Welcome to the ultimate smart contract developer, security researcher, blockchain engineer, full platform and course. This course, this set of videos is all you need to go from where you are to successful smart contract developer or security researcher. We have been doing this for over four years now, teaching the next generation of smart contract developers how to be successful. On YouTube alone, our videos have over 6 million views where we have both the number one and number two most watched smart contract educational content on the planet. And that doesn't even count the number of viewers and users who watch and learn on our education platform, Cyphron Updraft. And we've taken all the learnings in those years of doing this education, wrapped them all up to make what you're currently watching the best one yet. This one has a ton of advancements in it, making it the most cutting edge Web3 developer course, period. Having made one of these courses for the last four plus years, I've been reached out to by countless developers who are now full-time developers in the Web3 space, making a living, doing well, and contributing to Web3. And there are thousands that I have not met who have left comments or left me notes, and I know we're gonna do it again with this video. If you're looking to become a Web3, Solidity, Smart Contract, or Blockchain Developer, or any of those terms, this is the course for you. And this course is for anybody and everybody, no matter your blockchain or developer experience level. And additionally, we're gonna be using artificial intelligence to accelerate our learning progress. And I'm gonna teach you not only how to become a blockchain developer, but how to work with AI tools to make you a 10X developer. If you have a little bit of developer experience before this, this course will be even easier to get through. But again, don't worry if you've never coded before. And for those of you who are already familiar with blockchain and smart contract development, feel free to jump around the different modules and different sections and grab the learnings that you want. I promise there's a lot of cutting edge information in here and maybe you need to brush up. And when I say this course, I mean this path in its entirety. If you're watching this on YouTube, this is just one giant, long, humongous video. Watch this all the way to the end to have the highest chance of success. For those of you who are watching this on Cypher and Updraft, and you all should be, you have a buffet of choices of where to go, but don't worry, I'm gonna make picking the choices incredibly easy for you. So no matter if you're brand new to coding, brand new to blockchain, or you're an experienced smart contract engineer, you're in the right place. Welcome to the edge of the rabbit hole. Let's get froggy. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Patrick Collins. I'm a smart contract engineer, security researcher, and just lover of all things Web3. I'm one of the co-founders of the smart contract auditing firm, Cyphern, avid smart contract YouTuber, and I live and breathe smart contract development. I absolutely love Web3, blockchain, and smart contracts, and I love the power and the tools that they enable us to use. But not only that, I love taking blockchain developers like yourself watching this video right now on the journey to becoming a successful smart contract developer. I think the key to Web3, to blockchain, to cryptocurrencies being successful is having a phenomenal foundation of developers. So I'm incredibly excited that you're here with me. And for those of you who don't wanna become blockchain developers, the first two lessons of this course, lesson zero and lesson one, are foundational pieces of conceptual information for you just to understand how to get into this Web3 thing. So if you don't wanna become a developer, just stop once we get to the coding. In any case, I'm incredibly excited for your journey. This is a data dump passion project of all the knowledge that I've collected over the past few years of working in this industry and being a smart contract developer myself. And at this point, I have the track record to show that I am 100% confident that if you follow along, if you code along with us, if you follow me on this journey, you will come out the other side armed with the knowledge to be a positive force for the cryptocurrency and blockchain industry. Smart contract and Solidity developers are massively in demand with an average salary being around $145,000 a year. And with AI coming in place, it's becoming even easier to get up to speed quickly. But only those that understand the technology truly will be able to take advantage of all these advancements. AIs get stuff wrong a lot. So we especially need the knowledge to fact check whenever AIs get things wrong. Being here, you have the opportunity to be a pioneer, ushering in the age of Web3 of cryptocurrency, blazing the trail of where this phenomenal industry has yet to go. Like I said, this isn't the first time we've done this. We've already helped so many developers get into space, and we're gonna give you the cutting edge, most modern tools for industries like DeFi, NFTs, DAOs, tokens, upgradable smart contracts, blockchains, and everything else that you can think of. Once you finish this course, it will be abundantly clear what you want your next steps to be. And you'll have a ton of economic opportunity at your fingertips 
and opportunities to make a huge difference in this amazing industry. However, I can't just give it to you. You have to come with me on this journey. You have to take the step. Despite what you might think you know, cryptocurrencies and smart contracts enable a more accountable world, a more transparent world, a more collaborative world, a world where promises can't be broken. And that's a world that I want to live in. We'll teach you about the purpose of smart contracts in section one of this course. And then later we'll teach you how to build them. So before we even get started, I want to give you a huge thank you for even being here on this video and listening and being interested in engaging in this phenomenal technology. So thank you for being here and welcome to the rabbit hole because we're about to drop down. With that being said, let's get froggy. So let's begin our journey by talking about some best practices. That way you can get the absolute most out of this course and be as effective as possible. Now you're either watching this on Cypher and Updraft or on YouTube. And I encourage everybody to watch this on Cypher and Updraft because we've got a ton of features to make the learning experience that much easier for you. So if you are watching this on Cypher and Updraft though, there's a couple links I need you to be aware of. The first one in the top right is going to be the GitHub resources page. This will bring you over to what's called a GitHub repo or a GitHub repository, or basically a site that has all the code and all the information and basically all the materials that you're going to need to learn everything in our curriculum. You could basically think of this as your Bible for the duration of your blockchain developer journey. Additionally, in this GitHub, there's a discussions tab right here that you can click on. And in here is where you can ask questions, discuss with other people taking the course, interact with members helping out, and it's where you can discuss anything that you're having trouble with. Then on the other side, you'll see this tab called Written Lessons. If you cannot stand the voice coming out of my mouth, you can just flip over to that and just read the course curriculum as well if you prefer the written content over the video content. And it's good to go over to the Written Lessons anyways to maybe copy paste some stuff. If you scroll down here, right now it's blank, but if any time there's an update to a video, something's changed in the video and we haven't swapped out the video yet, you'll see a little updates section with information saying, hey, the video says this, but you should do this instead. Now, like I said, this is a very fast moving industry and sometimes things change and sometimes things need to be updated. So when you're watching one of these videos, be sure to look for the updates tab at the bottom. And then additionally, whenever you're working with the code that we're working with, I will give you a link to the finalized edition that you can use as a reference as well to make sure that the code that you're working with actually is going to match what we are going to build. Additionally, if you think you found something that is different or doesn't quite work, be sure to make a discussion for it in that GitHub repo. Like I said, it's going to be your Bible. Additionally, there's a link to join the GitHub discussions. This is your platform to ask questions, engage with the community and learn with both other people taking the course and also our TAs who are going to be helping you out along the way. Additionally, there is a link to the Discord for more real-time communication. I urge you to ask questions in the GitHub discussions as well, because those are going to be indexed, going to make them much easier to Google search later and have them show up as opposed to Discord. Discord is still phenomenal for you to join them. For those of you watching on YouTube, hello, you should scroll down to the description. And in the description are going to be links to these resources as well. And additionally, a link to Cypher and Updraft. If you've been watching, you've already seen some of the advantages that Cypher and Updraft has, including written lessons, single videos, and there's also ways to track your progress instead of having to scrub on a giant YouTube video. So for all of you who are watching this on YouTube, definitely be sure to go over to Cypher and Updraft, sign up there and watch the curriculum there because your learning experience will be much better. But leave this video playing in the background on YouTube so we get the bump from the YouTube algorithm. Thank you. That being said, as we go through this course, we're also going to teach you some best practices on working with artificial intelligence, how to best prompt these AI so that they can give you the best results. Just keep in mind, they sometimes get things wrong. And it's a good idea if you are going to use an AI to fact check it with a human or another resource. So be sure to say hi in the discussions and maybe meet some like minded peers. And additionally, once we do get to the coding portion of this course, it's a good idea to code along with me as I'm explaining things. So having the video up as well as your coding screen is a good idea. So you can follow along with me as I'm explaining it. If you're watching this on Cypher and Updraft, you can just click the little video pop out button and have the video pop out as such and code next to it. All of this is to say, if you run into an issue, jump to that GitHub repo and make a discussion. We will also be giving you some tips very soon about how to best make a discussion. Yes. Asking questions to other human beings is a skill. And we're going to try to teach you to be the most effective because asking well formatted questions is not only the secret to being a fantastic AI prompt engineer, but also becoming an incredibly successful 
developer. We're going to learn how to ask well formatted questions. And whenever we post on discussions or forums or whatever, we're going to work on formatting them as best as possible. Take breaks. I cannot tell you how many people have tried to rush through these courses and be like, oh, I'm going to finish in a single weekend. Your brain doesn't work like that. Your brain needs time to absorb the information. So take breaks. Maybe every 25 minutes to a half hour, take a five minute break. Or maybe you like working in longer chunks. Maybe take a whole hour and then take a 15, 20 minute break. Don't try to rush through the whole video in a day. You're not going to retain the information. Go outside, go for a walk, grab some ice cream, get some coffee, go to the gym. Your brain needs time to have the information settle. Maybe every two hours, just step away. Maybe be done for the day. Work at whatever pace makes sense for you. Everyone's going to have a different learning pace. There is no right speed for this course. I've had people take my courses in two weeks, in three months, in six months. It doesn't matter. Pick a pace that you can do and stick to it. Not only work at your pace, make sure that I'm talking at a pace that makes sense for you. There's a little gear icon in the YouTube video here where you can change the speed of how I'm talking and how fast the video is going. So if I'm talking way too fast for you, then you can slow me down. But if I'm talking too slow, then you can speed me up. And if you're watching this on Cypher and Updraft, you have the same dials as well in the bottom right hand corner. Additionally, if English isn't your native language, we have seven different subtitles in the Cypher and Updraft video player as well. So make the adjustments you need to make me go the speed you want me to go. And of course, this course is modular. So you can bounce around topic to topic and go to where you want to go. If you don't want to do any full stack stuff, then skip that section. If you want to go right to the advanced stuff, do that. Like I said, go the pace and take the learnings that you want to do. And after every lesson, it might be a good idea to go back and reflect on each lesson to really make sure the knowledge gets ingrained. Repetition is the mother of skill, and we're going to be repeating a lot of smart contract development. Now, the last bit here is in the Cypher and Updraft platform, we're going to have quizzes that you can take to help see if you learn the knowledge that you were supposed to learn. If you're watching this on YouTube, you don't have that. So go sign up for Cypher and Updraft and then play the YouTube video in the background. So the YouTube algorithm bumps us up. But additionally, at the end of every section, if you go to the GitHub repo associated with that section and you scroll down, there's going to be a bonus NFTs section with a link. This will bring you to a coding challenge on chain that you can actually solve to mint yourself an NFT, a badge of honor, proving that you gained the knowledge that you were supposed to. These are optional challenges that you can do to try to make sure that you actually learned what was meant to be learned here. And if you do solve them, you get a very cool NFT along with it. Don't know what an NFT is? Don't worry, we'll teach you later. Blockchain development and open source development world is incredibly collaborative. So be sure to use tools like, of course, the GitHub discussions tab, Ethereum Stack Exchange, the decentralized Q&A forum, Piranha, issues on different GitHubs, artificial intelligence, and more. And like I said, we'll give you more tips on how to most effectively use these sites in the future. And the reason I'm putting so much emphasis on this and that I will continue to put so much emphasis on this is being a successful smart contract developer is more than just knowing how Solidity works. Knowing where to go for information and how to collaborate with people is often more important than your smart contract knowledge. Because oftentimes you're going to run into issues you don't know how to solve. So we're going to teach you to unblock yourself on this and really anything in life. Plus, syncing with other people in the space makes it way more fun. Now, before we can actually get to coding, we need to understand how the blockchain even works, what the purpose of these smart contracts even are. And this is essential to becoming a successful smart contract developer because a technology is really just a solution. And a solution is only as good as the problem is. So we need to make sure we understand the problem really well so we know how to attack it with this smart contract technology. And the better you understand the smart contract technology, the better you'll be able to architect your smart contracts in the future and make really intelligent, really powerful systems that further this amazing industry. But if you already know the basics of blockchain, feel free to jump into lesson two and skip over lesson one. So those are some of the best practices to be really successful with this course. But with that knowledge, you're now standing at the edge of the rabbit hole. And if you're like me, once you jump in, you'll just want to keep going deeper and deeper. I'm so excited for you to embark on this journey with us. And I'm looking forward to seeing you on the other side, just like the thousands of other developers who have taken these courses and have emerged the other side triumphant. So it all starts with blockchain basics. Let's get froggy. 
Now, throughout this course, you will see a number of different guest lecturers who are going to be giving you this information. We work with some of the best people in the industry to give you this information. For lead instructors, I've already introduced myself, but just to reiterate, my name is Patrick Collins, and I will be the lead instructor for the majority of your journey on Cypher and Updraft. But it's not just me who helps out creating the curriculum here. I'd like to also introduce our co-lead instructor, Kira Nightingale. I will let her go ahead and introduce herself. Just a brief interlude from Patrick to say hi and introduce myself. My name is Kira Nightingale and I am a developer relations engineer at Cyphrin and I love all things smart contract engineering and I'm going to be helping Patrick out with creating content for you guys to become the best smart contract engineers in the world. So if you see my face now and again, not to be concerned because now you guys know who I am. And with that said, back to Patrick. So don't be too surprised if you see her face popping up from time to time. And with that, let's continue. Now, for you developers who are going to be going on to the Solidity Basics and Foundry Fundamentals or Viper or any of the other courses, we are additionally going to be teaching you how to deploy to an L2 called ZK Sync. At the time of recording, there are a couple of differences that make deploying to ZK Sync slightly different from deploying to Ethereum, but we imagine that in the future, we won't need these couple of differences. As ZK Sync matures, we imagine that the differences will become fewer and fewer. Kira will teach you more about L2s and how they work in a future lesson. And in our best practices section, we talked about different challenge contracts that you can go out and you can solve to win an NFT. And it's on ZK Sync where these challenge contracts are going to be deployed. Kira will go over why ZK Sync is such a phenomenal layer two rollup. And additionally, we wanna give a massive thank you to Matter Labs and the ZK Sync team for being the lead sponsor of Cypher and Updraft. It's thanks to their sponsorship and their dedication to making Web3 developer and security research education accessible that we are able to bring this course completely free to all of you. So you can help support them, support us by looking to deploy to their chain. Now, we of course think disclosures are very important. So anytime we work with a sponsor, we will have a list of them in the sponsors section of the GitHub repo associated with this course. And additionally, we will also give you alternatives as well so that you can use the technology that is correct for you. We also want to give a thank you to Arbitrum and Optimism, who historically have also donated to Cypher and Updraft. Now, as a recording, there are a few scenarios where if you're looking to deploy a real live professional smart contract to ZK Sync, it might be a little extra challenging. So we have a file in the GitHub repo associated with this course that we recommend that you take a look at before you deploy a production smart contract to ZK Sync in the future. Of course, since you're watching this right now, this probably doesn't apply to you. But in any case, a huge thank you to ZK Sync and the Matter Labs teams for helping sponsor Cypher and Updraft. Kira will tell you more about why they are a really cool layer too. And we're looking forward to seeing what cool smart contracts you deploy to ZK Sync. Now, since you're here, you've probably heard of Bitcoin before. Bitcoin was one of the first protocols to use this revolutionary technology called blockchain. The Bitcoin white paper was created by the pseudo-anonymous Satoshi Nakamoto, and it outlined how Bitcoin could make peer-to-peer -peer transactions in a decentralized network. This network was powered by cryptography and decentrality, and it allowed people to engage in censorship-resistant finance in a decentralized manner. Due to its features, which we'll talk about in a little bit, people took to this as a superior digital store of value, a better store of value over something like gold, for example. And that's why you'll also hear people commonly refer to it as a digital gold. Similar to gold, there's a scarce amount or a set amount of Bitcoin available on the planet, only so much that you can buy and sell. You can read more about the original vision in the white paper. We have a link to the white paper in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Now, this was an insane breakthrough. And in a little bit, we're gonna learn exactly how this is all possible and how this actually works under the hood. Some people though, saw this technology and wanted to take it a little bit farther and do even more with this blockchain technology. And a few years later, a man named Vitalik Buterin released a white paper for a new protocol named Ethereum, which used this same blockchain infrastructure with an additional feature. And in 2015, him and a number of other co-founders released the project Ethereum where people could not only make decentralized transactions, but decentralized agreements, decentralized organizations, and all these other ways to interact with each other without a centralized intermediary or centralized governing force. Basically, their idea was to take this thing that made Bitcoin so great 
and add decentralized agreements to it or smart contracts. And in fact, technically, these smart contracts weren't even really a new idea. Back in 1994, a man named Nick Zabo had actually originally come up with the idea. Smart contracts are a set of instructions executed in a decentralized autonomous way without the need for a third party or centralized body to run them. And they come to life on these blockchains or these smart contract platforms like Ethereum. And it's these smart contracts that are gonna be the core thing that we're gonna be working on in this course and that we're gonna be developing. You can think of smart contracts in the same way you think of traditional contracts or traditional agreements. They're just a set of instructions between parties, except instead of written on pen and paper or typed up in Microsoft Word, they are written in code and embodied on these decentralized blockchain platforms. And that's also where they're executed. Instead of being executed by the two parties or three parties or however many parties that are involved, this removes this centralized issue that we'll talk about more in a bit. This is one of the main differentiators between the Ethereum protocol and the Bitcoin protocol. It's these smart contracts. Now, technically, Bitcoin does have smart contracts, but they're intentionally Turing incomplete which means they don't have all the functionality that a programming language would give them. This was an intentional move by Bitcoin developers. Bitcoin developers viewed Bitcoin as a store of value versus Ethereum developers viewed Ethereum as both a store of value and a utility to facilitate these decentralized agreements. Now, these smart contracts on blockchains alone are absolutely incredible. However, they do come with a huge issue. If we want these digital agreements to replace the agreements in our everyday lives, they probably are going to need data from the real world. Blockchains by themselves actually can't interact with and can't read or listen to data from the real world. This is what's known as the Oracle problem. These blockchains are deterministic systems and they're deterministic on purpose. And we'll learn about more about how that works in the sessions to come. So everything that happens with them happens in their little world. But if they're going to be these agreements, they need external data and they need external computation. And this is where oracles come into play. Oracles are any device that delivers data to these decentralized blockchain or runs external computation. However, if we want our applications to stay truly decentralized, we can't work with a single oracle or a single data provider or a single source that's running these external computations. So we need a decentralized oracle network similar to our decentralized blockchain network. Your on-chain logic will be decentralized, but you also need your off-chain data and computation to be decentralized. Combining this on-chain decentralized logic with this off-chain decentralized data and decentralized computation gives rise to something called hybrid smart contracts. And most of the biggest protocols that we interact with today are some type of hybrid smart contract or interact with hybrid smart contracts to some extent. This is where the protocol Chainlink comes into play. It is a modular decentralized Oracle network that can both bring external data and external computation into our smart contracts to make sure they're decentralized end to end while giving them the feature richness that we need for our agreements. Chainlink allows for us to get data, do upkeeps, get random numbers, or really customize our smart contracts in any meaningful way. Now, throughout the course, we're gonna use the terminology smart contract. However, whenever we say smart contract, we're often using it a little interchangeably with hybrid smart contracts. But just know that when we say hybrid smart contract, we're talking specifically about smart contracts that have some type of off-chain component. Now, since Ethereum's release, a number of different blockchains or smart contract platforms have come to light, such as Avalanche, Polygon, Phantom, Harmony, and more. For the majority of this course, we're gonna be assuming that we're gonna be deploying to the Ethereum network. However, everything that we learn here is gonna be applicable to the vast majority of the blockchains out there, like Polygon, Avalanche, Phantom, Harmony, et cetera. And understanding everything from Ethereum fundamentals will give you the skills that you need to switch chains very easily with literally one line of code. So don't worry about learning a specific tool or with a specific chain because most of them work together seamlessly. Now, there are a couple of smart contract platforms that don't use Solidity, but still learning the fundamentals here will make you much better at those as well. And Ethereum by far has the most value locked and is the most used blockchain and smart contract platform out there. You'll also hear those two terms used a little bit interchangeably as well. Sometimes I'll say smart contract platform, sometimes I'll say blockchain. They kind of mean the same thing. Obviously, blockchains could mean store of value and smart contract platform, but you get the idea. Similarly, Chainlink is the most popular and powerful decentralized Oracle network it is the one that we're going to be focusing on for this course as well. Chainlink is also blockchain agnostic. 
So it'll work on Ethereum, Avalanche, Polygon, Solana, or really any other blockchain out there. Now, additionally, over the last year, a new term has come to light called an L2 or a layer two. This solves an issue that most blockchains see where they don't scale very well, or they don't grow big very well. We'll be talking about L2s a little bit more in the future, but the basic concept of it is that blockchains can really only get so big. So what they do, if, if this is Ethereum, you can actually have blockchains hook into them to essentially make them bigger. If that doesn't really make too much sense, don't worry about it for right now. Layer twos solve this scalability issues. And at the moment, there are two different types of true layer twos, optimistic rollups and zero knowledge rollups. Optimistic rollups like Arbitrum and Optimism or zero knowledge rollups like ZK Sync or Polygon ZK EVM. Yes, there's a Polygon chain, but there's also a Polygon ZK EVM L2. The two of them are very different. Don't worry about them for now. But like I said, once we learn how blockchains work from a basic level under the hood, then we'll explain more about how these L2s actually work. Now, throughout this course, you'll hear the term DAP or decentralized protocol or smart contract protocol or decentralized application. And they all kind of mean the same thing. A decentralized application is usually the combination of many smart contracts. And when we get into Solidity, you'll see what a singular smart contract really looks like. And like I said, learning all these core fundamentals will make you a better Solidity and a better smart contract developer. You'll also hear the term Web3 a lot in this video and in the industry. Web3 is the idea that blockchains and smart contracts are the next iteration of the web. Web1 being this permissionless open source world with static content. Web2 being the permissioned web with dynamic content, but all the agreements and logic runs off of centralized servers where they control your information. And then Web3 comes back to the permissionless web, but once again with dynamic content. And instead of centralized servers running your logic, decentralized networks run the logic, creating these censorship resistant agreements that these smart contracts enable. It is also generally accompanied by the idea that the users own the protocols that they work with, and it's an ownership economy. You'll see what I mean later in this course. Now we've talked a lot about the history and about the high level of these protocols and of these smart contracts and what they can do. But what do these smart contracts really mean? What is it when I say trust minimize agreements or unbreakable promises? What is the real value add of these smart contracts? Before we look under the hood and take a peek at how this all works from a technical standpoint, let's learn what all the value of this is. What is the purpose of us building all these technologies of you taking this course? What problem does this technology solve? In my mind, a technology is really only as good as the problem that it solves. If it doesn't solve a problem, then why bother? Smart contracts, blockchain, Web3, cryptocurrencies, those are all just different words that encapsulate the idea of what we're doing in such a unique paradigm. I think the easiest way to sum up what these smart contracts do is that they create trust minimized agreements. And if you might be scratching your head to that, a much easier way to think about it is just they give rise to unbreakable promises. Yes, you heard that right unbreakable agreements and promises. Additionally, they give rise to speed, efficiency, and transparency, and a number of other things. I made a video pretty recently about exactly this. So let's dive in and take a listen to the purpose, the undeniable value of smart contracts. Cryptocurrencies fundamentally re-landscape markets and agreements as we know them. Unfortunately, you've probably only been bombarded with people screaming about NFTs and money. Now, some of the memes are fun, but let's forget the bullshit and get down to the essence of this space. If you're already in Web3, this is the video to send to your friends to explain why you're so excited about this space and explain why we're here. And then if you're not into crypto, you've come to the right place. And yes, there are fun memes and markets and there's some money stuff and there are all these things. But outside of all that, the purpose of blockchains relates to the age old elementary school unbreakable promise, the pinky swear. Let's get froggy. Nearly everything you do in life is the result of an agreement or a contract. Your chair was the result of an agreement to buy and sell lumber, to assemble and sell the chair to a retailer on Amazon. Then you made an agreement to buy the chair for $40. The lights in your house are powered by electricity, which is an agreement from you and the electric company. You agree to pay them in return, they'll keep the lights on. The electricity that they generate is agreements between them and engineers who built turbines to generate the electricity. With insurance, you agree to pay some amount of money to them every month, and in return, they will do nothing. Or I mean, they'll cover your medical bills. Almost everything you do and everything you interact with 
is the result of some form of agreement or contract in some aspect. Now, agreements and contracts can feel kind of abstract and boring to really grasp onto. So to simplify, we can also refer to them as promises. When you get an oil change, they're promising that they will faithfully change your oil in exchange for money. When you put money in the bank, they promise to keep it safe in exchange for them to use your money to give out loans. When you buy a lottery ticket, the lottery promises to give you a fair chance at winning a ton of money in exchange for you buying the ticket. Whenever you make one of these agreements, in a way, you're asking them to pinky swear to not screw you over and to treat you fairly. But this doesn't always happen. Let's look at a real world example of someone breaking the pinky swear. Back in the 80s and 90s, McDonald's ran a promotion for people to win money by collecting McDonald's Monopoly game cards. The idea was simple. You buy McDonald's and in return you get a chance to win one million dollars. You can imagine McDonald's literally going, hey everybody, I promise if you buy our McFood and McNuggets, we'll give you a fair chance of winning this money. Woo! But they ended up breaking this promise. Instead of having a fair chance of winning, your chance was in fact zero. In the mid 90s, between 13 and 24 million dollars went into the pockets of not people playing the game honestly, but a group of corrupt insiders who had rigged the game. Meaning that when you played the McDonald's Monopoly game, you were buying into a set of lies and promises that were 100% always going to be broken. And the thing is, it doesn't really matter if this was McDonald's fault or not. They were the ones making the promises that they ultimately could not keep. Another way you could think about it is that that's $24 million that they essentially stole from you and I. Now, if this system was deployed on a blockchain with something called a smart contract, it would have been impossible to defraud this $24 million due to smart contracts being immutable, decentralized, and transparent. But I'll get back to that in a minute. In all the agreements and contracts we make, imagine making a pinky swear with a 10 year old and imagining how that agreement would hold up. Hey buddy, could you could you please keep my money safe? You can play with it if you like, but just, just please have it when I come back. Immediately, you might get that worrying feeling in your chest. Something might go wrong, but this 10 year old might lose your money. You might be thinking, how could I trust them? Will they break their promise? And this feeling of, I can't breathe because of untrustworthy situations happens to us all the time. Can I trust this used car salesperson to give me a good car? Can I trust this tag that says machine washable or will it make my shirt shrink? Will my insurance provider break their promise of covering my medical bills when I get hit by a bus? When Patrick promises he'll go on a hike with me, will he actually? Yes, Becca, I, I, I actually will. The issue with our current agreements and contracts is we have to trust the people who are making them to do the right thing. However, often they're actually incentivized to not do the right thing. Insurance doesn't want to pay out money. Sometimes salespeople just want to get the shit off their shelves. And with my girlfriend, I promised to go on a hike, but I hate hikes. Where else has this happened? Now you might be thinking, okay, Patrick, this seems cool, but like, where has this actually affected me? Well, the McDonald's lottery that we just spoke about above, during the Great Depression, with the run of the banks, banks promised to keep our money safe, and that when we went back to go get it, they would actually have the money there. And well and behold, there were times that they didn't have the money there. Just last year, Robinhood painted this amazing picture. Come use our application. We will give you access to the markets. We promise we will give you, a retail investor, a fair chance of interacting with the world of finance. <laughs> Psych! But not this asset, this asset, this asset, or this asset. The 2008 financial crisis, remember that? Shady deals behind closed doors combined with lies about financial product brought the world to its economic knees. How are you f***ing us? Hyperinflation in Zimbabwe, hyperinflation in Brazil. Fair enough. History is a relentless lesson of trustworthy entities being notorious promise breakers. And we finally have a way to fix it with smart contracts. Now, before I jump into smart contracts, a lot of people might be thinking, hey, cool and all. However, we have systems in place to protect against a lot of these things, which is true and which is great. And that is a very helpful step forward. But these systems often break. The ones in 2008 definitely didn't work. The ones with the Robin Hood crisis definitely didn't work. And even if these systems apply and you go to court to try to work them out, maybe you're in court for years before you actually see a resolution. And by that time, what you needed the money for is long gone. So what is this technology? What is this tool that can fix this fundamental problem in our agreements today? This tool is smart contracts and this tool is what the blockchain was built for. Now I'm going to give you a quick overview of what a smart contract is. 
However, I'm leaving some links in the description for more in-depth explanations. But the basics of them is a smart contract is an agreement, a contract, or a set of instructions deployed on a decentralized blockchain. And once the contract or set of instructions is deployed, it cannot be altered. It automatically executes and everyone can see the terms of the agreement. The real basics of it is that the code is executed by a decentralized collective, like a group of people, but a group of people running a certain software. This means that no one person or entity can actually alter any of these agreements or change the terms of the arrangement. In these traditional agreements, whoever owns the contract, whoever owns the execution of the contract can flip a switch and say, eh, we're not gonna do that anymore. In smart contracts, in Web3, in blockchain, you no longer can do that. Typically, these smart contracts are on a decentralized blockchain and used in combination with a decentralized Oracle network to get the real world assets and information. And if these words sound like I'm conjuring up a magic spell, well, again, check the links in the description if you wanna learn more about the technical implications. If you're not a technical person and you're not interested in getting to the nitty gritty, you can kind of think of it like HTTPS. I bet the vast majority of you don't even know what HTTPS stands for, and yet you use it every single day whenever you log onto the internet. So how does this fix the McDonald's monopoly issue? In its traditional form, the lottery was executed behind closed doors. Somebody operated and owned the code and the contracts and the agreements that ran the lottery, and they had the power to alter it, and nobody other than the people internal on the lottery could audit this altering happening. Now, if the code for this lottery was deployed onto a blockchain, every time a hacker attempted to alter it, everyone would be notified. Not only that, but you couldn't even alter it because the terms of a smart contract cannot be altered once deployed. Combine that smart contract with a Chainlink VRF Oracle to get a verifiably random number, and presto, you now have a perfectly decentralized, unalterable agreement that is impossible to hack, commit fraud, or manipulate. We have just saved the public between 13 million and 24 million dollars just by fixing the issue of trust. How does this fix Robinhood? Well, the problem with Robinhood is already fixed, right? Again, the problem is that there's a centralized body that can flip a switch at any time and say, yeah, you can't access these markets anymore. We're breaking our promise of actually giving you access to the markets. This is already fixed with something called decentralized exchanges. And these exist today. One of these exchanges is one called Uniswap. You can swap ERC-20 tokens, which are kind of the equivalent of stocks, but some aren't, some are, it's a little confusing. I won't get into that here either, but it doesn't have that centralized body that can flip a switch and ruin access to the markets. And had these investors been on a decentralized exchange, it would have saved them hundreds of millions of dollars. And it would have prevented fraudulent market manipulation. How does it fix run of the banks? With transparency built in and automated solvency checks, you can build a bank light smart contract that has insolvency checks built in that make it impossible to get there. Insolvent means broke as f Any agreement or any history lesson where there was a trust assumption that was broken, smart contracts can be applied to and should be applied to, especially in a time where big money runs, owns, and controls everything. We desperately need to move to a world where some self-interested centralized entity can't flip a switch and ruin people's access to the services that they need. We can move away from a world that is brand-based to a world that is math-based. Right now, if you interact with a service that you don't like or that they break their promise, the only thing you can do walk down the street to the next service that's going to make the same set of promises and you have to hope and pray that they're actually going to keep it we can move from that to a world where we can just look at the math and say oh okay one plus one equals two this is what this agreement is going to do for me every single time guaranteed because it's a decentralized autonomous agent has no incentive to be evil and everything is transparent and out in the open if i'm a big company and if it was better for me for one plus one to equal three Maybe I would go behind some closed doors and fudge some numbers and come back out and be like, hey, one plus one equals three. But with smart contracts, that's impossible. Doing the right thing is infrastructural. Now, given the choice between two agreements, one where you have to trust a single centralized entity that they're gonna do the right thing for you versus a decentralized, untamperable collective, which one are you gonna choose? I'm picking the one that can't screw me over every single time for every agreement I can apply it to. Now, this technology is relatively new, but we have already seen it re-landscape entire markets and continue to do so. The traditional financial world is already getting its lunch 
eaten by DeFi or decentralized finance. There's already over $200 billion of people's money in these protocols to help have a more fair, more accountable, more transparent financial system. This DeFi movement is one of the main reasons I got into this space because we desperately need to move away from where we are right now and end people's chances for wealth being sucked up by some group that's bending the rules in their favor. And smart contracts are our ticket to that better world. More and more industries are also coming over to smart contracts and blockchain because of all the innovations and because of all the advantages that it has. As we grow and as we get better, we get closer to this vision of having this concept fulfilled. Trust minimized agreements. These smart contracts are minimizing the trust that we need to give other people in order for these agreements to be executed. If trust minimized agreements is too confusing for you, just say unbreakable promises. Now, I gotta be honest with you guys, Blockchains and smart contracts and cryptocurrencies can actually do more than just trust minimized agreements. What? They have security benefits, uptime benefits, execution speed benefits, and a whole lot more. But it's a lot easier to just learn about one and learn the other ones later, right? It's kind of like sprinkles on top. So this is why we are here. This is why we're building this future. And this is why we are so excited about it. Last year, 2022, there were a lot of issues with a couple different companies, like, for example, SBF's FTX platform. The thing to me that's most frustrating about that situation is that FTX platform wasn't anything that I just talked about. It wasn't decentralized. It wasn't trustless. It wasn't transparent. It was purely a traditional Web2 company pretending to be Web3 and just using the cryptocurrency part of Web3, but not actually using the smart contracts. And we're doing a much better job as a community getting rid of the bad actors. And this is something that's incredibly important for you when working with protocols and when building protocols. I want you to be incredibly successful here, but I want you to be incredibly successful because you're making a ton of value. A lot of these platforms that we saw collapsing last year were not creating value. They were stealing value. They were siphoning value. They were faking having value. And as you learn and as you build smart contracts yourself, it'll start to become innately aware of what protocols and what companies are centralized and are not the ethos of Web3 and the ones that are. We are building verifiable, trust-minimized agreements, unbreakable promises. And if you can't verify those promises, then it's not trust-minimized. It's not Web3. It's not what this industry is for. That's what I want you to do as you finish this course is be a force for good. Unfortunately, because a lot of people haven't taken my course, not everybody understands the difference between a legitimate project and a token that's just meant to pump somebody's bags. As this space continues to grow and as people like yourself take courses like this, we will get to continue to push real legitimate projects forward and wash out the products that aren't actually contributing. Whew. Even in just this introduction part, we've learned a ton. So let's do a quick summary of what we've learned so far. Bitcoin was the first protocol to take this blockchain technology into the limelight and take these cryptocurrencies into the mainstream. Bitcoin is a sort of digital gold or a store of value, able to make transactions between users in a decentralized manner. Ethereum and other smart contract platforms take this blockchain technology one step further, enabling people to make smart contracts and decentralized trust minimized agreements. These smart contracts and decentralized applications can access and interact with the real world using something called decentralized Oracle networks. Chainlink is a decentralized network that allows us to build these hybrid smart contracts, which combines our on-chain logic with our off-chain decentralized data and decentralized computation, giving rise to our logic being completely decentralized and our data and external computation being completely decentralized, giving us all the features that traditional agreements and traditional contracts have. Now, these digital currencies like Ethereum and Bitcoin have value even without the smart contract part, having a censorship resistant decentralized store of value is immeasurably powerful in its own right. We have some links in the GitHub repository that'll teach you how this decentralized store of value flips traditional finance on its head. And it's another one of the great reasons for building smart contracts. But again, the easiest way to boil it down is trust minimized agreements or unbreakable promises. But let's also go into some of these other features that smart contracts have over our traditional environment. The first feature, of course, is that they are decentralized and they have no centralized intermediary. The different individuals that run one of these blockchains are known as node operators. And it's the combination of all these thousands of node operators running the same software, running these algorithms, running these smart contracts that make the network decentralized. We'll dive deeper into how that works later. 
The next feature is transparency and flexibility. In these decentralized networks, since all these individual node operators run this software, everybody can see everything that's happening on chain, meaning there's no shady deals, there's no weird things happening. Anything that's gonna be unfair, people would be able to see and just not use. Everybody has perfect information and has to play by the same rules. Now, additionally, this doesn't mean that there's no privacy. The blockchain is pseudo anonymous, meaning that you aren't necessarily tied to an identity in real life. They also have the feature of speed and efficiency. For those of you who have ever tried to do a bank transfer or send money across seas, you know it sometimes can take two to three weeks when in fact, all these banks are really doing is basic math. They're subtracting money from your balance and adding it to some other balance. Why does it take so long? In the blockchain, all of these transactions happen instantly. Another instance for those in the financial world today know that clearing houses and settlement days can take a long time. In the blockchain, there's no need for any of that because they happen instantly. This obviously is much quicker, but it also makes for much more efficient interactions with each other. Security and immutability. Again, immutable means that it can't be changed. Once a smart contract is deployed, that's it. Whatever is in the code is going to be in the code forever. They cannot be altered or tampered with in any way. This means that the security is much easier. Whereas in a centralized world, somebody can hack into the server, jump into the database and change some numbers. You can't do that in the blockchain world. And since it's decentralized, in order to hack the blockchain, you'd have to take over half of the nodes, as opposed to in the centralized world, where you only have to take over one. In the regular world, if your computer and your backup computer go down, all of your data is gone. In the blockchain world, if your computer and your backup computer go down, all your data is safe because it's being run on all these other decentralized nodes. And even if a few hundred nodes or if a few thousand nodes go down, it doesn't matter because as long as one node has a copy of the blockchain, you're good to go. Hacking a blockchain is nearly impossible and leaps and bounds more difficult than hacking a centralized server. Not only that, but this is safer in the asset sense as well. All you need to access your credentials and your information and your assets is your private key, which is basically your password for all of this. And as we've discussed in the video, these smart contracts remove this counterparty risk, remove this centralized intermediary, remove these trust gateways that we have to do in Web2. When we engage with users and individuals, they don't always have our best interests at heart. Smart contracts remove this counterparty risk because once one of these contracts is created, they can't go in and they can't alter it and they can't let greed or ego or anything else get the better of them and alter the terms of the deal. And as we said, this gives rise to these trust minimized agreements or these programmatic unbreakable promises. We move away from brand based agreements to math based agreements. We can look at the cryptography, we can look right at the code and see exactly what something is going to do and how it's going to execute versus having to rely on a human being doing the right thing. With smart contracts and decentralized hybrid smart contracts, doing the right thing is infrastructural. All these pieces boil down to us having the freedom to interact the way we want to interact without having to be afraid that interacting like that is going to screw us over. This trust minimized piece, these unbreakable promises make interactions so much better. In the purely Web2 world, we're constantly bombarded with messages of projects and protocols pushing us to move or act in the direction that makes them more profitable. Versus in the smart contract space, we can see everything transparently and we can even engage and interact and be partially owners of the protocols and the interactions that we decide that we want to be a part of. But let's also go into some of these other features that smart contracts have over our traditional environment. The first feature, of course, is that they are decentralized and they have no centralized intermediary. The different individuals that run one of these blockchains are known as node operators. And it's the combination of all these thousands of node operators running the same software, running these algorithms, running these smart contracts that make the network decentralized. We'll dive deeper into how that works later. The next feature is transparency and flexibility. In these decentralized networks, since all these individual node operators run this software, everybody can see everything that's happening on chain, meaning there's no shady deals, there's no weird things happening. Anything that's gonna be unfair, people would be able to see and just not use. Everybody has perfect information and has to play by the same rules. Now, additionally, this doesn't mean that there's no privacy. The blockchain is pseudo anonymous, meaning that you aren't necessarily tied to 
and identity in real life. They also have the feature of speed and efficiency. For those of you who have ever tried to do a bank transfer or send money across seas, you know it sometimes can take two to three weeks, when in fact, all these banks are really doing is basic math. They're subtracting money from your balance and adding it to some other balance. Why does it take so long? In the blockchain, all of these transactions happen instantly. Another instance for those in the financial world today know that clearing houses and settlement days can take a long time. In the blockchain, there's no need for any of that because they happen instantly. This obviously is much quicker, but it also makes for much more efficient interactions with each other. Security and immutability. Again, immutable means that it can't be changed. Once a smart contract is deployed, that's it. Whatever's in the code is going to be in the code forever. They cannot be altered or tampered with in any way. This means that the security is much easier. Whereas in a centralized world, somebody can hack into the server, jump into the database and change some numbers. You can't do that in the blockchain world. And since it's decentralized, in order to hack the blockchain, you'd have to take over half of the nodes, as opposed to in the centralized world, where you only have to take over one. In the regular world, if your computer and your backup computer go down, all of your data is gone. In the blockchain world, if your computer and your backup computer go down, all your data is safe because it's being run on all these other decentralized nodes. And even if a few hundred nodes or if a few thousand nodes go down, it doesn't matter because as long as one node has a copy of the blockchain, you're good to go. Hacking a blockchain is nearly impossible and leaps and bounds more difficult than hacking a centralized server. Not only that, but this is safer in the asset sense as well. All you need to access your credentials and your information and your assets is your private key, which is basically your password for all of this. And as we've discussed in the video, these smart contracts remove this counterparty risk, remove this centralized intermediary, remove these trust gateways that we have to do in Web2. When we engage with users and individuals, they don't always have our best interests at heart. Smart contracts remove this counterparty risk because once one of these contracts is created, they can't go in and they can't alter it and they can't let greed or ego or anything else get the better of them and alter the terms of the deal. And as we said, this gives rise to these trust minimized agreements or these programmatic unbreakable promises. We move away from brand based agreements to math based agreements where we can look at the cryptography, we can look right at the code and see exactly what something is gonna do and how it's gonna execute versus having to rely on a human being doing the right thing. With smart contracts and decentralized hybrid smart contracts, doing the right thing is infrastructural. All these pieces boil down to us having the freedom to interact the way we want to interact without having to be afraid that interacting like that is gonna screw us over. This trust minimized piece, these unbreakable promises make interactions so much better. In the purely Web2 world, we're constantly bombarded with messages of projects and protocols pushing us to move or act in the direction that makes them more profitable. Versus in the smart contract space, we can see everything transparently and we can even engage and interact and be partially owners of the protocols and the interactions that we decide that we wanna be a part of. So smart contracts have been around for a few years now. And what have they generated for? What industries have come about due to these smart contract platforms being around? Well, you've probably heard of some of these and some of these we've already mentioned, but let's give you a quick refresher. DeFi. DeFi stands for decentralized finance, and it gives users the ability to engage with finance and markets without having to go through a centralized intermediary. For example, like we said with Robinhood, you no longer have to trust that Robinhood would continue to give you access to the markets you instead would be able to see in the smart contract, yes, I have access to the markets. Or in the 2008 financial crisis, you never have to trust that these groups and institutions are giving you the correct things on the back end. You can see everything transparently right on the blockchain. You can engage with things like money markets and sophisticated financial products easy, effectively, and securely. If you're really excited about DeFi, we have a ton of DeFi examples showing you how to build and interact with these protocols in coming lessons. DAOs or decentralized autonomous organizations are another group that we've already mentioned. DAOs are groups that are governed completely decentralized by a set of instructions or smart contracts on chain. There are some massive benefits here where Engagement's much easier, the rules are black and white, and you can see everything directly on chain. Voting and governance technology is completely decentralized. And the blockchain space is one of the big ones pushing how we can evolve politics and how we can evolve governance to make it more efficient, 
fair and reasonable. And you better know it, we have some examples of how to build DAOs and how to work with DAOs in coming lessons. So be sure to watch those. NFTs stand for non-fungible tokens and can really be kind of described as digital art or just a unique asset. They can do so much more, but we'll keep it high level for now. Projects like Bored Apes and CryptoPunks have revolutionized the way that people get paid for their work, show off their creativity, status, and so much more. And yes, of course, we have lessons showing you how to create and interact with NFTs as well. So many other groups and so many other industries are being created as a result of this insane technology. And maybe after finishing the journey with us here, you go out and you'll be the one to pioneer the next industry or the next billion dollar idea. You've learned so much already. But now that we've learned a lot of this high level information, let's finally jump in and let's make your first transaction and let's get you set up to interact with this new world. In this next section, we're gonna get you a wallet and we're gonna show you exactly what a transaction looks like and feels like. Let's dive in. This is the Ethereum website, ethereum.org. We are going to make a transaction on a test Ethereum blockchain. I'll explain what that means in a little bit. This is going to be our first ever transaction that's made on the blockchain. And this process of making a transaction is going to work the exact same across all EVM compatible blockchains and layer twos like Arbitrum, Ethereum, ZK Sync, and etc. I'll explain what EVM means in the future. For now, just follow along and have fun running your first transaction. Now, in order for us to send a transaction on any of these EVM chains, the first thing that we need to do is set up a wallet. So I'm gonna to go to MetaMask because it's one of the most popular wallets and one of the easiest wallets to use. I'm using the Brave browser, but it works for Chrome or Firefox or really any other popular browsers out there. And it's just gonna be an extension in the top right hand of our browser. It's gonna make it very easy to see anything to do with our wallets and our transactions very easily. And it's gonna store all of our EVM-based currencies and EVM-based transactions. So I'm gonna go ahead and hit Add to Brave, Add Extension although Brave does also come jam-packed with its own wallet. So now we come to the Get Started page, and I'm going to go ahead and select Create a New Wallet. Sure, we'll agree to help out MetaMask. Now we're going to create our password, make sure it's really secure. For the purpose of this demo, mine's going to be kind of mediocre. Now I'm going to preface this. This wallet that you're making right now, as you follow along with me, this is going to be your development wallet. So if you want to make the password a little bit weak, just so that you can test things out very quickly. Go for it. Just know we're never, ever going to put real money into this wallet. It's good if you treat this as if it is a real wallet. That way you'll get used to and you'll get familiar with good wallet safety. You will then get a video like this, which will teach you about the secret recovery phrase, which we saw a little bit earlier when we were creating our wallet. Let's watch this video. MetaMask is a new way to connect to sites and applications. On traditional websites, a central database or bank is responsible for controlling and recovering your accounts. But on MetaMask, all of the power belongs to the holder of a master key. Whoever holds the key controls the accounts. Your secret recovery phrase is your master key. It's a series of 12 words that are generated when you first set up MetaMask, which allow you to recover your wallet and funds if you ever lose access. It's important that you secure your wallet by keeping your secret recovery phrase very safe and very secret. If anyone gets access to it, they will have the master key to your wallet and can freely access and take all of your funds. To secure your MetaMask wallet, you'll want to safely save your secret recovery phrase. You can write it down, hide it somewhere, put it in a safe deposit box, or use a secure password manager. Some users even engrave their phrase onto a metal plate. Nobody, not even the team at MetaMask, can help you recover your wallet if you lose your secret recovery phrase. If you haven't written down your secret recovery phrase and stored it somewhere safe, do it now. We'll wait. And remember, never share your secret recovery phrase with anyone, not even us. If anyone ever asks you for it, they're trying to scam you. That's it. Now you know what a secret recovery phrase is and how to keep your wallet safe and secure. Awesome. So that was a great introduction to keeping your wallet safe. We'll talk a little bit more about safety with our wallets in the future. Let's go ahead and, and select secure my wallet. Now this is where we need to write down our secret recovery phrase and save it in a very secure place. It gives us some tips here, like a password manager, a safety deposit box, 
or split it up and keep it in multiple secret places. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to be showing you the secret recovery phrase because I'm not gonna put any real money into this, but you should never ever do this. Additionally, you'll sometimes hear mnemonic as a synonym for secret recovery phrase. The main takeaway from all this is you should never share any of this. This is for you only. If you show this secret phrase to anybody else, they will have access to not just one account, but every account that you make in MetaMask. So be absolutely certain to not share this with anybody. So again, I know I'm belaboring the point a little bit, but everything that we're gonna do in this tutorial, we're gonna do with fake money and fake assets and never put actual money into this account that we're making here. Once you get familiar with using MetaMask and working with the tools and staying secure, then you can go ahead and create a separate MetaMask that will have real funds in it. If you wanna put real money in different MetaMask, a lot of browsers have a profile option and maybe you can make a new profile, install MetaMask on that different profile, call that profile real money profile or something, and that's where you will store your money. But for this video, for this tutorial, the MetaMask that you are using is going to be specifically for testing things out and you will never store real money to it. I'm going to harp on that a lot more in this course. So even if you're coming here and you have a wallet, I highly recommend still making a brand new one for this tutorial, just in case you don't accidentally code something or do something autonomous and give away your funds. If this is your first wallet, then great. But again, when you're working with real money, if you lose access to the secret phrase, you will lose access to all your money. So be sure to write this down. Promise me that you won't use real money for this course. Great. I'm gonna hit copy to clipboard for now, and we're gonna go ahead and hit next. Now we need to confirm by adding our seed phrase back in. We can go ahead and hit confirm, and we now have created our wallet. Let's go ahead and click, got it. Awesome. Now we can see the interface of our MetaMask full screen. And depending on your browser, what you can normally do is hit this little puzzle piece on your browser and select this pin button. So now we can pin our MetaMask into the top of our browser. And we can click it like so, and we can see it give a little drop down like this, and we can see the same information in this little drop down as there is on the full screen. Now, even if you lose access to that page, now that this is bookmarked in your browser, you can select your MetaMask, select these three dots and hit expand view to reach this tab. Now, additionally, what we can do in here is we can actually go up to our accounts and we can actually create multiple accounts by hitting create account. And if you wanted to, you could give it a name here. I'm just gonna leave it as default for account two. And now we have two separate accounts. We have an account zero with an address and an account two with an address as well. Both of these accounts actually share that same secret phrase. So anybody with access to the secret phrase can actually have access to both accounts. However, they have different private keys and that's what makes them different. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the future. If somebody gets access to a private key, they'll get access to a single account. If they get access to the secret phrase, they'll get access to all the accounts that you make. Even you know, if you made a third one, they'd get access to this one as well. Now, if you look up in the top right of the screen here, you'll see the section that says Ethereum mainnet. This is our networks tab. And if you click it, you can see all the different networks that our MetaMask has access to. Ethereum mainnet is the main network of Ethereum. And this is where real money is spent and used. For this course, we're not gonna be working with Ethereum mainnet. We're instead gonna be working with something called a testnet. For both engineers and non-engineers, we often need a place to test or simulate our transactions. And for the developers here, throughout this course, we are going to teach you another technique for testing out your transactions on a local network. And a local network is actually going to be the preferred way we do our testing and our simulations. However, it's still really important to see end to end what a real transaction looks like. And that's what a test net will do for us. It simulates exactly what a mainnet or a live money network would look like. However, there's no real money at stake and we don't actually have to spend any money. To see some of the test nets that come default with MetaMask, we can hit the show slash hide button, which will bring us to the settings page of MetaMask. We can turn on show test networks. And if we scroll back up, now if we hit our networks tab, actually let's go ahead and close out of settings. Now if we hit this drop down, we can see Gorelli test network, Sepolia test network, and Linea Gorelli test network. These networks are test networks that resemble Ethereum or Polygon, or Linea, or Arbitrum, or Optimism, or ZK Sync, or any other EVM compatible chain that we wanna work with. And again, we'll define EVM in the future. 
and we can actually switch the network that we're working on simply by clicking another network. So let's switch to Sepolio. We can see our network changed up here, and now we can see we have zero Sepolio ETH. So on ETH mainnet, this new account has zero Ethereum, and on the Sepolia test network, we also have zero Sepolia ETH, which makes sense because this is a brand new wallet. And we haven't put any money into this brand new account yet, so of course we have zero. At the time of recording, Sepolia is one of the most popular test networks out there. So we're gonna be working mainly with Sepolia throughout this course. However, test nets often change because again, they're run out of the goodness of people's hearts and sometimes people stop running them. You should absolutely have either the web3dev.education site up or the GitHub repository associated with this course. And an important note, sometimes you'll see this as the Chainexcel org foundry full course. We recently renamed it to the Cyphron foundry full course. So this is the correct link, but if you see Chainexcel org, that's fine as well. And you should scroll down to the recommended test nets section to make sure you're on the most up-to-date test net. At the time of recording, like I said, we're working with Sepolia. Throughout this course, we are gonna show you how to work with different test nets and different networks as well, because it's incredibly important to do so. The blockchain world is moving into a multi-chain world, and especially with the popularity of L2s, which help Ethereum scale, learning the differences between different chains and different L2s is incredibly important. Now, same as Ethereum, what we can do is we can actually go to Sepolia Etherscan. So we'll go to sepolia.etherscan.io, and we can grab our address from MetaMask by clicking and copying the address here, pasting it into the Sepolia Explorer. And same as Ethereum, we can see our account balance, we have zero ETH, there are no transactions, no token transfers, nothing, because obviously it's a brand new wallet. Now I'm showing you this because pretty soon we're going to send our first ever blockchain transaction. If you've never sent a blockchain transaction before, we're gonna do it on this testnet to give you some confidence as what a transaction actually looks like when you do move over to a mainnet. And I'm showing you this site now because you're gonna see when we send a transaction, a lot of this information is going to get updated. Now, just remember, like I said earlier, a testnet is run out of the goodness of people's hearts, so please use the transactions sparingly. Once you send your first transaction here, try not to send too many more, as one is good enough for you to see what's going on anyways. And in order for us to simulate one of these transactions, we're gonna to go to a faucet for a testnet. Testnets have this thing called faucets, which allow us to get some free Sepolia ETH so that we can test out sending transactions and receiving transactions. If you go to the GitHub associated with this course, or web3dev.education, we can scroll down to this testnet faucets section and select one of the links to go to one of these testnet faucets. Right now, the recommended faucet that we're working with is faucets.chain.link, but be sure to use the GitHub repo or web3dev.education to be most up to date. What this is gonna do is we're gonna ask this faucet site to send us testnet Ethereum. And this is why this testnet Ethereum isn't worth any real money, since we can get it for free anytime that we want. These obviously don't exist on mainnet. You can't get free mainnet Ethereum via a faucet. Now, what we can do is we can actually connect our wallet to this site and we can get some free testnet Sepolia ETH. This will make it so that in our balance here, we'll actually have some Sepolia ETH to play with. So to do this, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and hit connect wallet, accept the chain link terms of service, I've already read them. Our MetaMask is gonna pop up to connect it to this website. Now, get familiar with this interface because this is how websites will interact with our wallet and interact with the blockchain. Connecting our account to the site, we'll first select the specific account that we wanna connect. We're just gonna choose account one, we'll hit next, and then we'll go ahead and hit connect. And now we can see our wallet address in the top right, and we can see that we're connected on the Ethereum Sepolia testnet. If we go up to our wallet and we actually switch to Ethereum mainnet, you can see that the website has actually changed this little dropdown to Ethereum mainnet. And if we go in here, we can actually switch to Ethereum Sepolia and our MetaMask will pop up with this switch network button, which will help us switch the network for us. So now we're back on Sepolia test network. Connecting to these websites is how we give these websites a way to interact and connect with our wallets. We can go ahead and select this, hit these three dots and hit disconnect this account. But don't worry, anytime we want to send a transaction, the website has to ask us if we want to send a transaction. 
So just by connecting to the site, it won't actually send a bunch of transactions for us. And if we scroll down, we can see our wallet address is placed right here. And we can see we can request test link, and we can also request test ETH. For now, we don't need any test link, so we're gonna leave that off. But in the future, we will come back to the site to get some test link. For now, we're just gonna get 0.1 test Ethereum. And if all goes well, we should hopefully see it in our Sepolia ETH here. In order for us to get this test Ethereum, we do have to log in via Twitter. If you don't have a Twitter, you can use any of the other faucets in the testnets faucets area of the GitHub, such as the Alchemy Sepolia faucet or the Sepolia proof of work faucet. But if you are on Twitter, now's a great time to give me a follow, maybe give me a shout out and maybe say, hey, sending my first transaction. Thanks, Patrick Alpha C. Boop. Or not, whatever you want to do. Just some light shilling of my own Twitter account. Anyways, we can log on via Twitter. We can authorize this app, verify that we're human, give our AI overlords the prompt here. Oh, make sure we don't select the link and let's go ahead and send the request. Now, what's gonna happen is it's gonna give us this transaction hash on Sepolia. And after a delay, we'll see it go from initiating to waiting for confirmation to token transferred. And we'll see a transaction hash. And if we click the transaction hash, we'll see a transaction that was sent to our address. So this will be the first transaction that we get to see. And there's a ton of information here. But the most important piece is if we open up our MetaMask now, we can see we now have 0.1 Sepolia ETH in our account. And if we copy the address again, we paste it into here, we can see now we have a 0.1 ETH balance. You might have to wait several minutes for the transaction to finish going through. And if you accidentally refresh your browser, again, we can go ahead and just select our MetaMask, copy our address and paste it into Etherscan or just view it right in our MetaMask here. And if you missed that piece about the transaction data, if we go back to Etherscan with our address, remember we're on Sepolia Etherscan and we scroll down, we can see this most recent transaction hash that just occurred. And we can click the link here and we can see that detail about the transaction again here. Now, importantly, remember though, this is on Sepolia. If we switch back to mainnet Ethereum, you'll see we have zero ETH on mainnet Ethereum. If we switch to Gorilla test network, you'll see we have zero Gorilla ETH on that network. If we switch to Linea Gorelli ETH or any other network other than Sepolia, you'll see that Sepolia is the only one that has the 0.1 Sepolia ETH. If you want to practice working with a different testnet, feel free to scroll up back to the faucet, select a different testnet, and try to get testnet in one of these different testnets. Just be sure to take a look at what testnets your MetaMask comes with, since some of the networks this faucet is compatible with don't come built into our MetaMask. But again, like I said in the future, I'll teach you how to add these different networks to our MetaMask in the future. But huge congratulations, you received your first transaction. Because again, this faucet is us asking them to send us money. It's not us sending money, it's them sending money to us. And if this is the first transaction that you've ever sent, you should be proud of yourself already. Give yourself a big pat on the back. And here's a picture of me holding a cat with that cat's face all over my pajamas as a congratulations. Now, once more, let's grab our address, paste it into Etherscan here and scroll down. And we're gonna learn a little bit more about what actually went down, what actually happened in this transaction. You can see on Etherscan, it gives us some basic details. It says from and to. From is gonna be another address, a different address, an address controlled by the faucet, and two is obviously going to be our address. And if we select this transaction hash, we can see even more details in here. Understanding all these different fields is essential to becoming a smart contract developer and even just a Web3 or Ethereum or blockchain user. So let's learn a bit of the basics of what's actually going down in this transaction. The first field on this page is the transaction hash. You can even see a little question mark here, which tells you a little bit more about it. It's a unique identifier for this specific transaction on this network. So this specific transaction hash, we can even copy and paste this into the address bar and we'll get the exact same transaction back. This is the only transaction in the entire blockchain that will have this transaction hash. It's the unique identifier. It identifies the transaction of sending 0.1 ETH from the faucet address to our address. We can see the status of this was successful. We can see the block number and the number of block confirmations, which we will explain in the future. 
We can see the timestamp, which of course is when this transaction occurred. We can see the from and to, who initialized the transaction and who it was sent to. If we select this from and open this in a new tab, we can see some details about who actually sent us this test ETH. And if we go back to the transaction detail and keep going, we can see the value here, which again, if we roll over, it's the value of ether or testnet ether. And then in parentheses, the fiat value or the dollar value, which of course, since this is a testnet, it's always going to be zero. The value of this transaction was 0 0.1 ETH. Now, what's underneath this value thing, this transaction fee and this gas price thing? What are these? If we zoom in a lot more to these pieces here and we roll over transaction fee, we can see it says it's the amount paid to the block producer for processing the transaction. And then gas price is going to be the cost per unit of gas specified for the transaction in Ether or GUE. The higher the gas price, the higher the chance of getting included in a block. I'm going to explain that in a little bit, but if we scroll down even more, let's zoom back out and we click click to show more, we can see even more details about this transaction. For now, we're just going to click to show less and just focus on the details that are here. So let's talk about just the concept of transaction fees and gas for a second, because they are important concepts for you to understand. Remember how I said that these blockchains are actually run by a group of different nodes? Well, the question is, what's their economic incentive to keep running these blockchains? Are they running them out of the goodness of their heart? Well, on a real network, these nodes actually get paid a little bit of ether for processing transactions. Whenever you send a transaction, there is a node, sometimes referred to as a miner or a validator, depending on the network you're on, who gets paid a little bit of the native currency of the blockchain to process that transaction. For Ethereum, they obviously get paid in Ethereum. Or for test Ethereum, they get paid in test Ethereum, which again, the test Ethereum is worth nothing, which is why I said they're running them out of the goodness of their heart. If you're sending a transaction on the Polygon network, they're going to get paid in Matic, the native token of Polygon. If you send a transaction on an L2 like Arbitrum or Optimism, you're going to get paid in ETH, which is the native token of those L2s. This payment is obviously to incentivize people to continue to run nodes. And they get paid more the more gas you use. So what is gas? Gas is a unit of computational measurement. The more complex your transaction is, the more gas you have to pay. For example, if we hit more details just really quickly, and I zoom in a little bit more, we can see this section here, gas limit and usage by transaction. This means that when we sent this transaction, we limited it to a maximum of 60,000 gas, but in total, we only used 21,000 gas. This 21,000 gas represents how complex this transaction was. It was 21,000 gas units worth of complexity. Now for simple things like sending ether, the units of gas are usually pretty small. For example, 21,000 units of gas is actually a really small amount of gas being sent. But maybe for more complex transactions like minting an NFT, depositing some funds into a DeFi protocol, or deploying a smart contract, those are typically gonna be more expensive transactions because they're more complicated. They have to do more stuff. In the future, we'll introduce you to this concept of EVM codes or op codes. And if you break down a transaction to the lowest level, this assembly op code stuff, you can actually see exactly how much each op code costs in terms of gas. Don't worry about this at all right now. Just know that these transactions are broken down into many, 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 many very, very small instructions. And each instruction has a specific amount of gas. The more instructions usually means more gas. Like I said, we'll explain this much later in the course. Don't worry about this too much here, but just know that we use 21,000 gas. Now, if you take this gas used and multiply it by the gas price in ETH instead of GUE, so we'll take 21,000 and multiply it by this gas price in ETH, not in GUE, and hit enter, we'll see the total transaction fee of the transaction. And you can see that this number does indeed match the transaction fee. For you to understand how much ETH you're going to pay for your transaction, you multiply the gas price times the gas used. Transaction fee equals gas price times gas used. So this means that whoever sent us this 0.1 ETH also paid 0.0000525 blah 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 ETH to a blockchain node to a validator on the Sepolia Ethereum testnet. Now, each blockchain has their own unique way of 
calculating how much transaction fee someone's actually going to pay. For most EVM chains, this is the simple algorithm. It's going to be gas used times gas price. After we understand how the blockchain works more in depth, I'll explain to you what the rest of these values stand for. For now, just know that anytime you make a transaction on chain, you have to pay the validators or the blockchain nodes a little bit of gas or a little bit of the native token of the blockchain, which in our case is ETH. So you have to pay a little bit of ETH to the blockchain nodes providing or sending the transaction. Sometimes I'll refer to this just as transaction gas. Let's look at an example of this ourselves. If we pull up our MetaMask, we go ahead and hit expand view. As we know, we have two different accounts in here. We have account one and account two. Account one has 0.1 Sepolia ETH. Account two has zero Sepolia ETH. If I send 0.05 from account one to account two, how much do you think I'll have left in account one? Let's go ahead and do this. And this is going to be the first transaction that you send on the blockchain, which is incredibly exciting as well. Let's go ahead and hit this send button in our MetaMask. We'll hit send. We'll hit transfer between my accounts. We'll select account two and we'll say 0 0.05 Sepolia ETH. So we started with 0 0.1 Sepolia ETH and we're gonna send 0 0.05 to account two. We'll scroll down, we'll hit next. We can see some information here about what's actually going on. We can see some gas information, which MetaMask automatically prompted for us. And it even gives us the total amount that we're going to be paying in ETH. It's adding this 0 0.05 ETH to the estimated amount of gas that we actually have to spend so that at the bottom it says the amount plus the gas fee is the two of those combined. The value that we're sending plus the gas fee. And additionally in MetaMask, if you select this here, you can get some more information about editing our gas fees. The amount of gas that you choose to spend can be different depending on how many people are making transactions on the blockchain. The more people are sending transactions at the same time, the more expensive gas costs are going to be. So if a lot of other people are also sending transactions right now, the gas price is going to be higher. If a lot of people are sending transactions, that means there's not gonna be enough space for everyone's transaction to get through. So in order to throttle that, they increase the gas price. That's a bit of an oversimplification of what's happening, but if you take that understanding, that'll pretty much work. If you wanna specify exactly how much gas you wanna spend, you can click the advanced tab. If you select zero gas, there's a high likelihood that your transaction will never go through. So we're just gonna go with the default, which is usually a good idea. So let's go ahead and confirm. We now see a send transaction in our queue in the activity tab of our MetaMask, which shows us that we have a transaction currently sending. And if we click on it and click view on block explorer, it'll actually open us up on Etherscan and we'll see, well, mine was a little bit quick, but normally we'll see a little indexing tab and we won't see this having gone through. We'll see it as like indexing or sending or something like that. But after a little bit, it'll actually finish sending. You might have to wait a minute or so for this to actually finish going through, but it looks like mine was really quick. And same as our last transaction, this has a lot of the same information. And if we scroll down, we'll see that, of course, we sent a different amount of ETH, 0 0.05, and we have a different transaction fee. Now, if we pull up our MetaMask, what do you think that we're gonna see? We're gonna go ahead and click expand view again. And we see account one says 0 0.05, and account two also says 0 0.05. Hmm, that's kind of odd. I thought we spent some gas. Well, if we click on the big accounts button, we can see exactly how much ETH is in each account. We can see we have 0 0.0499 in account one and 0 0.05 in account two. And we can see in our activity history, our account one recently sent 0 0.05 ETH and account two recently received 0 0.05 Sepolia ETH. Now here's the best part of all this. Even if you don't want to become a developer, you just learned the basics of sending a transaction and interacting with sites using your MetaMask. Congratulations. Now here's something that's incredibly exciting. With just this little bit of information, you now know how to interact with blockchains and interact with the Ethereum protocol. So if you don't want to learn how to code anything, you can go and you can start interacting with Ethereum and interacting with protocols with just this much information. However, I know most of you guys are here to learn how to code. So let's look under the hood of Ethereum and what is actually going on with these transactions and with these gas and with these blockchains and what's really going on. Let's learn all the fundamentals of a blockchain. Now, if you wanna just go ahead and jump into the coding, go ahead and grab a timestamp from the description. 
However, learning exactly how the blockchain works is going to make you an incredibly powerful developer. So let's take a look at that first. So we're going to be going through this blockchain demo on this site right here. Now, the creator of the site has a fantastic video and a fantastic walkthrough blockchain 101. It is right on their site. So if you're looking for another explanation, definitely check out his video. It is absolutely fantastic. But the first thing that we really need to do in order to understand blockchain, in order to understand really anything and everything that's going on here, we first really need to understand this SHA-256 hash or hashing just kind of in general. Let's first understand what a hash is. A hash is a unique fixed length string meant to identify any piece of data. They are created by putting some piece of data into a hash function. In this example, uh, the hashing algorithm used is SHA-256. Now, Ethereum actually uses uh, this, uh, this right here for its hashing algorithm, which isn't quite um, SHA-256, but is in kind of this SHA family. But it's, it's really just another way to hash things. And uh, the specific hash algorithm doesn't matter uh, so much. So uh, this example uses SHA-256, but you can imagine it's the same as the Ethereum hash. They're just going to you know, result in a different hash. So what's going to happen in this application here is whatever data or whatever information we put into this data section here, as you can see below, this hash changes. So what's happening is this data is running through the SHA-256 hash algorithm, and it's outputting this unique hash. So this hash is a unique fixed length string that's going to identify like a blank data piece here, right? So if I put in, you know, my name, like, you know, Patrick Collins, this is the hash that's going to represent Patrick Collins, right? And you can see, even when I put, you know, tons and tons of data in here, the length of the string doesn't change, right? So it's always going to be the same amount, we can put almost any amount of data in here, there is an upper limit on the max size of the data. But for all intents and purposes, we can pretty much put any length in here. And you'll see too that you know, every time I type in Patrick Collins, this hash is always gonna be this 7E5B, right, I'm going to delete it, I'm gonna do Patrick Collins again, you know, 7E5B, it's always this, this unique hash is always going to be unique, right, it's always gonna be this fixed length string here. So now we can take this idea, right, of putting this data in here, and we can move on to uh, this concept of a block. So with this block concept, we're going to take the exact same thing with this hash, this, this data section, right? But instead of having everything just being in this, this singular data area right here, we're going to split this data up into block, nonce, and data. So all so what we're going to do is we're actually going to hash all three of these to get to get this hash, right? We're going to put all three of these, we're going to say all three of these are combined uh, together, we're going to put every all three of them into this hashing algorithm uh, to figure it out. So if I type a bunch of stuff here, we can see that block one with nonce, you know, this nonce and this data, we're going to get this hash. And as you can see, actually, the screen turns red, this block turned red. Now, what happens when I hit this mind button? When I hit this mind button, it's actually gonna take some time, it's gonna think for a little bit. And we can see that the nonce here actually changed, right? The nonce is different from what it was before. And this hash now starts with four zeros. Okay, and then it, the, the back turned green. When we're, when we're talking about mining, we're talking about miners solving some type of very difficult problem that takes a lot of time to do. Now, in this example here, the problem that uh, the miners had to solve was they had to find a nonce or, or a value in this nonce section that when hashed with at block number one with this data, it would start with four zeros. So the problem here the miners had to solve was to start with four zeros. And the only way for them to really do that is kind of this brute force, you know, trying stuff. So they tried one, okay, one didn't work. Okay, two, nope, two didn't work. Three, nope, four, five, six, okay, five. Well, that started with one zero, but that's not four. And they have to keep trying all these numbers until they uh, get to this one where, you know, let's hit mine again, where it has four zeros at the top, at the start. Now, this specific problem changes blockchain to blockchain, right? Uh, Ethereum has a, a different problem for miners to solve. Um, Bitcoin has different problems for miners to solve, but this concept is gonna be the same. And since Ethereum is proof of stake now, nodes actually take turns solving these problems. Again, we're not gonna go too deep into that right now though. So they have to take, it, it, um, one block is gonna be this, this, uh, this concept, is gonna be all this data, it's gonna be the block number, 
and it's going to be this nunce, right? And so this nunce is the solution, um, is, is going to be the, the number that they use to get like the solution to the problem, right? So if I go to one here, you know, and I do this again, I'm going to hit mine, and the nunce has changed, right? It went from one to 33,128, because this is the nunce that allowed this hash to start with four zeros. And so that's what's happening when uh, blockchain miners are mining, they're going through this process, this very computationally intensive process of trying to find a nunce that fulfills whatever the problem is. So that's really it, actually. So that's a block. And, and that's really what's happening when miners are mining, they're just looking, there's trial and error, brute force trying to find this nunce. So, so now that we know what a block is, let's go to the next step and figure out, okay, well, what's a block chain. So here we have an example of what a block chain is going to look like, right? We have a combination, you know, we have back here in the block section, we have one what one block looks like. Now here we have multiple different blocks, right? Each one of these represents a different block, but we have an additional column here, or we have additional uh, variable here. So like before, you know, we have block, nunce and data, right? We have block, nunce, data, but we also have this thing called previous, right? And so this is actually gonna be pointing to the previous hash of the last block. So for example, if we go to the, the last block in this blockchain, it says previous is 0008E8. And if we look at the hash of block number four, it's 0000AE8. And then we look at its previous, it's uh, four zeros B9, we have four zeros B9, and so on, all the way back to our first block, which has previous of just all zeros, right? And so the block with the previous of all zeros, is going to be known as the Genesis block. So you've probably heard that before the Genesis block, it's the first block in the blockchain, where the previous hash points to a hash that uh, doesn't actually exist. Now, as you can imagine, kind of the same as how this block worked, how the block nunce and data all go through the hashing algorithm. In the blockchain, the block nunce data and previous hash all go through this hashing algorithm to figure out, you know, what the hash is, okay. So if we go to over here, you know, for example, if I type in, you know, Patrick, obviously, this is now no longer valid, right? Because this nunce, uh, combined with the block, the data and the previous hash, aren't going to solve, you know, our problem of having four zeros at the, at the start, right? So I'm going to go ahead and fix that. And, and that's, that's kind of an easy way to, to see it being broken. But, but let's take a look, if I break this block right here, what happens if I if I break the data in here, if I do like Patrick in here, you can see that both of these are now red, both of these are now invalid right? Because the block hashed with the nunce hashed with the new data, which is my name, Patrick hashed with, the hashed with the previous block is now a brand new hash, right? And this block is still pointing to this previous hash right here, right is pointing to this previous block. And now it is wrong, and it is messed up. And now, um, and now it's nunce with this previous hash is also wrong, right? And this is where when we talk about uh, blockchains being immutable, this is exactly how it's immutable, right? Because if I go back and I change anything, you know, if I just typed a right here, the entire blockchain is now invalidated, because none of these are going to have uh, nunces that solve this equation anymore. So this is why blockchains are immutable is because anytime you change one thing, you ruin the rest of the blockchain. Okay. So however, though, you know, if if an A was here originally, we can go ahead and mine these, we can mine all these. But as you can see, you know, this is going to start getting very uh, computationally expensive, because I have to go redo uh, basically the entire blockchain. Uh, and the farther and farther down the line you get the harder and harder it becomes to, you know, rehash and, and redo all these different blockchains here. Now, this makes a lot of sense, right? So we have this blockchain, it's really hard to change something in the past. But if we do, we can just go ahead and remine it. Now, if I'm the one who controls the blockchain, right, if I'm the one who controls this, you know, and, and I want to change something in the past, well, okay, great, all I got to do is change this data here. And then, you know, mine each one of these, you know, obviously, it's going to be very computationally expensive, but it's something that I can do, right, if I'm the one who owns the blockchain. Now, here's where the decentralized nature or the distributed nature really uh, makes it incredibly powerful. So we're going to go to the distributed tab here, which uh, I also refer to as the decentralized tab here, uh, and it's going to show us what a blockchain looks like uh, in a decentralized manner. So we have this exact same uh, initial setup here, we have distributed blockchain, we have, you know, the, our first blockchain, which is kind of exactly as the one from here, but we also have more than one. So we have peer A, peer B, 
and peer C. And when people are talking about peer to peer, peer to peer transactions, they're really talking, uh, this is kind of that concept that they're talking about, right? So we have a number of different peers who are running this blockchain technology. They're all weighted equally, right? Each one of these peers or each one of these nodes, each one of these entities running a blockchain has the exact same power as anybody else. Right. So the way that we can tell very easily which blockchain is correct or which ones are correct are by looking at this end hash here. Right. Or by looking at where we are uh, in the blockchain. Because again, remember, because again, remember this this hash that this this in this last block here is going to encompass all of the blocks from before. Right. Because this last hash is going to have the previous hash here, which includes the previous hash here, which this hash includes the previous hash here. And which, so this last hash is encompasses everything in here, right? And we can look, we can look at the hash of peer C, which is four zeros and then E four B. We can look at the latest hash of peer B, which is four zeros E four B, and then peer A, which is four zeros E four B. So all of these peers, all of these nodes, all of these decentralized, you know, these independent, um, all these independent users running this blockchain software, they're all matched up. It's very easy for their nodes to look at each other and say, hey, great, we are all matched up. Now, what? let's say that A decides that, you know, something happened on the blockchain that they didn't like and they wanted to go back and change something, right? So let's say they change here. You know, obviously, uh, the rest of their blockchain is invalidated and they have to spend a lot of computational power to catch up to speed. So let's go ahead and humor it. Let's say that they they did. They ended up catching up. Uh, they ended up catching up, you know, they ended up mining everything. And now they have a valid blockchain, right? It solves the equation. Awesome. However, in block number three, there's something new, right? This is here and it shouldn't have been here. This is something that peer A put in by themselves. All that happens now is we look at all the blockchains that are running the software and we're looking at all the hashes at hash at block number five. So peer A has this new hash now, 0009BC, but peer B has a different hash, 000E4B, right? So who's right? Is it is it peer A with their new stuff or is it peer B? Well, that's where the decentralized error comes in because then we can look at peer C and peer C also has E4B. So peer B and peer C both say, hey, peer A, you're wrong, get out, right? And peer A will stop being able to participate in the mining rewards because they have essentially forked uh, the blockchain and started their own little blockchain, right, with their own history, because they're the only ones with this, this piece of data in block three, whereas peer B and peer C have nothing in there. So that really shows why uh, in these blockchain worlds, in this decentralized world, there really is no centralized entity, you know, peer A, you know, might have been maliciously motivated to change, you know, this, this block number three. However, democracy rules, right, the majority rules in the blockchain. Peer B and peer C both say, hey, you know, that, that's cute and all peer A, but you're wrong, right? That, that's not right. Now, it might be a little abstract that you just look at data and, you know, us typing kind of random stuff in here and think, okay, yeah, that's that's data, right? That makes sense. You know, it, just kind of random strings in here doesn't really do anything for us. So if we actually go over to the token section here, this is where everything really starts to make a lot of sense. So we have the exact same setup here. Uh, with peer A, peer B, peer C, except the difference is instead of having kind of this, this data section, we have this uh, TX, this transaction section, right? And this represents all the transactions that are happening in this block, right? So we're, we're sending $25 from Darcy to Bingle or to Bingley uh, for uh, $4.27 here, uh, 1922, right? And it's the exact same thing. So this, all these transactions are going to get hashed in the exact same way uh, that the data is going to get hashed. And, and this is why it's so powerful. Because again, you know, if I want to be malicious, right, if, uh, if I want to say, hey, I, I really wanted to give Jane a lot more money from Elizabeth, so I'm peer A, and I go back and I change it to 100. Well, now, you know, not only do I does my whole blockchain uh, get invalidated, because that was so far, uh, so long ago, but I'm not going to match any of these other chains, right. And so my blockchain is going to be excluded from the overall blockchain. So and let's let's go ahead and fix this. And it's the same thing if down here, if I, I become malicious, and I want to send, you know, I want uh, Miss Audrey to have less money, maybe I want to send a dollar, and I go ahead and mind it, the same thing here, this hash now, this 2A1 is not going to match peer B's, 
Peer B's hash of BBA, and it's not going to match Peer C's hash of BBA as well. So the two of them are going to say, hey, this, your blockchain is invalid. It's not matching the majority. You know, you're out, right? So that's really how uh, these blockchains work at a low level. And it all goes back to this, this understanding this hash idea and using it in this very sophisticated manner uh, to kind of cryptographically prove, um, you know, where, where stuff lies. Now, the way the blockchain works is that instead of random stuff put in this data section, it's actually going to be solidity code in here, defining ways to interact with different blocks and different protocols that are on chain, or as we've said before, different smart contracts. Now, the next question that you might be asking is, okay, well, how do I know, how can I be sure that I'm the one, uh, you know, let's say this is, let's say I'm Darcy, right? How can I be sure that I was, that Darcy was the one to actually send this money here? How do we know that Darcy sent $25 to uh, Bingley? Well, this is where we get into uh, private keys and public keys, and that's what we're going to go into now. Let's just do a quick recap of what we've learned in this section so far, right? We've learned that Ethereum actually runs on this Ketchak 256, but you know we used SHA-256 for this demo. It doesn't really matter. We're just talking about hashing algorithms. So again, a hash is a unique fixed length string meant to identify any piece of data. A hash algorithm or a hash function is a function or algorithm that computes any type of data into a unique hash. Mining is going to be the process of finding the solution to the blockchain problem. In our example, the problem was finding a hash that starts with four zeros. Nodes get paid for mining different blocks, and the problem is going to be different blockchain to blockchain. A block in a blockchain is basically a combination of a block, nonce, transaction, and a previous hash to create this unique hash for this block. And again, depending on the blockchain implementation, this might have a couple other fields or might have different fields, but this is essentially what's going on. Blockchains are decentralized and distributed because many independent users are going to run this blockchain software and they will check and they will compare against each other to see which blockchains are acting honestly and which ones are acting maliciously. In the blockchain world, majority rules. The nonce here is the answer used or the number used to get this hash. Now, nonce is kind of an overloaded term. It's actually used for a number of different reasons. In this case, we're using it to solve this problem of getting you know, four or five zeros at the stop of the hash. However, in Ethereum, it'll also be often used as the number of transactions from a given address. So now we're going to talk a little bit about signing these transactions and, and private keys and, and some other cryptography pieces, right? Because in this blockchain demo here, we can see we have all these, these fantastic transactions, right? All these things went through. But how do we know that it was Darcy who was the one to send $25 uh, to Bingley, right? How do we know that actually happened? And this is where all those pieces that we just learned about uh, in our, our testnet, in our MetaMask account, are really going to start to come to life here a little bit here. So here we have an example of public and private keys, okay? At the top, we have this private key, right, that was that was randomly generated. Uh, a private key is, is you know, as it kind of states, is a key that you really want to keep secret because you're going to be using this uh, as kind of your, your secret password for all your transactions, right? I can really pick, you know, any 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 private key, anything that I want. And with it, uh, this algorithm, uh, they're going to use an algorithm, you know, for Ethereum and Bitcoin, they both use this elliptic curve, digital signature uh, algorithm, it's it's a variant of just a digital signature algorithm. And it's going to create this, this public key, right? I'm really not going to go at all into kind of this digital signature algorithm. But just know it, it does use some of these, uh, some of the hash uh, knowledge that we just learned combined with some other pieces. Uh, to kind of get this this public key here. So I'm not going to go too deep into it. But we have this private key that we create, and we get this public key. Now this public key, we want everybody to have access to, right? This is yeah, whole world can see this, this private key, we really want it to be uh, private, we don't want people to see this, we're going to use this private key as like a password to quote, unquote, digitally sign transactions, and then people can verify them with this public key. So let's let's see what this actually looks like. Let's pick a, a random key, a more secure key, right? Because the longer it is, the, the more secure it's going to be. And if we go to signatures now, right? Um, let's say we have this, uh, this message that we want, right? We say high world, right? We want this to be the message. What's going to happen is this private key that we've created, we can use to sign this data, right? Remember how in the blockchain demo, 
you know, we were kind of we were hashing stuff, right? We were we we're using this uh, SHA-256 hash to, to get this hash. Well, we're doing something similar, but instead of hashing, we're, we're using this digital signature algorithm to create this message signature. Now, what's really powerful about how this, uh, this algorithm works is that you can create this message signature with your private key, but somebody else can't derive your private key from the message signature. And that's what makes this really, really powerful. However, if we go to verify using this public key, right? Uh, and so this is the, this is that 0403, this is that same public key. Using this, uh, using this public key, anybody can verify, oh, let's go ahead and sign it again. Anybody can verify that this signature is yours, right? So you have a public, a private key just for you. So you can sign things and a public key so that anybody can verify something, right? So anybody can verify this. And let's say somebody tries to fake a transaction from you. They say, hey, you know, this is, this is, this is their transaction. Um, all they have to do is verify that this signature against your uh, public key and very easily, this whole thing turns red because uh, it isn't verified, right? The, the algorithm says, hey, uh, -uh that's wrong. So we can go ahead and take that into transactions in this exact same way. So if I want to send money, you know, if I want to send $400 from, you know, my address to another address, using my private key, I can sign that transaction. And anybody else in the world can then verify this transaction, right? And this is why when people say, hide your keys, you know, protect your keys, this is what we're talking about. In our accounts here, right, if we go to uh, settings, and again, the only reason that I'm showing you guys my mnemonic and my private key is because this is a uh, this is a, a dumpster account. I'm going to throw this away at the end of this video, or I'm just not going to put any real money in it. Um, but when we look at our, our our MetaMask here, we have this mnemonic phrase which allows us to easily get these different private keys, right? So uh, mnemonic phrase combined uh, with you know uh, whatever account number will get us a private key. So mnemonic phrase combined with one, we're going to get this private key. And this is when we look at account details, export private key, password confirm. This is going to be the private key that we're going to use to sign our transactions, right? This, if anybody else gets access to this private key, they then can sign transactions for us and they can send transactions for us. And that's why we want to keep these private. So uh, they, it works the exact same way, right? And if, so this is why it's so important to hide your private keys and hide your mnemonics. Now, your Ethereum address is actually uh, a piece uh, is actually a piece of your public key. Now, to get our address in Ethereum, all we have to do is take this public key that we've created with our private key, hash it using that same Ethereum hashing algorithm, and then take the last twenty bytes, and that's how we'll actually derive to our um, to our address here. Now, knowing the exact methodology of how to get the address doesn't really matter because it could change blockchain to blockchain and could even change in ETH2. Um, but just know that that is essentially how kind of these addresses are derived, right? There's some derivative of the public key, right? Because the public key is public and, you know, uh, using the public key in kind of any public way is, is totally fine, um, but not the private key. So that is how we sign our transactions. Note though, this isn't how we send the transactions. So, so this is just going to sign it, create a transaction for us to send. Uh, we'll learn later on how to send these transactions. Whew, so that was a lot of information there too. Let's do a quick recap. Your public key is derived by using a digital signature algorithm on your private key, right? And you want to keep your private key private at all times because you're going to use your private key to sign transactions. Signing transactions with your private key, you are the only one who can actually do this because you can't get the private key from a message signature. However, using your public key, you can anybody can very easily verify that a signature that's signed by you is in fact signed by you. In our MetaMask, our private keys are located in this account details section. You just hit uh, show private keys and type in your password and you'll get your, your private key here. And the address of your account is derived from this private key uh, and it's derived from this public key. So if you think about it, your private key creates your public key, which then can create your address. And there's a little barrier or a big barrier here. 
because your private key you want to keep private and your public key and your address can all be public information. Now, remember how in our MetaMask, we were able to actually create new accounts. Mine says account six because I've created actually a few, but how was it actually creating those accounts? Well, now that we know all this, if we go back to our blockchain demo here, what our MetaMask is doing is essentially taking our mnemonic or, or that multi-word secret phrase and then just hashing it with some number. So secret phrase plus zero gets this and it'll set this as your private key. And for our account one, that'll be the private key or maybe it's plus one, the exact algorithm that it's using doesn't matter. But if you wanna create a new private key where you just hit this create account button, the way it actually picks this account is by taking this secret phrase and then just changing this number. So if I go, if I'm in my MetaMask, I do create account. This right now I'm on account six because like I said, I made a whole bunch. If I make account six, right? It's as if we just did the secret phrase plus six and created this new hash or this new private key and created this new hash and it uses this to make a private key. And this is why in your MetaMask, if you share that secret phrase, if you share that mnemonic device, they will have access to all the accounts that you ever created. However, if you share your private key, it will just give them access to that single account. Secret phrase has access to all the accounts created in your MetaMask or your wallet. Your private key is access to that single account and the public key or address anybody can have access to and it's cool for anybody to have access to. So when I'm thinking about the security of my MetaMask or my wallet, this is kind of the order that I think of it in. The seed phrase or mnemonic or secret phrase is incredibly important. Protect this at all costs because if somebody else gets access to this, they will have access to all of your accounts. The second most important is the private key because if somebody gets access to that, they will get access to a single account and then your public key, your address, which whatever, it's public. Now that we know a little bit more about what's going on underneath the hood of these blockchains, let's go back at our transactions and look at this gas thing again. And we'll look to see what's actually happening here. Gas in particular can be a little bit tricky to wrap your head around. So if you don't get it right away, don't worry. As we go through examples, it'll start to make more sense. So before I was saying, let's just look at this transaction fee bit, which is the cost associated with running this transaction. If I scroll over this on Etherscan, I can see this thing that says block base fee per gas plus max priority fee per gas times the gas use, which might be a little bit confusing here. Let's actually break down what's going on on Ethereum with EIP 1559 in place. And again, this is gonna be specific to Ethereum as every blockchain might do it a little bit differently. But if we click to see more, we can see a number of useful values here. We can see gas limit is 21,000 and usage is 21,000. So this transaction used 21,000 gas and we sent 21,000 gas along with it. Sometimes when sending a transaction, depending on when it's sent and depending on what the specific instructions are, it might actually use way more gas than what you want it to use. So with your transactions, you can actually set a limit. Hey, I don't want to use more than X amount of gas. I don't want to do more than X computational units. And in fact, if we go to our MetaMask and we click send to transfer between accounts again, and we pick, you know, 0.01 ETH or something. Next, we can actually hit this little button here, go to advanced, and we can actually edit some specifics of this transaction. One of them is gonna be the gas limit. We can change this gas limit to maybe 2200, 2300, or more or even less. Since sending Ethereum takes exactly 21,000 gas, MetaMask just defaults to setting it to that. But we also see these other interesting things. We see a priority fee and a max base fee. Let's reject this transaction and let's look back at Etherscan to talk about these. So currently in Ethereum, according to e EIP1559, every transaction on Ethereum comes with something called the base fee. This is the minimum gas price you need to set to include your transaction. And you'll notice that these are priced in something called GUI. So what is a GUI? If we come to the site ethconverter.com, and again, there's a link to this in the GitHub repository, we scroll down, we can see GUI, GUI, and Ether. If I put one Ether in here, I can see how much one Ether is in terms of GUI and in terms of way. One Ether is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, nine zeros. So that's that's one billion GUI is going to be one ether, and then 
1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, and then 18 zeros is away. These are just easier ways of referring to really, really small amounts of Ethereum. So if we look at our gas fees, we see that the base fee is 0 0.0000004 guay. And this obviously would be an even smaller number if this was in units of way. So if we take this number and we put it into our calculator, we can see that this is equal to 40 way or 0 0.0000, a whole bunch of zeros for ether. The max fee here refers to the maximum gas fee that we're willing to pay for this transaction. And you can actually see that our max fee is a little bit higher than what we actually ended up paying. Our max fee was 2.2132 something something, and the gas price we actually paid was up here. Now your transaction might, of course, be a little bit different. Then additionally, we have a max priority fee. This is gonna be the max gas fee that we're willing to pay, plus the max tip that we're willing to give to miners. Now currently in Ethereum, this base fee ends up getting burnt. And we can see on Etherscan exactly how much is getting burnt here. And if we pull up our calculator again, we can grab this gas fee, multiply it by the amount of gas we used, and we can see that this is indeed how much Ethereum we actually ended up burning. We go back to Ethereum Converter, paste it in, we can see that these two numbers are indeed equal. This means whenever you send a transaction, a little bit of Ethereum is removed from circulation forever or it's considered burnt. So currently in Ethereum, part of your Ethereum, part of your transaction fee actually gets burnt, and then the other part goes directly to miners. So to figure out exactly how much went to miners, we could do this number minus the burnt amount, and this is how much Ethereum was paid to an Ethereum miner for this transaction. You'll see down here, transaction type two, EIP-1559. This is the EIP-1559 version of these transactions. Like I said, every blockchain is gonna have a different fee burning and, and fee and gas process. And they're all gonna be a little bit different. But the sum of it is, blockchains have limited block space for transactions. The gas price that costs for your transaction to be included in one of these blocks changes based off how much demand there is. The base gas fee for Ethereum will go up and down depending on how many people are sending transactions and how many people want to be included in a block. If a ton of people want to be included in a block, that means a ton of gas is obviously going to get burnt. We've left a link to a video in the GitHub repository with this section from this YouTuber who does an amazing job breaking down this EIP-1559 and more about how this gas model actually works. I highly recommend you pause this video and watch that video to understand more. The base fee gets programmatically, algorithmically adjusted to try to target for all the blocks to be 50% full. If they're more than 50% full, this base fee automatically goes up. If they're less than 50% full, this base fee goes down. Now, this is a lot of the basics of how this transaction works, and it can be a little confusing. So let's do a quick refresher of everything in here. There's a unique transaction hash that uniquely identifies this transaction on this blockchain. We can see the status. We can see the block number that it's confirmed on. One other thing we want to look at, if we scroll up, we see block number and block confirmations. This is how many blocks have been mined since this block was included. Like we saw with our blockchain demo, the longer the blockchain gets, the harder it is to tamper with and the more secure it is. Typically, you'll see some processes say they'll only do something after 20 block confirmations, 30 block confirmations, or, or et cetera. The reason that they wait for these block confirmations is because they wanna make sure that that transaction is actually included. And we can actually see the block that our transaction was included in and all the other transactions with it different details about how much gas was used, the gas limit, et cetera. Timestamp is when the transaction happened. We can see from and to, we can see the value, and then we can see the transaction fee, which we see right here is block base fee per gas, plus the max priority fee per gas times the gas used, and we see all the details of the gas down here. Gas price is the cost of one unit of gas, Gas limit is the max amount of units of gas that we're willing to pay in this transaction. The usage is how many actually got used. The base fee is going to be the base network fee per gas, so 40 way per one gas used. The max gas is the 
max gas price we're willing to pay. And max priority is going to be the max gas price plus the tip that we give to miners. And then we can see how much is burnt. And then we see transaction savings, which, which is the difference between how much was actually used or paid for and then returned. So for example, in this transaction, the gas price we ended up picking was a little less than our max gas price here. So the gas price we ended up using was a little less than our max priority fee here. So we had some savings compared to that. We can also see that this was an EIP 1559 transaction. We can see our nunce here, which was nunce zero because the transaction that I'm showing is our first nunce. And then of course we can see the input data. For transactions that are just sending Ethereum, the input data is gonna be blank. But you'll see that when we get to smart contracts, the input data is not gonna be blank and it's gonna be one of the most important features of these transactions. You'll also notice that there's a state tab. This is an advanced tab and it shows the different states that are changed based off of this transaction. We're gonna ignore this one for now. Now that we know how the blockchain itself works under the hood, let's talk about some blockchain fundamentals. And we actually covered all these topics in a previous Free Code Camp video. So let's go to that. If the first time you listen to this, some of these concepts seem a little bit hard to grasp, don't worry about it. As we continue and as we move on with this course, they'll start to make more sense when you see them used in real examples. I definitely would recommend going back and re-watching and re-listening to the parts that you don't quite get and asking questions in the discussions tab of the GitHub repository. Awesome. So now that we know all the cryptography pieces and all the little nitty gritties of how the blockchain actually works and how our signatures work and how everything sticks together, let's talk a little bit about how this works in actuality and what's really going on. Now for a lot of this, each different blockchain has slightly different algorithms and slightly different metrics and criteria for doing a lot of this stuff. So when we're talking about these specific implementations, keep in mind the exact algorithm might be a little bit different, but the concepts are all still gonna be exactly the same. Hashing and a hash function is gonna be the same no matter where you look. A decentralized blockchain is gonna be the same no matter where you look. How it's actually implemented is gonna be a little bit different. Now, traditionally, when you run an application, you know, be it a website or something that connects to some server, you are interacting with a centralized entity. And unlike how we saw with the blockchain with multiple different peers, it's going to be run by a single centralized group. Now, it still could be run on many different servers, but all those servers are still gonna be controlled by the same centralized group. Blockchains, as we saw, run on a network of different independent nodes. When we saw peer A, peer B, peer C, those were different examples of different independent users running the blockchain technology on their own node. Now, when I use the term node, I'm usually referring to a single instance of a decentralized system. So when I say a single node, when I'm talking about a blockchain, I'm talking about one of those peer A's, peer B's, peer C's running that blockchain software. I'm talking about one server running this technology. And again, it's this network, it's this combination of these nodes interacting with each other that creates this entire blockchain. What makes these so potent too, is that anybody can join the network and that's why there's decentralized. The barrier to entry is a little bit of hardware requirements, you getting the correct materials to run the software and then you running the software. Anybody can join these networks and participate and that's what makes it truly decentralized. In fact, you can go to GitHub right now and run your own Ethereum node in a few seconds. Now in the traditional world, applications are run by centralized entities. And if that entity goes down, or is maliciously bribed or decides that they want to shut off, they just can't because they're the ones that control everything. Blockchains, by contrast, don't have this problem. If one node or one entity that runs several nodes goes down, since there are so many other independent nodes running that it doesn't matter, the blockchain and the system will persist so long as there is at least one node always running. And luckily for us, most of the most popular chains like Bitcoin and Ethereum have thousands and thousands of nodes. And as we showed in our demo, if one node acts maliciously, all the other nodes will ignore that node and kick that out or, or even punish it in some systems because they can easily check everybody else's node and see, mm, okay, this one is out of sync with the majority. And yes, majority rules when it comes to the blockchain. Each blockchain keeps a full list of every transaction and interaction that's happened on that blockchain. And we saw if a node tries to act maliciously, then all their hashes are gonna be way out of whack and they're not gonna match everybody else. This gives blockchains this incredibly potent immutability trait 
where nothing can be changed or corrupted. So in essence, we can think of a blockchain as a decentralized database. And with Ethereum, it has an extra additional feature where it also can do computation in a decentralized manner. Now let's talk consensus, proof of work, and proof of stake, because you've probably heard these before and they're really important to how these blockchains actually work. When we went through that blockchain example and we did that mining feature, this is what's known as proof of work. Proof of work and proof of stake fall under this umbrella of consensus. And consensus is a really important topic when it comes to blockchains. Consensus is defined as the mechanism used to reach an agreement on the state or a single value on the blockchain, especially in a decentralized system. I briefly alluded to this consensus mechanism in our blockchain example when I said, if one changes something and the other two don't, then majority will rule and kick that one out. This is part of that consensus mechanism. Now, very roughly, a consensus protocol in a blockchain or decentralized system can be broken down into two pieces, a chain selection algorithm and a civil resistance mechanism. That mining piece that we were doing, or, or the proof of work algorithm, is what's known as a civil resistance mechanism. And this is what Ethereum and Bitcoin currently use. Please note that depending on when you're watching this, if ETH2 is out, then it's no longer proof of work. Now, one of the other reasons that I absolutely love working in this industry is that we are changing things and we are building things and we are growing this network all the time. And as of September of 2022, Ethereum chain actually migrated from proof of work to proof of stake in an event called the merge. And I actually stayed up till 3 a.m. to watch this event. It was a ton of fun watching, watching all the little nodes work together and do this change and actually go live. But in any case, Ethereum actually moved from proof of work to a proof of state network. Now, proof of work is known as a civil resistance mechanism because it defines a way to figure out who is the block author? Which node is going to be the node who did the work to find that mine and be the author of that block so all the other nodes can verify that it's accurate? Civil resistance is a blockchain's ability to defend against users creating a large number of pseudo-anonymous identities to gain a disproportionately advantageous influence over said system. And in layman's terms, it's basically a way for a blockchain to defend against somebody making a bunch of fake blockchains so that they can get more and more rewards. Now, there are two types of the civil resistance mechanisms that we're going to talk about here, namely proof of work and proof of stake. Let's talk about proof of work a little bit more in depth first. In proof of work, this is civil resistant because a single node has to go through a very computationally expensive uh, process called mining, which we demonstrated earlier, to figure out the answer to the blockchain's riddle of finding that correct nonce or or whatever the blockchain system has in place. In proof of work, this works because no matter how many pseudo anonymous accounts you make, each one still has to undergo this very computationally expensive activity of finding the answer to the proof of work problem or the proof of work riddle, which again, in our demonstration, it was finding a nonce with that first four zeros. But again, each blockchain might change the riddle or, or change the problem to be a little bit different. In fact, some of these blockchains make this riddle intentionally hard or intentionally easy to change what's called the block time. The block time is how long it takes between blocks being published. And it's proportional to how hard these algorithms are. So these problems actually can change depending on how long they want the block time to be. If a system wants the block time to be very, very long, they just make the problem very, very hard. If they want it to be very short, they make the problem a lot easier. We'll talk about Sybil attacks in a little bit and how they can affect the system. But with proof of work, it's a verifiable way to figure out who the block author is and be civil resistant. Now, you need to combine this with a chain selection rule, create this consensus. Now, there's some consensus protocols that have more features, but very, very roughly, these are the two pieces that we're going to look at. The second piece is going to be a chain selection rule. How do we know which blockchain is actually the real blockchain and the true blockchain? Now, Bitcoin uses a consensus algorithm called Nakamoto Consensus, which uses a combination of proof of work, civil resistance, and the longest chain rule, which is their chain selection rule. Now, I do want to point out that when you go out and you leave this course and you leave the curriculum, a lot of people will just say Bitcoin's consensus algorithm is proof of work. And this is technically a little bit inaccurate. Proof of work is just a piece of Bitcoin's consensus algorithm, where the actual consensus algorithm is called Nakamoto consensus, which includes that combination of the longest chain rule and the proof of work civil resistance. I just want to give you the heads up that in the real world, a lot of people will use them interchangeably. It's not exactly correct, but 
we'll give them a pass. The decentralized network decides that whichever blockchain has the longest chain or the most number of blocks on it is going to be the chain that they use. This makes a lot of sense because every additional block that a chain is behind, it's going to take more and more computation for it to come up. That's why when we saw in our transaction, we actually saw confirmations. The number of confirmations is the number of additional blocks added on after our transaction went through in a block. So if we see confirmations as two, it means that the block that our transaction was in has two blocks ahead of it in the longest chain. Now, I do want to point out that a lot of people use proof of work as a consensus protocol. And I do want to say that this is a little bit inaccurate, but sometimes people use it interchangeably. Proof of work is a piece of the overall consensus protocol, which in Bitcoin and Ethereum 1's current case is Nakamoto consensus. Nakamoto consensus is a combination of proof of work and this longest chain rule, both equally and very, very important. Now, proof of work also tells us where these transaction fees and these block rewards go to. Remember how when we made this transaction, we had to talk about gas and a transaction fee. So who's getting paid? Who is getting this transaction? And this transaction fee is going to the miners or the validators. In a proof of work network, they're called miners. And in the proof of stake network, they're called validators. They are a little bit different. And we'll get into that when we talk about proof of stake. In this proof of work system, all these nodes are competing against each other to find the answer to the blockchain riddle. Remember, in our example, it was to find a hash that has four zeros at the start. And again, depending on the blockchain implementation, that riddle is going to be a little bit different. But all the nodes are trying as many as possible to try to get this answer first. Why? Because the first node to figure out the answer to the blockchain rule is going to get that transaction fee. They're going to get paid from that. Now, when a node gets paid, they actually get paid in two different ways. One is going to be with a transaction fee, and another piece is going to be the block reward. Remember how we talked about alternating the gas price or the GUI on our transaction? Well, that's the transaction fee that we're going to pay to these blockchain nodes for including our transaction. The block reward is given to these nodes from the protocol, from the blockchain itself. You've probably heard of the Bitcoin halving before. The halving is referring to this block reward getting cut in half, and it's supposed to be cut in half roughly every four years. This block reward increases the circulating amount of whatever cryptocurrency that is being rewarded. For example, on Ethereum, the block reward is giving out Ethereum. And on Bitcoin, the block reward is giving out Bitcoin. So these nodes are competing against each other to be the first one to find this transaction, to be the first one to find the answer to this problem so that they can be the ones to win both this block reward and your transaction fee. Some blockchains, like Bitcoin, for example, have a set time when they're no longer going to give out block rewards and the miners or the nodes are only going to get paid from transaction fees. Now, this gas fee, again, is paid by whoever initialized the transaction. When we got our funds from the faucet, there was some server and somebody else was paying the transaction fee for us. However, when we sent Ether from one account to another, our first account actually paid some transaction fee to send that Ether. In proof of stake, there's also a gas fee, but it's paid out to validators instead of miners. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. Now, let's talk about two types of attacks that can happen in these blockchain worlds. Let's talk about the first one being the Sybil attack. The Sybil attack is when a user creates a whole bunch of pseudo-anonymous accounts to try to influence a network. Now, obviously, on Bitcoin and Ethereum, this is really, really difficult because a user needs to do all this work in proof of work or have a ton of collateral in proof of stake, which, again, we'll talk about in a bit. The other more prevalent attack is what's known as a 51% attack. Now, as we saw as part of our consensus protocol, these blockchains are going to agree that the longest chain is the one that they're going to go with, so long as it matches up with 51% of the rest of the network. This means that if you have the longest chain and you have more than 51% of the rest of the network, you can do what's called a fork in the network and bring the network onto your now longest chain. Now, Sybil attacks obviously are when a single node or a single entity tries to affect the decentrality of the network by pretending to be multiple different people, although they're just the same person or entity. And like I said, it's really difficult to do in proof of work and proof of stake. So you can see now that blockchains are very democratic. Whichever blockchain has the most buy-in and is the longest is the blockchain that the whole system is going to corroborate. When nodes produce a new block and add it to the longest chain, the other nodes will follow this longest chain that the rest of the network is agreeing with, add those blocks to their chain, and follow up. So very small reorganizations are actually pretty common when a blockchain picks a block from a different longest chain, puts it on, and then has to 
swap it out for another block and, and continue with a different blockchain. However, if a group of nodes had enough nodes or enough power, they could essentially be 51% of the network and influence the network in whatever direction that they wanted. This is what's known as a 51% attack, and it's happened on blockchains like Ethereum Classic, which is not Ethereum. This is why the bigger a blockchain is, the more decentralized and the more secure it becomes. So after you watch this video and you become a blockchain engineering expert, I definitely recommend you run a node as well because you are going to increase the security of the network as a whole by running a node. So proof of work is fantastic because it allows us to very easily protect against these Sybil attacks and keep our blockchains decentralized and secure. However, it has some drawbacks as well. Proof of work costs a lot of electricity because every single node is running as fast as they can to win this race to get the rewards. This leads to obviously an environmental impact. Now, since proof of work and Nakamoto consensus, a lot of other protocols have taken this idea and gone in a different direction with a different civil resistance protocol. A lot of them with the intention to be a lot more environmentally friendly. And the most popular one right now is proof of stake. There are some chains that are already using this proof of stake protocol and that are live and thriving. Some of them are like Avalanche Solana, Polygon, Polkadot. So let's talk about proof of stake now. Again, this is a different civil resistance mechanism. Instead of solving this difficult problem, proof of stake nodes put up some collateral that they're going to behave honestly, AKA they stake. In the example of Ethereum 2, nodes put up some Ethereum as a stake that they're going to behave honestly in the network. If they misbehave in the network, they are going to be slashed or removed some of their stake. Obviously, this is a very good civil resistance mechanism because if you try to create a whole bunch of anonymous accounts, then each one of those accounts, you have to put up some stake. And if you misbehave, you're going to run the risk of losing all the money that you put up as collateral. In this system, miners are actually called validators because they're no longer binding anything. They're actually just validating other nodes. Now, unlike proof of work, which every node is racing to be the first one to find the block, in proof of stake, nodes are actually randomly chosen to propose the new block. And then the rest of the validators will validate if that node has proposed the block honestly. As we saw with our cryptography lesson, it's usually very easy for other nodes to verify if a proposal or a transaction is honest. Now, proof of stake obviously has some pros and cons as well. Pros are that, again, it is a great civil resistance mechanism and a great way to figure out who the author of a block should be. The other pros are that it's way less computationally expensive to figure out the new block. Because instead of every single node on the network trying to do this, only one node needs to do this. And then the rest of the nodes just need to validate it. The cons are that it's usually considered a slightly less decentralized network due to the upfront staking costs it costs to participate. Now this gets into a little bit of a philosophical battle on how decentralized is decentralized enough. And I think that's up to the community to decide. And as we progress, I think we'll learn more and more about how decentralized is decentralized enough. The general consensus amongst blockchain engineers though, is that proof of stake is very, very decentralized and very secure. Now there's another term that might be the first time you heard it, a layer one. We're gonna talk about layer ones and layer twos in terms of scalability really quickly as well. A layer one refers to any base layer blockchain implementation. Bitcoin's a layer one, Ethereum's a layer one, Avalanche is a layer one. These are the base layer blockchain solutions. A layer two is any application that is added on top of a layer one, added on top of a blockchain. Some examples of layer twos are gonna be Chainlink, Arbitrum, or Optimism. Arbitrum and Optimism are very interesting because they are layer twos that also look to solve this scalability issue. Arbitrum and Optimism are what's known as rollups, and they roll up their transactions into a layer one, like Ethereum. We're not going to go too deep into rollups and how they actually work, but all you really need to know is that they solve some of the scalability issues by being another blockchain that people can make transactions on, still on kind of this base Ethereum layer. Now they're different from side chains because side chains derive their security from their own protocols. Rollups derive their security from the base layers. So Arbitrum and Optimism, for example, is gonna be just about as secure as Ethereum. We're gonna let Kira go deeper into these layer ones and these layer twos and these rollups and all the differences between these in a later lesson. All right, so we just talked about a lot of stuff. So let's do a quick recap before moving on. Sybil attacks are prevented due to protocols like proof of work and proof of stake. 51% attacks grow increasingly harder with the size of blockchain, so you should run a node. Consensus is the mechanism that allows a blockchain to agree upon what the state of the blockchain is. Sharding and rollups 
are solutions to scalability issues on layer ones. A layer one is any base blockchain implementation, like Bitcoin or Ethereum. A blockchain scalability problem is that there's not always enough block space for the amount of transactions that want to get in them. This leads to very high gas prices. And again, gas prices are how much it costs to interact with a blockchain. Whew. So that's it for the blockchain basics and the blockchain explainers. With just this information, you now can go off into the world and start working with blockchains and interacting with blockchains with at least some level of knowledge as to what's going on. You should be incredibly proud of yourself for just making it this far. Definitely be sure to give yourself a pat on the back and a round of applause. Now that we've gotten a lot of the basics and the fundamentals out of the way, let's start jumping into the coding aspect. This is where you're going to learn how to actually build these smart contracts, how to build these trust minimized agreements in these blockchains and in these smart contract platforms. This next section, this solidity basics, the solidity fundamental section will give you all the skills to start actually coding solidity and understanding how these smart contracts work underneath the hood. So at this point, absolutely give yourself a high five, maybe say hi in the GitHub discussions, maybe say hi in the community on Twitter, on Reddit, etc., and be proud of just making it this far. The journey has really only just begun, but you've already learned so much. Let's begin the next section and let's jump into the code. Throughout this course so far, we've briefly mentioned a couple of terms, layer one or L1, layer two or L2, and roll up. So Patrick mentioned earlier that we'll be working on Sepolia to deploy our smart contracts and interact with them throughout this course. But we will also be deploying to and interacting with our contracts on ZK Sync Sepolia. Sepolia is a layer one or L1 testnet. And ZK Sync Sepolia is a layer two or L2 roll up. But what do these terms actually mean? So a layer one or L1 is a blockchain in its purest form, where there are nodes that contribute to civil resistance and help the chain reach consensus, as Patrick was describing earlier. The L1 is the base layer of the blockchain ecosystem that works without any additional plugins. It's often referred to as the settlement layer because it's the layer of a blockchain ecosystem that all plugins, layers, or additional components eventually write back to. Examples of L1 chains include Bitcoin, BNB chain, Solana, Avalanche. Ethereum is the chain that we'll be most commonly working with throughout this course. And when we talk about layer ones or L ones, we're most often referring to Ethereum. You can think of this L1 as like the hub of the ecosystem. For example, in the EVM or Ethereum ecosystem, the Ethereum mainnet is that hub of the ecosystem. And anything that hooks back into Ethereum is known as a layer two or L2. So a layer two is anything that is built on top of the L1. Makes sense, right? The first layer of the ecosystem is the layer one. The second layer of the ecosystem is the layer two. It's important to note here that apps deployed to the L1 are not considered L2s. For example, the popular decentralized exchange Uniswap is not considered to be an L2, but an app deployed on Ethereum. This means that its smart contracts are directly deployed on Ethereum. A layer two or L2 is any application that is built outside of the L1 and then hooks back into it. There are different types of L2s, such as L2 applications, for example, Chainlink. Like Patrick was describing earlier, Chainlink is a decentralized Oracle network that brings off-chain data on-chain in a decentralized way. Another type of L2 is event indexing networks like the Graph, which enables applications to access on-chain data. But the most popular type of L2 is an L2 chain or rollup. And when people mention L2s or layer twos, they are most often referring to rollups. But what actually is a roll-up, apart from the fruit snack for you Americans out there? Blockchain roll-ups are an L2 scaling solution that increase the number of transactions on Ethereum without increasing the gas costs. This is achieved by rolling up multiple transactions into one, hence the name roll-up. We'll explain a bit more about how this actually works in a second, but first it's important to understand why we need L2 chains or roll-ups. So in an ideal world, we need blockchain systems to have three properties. We need them to be decentralized, i.e. not controlled by a single centralized entity. We need them to be secure. 
So the system is protected against security vulnerabilities, like 51% attacks, where a malicious actor has control over a majority of the network, over 51%. Sybil attacks, where a malicious actor creates multiple nodes to gain control again by having a majority. Both of these attacks mean that the malicious actor can control the network to pass through any transactions they like or reorder transactions. And also replay attacks where the same transactions are sent more than once. If you don't understand how these vulnerabilities work, do not worry, but we will leave some resources in the GitHub associated with this course, if you would like to know more. And finally, scalable, meaning that the system can grow with without sacrificing speed or running costs. This is known as the blockchain trilemma. The blockchain trilemma states that a blockchain system can only ever have two out of three of these properties. For example, if the system is secure and decentralized, then scalability will be sacrificed as is the case with Ethereum. Ethereum inherently has a scalability problem. It can only process approximately 15 transactions per second. And as Ethereum is gaining in popularity, the number of transaction requests is increasing. The gas cost to pay for these transactions is increasing to jump the queue and avoid long wait times. If blockchain systems are to reach mainstream adoption, gas prices need to be reduced, even in the face of high transaction volumes. Enter rollups. Rollups aim to solve the trilemma problem by increasing the throughput of Ethereum without sacrificing either the decentralization or the security of the system. This is achieved by processing the transactions off of the L1 blockchain. And how does this work? When a user submits a transaction to a rollup, such as ZK Sync, an operator picks up this transaction. An operator is a general term and it can refer to a node, a set of components or entity responsible for processing the transactions. This operator's job is to pick up the transactions, order them with other people's transactions and then bundle them together, compress them and then submit them back to the L1, such as Ethereum. And so if Ethereum rolls back, so does the roll-up. Therefore, they have the security of Ethereum. By bundling the transactions together, this enables roll-ups to handle transactions efficiently because the gas costs associated with the transaction is split among all of the users, all of the transactions in the transaction batch. The validity of this transaction is then checked on the L1. And this can work a little differently depending on the type of roll-up. There are two main types of roll-up and the difference between these two lies in how the roll-up checks the validity of the transaction how they check it is legitimate rather than fraudulent. The two main types of rollup are optimistic rollups and zero knowledge or ZK rollups. Let's start with optimistic rollups. Optimistic rollups assume that the off-chain transactions are valid by default. They're pretty optimistic. Operators can propose what they believe to be the valid state of the rollup chain. After this, there is a time period known as the challenge period, during which operators can, you guessed it, challenge the rollup transaction. Operators can send a challenge by computing a fraud proof. If they notice a potentially fraudulent transaction. This fraud proof involves the operator playing a call and response game with another operator until they narrow down the dispute to a single computational step. This computational step is then executed on the L1. And if executing this step results in a different outcome, the state of the blockchain is different. The challenging or disputing operator wins the challenge and the fraud proof succeeds. If the proof succeeds, the rollup will re-execute the batch of transactions and the operator responsible for the incorrect transaction inclusion will be penalized. This is usually done using some kind of staking mechanism where operators send tokens to a smart contract that are held to say, yep, I'm gonna act honestly. And then if they don't, their tokens are taken away from them. This is known as slashing, which Patrick has mentioned previously. And this works the same on optimistic rollups. If the transaction proposals are not invalidated during that challenge period, then the proposals are assumed to be correct. So now let's move on to zero knowledge or ZK rollups. Zero knowledge or ZK rollup solutions prove each transaction batch to be correct using validity proofs or ZK proofs. ZK proofs in this context are a complex mathematical cryptographic problem. And at this stage, we do not need to understand how they work. We can just think of them purely as some math magic that just works. ZK proofs involve two participants. The prover, which is the entity that is trying to prove that they know something 
something. And the verifier, which is the entity that is verifying that the prover does in fact know the answer to the problem. The answer to the problem is often referred to in ZK proof world as the witness. In the context of ZK rollups, the prover is an operator and the verifier is just an L1 contract. So for each transaction batch that is submitted to the L1, a validity or ZK proof is computed by a prover and verified by the verifier or the L1 contract. This ZK proof then confirms the transaction validity. As we said, this is just some maths magic, but if you'd like to understand a little bit more about how that works, we will leave some references in the GitHub repo. But essentially what happens, the problem is boiled down to a single mathematical equation, meaning that the prover can then prove that their input satisfy this problem. And then the verifier can say, yes, the output is as expected and the proof succeeds. But again, you don't need to understand how that works at this time. You can literally just think of it as some math magic. And so to summarize, rollups help scale Ethereum by processing transactions off chain, bundling them together, and then submitting them back to Ethereum with some kind of proof, which is different depending on whether it is an optimistic rollup or a ZK rollup. One of the types of operators associated with rollups is a sequencer. The sequencer usually refers to the operator, which is ordering transactions and sometimes bundling them together. Now, in some rollups, this sequencer is in fact centralized. So it's controlled by a centralized entity. This can be problematic because it can lead to things like censorship, where the centralized entity is stopping some users' transactions from being passed, or it can manipulate the order of transactions for their own gain. So something like you being unable to withdraw because they're blocking your withdrawal transaction could occur. The other issue is that if the sequencer is centralized, then if the sequencer goes down, then no one will be able to pass through any transactions at all. Withdrawals can't happen. And this can be extremely problematic because what if withdrawals are halted for a day, a week, a year? forever. Are the funds then worth anything if you can't withdraw them? And these are just a few problems with sequences being centralized. And this is why projects like ZK Sync are working right now to decentralize their sequences. L2 chains or rollups are graded based on certain properties and given a stage. Now for this section, we are going to be going through the L2 beat website, which you can see at l2beat.com slash scaling slash summary. And here you can see all of the different chains, their stages and lots of different information that we will be going through in a second. So the stage of a rollup is a categorization framework based on Vitalik's proposed milestones. It is an opinionated assessment on the maturity of the rollup by the L2 beat team and its purpose to create an incentive for projects to work towards decentralization. And they have proposed three stages. Stage zero, full training wheels. In stage zero, the operators and a security council predominantly manage the rollup. This is like a committee of members who can make decisions in the case of bugs or problems or upgrades. And so in stage zero, the management of the rollup is pretty centralized. What about data availability? Data availability refers to the confidence a user can have that the data required to verify a block really is available to all network participants. So in terms of rollups, this transaction data needs to be available in order to be able to verify the transactions. So for stage zero rollups, there needs to be open source software to enable state reconstruction of the L1 data to ensure both transparency and also the verification. And finally, Finally, in stage zero, in the case of an unwanted upgrade, users have less than seven days to exit the system. Exiting in this context refers to the users withdrawing their funds from the system. And in stage zero, this usually requires some kind of operator coordination. So some entity is going to have to help them exit. The second stage is stage one. A bit confusing with the two, but it's called stage one. Enhanced rollup governance. So in stage one, the rollup is starting to be governed by smart contracts. The security council is probably still in place for things like bug resolution, but it is starting to become more decentralized. In stage one, the rollup has a fully functional proof system with a decentralized fraud or validity proof submission system. Now in stage one, a user can exit without coordination from an operator in the case of these unwanted upgrades. Now the final stage, stage two, is no training wheels. Smart contracts now fully manage the rollup. It's pretty decentralized at this point. And so the fraud or validity proof system is completely permissionless and users are now given ample time to exit in case of unwanted upgrades. There usually is some kind of security council where its role is strictly confined to addressing errors that can be adjudicated 
on chain, meaning that users are now protected against governance attacks. And so if we look through this L2 beat nice little table here, then we can see what stage all of the different rollups are at. So for instance, ZK Sync era is a stage zero rollup. So if we click into this, then we can see a summary of this rollup. And you'll notice here this pretty little pie chart. Let's go through what this means. This pie chart is a nice little visualization of the risk analysis for this rollup. So let's go through all of these little pizza slices. So first data availability. So can the L2 state be reconstructed from the data that ZK Sync submits to L1? And because it's green, yes, it can. So the difference in state before and after the bundle of transactions is submitted is published on chain so the proof can be constructed. State validation. So have we checked that these bundle of transactions is legitimate rather than fraudulent? Has the state well, the state difference has been validated to be correct. And in the case of ZK Sync, yes, because they use ZK proofs, they use a plonk zero knowledge system, which is just the fancy algorithm with KZG commitments. This is all just like the mathematical magic that happens. But yes, it's proved to be correct. So it's green. Zoom out a touch so that we can see the text box. But sequencer failure. So first of all, what's a sequencer? A sequencer is a type of these operators that we were talking about earlier. And it usually refers to the operator that is ordering the transactions and sometimes a sequencer can bundle the transactions together as well but in general it's talking about the ordering of the transactions so what happens if this sequencer goes down can i a user get my money out so users can submit transactions to the queue but you can't force them through they still need the sequencer there to get their transactions through the sequencer can't pick and choose transactions and selectively skip them but it could stop processing any transactions at all. So if it's down, then no one can get any transactions through and no one can withdraw their funds, move their funds or do anything. No transactions can go through. So it's yellow because they can submit them to the L1 queue, but they can't force them through essentially. So that's why it's yellow. Proposer failure. So the proposer is another type of operator and it's the operator responsible for proposing the new state of the rollup. So what happens if this goes down? What if we can't propose new state? So because they have a whitelisting system on ZK Sync, only white listed proposers can publish state routes, so new state of the blockchain on the L1. So in the event of a failure, then no one can get their money out. Withdrawals can't happen. No transactions can happen. So this is obviously a big problem. So it's red. And finally, exit window. So like we were saying earlier, the exit window is how long does a user have to withdraw their funds to exit from the system to not be using the chain anymore. And so for ZK Sync, in the case of unwanted upgrades, the contracts are instantly upgraded. And so there's no window for users to exit. So it's red. So if we zoom out again and we look at this page, then we can see a nice summary of the rollup. So we can see the total value locked, the activity on the chain, on-chain costs, so like the gas costs, the milestones. So for instance, on the 13th of March, ZK Sync era started using blobs. You don't need to know what blobs are at this point, but they're super cool. So I'm going to give you a quick teaser. We will be covering blobs in a later part of this course. So stay tuned for that. But essentially, blobs are like massive, massive chunks of data which aren't submitted to Ethereum. They're like a sidecar to the transaction. They tag along, but they're not stored on chain forever because they're massive. Instead, a hash of all of the data is submitted to Ethereum to compute the proofs. So you can see for rollups how useful this is because if you've got a massive bundle of transactions, then you can have all of that information without having to store it all on chain. Introduction of the Boojum prover. This is just their prover, the code and they had their alpha launch of the chain, which is cool. And then you can see the risk summary and the risk analysis that we were going through earlier. Now, if we scroll down to rollup stage, we can see that it's a stage zero rollup. And so you can click in and see what requirements they have met and what they need to do to move to a stage one. So we were saying with those permissioned operators earlier, so they can censor withdrawals, so that needs to be fixed. And then also in the case of upgrades, they're not given any time to exit the system, like we were talking about earlier. Now, the final thing to say about rollup stages and L to be is that these stages do not reflect the security of the rollup. It is purely an opinionated assessment of the maturity in order to push these protocols towards decentralization. Now, because the batches of transactions are submitted and proven on Ethereum, and so that is everything you need to know about L1s, L2s, and rollups. That was a lot of information for you all. So now is probably time for you guys to take a break and try and digest some of that information. Because I know there are a lot of new terms 
here. If you need to watch again, go ahead, because there is a lot of information here that is pretty complex. And so as Patrick says, and will say a lot of times throughout this course, go get yourself a snack, go get yourself a drink, a coffee, some ice cream, take yourself on a little walk and have a break and then come back when you're all refreshed and we can continue because it is time for us to make our very first transaction on ZK Sync Testnet and I'm super excited about it. So I will see you in a second for that. The final section, oh no, second to last. And now it's time to make our very first transaction on ZK Sync Testnet. The ZK Sync Testnet is sometimes called ZK Sync Sepolia, ZK Sync Era Testnet. I'll probably use the terms interchangeably, but ZK Sync Sepolia, ZK Sync Testnet, they're all the same thing. Some of the things that we're doing here are going to be repeated from earlier in the course, but repetition is key in order to get this information drilled into your brain. So first, let's go ahead and add ZK Sync Sepolia to our MetaMask so that we can see the transaction summaries, see our balance and things like that from inside MetaMask. Okie dokie, the very first thing that we need to do is we need to add ZK Sync Sepolia to our MetaMask so that we can see all of our transactions and everything that's going on inside our wallet, including our balance. So what we're gonna do is we're going to head to chainlist.org and make sure that we have got this include test nets box checked. And then we need to search for ZK, Oop, ZK Sync. And here we can see ZK Sync Sepolia Testnet, which has got the chain ID of 300. So if you click in here, and then we're going to connect our wallet and we are going to confirm that the site can have permissions to our wallet. And then we can click approve to allow this site to add a network. So this is going to add the network to our MetaMask. And then we are going to switch over to ZK Sync Sepolia. When we click inside our wallet, you'll be able to see a summary of the balance and all of the tokens, NFTs and activity going on inside our wallet. And it's that easy, that simple. Now, the second thing we want to do is we want to be able to see transactions and contracts in more detail like we did on Sepolia with Etherscan. So the Block Explorer equivalent to Etherscan on ZK Sync and ZK Sync Sepolia can be found at explorer.zksync.io for mainnet. And then if we switch over in this little drop down to ZK Sync era Sepolia, then it's sepolia.explorer.zksync.io for ZK Sync Sepolia. And if we grab our wallet address, then we can paste that in the search here. And we'll be able to see a summary of our account. So when we send our first transaction, it will come up here. So now what we need to do to send our first transaction is get some funds. And this is gonna be our first transaction is getting funds. So there are actually two ways that we can get testnet funds on ZK Sync Sepolia. The first is a bit like Sepolia and we can use a faucet directly. Faucet, faucet, I never know how to pronounce it. But these can be a little bit temperamental. The one that's recommended on the ZK Sync documentation here requires an API key and there's another one that requires us to sign in with GitHub, both things that we don't really want to do. So we're actually going to use a different method, which is bridging. But Kira, what is bridging? Let me tell you right now. So what we're going to do is we're going to get some funds from Sepolia. We're going to get some Sepolia ETH in the same method that we did so before. And don't worry, I'm going to take you through step by step how to do it again. And then what we're going to do is we're going to bridge those funds over to ZK Sync Sepolia. But I still haven't explained to you what bridging is. Let me do that now. Bridging means taking the funds from one chain and then getting them on the other chain. Now, we're not actually taking those funds and literally moving them. We're using a mechanism. Now, there's two main types of bridging mechanisms. The first is a locking and unlocking method. And what happens here is that the tokens are locked on the source chain. So they're locked inside a smart contract and then they're unlocked on the destination chain. They are released from a smart contract and sent to your wallet from the destination chain. Now you might imagine that this could be a bit of a security concern because what if the smart contract is hacked and my tokens that are locked on the source chain contract are taken? Now this can happen, but you just have to make sure that the protocol you're using is heavily audited and tested. Now the second method is a minting and burning bridge. And what happens here is that on the source chain, the tokens are burned. So they are sent to the zero address. They're taken out of circulation. They're destroyed. They are no longer. And then tokens are minted on the destination chain. They're given to the user on the destination chain. They're created. They're brought into existence. And if you don't understand what I mean by burning and minting, don't worry, this will be covered extensively in a future course. We go through ERC20s, minting and burning and all of these different things and tokens 
later down the line. So you don't need to know 100% how it works. All you need to know is that the tokens are actually removed on the source chain and then created on the destination chain. Now here, the bridge protocol needs to have control over the supply of the tokens in order to be able to burn them and mint them. So for instance, an example of this is CCTP created by the Circle team where USDC is burned and minted in order to create a bridge in which their bridge implements a burn and mint bridge mechanism. And this can occur because the Circle team have control of the USDC supply. But enough about bridges for now. And so let's continue and actually bridge our funds from Sepolia to ZK Sync Sepolia. And what we're going to do is we're going to get some Sepolia ETH from a faucet and then we're going to bridge it to ZK Sync Sepolia to get some ZK Sync Sepolia ETH. That's a lot of words. <laughs> Let's do that now. So like I said, the first thing we need to do is we need to use a faucet. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use the Google Cloud Sepolia faucet. As of recording this, this is the best faucet to use, but if you check the GitHub repo associated with this course, we will keep it updated with the best faucet on Spodia for you guys to use. So head there if you wanna check what the current best one is. As I said, this is the best one for right now. So we're going to select the network as Sepolia, and then I'm gonna go into my MetaMask and I'm gonna click this little button to copy my address associated with my wallet. And I'm gonna paste it in here. And then I'm gonna click this button that says receive 0.05 Sepolia ETH. So you may have had a little flag come up that says you need 0.001 ETH on mainnet. And what you need to do is just wait around 10 to 20 minutes and then come back and try again. And this is to prevent some kind of like Sybil attack where people are creating multiple, multiple accounts and then just draining the faucet by using newly created wallets instantly to try and get funds. So now our testnet tokens are on the way and we're actually doing a transaction on Sepolia as before. So these are the, all the steps that we've already done. And so now we've sent the tokens and we can check inside our wallet. And what we'll have to do is switch over to Sepolia testnet. And you can see, amazing, we now have 0.05 Sepolia ETH. And now we need to take those tokens and we need to transfer them to ZK Sync Sepolia to get some ZK Sync Sepolia ETH. How do we do that? We need to use a bridge. So we're going to head to portal.zkSync.io slash bridge to bridge our funds. And this is going to be a lock and unlock method bridge. Up in this right hand corner, we're going to click this little down arrow and then switch it to ZK Sync Sepolia testnet. Okie dokie. We are going from Ethereum Sepolia testnet to ZK Sync Sepolia testnet. I'm going to transfer 0.025 Sepolia ETH to ZK Sync Sepolia. First of all, I need to connect my wallet. So you can connect. So click connect your wallet, confirm that you'd like to connect. Okay, so now that we've connected our wallet, we can click continue. And then we're gonna click, I understand, proceed to bridge because we have made sure that our wallet does support ZK Sync Sepolia testnet because it's MetaMask, it does. So I understand. Now we can just confirm the transactions. It's good practice to read through. So yes, this is the amount I wanted to send it's from my Sepolia testnet account to my ZK Sync Sepolia testnet account. By the way, notice here, the addresses are the same. So we'll click bridge now. Then we can confirm this transaction in MetaMask. And now we can see a nice little visual of this transaction occurring. Okay, so now that it says that the transaction is complete, we're gonna head back over to the ZK Sync Sepolia Block Explorer. And we're gonna paste our wallet address into the search bar and we can see that we have in fact done our very first transaction. Amazing. So we can see here it's processed on ZK Sync and we can see that we've gone from our L1 address on Sepolia to our L2 address on ZK Sync with a value of 0.025 ETH with a fee, a very, very small fee. And so we're going to click into the transaction hash and you can see here the information about the transaction, including the hash, the status, which we're going to go through in a second the block number, the batch. So that's like the bundle of transactions from to our addresses on the different chains, the tokens transferred, the input data, the value, which was the amount that we sent, the fees, gas limits, nonce, and when it happened. So four minutes ago. So what does this status mean? It says on ZK Sync era, it's processed, but then on Ethereum, it says this weird thing where it's like sending, validating, executing. How come I have the funds in my MetaMask and it's processed on ZK Sync era, but on Ethereum? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Kira, what is going on? I'm confused. Well, let me explain to you. So if we head back over to the ZK Sync documentation and we head to ZK Sync stack concepts, finality, 
And that will explain to you what these two little sections mean. So finality in a blockchain system, as it says here, refers to the time taken from sending the transaction to when the transaction is considered settled. So therefore it can't be altered, reversed, cancelled. And so if on Ethereum, this is approximately 13 minutes. Now, what about on ZK Sync Era or ZK Sync Sepolia? So finality is tied to Ethereum finality, as we were explaining a little earlier. So from the time taken to sending a transaction to when the L1 smart contract updates the L2 state, what is this time frame? And so this has a couple of steps that it's breaking down here. So first of all, after the users submit their transactions, they need to fill up the batch that takes a few minutes. That batch of transactions needs to be committed to Ethereum. Then a proof needs to be generated and submitted and verified by the Ethereum smart contract. And then finally, the batch is finalized. And this can take approximately 24 hours. And these steps correlate to these sending, validating the proof, and then executing and finally achieving finality. That's what these steps are referring to, is this breakdown here. Now, you may say to me, Kira, that makes sense. It makes sense to me that it takes approximately 24 hours for all of this to happen. So how come it says it's processed on ZK Sync Era and you still haven't really explained to me how come I can see a balance in here? You just told me that it was going to be 24 hours. And yeah, that sounds super confusing. And the answer is again in the ZK Sync documentation, this instant confirmation section. So even though the finality is around 24 hours, you can consider your transactions submitted as having instant confirmation so that they can be instantly displayed in the UI, even though they're kind of unconfirmed. And you can consider these assets as immediately transferred and you, and you can make further transfers, but you should be cautious and wait for full finality because things can be rolled back and you shouldn't consider them fully received until you have full finality. And so that's why here we have this instant confirmations where we have the funds, it says it's processed on ZK Sync era, but it's not fully final. The transactions haven't been validated using the ZK proof. And so that's what these steps are referring to here. So now you have sent your very first transaction on ZK Sync Sepolia. That is amazing. Now there is a lot of information to digest here, but the very last thing that I want to explain to you is why we are doing this. Why are we interacting with ZK Sync Sepolia? Why are we going to be deploying our contracts to ZK Sync Sepolia throughout this course? Now, I just want to make a brief disclaimer to say that ZK Sync are kindly sponsoring Updraft in order to bring you the highest quality, most amazing content to become the best smart contract developers in the world. Now here at Cypherin, we would only ever recommend to you tools and chains and applications that we think are the best and that we ourselves would use. And so there is a number of reasons that we will be using ZK Sync and ZK Sync Sepolia to deploy and interact with our smart contracts and working with throughout this course. But let's give a little breakdown of this right now because I don't expect you to just take our word for it. You can make your own judgment. We'll give you our reasons why, and then you can understand the reasons why we are gonna be doing this. So as we have discussed, ZK Sync Era is a layer two ZK rollup. And there are four main reasons that we think that you guys should be using ZK Sync Era. First of all, security. So as we were saying earlier, the security of ZK Sync Era is directly inherited from Ethereum. If Ethereum detects an issue and rolls back, so does ZK Sync Era. The transactions are verifiably legitimate as ZK Sync uses cryptographic validity proofs to prove that the transaction is legitimate. Secondly, it's EVM compatible. Now, when you compile your smart contract, it doesn't compile to EVM bytecode, which you don't really know, need to know what this means, but instead it compiles down to era VM bytecode, which is like a ZK Sync special version. The ZK Sync compiler, KSolk, can compile and understand Solidity. And this means that you can take your smart contracts that you've written in Solidity and deploy them to ZK Sync era without really making any adjustments. There are a couple of really tiny nuances here, but we will be walking through them so you don't need to worry about that at all. Thirdly, ZK Sync supports Ethereum wallets out of the box. So no need to create a special wallet. What does this mean for you? It just means that you don't need to create anything special. You can just use your MetaMask as we were earlier and your address will be exactly the same, which again, we saw earlier. The address on Ethereum will be the same as on ZK Sync era. Your address on Sepolia will be the same on ZK Sync Sepolia. And there's nothing you need to do. It happens automatically. Now the fourth reason, and in my opinion, the best reason is that it is low cost and scalable. As we were talking about earlier, due to the transactions being bundled up together. The gas costs are split among all of the transactions in the bundle, meaning that it's super low cost. And what does this mean for you? It means that users interacting with your protocol don't have to pay really high transaction fees. As the network grows, you're not gonna have issues. So when everyone else is deploying their protocols to Ethereum and then down the line, 
as the system grows like we want it to, and we're gaining more and more users, they're gonna have to port their users over to a roll-up solution, which hopefully is also verifiable like ZK Sync using ZK Proofs. Now you, because you guys are clued in because you're here at Updraft, won't have to do that because you guys are already on ZK Sync. So as the system grows, you're not gonna have any problems. Your users are not gonna be faced with really high transaction fees. You're not gonna have really high transaction fees in order to interact with your contracts or upgrade them. And this is the true power of ZK Sync. And that's why ZK Sync are our recommended chain. And thank you again for ZK Sync for sponsoring. If you'd like, you can also deploy to your own favorite rollup, whether that's Arbitrum, Optimism, or Scroll, or any of the other rollups that are EVM compatible out there. And so now you have everything that you need to know about L2s and rollups and ZK Sync era and why we will be using it throughout this course. And so that was a lot of information. Again, you can go ahead and take a break in order to digest this information, but I will pass you back over now to Patrick and I'll see you again later in this course. So that's it for the blockchain basics and the blockchain explainers. With just this information, you now can go off into the world and start working with blockchains and interacting with blockchains with at least some level of knowledge as to what's going on. You should be incredibly proud of yourself for just making it this far. Definitely be sure to give yourself a pat on the back and a round of applause. Now that we've gotten a lot of the basics and the fundamentals out of the way, let's start jumping into the coding aspect. This is where you're going to learn how to actually build these smart contracts, how to build these trust minimized agreements in these blockchains and in these smart contract platforms. This next section, this solidity basics, the solidity fundamental section, will give you all the skills to start actually coding Solidity and understanding how these smart contracts work underneath the hood. So at this point, absolutely give yourself a high five, maybe say hi in the GitHub discussions, maybe say hi in the community on Twitter, on Reddit, et cetera, and be proud of just making it this far. The journey has really only just begun, but you've already learned so much. Let's begin the next section and let's jump into the code. Welcome to the Solidity Fundamentals course. Solidity, as we mentioned in the Blockchain Basics course, is the most dominant smart contract programming language. And once you get the skills to code Solidity and work with Solidity, you will be able to go out and become a smart contract developer, security researcher, and enter this blockchain world as a very technical person. I'm so excited for you to go through this because these are the steps that will make you a phenomenal blockchain engineer. So welcome to the Solidity Fundamentals. Myself and Kira will be the instructors for this course. And if you missed these already, let's once again start with the best practices for working with this course. So let's begin our journey by talking about some best practices. That way you can get the absolute most out of this course and be as effective as possible. Now you're either watching this on Cypher and Updraft or on YouTube. And I encourage everybody to watch this on Cypher and Updraft because we've got a ton of features to make the learning experience that much easier for you. So if you are watching this on Cypher and Updraft though, there's a couple links I need you to be aware of. The first one in the top right is going to be the GitHub resources page. This will bring you over to what's called a GitHub repo or a GitHub repository, or basically a site that has all the code and all the information and basically all the materials that you're going to need to learn everything in our curriculum. You could basically think of this as your Bible for the duration of your blockchain developer journey. Additionally, in this GitHub, there's a discussions tab right here that you can click on. And in here is where you can ask questions, discuss with other people taking the course, interact with members helping out, and it's where you can discuss anything that you're having trouble with. Then on the other side, you'll see this tab called Written Lessons. If you cannot stand the voice coming out of my mouth, you can just flip over to that and just read the course curriculum as well if you prefer the written content over the video content. And it's good to go over to the Written Lessons anyways to maybe copy paste some stuff. If you scroll down here, right now it's blank, but if anytime there's an update to a video, something's changed in the video and we haven't swapped out the video yet, you'll see a little updates section with information saying, hey, the video says this, but you should do this instead. Now, like I said, this is a very fast moving industry and sometimes things change and sometimes things need to be updated. So when you're watching one of these videos, be sure to look for the updates tab at the bottom. And then additionally, whenever you're working with the code that we're working with, 
I will give you a link to the finalized edition that you can use as a reference as well to make sure that the code that you're working with actually is going to match what we are going to build. Additionally, if you think you found something that is different or doesn't quite work, be sure to make a discussion for it in that GitHub repo. Like I said, it's going to be your Bible. Additionally, there's a link to join the GitHub discussions. This is your platform to ask questions, engage with the community and learn with both other people taking the course and also our TAs who are going to be helping you out along the way. Additionally, there is a link to the Discord for more real-time communication. I urge you to ask questions in the GitHub discussions as well, because those are going to be indexed, going to make them much easier to Google search later and have them show up as opposed to Discord. Discord is still phenomenal for you to join them. For those of you watching on YouTube, hello, you should scroll down to the description. And in the description are going to be links to these resources as well. And additionally, a link to Cypher Updraft. If you've been watching, you've already seen some of the advantages that Cypher Updraft has, including written lessons, single videos, and there's also ways to track your progress instead of having to scrub on a giant YouTube video. So for all of you who are watching this on YouTube, definitely be sure to go over to Cypher Updraft, sign up there and watch the curriculum there because your learning experience will be much better. But leave this video playing in the background on YouTube so we get the bump from the YouTube algorithm. Thank you. That being said, as we go through this course, we're also going to teach you some best practices on working with artificial intelligence, how to best prompt these AI so that they can give you the best results. Just keep in mind, they sometimes get things wrong. And it's a good idea if you are going to use an AI to fact check it with a human or another resource. So be sure to say hi in the discussions and maybe meet some like minded peers. And additionally, once we do get to the coding portion of this course, it's a good idea to code along with me as I'm explaining things. So having the video up as well as your coding screen is a good idea so you can follow along with me as I'm explaining it. If you're watching this on Cypher and Updraft, you can just click the little video pop out button and have the video pop out as such and code next to it. All of this is to say, if you run into an issue, jump to that GitHub repo and make a discussion. We will also be giving you some tips very soon about how to best make a discussion. Yes. Asking questions to other human beings is a skill. And we're going to try to teach you to be the most effective because asking well formatted questions is not only the secret to being a fantastic AI prompt engineer, but also becoming an incredibly successful developer. We're going to learn how to ask well formatted questions. And whenever we post on discussions or forums or whatever, we're going to work on formatting them as best as possible. Take breaks. I cannot tell you how many people have tried to rush through these courses and be like, oh, I'm going to finish in a single weekend. Your brain doesn't work like that. Your brain needs time to absorb the information. So take breaks, maybe every 25 minutes to a half hour, take a five minute break. Or maybe you like working in longer chunks, maybe take a whole hour and then take a 15, 20 minute break. Don't try to rush through the whole video in a day. You're not going to retain the information. Go outside, go for a walk, grab some ice cream, get some coffee, go to the gym. Your brain needs time to have the information settle. Maybe every two hours, just step away, maybe be done for the day, work at whatever pace makes sense for you. Everyone's going to have a different learning pace. There is no right speed for this course. I've had people take my courses in two weeks, in three months, in six months, it doesn't matter. Pick a pace that you can do and stick to it. Not only work at your pace, make sure that I'm talking at a pace that makes sense for you. There's a little gear icon in the YouTube video here where you can change the speed of how I'm talking and how fast the video is going. So if I'm talking way too fast for you, then you can slow me down. But if I'm talking too slow, then you can speed me up. And if you're watching this on Cypher and Updraft, you have the same dials as well in the bottom right hand corner. Additionally, if English isn't your native language, we have seven different subtitles in the Cypher and Updraft video player as well. So make the adjustments you need to make me go the speed you want me to go. And of course, this course is modular. So you can bounce around topic to topic and go to where you want to go. If you don't want to do any full stack stuff, then skip that section. If you want to go right to the advanced stuff, do that. Like I said, go the pace and take the learnings that you want to do. And after every lesson, it might be a good idea to go back and reflect on each lesson to really make sure the knowledge gets ingrained. Repetition is the mother of skill, and we're going to be repeating a lot of smart contract development. Now, the last bit here is in the Cypher and Updraft platform, we're going to have quizzes that you can take to help see if you learn the knowledge that you were supposed to learn. If you're watching this on YouTube, 
you don't have that. So go sign up for Cypher and Updraft and then play the YouTube video in the background. So the YouTube algorithm bumps us up. But additionally, at the end of every section, if you go to the GitHub repo associated with that section and you scroll down, there's going to be a bonus NFTs section with a link. This will bring you to a coding challenge on chain that you can actually solve to mint yourself an NFT, a badge of honor proving that you gained the knowledge that you were supposed to. These are optional challenges that you can do to try to make sure that you actually learned what was meant to be learned here. And if you do solve them, you get a very cool NFT along with it. Don't know what an NFT is? Don't worry, we'll teach you later. Blockchain development and open source development world is incredibly collaborative. So be sure to use tools like, of course, the GitHub discussions tab, Ethereum Stack Exchange, the decentralized Q&A forum, Piranha, issues on different GitHubs, artificial intelligence, and more. And like I said, we'll give you more tips on how to most effectively use these sites in the future. And the reason I'm putting so much emphasis on this and that I will continue to put so much emphasis on this is being a successful smart contract developer is more than just knowing how Solidity works. Knowing where to go for information and how to collaborate with people is often more important than your smart contract knowledge because oftentimes you're gonna run into issues you don't know how to solve. So we're gonna teach you to unblock yourself on this and really anything in life. Plus, syncing with other people in the space makes it way more fun. Before we get started, an important note, the GitHub repo is going to be the Cypherin slash Foundry full course that we work with. You may see references to a GitHub repository with a different name, such as Foundry full course F23 or chain Excel slash Foundry full course but this is the GitHub repo that you should be working with. Sometimes the names of our GitHub repositories or these links will change. So just be sure to use the GitHub resources in Cypher and Updraft, or if you're watching this on YouTube, the links that we provide to you so that you always know that you are on the correct link. Now that we're getting to the coding part, I need to stress to absolutely use the GitHub repository or go to the GitHub resources associated with Cypher and Updraft. If you're on the GitHub repo right now and you scroll down, to this section down here. Welcome to Remix, Remix Simple Storage. And this is gonna look a little bit different when you come to it. You can click on the GitHub repo associated with this lesson. This will have all the code that we're actually gonna be working with for this section, as well as a readme section, which is gonna have a lot of notes on how to actually work with the code. And instead of making issues and discussions on this repository here, if you have an issue, please use the discussions tab of the Foundry full course here, or use any of the areas that we've laid out in the questions section. We're gonna teach you how to ask questions so that they have the highest probability of being answered by either somebody else in the community, by an AI, or by a forum. Additionally, please be sure to check out web3dev.education for more information as well. I highly recommend that you pause the video right now and make accounts for, first of all, GitHub, and then at least Stack Exchange Ethereum. Additionally, ChatGPT is a great resource to make an account for. Just remember that it will often get things wrong and isn't quite up to date. Find you don't need to make an account for, but it often gets things wrong sometimes as well. Typically for each coding section, I'll give you a brief rundown of what we're actually gonna be building. And in this lesson, we're gonna be building this exact smart contract, and we're gonna be building your first smart contract ever, and we're gonna deploy it to a blockchain. At the end of this section, you are going to have deployed your first smart contract ever. So be sure to get to the end so you can deploy your first smart contract. We're gonna be using something called an IDE called Remix to deploy and interact and work with this smart contract, which is going to be very exciting. It's highly recommended to get the best experience out of this is for you to follow along and you to code with me. You can change my speed on the YouTube video if I'm coding too fast or I'm coding too slow but you taking the time to write out the code as I code along with you is gonna ingrain the knowledge into your brain. Repetition is the mother of skill, and I wanna make sure you come out the other side with skill. To actually code this, we're gonna be using a tool called Remix. You can either Google search it, or you can just come to the GitHub repo or web3dev.education and click this link to Remix, which will pop open the Remix Web IDE. So let's go ahead, let's jump in, and let's learn to deploy our first smart contract. At the end of this lesson, you will have deployed your first smart contract, you'll have written your first bit of solidity, and we are very excited to get through this part. Welcome to the Remix IDE, or the Integrated Development Environment. 
This is where we're going to learn to write a lot of our code in the beginning. If you want, you can go ahead and accept to help out Remix here. And if you've never been to the Remix website before, it'll give you a tutorial walkthrough of some of the features that Remix has to offer. For example, it has a Solidity compiler. Solidity is the programming language that we're going to be using in this course to code our smart contracts. We're, and we need to compile them when we've written the Solidity. We'll learn about that in a little bit. We have a tab here where we can actually deploy our contracts to a blockchain. And we have all these different folders and scripts since we can actually write JavaScript and TypeScript in Remix as well. But don't worry about those too much for now because I'm going to be explaining everything that we're going to do. Remix is an incredibly powerful tool because it has a lot of features that allow us to really see and visualize what our smart contracts do. Eventually, we're going to move off of Remix to a local development environment. However, Remix is a tool still used by some of the top auditors and smart contract developers in the space when they want to quickly check something out. And additionally, it's fantastic for learning the fundamentals of Solidity. The left-hand side is where we're actually going to start interacting with Remix. If we bring our mouse up to the top, this little file explorer is where we're going to have all of our files and where we're going to write our Solidity or our smart contract code. If you want, you can leave all these folders in here, but I'm actually going to go ahead and delete everything so that there's less for me to work with or, or deal with. So I'm just going to go ahead and right click and delete everything in here just so I can start completely from scratch. Again, if you want to leave all of these in here, feel free to do so. It doesn't matter. I just think it's cluttering up my mental space a little bit. Now we have a blank Remix project. And the first thing that we're going to want to do is create our first file to start writing and deploying our Solidity Smart Contract. We're going to go ahead and click the Create New File right here and type in simple storage.sol. .sol tells our compiler that this is going to be a Solidity contract, a Solidity file. And we're going to be writing Solidity inside of this file, which again, Solidity is the most popular smart contract programming language. And you'll see we actually get popped up a simple storage.sol on the right hand side, which we can type in and actually write our Solidity code. Now, right below the File Explorer button is a little search icon, which allows us to search for different code in all of our contracts. So, for example, if I type in hello in here and I copy that, paste that into the search bar, hit enter, we can see that it found this line hello in our simple storage.sol. Let's go ahead and delete that. Right below that search icon is this Solidity compiler. And you'll see a bunch of different stuff pop up, which tells us about our compiler configuration. And we can see even more advanced configuration if we hit the drop down. We're not going to hit that for now. Let's go ahead and double click the Solidity compiler over here so we can just see the simple storage.sol. I'm also going to click this hide terminal button so that we just see our simple storage.sol. Now, the first thing that we want to do in all of our Solidity and smart contracts is write the Solidity version that we're going to be working with. Solidity is a constantly changing language, and we want to be very specific about what version we're going to be using to write our smart contract, as each version does different things. To write your version, you're going to do pragma, Solidity, and then type your version. For most of this course, we're going to be using 0 0.8.19, as that's the most current edition of Solidity. How are getting used to working with different versions of Solidity is really good for you as you're going to be working with different versions of Solidity no matter where you go. Certain versions of Solidity are considered more stable than other versions. Right now, there's a popular tool called Slither, which recommends using 0.8.18. So if you want to default to 0.8.18 for this course, feel free to do so. We're going to be using a couple different versions as we code. So this line says we're stating our version. Now, these two slashes here stand for what's called a comment in Solidity. And this allows you to write anything after the two slashes. And when we compile or run our code, it will just ignore what's in here. So we could type blah, 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 whatever we want. Cats are cool. And it doesn't matter. You can write anything in here. I highly recommend as we're going along, you should write comments in your own code as well for you to refer to later on. And additionally, feel free to copy all the code that you write and paste it locally so that just in case your browser cache refreshes or something, you won't lose all the work you've done. So, so before you lock off for the day, copy paste this into a text file so that you can have it for later. But a good comment for here might be, this is the version. Now writing our version like this in Solidity tells the Solidity compiler that we're only allowed to use 0.8.18 when compiling this. 
However, maybe a new version comes out and we're okay to use anything newer than this version. To tell the compiler that, we add this little hat, this little caret, which says this contract only works with 0.8.18 or anything greater than that. This means 0.8.19 would work. When 0.8.20 comes out, that one would work. However, 0.8.17 would not work if we were working with 0.8.18 or above. If we don't have the caret, this tells the compiler that only 0.8.18 will work with this code. If we want to use solidity versions within a range, we could do something like this. We could say we want our version to be greater than or equal to 0.8.18, but less than 0.9.0. This would tell the compiler that any version between these two is a valid version. For example, 0.9.1 would not work. Neither would 0.9.0 because these are not strictly less than 0.9.0. Great, so now we know how to do compiler versions. Now, the next thing every smart contract needs to start with is something called the SPDX license identifier. Now, this actually isn't required by the compiler. It'll actually throw a warning if we compile and it won't error. It's fine if you don't have this. However, it's highly recommended. This is a way to make licensing and sharing code and IP of your contracts a lot easier from a legal perspective. I have a link to more about how licenses work in the GitHub repo associated with this section of the course. MIT is known as one of the most permissive licenses. It basically means anybody can use this code and pretty much do whatever they want with it. I wouldn't worry too much about the licenses right now, but let's actually go back to 0.8.19. And on the left-hand side, let's scroll down to this compiler button and open this back up. Even right now, now that we don't even have any code, we can actually go ahead and compile this contract. Now you might see a red squiggly and you might see a warning here, but don't worry about that for now. To choose our compiler version, we scroll up to this section and we can choose the compiler version that we wanna work with. Most of the time though, if you just hit compile simple storage.sol or you hit this big compile button, it'll automatically choose the version for you. For example, if I scroll down, but I hit compile, it'll automatically flip up to 0.8.19. And we were able to go ahead, we were able to successfully compile this code. Now it says no contract compiled yet because we haven't put a contract in here yet. We just put the version of Solidity that we're working with. Compiling our code means taking our human readable code and transforming it into computer readable code, which is essentially a bunch of zeros and ones or it's byte code. Computer code is very specific instructions for the computer to use, or in our case, the blockchain to use for our contract. We'll learn later about machine level code and op codes and EVM codes in a much later section of this course. Additionally, you can hit Command S or Control S, which will also save and compile. You'll see I kind of have a trigger finger and I will, out of habit, hit Command S all the time. Because as somebody who codes a lot, I need to make sure I save all the time, otherwise things might not work as intended. As you saw, if we use a different version of Solidity and we hit the compile button, it'll automatically flip back. But for example, let's say I, I wanted to use 0.8.7, anything greater than that, and we're on compiler 0.8.19, and we hit compile, it won't change. However, if I use something less than 0.8.7, and we hit compile, it'll change because it wants to automatically select a Solidity version that is appropriate for the version that you chose. Again, I wanna use 0.8.18, and I'm gonna hit compile, and we're good to go. Now we're gonna go ahead and start writing our contract. And to get the full screen view again, we just go ahead and click the Solidity compiler so that we can just see our code here. To start writing our contract, we're gonna use a keyword in Solidity called contract. This tells Solidity that the next piece of code is going to be the name for our contract that we're gonna create. You can think of a contract very similar to a class if you're familiar with JavaScript or Python or Java or really any object-oriented programming. And we're gonna go ahead and give our contract a name here. We're gonna call ours simple storage. And then we add this little open and closed curly braces or curly brackets. Everything inside of these curly brackets is gonna be considered part of this contract simple storage. Now, if we hit enter, we go back to the compiler and hit compile, we can see once again, this little green check mark pop up. This means our compilation has been successful. If we were to remove, for example, this curly brace and hit compile, we would see we would get this error. Compilation failed with one error. And if we scroll to the bottom, it'll tell us where the error actually is. And we'll get a little red pop-up saying what line the error is actually on. 
We'll learn about debugging these errors in a little bit, but let's add the curly brace back. Go ahead back to the compiler, the compile, and we're good to go. Hypothetically, we could deploy this smart contract right now. This is a valid contract, although it doesn't do anything. But congratulations, technically, with just this little piece of code, you've written your first smart contract. I spelt version wrong, so we're gonna correct that. Solidity has many different types of things that you can build in these smart contracts. Many different data types or just types. If you go to the Solidity documentation at docs.soliditylang.org, again, link to this in the GitHub, we can select the types section on the left-hand side to learn more about Solidity types. If you wanna get a holistic view of all the different types, you can go ahead and read this documentation. Some of the basic types are going to be Boolean, Boolean, Uint, and an address, and bytes. Bytes is a lower level type, which we'll talk about in a little bit. A Boolean is some type of true false value. A uint is going to be an unsigned integer, AKA a positive whole number, meaning no decimals, no fractions. A integer is going to be a signed whole number, meaning it could be positive or negative, but again, is a whole number. And then we have an address, which is going to be, well, an address. It's very similar to if we open up our MetaMask and we click this account here, it's gonna be something like this. There are some other types as well and ways to create your own custom types, but we'll learn more about that later on. We can use these different types to define different variables. Variables are essentially holders for different values, and these values can have one of these types. For example, we could create a variable called has favorite number, which would represent if somebody has a favorite number. This has favorite number could be true or false. Either they do have a favorite number or they don't. To tell Solidity that this has favorite number is a true false or a Boolean, we would add this bool keyword before has favorite number. So this has favorite number is gonna be either true or false. And to set its value, we're gonna give it this little equal sign and say true. So now has favorite number is a variable that represents true. We could also say has favorite number is false, meaning that somebody doesn't have a favorite number. For a uint, which again is an unsigned integer, we could say uint favorite number equals 88. This means that this variable favorite number is going to be 88. A uint and int are actually special in that we can actually specify how many bits or bytes that we want to use. For example, we could say uint 256. uint 256 specifies this variable favorite number has 256 bits. We're not going to go over bits and bytes in depth right now. But if you want to get a quick refresher, we've left a link in the GitHub repo associated with this course to give you an overview of bits versus bytes and how they work. An easier way to think about this is really just how big can it get? The bigger the number over here, the bigger this favorite number can be. The maximum size is a uint 256. And if you don't specify the uint 256, it defaults to being a uint 256. So this and this are the same thing. This, this, same thing. We could also have eight bits, 16 bits, 64 bits, etc. Oftentimes it's better when we're writing our code for a readability standpoint to be as explicit as possible. So you'll see me pretty much always writing UN 256 because I want to be very explicit with how many bits I'm using for UN 256, even though they mean the same thing. Instead of a UN 256, we could also have this be an int 256. And actually let's add that Boolean back up here. Now an int can actually be positive or negative. So we could have our favorite number be negative 88 if we wanted to. We can also have strings or text variables, which I didn't name up here, but I'll say why in just a minute. We could say string favorite number in text equals 88. And let's actually make this positive 88, even though an int could be positive or negative. I'll put this little semicolon here. You'll notice that at the end of every one of these lines, I'm adding this semicolon. This semicolon is how you can tell Solidity that a statement has completed. So this semicolon is saying the end of this line is right here. If we wanted to, we could put all of our code on the same line like this, and this would compile fine. It just looks really ugly. So we always want to put our code on a new line after the semicolon. A string in Solidity is basically text that represents well words. So I could say, 88 instead of having 88 in here. To tell Solidity that something is a string, you have to put it in between quotes. I could put really any combination of characters in here, even like hello, or follow Patrick on Twitter. 
And let's actually do you into 56 here, favorite number. And we'll do an into 56 favorite int equals negative 88. This way we'll just have an example of all these different types on screen. We can also do an address. So we can say address, my address equals, and we can go into our MetaMask, copy the address and paste it right into Remix and add that semicolon. And now we have our address type in Remix. And then finally down here, we're gonna say a bytes32 object, favorite bytes32 equals cat. And we're gonna put it in quotes, just like we did the string up here. And what's interesting about the string object is that strings are actually secretly just bytes objects specifically for text. So a string can actually get converted to a bytes object really easily because under the hood, they're essentially the same thing. Bytes typically look like something like Xerox and then a whole bunch of random numbers and letters that represent the hex of whatever the bytes is and can often be represented as strings like cat. We'll talk about bytes more in the future. Similar to uint 256 and int 256, you can have different size bytes, like bytes two, bytes, bytes four, bytes eight, etc., all the way up to 32. You can also have just straight up bytes and not have a number after, but that's a slightly different type and we'll go over that later as well. A uint like this and a uint 256 are the same thing, but a bytes 32 and a bytes with nothing are actually different. So keep that in mind for now. The largest bytes, like I was saying, is actually 32. So for example, we can't do a bytes 64. And if we type that in here, Remix actually goes, hey, there's an issue here. And if we try to compile this, and we scroll down, we'll again see this little error code here and this little error pop up. It even gives us an output declaration error, identifier not found or not unique. It gives us the line and we can say, ah, whoops a daisy, this should be a bytes 32. And we can go back and compile this. For our simple storage contract, let's say that we only want to store a favorite number. This contract is going to be a contract that allows us to store our favorite number and some different people's favorite numbers as well. So we're going to go ahead and delete everything except for the uint 256 favorite number. So we're going to go ahead and delete everything and boom. And we'll pick a smaller favorite number just to make it a little mentally easier. Now these variables actually have default values. So for example, if I don't set my favorite number to anything and I have a line that looks like this, you'll see that this actually compiles fine. Favorite number will actually get defaulted to zero and all of these types have a different default value. UN256 is zero, booleans is false, etc. So saying UN256 favorite number and not having an equal sign after here is the same as doing UN256 favorite number equals zero. So for now, let's not initialize it to anything so that favorite number starts off as zero. And remember, as you're coding along here and typing along with me, if you get confused, make sure to write your own comments. For example, we can say favorite number gets initialized to zero if no value is given. Now let's go ahead and learn to make our first function. Basic solidity functions section. Functions or methods Functions or methods are a subsection of code that when called will execute a very specific small piece of our entire code base. If you're familiar with JavaScript or Python or any other programming language, functions and solidity are exactly the same. Functions are identified by the keyword function. Let's create a function and name it store. And we're gonna have this function be responsible for actually updating our favorite number. We're going to store a new favorite number. So you first write the function keyword, the name of the function, and then you add these two parentheses. Whatever is in between these two parentheses represents what we're going to pass or send to our function or the parameters that we're gonna to send to our function. For example, we need to tell our store function what value it should use to update favorite number. So we're gonna tell our store function, it should take a uint256 and this variable that we're gonna to pass to it, we're gonna call underscore favorite number. It's important that we give it a different name than favorite number up here, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Then we're gonna say this is going to be a public function, and we'll explain that soon too. We wanna to put these little curly brackets in here as well, and we're just gonna say favorite number equals underscore favorite number. And without going too deep into what this is doing, we're saying, I'm not gonna explain public yet, but we will in a minute. But what we're saying is whenever you call this store function, you're going to set our favorite number variable 
to whatever variable that we passed. I'll explain why we do this underscore here as well in a little bit. And with just this, we can actually start to simulate what this smart contract will do and if our store function will actually work correctly. So what we can do with just this code right here is come over back to the compile tab and hit compile, make sure that we get this green check mark and that everything looks good. And then we can go down to this deploy and run transactions tab. Our deploy and run transactions tab has a ton of different parameters in here on how to actually deploy and run with our transactions. We're going to deploy this contract to a simulated virtual environment. So we're going to deploy it basically to a fake environment. We're not going to be deploying it to a test net. We're going to deploy it basically in kind of an imaginary world. In order for us to do this, first, make sure we're on this Remix VM. And for us, we're going to just use the default, which is the merge. Doesn't really matter which one you're on, just so long as it's the Remix VM. This Remix VM is a fake local blockchain where we don't have to wait for transactions to complete and we don't have to deal with any of the oddities on deploying our code to a real testnet or a real mainnet. And don't worry about the rest of these for now. We also get an account here. When we run on our fake Remix VM, we get automatically given an account with a different amount of Ethereum for each account. You can think of each one of these accounts similar to our MetaMask accounts in MetaMask, except for these are fake imaginary accounts that Remix just gives to us. For our transactions, including deploying contracts, we're given a gas limit, values that we can send, and we'd also choose our contract depending on which one we've compiled. Since we only have one contract in here, we only have one to choose from. So on the left-hand side, to deploy our contract to this fake Remix VM environment, we're gonna go ahead and click the deploy button. If we scroll all the way down to the bottom now, under this deployed contracts, we can see we actually deployed a contract here, simple storage. We can see the balance is zero, and we see this big orange button that says store, and then u 6 underscore favorite number. On our local blockchain, this at blah, blah, blah here, this is gonna be the address of our contract. Similar to our wallets, how they have different addresses, every single contract has a unique address as well. And if we hit this little copy button and we close this, and we put it as a comment here and we paste it, we can see this looks exactly similar to an address such as what's in our MetaMask. And then let's go ahead and open the deploy back up and we see that deployed contract is still there. Additionally, if you hit this little show terminal button and you pull this up, we can actually see we have this little comment here, creation of simple storage pending, and we have this green check mark here. This is notating that we actually sent a transaction to deploy this contract. Similar to sending ETH back and forth, in order for us to deploy a contract, we actually have to send a transaction. Since we're doing this on the Remix M, this is a simulated transaction, a pretend transaction inside of our Remix environment. You can even hit the little drop down and see even more information about this transaction. You'll see a lot of familiar keywords like status, transaction hash, from, to, gas, etc. Deploying a contract uses the exact same process as sending a transaction for just ETH. The main difference is we populate this data or input field with a ton of that bytecode. And if you copy this input field or this data field and go ahead and make a comment in here, you'll see it's a massive line and this massive line notates all the data associated with this smart contract, all the machine readable code. Remember, anytime we do anything that modifies any value on the blockchain, we actually do that by sending a transaction. Deploying a contract is modifying the blockchain, so we do it in a transaction, which means, yes, we spend gas. Now, this big orange button over here actually resembles our function store in our smart contract. And if we add some numbers in here and we call it, Again, if we pull the terminal up, we can see transact to simple storage pending, and we see we sent a transaction which called this store. If we do this again with a different number, we call it, we can see our terminal say, oh, you sent a, another transaction to update the state of the blockchain. And if we scroll all the way up to our account, you'll see that we have a little less ether in our account because we had to spend the gas associated with, well, A, deploying this contract, and then B, calling these functions. And then, for example, if I add this, if I add five in here and hit store, we'll send a transaction to store five on the blockchain. Now you might be thinking, okay, Patrick, that's pretty cool, but what is the value of favorite number? You're telling me that this function store is updating favorite number, but I can't really see it. How do I know that favorite number has actually been updated to five? Well, the reason we can't see it is that the visibility of our favorite number is actually defaulted to internal. So us not having anything here or right internal are actually meaning the same thing. And we'll talk about 
visibility and default visibilities in a minute. But in order for us to actually see the value of our favorite number, we'll go ahead and add the public keyword to this. This changes the visibility of favorite number to public. And like I said, we'll talk about visibility in a minute. But let's go ahead and compile this. Let's go ahead and delete this contract by hitting this X here. And let's redeploy this contract with this new public keyword. So let's go ahead and hit deploy. And now if we scroll down and we open up our simple storage, we actually now see a blue button labeled favorite number. And if we click it now, we can see it returns zero, which makes sense because we know that UN256 is default to zero. Now, if I go ahead and add five into here and hit the store button, if I pull up the terminal, we'll see that we went ahead and executed that store function call, that transaction that's going to take input this five as favorite number and set it to our favorite number. Now, if I hit favorite number, you can see it does indeed return five, showing that we actually updated our favorite number with this function call. And remember though, I'm gonna go ahead and do this again. And remember when I hit X here, this is just removing it from this window here. If you actually deploy a smart contract to the blockchain, hitting X from this window doesn't do anything because once you deploy your contract, it's immutable, it's out there, and you can't just delete it by clicking X and remix. Functions and variables can have one of four different visibility specifiers in Solidity, public, private, external, and internal. If you don't give one of these keywords to your variables, it'll get defaulted to internal. Public functions mean that they're visible externally and internally. And you'll see here, it says it creates a getter function for storage slash state variables. This means that other people can call this function or call this variable. When we didn't have a visibility for favorite number, it defaulted to internal, which is why we didn't see this blue number pop up because internal, it means that other contracts and people aren't allowed to call on this favorite number. We have a little bit more here. It says it actually creates a getter function for storage slash state variables. When we add this public keyword here, it's actually equivalent to us making a getter for this favorite number variable, a getter function. And I'll show you exactly what that function will look like in a little bit. Now, keep in mind though, everything on chain is technically public. So setting a function or variable to private isn't a good way to hide what the value actually is there. And we'll talk a little bit more about storage and visibility and, and that much later. Just remember, everything on these EVM chains is actually public data. This public variable just means any other contract can call this favorite number and, and see the value what's in favorite number. And private means only the current contract can. External functions mean they're only visible externally. And this is only for functions, not for variables. And it means another function inside this contract couldn't call an external function. And internal means only the current contract and its child contracts can call the function. We'll talk about child contracts and inheritance in a later section. So let's just keep it public for now. The reason that we have this underscore here in this parameter is because we need to tell users that this variable in here is different than favorite number. And there's a couple different conventions on naming local variables versus these what's known as state variables or variables outside of functions. And we'll go over those later in the course. Now, here's something that's really interesting as well. Remember how I told you earlier that sending ether is a relatively simple transaction, right? Well, let's see what happens when we call this store function and we update favorite number to five. Let's actually call it one more time. And we hit the little drop down here. Let's go to gas and we'll see gas actually cost 27,000 gas, which is a lot more than the 21,000 gas it costs to just send ether between accounts. Remember, every time you update the state of the blockchain, it's going to cost gas. Now, what do you think will happen if we do more inside of this store function? For example, we say, favorite number equals itself plus one. Let's go ahead and compile this. Let's delete our old simple storage. Let's deploy this new one. Remember the last one cost 27 gas. Let's pull up the terminal and Remix actually gives us a little tool tip and it's saying an infinite gas, which we know is actually wrong, but let's go ahead and add one, two, three in here and we'll hit store. We'll see this transaction. We'll scroll down. We'll see gas is actually a lot more. It's way more gas. It's 50,000 gas with just adding this line here. Now, technically, I'm not telling the full story here because there are some other gas costs associated with the first time you run a function, but it's still more, right? And that's what's important here. So, so let's go ahead and delete that line and go back to our old function here. Now, let's talk about something called scope for a second. So if I create a variable in here called uint 256 test var equals five, and I create a new function called something, 
we'll make it public. Could I access the test var and then maybe change it to six or seven? What about the favorite number var? What about the favorite number variable? Could I access that to seven? Well, let's go ahead and see what happens if we try to compile this. If we try to compile, we actually go ahead and get an error in our compilation, undeclared identifier. Whenever you create a variable, it can only be viewed in the scope of where it is. If that's confusing, just look for the curly brackets. The reason that our something function can read the test var is because this test var isn't inside of the curly brackets of something. The reason it can't read the test var is because test var was created way up here inside of these curly brackets outside of something. But favorite number wasn't created inside of these curly brackets, so how come it knows what favorite number is? Well, something is inside of these curly brackets and favorite number was created inside of all of these curly brackets. If favorite number was created inside of here, it wouldn't be able to access favorite number because again, favorite number is inside of this scope and not this scope. If you create a variable like test var inside of store, you can only access this test var inside of this store function and not anywhere else. The easy way to know what the scope of a variable is, is just look for the curly brackets. So let's go ahead and delete this something variable and let's delete this test var and let's recompile. Now, like we were saying earlier, when we add this public keyword to favorite number, it's the exact same as if we created a getter function to return this favorite number. So let's actually write a function similar to what this public keyword is creating. So we're gonna say function retrieve, we'll make this a public view function, and we'll talk about that in just a second. And we'll say it returns a uint 256, and we'll add the curly braces here, and we'll say return favorite number. And oftentimes when these auto suggestions come up like this, you can just hit enter and they will automatically do it. So if we do favorite and then I just hit enter, boom, automatically like that. Now I'm gonna hit command S, which is equivalent to me going to the compile tab and hitting compile. Now, if I go to the deploy tab and let's deploy this contract now, and we scroll down, we now see we still have that store function. We have our favorite number function and we have a new blue button called retrieve. Right now they both start off as zero. And then obviously if we update this to five by calling store, yep, I called store. These are now both return five since favorite number is the actual variable and retrieve is just returning whatever favorite number is. Now, as you can see here, these two functions are blue, but this one is orange. What's the difference? Why are the colors different? Well, the key is actually with this view keyword here. Solidity has a special keyword which notates functions that don't actually have to run or you don't actually have to send a transaction for you to call them. And those two keywords are going to be view and pure. A function marked view means we're just going to read state from the blockchain. For example, in our retrieve function, we're just going to read what the favorite number variable is. Our store function isn't reading, it's updating something. So, and it's changing the state of the blockchain. So we have to send a transaction. Since our retrieve function doesn't have anything inside here that updates anything, it just returns favorite number, we don't need to send a transaction. So if you add this view function in here, it disallows any modification of state. For example, I couldn't add favorite number equals favorite number plus one. If we go ahead and try to compile this, we'll get an error. Function cannot be declared as view because this expression potentially modifies state. So we'd have to remove this line or we'd have to remove the view keyword. So view functions disallow updating state, pure functions disallow updating state, and they disallow even reading from state or storage. This favorite number here is what's known as a storage variable because it's stored in a place called storage. We'll talk about that in a later section, but if this was labeled pure, we'd see we get a little red underscore here because favorite number is reading from state, Instead of returning favorite number, we would return something like seven. So this would be an example of a pure function. This would be ex an example of a view function because we're reading from state. Again, we'll explain the difference a little bit later. And like I was saying before, if we call a view or a pure function, we actually don't need to spend gas since we're not modifying the state. That's why these buttons over here are blue. They're representing view or pure functions, functions that we can call without having to send a transaction. For example, if I pull up the terminal here and I pull this up and I call retrieve, we do get another function, but it's just a call and it looks different than if I hit the store, 
which has this little check mark. They're different because the store is obviously sending a transaction and the retrieve is actually just making a call and not sending a transaction. However, something weird is going on here. If I hit retrieve and I go into the details of this call, I can see, oh, what's, what's this? Why is there an execution cost? It says cost only applies when called by a contract. What's going on there? The reason for that is because if another function that does update state, that does require a transaction, calls retrieve, that transaction does need to pay the gas of reading and calling this retrieve function. So calling a view or a pure function actually does cost gas only when a gas cost transaction is calling it. So we can go ahead and call these as much as we want. It costs nothing. But if another function that does cost gas calls it, it's going to cost something. For example, if our function store here then went ahead and called retrieve like this, since store costs gas, you're telling this function, hey, also call this retrieve function, which is more work for it to do. And since it's more work, it's going to cost more gas. So for example, if we delete this contract over here, let's go ahead and compile this. Let's go ahead and deploy this with this retrieve in here. So let's go ahead and look at these. These are now zero. We'll store five in here. We'll select the drop down. We can see how much gas we actually sent. 50,000 gas. Go ahead and drop this now. Close this out. Let's remove the retrieve line. Let's compile. We'll hit deploy. Simple storage. These are both zero. We'll add five. Hit store. Pull up the terminal. Hit the drop down. Look at gas. It's still 50,000, but it's actually a little bit less than before. Although I'm pointing at gas, we really should be looking at transaction cost because gas is really just actually how much we're sending, whereas transaction cost is how much gas the transaction actually cost. But in any case, it was a little bit less without the retrieve function. Now I've kind of been glossing over this a little bit, but this returns keyword specifies what this function is going to give us when we call it. So when we have this returns keyword in our retrieve function here, we're saying whenever we call this retrieve function, we want to get returned or we want to be given this favorite number of type UN256. We want to return a UN256 from this function. Now our contract as is, is pretty good. It does one thing pretty well. It's, it allows us to store our favorite number, update that favorite number, and then view that favorite number. And in fact, let's go ahead and make this an internal variable and we'll have the retrieve function be the way to get this. We can have this public, but for now, we're gonna set it up like this and I'll tell you why we're gonna set it up like that in the future. But what if we wanted to be able to store not just our favorite number, but other people's favorite numbers as well? Well, what we could do is we could create something called an array or a list of favorite numbers. What we could do is we could say, instead of just one uint 256, we could have a list of uint 256 called list of favorite numbers. This bracket syntax here identifies that we have a list of UN256 or a list of numbers or an array of numbers. An array of numbers is gonna look something like this. It's gonna have, maybe the first element is gonna be zero. Maybe the second favorite number is gonna be 78. Maybe the third favorite number is gonna be 90. Now arrays are very common in computer science and programming and an array in Solidity is exactly the same as an array in any other programming language. If you're unfamiliar with arrays, Arrays or lists are actually zero indexed. So the zero here is actually at index zero. So we refer to this object here as the zeroth object, right? This could be 77, and this would be the zeroth object. The 78 is going to be the first element, the 90 is going to be the second element, and so on and so forth. It's very common in computer science to actually start counting from the number zero, and arrays start counting from the number zero. We'll learn to play around with arrays more in just a minute. So this list of favorite numbers is great, but how do we know whose favorite number each section is? If this is our list of favorite numbers, how do we know who zero is, who 78 is, who 90 is, et cetera? Well, maybe what we would do, instead of just having a raw list like this, let's go ahead and comment this line out, maybe we could create a new type called a person. In Solidity, you can actually create your own types using the struct keyword. So we're gonna say struct person and do little curly brackets like this. Inside of these curly brackets, we can define what this struct person custom type is comprised of. And we're gonna say for every person, they're gonna have a uint256 favorite number. 
and a string name. Now, something important to note is, oh, whoops, we have two favorite numbers here. Remember what we learned about scope. Since this favorite number is inside of these curly brackets, these would clash a little bit. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to rename favorite number up here to my favorite number. And we're going to copy paste that down here as well. So we're we're renaming this state variable, this storage variable to my favorite number and just keeping it down here. That way we can have favorite number inside of this struct. In any case, we created this new type of type person, which is a combination of each person has a favorite number and each person also has a name. Now, similar to how we can have a U in 256, a Boolean, a string in, in 256, etc. We now have a type of person, and this is similar to each one of these. Oh, and we're also going to have to update the retrieve down here with my favorite number instead of favorite number. Now, since we have our own new type, we can actually create a variable of type person the exact same way we created a variable of type my favorite number. So we could say person visibility will be public. My friend equals, and we'll put person here and put some parentheses here. Because when you're working with custom types, you have to define both on the left side and on the right side what type it is. And in here, we would assign a favorite number and a name. So we could say seven and patch like that. So now Pat is going to be a person with a favorite number of seven and a name of Pat. See, the first parameter goes to the first item in the person struct, and the second parameter goes to the second item. I like being a little bit more explicit when working with structs. And actually what you can do is you can put little brackets here instead, and you can say exactly what value you're gonna assign to what section. So I can say favorite number is gonna be seven, and name is gonna be Pat. And we can hit Command S or just go straight to compile to see if it worked correctly, get that little green check mark. Now, by doing this, we've created our own type person and we've created a variable named Pat with a favorite number of seven and a name of Pat. Now, if we were to go ahead, let's delete this old simple storage and let's deploy our new simple storage. And we scroll down, we now have a new blue button since this is a public variable called Pat. And if we click the button, if we call this variable, we'll see favorite number of seven and string name Pat. You can also see this zero and this one, which shows the index of each one of these variables or parameters. Zero is for favorite number, one is for name. If we added another one, maybe bool is cool, bool is cool would be at index two. Whenever you create a custom type like this, Solidity will automatically index them, similar to the way that we index our lists or our arrays. Favorite number zero, name one, whatever is next would be two, et cetera. Now this is great for one friend, but what if you have a lot of friends, which I know a lot of you do because you're taking this course, which automatically means you're cool. Maybe what if you have your friend Mariah that you would like to add to our smart contract like this and her favorite number is 16. Or maybe your friend John, you'd have to copy paste the line, add John in here. His favorite number is going to be 12, so on and so forth. It might get very tedious to have to write variables for all of these people for all of these friends. This obviously isn't a great way for us to create lists of people or lists of our friends. So instead of this, we can actually use this array syntax that we just learned and create an array of person or a list of persons. So I'm gonna comment all these out for now. And a quick tip here, if you're on a Mac and you highlight a couple, of lines, if you're on a Mac and you hit command backslash or command question mark, it'll automatically comment or uncomment those lines. If you're on a Windows, I believe it is control slash, but you might be able to Google what the actual keyboard shortcut is. This is a keyboard shortcut I use all the time. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna create a list or an array of persons. So exact same as we did it up here, we'll say our type first is gonna be type person array. So we're a type person array. Then we'll state our visibility, which is gonna be public. Then we'll get our variable name, which is going to be list of people like this. So we've created a person array with visibility public and the name list of people, and we'll just leave it blank for now. So it'll get defaulted to being an empty list, which would look like this. Now, if I were to go ahead and deploy this, let's delete the last one.
let's compile, deploy, we scroll down, we select this. We now see we have our retrieve blue button and we also have this blue button for list of people. When you create arrays with a public keyword, instead of being able to see the whole array with this list of people button, you actually have to put in the index of the element you wanna work with and you get to see that exact element. It wants to take a uint256 as an input parameter. However, obviously our array is blank. So if we say, what is the person at the zeroth index? It'll say, well, nothing because you have a blank array. Well, what about the first index? Well, nothing. What about the second one? Well, nothing. No matter what you put in the box right now, it's going to return nothing. We'll show you how to add to this array in just a second. This kind of array is known as a dynamic array because the size of the array can actually grow and shrink. In Solidity, a dynamic array is signified by what's inside of these little brackets here. If we added a three in here, this would be a static array. We're saying this list of people can only have a maximum size of three. So we can only put three persons in this array. Dynamic array, static array can have any size, can only go up to three. Any size, up to three, any size, up to four. Hopefully you get the picture. We're gonna work with a dynamic array because we're gonna to want to add a arbitrary number of people to this person array. So let's create a function that will allow us to actually add people and update this array. And let's delete this comment. So below our retrieve function, we'll create a function add person. And this is gonna take two variables as input. It's gonna take the name of the person that we're gonna add. It's gonna take the favorite number of the person that we're gonna add as well as the name. So we'll say string memory name, and I'll explain this memory keyword in a little bit. And we'll do uint256 underscore favorite number. And let's do, and let's do underscore name, and we'll make this a public function. And what we're gonna do inside of this add person function is we're gonna take this list of people object and call the push function on it. Arrays come built in with a function called push which allows us to add elements or add person to our list of people array. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say list of people dot push, and we'll add these little parentheses here, and we're going to push a new person onto this array. Now what we could do, now let's comment this out for now. Now what we could do is we could create a new person, person, new person equals person name, favorite number, like we did above, oops, excuse me, these are backwards, person memory, new person, which we're gonna ignore that for now, and then just do list of people dot push new person. We could do this, this is valid syntax, and I'll explain this memory keyword in a little bit. This is gonna create a new person and we push to the list, or we could just add this person right into this push piece here. So we could delete this line. Instead of creating a new person on its own line, we could say, list of people dot push person, and then we'll add in here, favorite number name. Since we're calling this person favorite number name inside of this push object, Solidity is smart enough to execute this line of code first, create a new person, and then execute this line to push our person into this list of people object. So this function should allow us to push new people into our list of people array. So what we can do now is let's compile this. Let's deploy this. Let's delete the old one. We'll hit deploy. Now we see if we call our list of people at zero, we'll get nothing back because it starts off as a blank array. But now we have this new add person function where we can, you can kind of see very faintly, it takes a string name and a U and 256 favorite number. So we can add metric seven. We'll hit add person which if you have your terminal, you'll see we made a transaction. And now if we hit list of people at zero, we see we have indeed added a person to the zero with index. Patrick has a favorite number of seven and his name is Patrick. Obviously, if we hit one, we'll get nothing back and this will just stay up. But if we add another person, maybe John 16, add person. Now at list of people index one, we now see John 16. So zero, it's gonna be Patrick seven, one, John 16, two is nothing, so nothing happens.
Now we've talked about this a little bit already, but if we go ahead, for example, and maybe delete this semicolon, and we go to try to compile, and we scroll down, you'll see we get this error. Parser error, expected semicolon, but got bracket instead. And it gives us this little red exclamation mark and the line that it's having an issue with. All these red errors mean that your code isn't compiling, and you can't actually deploy this to the blockchain because Solidity doesn't know how to turn this human readable code into machine readable code. So we need to add this semicolon here, recompile, so we get no errors. Now, interestingly though, if we go to the top and let's say we delete this SPX license identifier, and now we compile, we scroll down, we get a yellow box and it says warning instead of error. It says warning, SPDX license identifier not provided, source file, blah, blah, blah. Interestingly though, if we compile this, we actually, let's delete our last simple storage, we can deploy this. So if something important to note is warnings are just that. They're just warnings. They won't prevent you from deploying or compiling your code. Errors will prevent you from deploying or compiling your code. Now, even with that being said though, it is good to try to remove all of the warnings because the warnings are generally there for a reason. They're warning you that you might be doing something bad. And sometimes if you have a bug in your code, simply just listening to the warnings would have solved it. So it's best to listen to the warnings here. So to summarize, if it's red, it's broken. If it's yellow, you might want to check it out. And additionally, when it comes to these errors and these warnings, this is where using our AI and Google searching skills can really come in handy. Let's say, for example, I ran our code, I get this error, I read the error, and I don't really understand what's going on here. What we can do is we could maybe copy this error and use any of the search features that we talked about resources for this course. We can use ChatGPT or Find, GitHub Discussions, Stack Exchange, Ethereum, and Piranha. And I'll explain what each one of these is good for later in the course. But for example, let's go and try out Find. Find is an AI search engine for developers. What it does is it first does a Google search, and then it reads all those links, and based off the links it reads, it tries to give you an answer. So what we could do is we could say, I am getting this compiler error in Solidity. How do I fix it? We hit this little drop down, put any code or context here. We'll paste our error. This is the error, like this. And we'll go ahead and hit search. We get a pretty verbose response on what's going on with our code. We could actually take this a step farther and we could copy our entire code base and we could paste it under here we say code, I usually put three back ticks before and after any code that I use, and I'll teach you why in the future. Well, let's go ahead and hit enter and research. It actually is able to read our code and say, one way to fix the error is to simply add a semicolon at the end of the line where you push the new person to the dynamic array list of people. And we can see it. we do indeed get a way to just copy our add person function, and we can scroll down and just paste it on top with it being fixed. And we could also say concise because it's being a little too verbose for us. We'll hit enter again. And it wasn't that concise, but a lot of these AI tools, like I said, are still in beta. But this was a good example of how using an AI tool like this can actually help you detect bugs. Like I said, oftentimes they will still get things wrong, which is why it's important for you to know about GitHub discussions, Stack Exchange, Piranha, etc. Later in the course, I'll explain more about how to ask good questions, how to do good AI prompting, how to format your questions, and how to search and learn more. One of the key pieces of being a really good software engineer or a good prompt engineer is less about actually knowing the information and more about knowing where to find the information. So throughout this course, I want you to practice using these resources because they're going to help you be a much stronger developer, much stronger prompt engineer, and just be better at everything that we're going to go over in this course. If Find or ChatGPT gives you a poor answer, be sure to use the GitHub discussions. If you have a question specific to this course, be sure to use the GitHub discussions. Or if you have a more general question about Solidity, about Foundry, or anything like that, you can use one of these resources. Again, I'll go over this more later. But great job. You've done your first bit of prompt engineering. Congratulations. You don't have to understand this section fully. Now, one thing that we didn't really go over and we kind of glossed over was this memory keyword. And you'll notice if we actually delete this keyword and you try to compile, we'll get an error. Data location must be memory or call data for parameter in function. 
but none was given. Now the EVM can actually read and write to several places and the number of places it can read and write from are actually constantly changing. Some of the most important ones are gonna be stack, memory, storage, call data, and code. And for now, you can go ahead and just look at this easier edition because a lot of these other places are more advanced. So for now, we're just gonna look at the stack, memory, storage, call data, logs, and then chain data. For those of you who want to go ahead and jump ahead and learn a little bit more quickly, we have an article associated with this lesson, which goes deeper into all these different places that the EVM can read and write. Keep in mind that this is accurate as of recording, and oftentimes the EVM is upgraded to add more places. We're not gonna go over all of these areas right now, but we are gonna go over some of the big ones, which are call data, memory, and storage. And this is gonna be a little bit advanced here, so if you don't understand this section the first time, don't worry about it, just keep pushing through. It'll make more sense as you go later on in the course. Call data and memory both mean that this variable is only going to exist temporarily. It's only going to exist for the duration of the function call. Any call anytime we call add person with a different name, we can only access this name variable that one time that we call this function. If I call add name Patrick seven, and now I try to list of people at zero, obviously we see Patrick at favorite number seven, we can actually never access that Patrick variable ever again because it existed in memory. It existed for a very short period of time, just for that single call. We could also have call data here, and we'll go ahead, remove this, deploy the dropdown, and do the same thing. We'll add Patrick, and actually, you don't even need the quotes. Patrick, we'll do 88, add person, we'll see if it's in there. Sure is. Call data and memory both mean temporary variables. Inside of functions, most variables automatically default to memory variables. Strings are a special type in Solidity, so you have to specify memory or call data, and it has to do with the way arrays work in memory, but we'll talk about that much later in the course. Now, the question obviously then follows, okay, well, if call data and memory are both temporary variables, why have two? What's the difference between these two? Well, let's try something. Let's have this be a memory variable, and in here, we'll say name equals cat. So we're gonna reassign whatever people put in here to cat. Let's compile this. Looks like it compiles fine. Now let's do call data and try to compile. Ah, we get an error. Type error. Type literal string cat is not implicitly convertible to expected type string call data. The difference between memory and call data is that a memory variable can be changed. It can be manipulated. If we pass a memory variable to a function, we can go ahead, memory, and I hit, and I hit command S to compile. This is valid solidity. This is not. If you pass a call data variable, you cannot modify it. Call data is temporary variables that cannot be modified. Memory is temporary variables that can be modified. And storage is permanent variables that can be modified. My favorite number was actually implicitly converted to a storage variable since it's added in this state context outside of a function. If you create a variable that's outside of any function inside of a contract, it'll automatically be a storage variable. And let's delete this line. Let's compile, let's deploy again, we'll delete this, deploy. We know it's a permanent variable because we can hit retrieve and we can always access what is in favorite number. So if we store one, two, three, we hit store, we can hit retrieve and we can access one, two, three. So this variable one, two, three exists outside of function calls. Now, even though I said there are more places like stack, code, log, return, et cetera, we can only make these variables call data, memory, or storage. And like I said, we'll explain that later in the course. So let's go ahead, let's add this back to memory because that's normally what you'll see. Now, the next question that logically follows is, oh, okay, Patrick, well, why do we need to put memory here? Well, we don't need to put memory over here. In fact, if we try to put memory there, we had an error. Data location can only be specified for array, struct, or mapping types, but memory was given. Like I was saying earlier, arrays, structs, or mapping are considered special types in Solidity. And the way that memory management works under the hood makes it so that we have to put this memory keyword. U256 is known as a primitive type, and Solidity is smart enough to know where to put this favorite number always under the hood. Like we were saying earlier, a string is actually an array of bytes, and so, so as we just saw with the error, we need to put the memory keyword for arrays. So then the next question is, okay, well, what about the storage variable? Can I put that here? No, you can't put that here either. 
since this is a function, Solidity is smart enough to at least know that, ah, okay, this is a temporary variable that you're working with. It's got to be memory or call data. It's not going to be storage since this name is only going to exist for a short duration. So you got to pick one of these other two. So the summary of this section is that structs, mappings, and arrays need to be given this memory keyword. A string is an array of bytes, so it needs this memory or call data keyword. So this code is starting to shape up. It has a lot of functionality here. We can store variables, we can add people, but it has a bit of an issue. If we have this contract and we wanna say, oh, what was Kelly's favorite number? Let's say we have four people in the array. Let's have Pat, seven, John, eight, Mariah, 10, and Chelsea, 22, or 232. And we ask the question, ah, what was Chelsea's favorite number? Well, the way we would do it is we'd have to actually loop through this list of people to find Chelsea. So we'd say, okay, what's at zero? Ah, okay, that's Pat. That's not Chelsea. What's at two? Ah, that's John. What's at three? Ah, that's Mariah. Or excuse me, what's at three? Ah, that's Chelsea. Favorite number 232. Okay, perfect. I found Chelsea. But obviously, if we had a thousand people in this array, that would be a very tedious process, and that would take a long time for us to find the person that we wanted. So the question then is, is there a better data structure than a list or an array to use that makes it much easier to access and find the information about the people that we want? And the answer to this is using a mapping. You can think of a mapping as a dictionary. It's a set of keys with each key returning a special set of information about that key. So it's similar to a dictionary. If you look up the word the, the word the will have a whole bunch of text associated only with the word the. So let's create a mapping type and you'll see how it works in practice. So we're gonna create a mapping like this with this mapping keyword. And we'll say the key is going to be a string and it'll point to a uint256. So this is going to be our type. Obviously what comes after the type, our visibility. So let's just go ahead and do public for this as well. And I like to be very explicit with my naming. So I'm gonna say name to number, signifying that this map maps someone's name to their favorite number. And now with this, we have essentially a dictionary where every single name or every single string is gonna map to one number. So for example, if we looked up Chelsea, we'd automatically get returned the 232 that we're looking for instead of having to iterate through this list. So let's add some capabilities to our add person function here so that we can update our mapping. So we have this list of people dot push, which adds someone to the array. Let's also update this so it will also add somebody to our mapping. To do that, we'll say name to favorite number. And we put these little brackets in here to specify what the key is. And we'll say underscore name, and we'll assign that to underscore favorite number. What this line is doing is now it's saying, all right, in our mapping up here, in our name to favorite number mapping, Anytime you look for that person's name, you'll automatically get their favorite number back. And now you have a much quicker way to access people's favorite numbers just by knowing their name. So let's go ahead, let's compile this. Let's deploy this, let's delete our old one. We'll deploy this. Now we have this new name to favorite number blue button. And so let's go through the same problem. So let's say we have Pat, seven, John, 16. Mariah, 32, Chelsea, 232. Now, same thing, list of people zero returns Pat, list of people one, John, so on and so forth. Or we could just go down here and let's say, let's look up Chelsea and we automatically get 232. We get Chelsea's favorite number back automatically. Same thing, if we look up Pat, we get seven. If we look up John, we get Mariah. And if we look up cheesecake, we get nothing back. In a mapping, the default value for all the keys is zero. So if you look up a key or a word that we haven't added in the mapping yet, it defaults to the default value of whatever that type is. Since ours is a string to uint256, uint256 default type is zero. If we look for a key that we haven't added, we get zero back. So now that we've added all this functionality, we're looking pretty good. 
we really like the way that our contract is set up. We have our my favorite number, which is a internal variable, but we have a way to read it with retrieve. We have our new typing person. We have a public list of people array. We've got a public name to favorite number. We've got a way to update the favorite number, retrieve the favorite number, and add people to both our list and our mapping. Now, in the future, you'll hear me say that you should never do this before you write any tests, before you get it audited. But for now, this is just a dummy contract that we're going to deploy on a testnet, so we don't really care. But let's go ahead and learn how to actually deploy this to a real testnet. This is going to simulate what deploying to a real network with real money is going to look like. Are you ready? You should be. This is going to be incredibly exciting. After you do this successfully, you should 100% tweet about it on Twitter on LinkedIn, on Lens Protocol, on whatever social media you want. It's important to celebrate your small wins. Surprisingly, it'll help motivate you moving forward. So first off, let's make sure this actually compiles. Okay, cool. We've got a green check mark. There's no warnings. There's no errors. Fantastic. Now let's go back to the deploy tab and we'll delete this down here and we'll scroll up and we're going to change the environment. We're in this Remix VM and we're actually going to move to Injected Provider MetaMask. Remember, this Remix VM is kind of this fake world that Remix gives to us. Injected provider MetaMask means that we're going to literally inject our MetaMask into this Remix. We're going to inject our MetaMask into this website. We're going to allow this website to interact with our MetaMask. We'll first get prompted by MetaMask to pick the account we want to use. I'm going to use account one and hit next. And we're going to go ahead and hit connect, similar to the way we connected to the faucet. We scroll up to our MetaMask. We now see, oh, it says your account is not connected. That's because I'm currently on account two. Let's flip to account one. And we do indeed see that account one is connected. And now before where we saw kind of this fake account with fake ether, we see our actual account with the actual amount of Sepolia ETH that we have. Make sure that, again, be sure to use whatever recommended testnet we have in the GitHub repo. For us, we're using Sepolia. Don't worry about the rest of these for now. So make sure you're on the correct testnet. To deploy to a testnet, you're going to need some Sepolia ETH. So if you haven't been to the faucet, be sure to head over to the faucet to get some Sepolia ETH. Remember, you can find those in the GitHub or web3dev.education. Now in Remix, what we're going to do, we're going to do the exact same process we use to deploy to the virtual Remix environment. We're going to do that to deploy to the testnet environment. So we're going to go ahead and hit the deploy button. And MetaMask is actually going to go ahead and pop up. This is similar to what we saw with the blockchain example with signing transactions. We're actually going to sign and send a transaction on the testnet. It's similar, again, to us sending Ether to ourselves. The difference here is, though, that our data section has a ton of information here. All this data is associated with sending this transaction, but this one has all of this contract information encoded in machine-readable code, or our compiled code. In details, we can see all the pavement information associated with this transaction. We can see exactly how much gas it's going to cost to deploy this contract on chain. But again, we're on the Sepolia test network, so this is fake money anyways. To actually deploy this, we're going to go ahead and hit the confirm button. And now we're going to have sent our function. If you have the terminal up, you can see we have this call created and it says creation of simple storage pending with this view on etherscan button. If you click the view on etherscan button, you'll get brought to this Etherscan page with this transaction going through on Sepolia. You'll see it's currently being indexed by Etherscan, but there's a good chance it already went through. And back in Remix, it actually goes ahead and gives us this green check mark saying that we did indeed deploy this contract. You might have to wait a few minutes for this to complete because again, we're sending a transaction to a testnet blockchain and the blockchain needs to actually produce the block with our transaction in it. But if we wait a few minutes on Etherscan, we'll eventually see a success status with block confirmations on this block section here. And exactly the same as what we saw with sending ETH to ourselves, we see all this information about the transaction, transaction hash, status, block, time, from, to, blah, blah, etc. But if we scroll down, this input data field is much bigger than anything we've seen before, because again, this is all the data associated with creating this contract. And of course, we see more gas fee information because again, deploying a smart contract to the chain is modifying the blockchain, so we have to spend gas. Now, if we come back to our remix and scroll down, we're able to see our simple storage contract and we're able to copy the address that it's at. So if we copy this address, we go back to Etherscan, we can even paste this into the bar here and we can see this contract that we went ahead and deployed. 
Etherscan is smart enough to know that this transaction created a new contract. Remember, this has to be on the Sepolia Etherscan, not the mainnet Etherscan, because we sent this on the Sepolia testnet. So now that we have this contract created, we have all the exact same functions that we had in our virtual environment, but these functions are actually on a testnet with a contract that we actually deployed. Now we can do all the exact same things we were doing on our fake remix environment on this testnet environment. For example, we can call retrieve, which doesn't send a transaction, it just reads off the blockchain, and we get zero, same as what we got before. If we look up a name, like Pat, in name to favorite number, we get nothing back because we haven't updated anything. If we add zero in here for list of people, we get nothing back as well. MetaMask didn't pop up here because these blue buttons are view functions. View and pure functions, like we said, don't send transactions. Now let's go ahead and actually send a transaction. Let's update the blockchain. Let's update our contract by storing a new favorite number. So let's do 7878 and we'll hit store and we'll press this orange button. You'll see, you'll get prompted with MetaMask actually popping up saying, okay, let's update the blockchain. Let's send this transaction. And if we go ahead and hit confirm, the exact same thing happens. We'll get this transact to simple storage, storage, transact to simple storage dot store pending, view an ether scan, this little check mark. If we view it, we can see the transaction indexing on Etherscan. And after you wait for a little bit, the transaction will go through. And now if we hit the retrieve button, we can see we have now stored 7878 on chain. If we copy the contract address again, we paste it into Sepolia Etherscan. We scroll down. After a few minutes, we'll actually see a second transaction come through. We see two transactions associated with this contract. The first transaction obviously is the contract creation transaction. And the second transaction is us actually calling the store method. Etherscan is smart enough to know that this is the store method. It's not always smart enough to know that, but for this one, it's smart enough to know. And we see that we actually updated our contract. And remember, in the future, please use these test nets sparingly. We're just starting out and we're just learning. So it's okay for us to send these transactions here though. But let's go ahead and let's keep going because name to favorite number of Pat still returns nothing. List of people zero still returns nothing. So let's go to add person. We'll do Pat 16, we'll hit add person. MetaMask pops up, obviously, because we're updating the state of our contract. We'll hit confirm. We see transact to simple storage .add person is pending. It looks like it has succeeded. So now if we do name to favorite number of Pat, we see 16 get returned. And if we do list of people at zero, we see we get Pat whose favorite number is 16. And guess what? At this point, you've successfully deployed a smart contract to a real test net. Congratulations. You should be incredibly excited for yourself. Be sure to give yourself a pat on the back, maybe go for a walk, maybe have an extra cup of coffee or an ice cream. Because additionally, you've also interacted with that contract with these buttons and remix that allow us to send transactions to update the state of our contracts. Congratulations, you're a Solidity developer, but we've got a lot more to go. And like I said, make sure to celebrate these little wins. Celebrating little wins will motivate you and excite you to continue to move forward. So be sure to take the time to pat yourself on the back. Congratulations if you've got this far. There's a ton more for us to learn, but just you getting here is a fantastic achievement in itself. Now here, if we wanted to deploy to a different testnet, all we would have to do in our MetaMask is switch to a different testnet like Linea Gorilli. Since we don't have any Linea Gorilli, we actually can't deploy this to a testnet, but if we used a faucet to get more Linea Gorilli ETH, that's how we would deploy it. Additionally, we could do the same methodology for deploying to Ethereum mainnet or any other mainnet that you want to work with throughout this course. The difference here is obviously you just need to buy some Ethereum to actually deploy this smart contract. Remix will automatically update to whatever network you're working with. For example, right here it says, ah, you're working on the main network. But if we were to switch to Gorelli, it would say, ah, you're working on Gorelli. But if we were to switch again, it would say, ah, you're working on Linea. In the future, we'll learn to add different networks so you can learn how to deploy to any other EVM compatible network that you want to. So you should be incredibly excited, right? You just deployed a smart contract to an actual network. Now, as we mentioned in Blockchain Basics, deploying to the Ethereum main chain has gotten incredibly expensive. And to help scale Ethereum and these EVM chains, we're working with these rollups, these layer twos, to actually execute our transactions. And these L2s are where we're going to deploy our contracts as well. 
So now I'm going to teach you how to deploy to an L2, to deploy to ZK Sync in particular. And when you go to actually deploy smart contracts and actually work with different networks, this is probably going to be the process that you're going to take as well. Nowadays, most contracts are not deployed to Ethereum mainnet because it's so expensive. A lot of contracts are instead deployed to an L2, and as they gain traction, maybe only then they're deployed to Ethereum. So we're going to take our simple storage contract, and we're actually going to learn how to deploy it to the L2 ZK Sync as well. Now, if you've followed along with the Blockchain Basics, you've already learned how to add ZK Sync to your MetaMask. However, if you haven't done that, we're going to go ahead through that as well. Now you have learned to work with different faucets, right? If you're working with the GitHub resources associated with this course, the GitHub repo, and we scroll down in here, we can obviously come to the testnet faucets, which might look a little bit something like this. To work with ZK Sync, there's actually going to be two different ways we're going to work with getting testnet funds. The first way is using a ZK Sync faucet, which will work the exact same way as doing a Sapolio faucet, but the other way will be actually using the bridge. Now, I will caution that sometimes these free faucets can be a little bit fickle. So if any of these aren't working for you, be sure to make an issue on this GitHub repo, come to the GitHub discussions, make a discussion and say, hey, I'm having a hard time deploying my smart contract to ZK Sync and we'll make it easier for you then. But if you want to go ahead and click the network faucets like here and walk through this, you can absolutely do so. But we're actually going to teach you how to do the bridge. If you've already bridged funds over to ZK Sync, you can go ahead and fast forward to the part where we actually deploy the smart contract. But I'm going to go ahead and show you the bridge again, just in case you skipped over Blockchain Basics. So we're going to come to this portal.zksync.io slash bridge website. Again, you can find this in the GitHub repo associated with this course, the GitHub resources. If you're watching this on Cypher and Updraft, it'll be that little button we taught you in the best practices section. So we're going to go ahead and agree. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to click connect wallet. And this is going to be real similar to what we did in MetaMask. We're going to hit connect wallet. We're going to select MetaMask here. And it's our MetaMask is going to pop up. Maybe we have to add in our password here. We're going to go ahead next and connect. And to get started, we want to make sure we are on the Sepolia test network, right? And again, if you don't have Sepolia ETH, you can come back here. The GCP faucet as of recording is the best faucet. You can use any of these other faucets as well. Again, if these aren't working, let us know in the GitHub discussions or make an issue on the repo. So you do need to have Sepolia ETH in your MetaMask. And what we're going to do is we're actually going to bridge over. We're going to transfer our Sepolia ETH over to this L2, this layer two ZK Sync. So what we're going to do is we're going to click this ZK Sync button at the top right and change to ZK Sync Sepolia testnet. And now we should see bridge from Ethereum Sepolia testnet. And the reason I want to show you how to do this is because this is actually going to be the exact same process that you're going to take when you're bridging to L2s in the future, when you're bridging to these other chains on mainnet, on real bridges, et cetera. So actually going through this will give you practice on how to actually do this. Now, like I said, if you're having a hard time getting the test net, don't worry too much about getting this done correctly. However, I highly encourage you to get this done and highly encourage you to try to be successful here so that you can go boast about it on Twitter. <laughs> but so what we're gonna do, in my wallet, I have 0.04 Sepolia ETH, we don't really need a whole lot of ZK Sync Sepolia to deploy smart contracts. So I'm just going to move over 0 0.1 Ethereum Sepolia testnet, right? Even 0 0.001 is probably plenty of ZK Sync Sepolia testnet to send over. So go ahead and do that. And remember, we are working with a testnet wallet. There's no real money associated with my wallet. And we're going to do from Ethereum Sepolia testnet to ZK Sync Sepolia testnet. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to select continue you'll we want to read this little warning here it says make sure your wallet supports zk sync sepolia test network before adding funds to your account otherwise this can result in loss of funds see the port see the list of supported wallets on the ecosystem website since we're using metamask metamask is supported i understand proceed to the bridge and we're going to see we're going to bridge from your sepolia testnet account to your zk sync sepolia testnet account we'll go ahead and select bridge now we're going to teach you later how to 
make sure that this transaction is actually sending your funds to the right places. But for now, since this is a testnet, we don't really care. We're just going to go ahead and hit confirm and we're going to send our funds over. Now your transaction is submitted. We will have to wait a little bit for this transaction to complete. You can see a little estimated time at the bottom here. While we're waiting, if we haven't done this already, we want to go ahead and add that ZK Sync Sepolia test network to our MetaMasks. So what we can do is we can come up to, we can go back to the resources page, right? The Foundry full course. We can go ahead, we can scroll down to this chain list section, which will be right underneath the testnet faucets. And if we click this link, this will bring us to the chain list website where we can actually add wallet information to our MetaMask. Later on in the course, we'll teach you how to do this manually and we'll teach you what all the parameters mean. But for now, we're just going to go ahead, we'll click a button and life will be easier. So in this little search networks section, we're going to look up ZK Sync Sepolia. We'll hit enter. Oh, we'll also hit include test nets. And we'll see this ZK Sync Sepolia testnet chain ID 300. This is the chain ID we're looking for. And then we'll go ahead and select connect wallet. Our MetaMask will pop up. We'll choose the wallet we want to connect with. And then we'll see this MetaMask pop up here. It'll say something like add site, allow this site to add a network. It'll say network name, ZK Sync Sepolia testnet. This URL might be a little bit different, but this one looks like it's fine. Chain ID, currency th symbol, etc. We'll go ahead and ignore these warnings. This is just a test net, so it's fine. And we'll go ahead and select approve. Once we hit approve, we'll see this allow this site to switch the network, Sepolia to ZK Sync Sepolia testnet. We'll go ahead and select switch network. And now if we go to our MetaMask and we select it, we'll see this little drop down. We are now on the ZK Sync Sepolia testnet like this. Cool. Now, if we go back to our bridge after some time, we'll eventually see this transaction completed here. And if we go to our MetaMask here, we'll actually see the funds inside of our MetaMask. 0 0.01 test at ZK Sync Sepolia ETH. Fantastic. So now that we have that, we can actually go back to our remix and learn how to deploy this to ZK Sync testnet. Okay, before we go back to Patrick and learn how to deploy our smart contract on ZK Sync Sepolia, I just want to come in very quickly and explain to you a little bug that there is with the ZK Sync plugin. So if we have our setup exactly as you had it with Patrick, where you have just your simple storage.sol smart contract, and then you went to the ZK Sync plugin, and then you hit compile, which is akin to in here with the Solidity compiler compiling the simple storage. If you hit compile right now, you'll see that in the deploy tab, which is the same as this deploy tab for for regular deployments when we did it with Sepolia, you'll see that there are no smart contracts ready for deployment yet. And it's saying that we haven't compiled a Solidity contract yet, even though it has a tick here and it says that we compiled it. And this is because of a small bug, which basically means that you need to have your smart contracts inside of a contracts folder. So if we just create a new folder, we call it contracts, and then we chuck our contract inside the contracts folder. And then we head back to the ZK Sync plugin, and then we hit compile simple storage, and then if I zoom out a touch and then I click accept, 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 then I'll be able to go ahead and deploy my simple storage and it'll compile correctly. So if you just make sure that all of your smart contracts that you write are inside of a contracts folder, you'll be good to go. So back to Patrick to explain you through that step-by-step -step in a little bit more detail. And I'm really excited for you to learn this because nowadays this is how all the pros do it. So you're going to be learning right now the exact same type of layer two or rollup that the professionals deploy to. We're going to deploy to this zero knowledge rollup called ZK Sync, and we're going to learn some of the differences on how to actually deploy to this test network. Now, in the future, deploying to this test network will probably be the exact same process as what we just did, right? You'll come to deploy, you'll go down, you'll switch this to injected, you'll hit deploy and boom, and everything will work exactly the same. But as of right now, ZK Sync is a little bit different. So we actually have to use a plugin to work with ZK Sync. So we'll come down to this plugin manager and we'll look for ZK Sync and we'll see this ZK Sync module that we'll go ahead and activate. Now on the left side here, you'll see a new ZK Sync little tab on the left side that we're going to go ahead and click. And we're going to see a setup pretty similar to what we were working with before with the deploy and run transactions tab, except for this is going to be down in ZK Sync. 
Let me just zoom in a little bit. We see a couple of different sections. We see compile, deploy, interact, and transactions. And then at the bottom, we'll see a little environment that we can kind of pull up. This environment section down here is the exact same as this environment section up here in the Ethereum deploy and run. This compile up here is the same as this compile for Solidity. This deploy here is going to be kind of the same as this deploy section here. And then this interact and transactions will make sense very soon. So what we're going to do now is we're going to first compile this simple storage.sol. And if you have more files in here for whatever reason, just select the simple storage.sol and just go ahead and hit compile. So this is actually going to compile. Now, as of recording, if we hit compile, we'll hit compilation failed, solidity compilation failed, logs can be read in the terminal log. And the reason for this is because, because the compiler we're using is this ZK Sulk latest. And as of recording, this is 0.8.24. This is because this using ZK Sulk latest only works with very specific versions of Solidity. So if we come to the GitHub repo associated with this course, we can go ahead, we can scroll down to, or scroll up, I guess, to welcome to Remix, Remix Simple Storage. We can scroll all the way down to ZK Sync L2 Deploy. We can see this ZK Sync Compiler Edition 0.8.24. We'll go ahead and copy that. We'll paste that into our simple storage contract, and then we'll go ahead and compile here. In the future, I imagine that this will just automatically work for the different versions of Solidity. But then you'll see a pop-up that looks something like this. Permission needed for file manager. This is asking us if we want to give this simple storage.sol permission to the ZK Sync era compiler. We're going to go ahead and hit remember this choice and we're going to go ahead and accept and we'll go back up. We'll just hit compile again. And even though it's still got the red squigglies, this has indeed compiled correctly. Uh, we to get rid of those red squigglies, we just can come back to the Solidity compiler and compile it with this new version of Solidity. Cool. So now that this has been compiled, our deploy tab opens up and we can now see a deploy button for our simple storage contract. So this is where we're going to deploy our contract. And with Remix, we had this Remix VM button up here. But for ZK Sync, we're going to go down to the environment down here and we're going to switch from remote DevNet to local DevNet. This is essentially the Remix VM equivalent of the ZK Sync environment. And now we're going to go ahead and select deploy. Now, as of recording, this remote DevNet is broken, hence this little red dot here. So instead, we're not going to test this. We're going to go ahead and deploy this right to the testnet. It's the testnet anyways. So we're going to come down to environment and we're going to switch from remote DevNet to wallet. And we're going to get this button that says connect wallet. And we're going to go ahead and click it. We'll select MetaMask. And as normal, our MetaMask will pop up. Let me zoom out a little bit. I'm going to go ahead and connect my account. And I'm going to make sure that I'm on the ZK Sync Sepolia testnet. If I'm just on Sepolia and not the ZK Sync Sepolia testnet, deploying this won't work. So be sure you're on the ZK Sync Sepolia testnet here. ZK Sync Sepolia testnet. Then what we can do is we can go ahead and deploy. And if we wanted to verify our contract auto magically, we can go ahead and select this verify contract as well. We'll learn more about verification and what it means in the future. For now, I highly recommend you hit verify contract. So now we're actually going to deploy this to the ZK Sync test network. You ready? You should be. So let's go ahead. Let's hit deploy and verify. Our MetaMask will pop up asking us to give a signature. We'll have a whole bunch of stuff in here. We don't really care. Again, this is a test net, a test account. So we'll go ahead and sign this. And after a brief delay, we'll see this huge output that looks something like this, this huge, huge, huge output. And in this output, let me pull this up a little bit. And if it's green and you see verification successful, that means this contract was both deployed and verified successfully. So what we can do then is we can grab this contract address and we can go to the ZK Sync Sepolia Explorer. This is going to be similar to that Etherscan project that we were working with before. And we can paste that new address, that address that we copied from this button right here into the ZK Sync Explorer. So remember though, be sure you're on sepolia.explorer.zksync. And in here, we can go to contract and we can see, whoa, we have our simple storage.sol 
code base in here. Oh my goodness, that's so exciting. We've actually deployed a smart contract to the ZK Sync testnet. ZK Sync is a zero knowledge rollup and is a really cool, really badass L2. So you should be incredibly proud because a lot of developers actually haven't gotten this far. Well done. You should be very, very exciting. Now, similar to working with Solidity and with Ethereum on this deploy and run transactions tab, on ZK Sync, we see these same buttons, right? We see add person, list of people, my favorite number, retrieve, etc. When we select these blue buttons in here, we'll see the output in the terminal over here. And obviously, if we were to go ahead and call one of these orange buttons, for example, storing 77, when we hit store, of course, our MetaMask will pop up. If you want to go ahead and test some of these out, go for it. Just remember, test nets can be a little bit fickle. They can be a little bit slow. But if we go ahead and confirm, it looks like it went through almost right away. I can hit retrieve again, and the 77 returns on our side. So with this, you have now just deployed a smart contract to ZK Sync. You should be so excited. Not only did you bridge testnet funds over to ZK Sync, but you actually deployed a smart contract as well. Now, you should be incredibly proud of yourself, and the Web3 community is proud of you too. So what I want you to do, if you do have a Twitter, if you don't, that's fine, but you should sign up for one. I want to hear from you. The ZK Sync community wants to hear from you. The Web3 community wants to hear from you and be excited with you. What you can do in the GitHub repo associated with this course, you can scroll down, go ahead to the Welcome to Remix, scroll all the way down even more and get to this Tweet Me button. If you go ahead and click this, you'll be opened up into a what's called a Tweet Intent. Now, I'm not logged in here, but if you are logged into Twitter, you will, it'll automatically populate a tweet for you that looks like this. I just deployed a smart contract to the ZK Sync testnet. Thanks, Patrick Alphacy and Cypher and Updraft. We absolutely love to hear from you all. So definitely be sure to send us a tweet, get excited with us, and be proud of yourself for deploying a smart contract to the ZK Sync testnet. You are becoming a pro so quickly. All right. And with that, you have deployed a smart contract to the L2s, which are faster and much cheaper than the Ethereum chain while still having a lot of the security and properties of Ethereum. You should be incredibly excited with yourself. So let's go ahead and close out this section with a little recap. Now, I've mentioned this a couple of times, but whenever we compile this code, it compiles it down to something called the EVM or the Ethereum virtual machine. Don't worry too much about exactly what this means, but essentially the EVM is a standard for how to compile and how to deploy smart contracts to a blockchain. Any blockchain that is EVM compatible, you should be able to deploy Solidity code to. Some examples of EVM compatible blockchains and layer twos, which again, we're going to go over working with layer twos more in the future, are going to be Ethereum, Polygon, Arbitrum, Optimism, ZK Sync, and more. Just note that it's important to double check the blockchain before you launch to it. For example, ZK Sync is EVM compatible, but a couple of keywords don't actually work with ZK Sync. Now let's do a quick recap of everything we learned in this lesson. And then after we do this, be absolutely be certain to take a break, maybe go get some ice cream, go get that extra coffee or whatever you like to do. The first thing you want to do in any smart contract or Solidity code that you write, be sure to write the version that you want to work with. And above the version, be sure to add the SPDX license identifier. If you're not sure what version to use, for now, just default to MIT. Then you have to create your contract object and name your contract. A contract is similar to a class in other programming languages. Anything inside of the curly brackets for the contract is part of that contract. There are many different types in Solidity, like UIN256, string, boolean, int, etc. If we want to create our own type in Solidity, we can use what's called a struct. You can create arrays or lists in Solidity. You can create mappings or dictionaries or hash tables in Solidity, where if you give it a key, it'll spit out the variable associated with that specific key. We can create functions in Solidity that modify the state of the blockchain. We can also create functions in Solidity that don't modify the state of the blockchain. View and pure functions don't modify the state of the blockchain. We can also specify different data locations in our parameters of our functions but we can only do that for special types like strings, structs, and arrays. 
call data and memory mean that that variable is only temporary and will only exist for the duration of the function call. Storage variables are permanent and stay in the contract forever. Function parameters can't be storage variables since they're only going to exist for the duration of the function call. Whenever we hit compile in our smart contracts, it actually compiles our Solidity code down to EVM compatible bytecode or machine readable code. We'll learn more about those specifications later. And last but not least, congratulations on your first contract here. All right, let's get started now with our lesson three. Remember, everything is in the GitHub repository or the web3dev.education. We scroll down once again, we can scroll to lesson three. And again, a lot of this is undone, but it'll be done for the actual video. Scroll down to lesson three, and we have lesson three, Remix Storage Factory. All the code that we're gonna be working with is in this Remix Storage Factory F23 GitHub repository. All of the GitHub repos associated with this course end with F 23, which stands for Foundry 2023. I'm going to first do a brief walkthrough of what we're going to be coding for this lesson. So for now, just sit back and relax and enjoy. For this lesson, we're going to be working with three new contracts. Our original simplestorage.sol, which we're going to do a slate modification to, a new 5storage.sol or add5storage.sol, and a storagefactory.sol. Our storagefactory.sol is actually going to be responsible for deploying new simple storage contracts. Yes, other contracts can deploy contracts. Not only is this going to be able to deploy other contracts, but it's going to be able to interact with other contracts as well. What we could do is we could deploy this to a Remix VM, hit deploy, we'll compile all of our code, go to a Remix VM, scroll down to select the contract, we're going to select storage factory, not simple storage, deploy this, see that contract that we just deployed down at the bottom, and you'll see our top function is this function called create simple storage contract, where if we pull up our terminal and we click create simple storage contract, you'll see we get a new transaction at the bottom. And this transaction is the transaction that we deployed a simple storage contract from our storage factory contract. Now we can actually go ahead and interact with our simple storage contract. Remember, in simple storage, we have a function called store, which takes a favorite number. We can actually call this store function on our simple storage contract from our storage factory contract using this F store function. So we'll add the index of our simple storage contract, which since we only deployed one so far, it'll be at index zero. And we'll say our new favorite number is one, two, three. And we'll hit F store and we'll click SF store at zero, one, two, three. SF store stands for storage factory store. So we're gonna store the number one, two, three on index zero. And again, don't worry about this making too much sense yet. We're going to explain this all in a minute. Now, if we hit SF get of zero, we'll go ahead and get back one, two, three. We're saying let's get the value of the simple storage contract stored at index zero. And we do indeed get one, two, three. Additionally, we have this list of simple storage contracts array or list. And it's only size one right now. But if we type in zero here, we get back the address of that original simple storage contract that we deployed. Additionally, in this lesson, we're going to learn about a ton of incredibly important Solidity features, such as imports and inheritance. Without further ado, let's get froggy. And one more time, of course, remember all the code is available in the Foundry full course F23 of the Chainxl org or on the web3dev.education site once it's up. So here we are back in Remix with our simple storage.sol. If you skipped over the last section and want to get that contract, just come to the full repository, go down to lesson two, go over to the code in the GitHub repo associated with this course, the Remix Simple Storage F23, and just copy and paste everything into Remix yourself. To make sure you've done it correctly, be sure to hit compile. We have our simple storage contract that we created in our last lesson, which is great. It allows us to store our favorite number and it allows us to store a list of people who have different favorite numbers, also a mapping, and some other different functionality with interacting with people's favorite number. But we want to go even further with this. We want another contract to actually deploy this simple storage contract for us and interact with it. Contracts interacting with each other seamlessly and permissionlessly is a feature of smart contracts and blockchain development that's absolutely essential and crucial and one of the reasons why blockchain development is so powerful. 
The ability for contracts to interact with each other seamlessly is something known as composability. Smart contracts are composable because they can easily interact with each other. This becomes even more important when we get to topics such as DeFi, where we can have incredibly complicated financial products and instruments interact with each other seamlessly because they're all using the same smart contract interface. So we're going to keep our simple storage.soul the exact same way it was from the last lesson, and we'll update it in a little bit. But let's go ahead and create a new contract called storagefactory.soul. So let's go ahead and get this contract set up. Now we're going to be doing this a lot. And when we work with AI pair programmer, now we're going to be doing this a lot. And when we work with AI pair programming, this is going to be a lot easier for us to do. But for now, repetition is the mother of skill. So let's keep going. First thing we need to do is what? If you want to pause the video and add the first two things you should put at the top of every Solidity Smart Contract right now, go ahead. But for those of you who didn't pause, let's go ahead and do SPDX, License Identifier, MIT. And then let's do Pragma, Solidity, 0 0.8.18 or 19, or whatever you want to do. You know what, let's do 19. What did we do in simple storage? We did 18, let's do 18. And then we'll do contract. So this will be the third thing actually. Contract, storage factory, like this. And I hit Command S, but you can also go and compile like so. And I'm also just gonna add the caret here, meaning we're gonna use 0 0.8.18, but any version greater than that also works as well. Awesome, now this storage factory contract is gonna be deploying a simple storage contract. So let's create a function that can actually deploy or create a simple storage contract. So we'll say function create simple storage contract, and we'll make this a public function. And we're going to have this create simple storage contract function, deploy a contract, and then save it to a state variable or a storage variable. But the question is, okay, well, how does the storage factory know what the simple storage contract even looks like? How does this contract know about this contract? How does this contract know that this contract even exists? The first way that we could do this is we could actually go to our simple storage.soul contract and start highlighting from the contract word and scroll all the way down to the end of the contract, copy it, command C or right click, copy, go back over to storage factory and below pragma solidity, but above contract storage factory, paste it in here. If we go ahead and command S or compile this, you'll see that this actually goes ahead and compiles successfully. Huh. So this is to show you that yes, right now in our storage factory .soul, we have contract simple storage, which ends here. And we also have contract storage factory down here. So this function is going to deploy a simple storage contract, but we're going to save it to a storage or state variable. And we're going to do it the exact same way we've been saving any variable. First thing, remember, like, remember how we did UN256 public favorite number? This was in the format type visibility name. We're going to do the exact same thing. The type of a simple storage contract is going to be simple storage. And the reason that Solidity is going to be able to identify this keyword is because it's the same name as contract. In the same sense that our struct keyword allows us to create a person type the contract keyword allows you to create a new type of well, a type of simple storage contract. So simple storage, for now, we'll just give it a visibility of public, and we'll give it a variable name, simple storage. Now this is going to be a syntax you're going to see a lot, and it might be a little bit confusing the first couple times you read it. The difference between these two is very subtle. The difference between simple storage on the left and simple storage on the right is very subtle. It's simply that the S is lowercase over here, and the S is capitalized over here. Solidity is case sensitive. So these are actually different words. Simple storage here is referring to the contract. Simple storage here is referring to the variable. You'll often see people use the syntax when working with contracts where they name the variable the exact same as the contract itself. If this is confusing to you, you can do my simple storage instead of simple storage with lowercase. So either one of these works. It's good to get used to this as such. But if that's confusing, you can do my simple storage. Now in our create simple storage contract function, we're going to say simple storage equals new simple storage like this. This new keyword is how Solidity knows to deploy a contract. So with just this code alone, if we go to the compile tab, we compile this. This does indeed compile. We can go to deploy. We need to make sure we're on the storage factory .sol on the right hand side. We'll scroll down to the contract. We can actually deploy our storage factory like so, hitting the deploy button. And remember, you can see the transaction in the terminal here. 
and we can scroll down to the contract. Right now, there's two buttons. We have our blue view function, simple storage, because again, the public keyword automatically gives the variable name a getter function or a view function. And of course, we have our create simple storage contract orange button because it is actually a transaction. Right now, simple storage returns nothing, the zero, the default value for an address, which is the zero address. And if we call create simple storage contract, we get see a green check mark, meaning that transaction went through. Now, if we call the simple storage blue view function, we see we indeed get an address here. We have deployed our simple storage contract from another contract. Oh my goodness. So congratulations. Now you know how a contract can deploy another contract. Awesome job. But the thing is, like I was saying, if we just add all of our contracts into the same file and we have these massive contracts all interweave between each other, it can get very cluttered and very confusing. So is there a better way we can actually arrange and organize our code other than this? And this is actually even a little bit redundant since we already have our simple storage.soul. If I change something in here, then I would also have to go and change it in here. And that's too much work for me. As an engineer, I will work incredibly hard to be incredibly lazy. So instead of doing this, we can use what's called an import. If we go ahead and delete our contract simple storage in our storage factory here, so that now we just have the storage factory contract, we can go ahead and use the import keyword to import simple storage.soul. So we can do import dot slash simple storage.soul and a little semicolon here. This import dot slash simple storage.soul is the exact same as if we had this giant simple storage in here. So this import simple storage.soul is a shorthand version of copy pasting that simple storage.soul into this contract. And now we're able to have simple storage.soul in its own file and storage factory just import it from simple storage, making our lives much easier. It takes our path package or GitHub, which we'll explain in a little bit, and, imp and copy pastes whatever in that file at the top of our file. Literally Solidity for us is copy pasting everything in here and sticking it up here. So we can go ahead, run this again. Let's compile, delete our old contract, run, run Remix VM. Let's be sure we're on Storage Factory. We'll go to Storage Factory, we'll deploy it, scroll down, click here. Simple Storage starts up as nothing, create simple storage. Oh my goodness, look, we deployed a contract, huzzah. Great work. So now that we're starting to work with different files, there's a number of things we want to consider. The first one is actually the Solidity version. So right now we're using 0.8.8 .8 with no carrot and in storage factory we're using 0.8.8 .8 with a carrot. If I were to, for example, move the solidity version of this down to 0.8.16 and go to compile this with a different version, Remix is actually gonna Remix is actually gonna automatically bump this up to 0.8.19, or actually Remix is actually gonna automatically bump this up to 0.8.18 if I'm on the simple storage, because 0.8.18 is the version that works for simple storage, and it still is compatible with Storage Factory. However, if I were to take Storage Factory and move it to 0.7.6 and try to compile, it's gonna to try to compile this with 0.7.6 and our simple storage with 0.7.6 and it's not gonna be able to do it for both. And so we're gonna get a compilation error. So when working with multiple files, it's important to keep the version of Solidity in mind because you wanna make sure that all of your contracts can actually compile together. So this is great and all, but right from the get-go, I wanna teach you the more advanced import that you should always use. So this is good, but we actually never want to default to this. We want to default to something called named imports. Let's say our simple storage.soul contract had a ton of other contracts like Contract simple storage two, simple storage three, simple storage four. And these were all massive, massive contracts. As we have this right now, import simple storage.soul would import everything from here. Simple storage, simple storage two, simple storage three, simple storage four. And if these files were incredibly big, when we deploy our storage factory, it would have to calculate all this extra computation, making the deployment of our storage factory more expensive. If that's confusing to you, don't worry about it right now. Additionally, in the future, these can import from weird places that aren't compatible with Storage Factory. Again, that's not gonna make sense quite yet, and that's okay. But in any case, there's a way for us to not import this whole file, but only a very specific contract or a specific section of our simple storage.soul. So instead, what we can do is in our import statement, we can specify the exact contract that we wanna import from this file. So in our simple storage.soul, 
let's say we do have these other contracts in here, we could say we only want to import simple storage, not simple storage two, not, not simple storage three, not simple storage four, by saying import these little brackets here, simple storage from simple storage dot soul. And this goes ahead and compiles correctly. We could also import multiple contracts from our simple storage. For example, we could do import simple storage, simple storage two from simple storage dot soul. This way we only import the exact specific contracts that we want from these other files. And I promise you in the future, always referring to named imports instead of this type of imports will save you a lot of headache in the future. So always default to this, never default to this. Just by learning this, you are already better than 80% of the current Solidity developers. So congratulations. <laughs> But all right, fantastic. So we've learned about imports. We're able to import our simple storage from simple storage.soul. We're importing it in the more advanced way. Congratulations. Now, already here, you might actually start running into some questions, right? And we're going to get more and more advanced with this course. And you're going to have questions, which is a good thing. If you don't understand stuff, that means you're thinking critically and you're approaching the subject matter the right way. So this is where we're going to jump into again, doing a little bit of an AI chat example. So for example, on this line, let's say you're a little bit confused and you go, what's the difference between simple storage here and simple storage here? I don't understand. So let's learn how to work with ChatGPT or any AI buddy to ask them to help clarify. So we're going to go ahead. I'm going to hit command A, or you can just highlight everything. Command C to copy or right click copy. We'll go over to ChatGPT, and in here, we're going to ask the question. Hi, I'm having a hard time, and let's zoom in, understanding the difference between the simple storages on this line. And here's where we want to be very specific when we're talking with AIs. So I'm going to hit Shift Enter so that it doesn't actually send the question to ChatGPT, but I'm going to put three back ticks, Shift Enter again. And actually I said, we're going to copy the whole thing, but let's just copy this, this single line and paste it in here. Shift enter again, three back ticks again, adding this delimiter tells ChatGPT that this is a block of code and it makes it easier for ChatGPT to be able to understand that this is a block of code. Then I'll hit shift enter twice. And if you have a lot of code, you're not going to be able to copy your whole contract because a lot of these AIs can only understand so much in a question, but this is small enough that we can actually just go ahead and copy the whole thing, bring it back over to ChatGPT and say, here is my full code. And then we'll do again, shift enter, three back ticks, shift enter, paste, shift enter, three back ticks. So now we have a little AI prompt here that we can ask in ChatGPT. And, and I don't have this in here yet, but in the GitHub repo associated with this lesson, I will add this AI prompt in here. So let's go to the bottom. And I was saying you needed to use shift enter, but I guess you could just use enter. That's fine. Let's go ahead and click the send button and it'll send it the question. So now it'll start outputting here and let's see what it says. And this is where we can already start to see the power of these AI buddies as learning buddies. We see in the given code, simple storage is a variable of type simple storage, which is a contract defined in simple storage as soul tells us what the line is doing, it clarifies the differences a little bit more. And a lot of this beginner basic stuff, AIs are really good at. Once we get more and more advanced, AIs are going to start breaking apart. But at least for the beginning of this course, AIs are going to be incredibly helpful and incredibly good at explaining a lot of these. What we could do if we wanted to is we could also go ahead and copy this prompt. We could go over to something like Bard, paste it in here and ask Bard the same thing. And here's already a good example of where an AI can get things wrong. We scroll down, it's telling me you can use simple storage variable to interact with the new simple storage contract. For example, you could call the set function to set the value on stored data variable, or you could call the get function to get the value of the stored data variable. Uh, there is no stored data variable, so I don't know where it's getting that from. So just remember, keep in mind that AIs can get things wrong, and that when they do, there are other forums that to use as well. Like I said, we're going to be learning about them as we go on, like Stack Exchange Ethereum. Piranha, or like I said, of course, the discussions forum of this course. So if Bard or ChatGPT or whatever AI buddy you're working with gives you something confusing, 
Be sure to go to the GitHub discussions or ask on one of these forums. Now, as you can see though, right now, every single time we call create simple storage contract, we're gonna deploy a new simple storage contract, but we're gonna override it in this simple storage, right? So if we go ahead and deploy this right now, we'll scroll down here, simple storage at the zero address, create. Okay, now it's at a new address, create again. Okay, now it's at a new address. We're not keeping track of all the different addresses that this simple storage contract is being deployed to. So let's actually create a running list of all the different simple storage contracts that we're deploying. So instead of having this variable be just a single simple storage contract, let's have it be an array or list of simple storage contracts. And we'll change the name to list of simple storage contracts. So now when we deploy it, instead of saving it like this, we're gonna do what we did before in our last section. We'll say simple storage, new simple storage contract equals new simple storage, and then we'll push it onto our dynamic array. So we'll say list of simple storage contracts, push new simple storage contract. So let's go ahead and compile this. Okay, looks good. Let's go ahead and deploy this. We'll delete our old one. We're on the Remix VM, great storage factory. And look at this, you can even see, make sure we're on storage factory. Okay, great, we'll go ahead and deploy that. Awesome, we get list of simple storage contracts, which now has this uint256 input, which allows us to choose the index of the variable. We'll go ahead and create simple storage. Now, if we go check the zeroth index, we have an address. If we check the first index, nothing happens. If we call create again, which, sorry, if I have the terminal up, I'll call create again, again. Now there is one at the first index, and since I called it twice, there's also one on the second. There's nothing at the third, I'll hit create again. There's now one at the fourth. Oh, at the third, excuse me. Awesome, so now we actually have a running list of all of our simple storage contracts. Now let's learn how to actually interact with other contracts from a contract. For now, we can think of our storage factory as a sort of manager for all these other contracts. So let's learn how our storage factory contract can actually call the store function of the simple storage that it deploys. So let's create a function called SF store, which is gonna stand for storage factory store, and it's gonna take two variables, a uint256 underscore simple storage index and a uint256 underscore new simple storage number. I'll make this public like this. Now, in order to interact with a contract, you're always gonna need two things. And we're gonna to refer to this a lot. You're gonna need an address and you're gonna need the ABI. Now, this is technically a lie. You really just need the function selector, but we're gonna learn that way, way later in the course. For now, just think, okay, I always need the address and I always need the ABI. The ABI stands for Application Binary Interface. The ABI will tell our code exactly how it can interact with another contract. We'll go deeper into the ABI later on in this course. But for now, if you go to the Compile tab, you hit Compile, and you scroll down, there's this little button at the bottom that says copy ABI to clipboard. Or you could also go to compilation details. You can see a ton of information about the compilation details, such as the bytecode with the opcodes, the metadata, the name, but also the ABI, which tells us the ways we can interact with this contract. If we hit the drop down for the zero, we see there's an input, create simple storage contract, which is one of our functions. And you see state mutability, which we'll talk about later. But if we had another drop down, we see list of simple storage contracts. And the other drop down, we'll see SF store. These, as you know, are the buttons that we can press when we deploy this contract, right? So if I redeploy this, we see those exact three buttons. These are the three buttons that were inside of that ABI. This is how Remix knows to put three buttons here because it looks at the ABI and sees that there's three buttons. So in our code here, our compiler knows what the ABI is. So in our code here, the compiler automatically knows what the ABI is because the compiler is the one that generates the ABI. And we know where the address is because we have a list of all of our addresses that we're keeping track of up here. So the reason we have the ABI is because we're importing our simple storage contract. And actually let's delete this simple storage too. We don't really need the simple storage too. So when we compile simple storage, we automatically get the ABI for solidity. In the future, we'll learn other ways to get the ABI. So down here, let's get a simple storage contract to interact with from our list. And to do that, we'll say simple storage, my simple storage equals list of simple storage contracts at index, simple storage index. 
like this. Since this is an array of simple storage contracts, we can just automatically get the contract itself like this. However, let's say that instead of this being an array of simple storage contracts, this was an array, an array of addresses, a list of simple storage addresses like this. You don't have to code along with me for this section, just go ahead and follow along and watch. If we had a list of addresses, and this would be to be a little bit different, but if we had a list of addresses instead, we could say simple storage, my simple storage equals list of simple storage addresses at the index, and then do something called type casting. And we'd wrap this in parentheses like so. Let me zoom out a little bit. So this is something we'll learn about a little bit later. So basically what we're doing is this list of simple storage addresses, simple storage index, this line returns an address and we're wrapping that address in simple storage like so. If this is a little confusing for you now, don't worry too much about it. We will learn about it more later. Now that we have our simple storage contract, we can actually call the store function directly on this contract. So now we can say my simple storage dot store and we'll add the new simple storage number. And this is great. If we were to deploy this contract right now though and call this SF store function though, we wouldn't be able to read the new variable that we just updated our simple storage contract with. So let's create a function that allows us to read from our simple storage contracts as well. So we'll create a function called SF get, which will take a UN256 underscore simple storage index as an input parameter. We'll make this a public view function that will return a uint256, uint256, and we'll say simple storage, my simple storage equals, and we'll use this exact same syntax that we used above to get the simple storage index, equals list of simple storage contracts at the simple storage index. And now we're gonna do return my simple storage. And again, if you see these autocompletes that come up, you can just hit tab, but dot re. Retrieve. So perfect. Now let's go ahead and compile. We'll go ahead and delete the old deploy. We'll make sure we're on storage factory .soul. We'll hit deploy and we see storage factory down here. Now let's go ahead, run through that exact same exercise. So we'll pull up the terminal just to see our transactions go through. We'll hit create simple storage. Let's see that it's actually there at the zeroth index. Okay, cool. We see an address there. So now let's store a new variable at index zero. So at this address, so we'll say at index zero, we'll store the number one, two, three. And actually before I hit this button, if we go down here, we hit zero, we get nothing back, right? But now if I hit SF store with index zero, favorite number one, two, three, looks like the transaction did go through. Now, if I hit SF get, we go ahead and get one, two, three. So our storage factory contract was able to create its own simple storage contract, store a variable in that contract from the storage factory, and we were able to read back the number one, two, three, all from within our storage factory contract. Feel free to pause right now and play around with adding different values, creating different simple storage contracts so that you really understand what's going on. You can also feel free to hit the little drop downs and read more information about these transactions. Just as a recap, in our storage factory contract, we have a function called create simple storage contract, which creates new simple storage contracts from the storage factory contract. The reason it's able to do this is because we're importing from our simple storage.sol file using something called named imports. We're only importing simple storage. We're not importing anything in these other contracts. Then we use SF store to store a new number on one of those simple storage contracts using the index in our array. It can do this because we have the address and the ABI. The list of simple storage contracts automatically come packed with the address and the ABI. And then finally, we can read back those simple storage values that we stored. Now we can make this SF get function even more condensed. Since this list of simple storage contracts, simple storage index returns an object of type simple storage, we can actually delete this whole line, copy this, paste it here and delete this line. And this will work exactly the same as what we had before. Go ahead and save or compile. You'll go ahead and get that green check mark there. This dot retrieve is saying we're going to call the retrieve function on whatever this is. And this, whatever this is, is of type simple storage contract. We can actually do the same thing up here by deleting this part, copying this line, except for the semicolon, and pasting it over the my simple storage and hitting save or compile. Awesome. Great job so far.
Awesome. Now, let's say you really like this simple storage contract. You love all of the functionality except for one thing. You wish that the store function didn't just store the favorite number, you wished it added five. So for some reason, you want a contract that does everything this contract does, but just adds five whenever you call store. For some reason, you want everyone's favorite number to be five larger than what they think it is. Well, one thing we could do is we could just copy paste this into a new file. But again, that's kind of too much work for me. I'm a lazy engineer. <laughs> but let's go ahead and see how we can approach this problem. So let's create a new file and we'll call it add five storage .sol. And same thing, since this is a new contract, we're gonna follow the exact same tips. We're gonna do SPDX, license identifier, MIT. We're gonna do pragma solidity, 0 0.8.18. Let's even do the little caret here. And we'll do contract, add five storage, like so. Will it compile? Great, looking good. Oh, I'm getting a warning. SPDX license, spelled license wrong, so let's spell that right. Okay, cool, looks good. So like I said, the first thing that we could do is we could copy paste everything in here and then just change the pieces that we don't like in our add five storage. This is a little bit redundant, a little bit too much work, and we are engineers. We want to work as hard as possible to be as lazy as possible. So how can we do that? Well, this is where we can do something called inheritance. We can have our add five storage contract be something called a child contract of our simple storage contract. And we can have our add five storage inherit all of the functionality all of the functionality of our simple storage contract. So first, of course, in order for our add five storage to know about our simple storage contract, we're gonna go ahead and have to import it. So we're gonna do import, and we're gonna do, once again, the named imports because we're advanced Solidity engineers. So we're gonna say import simple storage, just the simple storage contract from dot slash simple storage dot sol. Now, if this dot slash is confusing to you, don't worry, we'll learn about directory structures later on in the course. And then we'll say our contract add five storage is simple storage. Now our add five storage is gonna do what's called inherit everything from simple storage. And our add five storage is gonna have all the same functionality as simple storage. We can actually see this directly. If we go to compile, let's go ahead and delete our previously deployed contracts. We're on the remix VM. Let's make sure we're We've selected add five storage, add five storage .sol. Let's go ahead and deploy it. And if we scroll down, we can actually see, oh my goodness, it's got all the same buttons as simple storage, even though the contract itself doesn't have anything to find. That's because we inherited all of the buttons. We inherited all of the functionality of simple storage into add five storage. If you want a contract to inherit the functionality of another contract, you just import it in and then say your contract is that other contract. Now we can keep going though and add our own custom functionality into add five storage that's not in simple storage. So for example, we could say function, say hello, it's gonna be a public and it returns a string memory. And again, you need the memory keyword because strings are special in Solidity. And we could just say return, hello, like so. This will be a public pure. It's not a view because we're not reading from storage. And again, if that assertion is a little confusing to you, don't worry too much about it now. But if we go to deploy it, let's delete our old one. We'll deploy this one. We see we have all the functionality of simple storage plus this say hello function. Great, but let's delete that for now. Let's say instead of wanting to add additional customization, you actually love every function in here except for one. Remember, the reason we wanted this add five storage .sol is because we actually wanna change the store function to have it add an additional five to people's favorite numbers. Maybe you're mischievous and you want people's favorite numbers to be five greater than they are. Well, to add this add five customization to that store function, we can do something called overrides. To do overrides, there are two keywords that we need to be aware of. Those are virtual and override. If I were to try to create a store function for our add five storage right now, what do you think will happen? Well, let's try it out. So let's say function store uint 256 underscore new number public. If we try to compile this right now, we'll actually get an error, even if there's nothing in this store function. We roll over, we say, from Solidity, type error. Overriding function is missing override specifier. And remember, if you get lost or confused, an error like this is something perfect for you to ask ChatGPT or maybe even find. We could say, I am trying to compile my Solidity code, but I'm getting this error. So we can copy this whole error here, paste it in here, and then in additional context, we'll just add the code like this. We'll hit search, see what it gives us. We'll say, and it looks like find was able to find the answer. 
The error message indicates the function store in the add five storage contract is missing the override specifier, which is required because it overrides a virtual function from the simple storage contract. Thanks. I'll explain what find is giving us in just a minute. It's right. We need to tell Solidity that it needs to override the store function in simple storage. We want to be very explicit and say, hey, do this store function and not what's in simple storage. So let's go ahead and add the keyword override. Now, though, if we just add that keyword, we go ahead and try to compile, we still get an error trying to override a non virtual function. Did you forget to add virtual in order for a function to be override a bowl? You need to add this virtual keyword in the base class or the parent class. So in simple storage, we need to add virtual to store. This virtual keyword means that this function is overridable. Any function that doesn't have this keyword, you can't override. Now our store function is override a bowl. And we've specified that we are indeed going to override the store function. Now, if we go ahead and compile, we'll see everything compiles successfully. All right, great. So now let's just add the functionality to store. Remember, since add five storage inherits everything from simple storage, this means that we even have access to my favorite number. So what we can do is we can say my favorite number equals underscore new number plus five. We'll compile this and now let's try it out. We're on Remix VM. We want to make sure we're with add five storage. We'll delete the other ones. We'll deploy, scroll down, hit the drop down. Retrieve currently returns zero. Now, if we store two, we'll pull up the terminal to make sure we're actually sending transactions. We'll hit store. And now, if we hit retrieve, we see we indeed get seven back because two plus five is seven. We add five, we hit store, retrieve now returns 10. So, this is how we do inheritance and override functions. And that's it for this section. You've learned a ton of incredibly powerful features in Solidity. So let's do a quick recap of what we learned in this section. We learned that with the new keyword, we can actually deploy contracts from other contracts. We learned that we can actually import other contracts, which is essentially the same as copy pasting the code into this file. We also learned this thing called named imports, which is going to make you look even better than most of the Solidity devs out there. We learned that we can interact with other contracts so long as we have the address and the ABI. The simple storage type automatically comes with the address and the ABI, so we can just access it like this. We didn't learn too much about the ABI, but we'll learn more about it later. We learned that if we want to make a child contract and inherit the functionality of some other contract, we can just import that contract and then use the is keyword in the contract declaration. To override a function, we need the override keyword and we need the base class or the parent class to have the virtual keyword on the function you want to override. And that is the end of this lesson. So be sure to give yourself a huge pat on the back. Take a break. Breaks are good for your brain. Go for a walk, grab a coffee, get some ice cream. Go tell your friends, go post on Twitter. You're getting more and more advanced with Solidity very quickly. So be sure to celebrate the little wins to keep being excited and keep that curiosity. Congratulations, you've completed this lesson. All right, everybody, welcome back. We are now headed into lesson four. This is going to be our Remix Fundme. And once again, you can find all the code associated with this lesson in the GitHub repository associated with this course and also web3dev.education. And let's do a quick walkthrough of these contracts before we actually start coding anything to see what we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be creating one contract, fundme.sol. We're also gonna have another file called priceconverter.sol. And we'll talk about that in a little bit. The Fundme contract is gonna be our main contract. This is going to be an example of a crowdsourcing application or a way to raise money. You can think of it as a Web3 decentralized Kickstarter. We'll allow users to send Ethereum, Polygon, Avalanche, etc., or really any native blockchain cryptocurrency into this contract and allow the owner of the contract to actually withdraw all the funds for them to go spend on their new project. And we are going to actually deploy this contract to a testnet. And remember, use the testnet transaction sparingly. But if we deploy this to a testnet, we scroll down, we actually see that we have a couple of buttons and a new color button. We'll actually get a new red button for our fund function. A red button indicates that a function is payable and we can send native Ethereum or Polygon or Avalanche or whatever the native cryptocurrency of the blockchain we're working with is. 
we additionally will indicate a minimum USD amount to send to the contract. So funders have to spend at least $5 worth of Ethereum in order to call this fund contract. So if we go up to the value section, we can actually send some value with this transaction. And again, don't worry about this making sense yet. But if I want to send 0.01 Ether, I'll grab that amount in way, paste it into the value section here. I'll scroll down, I'll hit the fund button. MetaMask will pop up. I'll confirm. We can see at the top, the current balance of the contract is zero. And we'll wait a little bit for the transaction to finish going through. And after the transaction finishes going through, we can see an Ether scan. We have a balance of 0.01 ETH. And we can also see that after remix, after a slight delay. Then we can allow the owner of the contract to withdraw those funds. Right now, the owner of the contract is also us. And after this transaction goes through, we'll see that balance removed from the contract and it'll go back into our wallet. And as you just saw there, if we held our MetaMask up for long enough, eventually it would pop back into our MetaMask. Are you excited? Well, you should be. Because after you complete this section, you'll actually know most of the fundamentals of working with Solidity. We're going to be going over a lot of advanced features in this section. And I'll let you know the specific parts that you don't need to fully understand quite yet. There's going to be a couple parts where if it doesn't totally make sense, just keep going with the course. And as we get later into the course, you'll figure out why they make sense. But it might be a good idea to write down the questions that you have to ask either an AI on the GitHub discussions or web3education.dev. Make sure, of course, to use the discussions tab in the Foundry full course F23 to ask questions and interact with other developers who are taking the same course. Or go to web3dev.education to learn more. All right, let's get froggy. So the first thing that we want to do is let's once again delete everything in our remix so we can start from scratch. So I have the contracts that we're actually going to be building in here. You might have the simple storage, the add five extra, the storage factory, et cetera. Let's go ahead, right click and just delete everything. We're going to start completely from blank here. So let's go ahead and delete everything in here. All right, great. So let's go ahead and start creating our contract. We're going to call it fundme.soul. One thing that's really good when you actually start building any code at all is to first write down what you want it to do. So what do we want ours to do? We want to get funds from users into this contract withdraw funds to the owner of the contract or whoever has created this fund me contract. And then we also want to set a minimum funding value in USD. We don't want people to be able to donate just a penny. So let's go ahead and set this up. SPDX license identifier, identifier, MIT, do pragma solidity, carrot 0.8.18 contract fund me. Let's go ahead and delete these comments. So before we embark on writing all of our functionality out, let's just write down the functions that we want to build. So we're probably going to want a function fund, which is going to be the function they call to send money to our contract. We're going to want a function withdraw, which is going to be the function that the owner of the contract is going to use to withdraw the money that the funders send us. And those are going to be the two main functions that our contract is going to need. We're going to be implementing more functions than just this, but these are going to be the main functions to interact with our protocol or interact with our fund me contract. Let's comment out withdraw for now and just start focusing on fund. We want anyone to be able to call this fund function. So we're going to make this public. And we want this function to do what? Well, we want it to allow users to send money and we want to have a minimum dollar amount that they have to send. So the first question we need to answer is how do we send ETH to this contract? How do we have it when a user calls the fund function, ETH automatically gets sent into our contract? Whenever we send a transaction on the blockchain, there's actually always a value field that gets populated. And most of the time it gets sent with zero. Even before when we call the send function between our accounts, when we added an amount in our MetaMask, this amount value populated the value field of our transaction. This value field is the amount of native blockchain cryptocurrency that gets sent with every transaction. The first thing that we need to do to allow a function in Solidity to accept this native blockchain currency in the first place is to make the function payable. It's this payable keyword that makes the function look red in the Remix UI. Just like how wallets can hold funds, contracts can actually hold funds as well. So whenever you deploy a contract similar to a wallet address, it actually acts almost the same as a wallet address. You can send money to it, you can interact with it, etc. And like we did in the demo, you'll see this contract actually gain a balance, just like a wallet. You can access this value amount of a transaction using one of the globals in Solidity called message.value. Solidity has a number of these globally available keywords and functions, and you can find these in the Solidity documentation. One of them is message.value, which is the number of way sent with the message. If we wanted users to be required to spend at least one whole ether with this fund function, we could use something called require to do so. In order to do that, 
we would add this line require message.value is greater than 1e18. And there's a couple of things to unpack here. 1e18 is equal to 1 ether, which is equal to 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Or put another way, it's equal to 1 times 10 raised to the 18th. In Solidity, a double asterisk or double multiply sign is how you do a power or an exponent. This value here is the value in way of 1 Ethereum. In your smart contracts and at the lowest level, this is how they process numbers in this giant way format. So if we wanted people to be forced to send at least one whole ETH with this fun function, we would just say require message.value is greater than 1E18. You can use something like ethconverter.com to see to convert one Ether between Ether, Way, and Gwei is actually another value in between Ether and Way. And we saw Gwei actually when we saw gas costs. Normally gas costs are shown in forms of Gwei. This required keyword is a checker. It's basically saying, hey, is message.value greater than 1E18? If not, then revert this transaction. And if we want, we could add a little revert message. We could say like, didn't send enough ETH. We can actually deploy this. We can actually compile and deploy this on a Remix VM. Deploy, scroll down, and if we hit fund, and if we pull up our terminal, we hit fund, we actually see we get this little X here, meaning our transaction didn't go through. And if we hit the drop down, well, again, same thing, same thing. We know that this error is because we have this require statement in here and our transaction is reverting or not going through. So we know that with this transaction, we need to send at least one ETH or, or one E18 way worth of ETH in the value section of our transaction. So if we scroll up, we can actually just change the unit to ether, put one in here, scroll down. And now if we hit fund, Oh, it doesn't go through because we have strictly greater than. So excuse me, let's do let's do two. Now I'll scroll down, we'll hit fund. And we see we get a green check mark and we see the fund me balance actually has improved to two. If we update the value to two again, and we scroll down, we hit fund again, we see our transaction went through and we have four. If we try to do less, like let's change this to way and we'll do, you know, a thousand way. Scroll down, we hit fund, up, oh, it fails because 100 way is less than one E18 way right? Because one E18 way is this much way. So obviously, a 1000 or however much I put in is much less. So this require says if this first section is false, then go ahead and revert with whatever this second section is. Reverts can be a little bit confusing and a little bit tricky. So what is a revert? A revert undoes any actions that have been done previously, and sends the remaining gas associated with that transaction back. So what does that actually mean? Well, let's say, for example, in our fund me contract, we have a UN 256 public my value. And let's have my value initialized to one. Now in our fund function, let's say my value equals my value plus two. So every time this fund function successfully goes through, we add two to my value. However, if we get to a revert statement, even though we added two to my value previously, since our contract reverts, this would actually revert this action or reset it back to its initial state. So if this transaction reverts, my value would go back to one or whatever it was previously. If we compile FundMe, we delete our previous deploys. We're on the Remix VM. We'll deploy FundMe. We'll scroll down. We have my value, which defaults to one. If we call fund right now without any value, we pull up our terminal. We can see the transaction failed. My value is still one, even though this line technically executed. This line executed, but then this line hit and it reverted what was done here. So if we scroll back up though, we go to ether, we'll put one in for now, scroll back down. Now we'll hit fund. Oh, needs to be more than one, excuse me. We'll add two here, scroll back down. Now we'll hit fund. That transaction did go through, which means my value will now be equal to three. And again, if I set value to zero, we call fund it reverts, so my value is still three. So then the question might be, oh, well, did we spend gas to do this if my transaction didn't even go through? Well, unfortunately, the answer here is yes. If you send a failed transaction, you will spend gas because computers executed this line and then they executed this line and just failed. So users can actually specify how much gas they send with every function. Let's say there was a ton of computation after this require line, we would need to send a ton of gas to operate and run our fund function. However, once it gets to this require line and it reverts, however much gas that we sent to execute the rest of the computation would just get refunded to whoever initiated the transaction. Like I said, sometimes the refunds and some of that can be a little bit confusing. 
So again, for now, just know that if a transaction reverts, it undoes anything it does previously, and you can consider the transaction failed. However, if you send a reverted transaction, you will still spend gas. But okay, let's delete this value for now, delete it from the global scope, and delete some of these like that. In fact, every single transaction that we send will have these fields. It'll have a nonce or the transaction count, the account, the gas price, the gas limit that we've seen on Etherscan, a two, aka the address that the transaction is sent to, a value, which is going to be this amount that we're talking about. We'll also have data, which is going to be what we send if we make a function call or deploy a contract. And then we'll have this VRS components. We're not really going to go over these VR and S because this is that cryptographic magic that's happening when a transaction is signed, but just know that that's in there. For sending value, we can populate some of these fields. The gas limit, for example, is populated to 21,000. Data is going to be empty. And then that two is going to be the address of the transaction we want to send to. For a function call, we can also still populate the way that we want to send. So we can call a function and send a value at the same time. In Remix, it has a little drop down here for Way, Gway, Finny, and Ether. We're going to ignore Finny for now, but of course, we have our Way, Gway, and Ether again, where one Ether is worth this much Gway and this much Way. So right now our contract is pretty minimal, right? We're requiring the message.value is greater than one whole ether, but we want to actually require that it's less than some value. Like, let's say we want to have users spend a minimum of $5 as opposed to one whole Ethereum. So let's first specify that $5. We can do that at the top of our contract. We'll say uint256 minimum USD equals five. And we'll make this public instead of internal. We'll update this minimum USD in the future to make this more gas efficient. So what we want to do is we want to require that our fun function requires that the message dot value is greater than, let's say greater than or equal to minimum USD. However, minimum USD is in terms of USD or dollars and message dot value is in terms of ETH or way in terms of Ethereum. So how do we convert the amount of Ethereum to its price in dollar? This is where oracles and Chainlink comes into play. The dollar price of an asset like Ethereum is something that we've assigned to Ethereum outside of the blockchain in the real world. So in order to get this abstract concept of the price of the native cryptocurrency of the blockchain we're working with, so we need to use a decentralized Oracle network or something called an Oracle to get this price. So before we keep going, let's learn a little bit more about decentralized Oracles, Chainlink, and how they work so that we can understand how to get the price of Ethereum into our smart contracts. As we've talked about, blockchains are deterministic systems which means that they themselves can't actually interact with real world data and events. They don't know what the value of an Ethereum is. They don't know what random numbers are. They don't know if it's sunny outside. They don't know the temperature. They don't know who's president. They don't know any of this information. These blockchains also can't do any external computation. Maybe you have some amazing artificial intelligence model that you want to integrate with a smart contract. Smart contracts by themselves can't do anything with that. As we've mentioned, this is because blockchains are deterministic by design. This is so that all the nodes can reach consensus. If you start adding variable data or random data or values that return from an API call, different nodes could get different results and they would never be able to reach a consensus. This is known as the smart contract connectivity problem or the Oracle problem. And this is bad news because we want our smart contracts to be able to replace traditional agreements. And traditional agreements need data and they need to interact with the real world. So this is where Chainlink and blockchain oracles come into place. A blockchain oracle is going to be any device that interacts with the off-chain world to provide external data or computation to smart contracts. However, the whole story doesn't even end there. If we use a centralized oracle, we are reintroducing a point of failure. We've done all this work to make our logic layer decentralized but if we get our data through a centralized node or through a centralized API, or we decide we want to make the API call ourselves, we are reintroducing these trust assumptions that we've worked so hard to get rid of. We're essentially ruining the entire purpose of building a smart contract. So we don't want to get our data or do external computation through centralized nodes. Those are bad news. Chainlink is the solution here. Chainlink is a decentralized Oracle network for bringing data and external computation into our smart contracts. As we mentioned before, this gives rise to these hybrid smart contracts, which combine on-chain and off-chain to make incredibly feature-rich, powerful applications. 
Chainlink is a modular decentralized Oracle network that can be customized to deliver any data or do any external computation that you like. So for example, a lot of people say, oh, I can just make an HTTPS call to some API and we'll be good to go. The blockchain nodes can't make these HTTPS calls because they wouldn't be able to reach consensus. If they called the node at different times or they did something else, all the consensus would be broken. So instead, we need a decentralized network of Chainlink Oracles to do this. And then in the transaction, this network of nodes will return the data to our smart contracts for us. Now, Chainlink networks can be completely customized to bring any data or any external computation at, that you want. However, doing the customization can be a little bit extra work. There are a ton of Chainlink features that come out of the box, completely decentralized, ready to plug and play into your smart contract applications. What are those features? The first one is gonna be Chainlink data feeds, and that's the one we're actually gonna be using for our application here. Chainlink data feeds, currently at the time of recording, are powering over $50 billion in the DeFi world. The way they work is a network of Chainlink nodes gets data from different exchanges and data providers and brings that data through a network of decentralized Chainlink nodes. The Chainlink nodes use a median to figure out what the actual price of the asset is and then deliver that in a single transaction to what's called a reference contract, a price feed contract, or a data contract on chain that other smart contracts can use. And then those smart contracts use that, that pricing information to power their DeFi application. We can see an example, we can see an example at data.chain.link. And you can change networks, you can change price feeds, you can change a whole bunch of different information to see some of the most popular price feeds. Let's look at ETHUSD, for example. On ETHUSD, we can see this whole network of independent Chainlink node operators that are each getting different answers for the price of ETHUSD. They're getting aggregated by the network and then delivered on chain. We can see how often they're updated. These ones are updated for a 0.5 deviation threshold or a few hour heartbeat whichever one hits first. We can see when the last update was, we can see the number of Oracle responses, et cetera. We can see the contract address directly on chain. We can even look at the contract on Etherscan. We can see some of the history. We can see all the responses of the different Oracles. And then at the bottom, we can see the different users and sponsors keeping this network up. Similar to transaction gas, whenever a node operator delivers data to a smart contract, the Chainlink node operators are paid a little bit of Oracle gas in the Chainlink token. Right now, these users of the protocol are sponsoring keeping these feeds up and are paying the Oracle gas associated with delivering this data on chain. Here's an illustration of what the current model of these data feeds look like. A network of these Chainlink nodes each reaches out and gets the information about an asset and then signs the data with their own private key. In a single transaction then, one node will deliver all the data with all the different signatures to a reference contract. If that node doesn't deliver the data, another node will send it instead. Reputation is incredibly important when you're a Chainlink node operator. If you miss data updates, if you forget to send transactions, you'll probably be quickly kicked off these networks and have no chance of making any more money in the future. These data feeds are used by some of the largest protocols in the space, such as Synthetix, SushiSwap, Compound, and Aave with several billion dollars each. We can take a look at an example over at docs.chain.link. Now the docs are probably gonna look very different by the time you actually start looking at them because they change the docs pretty frequently. So an easy way to get started here is maybe go to docs.chain.link and then over either on developer hub or overview, go to data feeds. And this is where you can see most of what you need in the getting started section of the documentation. And we can see an example of an entire contract that uses and reads from one of these Chainlink price feeds. We can even open this up in Remix and work with it in Remix. It looks like this example is reading from a price feed on Coven. The reason we're actually going to use a testnet to see this work is that there's a set of Chainlink nodes monitoring the test network to, to show you exactly how this works out. Once we get deeper into the course, we'll show you how to actually run tests and work with Chainlink nodes without actually being on a test net, which will make your development much faster. But I highly recommend walking through this section along with me so that you can see firsthand how this actually works. So let's go ahead to faucets.chain.link slash coven. We're gonna switch 
to the Coven network. And we're going to get some Coven ETH. But remember, look at the network flag and use whatever network is in the documentation. So to get some Coven, we're going to come to the faucet. We're going to turn off test link. We'll just stay with ETH. I'm not a robot. And then send request. Once our Coven Ethereum has reached our wallet, we can go ahead and close. And we can take a look in our wallet and see that we do indeed have 0.1 ETH on Coven. Now let's go back to our remix. We'll compile this contract. We'll go and deploy this on Injected Web3. And again, the reason we're going to use Injected Web3 instead of JavaScript VM is that there's no network of Chainlink nodes watching our little fake JavaScript VM. There are a network of Chainlink nodes watching the test net. So we'll scroll down. We'll switch contract to the price consumer v3 and we'll hit deploy. MetaMask will pop up. And after a brief delay, we can see our price feed consumer down here and we can hit get the latest price, which shows us the latest price of Ethereum in terms of USD. You may be wondering why the number looks so weird. That seems like a really large number for the price of Ethereum in terms of USD. And this is because decimals don't actually work so well in Solidity. And we'll get to that in a little bit. There's a decimals flag associated with this price feed address that tells us how many decimals to include with this price. It's also in the documentation. However, I know that this one has eight decimals. So this is saying the value of Ethereum right now is $3,262. It may of course be different when you go ahead and try this. Now, there's a number of things that happen in this contract that I'll explain in our fund me example. But if you want to take a look now and see if you can figure out what's going on, I recommend you do so. Price feeds are one of the most powerful out of the box decentralized features you can use in your smart contract to level them up, especially for decentralized finance. If you're looking for different addresses of different price feeds, you can check the contract addresses section of the documentation, choose the network that you want, and then scroll down and then look some of the different addresses of the different price feeds. For example, this address will give you the price of one inch token in terms of Ethereum. This address will give you the price of the Apple stock in terms of USD and so on and so forth. The next decentralized application right out of the box is going to be Chainlink VRF or Chainlink Verifiable Randomness Function. Once we do our lottery example a little bit later, we'll talk about how randomness can be manipulated in blockchain. Blockchains are deterministic systems which by definition means that they can't have randomness. If you can determine what a random number is, it's not really random anymore, is it? So we need a way to get a provably random number by looking outside of the blockchain. And oracles are perfectly positioned to do exactly that. Chainlink verifiable randomness function is a way to get provably a random number into our smart contract to guarantee fairness and guarantee randomness of applications. Many protocols like Pool Together, Axie Infinity, Ether Cards, Avagochis, and more Use Chainlink VRF for lotteries, for randomizing NFTs, for gaming, and for more. We're going to do an example of Chainlink VRF in a later section once we get to the lottery section. If you want to see if you can play with the randomness yourself right now, I recommend you going to docs.chain.link, EVM chains, and scroll down to get a random number. And this will teach you how to get a provably random number into your applications. The next decentralized out-of-the-box feature of Chainlink is Chainlink Keepers, which is decentralized event-driven execution. As you've seen, in order to kick off some type of transaction, somebody needs to spend the gas and somebody needs to sit down and hit the go button or hit the transact button or hit the send button. This is obviously a centralized vector if you have a decentralized application that needs to run at specific times or after specific events are triggered. Chainlink keepers are the solution to this. Chainlink keepers are Chainlink nodes that listen to a registration contract for different events that you specify to fire. Maybe you say every 10 minutes you want to do something or once a week do something, or if the price of some asset hits some number, or maybe a liquidity pool is at a certain level, whatever event that you want to code, you absolutely can. The Chainlink nodes constantly listen for these triggers to happen and check the different contracts for these triggers. Once a trigger returns true, the Chainlink nodes will then perform whatever action that you tell the Chainlink nodes to do. We're also not going to go over the Chainlink Keepers examples right now, because we're going to get to them in a later module. However, if you want to try them out, go to docs.chain.link/ethereum 
going and go to Making Compatible Contracts and feel free to read the documentation and try it out yourself. The last out of the box feature of Chainlink is the most customizable, but also the hardest to get correct. End-to-end -end reliability is the ultimate promise of our smart contracts, and we want and need them to be able to do anything. We want to be able to take any input and get any output. Chainlink Functions is the last decentralized out-of-the-box tool, and it allows you to make any API call in a decentralized context through a network of Chainlink nodes. We're not gonna be going over that at all in this video, but be sure to check out the documentation if that's something that you're interested in. To me, Chainlink Functions is gonna be the future of DeFi and smart contracts. And if you're looking to make something novel and if you're looking to make something that's never been done before, I 100% recommend you check out Chainlink Functions later on after this course or whatever you wanna do. As a filming, it came out about a month or two ago and people are just beginning to build amazing things with Chainlink Functions. So be sure to check this out after or during the course. We're gonna be using the Chainlink automation in a later section in this course. Again, if you wanna try these out in Remix on a real testnet, you can go to the documentation and play with them here. Now, I know we haven't actually written that much code, but we've gone over a ton, so I wanna do a quick review. In order for a function to receive native blockchain token like Ethereum, you need to mark that function as payable. If you want to force a transaction to do something and you want it to fail if that wasn't done, you can use a require statement. A transaction that reverts means it undoes any work that it did previously and returns any gas to the user. To get the value sent with a transaction, you can use the solidity global message.value. Chainlink is a technology for getting external data and computation into our smart contracts. And most importantly, getting that data in a decentralized context. In this example, we're gonna be using a Chainlink data feed or a Chainlink price feed, which is a decentralized way to get pricing information from real world assets into our smart contracts. Now, in order for us to figure out if the amount of Ethereum sent with a transaction is greater than or equal to our minimum USD of $5, we need to convert the amount of Ethereum into its value of dollars. So how are we gonna do that? Well, the first thing that we're gonna to need to do is we're gonna to need to get the price of Ethereum or Avalanche or Polygon or whatever native blockchain token that we're working with. So let's create a function to do that. We'll create a function, get price, and this function is just gonna get the price of Ethereum in terms of USD. And then we're also gonna create a function called get conversion rate, rate, which is going to convert a value to its converted value based off of the price. For now, we're gonna make them both public functions so we can play with them, test them, and do whatever we want with them. To get the price of Ethereum, we're gonna use a Chainlink data feed, and we can go to the documentation to get that information. And just know in the data feeds documentation, the feeds addresses has now its own section, price feed addresses. You can scroll down in here, go to Ethereum, and then just look for Ethereum Sepolio for Sepolio. So in the documentation, I'm gonna scroll down using data feeds. We've got an example here, right in Solidity. And if you wanted to, like I said, you could easily open this up in Remix. Now you can see this example in the documentation, what's actually going on when I'm working with a Chainlink price feed. There's a contract out there at an address, and we're gonna call this latest round data function on that contract. It gives us a whole bunch of data, but we really only care about the price. So we're gonna to wanna to do the same thing. We wanna reach out to that contract that's currently storing and having the price updated. So since we wanna reach out to and work with a contract, we're gonna need two things, right? What are those two things? And we need the address and we need the ABI. The address of the contract is gonna be really easy. We can get the address by going to the Chainlink documentation and let's go to this price feed addresses section. So now that we're at the docs, we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna go back to the feeds addresses, price feed addresses here, and we're gonna scroll down. And once again, we can see in Sepolia testnet, we can see the ETH USD address down here on the Sepolia testnet. So now that we have the address, how do we get the ABI? Well, before with simple storage, we imported the entire contract from the top and we compiled and we got the ABI like that. We could do that here, but that's kind of a lot of code and we don't actually care about what the whole contract looks like. We only really wanna know what the functions are so we can call that latest round data function. Remember, if we're on Remix and we go down to the compilation details, the ABI is really just this list of functions that we can call on a contract. The ABI itself doesn't actually need to include any of the logic. It just needs to say, hey, these are the functions you can interact with and here are their inputs, and here's whether or not they're payable, and here's whether or not they're view functions, et cetera. Like I said, though, this kind of is a white lie. You can also use a function selector or some other ways, but we're just gonna ignore that for now. How can we get the ABI? There's a concept in Solidity known as the interface. If we go to the Chainlink GitHub, and we go to smart contract kit slash Chainlink, we can see a lot of the different contracts in the Chainlink repository. We can go to contracts. Now, depending on when you watch this, this location might be a little bit different, be sure to use the GitHub repo to get the most up-to-date edition. 
So we're going to go ahead and scroll down to SRC slash V08. We're now going to do shared. It was previously in this interfaces folder. We do shared interfaces and we're going to grab the aggregator V3 interface dot soul. If we scroll down, we can actually see a whole bunch of function declarations, but none of them are actually implemented. It's just function, the name of the function, some stuff, external view, blah, 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 but then just the semicolon and nothing inside of them. This is what's known as an interface. If you compile this, this will actually give us that ABI because it defines all the different functions that you can call on a contract. It just doesn't have any of the logic. Again, we don't really even need to know what the functions do. We just need to know how to interact with the contract. And if a contract is deployed, it'll have that logic in its deployment. So what we can do is we can copy this whole thing, scroll all the way to the bottom, hit the copy button, and paste it in our remix. Now hold on though, if you're following along, you don't have to copy paste it in here with me because I'm gonna teach you something in just a minute that makes this a little bit easier. This pasted code alert comes up. Since we're only working on test nets here, we're gonna be okay that we don't have to worry about pasted code alert. If you wanna take a second to read it, please do. But we're gonna paste this code in here, just like we did before with simple storage. For now, you don't have to follow along. I'm about to show you an easier way. Just follow along and watch. Now that we have this interface, aggregator v3 interface, we can use this interface to make API calls because now we have the address and we have the ABI. And we can even compile this and it'll compile fine. So we can say aggregator v3 interface at address this and the combination of these two give us whatever code is at this address with all the functions from the aggregator v3 interface. And just to test this out, we can do something simple like dot version since if we scroll up, it looks like there is indeed a version function. We put a little semicolon at the end. So let's actually go ahead and actually copy this line, give it its own function called get version. This will have this public view returns. What is the version up here return? A uint 256. We'll have a return a uint 256. Paste that line in here, aggregator v3 interface at its address dot version. We'll say return all of that. Now I'm going to go ahead and deploy this to the Sepolia testnet just to show you what this would actually look like. However, I'm going to recommend you don't do that for now. Just know that this will work. This way you won't have to wait forever for your transactions to go through on the testnet. So to do this, I'm going to go ahead, scroll up to the top, go to Injective MetaMask, change the contract from aggregator v3 interface to fund me. I'm going to go ahead and hit deploy. My MetaMask is going to pop up. I'm going to go ahead and hit confirm and we're going to scroll down. And now we have a big blue button called get version which I'm gonna go ahead and click. And we can see we get a four return because at this contract address on the blockchain, it has the functionality for get version returning four. And for the rest of this lesson, I'm gonna be showing you guys and testing this on an actual testnet. However, I recommend that you don't test all of these as I go along, just watch me do them. Because again, waiting for transactions on a testnet can be really annoying. Sometimes the testnet might be having issues because again, it's people running them out of the goodness of their heart. So. For this lesson, just follow along, write the code with me, and then maybe at the end, deploy everything. So this is a really easy way and a common way that people use to interact with other contracts outside of their projects. They get the interface of that contract using the interface keyword, they compile it, and the compiler actually gives us an ABI, and then you just wrap an address around with that interface keyword, and you can call any function at that address. And, and this is one of these things, as we work with more and more, it'll start to make more sense. In the beginning, it might be a little hard to grasp, but just bear with me for now. The more we do it, the better you'll get. Don't get discouraged. Take a deep breath and exhale, and let's keep coding. And if this is confusing to you, this is again where we can work with our AI friends or any of the forums that we're working with. Again, very soon, I'm about to show you how to ask really good questions and make really good prompts. But one we could ask here is, Hey, I'm confused. How does the Solidity function return the value for when I didn't define any logic in aggregator v3 interface? And I just posted that code from get version here because a common issue that I see new developers run into is they go, oh, wait, wait, how does this version return for? My aggregator v3 interface doesn't have any code in it. Why, why does putting an address in here make it work? Like what's going on? And let's see if our AI is able to help us here. So this is ChatGPT version 3.5. Again, I prefer version four, but this is the cheaper one. And it says in the code you provided, the get version function is calling the version function of an instance of the aggregator v3 interface contract. It appears that the contract address here is being used to create an instance of aggregator v3 interface. The aggregator v3 interface is an interface contract that defines a set of functions that must be implemented by another contract. It serves as a way to interact with the contract 
at the given address by providing a common interface. The version function being called in your code is likely defined in the actual contract that implements this. Uh, and this is pretty much correct, right? And so it gives us some more context here. This is exactly correct. This address has a version function and us surrounding it with this aggregate v3 interface, like typecasting it in these parentheses like this, is just telling our Solidity compiler, hey, there's a version function at this address, or there's a, a latest round data function, or all the functions, all the functions in this aggregator v3 interface are at this address. If this address doesn't have a version function, this would just break. And this is a good example of, again, where we can actually follow up with these AIs. They're typically very good at keeping context. So we could even ask, what would happen if that contract address didn't have that function? And we see if the implementation contract at the given address does not have a version function, or if it has a different function signature, calling version on the contract would result in a compilation error or a runtime error. So it wouldn't result in a compilation error, but the transaction would revert. So, so this is pretty helpful here. But again, we always want to double check this. So this is where we'd probably go back to the discussions forum and follow up there. So now that we actually have the interface, we can start calling these functions and calling these addresses. However, having a ton of these interfaces is really going to clog up our contracts and clog up our files and be really gross to work with. Is there a better way for us to do this? Well, when we worked with simple storage, yes, there was. We just went ahead and used imports, right? But that's when we had all the code in our locally in our directory. We don't have all the code locally. We didn't create the aggregator v3 interface. We didn't create the price feed contracts. So can we do something like sim import simple storage.sol, but with a contract outside of our project? Well, again, we could copy paste it to its own file and import aggregator v3 aggregator v3 interface.sol. And of course, we're going to use this named import syntax because we're awesome developers. We could copy paste it like this and do exactly what we did before. We could create a new file called aggregator v3 interface paste the code in there, or we could actually import directly from GitHub. If we go back to the documentation associated with using data feeds, we scroll down to using data feeds here, scroll down, we see at the top, they do this import like this, import at chain link slash contracts, SRC, blah, blah, blah. Now, if you look at the top of the documentation, this link here, this import aggregator v3 interface from chain link contracts, SRC, v0, shared interfaces, blah, 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 this might actually be different than what we show in the rest of the video. Just for you, be sure to use whatever the documentation says and whatever we have in the GitHub repo associated with this course. So in this video, we might actually use Chainlink Contracts SRC V08 interfaces, aggregator V3 interface, and we skip over the shared, but you should just use whatever the documentation says and whatever is in the GitHub repo associated with this course. As of now, we're going to use this line with this shared keyword. So just keep that in mind when we're going along with this. This import actually has the same setup as, as the path of what's in the GitHub repository. So instead of us copy pasting from GitHub, we can actually import directly from GitHub or NPM. We can copy this line back in our remix. We can paste it in like this. Remix is smart enough to know that this at Chainlink slash contracts is referring to the, what's known as an NPM package at Chainlink slash contracts. At Chainlink slash contracts is what's known as a package manager, and it keeps different versions of combinations of code for us to download. At Chainlink slash contracts is created directly from Chainlink repository. Remix downloads all this code from NPM, which is created from the GitHub, so it essentially downloads it from the GitHub. So us doing this import like this is the same as it's just copy pasting the entire interface at the top of our contract. And just remember, again, during some of this video, we're going to have the Chainlink contracts src v08 interfaces aggregator v3 interface while other times we're going to have the shared keyword in here like i said be sure to use whatever the documentation and the github repo associated with this course says to use and now we have this aggregator v3 interface that we want to work with we can go ahead and compile and bada bing bada boom so great so now that we have the interface here which will give a minimalistic abi for us to interact with the contract how do we actually get the pricing information well, again, if we go back to the docs, we can see right here, it gives us an example of the code we can use to get the latest price. But let's write it ourselves just so that we know what's going on. We'll say aggregator v3 interface, and we'll actually create a new variable called price feed equals aggregator v3 interface contract at this address, which again, only works for Sapolio. Now we can call this latest round data function on the price feed. So we'll say price feed dot late round data 
And if we look at the interface on GitHub, we can actually see latest round data doesn't just return one variable, it returns a whole bunch of different types of variables. And to return multiple types, we do some syntax that looks like this. And we'll say you int 80 round ID, and you can even flip back and forth between the documentation, make sure you have it right. Int price, which again, we know an int defaults to an int 256. You int 256, start it at. You int 256 timestamp, and then you int 80 answered in round. Ooh, there's a lot of code in here. Since this function returns so many variables, we have to set something up to capture them. But we don't care about any of this other stuff. We just care about price. So what we can do is actually just remove them and leave the commas in there. So we're going to remove started at, remove timestamp, remove answered in round, and I hit command S to compile. We're going to get these yellow squiggly lines, which are warnings, but we're going to fix them in a minute. Now we have in price equals price feed dot latest round data because we only care about getting the price from the return. The reason price is an int 256 is because some price feeds could be negative. Now that we have the price, this price variable is going to be representing the price of ETH in terms of USD. And it's going to return a number that looks like this because again, Solidity doesn't work with decimals. So we know that this price feed has eight decimals, but it'll get a return like this. Boom, like this. It'll return a value that looks like this. If we want to double check how many decimals there are in a price feed, it actually has a decimals function, which allows you to check that as well. Now, as we know, message.value is going to have 18 decimal places. How do we know that? Well, because we know that one ether is equal to this many way, and this many way has 18 zeros. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this massive number is equal to one Ethereum, right? 1 point, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So right now, message.value and price actually have different decimal places. Price has eight message.value is going to have 18. So to get them to match up, we have to do return price times 1e10, or to add those additional 10 decimal places. And yes, I know we have a red line, I'll fix this in a minute. Price, as we know, is a int 256. And message.value is going to be a uint 256. So the types are actually different. So we want to get the price in terms of uint 256 instead of int 256. To convert them, we can again do a thing called typecasting. There are a lot of different types that can be easily converted between each other. Not all types can be typecasted, but an int and a uint 256 can be. So to make our price a uint 256, we would just do uint 256 and wrap price like this. Or we could just wrap both of them like this. Now, of course, since we're not modifying any state, but we are reading storage, we can make this a view function, and then we'll say it returns a uint 256, like so. And now, if we compile, we get rid of all those errors and warnings. Now, math can be a little bit tricky in Solidity, but the more you do it, the better you'll get. And the reason math can be tricky is because there aren't any decimal places, so you need to only work with whole numbers. The more you work with it, the better you'll get, though. Awesome. So now we have a get price function, which is going to return the value of Ethereum in terms of USD as a uint 256. Now, all we have to do is convert our message.value in terms of dollars using this get price function. To do that, we're going to use our get conversion rate function. This get conversion rate function is going to take a uint 256 ETH amount as an input, and we're going to convert this ETH amount to its value in dollars. This will be a public view function that will return a uint 256. So first, we're going to get the price of Ethereum by doing uint 6 ETH price equals our get price function that we just defined. And then we're going to do uint 256 ETH amount in USD equals ETH price times ETH amount. And then we actually have to divide by 1E18. The reason we divide by 1E18 is because both of these have 18 decimal places. And if we multiply 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. If we multiply these by each other, where both of these are representing 1, we're actually going to get a number that's absolutely massive with 38 decimal places. So we need to divide by 1 in 18 to reduce it back down to what it should actually be. An important rule with working with math and solidity is you always want to multiply before you divide. The reason for this is since, again, only whole numbers work in solidity, if you were to do 1 divided by 2, you would end up getting zero. So you always want to multiply first. When we get to the foundry section of this course, testing all this math is going to be a lot easier. If you're really struggling with some of the math bits right now, I wouldn't let that slow you down because one of the things that AI is really good at is doing a lot of these math conversions. 
But in any case, this ETH amount in USD is the number that we're looking for. So we can say return ETH amount in USD. And awesome, now we have a get conversion rate function. Let's walk through this together just so that you can understand what's actually going on. Let's say we want to see how much one ETH is worth. Well, we're gonna get the ETH price, which let's say it's $2,000, but it's gonna be $2,000 with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 18 zeros. So ETH price might look something like this. So that means we're gonna do this 2,000 with 18 decimal places times one ETH, which is gonna be one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight, nine, ten. We're gonna multiply those together. And then since we're gonna get an additional 36 zeros, then we just divide by one E18. And that's how we would get $2,000 equals one ETH. It's gonna be 2,000, of course, with 18 decimal places. One of the good reasons for using whole numbers in Solidity is that it's not possible to have decimal places. So we don't lose any precision, which is really good. So normally we should test this function before continuing, but since we're doing all this on a test net, and I promise you that I tested this all beforehand, we're just gonna go ahead and keep going. So now that we've done all this work, if we wanna make sure that our users are sending at least $5, we can do get conversion rate of message.sender needs to be greater than minimum USD. Because get conversion rate takes an ETH amount as input uses the pricing information to get the dollar value back, and we're gonna check to see that the dollar value of the message dot value is greater than the minimum USD. However, since get conversion rate returns a value with 18 decimal places, we need to update our minimum USD to say five times 10 raised to the 18th. Or we could also do five E18, or we could do five times one E18. I personally like this five E18 syntax, but whatever works for you. I'm going to deploy this to a test net just to demonstrate this working, but again, you do not have to. So we're gonna go ahead, delete our previous deployments, inject to Web3, deploy, MetaMask pops up. I'm gonna go ahead and confirm. After a long delay, we'll get our deployed contract here. We have all this stuff. We can call get price, and we can see the value of Ethereum right now is this with 18 decimal places, which is awesome. So it's around $1,896. So if I were to try to fund this with maybe 100 way, I know for a fact that 100 way isn't gonna be enough. So if we call this fun function, we're actually going to get this gas estimation failed. Gas estimation error failed with the following message, blah, 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 error. Execution re reverted, didn't send enough ETH, which is actually exactly the error message that we have here. It's exactly what our error message is here in our require, didn't send enough ETH. So if we try to fund it, we're gonna get didn't send enough ETH. And this gas estimation failed is a pretty common error that you'll see in Remix and Solidity and EVM in general. It's kind of just the boilerplate answer for something went wrong. Luckily, we got the actual error message here so that we could debug here's what's actually going on. Now you see here, we could still send this transaction. Like I said, we would actually spend gas to send a failed transaction. And this isn't something that we want to do. So we're going to go ahead and cancel. However, if we did send maybe one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So if we go to Google, actually, we can even see like an ETH to dollar conversion rate. So if we send 0 0.01, 0 0.01 ETH right now is worth $18. It might be different depending on when you actually do it. So if we send 0 0.01 ETH in our remix, and we can do that by doing one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two, three, four, five, six. So that's one E16. And we hit fund now. We actually see MetaMask pops up. We don't get that gas estimation error. We can go ahead and confirm and we can see that our function is working as expected, which is great. It's reverting transactions that have less than $5 and it's letting transactions go through that have at least $5. Awesome. And if we select minimum USD, we can obviously see that here. And we can see we have 0.01 ETH here. Fantastic. And since we don't have a withdrawal function here, we actually can't pull it out, which is another reason why I say, hey, maybe don't test this right now. But great, we've confirmed our get conversion rate is working. So let's move on, fantastic. So what's the next thing that we should do in this contract? Well, we probably wanna keep track of the users who send us money in this contract. So we can keep an array of addresses called funders and keep updating that depending on who actually sends us money. So up at the top, we'll make an address array or an address list, we'll make it public and we'll call it funders. And anytime somebody sends us money, We'll say funders dot push message dot sender. Like message dot value, message dot sender is another global variable we can use in Solidity, which refers to 
over call this function, the sender of the transaction to this contract. So if we're on Sepolia and we initialize a transaction from our MetaMask, the message.sender is going to be this account right here. And then maybe we want to even make a mapping of addresses to, to make it easier to look up how much money each funder has sent. So we'll make a mapping of an address to a U256. We'll call it public address to amount funded. Now, something that's newer in Solidity is you can actually name the types in your mapping. So you could say address funder mapped to U256 amount funded. Usually this is what's known as a little syntactic sugar. It's just to make it easier to read what this mapping is, right? Funder to amount funded. And then our variable name is very explicit, address to amount funded. Now, if somebody funds our contract, we'll of course do address to amount funded, the message.senders address plus equals whatever they previously have funded plus message.value, whatever they're additionally adding. All right, great. And now we have a way for us to keep track of funders sending money to our contract and have an easy way with a mapping to look up how much they've spent in total. Now, I know we've gone over a lot of advanced solidity here, so let's do a quick refresher of what we've learned so far. Whenever we interact with a contract, we always need the address and the ABI. Compiling an interface allows us to get that ABI very easily for us to interact with another contract. When we combine the contract address with the interface, we can easily call the functions on that contract. Chainlink price feeds are an easy way to get data, especially pricing data, from the real world into our smart contracts. When working with math and Solidity, and the EVM in general, decimals don't work. So we need to always make sure we're using the correct number of units whenever we interact with our contracts. Message.value and message.sender are known as globally available units in Solidity. And they refer to the sender of a message of the current call or the number of ways sent with a message or transaction. There's a whole bunch of these and you can view them all in the Solidity documentation. All right, great. So we've got a way to actually get this pricing information pretty easily. However, our code is getting a little bit cluttered with these get price and get conversion rate. You'd think that these are functions that would be reused pretty often anyways for anybody looking to work with Chainlink price feeds. So is there an easier way for us to work with this pricing information? Maybe doing some math like this is pretty common and we'd want other contracts to be able to import this conversion functionality. And a way that we can do that is actually creating something called a library. There's a site out there called Solidity by Example, which has great examples of using libraries and what they work with. Libraries are similar to contracts, but you can't declare any state variables and you can't send ether. A library is embedded into the contract if all library functions are internal. Otherwise, the library must be deployed and then linked before the contract is deployed. That's a little bit confusing. Don't worry too much about that right now. Using libraries can actually add functionality to different values. And what do I mean by that? Well, I mean, we can have our get conversion rate function be a function of any value of type UN256. Means we could take this get conversion rate and do something like message.value dot get conversion rate. So we can create our own custom function with any type. So we could work with get conversion rate as if message.value was a class or an object or a contract that we actually created. To do this, let's go back to our files, create a new one, create a new one called price converter.soul. And this is going to be a library, a price converter library. So how do we create a library? And what is a library? Well, a library is going to be very similar to a contract. We're going to start, of course, with SPDX license identifier. We're going to do pragma solidity, and we'll give it a version of 0.8.18, the little carrot. And instead of typing contract, we're actually going to type library for the name of the library. And we're going to call this library price converter. So libraries can't have any state variables and all the functions have to be marked internal. So what we're going to do is we're going to go back to fundme.sol. Let's zoom out a little bit. We're going to grab get price, get conversion rate and get version, delete them. Well, I hit copy first, go back to price converter, paste them in here and work with them in here. Of course, we're going to need the aggregator V3 interface. So we're going to go back to our fund me. We're going to copy this named import from aggregator V3 interface, paste it in at the top here, hit command S, and we're going to go ahead and compile this successfully. Fund me is no longer going to compile, but we're going to fix that in a little bit. Now, the first thing that we're going to need to do in here is make these all internal. So we're going to say internal like this. We're going to do internal get conversion rate and internal get version. Now that we have our price converter library, we can actually import it back in our fundme and attach it to a UN256. And let's actually delete this aggregator v3 interface line for now. And we'll do import price converter from dot slash price converter dot soul. 
And now to attach the functions in our price converter library to all uint256s, we'll say using price converter for uint256. Of course, if we compile our fund me, we're going to get an issue because it doesn't really know what get conversion rate is. So for now, let's actually just comment out this line. I'm going to remove these comments up here as well. So what we can do now, though, is we can do message.value dot get conversion rate, get conversion rate. And in your library, whenever you're working with a library, the first input variable for a library is going to be the type that you're using with the library. So message.value is of type UN256. So this gets passed inside of get conversion rate as the first variable into UN256 ETH amount, even though we don't pass any variables inside of these parentheses here. For get price and get version, we don't really care to have an input parameter at all. So it'll pass it in, but not do anything. So now instead of require get conversion rate of message.value, we can actually do, let's uncomment this line now and let's delete this line. We can actually do message.value.get conversion rate, conversion rate. And now if we compile this, this is gonna compile successfully. This works because we're attaching the price converter library to all UN256s. So now all UN256s have access to this get conversion rate function and since message.value is a u 256 it can call dot get conversion rate and it'll pass itself so that message.value as the first input parameter to the function here. If we wanted another variable in here like u 256 something else, that would be the first parameter inside these parentheses. So maybe like one, two, three or something, right? This one, two, three would be the something else, but message.value would still be the initial parameter, which in this example would be ETH amount. Let's go ahead and undo that and undo that. But all right, great. We've moved a lot of the math into our own library. Congratulations. Nice work. One of the most common libraries that was used for a long time was this library called safemath.soul. And in your Solidity journeys, you'll probably see it pop up from time to time. Now, we're going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here about safemath and the library safemath. And this is an excerpt from my course last year. So you might see stuff like RinkB and some other stuff but just focus on the safe math stuff. Just know when we refer to the JavaScript virtual machine, that's talking about the Remix virtual machine. One of the most common libraries that was used for the longest time was this library called safemath.soul. And you'll probably see it a lot of different places. We're gonna go off on a quick little tangent here and teach you about safe math. So let's close FundMe and close Price Converter. Now let's create a new file called safemathtester.soul. And let's start with some basic stuff in here. Safe math was all over the place before version 0.8 of Solidity, and now it's almost in no contracts. What happened? Why is safe math no longer used as much? Well, let's create a sample contract. This is a section that you don't have to follow along if you don't want to code along with me, but if you want to, you absolutely still can. This is going to be a contract we are going to deploy on a JavaScript virtual machine. Uh, we can use any version of Solidity before version 0.8 of Solidity. So for example, we'll use pragma caret 0.6.0 and we'll create contract safe math tester dot soul. Now, if I create a uint eight, I set it to public big number and I set this to 255. Oops, safe math tester. Let's go ahead and compile safe math tester with 0.6.7 pragma solidity. The maximum size of a uint 8 is going to be 255. This is going to be the biggest number that we can fit in a uint 8. And if I were to deploy this to a JavaScript VM or even a test network, safe math tester, let's go ahead and deploy it. If I hit big number, we're going to get 255. But what happens if I create a function called add that sets big number equal to big number plus one. Let's save that, delete that old contract, and deploy. Well, right now, big number is 255. What happens when we add one to big number when 255 is the max size a uint 8 can be? Well, let's hit add. And now let's check what big number is. Big number gets reset to zero. So what's going on? Well, prior to version 0 0.8 of Solidity, unsigned integers and integers ran on this concept of being unchecked, which means that if you passed the upper limit 
of a number, it would just wrap around and start back from the lowest number it could be. So if I call add a whole bunch more times and hit big number, now it's eight. If I were to hit this add button a ton more times and get it back to 255, it would then continue to wrap over to zero. So one of the most popular libraries that was out there was this safe math library, which would basically check to make sure that you weren't wrapping around a UN256 or an IN256. Basically, it was a way to say, hey, you've reached the max this number can be, and now your transaction is gonna fail. If we switch this to 0 0.8 of solidity, delete the old contract, we'll go switch this to 0 0.8, we'll go ahead and compile it. And now we deploy this to a JavaScript VM. If I hit big number, we get 255, but if we hit add, it actually fails and we still get 255. In version 0 0.8 of Solidity, they added this bit where it automatically checks to make sure if you're gonna do what's called overflow or underflow on a variable. We can actually revert back to the unchecked version by using an unchecked keyword. So if we wrap this big number equals big number plus one in this unchecked bracket, let's delete our old contract, we'll compile, we'll redeploy. We hit big numbers, 255, now we hit add, we hit big number again, it reverted back to zero. So that's a little bit more about safe math, checked and unchecked. So in version 0 0.76 and below, this code that you see in front of you is gonna be the exact same as this code in 0 0.8 and above with this unchecked keyword. Now you might be thinking, in newer versions of Solidity, why would I use this unchecked keyword? Well, you'll find out later that this unchecked keyword makes your code a little bit more gas efficient. So if you're absolutely positive that your math is never gonna reach the top or bottom limits of a number, then it might make sense for you to use the unchecked keyword. Let's head back over to our FundMe contract, where we are now using the price converter library that we just created. Awesome, we have a lot of the basics of the math that we need in our FundMe contract. So, all right, so this is great. People can actually send us money and we're gonna keep track of them as well, which is fantastic. So the next thing, obviously, that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to be able to withdraw that money out. So now let's go ahead and implement our withdraw function. When we withdraw the money, we're probably going to want to reset all the mappings back down to zero to show that, hey, we've withdrawn all the money and there's nobody left. To do this, we're going to use something called a for loop. A for loop is a way to loop through a list of something or to do something in a repeated amount of time. If you're familiar with other programming languages, it's the exact same concept. We wanted to get all the elements in this list, for example, which where one is at the zeroth index, two is at the first index, three is at the second index, and four is at the third index, which I know is a little bit confusing. These are the different, these are the indexes, and these are the elements. We would loop zero through three to get all the elements out of this array. To do this loop, we're gonna use the for keyword. We're gonna say for, put some parentheses, and in a for loop, we can add a, a couple of things. And by the way, this is a way to do comments inside of a line in Solidity. You do a backslash star, star backslash, and now everything in here is a comment. So in a for loop, you first need to give it the starting index, then you give it the ending index, and then you can give it the step amount. For example, let's say we want to start on the zeroth index. We want to go all the way up to the 10th index, and we want to go by up each time. We would do zero, one, two, three, four, et cetera. Well, let's say we want to start with the third index. We want to go to the 12th index and we want to up by two every single time. Well, we would do three, five, seven, nine, etc. So our starting index is going to be a uint 256 and we'll call it funder index. And we're going to say we're going to start with zero and we're going to end once the funder index is less than the funders dot length. So I know I set up here, it's the ending index, but instead it's a Boolean. Once the funders index is greater than funders.length, which is how you can get the length of an array, then we're going to end. And then finally, we're going to say every single time we do a loop, we're going to say funders index equals funders index plus one. Now there's a shortcut you can do to do some variable equals itself plus one, and that's just plus plus. This plus plus means every time we go through the loop, just add one. And we actually don't need that here. And then we put these curly braces to say, okay, execute everything inside of this loop here for the duration that we specified here. And this final piece means that every time we run through all the code inside of these brackets, we're gonna add one to this funders index. 
That's how we go from zero to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, et cetera. To access the zeroth element of our funders array, we're gonna say funders of funder index. And this is going to return an address since it's an array of addresses. So we'll say address funder equals funders of funder index. And we wanna use this to reset our mapping address to amount funded. So we can say address to amount funded at the funder address is now equal to zero. So we're gonna reset whatever we added when they funded us down to zero because we're withdrawing all the money out. And additionally, how there's a nice little shorthand like plus plus down here, up here in the fund, another nice little shortcut, whenever you wanna add something to, whenever you wanna add something to something that already exists, instead of doing something equals itself plus the new thing, you can just do plus equals. This means that we're gonna set address to amount funded of message.sender equal to itself plus message.value. So let's walk through this for loop a little bit. We're gonna start with the zeroth index. We're gonna get the funder at the zeroth index in our funder array. We're gonna take that address, stick it into our mapping, and reset the amount that they've sent us to zero. Then we're gonna do funder plus plus. We're gonna to check to see that funder plus funder index plus plus is less than funders.length. Obviously fund zero plus one is going to be one. So we're gonna check if one is less than the total amount of funders, and then we're gonna get the address of the funder at the first index, reset them to zero, get the address at the second index, reset them to zero, third index, et cetera, et cetera, until we finally reach the index that is equal to or greater than the length. So if we have 10 funders and we reach funder index 10, the for loop will exit and be done. But we still haven't done two things. We need to reset the array still, and then we also need to withdraw the funds since we've accumulated all this message.value in the fund function. To reset the funders array, we could do the same thing we did with the mapping and reset each single address at each index, or we could just create a brand new funders array, which is what we're gonna do. So to reset the array, we're now gonna say funders equals new address array, and to start off at a length of zero. Previously, we used the new keyword to deploy a different contract. Now we're using the new keyword to reset the funders array to a brand new blank address array. This part's a little confusing, don't let it hold you back. And later in the course, why we make the choices here that we do. So great, we've gone ahead and reset the array. So now how do we actually withdraw the funds? For this section, I'm gonna go ahead and again, refer to a previous course that it did because the content is exactly the same. Just remember JavaScript VM is Remix VM. So great, we've gone ahead and reset the array, but how do we actually now withdraw funds from this contract? How do we send the funds back to whomever is calling this? Now to actually send ether or send native blockchain currency, there are actually three different ways to do this. We're gonna look at all three and say what the differences between the three of them are. The three different ways are gonna be transfer, send, and call. Let's go ahead and start with transfer, since transfer is the simplest and at surface level makes the most sense to use. So if we wanna transfer the funds to whomever is calling this withdraw function, we would do, we would say message.sender.transfer, and then we'd get the balance of our contract here by saying address this, that this keyword refers to this whole contract dot balance. And we can get the native blockchain currency or the Ethereum currency balance of this address like this. And we can just do that. Only thing that we need to do is we need to cast, we need to typecast message.sender from an address type to a payable address type. So message.sender is of type address, whereas payable message.sender is of type payable address. And in Solidity, in order to send the native blockchain token like Ethereum, you can only work with payable addresses to do that. So we just wrap it in this payable typecaster. So this is the first way that we can actually send Ethereum or send tokens from different contracts to each other. We wrap the address that we want to send it in, in this payable keyword, 
We do dot transfer, and then we say exactly how much we want to transfer. But there are some issues with transfer. Here we are on Solidity by example for sending ether, which again is a fantastic resource to refer to if you get lost. The method that we just looked at was this transfer method. Now we saw way earlier in the course that if I sent Ethereum from one address to another, it cost about 2,100 gas or 2,100 gas. Our transfer function is capped at 2,300 gas and if more gas is used, it throws an error. The next one that we're using is gonna be send, which is also capped at 2300 gas. And if it fails, it'll return a Boolean. So with transfer, if this line fails, it'll error and revert the transaction. With send, it won't error. It'll return a Boolean of whether or not it was successful. So using send, we'll do payable message.sender.send address this dot balance. But we don't want to finish our call here. If this were to fail, the contract wouldn't revert the transaction and we just wouldn't get our money sent. So we want to do Boolean send success equals this whole bit here. And then we want to require send success. And if this send fails, we'll throw an error saying send failed. This way, if this fails, we will still revert by adding our require statement here. Transfer automatically reverts if the transfer fails. Send will only revert the transaction if we add this require statement here. So great. What's the third way that we can actually send Ethereum or native currency? Well, it's with this call command. Now call is gonna be one of the first lower level commands that we actually use in our Solidity code because this call function is actually incredibly powerful and we can use it to call virtually any function in all of Ethereum without even having to have the ABI. We'll learn the advanced ways to use this call much later. For now, we're just gonna learn how to use it to send Ethereum or your native blockchain currency. Call is gonna look very similar to send. We're gonna do payable message.sender.call and this is where we'll put any function information or any information about the function we wanna call on some other contract. We actually don't wanna call a function, so we're gonna leave this blank. We can show that we're leaving it blank by just putting in these two quotes here. We instead wanna use this like a transaction. And as we saw in our deployment, there's always this message.value bit. So we're gonna use this call function as if it's a regular transaction and we can add stuff like message.value. So in here, we're gonna add these squiggly brackets and we're gonna say value address this dot balance. This call function returns actually two variables. And when a function returns two variables, we can show that by placing them into parentheses on the left-hand side. The two variables it returns are gonna be a Boolean that we're gonna call call success and also a bytes object called data returned. Since call allows us to actually call different functions, if that function returns some data or returns a value, we're gonna save that in the data returned variable. It also returns call success where if the function was successfully called, this will be true. If not, this will be false. And since bytes objects are arrays, data returns needs to be in memory. Now, for our code here, we're actually not calling a function, so we don't really care about data returned. So similar to what we saw with the price contract, we can just go ahead and delete that and leave the comma to tell Solidity, yeah, we know this function returns two variables, but we only care about one. And then similar to the send piece above, we're gonna do require call success, call failed. Meaning that we're requiring call success is true. Otherwise we'll revert with an error that says call failed. Now, if learning the difference between these three is a little complicated for you right now, don't let that slow you down. Feel free to come back to this after you've learned more about how some of these lower level functions work and a little bit more about how gas works. Solidity by example does a fantastic job though of saying what the differences between all three are. 
Transfer has a maximum of 2300 gas and throws an error if it fails. Send has a maximum of 2300 gas, returns a boolean if it fails. Call forwards all gas, so it doesn't have a capped gas, and similar to send, returns a boolean if it is successful or if it fails. As of recording, right now, using call is the recommended way to actually send and receive Ethereum or your blockchain native token. For now, if this part's a little bit confusing for you, for now, just look at this and see, ah, that's how we send and transfer Ethereum or native blockchain currency tokens. And I'm gonna delete this part for the video, but I'll keep those comments in the code repository associated with this course. All right, great. And actually the exact same code from that video we're gonna use for this as well. So we're gonna use this call, call success to work with sending a balance. However, there's a bit of an issue here. Right now, anybody can call this withdraw function and take all the money out of this contract. We don't want that. We want anyone to be able to fund the contract, but we don't want anyone to be able to withdraw money from the contract. We only want the owner of the contract to be able to withdraw. So how do we set this contract up so that the withdraw function can only be called by the owner of this contract? Well, we want to set this contract up so that whenever we deploy it, whenever we create this contract, an owner gets assigned to this contract. We assign some address to being the owner, and then we add some parameters so that withdraw can only be called by that address. So what we could do is we could set up some function called call me right away. And when we deploy this contract, we would just immediately call this call me right away function, which will set us up as the owner. However, that would take two transactions. And remember, we're engineers. We want to work incredibly hard to be incredibly lazy. So instead, Solidity has something called a constructor. And if you're familiar with other programming languages, a constructor is the exact same as really every other programming language. And the constructor is a keyword and a special function in Solidity. So we can create a constructor function without the function keyword. We just call it structor. And we also don't even need the public keyword. You'll see Remix even highlights it pink. This is gonna be that function. It's gonna be a function that is immediately called whenever you deploy your contract. This function will be called in the exact same transaction that is used to deploy your contract. For example, if I were to take this minimum USD, add it in our constructor and say minimum USD equals two, this minimum USD would immediately get updated to two right after this contract is deployed in that exact same transaction. Since we want this withdraw function to only to be able to be called by the owner of this contract, in our constructor, we can set up an address right away to be the owner of this contract. So let's create a global variable called address public owner. And then right in our constructor, we'll say owner equals message.sender. Message.sender, of course, being the sender of the caller, which in this example is going to be the deployer of the contract. Don't worry, we're going to demo all of this very soon to show you everything that's going on. If you want to test all this right now, absolutely go for it. But just remember, it's going to take you a little bit longer on a test net, and I'm going to show you how it all works anyways. Now that we have our owner set up, we can actually modify our withdraw function so that only the owner can call this function. Easily enough, we're already familiar with the require keyword. We could add a require, the message.sender of whoever calls this withdraw function, must be equal to, and this is how you do equals in Solidity with this double equal sign. A single equal is set, a double equals means equals. So message.sender must equal the owner. And if it's not the owner, we could revert with something like must be owner. Awesome, so now we have a quick way to require that whoever calls the withdraw function is indeed the owner. Awesome. But let's say we have a lot of admin functions or only owner functions or functions that should only be called by the owner. Would we have to put this line on every single function? Remember, we want to work incredibly hard to be incredibly lazy. We don't want to have to copy paste this line to every one of these functions. And this is where something called modifiers come into play. So we're going to go ahead and actually delete this line. And at the bottom, we're going to create our first modifier. A modifier is going to allow us to create a keyword that we can put right in the function declaration to add some functionality very quickly and easily to any function. To create a modifier, you use the modifier keyword, and then you set it up very similarly to a function. So our modifier is gonna be called only owner. We don't give it a visibility like functions. And in here, we can put our code. So again, we'll say require the message.sender 
is equal to, not set to, is equal to the owner. And if it's not the owner, we're gonna say sender is not owner like this. And then underneath, we're gonna put this little underscore with a semicolon. What we can do is we can take this only owner keyword and stick it in the function declaration of our withdraw. And what's gonna happen now is it's going to execute what's in this modifier first. It's gonna execute this require. And then this little underscore says, and then add whatever else you wanna do in the function. So we're gonna execute this require, then whatever else is in the function. And for our withdraw function, it's gonna be everything else in here. In our modifier, if we had the underscore above the require, this means that we would execute the code inside the function first and then the require. So the order of your underscore matters. So now with this modifier keyword in the withdraw function, whenever you call the withdraw function, we first go up, oh, there's a modifier, I gotta drop down here, we'll execute this, oh, here's an underscore, time to go back to the function, let's do what else is in the rest of the code. And then it'll come back down to the only owner modifier and say, oh, is there anything else to do? Oh, there's nothing else, so I guess we're good. So let's see this all go through end to end. And remember, you don't actually have to deploy this to a testnet if you don't want to, but if you wanna follow along, feel free to do so, of course, as well. Get started, let's, of course, compile fundme.soul. Looks good. Let's delete any contracts deployed previously. Let's make sure we're on injected provider MetaMask. And let's make sure that we are on a testnet. We are indeed. Let's make sure we have a little bit of testnet ETH in our wallet, and we sure do. And let's go down to the contract and make sure we're on the right contract. If you try to deploy something like an interface, you'll get an alert like this. This contract might be abstract, blah, blah, blah. So we're not gonna do the interface. We're going to do the FundMe contract, of course. We'll hit deploy. MetaMask will pop up. We'll go ahead and hit confirm on the MetaMask. And then we're gonna to have to wait a little bit for the contract to actually finish deploying. If we pull up the terminal, we can see the contract go through and we can also see it in Remix here. Now we've got a number of buttons in here. We've got our red fund button, of course, which is because we have our fund function, which is payable. And this allows us to send ETH with this function. We have our withdraw function, which is just orange because it is not payable, although it is going to be withdrawing money out of the contract. And then we have our typical blue view and pure functions. The owner, of course, is gonna be our MetaMask, since we are the ones who deployed this contract. Minimum USD is going to be five. And these are, of course, going to be empty. We can call our fund function only if we send some value with it. If we try to call fund without any value, we're gonna get this gas estimation error failed. And we'll even see didn't send enough ETH in the error log. So let's go ahead and cancel this. Again, we could send this, but that would be a huge waste of gas. So we'll cancel it. And let's get a value that's gonna be enough. So I believe 0.01 ETH should be enough. Let's say 0.01 ETH, it looks like that's about $18. So back in Remix, let's do 0.01 ETH in terms of way, which is this value here. Paste that in. And we'll scroll down. Now if we call fund, it does indeed go through. And we can go ahead and hit confirm on this as well. And we see that transaction pop up on Etherscan. And we might have to wait a little bit for this transaction to finish. Finish going through, finish indexing, etc. So let's give it a couple minutes. Oh, it looks like it's gone through. Fantastic. We can even see in the FundMe contract, the balance has gone up to 0.01. And we can see if we look at funders at index zero, we can see our address. And if we copy our address and paste it into the mapping, address to amount funded, we do indeed see an amount in here. With this transaction fund being called, of course, on the testnet etherscan, we can see all the data and information associated with this. And we can even scroll down and see the input data. We can see that this was calling the fund function. We'll learn more about the input data later. So now what we could do is we could do the reverse. We could go ahead and withdraw, and that should reset the mapping and the array back down to zero. For our modifier to work, we have to use withdraw on this account. If we switch to an account that isn't the owner of this contract and we go ahead and reconnect and we scroll down, we make sure value is zero and we scroll down and try to hit withdraw, we'll see we get gas estimation failed and we'll even say sender is not the owner. So we'll go ahead and cancel that. 
we'll switch back to account one. We'll make sure we're working with account one. Now we'll call withdraw. We'll see MetaMask does indeed pop up and we can go ahead and confirm. And in just a minute, we'll see the balance reset. And if we call our funders and mapping, they should also have been reset. So let's wait a little bit. Now, if I try to call address to amount funded with that same address, we now get zero. And now if I look at funders at index zero, it actually errors and this isn't correct. Following our more advanced solidity concepts, if you don't understand them the first time, don't let them stop you. They are not required to know to continue. The following is an excerpt from a slightly older edition of this course. You'll see that I don't use named imports like a noob and a few other pieces of the code look slightly different. But this next section, we're gonna go over a lot of really advanced solidity pieces here that are gonna really advanced solidity fundamentals. These are gonna be fantastic for saving gas, making your code look a lot cleaner and just better coding practices overall. For those of you who are looking to go super far with this, definitely be sure to pay attention to this section because this will make you look like a badass when you code later on. Just remember, when we say JavaScript VM, we just mean Remix VM. Additionally, whenever we deploy to the RinkB testnet, just know that you should be deploying to the Sepolia testnet or whatever the most up-to-date testnet is. Or just don't deploy to the testnet and just follow along. We're gonna modify this contract to make it a little bit more professional. It's not gonna be end-to-end -end amazing, but it's gonna be a little bit better and you'll see why in a minute. So the first thing that we're gonna do is we're looking, we're gonna look at some of these variables here. In particular, owner and minimum USD. Owner gets set one time in our contract here and then it never changes again. Minimum USD gets set one time even outside of the constructor. If we have variables that only get set one time, we can actually use some tools in Solidity to make them more gas efficient. For now, let's compile our FundMe contract and then deploy it to a JavaScript virtual machine. Remember, we can go ahead and deploy it right now. However, funding and withdrawing and doing any of the money stuff isn't gonna work. Because again, we don't have a chain link network on our JavaScript VM. So those aren't gonna work so well. But for what we're gonna do right now, we don't really care so much. Here's what we do care about. We do care about how much gas this costs to actually send. We do care about how much gas this costs to create. Right now, creating this contract costs about 859,000 gas. And we're gonna add a couple of tricks right now to bring this number down. We're gonna add some stuff back in in a bit, which will bring it back up. But for now, we're gonna learn some tricks to bring this number down. The two tricks that we're gonna learn are the constant keyword and the immutable keyword. In their solidity, there are two keywords make it so that your variables can't be changed. And those keywords are constant and immutable. You can learn more about them in the Solidity documentation. If you assign a variable once outside of a function and then never change it, so if, if it's assigned at compile time, you can go ahead and add this constant keyword. We'll learn later about storage, but when you add a constant keyword, this minimum USD no longer takes up a storage spot and is much easier to read to. So now if we recompile this and we deploy this new contract, let's see if we saved any gas. If we look in the transaction logs now, we can grab the transaction cost of how much this cost to deploy. And let's compare it to how much it was before. Wow, we saved almost 19,000 gas. That's almost as much gas as it cost to send Ethereum. Typically, constant variables have a different naming convention. Typically, you'll wanna do them all caps, like min, emum, underscore, USD, so all caps with underscores. So now let's just find minimum USD and replace that with all caps as well. With this interaction, we know that this variable is a constant variable and it's much cheaper to read from. Now, if we go ahead, compile this and redeploy in our fundry contract, even though this is a view function, remember view functions do have gas costs when, when called by a contract. As a constant variable, we can see the execution cost of this variable, 21,415 gas. So let's put a little note right underneath it. If we remove the constant variable, we delete this contract, we redeploy, we click fund me, and we hit minimum USD again, we can now see how much gas this was cost if it wasn't a constant variable. We can see the gas cost did indeed go up. Now on chains that are much cheaper, this gas difference probably won't make it that much of a difference, but on more expensive chains like Ethereum, this is gonna make a big difference. For example, on Ethereum, we can actually see current gas prices on Ethereum here. 
we can see that the current gas price of Ethereum is about 141 GUE. So we'll go to our converter, way to way. We'll copy the way price times this. We'll get the gas price of calling our minimum USD, which is this number here, which if we put back in our Ethereum unit converter, we can see it costs this much gas. And if we times that by the approximate current price of Ethereum, which is around $3,000, calling minimum USD as a constant is gonna cost $9. Calling this at a, at a non-constant is gonna cost almost a, an entire dollar more. You, you can see how all these little gas optimization tricks are gonna make your life a lot better. So let's keep this constant keyword in here. We'll learn more about constant and storage in later sections of this course. Now, as you're just getting started with this course and with Solidity, do not struggle and do not worry about making your contracts as gas efficient as possible. In the beginning, and especially right now, just write your contracts as best as you can. Once you get really good at gas and once you get much later on in the course and much more advanced with Solidity, then you can start going back and working on gas optimizations. But do not let gas optimizations hold you back or if you start stressing over it, just let it go. Don't worry about it and just write your code as best you can. So long story short, do not stress about gas optimizations right now. Now, another variable we only set one time is going to be our owner variable. Owner equals message.sender. We set this one time in the constructor. Variables that we set one time, but outside of the same line that they're declared, and we set them, for example, in the constructor, we can mark as immutable. Typically, a good convention for marking immutable variables is going to be doing I underscore so that we know that these are immutable variables. They have very similar gas savings to the constant keyword. Owner, of course, is a variable that we can't set on the line here because inside the global scope, there's no function going on. However, inside functions, because inside the global scope, there's going to be no message.sender. There's only going to be a message.sender when we're inside of a function. So inside here, we might say I owner equals message.sender. And then, of course, we'll scroll down and we'll change this require only owner now equals I owner. Now, if we compile that, and deploy it, we can see how much gas, we can see how much gas calling I owner is gonna be by with the immutableness. We get 21,508, which we'll go ahead and copy for now. And we'll put right here, we'll say immutable. Now, if we remove the immutable keyword, let's close this, redeploy. Now, if we scroll down to I owner, scroll up the logs, we go down to the call, we scroll down, we see the execution cost was much more. So we'll do double backslash, paste that in here. Gas for non-immutable. So you'll want to keep some of these tricks in mind when it comes to storing variables. The reason that these two save gas is because instead of storing these variables inside of a storage slot, we actually store them directly into the bytecode of the contract. And like I said, don't worry too much about that for now. Later on in the course, we'll teach you more about storage and a lot of this low level stuff that it comes with these contracts. But for now, just know that these exist and they're nice gas savers if you're only setting your variables once. All right, great. So we've just made our contract a little bit more gas efficient. Little gas efficiency improvements are gonna be concepts I sprinkle throughout this course. And when we get to the more advanced section, I'm gonna break down exactly what's going on and why all these gas efficiencies exist and what's going on behind the scenes for these gas efficiencies to occur. It's a little bit in the weeds, which is why I'm going to gloss over it right now. So if it's confusing, don't worry. I wouldn't let these gas efficiencies be the thing that slow you down. Awesome. So we have these two gas optimizations. How else can we make this contract a little bit more gas efficient? Well, one of the ways we can make this more gas efficient is by updating our requires. Right now with our require statement, we actually have to store this sender is not an owner as a string array. Every single one of these characters in this error log needs to get stored individually. This, this string may not seem very big, but it's a lot bigger than the alternative with what we can do. As of 0.8.4 of Solidity, you can now actually do custom errors for our reverts. We declare them at the top and then use ifs instead of require, and then just add our revert statements. This ends up saving a lot of gas since we just call the error code as opposed to calling the entire string associated with the error. 
So for example, with our require down here, and with actually with all of our requires, what we could do is instead of having this require, we could create a custom error. So at the top, what we could do is we could say error, not owner. And you'll notice that this is actually outside of the contract here. Now what we can do is we can take this error, not owner, scroll down into our only owner. Instead of doing a require, we'll do an if statement. We'll say if message.sender is not I owner, then we're going to go ahead and revert with a not owner error. This ends up saving us a lot of gas since we don't have to store and emit this long string here. Now in a lot of code today, you'll still see require a lot of places because these, these custom errors are pretty new in Solidity. So you'll want to get used to writing it both ways. I wouldn't be surprised if in the future, the syntax for some of these errors looks like this so that it's more readable. But for now, if you want to do a more gas efficient way than requires, you can use something like this. We could update all of our requires here for these custom errors, but for now, I'm going to leave both in just to show you the differences. This revert keyword does the exact same thing that require does without the conditional beforehand. So you can actually go ahead and, and revert any transaction or any function call in the middle of the function call. Now let's look at one more way to improve this contract. Sometimes people will try to interact with a contract that takes Ethereum or the native blockchain token without actually going through the required function calls that, that are needed. For example, on a JavaScript EVM here, I could actually try to send this contract money without calling the fund function. However, if I were to do that, what would happen? Would our fund function get triggered? No, it wouldn't get triggered. We wouldn't keep track of that funder. We wouldn't have that person's information updated in this contract. So if later on we want to give rewards or something, we wouldn't know about those funders. And this wouldn't be great because people would send our contract money without us ever knowing. And we wouldn't be able to give them any credit or anything. Additionally, maybe they called the wrong function by accident and they, they weren't using MetaMask and they weren't using a tool to tell them, hey, this transaction is likely going to fail. So what can we do in this case? What happens if someone sends this contract ETH without calling the fund function? Right now, if we were to send this fund me contract ETH, it would just go to the contract, right? And this contract just wouldn't keep track of those people. But there's actually a way for when people send money to this contract or people call a function that doesn't exist for us to still trigger some code. And now there are two special functions in Solidity. One is called receive and one is called the fallback. Now in Solidity, there are actually a number of special functions and two of these special functions are the receive special function and the fallback special function. A contract can have at most one receive function declared using the receive external payable without the function keyword. This function cannot have arguments, cannot return anything, and must have external visibility and a payable state mutability. What does that actually mean and or look like? Well, let's create a separate contract to go ahead and play with this. So in here, we're going to create a new file called fallbackexample.sol. And in here, we're going to add our basic pieces. SPX license identifier, MIT, Pragma Solidity, 0.8.7, and we'll do contract fallback example, like so. Feel free to pause the video to catch up to this point. Once we create our fallback contract, let's create a variable to go ahead and try to test this function. We'll create a UN256 public result variable. And let's create this receive function. So we'll say receive is going to be an external payable function. We don't add the function keyword for receive since Solidity knows that receive is a special function. Whenever we send Ethereum or make a transaction to this contract now, as long as there's no data associated with the transaction, this receive function will get triggered. What we can do in here now is we can say result equals one. So let's go ahead and test this out on the JavaScript virtual machine. So we compile this. So we're gonna go ahead and compile this. We'll go deploy it on the JavaScript virtual machine. We're gonna deploy our fallback example, and we're gonna see what result is initialized to. Since we haven't set anything for result, result of course is initialized to zero. But what if we were to send 
this contract some Ethereum. Well, receive would go ahead and be triggered here. We can actually send this contract some Ethereum directly by working with this low level interactions bit here. Don't worry about what call data means for now. Just know that this area down here is a way we can send and work with different functions. And we can add parameters to this transaction by going up here and adjusting the variables up here. If we keep call data blank, it'll be the same as if we were in MetaMask and just hitting send and then choosing this contract address. Again, we can't actually use MetaMask since this is a virtual machine and not one of the networks that we're working with. So if I do, for example, I change this value to one way and I keep everything blank and I go ahead and hit this transaction button, which again, is gonna be the same as hitting this send button, but only sending one way, what do you think will happen? Well, let's try it. We can see in the log area that we did indeed send a transaction. And if you look at the description here, you can even see it says from so-and-so to fallback example dot receive. It looks like it called our receive function, which should have updated our result to one. So if we hit result now, we can indeed see that result has been updated to the value of one. Well, let's go ahead and delete this. Let's deploy this contract again. And this time let's have value be zero. Does receive get triggered this time? So let's pull this down. Let's hit transact. Let's leave the call data blank. We'll leave value at zero. So this will be the same as if we had sent zero Ethereum to this contract. Let's hit transact. It looks like that went through. Do you think result is gonna be one or zero? If you thought one, you were correct. A receive function gets triggered anytime we send a transaction to this contract now, and we don't specify a function and we keep the call data blank. When working with any other contract, like FundMe, for example, when we call one of these functions, we're actually just populating this call data bit with certain data that points to one of these functions up here. If we send a transaction and we add data to it, we could actually call one of these functions. Now let's try this again. Let's delete the contract again. We'll redeploy, open this up. Result is currently zero. Receive, like I said, only is triggered if our call data to it is blank. Now this time, if I add some call data to this transaction, do you think receive will be triggered this time? If we hit transact and remix, we actually get a pop-up saying fallback function is not defined. This is because whenever data is sent with a transaction, Solidity says, oh, well, since you're sending data, you're not looking for receive, you're looking for some function. So let me look for that function for you. Hmm, I don't see any function that matches the 0x00. So I'm gonna look for your fallback function. Remix is smart enough to know that we don't have a fallback function. The second special function in Solidity is called the fallback function. This is very similar to the receive function, except for the fact that it can work even when data is sent along with transaction. So our fallback will look something like this. Fallback, external, payable, result equals two. Fallback is another one of these functions where we're not gonna put the function selector because Solidity is expecting this. Actually, you're already familiar with one other special function. If we go back to our fund me, our constructor, for example, is another type of special function. There's no function keyword. Solidity knows that this constructor is immediately called when we deploy this contract. So now we have our fallback function. Let's go ahead and compile this. Let's delete our old contract. Let's go ahead and deploy this new contract. Let's click here. We hit result. We do indeed see it's set to zero. Now, if I add this zero X zero zero and I send this and I hit transact, this is equivalent to calling our contract here without a valid function. So our contract goes, hmm, I don't recognize what you're trying to tell me here. I'm gonna refer you to our fallback. And now if we hit result, we see that it's been updated to two. If we take this away, Solidity will go, hmm, it looks like you're trying to send some Ethereum or call this contract without specifying what you wanna do. Well, I have a receive function, so I'm just gonna go ahead and forward you to that. So if we call transact, we hit result, we see it updates back to one. Add some data, hit transact, we see it updates to two. No data, updates to one. Soliditybyexample.org has a wonderful little chart that we can use to figure out whether or not receive is gonna get triggered or fallback is gonna get triggered. If it is empty and there's a receive function, it'll call the receive function. 
If it is data and there's no receive function, it'll just go to the fallback function. And if there's no fallback function, it might just, it might error out. So this is a lot of really fantastic information here. How can we apply this to our FundMe contract here? Well, what we can do now in our FundMe is we can add these fallback and receive functions just in case somebody actually sends this contract money instead of calling the fund function correctly. So what we can do is let's add a receive function. So if somebody accidentally sends it money, we can still process the transaction. We'll say receive is going to be external payable. And we'll just have the receive function call fund. And we'll do the same thing with our fallback function. We'll have fallback external payable. We'll just have it automatically call fund. Now, if somebody accidentally sends this money without calling our fund function, it'll still automatically route them over to the fund function. This means too, that if somebody doesn't send us enough funding, it'll that transaction will still get reverted. So let's go ahead now and let's switch to Rink B to test this on a real test net. I'm on Rink B in my MetaMask. Let's switch over to Injected Web3 and we'll scroll down. We'll choose our FundMe contract and we'll go ahead and deploy this. MetaMask pops up. I'm going to go ahead and confirm the transaction and we see our fund me contract here right now we can see the own we can see i'm the owner we can see minimum usd and we can see of course that it's a blank contract and there's nothing funded in here if we copy the address and then go to rink b ether scan paste the address in we can see that there's no ether in here and the only transaction associated with this has been the contract creation we saw what happened before when we hit the fund function our contract was updated with a new balance and that funder was added to our array. Let's see what happens now if we just directly send this contract money without calling the fund function here. If we did this right, our receive function should pick it up and kick the transaction over to fund. So let's copy this address. We'll go to our MetaMask. We'll hit send, paste the address in here. We'll do 0 0.02 ETH again, because this should be more than the minimum amount in USD. We'll hit next. I'll go ahead and confirm this. And after a slight delay, if we did this right, we should see this transaction having called the fund function here. Now that our transaction has gone through, and after a brief delay and waiting for Etherscan to update, we do indeed see that our balance has updated to 0 0.02, which of course, this makes sense. And we see in the transactions list here, we see that this actually went through as a as a transfer instead of us calling the fund function. Let's go ahead and remix and see if our funders was updated. It looks like it was at the zero with position of funders. We have our address. And if we take our address and pop it into address to amount funded, we can see exactly how much we had funded. This means that since we added this receive function in here, we automatically had to call our fund function up here. So awesome work. We were able to add a receive function to help people who accidentally call the wrong function or accidentally send this contract money instead of correctly calling the fund function. Now, if they had directly called the fund function, it would have cost them a little bit less gas, but at least this time they're going to get credit and add it to our funders array for having sent our funding contract money. Okie dokie, as before with simple storage, there is a small bug with the ZK Sync plugin, which I'm going to walk you through very quickly before I pass back over to Patrick, who's going to walk you through step by step what the changes you need to do here are. So I have made some small modifications for ZK Sync to this FundMe contract, but Patrick is going to walk through that in a second. I just want to note that if you were to compile the FundMe contract after making all the modifications that Patrick suggested, you would see in the deploy tab, there are no contracts ready for deployment yet. And that is because for the ZK Sync plugin, you need to make sure that your contracts are inside a contracts folder. They're not just free floating here. So if we just create a new folder called contracts, and then we chuck our contract inside the contracts folder, and then we went back to ZK Sync, and hit compile fund me. Then you would see that the smart contract has compiled successfully and you can go ahead and deploy it. So just make sure that all of your contracts are indeed inside of a contracts folder. Now I'll pass back to Patrick. He's going to walk you through some of the changes that need to be made to your smart contract before you do all of this. So just remember, put your smart contract inside of a contracts folder for the ZK Sync plugin.
All right, so now we're going to take this code base and we're actually going to deploy it to ZK Sync, similar to what we did with Simple Storage. We're going to deploy it to the ZK Sync Sepolia testnet. Now, like I've always been saying, deploying to testnets can often be very fickle. So if you do not want to follow along with me here, feel free to not follow along with me. But if you want to try to do this as well, feel free to do so. Now, the reason in particular I want to show you deploying this to the ZK Sync Sepolia testnet is because I want to show you something in particular. Down here, where we have the get version, we're using this specific price feed address that we got from the Chainlink documentation. This price feed address is specific for the Sepolia chain. And every single different chain, including the different L2s, are going to have a different address here. So if we want to use ZK Sync, we have to use the ZK Sync Sepolia testnet address. So if we copy this address and we go back to the Chainlink documentation, now, the docs are probably going to look very different by the time you actually start looking at them because they change the docs pretty frequently. So an easy way to get started here is maybe go to docs.chain.link and then over either on developer hub or overview, go to data feeds. And this is where you can see most of what you need in the getting started section of the documentation. So now that we're at the docs, we're going to go ahead. We're going to go back to the feeds addresses, price feed addresses here, and we're going to scroll down. And once again, we can see in Sepolia testnet, we can see the ETH USD address down here on the Sepolia testnet. Since we want to deploy to ZK Sync now, what we're going to do is we're going to scroll up in this, and in this networks section, we're going to look for ZK Sync, which is right here. We're going to scroll down. We can see we have the ZK Sync era mainnet list of addresses. We're going to scroll right on past that. And we're going to go to the ZK Sync Sepolia testnet where we see ETH USD right here. And we're going to go ahead and copy that. If we want, we can even open this up in a new tab. We can go to the contract. We can select read and we can scroll down maybe to the latest answer. We'll hit query and we'll be able to see the latest price of Ethereum on the Sepolia testnet. Remember, this is just a testnet, so it's not updated very often. So now what we want to do then is right in get version, we're actually going to change this address, paste in that new ZK Sync Sepolia address. Once we have the new address in here, there's a couple other tweaks that we need to make. And I have an issue associated with the ZK Sync plugin here so that this becomes easier in the future. But right now, if we were to go ahead and try to go to the ZK Sync compiler here and compile this, you're going to get this long error saying Solidity compilation failed, right? And one of the reasons is first, we need to have, we need to update our contract to the ZK Silk latest version, which is going to be 0.8.24. And we have to do that with our price converter. We need to update that to 0.8.24 as well. But additionally, right now, the ZK Sync compiler has a hard time working with libraries. So what we can do instead is we can just copy all of this library code come over to FundMe, delete this import, paste the library code in, and we can first check it works with Solidity. Then we can come back to the ZK Sync compiler and compile it here. And then it should update accordingly. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to deploy this and I'm going to verify this as well, just to show you what it looks like on the ZK Sync testnet. Like I said, you don't have to actually do this you can just go ahead and follow along. Although my mistake, we both need to update the version here and we need to update it in our library as well. If we didn't do this, it would be pointing to an address that doesn't necessarily exist on the ZK Sync testnet. And this would fail. We wouldn't get the correct price conversions. So let's go ahead, let's deploy and verify this. And if you wanna go ahead and do this as well, feel free to do so. So first, we're going to need to update our environment to work with a wallet. If you haven't already, we're going to go select wallet down here. Normally, a connect button will come up. I've already connected, so mine looks like this. If you're not already connected, you go ahead and you'll hit connect wallet. You'll select MetaMask here, and then your MetaMask will pop up. Or if not, if it's already connected, it'll look something like this. So what we'll want to do now is switch from price converter to fund me. Remember not to do price converter, you will get an error. You can even pull up the terminal here. And then we'll select deploy and verify or just deploy. Per usual, MetaMask will pop up. 
Now you notice a little bit different from Sepulia, we're actually just signing as opposed to signing and sending here. That's because with ZK Sync, we actually have a slightly different deployment process, but we'll learn about that in the future. We'll go ahead and we'll sign this. So it looks like our verification failed. That's not a big deal. What's important is that the contract has been deployed. So what we can do now is scroll on down and we can check to see the blue buttons to see if this at least deployed correctly. If we select minimum USD, we get that. If we get select get version, we do indeed get four, which means this contract has been deployed to the correct chain. So it didn't verify correctly, but that's not a big deal because we can still interact with it as such. And if you did go ahead and deploy this to ZK Sync, you should be incredibly proud of yourself because that's incredibly exciting. And feel free to play around with this as you see fit. You'll notice the amount of ETH I have actually did go down, even though in my activity, it doesn't show that I sent a transaction. Huh, that's really odd. For now, just ignore that and we'll learn in the future why that happened and how that happened. But for now, if you did, th if you did this, congratulations on deploying this to ZK Sync. That's incredibly exciting. We've even learned some advanced sections of Solidity. And this is gonna be the last time that we start our projects in Remix. We're gonna be moving over to a code editor now where we can get even more advanced with our Solidity and our setups. For the most part, you've gone over the vast majority of Solidity basics. There are a number of things that we still haven't learned yet. And the reason we haven't gone into them is because they get more advanced and understanding their real use doesn't really make too much sense until a little bit later. Some of the things that we're gonna go over are enums, events, try catch, function selectors, ABI encoding, hashing, and then Yule slash, and then Yule slash assembly. However, if you've gotten this far, you probably can read most Solidity code and understand what's going on, which is absolutely fantastic. So you should give yourself a huge round of applause for getting this far and doing this. Let's do a quick summary of this more advanced section and make sure we understand what we learned. In Solidity, there are a couple special functions. Some of them are receive, fallback, and constructor. These functions don't need to have the function keyword and instead can just be called like so. Receive and fallback are two very special functions. If data is sent with a transaction and no function was specified, the transaction will default to the fallback function if that fallback function exists. If data is empty and there's a receive function, it'll call the receive function. There are a couple of keywords that can help us save gas in the long run. Some of those keywords are gonna be constant and immutable. Constant and immutable are for variables that can only be declared and updated once. Once we say minimum USD is 50 times one E18, this minimum USD can never be changed again. And this helps us save gas. Immutable can also save gas similar to constant. However, immutable variables can be declared one time in the constructor. Once an immutable variable is declared, it can't be changed later on. In fact, if we even tried to update an immutable variable or a constant variable and we compiled, our compiler would give us an error saying, can't write to immutable here, or if we tried to change a constant variable, our compiler would say, hey, you can't assign to a constant variable. Sorry. In Remix, if we want to send Ether to a contract that's on the JavaScript virtual machine, we can deploy that contract. And then in the contract, we can just hit the transact button without any call data and update the value that we send with the transaction. If call data is blank, it'll trigger a receive function if it exists. But if there's data that doesn't specify any of the other functions, it'll trigger the fallback function. All right, my code's done. Time to ship it. Delivery free, box you, dog water, zero earn, zero PR. In the age of AI, debugging and getting into software engineering has never been easier. Here are the exact six steps you need to take to unblock yourself from any software engineering error you'll ever get. Number one, tinker. Try to pinpoint your error. You can usually use an AI buddy to help you out here. 
Pinpointing your error will potentially solve your problem before you even go into an AI and allow you to craft a better question to an AI. Once you've pinpointed the issue, you can move to step two, which is ask your AI. You can use ChatGPT, Find, Bing's AI, or if you want to get wrong answers, Google's Bard. There are six principles to prompt engineering so that you can get the best out of your AI. Write clear and specific instructions, give as much context as possible, use delimiters to clearly indicate distinct parts of the input, and especially look out for something called hallucinations. Hallucinations are when your AI gives you an output that it thinks is right, but is completely wrong. For example, if I write about writing solidity and variant tests in Foundry, GPT disgraces us by saying we have to npm install it from Open Zeppelin. These can be tough to spot, but once you try it out, you'll see it doesn't work. And finally, you want to understand the limitations of the AI you're working with and iterate constantly. Large learning language models are trained on human conversation, so you can interact with them as if you're having a conversation. But it's important to know the limitations of these AIs, as most AIs have a limit on how many tokens or words they can keep in context at one time. AI is trained off human language, so if you're good at asking other humans questions, you'll probably be good at asking robots questions too. Asking questions is a skill, so keep practicing. I've got a link in the description to learn.deeplearning.ai, which is a free course to help software engineers be better prompt engineers. Now, when the AIs can't help you, you'll have to go back to the old standbys, actually doing work yourself. And one of the first pieces of work is reading the documentation. You probably should have done this already. However, we can still use ChatGPT because a strategy that I constantly use is I'll copy paste sections of the documentation at ChatGPT as context and say something like the above are the docs for tool X based on those docs, how do I do Y? So Google might be crying because ChatGPT is eating its lunch, but Google still has what AI doesn't have, the entire internet. Previously, anytime I ran into an issue, I prayed someone else had run into it before I made a post on it so I could Google search that exact issue. There's a new tool called Find that combines web search with AI as it does a web search and it crawls through all the data of the sites, reads them all, and then gives you an answer based off of what it reads. Five, ask in a forum. Sometimes the information just isn't out there and we need to ask human beings. We always wanna ask our question on a webbed indexed forum like Stack Exchange, Stack Overflow, Hirana, or Reddit. This way web crawlers and more likely AIs can scrape the data from these sites and learn from us. That way, the next time we have this question, we can get our answers quickly. Asking on Discord and Twitter are because your knowledge will get lost to the unsearchable <laughs> conversations that Discord is, and web crawlers don't index them. The super secret alpha is to ask a question on Stack Exchange and then post your Stack Exchange link to Discord. You should 100% always ask your questions and format them with Markdown, and if you're not sure how to do Markdown, you can ask ChatGPT to help you format your questions in Markdown. Ask on the support GitHub or forum. Is the tool you're working on open source? Awesome, ask a well-formatted question on their Git page. Not open source? Never use that tool again. This is how we improve our tools, by creating issues, engaging with each other, and even taking on issues and contributing to the open source code. And then finally, iterate. Do all these same steps over again. And as always, keep hopping through the code, and until next time, stay riveting my fellow blockchainers. All right, fantastic. So now we know a little bit more about the different tools and techniques we can use when we do, in fact, get stuck. We can use something like ChatGPT, forums to ask questions. We obviously want to Google search. And especially for this course, you definitely want to make sure you use the discussions channel. But I wanted to give you some very specific tips about working with this course. Number one, limit your self triaging to 15 or 20 minutes. For example, if we're trying to compile our price converter.soul and maybe we forgot to add the address in here, right? And we're going to go ahead and compile and we're getting this error. This is exactly one argument expected for explicit type conversion. Now, this should be pretty obvious what the error is. Hey, it's expecting one argument and we obviously just removed that argument, but maybe you're having a really hard time and you're trying all this different stuff and you can't seem to figure it out. Limit yourself to 15 or 20 minutes. We do not want to be messing around for so long that we can't figure something out, right? Something like this would be very easy for us to hit compile, copy this error, go to ChatGPT and say something like, hey, I'm getting an error compiling my solidity. Here is the error. Do three backticks, paste it in here like that. Three backticks is markdown. And like we said in the video, we wanna use delimiters to clearly identify what is code versus what is not. Oops, and I hit, and I hit enter, whoops the daisy. We're actually gonna hit stop generating and we're gonna copy paste the question again. Now we're gonna say, here is my solidity, it's wrong. And then we'll copy the solidity line. Once again, three back ticks, we'll say solidity here, we'll paste it in, three back ticks to end it, hit enter. And it'll probably give us the answer here. 
and sure enough, the error message suggests that you need to provide an address when using explicit type conversion. So we go, ah, okay, whoops, we need to actually add an address in here. It gives us an example. And we can go back to our code and you know paste that address in here and, and be good to go. So limit self-triage to 15, 20 minutes. That's gonna be the first tip. Number two, don't be afraid to ask AI, but don't skip learning. The purpose of this course is for you to be able to learn everything here. AI is going to get things wrong. And it's only the people who actually have learned what's going on under the hood who are going to be able to call out when AI gets something wrong. When AI gets something wrong, it does something called hallucinate. And we talked a little bit about that in that AI video we just watched. So hallucinations are when the AI makes something up that it thinks is right, but it's completely wrong. And that's something we absolutely need to watch out for when we're coding and when we're learning. A perfect example of this is with Foundry, which is a tool we're about to learn very soon. In order for us to install Foundry, we actually need to run this command, right? Get foundry.sh. It's the first thing that it tells us to do. At the time of recording, ChatGPT has not been trained on the Foundry tool. So if I ask it a question like, I'd like to initialize a Foundry project with Solidity, can you show me how to do that? And will it enter? So the first sentence out the gate is wrong. It's not aware of Foundry, so it, it tried to guess what Foundry was and it got it wrong. It is not a Rust-based framework for building blockchains at all, and it is directly related to Solidity. So it's really important that we use AI to augment our learning we don't skip over the learning with AI. It's really good to bounce questions, good ideas off of, but in order for us to be even able to recognize when Foundry is hallucinating and making stuff up, we need to have that knowledge ourselves. Step three, of course, use the forms. Web3education.dev will have a place for you to ask questions, but in the meantime, definitely be sure to use the Foundry full course discussions. Use this to your advantage and use this to help other people out who have questions. This is a community project. We're all going to be helping each other out learning. Number three, Google the exact error. If AI doesn't know, the forums aren't know, Google the exact error. Maybe somebody else has come across this error previously, asked the question online, and you can just Google it. And then, of course, post your question in Stack Exchange or Piranha. And like we said in that AI video, you want to use Markdown and format your questions as best as possible. So if you're unfamiliar with how to use Markdown, if you're unfamiliar with how to format your questions. Again, please be sure to ask ChatGPT or some other AI how to best format your questions. You can even simply say, ask ChatGPT, could you give me an example of a well-formatted Stack Overflow question with COD or code? And it'll actually give us a really good formatted question. So it gives us the question, it formats the code for us. It's using this with the three backticks that I showed you in order to get this code block here. It's using three backticks and it's being very verbose in giving all the details of the question. So be sure to ask questions like ChatGPT. Awesome. Again, let's say we're in here, we compile, we get this error, exactly one argument expected for explicit type conversion. If we copy this error, go to Google, we paste just the error in, we'll remove this our specific code. Looks like the first thing we get in Google is actually contract inheritance. And we can see that this is actually exactly the error that we're getting. It looks like this does actually explain the answer, but it's a little bit confusing to understand here. So maybe you would copy paste this into ChatGPT as context, right? There's a lot of creative ways you can approach debugging some of your issues. Obviously, when you're out in the wild and you're actually building things yourself, obviously the education site and the discussions channel of the GitHub repo, the people in these aren't gonna have context for the new creative thing that you're working on. So I want you to get used to doing that methodology that we're teaching here, right? Asking your AI buddy, if your AI buddy doesn't know, Googling, asking questions on Stack Exchange Ethereum, asking questions on Piranha. Piranha is arguably better because you're asking your questions in a decentralized location as opposed to a centralized server. But I definitely want you to practice asking questions and go to Piranha, go to Stack Exchange, make accounts for these so that when you do run into an issue, because you will, you'll know where to post them. I'll encourage you to pause and post a question on one of these forms right now just so that you get used to it, just so that you get out of your shell. And you're going to suck at asking questions in the beginning, and that's okay. You will get better at asking questions as you continue with this course. Asking good questions is a skill in itself. And if you learn how to ask very good questions, that's the secret sauce to being amazing at AI prompting as well.
Now, the final step in all of this is actually going to be posting an issue on GitHub slash Git. A surprisingly incredibly important part of being a software engineer and being a developer in Web3 is interacting with the community. The vast majority of these tools that we're working with are going to be something called open source, meaning that the code associated with them is actually available for anybody to view. This tool Foundry that we're going to be working with is one such example. And if you see, it has this issues tab where there's just a ton of issues people are posting while using this tool. This is how code is able to be improved and move forward. All this code is public for people to use and work with. And if there's a question that isn't answered, you can post here and tell the developers of this tool, hey, I'm running into an issue. Maybe we should make a project improvement. I would say be very respectful with the way that you make issues. You definitely want to do some searching on issues to make sure that nobody else has asked the question that you're working with. And be sure to use these other resources first, like Piranha, like Stack Exchange. But in the future, once you leave this course, it's going to be incredibly important for you to participate in the ecosystem by making issues, by making pull requests, and actually improving some of the tools that we're going to be working with yourself. Even Ethereum has a GitHub, and if there's any improvements that you want to make, you can add an EIP to actually improve Ethereum. We'll talk about EIPs some more later. You can improve some of the clients that Ethereum runs. So interacting with each other is incredibly important. And in fact, if you don't have a GitHub, we are going to get you set up with GitHub right now because GitHub is the platform that most developers use to share code and write code and interact with code in between each other. So if you don't have a GitHub, let's sign up right now. And we're going to use the GitHub to create our own portfolios of all the different cool coding projects that we've created. This way, when you go to apply for a job, you can say, hey, go look at my GitHub. I've got all these really cool projects. So we're gonna make you a GitHub right now. If you don't have an email, you're gonna need an email. I made a burner account just for this video. And I'm also gonna walk you through formatting a question. And I know I'm belaboring the point here, but I really, really want to stress the importance of formatting these questions really well. So we're actually going to show a clip from my past video. So we're going to be using the full blockchain solidity course JS. But again, for this video, just be sure to use the GitHub repo associated with this course and not that other old GitHub repo. All right, let's watch this video. In fact, if you haven't already, let's sign up for GitHub right now and let me walk you through formatting one of these questions because the better you format your questions, the better chance you have of actually getting the answer. And remember, when asking questions on these forums, when asking questions in these discussion communities, people answer these questions out of the goodness of their heart, right? So if you don't get a response, there's a chance that maybe nobody knows, maybe it's your question isn't formatted very well, and etc. So we're gonna learn how to ask really good questions here. And if you're new to blockchain, do not skip this section, okay? This is gonna be that piece that's gonna give you the superpower to unblock yourself from any coding issue you run into. So don't skip this part, be sure to follow along. Okay, so if you don't have a GitHub already, you do need an email to get started. So I'm gonna go ahead and sign in. I made a burner account just for this video. So what we're gonna do, we're gonna go ahead and sign up, GitHub, enter your email. and we hit create account. They're gonna send us an email. So we're gonna come back to our email. We're gonna get our launch code here, paste it in, answer a little bit of information. We're gonna choose the free version and fantastic. We've now created a GitHub profile. Awesome, so now we've created a GitHub. So I'm actually using a GitHub that I used in my last course. So that's why I have all these repositories over here. Now, in order to create a new discussion over the Foundry full course F23, let's go over to the discussions tab. We'll hit new discussion and we'll hit general and I'll say something like test discussion. Be like, feel free to say hello here. Start discussion. Now I'm going to show you a question that's formatted poorly and I want you to never, ever, ever ask a question like this. And if you see somebody ask a question like this, please help them format their question correctly. Hey, why my code not be good? And then you know, let's just have it be an issue like this, right? What's wrong, wrong with this? Okay, well, why my code not be good? Obviously isn't clear what's going on. The code isn't formatted well, and even an AI would have a hard time answering this. So let's fix this to be a little bit better. As we know, we wanna copy the exact error we're getting. So we'll say, we'll copy the error, we'll go back. And we'll say, 
I am receiving this error. We'll do the three little back ticks, paste our error right in here like that. Actually, let's be even more explicit. I'm receiving this error while compiling. Here's my code, three back ticks. We'll put solidity here and copy the whole line that is erroring, paste it in here. And someone help me figure out what the issue is, right? And you see how this is much, much better, right? We have these two blocks that pop up because we did the back ticks. And the secret is that this is going to get you a much better answer from an AI as well, right? If we edit this, we can copy the whole thing in Markdown, go over to ChatGPT, paste it in, zoom out a little bit. And we're going to get it actually an answer. Hey, you're receiving this error because you're trying to create an instance of aggregator V interface without providing the necessary argument, blah, blah, blah. Oh, and it actually gives an updated version of that, but it helps us out here. So ask, format your questions correctly. You will get better answers from both AIs and humans. And I know I'm spending a long time on this, but I really, really need you to understand that the secret to prompt engineering is actually just being able to ask better formatted questions with human beings. And it's better for interacting with human beings as well. Now, the other thing that I did really well here was I only posted the relevant code to the error that I was getting. What we see a lot of people do is they just copy paste their entire code base into here. This is not very helpful as it's going to make somebody who wants to help you their job a lot harder. If they have to read your entire code base, right? We reply here. This is so much more reading for them to do. It's going to take them a lot longer and they might not actually read it. And we didn't actually highlight this with the back ticks. And it goes the same thing with AI. If you give your AI too much text, it can't read all of the text. Because again, some of these AIs have limitations in how much text they can read. So it's the exact same thing with working with human beings. So feel free to take some time to either in ChatGPT or whatever AI you're using, or in this test discussion forum to post some well formatted questions. And remember, you can use AI to help you get those formatted questions in Markdown. Be sure to ask ChatGPT to give you the output in Markdown. So if you haven't worked with Markdown before, that's okay. You'll learn as you go along. But one of the biggest differences, especially when working with Markdown, that's going to make your code so much more readable. And I 100% need you to always do this whenever you ask questions is, you see how this got like some syntax highlighting in this above question? Well, if we go click edit again, we can actually see why. Up here, we did those three back ticks, and then we typed the word solidity. When you do these three back ticks in your questions, if you type the word or you type the language next to the first three back ticks, it'll actually add some formatting to make it more readable. So if we scroll down to this poorly formatted question, you can see that this is just all white and like impossible to read. It would be at least slightly better if we hit edit, and next to these three back ticks, we wrote solidity. If this was like Java code or Python code, we could write Python or Java or whatever. But since this is Solidity, we'll write Solidity. I'll hit update. And you can see that it is substantially nicer and it is much more readable now. So even though this is still a bad question, obviously, because we just copy pasted all of our code, it's at least much more readable. So anytime you do a code block like this of any of your code, absolutely 100% be sure to do the three back ticks and then the language of the block of code. So just remember this, there are no bad questions, but there are poorly formatted questions. Make your questions well formatted for both human beings and for AI. And then most importantly, be sure to join these forums. And like I've said a hundred times, interact with these people, interact and help and give back. The more people that use and are good at the tool that you're working with, the more likely that they're going to help you sometime in the future. And this is how I've met so many people in the industry is just giving back and interacting with other people. So whenever you ask a question, especially in the beginning, because in the beginning, you're going to have more questions than not, be sure to at least try to go back and answer a question. Think of it as question and answer debt. Every time you answer a question, make a little mental note and say, ah, in the future, I need to at least try to answer one of somebody else's questions. This is how we grow and move so much faster. Now, this next piece that I'm going to show you is actually outside of this course, but it's a resource that I wanted to show you in case after this course is done, you want more resources to learn about Ethereum and learn about the EVN. 
It's with my good friend Austin, who's going to show you speed run Ethereum and definitely something you might want to check out after taking this course. What's up? I'm Austin Griffin. Happy Bowtie Friday. I want to show you the best way to get started building on Ethereum. It's speedrunethereum.com. It'll teach you how and why. You'll, you'll build a simple NFT. You'll build a decentralized staking app. You'll learn that the superpower of Ethereum is allowing you, the builder, to create a simple set of rules where an adversarial group of people can coordinate financially. You'll build a token vendor. You'll build a dice game and you'll learn about randomness on chain and where it works and where it doesn't and what you can do about that. You'll learn about a DEX and what a hyperstructure is and how people can use liquidity to swap. You'll learn about state channel and scalability and sign messages and multi-sig wallets and account abstraction and SVG NFTs. Lots of fun stuff along the way. Like I said, not just the how, but the why. Go to speedrunethereum.com and get started today. Uh, it'll have you do a quick video. Uh, and then it says to use scaffold ETH to start tinkering. I want to show you how to do that. First of all, all this stuff is open source. Uh, it's all ungated and open source. Just get in and get get in, get learning. Okay. But the scaffold ETH thing, uh, scaffold ETH is a great way to tinker uh, with solidity and kind of get your 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 bearings, right? So let me show scaffold ETH too, just for a second. If we zoom in, uh, I've already kind of uh, gone through the whole readme and installed everything. I want to show this right here. Here's a smart contract. And I have my front end that's uh, auto adapting to the smart contract. And so uh, when in speedrun Ethereum, it tells you to tinker with each one of these concepts. Let's just go look at mappings or structs or modifiers. Let's just go look at a mapping and let's grab a mapping, right? And let's copy and paste it right into our smart contract. So something called my map, I don't even know what it is, right? And then we yarn deploy and we'll see that my map show up over here. And this is kind of the feedback loop I want you to get into where you can grab some stuff from Solidity by example, paste it into your smart contract, deploy it locally, and then tinker with it. There's my my map. Let's see what Vitalik's valence is in my map. It's zero. Oh, okay, so check out Speedrun Ethereum. Check out Scaffold ETH. Get started building cool things on Ethereum today. Happy Bowtie Friday. Hearts, hearts, hearts. See ya. You have now completed the Solidity Fundamentals. This is incredibly exciting. You know a lot of the basics of Solidity, how to deploy smart contracts, how to work with smart contracts, and a lot of the fundamental skills it takes to become a smart contract developer or security researcher. But we've really just scratched the surface. Next up is the Introduction to Foundry course, which is a smart contract framework that's going to accelerate our development prowess, allow us to make much safer, much better tests for our smart contracts, allow us to deploy them programmatically and do a, a lot of really powerful things for us developers. So huge congratulations on finishing Solidity Basics. As always, now's a great time to get some ice cream, go for a walk, or maybe go to the gym. Take that break, and I'm looking forward to seeing you at the start of Foundry. Welcome to the Foundry's Fundamental Course, where you are going to learn about Foundry, the smart contract framework. Once again, my name is Patrick Collins, and I will be the lead instructor for you here. Let's get froggy. Now, the reason I especially wanted to show you all of these debugging things right now is because we are about to move off of Remix. Remix has been this phenomenal IDE or this phenomenal integrated development environment that allows us to quickly try things and quickly deploy things but we're actually gonna move off of Remix to a more professional setup, and we're gonna be using a modern set of tools that most of the rest of the development community also works with. And I'm gonna tell you this right now, often installing these new tools and often just getting your local development environment set up not using Remix or not using what's called a cloud IDE can often be the actually most difficult step in this whole process. So I want you to be absolutely vigilant in using 
all of the resources that I just showed you using the chat, using chat GPT, using Piranha, using Stack Exchange ETH, using web3education.dev. Once we get this up and live, be sure to use these tools and don't let installing these slow you down because in my mind, installing these can be the hardest part of this whole course and it's okay. Things might not work the first time and that's okay. Just be sure to ask questions and be very specific with the errors that you're seeing. And installing these things, that's what we're gonna learn how to do right now. So Remix is a phenomenal tool, but now we're gonna move over to this more professional setup called Foundry. Foundry is one of the most popular smart contract development frameworks, similar to Hardhat or Brownie, if you're familiar with those. And it's known specifically for its speed. Foundry is easily the fastest to work with smart contract development framework. One of the unique aspects about Foundry is that whereas Hardhat is JavaScript based, Brownie is Python based, Foundry is completely Solidity based. So we don't have to learn any other programming languages other than Solidity to work with Foundry. And similar to everything that we've been doing so far, all of the code for all of our Foundry products are going to be in the GitHub repo associated with this course. However, the documentation for Foundry, I think is also phenomenal. So be sure to use this as you code along. And something very interesting that I really love to do, most of these pages are pretty small. So even if your AI isn't trained off of Foundry, which as a recording, it's not, what we can do is something called context injection when we have issues. So we can copy the entire page of documentation. We can say, I'd like to start, I'd like to install Foundry. Here are the documentations for installation. How can I do it? Do the three backticks, paste the whole thing in there. And by giving our AIs the documentation for working with Foundry, it's actually going to give us outputs to install Foundry. So this is a methodology you'll see me use from time to time, this context injection. You can find more information in the GitHub repo, once again, associated with this course on installation and setup Mac OS, and this should be Linux. And then we have some Windows setup stuff down here. And we're gonna go over how to set up all the important things for this course. So be sure to use this as a reference. Now, a great question you might be asking is, well, what's even the purpose of Foundry? Why do we need to use this other tool? Remix is working great. Well, in Remix, you notice that we did a lot of stuff manually. Like I came in here, I had to go to compile. Maybe I wanted to test something out. I would go deploy it. Uh, I got to put a price feed in here, put a price feed in here, deploy. Okay, does the get version work? Uh, something's wrong with my get version. Okay, my o I owner works. Okay, minimum USD works. Oh crap, I, I gotta go make some little change here. You know, maybe I want get version to actually return, you know, seven plus two or seven plus one. Now I gotta go, you know, delete this. I gotta go redeploy. I gotta go click this. I gotta go down. I gotta click ever. And then if I have a hundred things that I change, testing all of this is gonna take a really long time. And anytime you do something, anytime us as human beings changes our code in some way, there's a chance that we break something. And remember, these smart contracts are immutable. So if we break something, if we mess something up, that's really bad because that mess up will be permanent on the blockchain. So we want a framework that helps us deploy our smart contracts, test our smart contracts and interact with them in a much more programmatic way rather than we having to manually click around, right? If I change 10 functions and I wanted to test they all work, I would have to go click 10 buttons. That's ridiculous. In Foundry, we can do all of that in one command or one button. So that's why we're going to be using Foundry here. And I'm so excited for you to be using this Foundry tool because like I said, it's the fastest smart contract development framework out there right now. But additionally, it's also the framework of choice for smart contract security engineers and auditors. And I expect more and more projects in the future to be built in Foundry. So incredibly excited for you here. Now for the rest of the course, I'm gonna be using a code editor called Visual Studio Code. This is one of the most powerful code editors on the planet. And if you've already got it set up, feel free to go ahead and skip this part. You'll often hear people refer to this as VS Code or Visual Studio Code or just Visual Studio. However, it's important to note that Visual Studio Code, this is different than Visual Studio, which you might see look like this. So Visual Studio Code is what you want, not Visual Studio. Visual Studio is a different application. Make sure you're on Visual Studio Code. Now, if you choose so, and you're a total hardo, you can absolutely work just with your terminal or just with PowerShell or just with whatever coding environment that you want, like Atom or Sublime. However, for us, we're gonna be working with Visual Studio Code. 
and I'm going to be going through setting up Visual Studio Code the way that I like to set it up. You can absolutely set it up whatever way that you feel comfortable. Now we're going to go through three different installation processes and pick the one that's most appropriate for you. The first one is going to be for Mac and Linux users. The second one is going to be for Windows users. And then our third one is going to be a last ditch effort. If for whatever reason you can't get Windows or Linux or the Mac instructions to work, we're going to use a Git pod installation. Now I highly, highly recommend that you try to get everything working locally without using Git pod. However, if for whatever reason you can't get those installation pieces to work, we will have Git pod instructions for all of the repos that we work with here. But to get started, we'll start with the Mac and Linux installation instructions. The first thing you're going to want to do is download the Mac, or if you're working with Linux, download the Linux installation of Visual Studio Code. Once you have it installed, it'll look a little something like this. And if it's a fresh installation, it'll even give you some tips and tools to actually get started. If you've never worked with Visual Studio Code before, I highly recommend going through any get started or getting instructions tips that come with opening Visual Studio Code. Additionally, we have a Visual Studio Code crash course in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Now, one of the awesome things about Visual Studio Code is it has this thing called terminals, which are command line prompts that allow us to run scripts. Basically, it's where we're going to be running all of our code. The way we can open up the terminal is we can go ahead and hit terminal and select new terminal. And it'll get something like this. Now, you might have bash or ZCH or some other type of shell. The type that you have doesn't really matter because on Mac and Linux, it's going to be Linux based. And like I said, sometimes installing this can be the hardest part of this entire course. So, so don't get discouraged and please use Stack Overflow, Stack Exchange Ethereum and the GitHub repo to move past any issues you run into. Now, if you're on Mac or Linux, you can actually hit control back tick to actually toggle your terminal mode. This will pull the terminal up and down for you. Getting familiar with keyboard shortcuts will actually make your life a lot easier because you'll be able to move around Visual Studio Code much more effectively. We have a link to a list of keyboard shortcuts additionally in the GitHub repository associated with this section. As we move along, I'll give tips on different keyboard shortcuts that you can optionally use. Otherwise, you can just go ahead and click as well. You can click the trash can to delete the terminal, go back up, terminal, new terminal to pop it back up. Now, the next thing that we're going to need a little bit later, we're not going to need it for this section, but it's good to install it now is going to be Git. We will have links to the installation instructions in the GitHub repository. Installing Git on Linux, you're going to use one of these two commands. And on Mac OS, if you just type Git on the command line, it should go ahead and prompt you to install it. So if we're back in our command line and we just type Git, it should prompt you to go ahead and install it. And if you do Git dash dash version, you should get something that looks like this. You can also use a Mac OS Git installer by clicking this link here and running through the installation process. All right, now that you have Git and Visual Studio Code installed, we can continue on to the next section. Awesome. If you're not planning on using Windows or Git pod, feel free to skip the next two sections. And for this Windows setup, we're going to be learning about a tool called WSL. And to introduce that to us, we have my friend Basili, who has done amazing work helping me on some of my past courses, and he's going to be helping us here today. So take it away. This tutorial is going to be useful for any Windows version from Windows 10 and above. Let's get started by installing our code editor, in this case, Visual Studio Code. So let's type VS Code on the browser and hit Enter. Select our version for Windows, select the destination and click Save. And the installation process is going to be the same as any other program. So let's select and accept the agreement, click Next, add code to the path, create a desktop icon, hit Next, and install. This shouldn't take a lot. And this is how the editor is going to look like the first time we install it. We can customize the theme, create shortcuts, and sync with another devices. And if you want to go deep into Visual Studio Code, well, I suggest you to pause the video for a moment and go through all these steps one by one. Now, we could 100% go forward and install the rest of our tools in a Windows environment, but Vasily is actually going to explain to us that the Windows environment isn't really actually the best way and the best place to do our installations. 
Microsoft has definitely increased their support for developers in the recent years, but when it comes to smart contract development, there is a better option to consider, using WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux. Trust me, it's a game changer. You see, smart contract development often involves working with tools and utilities that are commonly found on Unix-based environments. While Windows has come a long way in accommodating developers, there can still be some challenges when it comes to running certain command line tools and setting up the right development environment. Not mentioning that if you want your code to run on any machine using a Unix-based system, Mac and Linux, is better for your developer needs. Here is where WSL shines. By installing a Linux distribution through WSL, you can access to a full-fledged Unix-like console right on your Windows machine. And don't worry, you don't need to be a hacker or wear a hoodie to make it happen. It's actually quite simple. So let's do it. For that, let's open the Windows terminal. This is a pre-installed application on Windows 11. And something you can easily install through the Microsoft Store on Windows 10, just type Terminal, and here you are going to have the Windows 1. So let's install WSL by typing WSL minus minus install. Hit Enter. This is going to trigger us a admin operation, and the installation is going to start. And here we just have to wait until the process finishes. Once the process is done, this will require you to reboot your operating system, so I'll see you on a second. Once rebooted, this is going to automatically open this terminal, and the installation process is going to proceed. Now you have to input a new Unix username, for me it's going to be Chromeware, and then you have to set up your password. Don't worry, the password is always hidden on Linux operating systems. And as easy as that, we already have an operating Linux terminal inside our Windows machine. So we can now close this. Now if we open a new instance on the Windows terminal, we click here on this drop down arrow, we can have now this Ubuntu shell, on which we are going to install all the development requirements we are going to use to run the course. So the next step is to make Visual Studio Code compatible with WSL. So let's do that. Let's go to the extensions tab. Let's search for remote development and install all these extensions. This is going to automatically install the compatibility to connect our Visual Studio Code with WSL. And as you can see over here, I have a new icon called Open a Remote Window. If I click here, I can directly connect to WSL. However, there is an easy way to do this. Let's close. Visual Studio Code, and on the Linux terminal, let's just create a new folder, for example, mkdir solidity course. Let's move to that folder, and now let's open Visual Studio Code inside this folder. Just type code dot, hit enter. This is going to install the latest server for WSL on Visual Studio Code. And once this is done, we are going to have a new instance of Visual Studio Code, but using WSL. Let's just trust the authors. And as you can see here, I'm getting this WSL Ubuntu banner over here, and it's because I already connected this with the Linux instance. So you have two options from now on. You can start using just the Windows Terminal to execute all the things we are going to need, or you can use the integrated terminal, which comes with Visual Studio Code. Just go to Terminal, New Terminal, and now we are going to have a terminal using the exact same WSL instance. So we can start using sudo commands, for example, sudo apt update, and this is going to work properly. Now just take something in consideration. Maybe you are going to develop all your projects on a folder called Development inside your documents on Windows. And you can do so, however, if you Take a look to the Linux terminal with the ls command. As you can see here, you are going to have just access to the local files and folders inside of the WSL instance. And I highly recommend you to do that because of course you can do something like typing the address of your local development folders and use the projects from here, but the communication from 
the WSL console and the local Windows files are actually quite slow, so I prefer just to keep simple and use all the folders inside WSL. Remember that you have to just manage simple commands such as ls to know all the folders on the current directory and cd to navigate through them. Now, if you go back to your VS Code and you hit terminal, new terminal, and open up a terminal, we're going to want to then install Git. We're not going to use Git for this lesson. However, we will definitely be using it in the future. See if Git's installed, type git dash dash version. Sometimes Linux will automatically come with Git installed and you'll see something output like this. However, if you are the ones who decided to keep using PowerShell and just Windows instead of WSL, don't forget to go to the official Git page and install it for Windows. The process is the same as we did before, pretty standard, just the common sequence of clicking next and of course, please do read the license agreement. And now, if you've made it this far, you should be able to follow along with the Mac and Linux instructions as if you're running on a Mac and a Linux, even though you're running on a Windows. Just be sure that whenever you're in your VS Code, you take a look at the bottom left and make sure you're on WSL Ubuntu. Like I said before, if you want to run in PowerShell or in a Windows environment, you're more than free to do so. But like I said, if you've made it this far, huge congratulations. Awesome work. And then finally, our last setup is going to be using a tool called Gitpod. Starting from lesson five, the lesson that we're on right now, Ethers.js Simple Storage, all of our code repos are going to come with a button. In the repo, if you scroll down, they'll come with this open in Gitpod button. Now, Gitpod is a cloud development environment where you can actually run your code on a remote server. It's kind of similar to Remix IDE, but it allows you to run Visual Studio Code in the browser or connected to another server. This is good because then you don't have to do any installation on anything since all the tools that you can want to use are just going to be running on this remote server. This has its downsides though, obviously, since you'll only be able to code if Gitpod is up and working for you. Additionally, when it comes to private keys, you absolutely do not want to run any code with a private key that has real money in it on Gitpod. Why? Well, once again, since you're running your scripts on a remote server, those servers have access to your private keys. But since you've pinky promised that you, for this course, you're not going to be using a MetaMask or a private key with actual money in it, it should be fine. The other downside is that these often cost money to use and Gitpod isn't free, but it's an option if you absolutely cannot get any of the installation working. So if you go ahead and you hit this opening Gitpod button, You'll get a welcome to Gitpod showing up. Uh, we're going to go ahead and continue with GitHub since you've signed up for GitHub here. You want to go ahead and authorize Gitpod. And it'll go ahead and start creating this workspace for you. And you'll notice it looks exactly like Visual Studio Code. Since I opened the repo up in Gitpod, it came with all the code. And you can even open this workspace up in VS Code Desktop. So this is might be a little bit confusing, but basically you can run off of Gitpod using your local Visual Studio code. And if you see Gitpod here, that's how you know that you're running off of Gitpod. If you see this pop up, do you want to open this workspace in VS Code Desktop? You can hit open and it'll ask you if you want to open up Visual Studio code, which I'm going to go ahead and hit yes. And you'll get something that looks like this on your Visual Studio code. It'll tell you that it wants to install the Gitpod extension and then open that Gitpod URL. So you can go ahead and install it, reload window and open, and it's gonna go ahead and start connecting to our, the Gitpod workspace. And this is gonna be the same as running Gitpod in the browser here. Or you can also do it manually by hitting the Gitpod in the bottom left, and then type in open in VS Code. And then you should be able to run it in your Visual Studio Code. For now, I'm going to recommend that if you're using Gitpod, just stay in the browser just so that you know, okay, I am running this on a remote server. And just as a reminder for you that you're not actually locally developing. And hopefully this will be a trigger to not actually put any special private keys or anything like that. But you can make workspaces, you can make new folders, and you should be able to run 
all the commands on here as if you were running locally with Visual Studio Code. So open up the terminal, you can hit this little bar in the top left, go to terminal, new terminal, or use control tilde, exact same as Mac OS and Linux keyboard shortcuts. To create a new folder, we can change directory, cd dot dot, mkdir, new folder, mkdir makes make directory called new folder. And then we're going to change our directory into new folder and hit enter. And now we're in that new folder. For each section, you can either open up the entire source code right into Gitpod, or you can create a new folder for each section yourself and start from blank. And then you would just type code period, and you'd be in a brand new folder. And if you're using Windows, this should say WSL or Ubuntu or something like that. And if you have all that, that means we're ready to go. Now, a quick note, something that you'll see me do a lot, and you can do this as well. Oftentimes, when my terminal gets really, really big, or there's a ton of commands in here, it gets a little bit overwhelming for me. So one thing that you can do is you can type clear and hit enter to clear it. Or what you can do is you can hit command K if you're on a Mac or control K if you're on a Linux or a Windows. And it's one of my favorite keyboard shortcuts that I use all the time. Additionally, the trash can and the X here are very different. If I go do a couple of enters here and we're down here, if I hit the X here and then pull my terminal back up by doing the toggle or by doing terminal new terminal, you'll see all those lines are still here. But if I hit the trash can and then pull the terminal back up, you'll, you'll see it actually refreshes. Mine has a special command that prints stuff out. Trashing your terminal is basically deleting whatever's running in it and the X is just hiding it. And it's hitting control tilde or toggling our terminal or whatever command it is on your environment that's equivalent to hitting the hide, not the trash. So if we want to remove and start a terminal over, we hit the trash can and then we pull it back up. So after we have that set up, the next thing that we're going to want to install is actually Foundry itself. In the Foundry book, you can find this in the installation tab or you can go to getfoundry.sh and it'll have this command that you can actually just go ahead and copy. Windows users, we're gonna teach you how to do it the Linux or Mac OS way, so just stay tuned. So we're gonna go ahead and copy this and run this command. Again, we can go terminal, new terminal, and there are also some shortcuts to do this. We're just gonna go ahead and paste this in here and hit enter. You will need internet access for this to work because it's actually downloading Foundry from this website. Now let me just move this up, zoom in a little bit here. And you'll see me do this a lot. In the terminal, I'll type clear a lot to remove anything that's been coded or output in our terminal here, or you'll also see me do command K like that, which clears the screen. When I'm typing in the terminal, you'll see me hit control W a lot, which actually removes the most recent block of code you've written. You'll also see me do control U, which deletes the entire line. So I'm gonna use command C for copy and command V for paste a lot. For those of you on Windows and Linux, it might be control C and control V. And if you're unfamiliar, you can Google the keyboard shortcuts for, co for copying and pasting for Windows or Linux. If you're on a Windows, these keyboard shortcuts might be a little bit different. We've got a list of keyboard shortcuts in the Git repo associated with this course. But if you've just run that curl command, you'll see an output at the bottom down here that says something like detected your preferred shell is whatever your shell is here and added Foundry up to path. Run source or simply start a new terminal session to use Foundry up. And once you run that, we can go ahead and run Foundry up and this will actually install and update Foundry to the latest version. Now, whenever we want to install and update Foundry, we can just run Foundry up like this. It'll automatically install everything. And Foundry comes with four components, Forge, Cast, Anvil, and Chisel. We'll know we've installed these right if we run Forge dash dash version, and we'll see an output that looks something like this. Now, something important to note, if you hit this trash can in the top right, this actually kills the terminal. It's different from the X, which is just close the panel. If we close the panel and then we reopen our terminal by hitting terminal, new terminal like this. This actually creates a new terminal, which we can kill like this, but our old terminal is still up. In order to actually delete this terminal, we have to hit the trash can. Now you wanna try this out now. Delete your terminal like we just did, open up a new terminal and run Foundry up. 
if this doesn't run, we might have an issue with your path and you might need to add Foundry to your path. If this is an issue that you have, please make a discussion on the GitHub repo associated with this course or check. Please first check this lesson six of the GitHub repo associated with this course and we'll add some debugging tips to make sure that that does indeed happen. Or if there is no debugging tips here, make a discussion on the course. But first, be sure to check to see if that discussion already exists. And you should be able to do forge dash dash version. However, what can happen is if you trash can the terminal and open up a new terminal, if you run forge dash dash version now, it might say forge command not found. This means that you have to rerun this command, this source command that Foundry told us to do. If you're working with bash, most of the time this bash RC file automatically gets loaded, but sometimes it actually won't depending on what your setup is. If this happens for you, another thing that you can do is you can type CD and go to your home directory and type this line, echo source, and then whatever Foundry up told you to do, double caret dot bash profile and hit enter. For example, when we just ran Foundry up right here, it gave us this command here, the source users patrick.bashrc. That's what we would want to echo. However, this will change depending on your terminal setup. So look to the GitHub repository for the command that you should be using for your setup. Please make a discussion thread if one does not already exist. What this will do is it'll add this command to the end of your bash profile. Make sure you do double like this, otherwise you could override whatever's currently in your bash profile. Now I'm gonna give you a command that if you screw up, you could accidentally override some stuff. If you've never used bash profile before, you kind of don't have to worry about it though. The other command you can run is something like this. If you do get an issue, we can just ask an AI something like, how do I get my dash bash RC to load by default? And there's a couple of different ways for this, depending on what system you're using and what you're working with. All I'm gonna say though is, if this happens to you, if you run forge dash dash version, and instead of getting an output, you get something like command not found, ask an AI, or come into the discussions of the channel, and as people run into this, we'll build and start a discussion, and if enough people have issues, we'll create a new file here to help people debug that issue. So, but it looks like ChatGPT does give a pretty good output of what we can do. We can edit our bash RC, our bash profile, our profile, et cetera, and work with it like that. So if you run into that issue, there's plenty of things we can do to fix it. Don't worry. But if you're a little nervous, feel free to use the discussions channel of the course. Got it? Okay, great. If you see an output like this, you've done it right. If you see an output like, we don't know what you're doing, you've done it wrong. <laughs> All right, great. And again, installing these can be some of the hardest parts of this course. So don't get discouraged if this doesn't work right away. If it worked right away for you, that's actually amazing. Now also the control backtick shortcut toggles the terminal visibility between up and down. I also have command J as a toggle for panel visibility as well. This is a key binding that you'll see me use pretty often because we often will flip back and forth between the terminal and our code, which is gonna be up here. In fact, if we click this explore button on the left, we can select this area, select new file, do something like hello.txt, or better yet, hello.soul, and we can add some code in here. What's important to know is if you see this white dot in the top section here, this means that this file isn't saved. Command S or Control S, depending on if you're on a Windows or Mac or Linux, will save it and make that white dot go away. Unsaved, saved, unsaved, saved. It's important to recognize if a file is saved or not, because if it's not saved, it might not do what you think it should do. So I kind of by default will always automatically save by hitting Command S, and it's a good practice to get into. Just always auto save everything you do. We can also delete this file we just created by right clicking it and selecting delete, move to trash. Final thing that we want to install, and we'll install a lot of these as we go along, is actually an AI extension something in VS Code to help us actually have AI inside of our Visual Studio Code. If you select this little box looking thing that says extensions, you get a search box which allows you to search for extensions. The AI that I work with the most is GitHub Copilot, but you can use whatever AI you want, or you could just not even use an AI. 
GitHub Copilot does cost money to use, so feel free to also not use it. There's some other free VS Code extensions that use AI, so feel free to browse around and choose which one you like. For me, I'm gonna go ahead and install GitHub Copilot. You'll get a little guy in the bottom right for your VS Code that will let you know that you've done it correctly. You'll need to sign into GitHub, which is something that we've recently made, in order for it to work. Now, you'll see me using GitHub Copilot pretty often when I write my code. Because I have this little doodad on down here, I can start writing some code and GitHub Copilot will start giving me suggestions as to what I should write. For example, if I were to add SPDX Li Sense Identifier, GitHub Copilot actually automatically starts to gray out and give me a suggestion. If I hit tab, I can auto-complete my code with GitHub Copilot suggestion. Alternatively, what I could do, then for example, I could keep coding and I can see it's already giving me a suggestion here. And if I hit up key enter, I'll actually open up this bit on the side where GitHub Copilot will give me a ton of different solutions on what it thinks I'm trying to write. And I can just pick one of these solutions. Obviously some of these aren't doing anything. We'll learn about the command palette soon. And we can also use any of the GitHub Copilot commands that come with the command palette. An alternate to VS Code is a tool called VS Codium. So VS Code is a tool that's owned by Microsoft and it sends up telemetry data up to Microsoft. So basically it can send data about ways to make your experience better with VS Code. For people who have a more security mindset, this is an open sourced version of VS Code that I highly recommend you check it out. Another extension that you might wanna add is GitHub Copilot Labs. GitHub Copilot Labs has AI features that are experimental, so it might be worth installing as well. All right, fantastic. At this point, you should be 100% set up with Visual Studio Code and Git. If you're using Gitpod, that's great as well. And if you're using Windows, you should be 100% using WSL because the rest of the commands are only gonna work if you're using WSL and we're only gonna be working with Linux, Bash, or ZSH commands moving forward. If you want to be a hardo, like I was saying, do everything in PowerShell, that's great too. Moving forward, what I want you guys all to do is open up your terminal, the different ways I showed you, and create a folder by typing in mkdir foundry hyphen f23. And then you do cd foundry f23. You'll notice something else I do a lot is I'll type the first couple letters of the folder I wanna go into, and then I'll hit tab, which will auto-complete a lot of stuff for you in the terminal. Sometimes it doesn't work, you'll get better at figuring out what auto-completes and what doesn't. If I hit enter, this means I'm now inside of my Foundry F23 folder, and I can run commands inside of this folder. Moving forward, I want you to put all of your repositories inside this folder. This way, moving forward in the future, when you start actually working on projects in real life, you can refer back to this folder and refer back to code that you wrote and refer back to your notes to make sure that you understand stuff moving forward. Originally, I had set up this F23 to stand for this is the Foundry 2023 edition. However, we've gone back and we've updated everything and we decided to just keep the F23 so that we don't have to change all the links. So so now the F23 just kind of doesn't mean anything. So you can, you can ignore that F23 moving forward. We've got git dash dash version, forge dash dash version. We have cast dash dash version, which cast came with forge and Foundry. We have anvil dash dash version. And we also have chisel dash dash version. I'm gonna type clear or hit command K to clear everything in the terminal. And all right, now that we have everything set up, let's go ahead and start creating our simple storage project in a professional environment. This is going to be the exact same environment that the big protocols use. These are the environments that Uniswap, Aave, Curve, et cetera, these billion dollar groups use. You are learning the exact same tools as them. Additionally, for those of you who are interested in security and auditing, Foundry is the most popular tool amongst auditors. So for those of you who wanna become security researchers, you're gonna learn the exact same tools that the best of the best use. You ready? I sure am. So let's go ahead and create a new folder inside of this folder here. To do this, we're gonna type mkdir, Foundry, simple storage, F23. And then we're gonna CD into Foundry, simple storage, F23. And you'll notice I hit tab there to autocomplete again. Now everyone's terminals are gonna look a little bit differently. Mine tells me the exact path of the folder that I'm in. 
but I have a alias called video shell, which just shows me the current folder that I'm in. And I'm going to use that for the rest of the video. So if you see my terminal look like this, it means I'm at this location. Now, if you're inside of this folder, you can actually type in code and then hit a period. And then you should get a new Visual Studio code, which is now defaulted to that folder. If you don't, you can also hit file, open folder, and select the folder that you want to open, which will also open up a new Visual Studio code inside of that folder. If you open up your terminal now, you'll see that we are indeed in the folder for this project. And now on the left hand side over here, this explore piece, if we create a file, you'll see it pop up in the left hand side of our Explorer. Touch is a command to create or touch a file. And we can go ahead and click it and type stuff in this file. Now, all these CD and MKDIR and all these commands are known as bash or ZSH or like Linux terminal commands. And we're going to be using them a lot throughout this course. If you want, it's a great lesson on working with bash and CCH and Linux commands on the Free Code Camp YouTube. But at the same time, most of the time, ChatGPT and most AIs are actually very well versed in bash and Linux commands. So anytime you have a problem doing something, you can often just ask one of these AIs and it can help you out. As of recording, this one just came out a couple of weeks ago, so it's incredibly up to date. So if you want to get the basics down, it's only about 45 minutes long. I definitely recommend watching this so you can at least be familiar with some of the power that Bash has. You can absolutely continue on with the course as is and just use AI to augment you. But for those of you who want to get more knowledge, definitely check that out. And again, the reason I have this dash F23 is to let everyone know that this is associated with the Foundry 2023 course. But awesome, we can actually begin getting set up with our own local environments, similar to that Remix VM that we saw when we were working with Remix. We can work with our own local blockchain and do a bunch of stuff locally. As you can tell by the name of this project and from what I was saying earlier, this is gonna be our simple storage project, but coded with Foundry, which again is a smart contract development framework that's gonna make our deployments and interactions with our code much more professional. To get started with Foundry, what we can do is we can open up our Explorer to see what's in here. Let's go ahead and delete hi.txt, move to trash. I'm going to do my video shell command here, which won't work for you, but it works for me. What we're going to do is we're going to run a command to create a new Foundry basic project for us. And if you go through the Foundry documentation, this is going to be basically this creating a new project section of the documentation. And if you want to follow along with the documentation, you can do that as well. But to do this, we're just going to run forge init like this. And we'll see it created a ton of folders over on the left hand side for us. If you run into an error because you accidentally have some files in here, for example, if I run forge init right now, it's going to say, oh, it's not an empty directory. What we can do is type forge init dash dash force period to say, let's do it in this directory, hit enter. And it's actually going to give us an error because it's going to go, hey, it already has everything that I was going to do. So it's just, it's just not going to do anything. But if you have files in here already, you just add this dash dash force piece. Now, if you get a different error about Git, Vasily is actually going to help us triage that. So take it away. And we are getting this error. And this is pretty common. Don't worry. The reason is because even though Git comes pre-installed on our WSL install, we still have to configure our username and our email. So we can just use these commands, change this one, my actual email. And now let's also configure the username. After we have these configurations, we can run that command again, forge init hello foundry. And if we check this out, we have our first foundry project ready to be used with all the things we are going to need. And let's walk through what we have over on the left hand side here. So we have this dot github slash workflows file, which we're going to ignore for now, but we'll explain this later. We have lib, which we're also going to ignore for now, but we'll explain later. We have script with a file in here, which for now we're going to go ahead and delete. We have SRC, which is where we're going to put all of our smart contracts that we want to deploy. Right now it comes packed with this counter.soul, which we're also going to delete, move to trash. And then we also have tests, which we haven't learned about yet, but we will. And for now, once again, you guessed it, we're going to go ahead and right click and delete source is going to be the main section that we're going to be working with. SRC stands for source. And you'll see in a lot of projects, this is where they put all of their main contracts. Test is where we're going to put code to test what's in SRC. 
and script is where we're going to put code to interact with our contracts that are in SRC. Git ignore is going to be files that we're not going to push up to GitHub if we push our code to GitHub, which is going to be really important. Git modules, we can ignore for now. I'll teach you about that later. And founder.toml is a file that is going to give us configuration parameters about working with Foundry. And as we go along in this course, we're going to update this folder because we're going to update how we're going to work with Foundry. Now, for us to get started here, we're going to add our simple storage code into the SRC or source folder. If you close your Remix, we can just come on back to the repo associated with this course. We'll scroll down to the Remix simple storage, select the code base, and we'll go in here and just copy all the code in here. Come back over to VS Code. And in SRC, we'll right click, new folder, simple storage.sol, paste it in here, and hit save. Hello, my name is Vasily, and I'm going to be your instructor for everything related to development on Windows. We are going to see each other a lot because each time a new tool is introduced to any of the courses, you're going to see me there teaching you how to install, run, and configure that specific tool on Windows. Installing developer dependencies on Windows is a little bit tricky and sometimes really messy. That's why we are going to install a tool called WSL or the Windows subsystem for Linux. On the upcoming videos, I'm going to be really straightforward on how to install the tools we are going to use for the rest of the lessons. However, if you want to actually understand what WSL is, how it works, the basic command line tools, and a lot more, please be sure to check our 100% free crash course about WSL for smart contract developers we published on YouTube. With that said, let's get that Windows environment ready for development. Microsoft has definitely increased their support for developers in the recent years, but when it comes to smart contract development, there is a better option to consider, using WSL, the Windows subsystem for Linux. Trust me, it's a game changer. You see, smart contract development often involves working with tools and utilities that are commonly found on Unix-based environments. While Windows has come a long way in accommodating developers, there can still be some challenges when it comes to running certain command line tools and setting up the right development environment. Not mentioning that if you want your code to run on any machine using a Unix-based system, Mac and Linux, is better for your developer needs. Here is where WSL shines. By installing a Linux distribution through WSL, you gain access to a full-fledged Unix-like console right on your Windows machine. And don't worry, you don't need to be a hacker or wear a hoodie to make it happen. It's actually quite simple. So let's do it. Let's get started with the installation process. First, we need to install WSL using the Windows Terminal. In Windows 11, you can just hit the Windows key and type Terminal, hit Enter, and this will open the Windows Terminal for you, which defaults to PowerShell. However, if you are using Windows 10, you are going to need to install the Windows Terminal through the Microsoft Store. So you can open the Microsoft Store, look for Windows Terminal, and please be sure to select the one from Microsoft Corporation. Once you have it, please open it, and installing WSL is going to be a really straightforward process. And on the terminal, we are just going to type WSL dash dash install. This is going to trigger some admin level operations, as you are going to see on the screen right now. You just select yes, hit enter, and once the installation process is finished, this will require you to restart your computer. Once you reboot your computer, this is going to automatically trigger this window to continue the installation. So let me actually make this big for you to see. And the first thing we need to do here is to select our Unix username. I'm going to select Chromeware, hit enter, and then we are going to be required to set up a new password. Something interesting on most of Linux operating systems slash distros is that when you are using the terminal, if you type anything over here, the password is going to remain hidden. That doesn't mean that you are not typing anything, but the terminal is not going to show anything over here. Unless you use another Linux distro, for example, Linux Mint, otherwise 
most of the Linux operating systems are going to keep this always hidden. I'm going to type my password though, and then hit enter. And as you can see here, the terminal recognizes that password and ask me to type it again for confirmation. And once we finish this, that's it. We have WCL installed on our machine. As you can see here, the installation finished properly and we can continue. I'm going to actually close this for now. There are plenty of ways to install Visual Studio Code and I'm going to show you three of those ways on this video. The first one is going to be using the terminal. As we are going to spend a lot of time using the Windows terminal anyways, we can install it with the hacker slash programmer way. For that, we are going to use Winget, which is a package manager pre-installed on Windows 11 for installing software. You can also get Winget on Windows going directly to the documentation. So for example, if I want to install Visual Studio Code using Winget, I just use Winget search VS Code. This is going to show me all the available packages to install Visual Studio Code. So for installing Visual Studio Code using this is going to be really easy. I'm just going to copy this and say winget install and the package name I just selected. If I hit enter, this is going to start the installation of Visual Studio Code on my machine. As you can see, this is opening the installation for me. And that's it. This is how you install our code editor from the terminal. And if I go to the main menu, I already have Visual Studio here installed. The second way to install Visual Studio Code is open your favorite web browser. On the search bar, look for Visual Studio Code. Select the one from code.visualstudio.com. This is the official Microsoft one. You can click on download for Windows. This is going to automatically trigger the download and open it. This is going to start the installation process. And of course we have the user and license agreement. Mostly no one cares about this stuff and no one reads it, but I highly recommend you to spend a little bit doing so as a good practice. I'm going to accept the agreement, hit next. This is going to give us the path and the installation is almost the same as we did on the terminal way. But in this case is going to allow us to have more things like this at open with code action to Windows Explorer file context menu. This will allow us to do a right click here and have the ability to open any folder using Visual Studio Code. I'm going to also create a desktop icon. Hit next and install. On the meantime, this is installing. I'm going to mention that if you are concerned about Microsoft having that much control over the data because they own Visual Studio Code, they own GitHub, they own a lot more of tools, and you want an open source version of Visual Studio Code, that will lead us to the third way, which is VS Codium. VS Codium is an alternative to Visual Studio Code, which is exactly the same, but without Microsoft Telemetry Gallery logo and etc. So basically they take the basic Visual Studio Code build, remove all the Microsoft stuff from it and change the license to the MIT license. So basically if you are concerned about your privacy or Microsoft having access to your data, VS Codium is a really nice alternative. The installation is exactly the same. You hit on install, you download the latest release. This is going to lead you to GitHub and select the one for Windows. In this case, is going to be the one marked as VS Codium User Setup.exe. You hit this, this is going to trigger the download, and you're going to have the package to be installed over here. If you open it, this is going to allow you to install VS Codium. But as this is not signed by Microsoft, Microsoft is going to prevent to run this. You click on more info and run anyway. This is going to open the installation and the process is going to be almost the same because at the core, they are the same code editor. And this is how you can install Visual Studio Code in three different ways. Select the one you like for this tutorial and for the rest of the course. I'm going to keep from the one coming directly from Microsoft Visual Studio Code.
Now, one of the first things that you'll notice is this is formatted horribly. It's just all white text. This cute little ETH logo comes up, which is really nice, but we want a way to actually format this code correctly. So there are a lot of different VS Code extensions that actually will format our Solidity code for us. One of them is the Solidity. If we, if we simply type Solidity in the extensions bar, we'll get a whole bunch of options that we can use. I'm a big fan of the Hardhat Solidity extension. Even though Hardhat is another framework, it also can format our code in Foundry. Another one that a lot of people like is the Solidity Visual Developer. So that's another option if you wanna use that one. And this one by Juan Blanco is probably the most used on the planet. But we're gonna go ahead and hit install to install this Nomic Foundation Solidity VS Code extension. And if we go back to our simplestorage.sol, you'll see it is now formatted with syntax highlighting similar to what we saw in Remix. If it doesn't automatically highlight for you here, what we can do is hit Command Shift P or Control Shift P, which opens up our command bar here, and we can type in settings, and we wanna open our user settings in JSON. You can also hit code and then settings as well. In here, and a lot of you might have nothing in here, so what you can do is you create these little brackets to say, hey, whatever is in here is gonna be our new settings, and we wanna type these little quotes, these little brackets, and say solidity, like this. Little set, little colon here, some more brackets. And since I'm using GitHub Copilot, it's even starting to give me suggestions, which I'll explain much later. But we could do editor dot, but you could paste in this editor dot default formatter, nomic foundation dot hardhead solidity. I'll have this code in the repo associated with this course, so you can just copy paste this if you want to. I've got a whole bunch of other stuff in here, so I'm gonna go ahead and delete this though. But that way your Solidity code will default format using that hardhead extension that we just installed. Great. Additionally, this foundry.toml file also isn't formatted very well. So we'll go to extensions, we'll type in toml, and we'll install this better toml here. We'll close this. Now, if we go to foundry.toml, we'll see this is now highlighted very nicely too. Great. Now just remember, Whenever you see this little dot here, this means that it's not saved. So hit Command S or File Save and do that a lot. The other thing that's really good about us adding that default formatter is in our code here, you know, maybe this isn't formatted very nicely, right? Maybe we, we've got this over here and, and this over here and it's kind of not looking very nice here. If I go ahead and save without formatting, it'll save it here. But what we can do is if we add that auto formatter, now, if we do Command Shift P, again, that brings this up, this command palette up. You can also get it by hitting View Command Palette, and we type Format Document. It'll format our code automatically depending on what formatter we're defaulting to. Since we opened our JSON and we defaulted to the Solidity hardhat, it'll automatically format with that. If your code isn't auto formatting, that's okay. Don't worry about this too much. Be sure to use AI, a web search, and the forums to get your formatting good. The other thing that I like to do is we'll go over to settings again. We're not gonna go to the JSON. We're gonna open the user settings and we're gonna type in format on save and we'll check this box on. This way, every time we save, it'll automatically format. So if I have this and I hit save, it'll automatically format my Solidity code for me. If I don't want it to format, again, we open the command palette with command shift P or view command palette and we can say save without formatting and it'll save it see the white dot is gone and it will not be formatted but i'm going to save and reformat it because i like it formatted and just to note we pretty much never want to open these default settings jason so avoid that one all right great and just with this little pieces of code and foundry installed we can go ahead and compile our simple storage.soul right in our terminal. So what we can do is we pull up our terminal and we can type in forge build or forge compile. And this will compile our code like so. Once we compile, we see a couple new folders show up. One of them is out. And this file in out has all the different information that the Remix compiler would have. For example, it has the ABI. If we go back to Remix, we go to the compiler tab, we go to one of our contracts, we scroll down, we can see we have the ABI section, or it's also in the compilation details. In VS Code, we can even click this little drop-down thing next to it, 
and it'll minimize the ABI. And we can see the rest of this stuff, like bytecode, method identifiers, and all this other stuff, which we'll learn about later. We also get this cache folder. This is a folder that you would basically ignore. Now, anytime in our terminal we hit up, we can actually cycle through commands that we've recently run. So if I run some crazy long command like this echo here, which is a bash command, don't worry about it, and I want to run it again, I can just hit up. All right, great. So one of the things that we did in Remix quite a lot was we deployed our code to a Remix VM or a JavaScript virtual environment. We want to be able to do the exact same thing in Foundry in order to test and interact with our contracts. Foundry actually comes built in with a virtual environment in the shell. And if you run Anvil, you'll get an output that looks, and we pull this to the top, you'll get an output that looks something like this. Anvil, and we get some fake available accounts with some fake private keys. You'll also get a wallet mnemonic, the derivation path, which you can ignore, some details about the blockchain, and then this endpoint or RPC URL, which we're going to learn about soon. For now, if you want to close this, hit Control C or just delete your terminal to end running the Anvil blockchain. Now, moving forward, we're going to work with Anvil, but I do want to give you an intermediary step, and that's going to be with the Ganache ETH chain. And we'll have a link to this in the GitHub repo associated with this lesson. Now, and I want to give you a heads up. So Ganache is part of this suite of tools called the Truffle Suite tool set. And the Truffle Suite is actually being sunset. It's being deprecated. So in this video, I'm still going to be showing you some Ganache stuff. However, you do not need to download it. You do not need to do any of the Ganache stuff that I'm going to show you here. I'm going to go ahead and show you Ganache. However, pretty soon we're just going to do everything with Anvil anyways. So feel free to just watch, follow along, and then we'll actually replicate the exact same things using Anvil. So this is one of those times where you can just sit back and enjoy the ride. Don't do any of the Ganache stuff here. Just go ahead and watch me. But when we get to the Anvil section, we definitely want you to do the Anvil stuff. So great. Ganache is a one click blockchain and it gives us a user interface or an app for us to look at our transactions in an easier way. So if you go ahead and download it for your system, we can get started there. Now, a note for Windows users, if you're using WSL, the setup here is a little funky. We ran into some issues with it in our previous course, and we'll have some troubleshooting tips for those of you who are using Windows and WSL, if you wanna work with Ganache. And everything that we're gonna be doing moving forward though, does work with Anvil. Ganache just allows us to see transactions a little bit better than viewing all this stuff in the terminal. So if you're having a hard time with Ganache, don't worry, we can do everything that we're doing with Anvil, which should work for you, no problem. Once you have Ganache installed, when you open it up, it'll look something like this. And if we hit Quick Start for Ethereum, we'll actually create a brand new locally running blockchain with a nice little UI to view things. Same as Anvil and same as Remix, we get some addresses, we get each of them has balances, they come with some dummy private keys and dummy addresses and the likes. What's nice about this is that we can see the blocks, we can see different transactions, and if we're working with Truffle, we can see contracts. We're not gonna work with Truffle though, but these are gonna be very helpful for us to view stuff. Additionally, we're not gonna use Ganache again in the future, so if you have trouble setting up with it, don't worry, just use Anvil. I'm gonna use it to show you what's going on. Remember though, don't use these private keys on a public blockchain. It's for development purposes only because everyone knows these private keys because they're dummy private keys. Now, in order for us to learn how to actually deploy to this blockchain or how to deploy to Anvil, if we're working with Anvil, we need to understand how even Remix was able to deploy to a public blockchain. When in Remix, when we switch to injected provider MetaMask, we know that MetaMask popped up, it asked us to add our password and we went ahead and got connected. And if we looked in MetaMask, we saw our account is indeed connected to Sepolio. When we hit deploy, our MetaMask popped up again and it was able to deploy our contract to a real test network. Well, how did it know where to send our transaction? How did it know where to send our contract? Well, let's go ahead and open up our MetaMask here. If we click the three little dots and hit expand view, we hit the little button now and we go to settings and we go to networks, you'll actually see in here that 
each one of these networks, Ethereum mainnet, Gorilla, Sepolia, Linea, or whatever you have, comes with a whole bunch of information. Let's go to ETH mainnet and check that out for a second. It has a name, an RPC URL, a chain ID, currency symbol, and block explorer. This RPC URL is the actual HTTPS endpoint that we actually send API calls to when we're sending transactions. So whenever you interact with MetaMask and you send a transaction or you deploy a contract, you're actually making an API call to whatever is in here. You'll see this is an Infura endpoint. And Infura is known as a node as a service project that allows you to send transactions to a blockchain node without having to run one yourself. If you wanted to send transactions to your own blockchain node, you would just swap this out with your own blockchain node address. We can't actually change the ones that come built into MetaMask, but we can add new networks, which is what we're gonna do now. In here, if we scroll to the bottom, we can hit add network manually, and we can add information about our own custom network. So for us, we're gonna make this new network called localhost or local chain or whatever you wanna call it. For RPC URL, if you're working with Ganache, it's gonna be this RPC server right here. If you're working with Anvil, at the bottom, we have this listening here. So what we would do is we would copy this or we would copy this from Ganache and paste it in here. Just note that you always need the HTTP or HTTPS colon slash slash. Most of our local applications aren't gonna be HTTPS, they're just gonna be HTTP. So if we're working with Ganache, let's go ahead and copy the Ganache endpoint, paste it in here like so. Every single blockchain gets their own chain ID. It's an easy way for us to know which blockchain that we're interacting with. Ganache has 1337, and Anvil doesn't say it, but it's 31337. So Anvil is 31337. Since I'm using the Ganache endpoint here, I'm gonna type in 1337. If you're using Anvil, it would be 31337. But what's kind of nice is MetaMask can actually identify what you're using and identify the chain ID and basically tell you what chain ID to use. Just to note, it looks like the newer versions of Ganache are using a different RPC server and a different network ID. And make sure you're on this hard for the merge here as well. Although in practice, I've found that even when you have 5777, it still is expecting 1377. So be sure to use the correct chain ID when you're working with this. Currency symbol, we're gonna do ETH. And since this is a local blockchain, we don't actually have a block explorer. Etherscan has no way to connect to our own local blockchain. So we don't get a block explorer for this one. But if I go ahead and hit save now, it says network added successfully, and I can go ahead and switch to my local host chain. Boom, and now we can see it in my list of networks. Of local host, I've got no assets, no NFTs, and no activity. Now, if your local Anvil or Ganache chain isn't running after you've put it in your MetaMask, if you actually try to swap to your Anvil or to your local host or to your Ganache, you'll just get this spinning wheel of death here, right? And eventually you'll get this little X that'll show up and you'll have to switch to a different network. So if you ever wanna to switch to one of these that isn't running, it won't work. You'll have to either run it or you can hit X here and then in your MetaMask, you could just delete one of these right here. While we're not running our Ganache or our Anvil, we're just not gonna have one of these selected. Great. And so this is where on both Anvil and Ganache, they have these available accounts and these private keys. Since I'm using Ganache, what I can do is I can select this show keys, copy this private key and import it into my MetaMask. So I can go up, hit this little button. I can hit import account, paste my private key in here and hit import. Now you'll see in my MetaMask, I have a couple different accounts. Account three, the one I just imported, has 100 ETH. Why does it have 100 ETH? Well, because I'm using one of these dummy accounts from Ganache. And again, if you're using Anvil, they, have, they start with 1,000 ETH. This process that we just did to add our new Ganache local chain is also how we're gonna add any EVM compatible chain on the planet. We'll just hit add network and MetaMask actually comes built in with a lot of these. And for example, if we wanted to work with Arbitrum 1, we could just hit add and it would add all this information in for us. Approve. Network added successfully. But if MetaMask doesn't have those built in, that's the process. Now, if we go back to settings, network, localhost, this endpoint is the most important thing you need to send a transaction to a blockchain. You need a connection to a node in order to send transactions to. If you wanted to send transactions to your own node, you would 
run something like Geth, which is an execution client, and then something maybe like Teku or Prism, which is a consensus client, and send transactions there. I'm not going to go over this right now, but I highly recommend that those of you who are curious, maybe you take some time and you try to run your own Ethereum node. I run many Ethereum nodes and it's a lot of fun. That's kind of a weird thing to say. It's fun to run nodes, whatever. It is fun to run nodes. Each one of these blockchains has different methods you could send to them to do things. If you're familiar with APIs and HTTP endpoints and you go to this Ethereum JSON RPC specification site, you can actually see all the different methods that Ethereum blockchain nodes can make and most EVM blockchain nodes can make. And when we actually sign and send transactions, it's these calls that we're actually making, like ETH sign, sign transaction, send transaction, send raw transaction, etc. We're actually not going to be going over interacting with these because Forge actually handles a lot of sending these transactions itself. If you want to learn how to send a raw transaction, making raw API calls to your own Ethereum node or an Ethereum node as a service like Infura or Alchemy, you would do that in a different programming language like Bash, Python, or JavaScript. All right, awesome. Now that we have our endpoint and our private key, we pretty much have everything that we need to deploy to our own local blockchain, be it Ganache or Anvil. Same as working with a real blockchain, we need an actual balance to spend gas to deploy our contract. Now, there's actually two ways that we're going to learn to deploy contracts. And the first way is actually with just working with the command line. If we're in our command line, if we're in our terminal here and we do forge dash dash help, we can actually see all the different commands that forge comes built in with. The one we're going to be working with right now is this create command. And if you read it, it says it deploys a smart contract, which is perfect. That's exactly what we want to do. And if we're in our command here, let's hit clear and we do forge create dash dash help. We can see a ton of different options for deploying our contract. Click show keys, copy the private key. Again, if you're using Anvil, use the private keys there. If we do forge create simple storage, which is the name of our contract, it'll compile and then it'll throw an error actually, or it might actually work. But because I'm working with this RPC server, but this RPC server is different from the one that Forge actually defaults to. So instead, what I can do is Forge create simple storage dash dash RPC dash URL. Copy this, paste it in here. It might be upset with the uppercase. So let's just make that lowercase and I'll hit enter and this won't work either. Well, of course, we forgot to add a private key. So if I hit up, I can hit dash dash interactive as well. And now it'll prompt me for a private key. Now, and a really important note that I want to tell you, never use a real private key in your VS code if you're using an application that potentially will send your information. A much better option is to use your own terminal as opposed to something like VS code, which might send data or Gitpod. Since we are just developing and we're just practicing, it's fine to paste our private keys here because this is a private key that's not going to have any real money, right? It's a fake private key. So for now, we can go ahead, we can go back to our ganache or back to our anvil, hit show keys, copy this private key, paste it in here. It won't show up if you hit paste, but I'll hit enter and we'll go ahead and see information about our transaction. Now, if you're working with ganache, we can now hit done here. If we go to blocks, we see we created a new block. We go to transactions, we can see that we sent a transaction and we created a contract. And then you can see logs about working with this as well. Fantastic. If you're working with Anvil and you send a transaction, you're not going to see any of those details. For those of you who want to continue to see these blocks and these transactions and want to keep working with Ganache, feel free to do so. <clears throat> Moving forward, we're going to work with Anvil. So I'm actually going to close Ganache now. I'm going to hit clear in the terminal and I'm going to run Anvil here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new terminal by hitting the plus button here. And we're going to run that command again, but we're going to run it with a private key from Anvil. So if we go to here, we do forge create. This time we don't have to put an RPC because forge defaults to the Anvil one, but I can say simple storage dash interactive. It'll do enter the private key. I will paste it and we'll go ahead and deploy. Go to Anvil. We don't get any logs like this but we can see we went ahead and actually deployed it to our Anvil blockchain. Awesome work. Another way we can do this forge create is by running forge create simple storage. If we wanted to be incredibly 
explicit, we would do dash dash RPC dash URL, copy this, HTTP colon slash slash, paste it in there, dash dash private key, and back in Anvil, copy the private key, paste it in like this, and we would get the same thing. Now, here's what I'm gonna tell you, and this is incredibly important. Pasting in your private key like this is no bueno, very bad. We pretty much never want to have our private key in plain text, especially our production or our private keys with actual money. Putting this private key in plain text is not a big deal because this is a fake dummy one. It's also bad to have our private keys in our shell or bash history. If I hit up once on my terminal, I can see the private key in here, which is why the interactive is a little bit better because it at least obfuscates the private key. To remove your private key from your history in bash, you can do history dash C. Now, if I hit up, I can't see any commands. And if I do history, I can see my entire history, which is just the history keyword. Now, if I type clear, I'll do history. Now I see history, clear, history. Great. And we don't have the private key in our command history anymore. We will learn more about proper private key safety in the future, but I want you to do something for me right now. In a new file, I want you to right click and I want you to write promise.md. We're gonna hide the terminal. And in here, we're gonna say, I promise to never use my private key associated with real money in plain text. In fact, take this and tweet this. I promise to never use my private key associated with real money in plain text. And I can't spell, and that's fine. And then if you wanna at me, or you wanna add Cypher and audits or whatever, go ahead and send that. We are gonna have more of these promises that you're gonna do, but this is the first one that I need you to understand. Right now it's cool because these are dummy keys, but in the future, it will definitely not be cool. And I'm stressing this because I've seen a lot of multi-million dollar companies not follow this and get their private keys hacked. Now, of course, though, the basic way to deploy to any blockchain would be forge, create the name of your contract, add the RPC URL, and then add your private key. We're going to learn how to get RPC URLs for free using Alchemy for any blockchain that we want. And like I said, more safe private key methodologies in the future. But now you've just learned how to deploy your contracts to any chain from the command line. This is great. So this was a while ago that I made this with this .env, but now what you can do is you can just have no .env at all, and you can now use the power of cast built into Foundry to use private keys without ever having them in plain text, which is what we want. Your private keys will always be encrypted using the methodology that I'm about to show you, and therefore you should never have to use a .env again. If you come to Cypher looking for a security review or a security audit, and you have a .env example in your Git repo, I will fail you. So recently we just showed you how to use a .env or use a .env.example to get a private key RPC URL and Etherscan API key as environment variables, which is great. However, the issue is that we have these in plain text and that's bad for a hundred reasons. We might accidentally push this to GitHub. We might accidentally show this in our terminal. You always want to do your best to make sure private keys are never left in plain text. So what we can do instead is we can encrypt them using ERC2335, which is just a way to encrypt our private keys into a JSON format. So in our code base, let's pretend our private key is the default key that comes with Anvil. So if I run Anvil, I get this output like this. We scroll to the top and let's say, this is the private key that I want to encrypt. I'll copy this address and then we'll do cast wallet import default key dash dash interactive. I would also highly recommend you not doing it in VS Code and instead do it directly in your terminal or your shell just in case you're using a buggy VS Code for whatever reason. And this will bring us into an interactive shell for us to post our information. I think this is also really helpful because we do have to paste our private key and this will be the only time you have to paste your private key or have it in plain text. But when we hit paste, so I'm going to go ahead, talk about screencast mode, I'm going to go ahead and paste it in and you'll see that nothing actually showed up because it does that intentionally. So now I'm going to untoggle screencast mode and then you enter a password. And this will be the thing you need to remember moving forward to work with this private key. So I'm going to do a crappy password. Great. And it'll say default key key store was 
saved successfully and it'll give you this address here. Now, before what we were doing was we were passing our private key directly into our terminal and you know, we were using a make file to make it look a little bit easier, but in our terminal, it would be something like forge script, blah, 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 some script dash dash private private key and then our private key, which is bad. So instead, what we can do now, now that we have it in our cast and we can even do cast wallet list to see our default key in here. And now what we can do is we can run forge script script deploy, excuse me, script deploy fundme.s.sol colon deploy fundme, right? This is going to be our basic script that we're running dash dash RPC URL HTTP local host 8545. This is if I'm running Anvil, right, which I am running Anvil right now. Of course, this can be Sepolia, this can be mainnet, this can be whatever else you want. And now importantly, instead of doing dash dash private key, and then in plain text pasting some private key, we now instead do dash dash account default key dash dash sender. And this is where this is a little bit annoying, but we do have to copy paste the address of the sender. So the sender associated with this private key. So this is our private key. And this is the address associated with that private key. And then we can do dash dash broadcast and then dash, you know, VVVV. And of course, if we were actually deploying to Sepolia, we could do let me zoom out a little bit. We could do verify etherscan API key, etc. But I'm going to go ahead and run this now. And what it's going to do is going to compile, it's going to run through the traces. And now it's gonna say enter key store password, and it won't let you actually run this without the password. So which I'm just gonna say, okay, and type in my crappy password here and boom, it's going to deploy. So there are some other ways to do this to make it even quicker. There's also a dash dash password file where you can pass it a password file. So maybe in your files here, you'll do like a password or something like that, where you put your password in here. You'd of course want to put that in your dot git ignore. But even if you push your password up to GitHub, that is still substantially better than if you push your private key up to GitHub. Just absolutely make sure you're not reusing passwords. And once you have this in here, you can do cast wallet list. You can see your wallet in here. And if you go to your home directory and you go to dot foundry key stores, do an LS in here, you can now see this default key in here. We could also look at this file. I'm going to use cat, but you can really use any command you want. And you can see this, it's this giant blarble of nothing. It's basically this encrypted version of this private key, which again, follows this ERC 2335. And then in your shell, if you type history, you should be able to see a history of the different commands you ran. And if you put your private key in any of these commands, do history dash C. Now, if you type history, it'll be gone. You can also remove your dot bash history, boom. And now their private key is no longer in your bash history. And if you're using a different shell like ZSH, check out where the ZSH history is shown. So should you still take the dot EMV pledge? Absolutely. Anytime you feel yourself starting to think, hmm, I kind of want to reveal my private key. You should have a feeling come over you where you go, maybe I don't want to do that. Again, I know that you are using a development private key for this course because you promised you would be. But when you move to working with a real private key with real money, this is what I want you to do. I want you to encrypt it once and then try to never look at it again. Anytime you see your private key in plain text, alarm bells should go off in your mind and you should say, I shouldn't be doing this. How do I reveal this private key as least often as possible? And everyone should go on Twitter and thank this guy for being the one to finally set this up and merge this foundry improvement. So to recap, you no longer need to have your private key in a .env ever. You shouldn't be doing that anyways, because I showed you other ways to not do that. But now you doubly do not need to do that. And especially if you have a private key with real money in it, if you must send a transaction with that private key, this is how I want you to do it. Number one, use cast wallet import. Number two, at least use a password or a password file instead of using your private key. And number three, if you do type your private key, make sure to delete it from your history after you write it. Thank you and stay safe. All right, great. So now we've learned how to actually deploy a contract to any blockchain that we want using the command line. But now I'm going to teach you the second way we're going to deploy our contracts. And this is the way we're actually going to do it for the rest of the course. When we're deploying our code, we want to make sure we have a continuous reproducible way to deploy our smart contracts. And when we test our code in the future, we want the tests to test the deployment processes as well as the code. 
So instead of just doing the command line, we're actually going to write a script for us to deploy our code. And because Foundry has everything written in Solidity, this script that we're gonna write to deploy our code is also gonna be written in Solidity. And this is where Solidity as a contract language versus Solidity as a scripting language is a little bit different. Foundry has a whole bunch of built-in stuff to give our Solidity even more functionality outside of just smart contracts. And you'll learn about how later in the course. But for now, we're gonna learn how to create a script to deploy our simple storage contract. And the way we create a script to do it is first, we come to our script folder, we'll right click, new file, we'll create deploy simple storage dot s dot soul. This dot s dot soul is just a foundry convention. Most of the time scripts have a dot s dot soul instead of just being dot soul. And in here, we're actually going to write a contract in Solidity to deploy our smart contract, which sounds a little bit weird, but don't worry too much about that. This deploy script is gonna be written in Solidity, but it, it shouldn't be considered a contract that we actually ever want to deploy. It's just for deploying our code, but it is written in Solidity. So since it's written in Solidity, we'll do the same thing as usual, SPDX license identifier, MIT. And if you're using GitHub Copilot, it might even auto suggest like this. And I'm just gonna go ahead and hit tab. I'll do pragma solidity 0 0.8.18. And then I'll create contract, deploy simple storage like so. And I'll hit save. If you go to the foundry docs, we can actually scroll down to this solidity scripting section in the tutorials. And you can learn how to actually write scripts and work with scripts. The first thing that we need to do in order to tell that foundry that this is a script is we need to actually import some additional code. Now, one of the things that we saw in here was this lib folder. And this lib folder actually starts with another folder called forge STD. This forge STD stands for forge standard library. In here, there's a ton of helpful tools and scripts for working with foundry. And to tell foundry that this contract deploy simple storage is actually a script we need to import from forge STD. So we can do import forge dash STD slash script dot soul. And we'll have our contract deploy simple storage inherit all the functionality of this script by saying is script. And I know we learned about inheritance before, so you should know what that means is script. And then additionally, our deploy simple storage is going to need to know about our simple storage contract. So we'll go ahead and import that import. We'll go down a directory since we're in the script folder and we need to go to the SRC folder. These two dots is how you go down a directory. We'll do slash SRC VS code even might help prompt you here dash and it again auto prompted for me and I hit tab and we now we've imported simple storage. Now, since we know that this is the noob way to do imports, we're going to do the cool way by using named imports instead of nameless imports. Okay, great. Now inside every deploy or script contract, we need our main function, which is gonna be called run. And this is going to be the command that gets called when we go to deploy our contract. So we'll create a function called run, we'll make it external, and we can have it return a simple storage contract. And in here, we're going to use a new keyword that we haven't used before. We're gonna say vm.start broadcast. VM is a special keyword in the forge standard library. The VM keyword is a special keyword that we can only use in Foundry. It's related to something called cheat codes. We're not gonna go over that too deep right now. You can see a whole list of Foundry cheat codes in the documentation and forge standard library references which have even more cheat codes as well. This VM stuff is only gonna work in Foundry. If you actually were to try to deploy this in Remix or some other framework, it wouldn't work. These VM cheat codes only work in Foundry. It's not valid in regular Solidity, but if we're inheriting Forge STD code, this VM keyword exists. If you're using the hardhat Solidity extension, we can actually control or command click into VM and we can actually see where it's defined. But if that's confusing, ignore that for now. This VM.start broadcast says, hey, everything after this line inside of this function you should actually send to the RPC. And then when we're done broadcasting, we're gonna do vm.stop broadcast. So everything inside of these is what we actually want to send and deploy. 
the reason we have this is because maybe we have some stuff like we want to set some boilerplate code before we actually send transactions and we don't want to spend any gas to like set starting value to one, right? So any transaction that we want to actually send, we need to put in between these vm.start broadcast and vm.stop broadcast. And for us to deploy our simple storage contract, we just do simple storage, lowercase simple storage, right? These are different. Simple storage, the variable, simple storage, the contract equals new simple storage like this. And remember, what does this new keyword do? Well, the new keyword creates a new contract in Solidity. It's also going to create a new contract in between our vm.start broadcast. This being in between these vm.start broadcasts is going to send a transaction to create a new simple storage contract. If this is a little bit confusing for you right now, that's okay. It's going to make more sense as we go on later in the course. But for now, just do this and follow along with me. And then, of course, we can say return simple storage. Okay, great. Now, if we pull our terminal back up, we can see we have Anvil running right now. And we can actually kill it with Control C, we'll clear to the top. And what we can do now is run forge script script deploy simple storage dot s dot soul hit enter. And look, oops, looks like I got some different solidity versions. So let's change this to a carrot in here. And let's change this to a carrot in here, this being an 18 so that they're both on the same version. Let's type clear, close these or minimize these out. We'll hit up twice and we'll run this again. And now what you'll see is it's compiling. It compiles both the script to deploy and our simple storage contract using 0.8.19 because we did the carrot. Compiler successful, script successful, tells us the gas. And then we went ahead, we returned our simple storage contract, which was deployed here. Now you might be asking, wait, 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 Patrick, we, we don't have Anvil running. We don't have a local blockchain running. Where did this deploy to? Well, in Foundry, if you don't specify an RPC URL, it'll just automatically deploy your contract or run your script on a temporary Anvil chain. So once I ran forge script, it saw there was no RPC URL. So it spun up a temporary Anvil blockchain, deployed our simple storage, and then tore it back down at the end. You can see at the bottom, if you wish to simulate on-chain transaction, pass an RPC URL. So if we do clear, we run Anvil, and then create a new terminal. We could run forge script, script, deploy simple storage at s.sol, and I'm hitting tab to auto complete that dash dash RPC URL, go back to Anvil, copy this, go back to bash, HTTP dot dot slash slash, we actually almost deployed this to the blockchain, we actually did a simulation of deploying to our Anvil chain here, it gives us one more piece of information to broadcast these transactions add dash dash broadcast and wallet configurations to the previous command. And now we get a new folder, which gives us information about our previous deployments in case we forget. For example, if we deploy a contract, we can flip back here and see where we actually deployed code. So let's pull up our terminal once more and actually deploy this to the blockchain. So we'll hit clear, I'll hit up, we have our RPC URL. So now let's do dash dash broadcast, and we'll do dash dash private key, and we'll grab a private key from Anvil and paste that in here and hit enter. Boom. And we see at the bottom on chain execution complete and successful. And we see we get some transactions here. We waited for receipts, etc. So fantastic. So we learned how to actually deploy our smart contracts through the scripting command now. Awesome job. Now let's learn a little bit more about what actually just happened, right? Because right now sending transactions is still kind of this magic thing, right? So let's hide our terminal and let's go up to our Explorer. Let's pull this out a little bit and let's go into here. Now what's important to note is that there's actually a couple different folders in here. Dry run is the folder whenever we don't have a blockchain running. Otherwise this gets separated by chain ID, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. But if we go into one of these, either dry run or, or even just run latest, we'll see details about the transaction. We'll see a hash, transaction type, contract name, address, blah, blah, blah. 
This right here, this transaction section is actually what is getting sent on the chain. When we do forge script or forge create, this is the transaction that we send to that RPC URL, right? This is the API data. If you're familiar with HTTPS posts, this is the data that we actually send. We send the type, which for now, just everything is type two because we're in the merge. Don't worry about type one for now. We have a from, which is of course the from address that we want to have. We have a gas here, and this is the hex value of gas. Now, if we pull our terminal back up, we'll clear this out. I'm about to show you an amazing trick that's gonna make your life a lot easier down the line. Cast actually can convert between hex and numbers really easily, and cast comes built in with Foundry. If we do cast dash dash to base, paste our hex in here and write DEC for decimal, it'll convert this hex value to its decimal value. 0x714c2, whatever, is just this number. And I use this cast to base all the time. You can put some value in here and then what you want to convert it to. And it's a very easy way to see what some value is. There's some other stuff in cast as well. If you do cast dash dash help, there's some other ways to convert different units to each other, like from way, spites 32 and some other stuff. But to base is gonna be one that we're gonna use a lot. So we have the gas, we have the value with the transaction. Yes, since deploying a contract is just a transaction, we can add a value to it if we want. In our deploy script, right in here, we would just do some brackets. We would say like value and like one ether. If we wanted to deploy this with one ether, we can't send a value here because in Solidity, you can't set the option value if the constructor is not payable. We'd have to make the constructor payable, but we could send value just like any other transaction. There's this huge data piece here. This is actually the contract deployment code and the contract code in here. We have the nonce, which is gonna be that number that's only used once. And then don't worry about access list for now. But this is all the transaction information. And then of course we have our RPC. Now what's not stored in here is, is a couple other pieces of the transaction. Now additionally, there are these V, R, and S values that account for the transaction signature. It's not getting saved here because it's technically part of this from anyways, they're public values. And these R, S, and V allow our private key to sign the transaction. So what's really happening when we send this, the reason we need our private key is we need the private key to actually sign the transaction that we built. And that's happening a little bit under the hood. So whenever we send a transaction, there is a signature happening. We are signing a transaction and then we are sending it. And that's important for later in the course. They don't save it here, but signing the transaction does happen. When you sign a transaction, it's very similar to doing that hex thing we showed you way, way at the beginning of the course with the blockchain. Only the private key can sign the transaction. This is how when we send our data to a node, it knows that it's able to execute it because it's signed by our private key. I'm not gonna go too deep into that right now. Now this nuts piece is a little bit important. Every single wallet has a counter of transactions, which is basically the nonce. Whenever you send a transaction, you give it a nonce or this value, this number only used once to basically count your transactions. This is really good because if you want to replay transactions, you would just send the same transaction data with the same nonce. For example, if we have a transaction that didn't go through, you'll see that this is in this run latest for the dry. If we run this again, if we hit up, you'll see that if we run our transaction again with our Anvil deployed here, We'll actually deploy another transaction. If we go back to our broadcast folder, we see there's actually two runs and a new run latest. If we go to our run latest now, you'll see that the most the latest run now has 0x1. So this increments every single time we send a transaction. Your nonce increments every time you send a transaction. And again, contract deployments are transactions. Now we went over a lot of stuff in here, but the most important takeaway I want you to have from this is anytime you change state on the blockchain, it does it in a transaction. And the differentiator is going to be what's ever in this data field. This data field contains the opcodes to tell the blockchain, hey, I'd like to create a new contract. We're not really gonna go too deep into what these opcodes are or this EVM bytecode. We'll briefly talk about opcodes later in this course, but if you wanna really learn about opcodes and assembly, we have another course on security coming out that will go over that. But this is the most important thing to take away. When we're in Remix and we're sending transactions with these buttons, we're doing the exact same thing. We're populating the data field of a transaction, but instead of the data being associated with creating a contract, the data is associated with sending a transaction.
All right, great. Now that we've actually deployed our contracts, though, we should learn how to interact with them in the same way that Remix allows us to interact with them with our buttons here. Now, there's two ways to actually interact with our contracts. One is going to be doing what we did before with scripts, but the other way is actually going to be doing directly from the command line. So we're actually going to learn the command line parts in this project, and then we're going to learn how to do scripts in a later project. So let's pull up our terminal here. And just to make sure that we have this deployed, let's hit up a couple of times, and we'll rerun this deploy script. Now, in just a second, we're going to learn how to actually interact with our contracts from the command line as well, similar to how Remix has all these buttons that we can press. However, first, we're going to make this a little bit better. And we're going to take a couple of different approaches to not having this in the command line. As you saw before, we could use Forge Create Interactive, paste our private key in, and it wouldn't be in our command line. We actually can't use Interactive for when we're sending scripts at the moment. I'm sure in the future, they'll make it a little bit easier for us to do this. But right now, we really don't want to have to do dash dash private key and paste our private key in plain text. So what else can we do? What alternatives can, do we have? Now, what I'm about to show you, once again, only do this for your development environments. Do not put a real private key in here. The reason I'm showing you this is because it is much quicker to test. However, it's terrible to use in production. So this is cool for development purposes. This is not cool for actual production purposes. What we're going to do is we're going to create a new file called .env. And whenever you create a .env, the first thing you should do is go to a gitignore file. Make sure that a .env is in this gitignore. I'll explain what the .gitignore does in the future, but for now, just have that be the first thing you do. In our .env file, we can put in what's called environment variables. These are variables that might be a little bit sensitive that we don't want to actually write in the command line or accidentally expose to the public. One of those, of course, is going to be our private key. So let's go to Anvil, scroll up, grab that private key, copy and paste it in here. And we have this private key equals this. Typically, you'll also see RPC URL equals what's our Anvil RPC URL. It's this right here. So we'll do HTTP slash slash paste that in there. And great. Now that we have those in there, what we can do is now run source.env, which will add these environment variables into our shell here. And we can do echo private key like that. And we'll see our private key actually show up like so. We can also do echo dollar sign RPC URL. And we'll see our RPC URL actually show up like this. And then what we could do is we could go back to our forge script. And instead of typing in our private key, we would just do dollar sign private key and dollar sign RPC URL. So now our RPC URL and our private key at least aren't being run in our command line so that it's not stored in our shell's history. The issue, of course, is that, okay, well, now we have it stored in this .env. Anytime you have your key stored in plain text, you should be afraid. <laughs> you should be a little bit nervous. So we can actually take one more step to make this even more secure. And this is going to be one of the steps that I recommend that you take when you're actually working with production code. You definitely do not want to launch production code with the .env file. And I'm going to summarize all of this very soon. Just stick with me, I promise. This is a little bit boring, but it's incredibly, incredibly important that you get this right. And I'm going to try to prevent you from getting wrecked. Now, Foundry is a tool that is constantly being improved and updated. And there's an issue in the Foundry repo right now called Improve Wallet Management US using Keystore. I would love a way for you to actually encrypt your private keys so that none of you accidentally push a private key up to GitHub or expose a private key that it's in plain text. If you run forge script dash dash help and you scroll up, you get this wallet options section where you can actually pass the path to an encrypted key store file and a password. A key store is a file that has your private key but encrypted by a password. Instead of having your private key in plain text, you would have it encrypted and you would just need the password to decrypt it. That is a much safer way to deploy your contracts. I've added some context in another issue on Foundry as well. And if you all could come in here and give this a thumbs up, that would be fantastic. A way to encrypt your private key into a key store file natively doesn't exist in Foundry yet, but I've put out a bounty for someone to actually implement this. So be sure to just check the GitHub repo associated with this course to check to see whether this feature is implemented. So what I'm really trying to get at is, for the moment, a private key in our .env file is cool, so long as we don't expose the .env file. But for real money, you're not going to do that. We're not going to do that, okay? 
For real money, we're gonna use the Dashish Interactive to paste our private key, or we're gonna use a key store file with a password once Foundry adds that. There are some tools like DappTools eSign that you could optionally download if you want to deploy and interact with wallets that have real money in them. And it does have this import keyword where you can import your private key into a key store file. And then you would just obviously encrypt that with a password. So for the moment, this is your setup, but in the future, this is gonna be your setup, okay? This is cool now, but not in the future. And additionally, if you go to the Foundry Full Course F23, you go to discussions, and this will also be in, and this will also be somewhere on this site at some point, you'll see this, the .env pledge, which has a whole bunch of information about working with .env files and keeping your private keys safer. For the rest of this course, we are gonna be working with this .env syntax because it is easier. However, I'm really hoping that Foundry in the future adds this key store encryption by default so that we don't accidentally expose our private keys. And I'm not doing this to scare you, but I'm doing this to impress upon you the importance of making sure you keep that private key and that mnemonic safe. The other reason that we're okay to put our private key in our .env file is that you have already promised me that you're only going to work with a development private key or a private key that you're not gonna add any real money into. So if you expose it, it'll be fine, but you still wanna practice not exposing it. So please say, take some time to read this. And then if you do agree to everything, just say, I will be safe as a comment on this .env pledge. So I'm gonna read it out and it's important for you to understand this moving forward. So it's gonna be a little dry here, but I am just gonna read it. I solemnly swear that I will never place a private key or secret phrase or mnemonic in a .env file that is associated with real funds. I will only place private keys in a .env file that have only tested ETH, LINK, or other cryptocurrencies. When I'm testing and developing, I will use a different wallet than the one associated with my real funds. I am aware that if I forget a dot get ignore and push my key slash phrase to GitHub even for a split second or show my key slash phrase to the internet for a split second, it should be considered compromised and I should move all my funds immediately. This is a really important line. Even if you show your private key to anywhere on the internet for even a split second, it is considered compromised and you should move all your funds immediately. If I'm unsure if my account has real funds in it, I will assume it has real funds in it. If I assume it has real funds in it, I will not use it for developing purposes. I'm aware that even in my MetaMask, if I hit create account or add account on my MetaMask or other ETH wallet, I will get a new private key, but it will share the same secret phrase slash mnemonic of the other accounts generated in that MetaMask. And these are some additions that I made from the last course. For this course, I will only use funds associated with my brand new never before used MetaMask or other wallet. And again, in most browsers, you can choose a different profile and install a MetaMask on a different profile and use that MetaMask for this development purpose. If I must use a private key associated with real funds in the future, until I'm 100% sure what I am doing, I will always either use encryption methods like the DAP Tools key store file. I'm not gonna show you how to work with this because some of the installs might be a little bit tricky, but they have a way to actually import and encrypt private keys to a key store file. Use the Foundry's built-in key store creator, which isn't implemented yet. Anybody here who is a Rust developer or knows some Rust or wants to participate, definitely be sure to check out this issue, which is on Foundry, and I would love somebody to take a crack at this. Or if you must, use the command line as a way to pass your private keys and then delete the command line history immediately afterwards. If I never actually deploy anything to mainnet myself or work with a private key with real funds, I do not need to be concerned. For any of you who are getting a little bit nervous about this, just remember, if you don't work with any real money, you don't have to worry about this, okay? So a lot of you people who are who are newer here, who are going to be going through this course, we're not gonna use any real funds. So you won't have to be worried about this. For those of you who are doing the extra credit, which is with real funds, you will need to keep this in mind moving forward. And I would try to load your real MetaMask with real money with small amounts so that if it all gets stolen, you won't lose sleep at night. Okay, great. And I'm telling you all this to arm you with this knowledge that you can be more secure moving forward. Take a look at this, read this, internalize it. And if you wanna copy paste this on Twitter in a huge tweet thread, shout this from the rooftops, put this in an article, make a TikTok with this .env pledge, have an absolute blast. The more people who know about this and the more people who understand this, the better. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. All right, so I know that was a lot of private key information and there's gonna be more soon too. So, but the reason I'm harping on this is because I really, 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 really wanna make sure that all of you don't actually mess this up. Since you are the developers, you are gonna be the ones responsible for dealing with all this, and I wanna make sure that you get it right.
So this was a while ago that I made this with this .env, but now what you can do is you can just have no .env at all, and you can now use the power of cast built into Foundry to use private keys without ever having them in plain text, which is what we want. Your private keys will always be encrypted using the methodology that I'm about to show you, and therefore you should never have to use a .env again. If you come to Cypher and looking for a security review or a security audit, and you have a .env example in your Git repo, I will fail you. So recently we just showed you how to use a .env or use a .env.example to get a private key RPC URL and etherscan API key as environment variables, which is great. However, the issue is that we have these in plain text and that's bad for a hundred reasons. We might accidentally push this to GitHub. We might accidentally show this in our terminal. You always want to do your best to make sure private keys are never left in plain text. So what we can do instead is we can encrypt them using ERC2335, which is just a way to encrypt our private keys into a JSON format. So in our code base, let's pretend our private key is the default key that comes with Anvil. So if I run Anvil, I get this output like this. We scroll to the top and let's say, this is the private key that I want to encrypt. I'll copy this address and then we'll do cast wallet import default key dash dash interactive. I would also highly recommend you not doing it in VS Code and instead do it directly in your terminal or your shell just in case you're using a buggy VS Code for whatever reason. And this will bring us into an interactive shell for us to post our information. I think this is also really helpful because we do have to paste our private key and this will be the only time you have to paste your private key or have it in plain text. But when we hit paste, so I'm going to go ahead and talk about screencast mode. I'm going to go ahead and paste it in and you'll see that nothing actually showed up because it does that intentionally. So now I'm going to untoggle screencast mode and then you enter a password and this will be the thing you need to remember moving forward to work with this private key. So I'm going to do a crappy password. Great. And it'll say default key key store was saved successfully and it'll give you this address here. Now, before what we were doing was we were passing our private key directly into our terminal and you know, we were using a make file to make it look a little bit easier, but in our terminal, it would be something like forge script, blah, 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 some script dash dash private private key, and then our private key, which is bad. So instead, what we can do now, now that we have it in our cast, and we can even do cast wallet list to see our default key in here. And now what we can do is we can run forge script script, deploy, excuse me, script deploy, fundme.s.sol colon deploy fundme. right? This is going to be our basic script that we're running dash dash RPC URL HTTP local host 8545. This is if I'm running Anvil, right, which I am running Anvil right now. Of course, this can be Sepolia, this can be mainnet, this can be whatever else you want. And now importantly, instead of doing dash dash private key, and then in plain text pasting some private key, we now instead do dash dash account default key dash dash sender. And this is where this is a little bit annoying, but we do have to copy paste the address of the sender. So the sender associated with this private key. So this is our private key. And this is the address associated with that private key. And then we can do dash dash broadcast and then dash, you know, VVVV. And of course, if we were actually deploying to Sepolia, we could do let me zoom out a little bit, we could do verify etherscan API key, etc. But I'm going to go ahead and run this now. And what it's going to do is going to compile, it's going to run through the traces. And now it's gonna say enter key store password, and it won't let you actually run this without the password. So which I'm just gonna say, okay, I'm going to type in my crappy password here and boom, it's going to deploy. So there are some other ways to do this to make it even quicker. There's also a dash dash password file where you can pass it a password file. So maybe in your files here, you'll do like a password or something like that, where you put your password in here. You'd of course want to put that in your dot git ignore. But even if you push your password up to GitHub, that is still substantially better than if you push your private key up to GitHub. Just absolutely make sure you're not reusing passwords. And once you have this in here, you can do cast wallet list. You can see your wallet in here. And if you go to your home directory and you go to dot foundry key stores, do an LS in here, you can now see this default key in here. We can also look at this file. I'm going to use cats, but you can really use any command you want. And you can see this, it's this giant blarble of nothing. It's basically this encrypted version of this private key, which again, follows this ERC 2335. And then in your shell, if you type history, 
you should be able to see a history of the different commands you ran. And if you put your private key in any of these commands, do history dash C. Now, if you type history, it'll be gone. You can also remove your dot bash history, boom. And now their private key is no longer in your bash history. And if you're using a different shell like ZSH, check out where the ZSH history is shown. So should you still take the dot EMV pledge? Absolutely. Anytime you feel yourself starting to think, hmm, I kind of want to reveal my private key, you should have a feeling come over you where you go, maybe I don't want to do that. Again, I know that you are using a development private key for this course because you promised you would be, but when you move to working with a real private key with real money, this is what I want you to do. I want you to encrypt it once and then try to never look at it again. Anytime you see your private key in plain text, alarm bells should go off in your mind and you should say, I shouldn't be doing this. How do I reveal this private key as least often as possible? And everyone should go on Twitter and thank this guy for being the one to finally set this up and merge this foundry improvement. So to recap, you no longer need to have your private key in a .env ever. You shouldn't be doing that anyways because I showed you other ways to not do that. But now you doubly do not need to do that. And especially if you have a private key with real money in it, if you must send a transaction with that private key, this is how I want you to do it. Number one, use Cast Wallet import. Number two, at least use a password or a password file instead of using your private key. And number three, if you do type your private key, make sure to delete it from your history after you write it. Thank you and stay safe. Whew. In any case, let's go ahead and let's learn how to interact with these contracts from the command line first. And in later courses, we'll learn how to do it from scripts. So we have our Anvil running and we've deployed our contract using our deploy, using at least something marginally better, using private key as an environment variable, as opposed to just pasting it right in here. So what we can do now is we can take this contract address and we can actually start to interact with it. Foundry has another tool built in called cast. And if you type cast dash dash help, you'll see we get a whole bunch of commands to work with cast. One of the commands that we can work with is going to be send, which is to sign and publish a transaction. So what we can do is we can do cast send dash dash help. We can see the help of send and we can see the arguments it takes is going to be two the signature and the arguments. So on Remix, for example, if we have our simple storage contract and we deployed it. If we wanted to call our store function and send the transaction, we would just add some numbers in here and then click store like this, right? If we want to call store from the command line, we can do cast, send, the address we want to do, the signature, which for now just know is the is the function and the input types it needs. So we could call store with a parenthesis uint256 because we're calling the function store, which takes a uint256's input parameter, and then the arguments or the values we want to pass to our store function. And we'll go ahead and hit enter. Of course, this fails because we need to add our private key and RPC URL. So we'll hit up, we'll do RPC URL, we'll do dollar sign RPC URL. And then we'll do dash dash private key and then private key like that. And now you'll see we'll get all of this data about our transaction back. We get the block hash, block number, contract address is blank probably because it's a local chain, logs, we can learn, we'll learn about logs later, the transaction hash, etc. Now, in order to read this, we're going to use cast call, which is going to read off the blockchain. And if we do cast call dash dash help, I'm going to scroll up a little bit. We'll see call takes two signature and arguments, exact same as send, but the difference is it's like call is like doing one of these blue buttons. It's calling as opposed to sending a transaction. It's just doing a view function, not actually sending a transaction. So we'll do cast, call, we'll paste the contract address, we'll call retrieve, R-E-T-R-I-E-V-E, -E -E, R-E-T-R-I-E-V, oh, did I spell retrieve wrong? I don't know, I guess we'll find out. No input parameters here and no arguments. We can just hit enter and we'll see we get the hex value back. This is where I said you're going to be converting stuff from hex back and forth a lot. Then we can do cast dash dash to base, paste the hex and say decimal. And we can see we get back one, two, three, which is exactly what we've stored on chain. So if we hit up a couple times back to our cast send transaction, our cast send command, and we change one, two, three to 777, 
we hit enter, we'll send that transaction. Now, if we hit up three times, two or three times, we'll call cast call retrieve now, and we should see the new number, which we get back as a hex. And then we'll do cast dash dash to base, paste it in, deck, and we do indeed see 777 return to us. Awesome. So now we know how to actually interact with our contracts from the command line. And this is going to be the same way we can actually interact with our contracts on an actual testnet or on an actual mainnet. All right, so now you might be asking, okay, Patrick, what does this look like on a testnet or a live network? So let's go ahead, let's go to our .env file and let's update this so that it's a .env file for an actual testnet. So the first thing is we're gonna need an RPC URL for an actual testnet, for an actual network. And this is where in our MetaMasks actually have Infura connections built in. Remember before we went to our settings, networks, Ethereum mainnet, we saw, oh, we saw we have this Infura connection. We can't use this one because this one's designed specifically for our MetaMask. So we're gonna to have to get our own RPC URL for an actual testnet. Well, one of the things we could do is we could run our own blockchain node, but a lot of people don't wanna do that. So what a lot of people do is use something called a node as a service. To do this, what I'm gonna recommend you do is actually come over to the Foundry full course repo, scroll down, and there's gonna be a section called deploying to a testnet or a mainnet. If we click this link, we'll actually go ahead and we'll get sent to the Alchemy platform where we're gonna sign up for a free node as a service that we can actually send transactions to. And we're gonna go ahead and sign up for their platform. You can sign up with Google, sign up with SSO, whatever you wanna do. I'm gonna go ahead and sign in with Google. I'm indeed human. And we're gonna to come to their user interface that looks something like this. We're gonna deploy this to Sepolia, but remember, go to the recommended testnet section of this course. So what we're gonna do now that we're in here is we're gonna go ahead and create a new app. And you can name it whatever you want. I'm gonna call it Sepolia Testing. I'm just gonna copy this for our description. This is on the Ethereum chain, but on Ethereum Sepolia, we're not gonna do any advanced features. We'll go ahead to create app. And now we have this Ethereum Sepolia app where we can view details. We can see how often we're calling this and we can see different details about our node. And if we hit view key, we see we have this HTTPS endpoint. And this is gonna be the exact same thing as that Anvil or Grenache or MetaMask endpoint that we saw. And we're gonna go ahead and copy this. And back in our main V, what we could do is we, we can create a new RPC URL called Sepolia RPC URL equals, and we'll paste that in here. Now we have an RPC that points to an actual testnet. With our private key, we can't use this as a private key because this is an Anvil private key. And it doesn't have any real money in it, and it doesn't have any testnet ETH in it. But what we can do is instead, we can use our one of our private keys in our MetaMask. So if we switch back to Sepolia in our MetaMask, we can pick one of our accounts that actually has some money in it. I'm gonna pick account number one. We'll hit the three little dots, account details, export private key. And remember, it's okay for me to show the private key here because this is just a dummy private key, but I'll add my password in. And remember, I'm never gonna actually do any real moneying with this. And I'll copy this, hit done, and paste this in here, and maybe I'll Maybe I'll comment this line out in .env file. This hashtag or this pound sign is what the comment is. But maybe we'll do a new private key equals and I'll paste this in here. And now I have the private key from MetaMask. I have the RPC URL. And those are all I need to actually deploy a transaction. So what I can do now, pull my terminal back up. So we're gonna run this command to actually deploy this to a real testnet from our foundry using Alchemy as our node as a service. And you'll see in the user interface of Alchemy, you'll see a transaction actually come through our node. This is us sending a transaction to a real node and we'll be able to see the stats here on our Alchemy dashboard. So let's go ahead, let's do this again. So first we're gonna to need to run source.env to make sure all of our .env stuff is loaded. Then we're gonna run forge script script deploy simple storage.s.sol and I'm hitting tab to autocomplete here dash dash RPC URL, Sepolia RPC URL with the little dollar sign, dash dash private key, dollar sign private key, dash dash broadcast. If you don't add the dash dash broadcast, 
It won't actually send it. It'll simulate sending it. Now, if I hit enter, we'll see it compile. And now we're running this script, deploy simple storage.s.sol, which actually deploys it. And we'll see we went ahead and deployed our contract simple storage on the Sepolia chain. We see all these details about it. It's sending the transaction right now. It's storing the latest run under the broadcast folder under its chain ID in here in this run latest.json. And after a brief delay, we'll see it went through. And what we can do is we can grab this hash, go over to sepolia.etherscan.io, paste that hash in here, and we'll see we actually successfully sent a transaction. And if we click on our contract address we just created, we'll see we actually just created this contract on a real testnet. If we go back to our Alchemy dashboard and we hit refresh, we'll see we actually sent we sent some requests. If we scroll down, we can see some of the different requests we sent. ETH send raw transaction was the request that we sent to actually send our transaction to the blockchain, but we also got some stuff about the chain ID, fee history, etc. One thing that you'll notice though, when looking at this on Etherscan, is that the contract, oof, it's just a whole bunch of bytecode here, right? This isn't very readable. What we can do is we can actually verify this contract. And now I'm gonna show you the hard way first, and I'm gonna teach you the easier way later. But you can manually verify a contract on Etherscan or other block explorers by selecting verify, going to Solidity. This is a single file contract, so we're gonna do single file. I know that we were on 0.8.19 and our open source license is MIT. We'll hit continue. We'll go back to our simple storage.sol and we'll copy the whole contract. Scroll down, we'll hit paste. Optimization is gonna be yes. There's no constructor args, no contract library addresses, no miss settings. I'm not a robot. And we hit verify and public. Sometimes this can be a little bit tricky to get right. And we're gonna work with programmatic verification pretty soon that makes it a lot easier. But if we did it correctly, what will happen then is if we click on our contract address here and we go to contract and we scroll down, we can actually see our contract right in Etherscan. This will also give access to these read and write contract buttons, which we can see it now looks really similar to what's on Remix. And we can actually interact with our contract right from Etherscan or another block explorer. Like I said, that's the manual way to verify your contracts, and you can run into a lot of issues doing that, so I don't recommend doing it. I recommend doing the programmatic way, which I'm going to teach you very soon. All right, so now we're just about done with our very basic project here, which is fantastic. We've learned a ton already, but there's a couple of things we want to keep in mind here moving forward. And one of those things is when it comes to formatting. So we are using the VS Code auto formatter to auto format our code. But if somebody else comes, and I'm gonna actually save without formatting, if somebody else comes to our code base, we're going to want to have them format it the exact same way that we format it. So what we can do is we can use the forge format command, which if we run it, you see favorite number actually went ahead and format it. So I'm gonna save without formatting again, run forge format, and it's gonna auto format our code here. So this is a command that will automatically format all of our Solidity code. Awesome. And additionally, for every single repo you ever work with, you always want to make a readme.md file. So right click, new file, readme.md. I actually already made one over here. And this is where you're going to put information about your project. Here I put some notes about the private key usage, which I'm just going to delete for now. Readme files are generally where you put information about your project, instructions to work with it, places to contact you, really any information that another open source developer should know when they want to interact with your project, because we are going to push this up to GitHub as well. We're not going to push this up to our GitHub because it's kind of easy, but in the next project, we're actually going to push the code up to GitHub and I'm going to teach you how to do that. Readme.mds are this markdown syntax. Remember how we were talking about answering questions or asking questions using markdown syntax? Well, this is going to be the exact same. If I do a hashtag or pound sign like this, and I say hello, and then some text down here. And if I hit save, what I can do is I can actually preview this markdown. So in my extensions over here, we're going to look for a markdown extension. I actually already have one markdown all in one or markdown preview or whatever you want to install. And we can do open up our command palette with command shift P or view command palette. We can do markdown 
preview, open preview like this. And we can see what this looks like as if it was on a GitHub repo. We can see hello is big. We can see our text down here is small. And if I were to do like some back ticks like this, I can say like code here, save that, look at our preview again. We can see this is formatted now as code. You can also do command shift V to automatically go to preview mode, or it might be control shift V for Windows and Linux users. There's a lot of different ways to go preview your markdown. And remember if formatting your your readme is difficult, usually AIs do a pretty good job at formatting your markdown for you if you just ask them politely. So now we just learned a lot about deploying smart contracts, private keys, and more. Now we're actually going to teach you a slightly new process for working with a layer two for deploying to ZK Sync. We actually have to go through a slightly different compilation process. This is because ZK Sync compiles down to slightly different opcodes than Ethereum. We'll learn more about the differences between ZK Sync and Ethereum in a future section. But for now, just know that at a high level, Solidity will work pretty much exactly the same on ZK Sync as it will in Ethereum. But the low level stuff, the stuff that comes out in this out folder with Foundry is actually gonna be different from ZK Sync. So right now, instead, we're actually gonna do three things. So first, we're gonna install this tool called Foundry ZK Sync. Then we're gonna compile our Solidity, our simple storage contract with this dash dash ZK Sync flag. And then we're actually gonna revert back to vanilla Foundry. And you'll see what I mean in just a second by that. Now, if you go to the GitHub resources associated with this course, the Foundry full course GitHub repo, and we scroll on down, We'll go to Foundry Simple Storage and we go into the code base and we scroll down in here. There will be a section towards the bottom that says ZK Sync Instructions with a link to Foundry ZK Sync. You can also find this link in the main repo. If you scroll down a little bit farther, there is a Foundry ZK Sync. There is a Foundry ZK Sync link down here as well, compiling to ZK Sync in Foundry ZK Sync that you can go ahead and click. And that will bring you to this Matter Labs Foundry ZK Sync GitHub repo. And in this repo, what this is, it's a what's called a fork of Foundry tailored for the ZK Sync environment. So it's basically all the Foundry code with a couple of tweaks, a couple of additions to make it work a little bit easier with ZK Sync. And if we scroll down in here, there's actually some instructions to installing this project installing this repo this is this quick install instructions now i'm going to go through the quick install here however the instructions might be a little bit differently depending on when you watch this so just you just follow along with the instructions here we will show you what the expected outcome should look like and the important bit is that this installation overrides any existing forge and cast binaries in foundry so right now in our terminal if i type forge dash dash version we get this output like this and this is what i'm going to refer to as vanilla foundry or base foundry the foundry that we installed from the foundry documentation this foundry here is going to be foundry zk sync and it's going to use the same keywords it's still going to use forge but it's going to be this foundry zk sync edition first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to clone this repository so i'm going to copy this git clone line here either with the copy button and in here, what I want to do is I actually don't want to install it in my Foundry Simple Storage repo. Maybe I'm going to CD down a directory into my Foundry F23, or I guess I should say F24 now because I'm recording this in 2024. And I'm going to paste that in here. Hit enter. If you're having issues cloning it with this, you can, of course, just copy the URL up here and do git clone, paste the URL, and then delete a bunch of this stuff just to this part, github.com slash matter lab slash foundry ZK sync or whatever the URL is at the moment. And you can do that as well. This will create a new foundry ZK sync repo that we can CD into CD foundry ZK sync like so. And I'll do a little clear here and oh, the instructions said change the directory. Great. We've already done that. Next, we're going to run this command line here. Now, if you're on a Windows machine, this command as such won't work. So you'll need to be on 
WSL, like what we showed you, or use a Mac or a Linux environment. But we're going to go ahead and we're going to copy this and we're going to paste this into our terminal in this Foundry ZK Sync folder. Remember, we can do a little PWD to make sure we're in the correct Foundry ZK Sync folder. And we're going to go ahead and hit enter. And this is going to run what looks like to be the Foundry installation piece. Huh, interesting. If we scroll up in here, we can see a similar output to what we with Foundry, but we get something like this. Detected your preferred shell is Bash, or this might be ZSH or whatever shell that you're using. But it says run source, this right here, or start a new terminal session to use Foundry up ZK Sync. Well, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and delete and open up a new terminal here. Now, if I type forge dash dash version, I actually get a slightly different version than what Foundry gave me. It might be 0.0.2, .0 it might be some other version depending on what version of Foundry ZK Sync you actually update. Now I can also run this new command, foundry up dash ZK Sync. Go ahead and run that. And what this will do is it'll install the latest edition of Foundry ZK Sync into our terminal, which is really exciting. And what's cool, if I do forge compile or build dash dash help, and I scroll up a little bit, we'll see in here we have some new ZK Sync era flags, such as the dash dash ZK Sync flag, which we're going to use pretty often, and some compiler options and all this other good stuff. Now here's what's cool. If we want to switch back to what I'm going to call vanilla foundry, we can just run foundry up and this will override forge and cast to be back to vanilla foundry. So now if I run forge build dash dash help and we scroll up, I won't see those ZK sync flags anywhere. I don't see them in here. But now if I go ahead and clear this and I run foundry up dash ZK sync now, I'm going to get those ZK sync commands back and we can see we're back to 0.0.2. .0 if I run forge build dash dash help, I scroll up, we can see, oh, there's some ZK sync stuff, ZK sync compiler, ZK sync era VM, and we're back on the foundry ZK sync compiler. Very exciting. So for you, I'm going to recommend for the most, most of the time, you should be on the vanilla foundry and you can make sure you're on vanilla foundry by just running foundry up. Then whenever we want to switch back to Foundry ZK Sync, we're going to run this Foundry up dash ZK Sync to switch back to the ZK Sync edition of Foundry. So if you haven't already, run that Foundry up ZK Sync to be on the ZK Sync edition of Foundry. And then what we're going to do now is finally, we're going to build this simple storage dot soul with Foundry ZK Sync. Remember, when we ran build before, we got this out folder here created, okay? And this contains all the compilation, all the compile, all the build details sort of associated with Vanilla Foundry. If we run forge build dash dash, actually, let me keep this open and I'll zoom out just a little bit. Forge build dash dash ZK sync. What you'll see happen now, you'll get some warning outputs like this. You can ignore these, but what you'll see now is you'll see this new folder called ZK out. And this ZK out folder contains all the compilation details for, you guessed it, ZK sync, right? So we have out, which is the EVM or the base Ethereum compiled code. And then we have ZK out, which is the ZK sync or the era VM compiled code. Now, like I said, if I want to just switch back to vanilla foundry, I can just run foundry up. We'll switch back to Vanilla Foundry. Maybe I'll clear my terminal. If I do forge build, now I just build a normal Foundry project like so. So now with just running forge build dash dash ZK sync on that Foundry ZK sync edition, we can compile all of our smart contracts to the ZK sync output so we can deploy our smart contracts in a much cheaper, more effective manner to the L2 or the layer two, the roll up ZK sync. Awesome. Like I said, for continuing this journey, stay on the Foundry up, the base, the vanilla Foundry command line, unless I tell you specifically, hey, now we're gonna be using Foundry ZK Sync. So, cool.
All right, so now that we've learned a lot about deploying our smart contracts with Forge Crate and with Forge Script to our local Anvil chain, we're gonna now learn how to do it for ZK Sync. Now, typically, the process is gonna be exactly the same. You're just gonna have your Forge Create Script with all your little commands in it, dash dash RPC URL, this would be like your ZK Sync RPC, and then you would add that dash dash ZK Sync at the end. As of recording, you also have to add a dash dash legacy, but we'll explain why you need that another time. So typically the process is gonna look exactly the same, just with a dash dash ZK sync and a dash dash legacy flag. However, I'm gonna show you how to deploy to a locally running ZK sync node. And this process is a little bit more involved than working with Anvil. So I'm gonna tell you that this is 100% an optional section to do. And the main takeaway is that deploying to ZK Sync with Forge Create is gonna be pretty much exactly the same as what we did with Anvil. You're just gonna add that dash dash ZK Sync flag and a dash dash legacy flag at the end of your Forge Create command. Now we're not going to be showing you how to deploy to ZK Sync with scripting because as of recording, scripting with ZK Sync doesn't work very well. So in a production environment, you actually would want to use that forge create syntax and do some clever bash scripts to test your deployment process. We're not going to go super deep down that path, but just know for deploying, you're going to use forge create and we're going to walk you through how to actually do this right now. But sometimes we want to make absolutely sure that our smart contracts work properly on ZK sync instead of raw Ethereum. So to make absolutely sure, we can also deploy our smart contracts to a locally running ZK Sync chain. Now to do this, you're gonna need a couple additional pieces. So like I said, this is gonna be optional. If you want, just go ahead and kick back and relax and watch me do this just so that you're familiar with some of these processes. Or if you're feeling sufficiently motivated, feel free to jump in. But again, this is not required. This is 100% optional. So what we're gonna do is same thing. Go to your GitHub resources. We're gonna scroll down, Foundry Simple Storage. We're gonna open up our code base here and we're gonna scroll down to this section in here called ZK Sync Instructions. So we've already got set up with Foundry ZK Sync. We can make sure we're on Foundry ZK Sync by running Foundry up dash ZK Sync, getting an output like this. And it looks like, cool, that installed successfully. Then what you're going to need to do is you're going to need to install. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Docker, this could be a whole new world. And that's why I'm saying this is optional. Docker can be very tricky for new developers to install. If you already got it installed, great. If you want to give yourself a challenge here, great. Go for it. The Docker docs have a lot of documentation on how to install Docker. So feel free to do so. I'm not going to walk you through installing this because like I said, this is going to be an optional section for you. I will say that once it's installed, at least for Macs, you get this new Docker application. For Linux, you don't. I don't think you get one for Windows either. And if you open the application, you'll see something like Docker Engine starting. And then maybe you see something like this. So this is specifically for Mac OS. Linux users will see something different. And what this will do is it'll kick off, it'll start the Docker daemon or the Docker background pro progress. So if we kind of just move this off to the side, we keep it running though. We go back to our terminal, do a little clear. If I do a Docker dash dash version, I'll get a little output that looks something like this. Once I do that, I can kill my terminal, reopen it. I can run Docker PS and I'll get an output that looks like this. Now, if I stop this, on a Linux, you might be doing something like sudo system ctl, uh, sudo syst ctl start docker to start it, and then stop docker to stop it. But if it's running and I go ahead and quit it, quit docker desktop or sudo system ctl stop docker. If I run docker ps now, I'll get cannot connect to the docker daemon. But that's how we go ahead and get Docker installed. Like I said, this is an optional section. If you're struggling installing doc, if you're struggling with installing Docker, you can just move past this. Anvil is going to be perfect for pretty much everything that we're going to do. 
But once you have Docker installed, the next thing we'll want to do is install Node.js and NPM. Once again, we can come to the Node.js documentation by clicking that link in the GitHub repo associated with this course. And you can choose the version, you can choose your operating system, like Windows or Mac or Linux. If you're using WSL, definitely use Linux. And you can choose the package manager to install with, and you can run each one of these commands to make sure that it's actually installing correctly. Once you've installed it, you can run npm dash dash version, get something like this, npx dash dash version, get something like that, and then node dash dash version, and get something like this. So node is a pretty common, pretty popular package, so it's probably good for you to have this installed anyways, because a lot of projects and a lot of people work with NPM. So now that we have both of these installed, we're going to work with this ZK Sync CLI. So this ZK Sync CLI, you can find more information on this in the ZK Sync documentation. This is a tool that makes developing and interacting with ZK Sync a little bit easier. And we're gonna be using it to run a local ZK Sync node, like a minimized ZK Sync node. So to get started, we're going to run mpx zk sync cli dev config. And I'm going to go ahead and copy paste that in here. mpx zk sync cli dev config. And this is going to prompt us saying, hey, uh, what do you want to use? And I, we're going to say we want to run an in memory node. So this will be in Docker. So I know there's this section section that says Dockerized node, but we're going to do the in memory node here. Quick startup, no persistent state, only L2 node. The name of this might be a little bit different depending on when you watch this. And then we don't want either of these. We don't need a portal. We don't need a block explorer. If you want to fiddle with working with these yourself, feel free to do so. So I'm just going to go ahead and hit enter here as well. The configuration has been saved successfully. Now to spin up our Docker node. And actually before we do this, if you do like a little Docker PS, you'll see again a blank output here. Now if we paste this in, npx zk sync cli dev start and this is going to go ahead and spin up a zk sync node running in the background for us so unlike anvil which is kind of in a terminal and will always be in a terminal this is actually running in a docker cloud and we'll get a whole bunch of information here that is going to look pretty familiar with us but if i run docker ps now now i get this kind of wild output here but essentially we this docker ps command means hey there's a process running in the background in docker now if i were to quit docker so i just i just went ahead and i actually quit docker in the background now if i run docker ps you're going to get this cannot connect to the docker daemon hey is the docker daemon running if i also try to run mpx zk sync cli dev start i'm going to get kind of an error that looks like this cannot connect to the docker daemon is the docker daemon running so if you see something like this, you're having a hard time starting the Docker daemon. And I would honestly tell you, it's probably not worth figuring that out right now. So just move on, keep working with Anvil. Anvil is fantastic. So, so I'm going to start Docker back up in my background here in my little, my little Mac Docker application. So anyways, I just spun this back up and now I can go ahead and rerun this MPX ZK sync dev start. It's going to remember my config from before. And we're going to go ahead and get this in memory node spun up, right? I can run Docker PS. I can see that this is once and once again running and fantastic. You can see up here, it'll give us a chain ID, an RPC URL. And instead of giving like an output with a list of private keys and accounts, we can actually copy paste this link that it gives us. And it'll give us this list of account addresses and private keys in the ZK Sync docs that we can go ahead and use. So now that this is running, now that we have this RPC URL, we can go ahead and deploy our contract to our local ZK Sync chain the same way that we did with Anvil, except for we're going to be doing to this ZK Sync chain. So first, let's just check forge dash dash version. Okay, 0 .0 0.0.2, cool. That means I'm on the Foundry ZK Sync edition of this. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna do forge, create, simple storage, 
Now, this probably won't work, and I'll show you why in just a second, though. Dash dash RPC URL. We can just copy paste this RPC URL. Dash dash private key. And again, this is terrible to do private keys like this. I'm going to show you a better way very soon. Paste that in here. And then we have to do dash dash legacy dash dash ZK sync. Enter. And the reason I wanted to show you this is because we are going to run into an error. Let me zoom out just a hair. Libraries must specify a path. This is a bug. Consider reporting. Basically, the Foundry ZK Sync isn't clever enough to know where this simple storage contract is. So I'm actually going to delete my terminal here or hit Control C or get out of it however you want. We're going to open the terminal back up. We're going to run this command again and we're going to update it though. So instead of just saying simple storage, we're going to say SRC slash simple storage. We're going to give it the whole path. So it's SRC simple storage. And then we're also going to do a colon with simple storage like this. So we're saying at path SRC slash simple storage in this folder do Oops, excuse me, simple storage dot soul in this file, grab the simple storage contract and deploy that. And if we hit enter now, we'll see first it compiles successfully and then it goes ahead and deploys. Fantastic. And we can see as a deployer, deploy to transaction hash, etc. Now, if we didn't use this dash dash legacy, it'll also work, but it might not work for more complicated smart contracts that we're going to use in the future. So for now, I'll say just default to legacy. If you want to get more interesting, you don't do it with the dash dash CK sync. You will just get failed to serialize transaction address to to address is null. And we'll learn why that happens in the future with CK sync. So once you're done working with all this, of course, if you want to go ahead, you can close down, quit your Docker desktop, and then we can just run Foundry up to convert back to vanilla Foundry as opposed to being on Foundry ZK Sync. And now you've deployed a smart contract to a locally running ZK Sync node, which is pretty phenomenal. Now, I'm kind of fibbing to you. Scripting works for ZK Sync, the forge script script thing. It works for ZK Sync in some scenarios. However, because it's not super clear where it's not going to work. I'm just going to say for the duration of this course, for now, just assume it doesn't work. However, I did go ahead and deploy to a ZK Sync locally running node using Forge Script so I could show you something cool about Siri here. So I'm going to introduce a lot of different concepts to you, and it's not super important you understand everything right now. Later on in more advanced sections, we'll go deeper into these transaction types and deeper into the concepts that we're going to express here. Again, you don't have to actually deploy to the ZK Sync locally run a node. That is 100% optional. But if you were to do it with a script, you would get this broadcast folder with this chain ID. And I wanted to do that to actually show you something cool that I'm going to teach you now. Now, I know this was an optional section, but I went ahead and I did actually deploy these smart contracts to the ZK Sync local node as well. And if you did that, if you look in your broadcast folder, you'll probably see this 260 in here, right? Now in here, you'll see a 31337 folder and a 260 folder. These 31, oh, there's a lot of them in here. This 31337 represents all the scripts that we ran on our Anvil local chain. And since I've been recording for a while and I wanted to do a couple of trial runs, I've actually deployed a ton in here. And then there's our 260, which is our locally running ZK sync chain. If you went ahead and did that, again, you don't actually have to. And these folders contain information about when we ran those deploy scripts, right? Again, I did not teach you how to use the scripting functionality for ZK Sync, but we did actually go through that for Anvil. And going into these runs, we can actually learn something about transaction types. So let's look into these transactions that we sent to the 31337 chain ID, aka that Anvil chain. This can actually teach us something about different transaction types. Now, if I look in the run latest.json, when we scroll down in here, we can see a whole bunch of transactions. If we scroll down into this receipts section, we can see this type 0x2. However, if we flip on over to the 260 chain ID, right, this is going to be the chain ID of the ZK Sync 
local node that we were running and we go to run latest if we scroll around in here we scroll down we can see a bunch of stuff we can actually see in this transaction area we see a type 0x0 huh is there a receipts okay yep okay there's a receipts okay well maybe there's a type in here no we see logs status mm, i don't see i don't see a type in here that's actually because the foundry zk sync and the foundry report types a little bit differently but interesting so we see on the foundry we see a type 0x2 and on the zk sync we see a type somewhere in here type where is that type 0x0 well what if we were to deploy our smart contract again with regular vanilla foundry but we use that dash dash legacy command right so remember deploying with vanilla foundry to anvil we had a type 02 transaction in our receipts so let's go ahead let's do anvil copy this make a new one a new terminal now let's do forge script script deploy simple storage dot s dot sol dash dash rpc dash url http remember this is all in the github repo so you can go ahead and copy paste if you want to follow along dash dash private key we can go back here we can scroll it up and grab one of our private keys and remember putting your private key in plain text is terrible we'll teach you later how to actually fix that and then we do dash dash legacy dash dash broadcast this is now going to deploy our smart contract to anvil via a legacy transaction so if I go back to my 31337 which is my anvil deployments and I go to the run latest.json whoa in receipts I now have type 0x0 right if we go to this one right above it we still have type is 0x0 because these two are going to be the same but if we go to one past that now we scroll down we can see type 0x2 now if I were to run this script again without this legacy flag right I'm going to go ahead and press enter now we're going to get a new run latest and now the type 2 is back so this is showing that these transactions are actually different types so there's actually several different types of transactions in the EVM and era VM ecosystem so there's actually diff several different types of transactions in the EVM or the Ethereum and the ZK Sync ecosystem. We do a little bit of a walkthrough of these different transactions in a phenomenal blog that we have on the Cypher blog site. And the ZK Sync docs also do a great job of walking through the different transaction types. So on Ethereum, on ZK Sync, on all these chains, the original type of transaction was didn't have a name it was just called like transactions there was only one type of transaction however the e ethereum and the evm ecosystem quickly decided oh having a single type of transaction isn't that helpful we probably need to support multiple different types of transactions so they created an ethereum improvement proposal called type transaction envelope and don't worry too much about eips or these numbers or anything like that for now but basically they improved Ethereum, they approved the EVM to support multiple transactions. And all the original transactions, they just called legacy or type zero transaction. Then they created a type one transaction, which had this access list thing. We had this EIP 1559 or type two transaction, which as of recording is the default transaction. So that's why in Foundry, when you don't specify that dash dash legacy flag it automatically sends it as a type 2 transaction if you add the dash dash legacy flag it'll send it as a type 0 transaction now each one of these transactions have slightly different parameters and they look slightly different again you don't need to worry too much about this now I really just want to tell you there are several different types of transactions the other thing is back in our remix Back when we were deploying to ZK Sync, when we hit the deploy button, we had this weird signature thing come up. We had another transaction type if you looked at the MetaMask. It was a little bit weird because we signed something in our MetaMask, but we didn't send a transaction. And if you looked in your MetaMask, we had another transaction type, type 113 or 113. I'm going to go ahead and reject this. If you go to the ZK Sync docs, they do a great job of explaining 
type 113, where this is one of ZK Sync's superpower, where they have this account abstraction type transaction 113 or 0x71. This is the hex of 113. This is a transaction type specific to the ZK Sync ecosystem. And many different ecosystems have different types of transaction types. However, pretty much all EVM ecosystems have at least type 0, type 1, type 2, with type 2 or EIP 1559 being the default. Again, if these EIPs and numbers are kind of feeling like I'm pulling <laughs> magic words out of a hat, we'll explain EIPs and ERCs later on in the course. Now, as I said, you don't need to remember or understand everything that I'm saying right now. Just the takeaway that I want you to have is that I want you to know there are different transaction types in these ETH, these EVM and these ZK Sync ecosystems. If you see the dash dash legacy flag being passed, you know that you're passing a type zero transaction. If you don't have the dash dash legacy, you're probably going to be working with a type two. And I say probably because there are scenarios where you're going to work with a type one or a type three or a type, etc. So now, you know, there's different types of transactions under the hood. All right. So a little bit earlier in this course, we deployed to Sepolia, and then we just taught you a lot about working with ZK Sync, one of these rollups, one of these L2s. And actually deploying to Sepolia, deploying to that testnet actually simulated something. What we did actually simulated deploying to the Ethereum chain itself, deploying to a layer one, deploying to one of these chains, or really deploying to Ethereum, which is great. However, there's something we want to keep in mind. Like I said, like I've said earlier in this course, most projects nowadays, they don't deploy directly to Ethereum first. They'll deploy to an L2 or a layer two or these rollups as Kira has gone through for us. And if we go into our broadcast folder, right, into our 1155, again, if you haven't actually deployed to Spolia, don't worry, just kind of follow along with me. If we scroll into this run latest, we can see this gas used section. And we can also see this effective gas price, but let's look at the gas used. So we can convert that gas used hex number back to a real number with cast to base, paste it in, deck like so. And we'll see we used this much gas to deploy this smart contract. Cast to base is a tool that converts a hex number to its decimal equivalent or its numerical or integer equivalent. Oftentimes in the blockchain world, numbers are represented in their hexadecimal formats instead of the actual number formats. So when we saw the gas here, this 0x5747A is the hex version of the number 357,498. So that's why we had to do that conversion here. Now we can actually estimate how much this would cost us to deploy this to the Ethereum mainnet. On the testnet explorer, I can scroll down in here and I can see how much this would have cost me. Oh, by the way, you can see that transaction type here again. We can see that we used this much gas. Okay, that looks like it's exactly what we got in our foundry project. Okay, cool. We can see we have some gas fees here. And then we can see the final transaction fee, how much it costs right here, which is going to be the gas price times gas used. Okay, so this is the gas used. This is the gas used and this was the gas price. So what we can do then is we can take this gas used and we can go to Etherscan and we can go check kind of the most recent gas price of different transactions. So we can just pick kind of the most recent block. We'll go pick a, any transaction hash. We'll scroll down to more details. We can see, okay, gas fees. Okay, gas price is right here. And so what we can do then, we can pull up our little calculator and we can do the gas used of creating that simple storage contract times at 5.15. Maybe we could put the rest of it, but that's the approximate gas price. And this is the final value that we get. So this is how much gas it costs to deploy this. We can take this output that we get, go to maybe ethconverter.com. One gas is going to be a GUI. So we can just kind of paste it in here. We could see the total ETH amount. And then if this site doesn't update, we could just be like ETH to USD converter. And we can basically finally arrive at how much money this would cost if we were to deploy this to Ethereum. Just deploying this contract would cost us $7. And this is a very tiny, minimal, minuscule little contract here. This is it. 
right? This isn't a big contract. And there's code bases with thousands and thousands of lines of code. And this has like less than 30 and it costs us $7. So contracts deployed to the Ethereum main chain as a recording cost thousands or tens of thousands of dollars. And this is why a lot of people don't deploy to the Ethereum main chain because of how expensive it is. And this again goes back to why rollups are so important. Using the Ethereum chain can be incredibly expensive, which prohibits a lot of people from using it. So a lot of applications, a lot of people deploying smart contracts, they don't want to deploy to Ethereum because if it's expensive for them, it's expensive for everybody else. But they want the security of Ethereum, so they go ahead and they deploy to an L2. So now I'm not going to show you how to deploy this to ZK Sync Sepolia, but if you wanted to, the process is going to be pretty much identical to deploying to that ZK Sync locally running node. The only additional piece that you would need, of course, would be an RPC URL for ZK Sync Sepolia. We can actually get one of those from our friends over at Alchemy if you've already gone and signed up with Alchemy. And if you don't have an Alchemy subscription, a number of other RPC or node providers also support ZK Sync, like QuickNode, for example. So to get a ZK Sync Sepolia RPC, first we would go back over to Alchemy. We're gonna sign back into Alchemy and we're gonna create a new API key on Alchemy. So we're gonna go ahead and apps, create a new app. We're gonna switch now to ZK Sync. We're gonna do ZK Sync Sepolia and maybe we'll call it like testing testing like this and same thing in here we're going to select the API key and we're going to grab this HTTPS API key for the Alchemy ZK Sync. We're going to come back to Remix in our .env although you now know you're not going to do this private key in the .env anymore uh, but what we can do is we can say ZK Sync Sepolia RPC RPC URL equals and then paste that in there. So now we have this new RPC URL that we can use. So if we go to this site, l2fees.info, this will give us a better understanding of how much doing different operations costs. We can see on ZK Sync Era, which is the chain that we've been working with a lot, sending ETH costs less than a penny. A lot of these L2s are substantially cheaper versus something like Ethereum, which is gonna be substantially more expensive, which is why we want to deploy to these L2s in the first place. And if you did follow along with us, let's just do a little foundry up just so that we're back on vanilla foundry instead of foundry ZK sync. Now, Alchemy has a couple of other really cool features about it, especially when it comes to learning more about what's actually happening with our transactions. Whenever we send a transaction to a blockchain node, it actually enters something called the mempool. It's basically the place where transactions go before they get actually sent. And the Alchemy dashboard is a great place to actually view those transactions and see their status. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Vito from the Alchemy team, who's going to explain more about what Alchemy has to offer, some of the other cool parts of Alchemy and more. ZK Stark, ZK Snark, ZK Proof, ZK... Oh, wow. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm GM GM everyone and welcome to this brand new video. I'm Vito and today I'm going to walk you. <sighs> this is not my channel. This is not even Alchemist channel. Where the heck? Oh my god, this is the latest Patrick Collins video about Foundry that everyone must watch. Uh, well, welcome everyone. I am Vito. And thank you, Patrick, for hosting this cameo. I guess my job today is to tell you a bit more about what Alchemy is, what we do, how we do it, and how you can get the most out of it. Well, before getting started, let me quickly, quickly introduce myself. I am Vito, lead developer experience at Alchemy, blockchain developer and web free content creator on a mission to onboard 1 million developers onto web free. Of course, today we're not here to talk about me, but we're here to talk about how Alchemy can help your decentralized applications scale to billions of users. So to get started, what is Alchemy? Well, Alchemy is a node provider and web free developer tooling platform, powering hundreds of thousands of web three and web two applications out there. Things like OpenSea, Nifty Gateway, but also ZeroX, Argent, Dapper, but as well as big, ma massive Web2 companies such as Adobe, Shopify, and Stripe. The question here probably is, why do these companies use us? Why Alchemy? Well, that's a, the question we'll try to answer here. Briefly, the thing is, when you need to develop an application, chances are you won't run the servers your code, your code will run on. And most likely, you won't even develop the deployment and integration pipelines for it. 
To do this, you will use services such as AWS, Azure, Google Cloud. Well, Alchemy does exactly this, but for Web3. You can see it as the AWS of Web3 with APIs, SDKs, libraries that will simply make your developer experience better. But how do we do that? Well, we do it in mainly three ways. The first one is the super node, a blockchain proprietary engine that hacks as a load balancer on top of your node and makes sure you always get the latest available data from the blockchain. On top of the super node, we built the announced APIs. The announced APIs are a set of APIs that will allow you to pull data from the blockchain with ease. Here, you can see how we envision this, with the Alchemy Supernode at the center as the core infrastructure powering its ecosystem all around, such as our announced APIs, but also our monitoring tools, and of course, supporting all the chains that we support to date. I will get back to it in a few seconds. But the question is, of course, how do you get started? Well, the first thing that we're gonna do is navigating on alchemy.com, and we're gonna create a new account. Creating an account on alchemy.com is completely free, and actually, cool thing is that you'll be able to scale your application using our freemium plan because it's quite generous. So don't be concerned about paying anything. Everything you'll see today and probably in Patrick's course is completely free to use. Let's go back to creating a new account. In this case, I will just sign in. Of course, I already have an account. So I'll click on sign in. And as soon as we'll open this window, you will see all of your applications. Of course, if this is the first time you're logging in on Alchemy, you will only see the demo application, but no worries, we're gonna learn how to create a new application right now. Super important, click on Create App and let's give it a name. So we're gonna call it Patrick is cool, and I'm gonna use underscores just because of personal preference. Feel free to use spaces or name your application the way you want. We're gonna also give a description. This is optional, you don't have to, but I really think that Patrick is cool. And then we're gonna select a chain. As we said before, we support the majority of EVM compatible chains. As you can see here, we support Ethereum, Polygon POS, also ZK EVM, as well as Optimism and Astar. And on top of that, we support Solana, a non EVM chain. Here you can select your chain and here you can select your network. In this case, we will go for Ethereum mainnet, but feel free to try out all the other networks and testnets, of course. We have one for all of these. Uh, mainnet that we support. So we'll create the new app. And once the app has been created, I can just go and search for my name. So Patrick is cool and click on my application. Here we go. Once the application has opened, you will be able to see the application specific dashboard. And this is a big change, big game changer for all decentralized application developers because this gives you full visibility over your application and infrastructure health. You'll be able to see things such as latency, compute units, that, it, that is how many RPC calls are eating your nodes, as well as the success rate of your calls, the throughput, and so on and so forth. Super useful when you need to debug. So let's say that here you see 98% of success rate, you'll be able to understand why your transactions are not going through. Well, let's actually do an example. Let me go back and find an application that has actual calls. So here we go. I just navigated to this demo key application that as you can see has a ton of calls, but also as you can see, it has a success rate of 98.5%. That means that 1.5% of our calls are failing to go through. But how do you understand that? How do you debug this? Well, if you are not using Alchemy, chances are that to debug your RPC calls, you will have to spin up your own nodes or be run a local node. And in that case, you'll be able to see the logs coming from the node. Otherwise, there is no possibility to see the logs coming from the node. This is not something you will see on Etherscan. Using Alchemy, you'll be able to see all the issues related to your calls as well as the known issues related to your calls in this dashboard. So let's say that we have 1.5% of calls not going through. What we can do is go on the recent invalid request tab. And here, all the requests that didn't go through will be listed, as well as the reason why they didn't go through. For example, here we have an ETH send row transaction that didn't go through because there weren't sufficient gas funds. Well, let's take another one. Here, execution reverted, for example, means that probably there is a problem with the smart contract. So as you can see, 
debugging as well as you can see other information on the left hand side but I will go back at this in a few seconds because I want to show you another tool that is even more precise to see the information about the actual request. Here you'll be able to debug your RPC calls with super ease. On top of that, as I was saying, we have other tools to help you debug and get more visibility on your application. So if you click on the menu and here what we can do is navigate on the mempool. And the mempool is actually just like the mempool that you might think about when you're thinking about Ethereum. So it's a place where all of your transactions are and you can see the status of the transaction, the information about the transaction, what if the transaction is going through, if it didn't go through, if it's spending for hours, if it got mined, how much it costs and so on and so forth. So let's say we, we just navigated on our mempool watcher and here we have all the transactions going through on our applications. Here I have a bunch of applications, so that's why I'm seeing a lot of transactions. Here on the top, you can see all the mined transactions. So the transactions that already went through, that can be mined or validated. The pending transactions, um, let me just select one application because of course, otherwise it's gonna take a long time. Here you have all the pending transactions. That mean all the transactions that are waiting to be mined or validated. And here you have dropped and dropped and replaced. So transactions that have been dropped, canceled or replaced by other transactions with the same nonce, the same call data and the same gas fees or dropped means there are transactions that have been canceled and won't be validated or mined. But on top of that, you can get even more information on these calls, on these transactions. If I click here on the Ash, this won't bring me on Etherscan, but will bring me on the mempool transaction summary page. And here I can see all the information about the transaction. I can see how much gas it costed, uh, which network it was on, of course, uh, the transaction hash, as well as the from address. So who sent the transaction and who's sending the transaction to, as well as the value inside the transaction, the time it took to get sent and the time it took to get um, validated. This is more clear on validated transactions where everything has already been filled out. So I can go back in my mine page. So here we go. I can select one. And as you can see here, I have all the information. So I have max fee per gas. I have the transaction type. So this was using the EIP 1559 and a bunch of other information about the transaction itself. Super helpful to debug and get full visibility over it. All right, now that we've quickly gone through how Alchemy works, what it is, and how its features can help your developer experience become way better and develop faster, I don't want to steal much more of your time while learning during this amazing course. So what I'm going to do is leave you with a couple of resources that will make your developer experience with Alchemy even better. The first one is our documentation. So our documentation has everything you need to get started using our APIs, SDK, libraries, and also tools that we didn't have the time to go through today, such as our generalized custom GraphQL webhooks that allow you to pull data real time from the blockchain through GraphQL queries. On top of that, you will also have tutorials and guides to build your applications and complement the knowledge you're creating during this course. Of course, follow us on Twitter at Alchemy Platform or Alchemy Learn. And if you want to shoot me a message telling me the amazing things that you're building while learning from the Patrick's course, please shoot it at Vito Stuck on Twitter. Thank you so much, Patrick, once again for hosting us. And thank you everyone for sticking with us for 12 minutes. It's been a pleasure. See you around and happy building. But for this one, you should be incredibly proud of yourself. You just did an entire project in Foundry. Huge congratulations. So let's do a quick recap of everything we learned and then we'll move to the next project. And yes, we are going to push our next project up to GitHub and do a lot more advanced Foundry and a lot more advanced tooling here. So let's do a quick recap of what we learned so far. Well, first, we learned how to create new Foundry projects with Forge, Dash, Dash, and Knit, which will give us all of these folders on the left-hand side here to actually start working with our projects in a more professional environment. We learned about some of the basic Foundry commands, such as cast, anvil, and forge. Forge is used for compiling and interacting with our contracts. Cast is used for interacting with contracts that have already been deployed. And anvil is used to deploy a local blockchain, similar to Ganache, which is another local blockchain that we worked with. We learned that Whenever we send a transaction on our MetaMask, we're actually making an HTTP POST request to this RPC URL. And we can also take an RPC URL from a node as a service like Alchemy and use it to actually send transactions from our Foundry projects. 
We learned both how to actually compile our code in Foundry and then also write a script to deploy it directly in Solidity. We've learned some very basic information about keeping our private keys safe. For the rest of the course, we're gonna be working with a .env file, but when we work with real money, we might not wanna actually have our private key in plain text ever. So we learned how to deploy our contracts to a blockchain programmatically, and then we learned how to interact with them using the cast keyword and send to send transactions and then cast call to read from those contracts. We've learned how to auto format our contracts with forge format, and we learned the manual way to actually verify one of our contracts on the blockchain. Whew, we learned a lot here. So be absolutely sure to take a minute to go on a walk, go get a cup of coffee, go grab some ice cream, go post on Twitter that you've taken an extra step in your Web3 developer journey. You should be incredibly proud of yourself for getting this far. Like I said earlier, installing some of these tools like VS Code and Foundry can be one of the hardest parts of this entire course. So if you're in here, if you're working with me, you're doing fantastic. We've got a lot more to go, but just by getting this far, you've done incredibly well. So with that being said, take that break. Remember, breaks are good for your brain. Take that break and we'll see you in the next one. All right, now welcome to lesson seven, the Foundry Fund Me. If you're on the GitHub repo associated with this course, you can of course scroll down to lesson seven here and the code is all gonna be right here. This is going to be the first code base that you actually push up to GitHub yourself. Doing this is an incredibly important step in your smart contract journey. Yes, being on GitHub or GitLab or Radical or some version control system like this is incredibly important for being a part of the Web3 ecosystem. We're gonna be using GitHub because it's the most popular at the, at this time. So let's do a little walkthrough of what we're actually going to be building here. We're going to be using the FundMe contracts that we created before. And if we go into the SRC of this folder, you can see we have our FundMe contract in here. And you can see we're using the more advanced syntax here. We've got all caps for our constants. We're using I underscore for our mutables, S underscore for storage or state variables. And I know we talked a lot about storage and state and we didn't really explain what it was though. And so additionally, we're gonna finally learn what this storage stuff really means. And we have an example that we're gonna go through called fun with storage. We're gonna learn how to, in a professional way, deploy this code using Foundry scripts, we're also gonna learn some really cool stuff about interacting with storage. We're gonna learn how to make it easier to deploy these contracts on different chains that require different addresses. And we're gonna learn how to use Foundry scripting to actually interact with our contracts in reproducible scripts instead of always from the command line. We're gonna learn how to make our contracts more gas efficient so that people spend less gas using our transactions. We're gonna learn a little bit more about advanced debugging techniques and more on making a professional Foundry setup. And additionally, we're gonna learn how to write really fantastic tests for our contracts. Writing tests is an essential piece of becoming a powerful and effective smart contract engineer. So a lot of this lesson, we're going to be writing awesome tests. When you get to the end of this project, you should 100% push this up to your personal GitHubs and share this on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on Lens Protocol, whatever, because this is going to be a huge, huge step in your journey. And, and at the end of this, you're gonna understand what all of this code does and be able to use it and talk about it effectively. And just a quick note to make this, and just a quick note to make sure you absolutely smash this project out of the park. We're not going to be deploying to ZK Sync or worrying about deploying to an L2. Let's just 100% get you to the end of this so that you can push this up to your GitHub, get that portfolio going, and be incredibly excited for this. And then we'll learn how to deploy one of these more advanced smart contracts to ZK Sync in the smart contract lottery, which is going to be outstanding. So with all that being said, let's go ahead, let's jump into the code and let's start building our Foundry Fund V. All right, so here we are in our VS code and we're in our Foundry F23 folder, which if we type LS right now, 
we just have our foundry simple storage. This is the only folder that we've created. So let's create a new one. We'll do MKDIR, which stands for make directory, foundry fund me F23 and hit enter. Now, if we hit LS, which stands for list, we can see these two folders and we can type code foundry tab F U N D tab and it'll auto complete and we'll hit enter. And this will, will open up a new VS code in that folder, which of course is going to be blank. Now, if I pull our terminal back up, we can run and we pull up the Explorer. We can run our command to initialize a blank foundry project. So we can do, of course, forge init or forge init dash dash force. And we get our basic project set up here. Fantastic. So we have some tests, SRC and scripts. We know what SRC is. We haven't worked with tests, but we have worked with scripts. Most of the time, Foundry will come default with this counter thing. And if your Foundry doesn't come with these, don't worry, just watch for now. But if it does, you can play along with me. If we look in SRC or source, we see this counter.sole contract. It's a very basic contract. We have a set number, which takes a UN256 new number as an input parameter and changes this storage variable to whatever that new number is. We also have this function increment, which just uses this plus plus syntax. This plus plus syntax is equivalent to saying number equals number plus one. So whenever we see plus plus, that's the same thing as number equals number plus one. We have a script here, which doesn't really do a whole lot of anything, but we have this test, which we haven't talked about. Testing our smart contracts and testing our code is absolutely essential to being a top blockchain engineer. You'll see out throughout the rest of this course, we're actually gonna spend a decent time inside of this test folder, inside of this test file, testing our code, testing our smart contracts. And if you run forge test in your terminal and you do have this counter.t.sol, what it will do is it'll compile all of our code and then it'll run these tests from this test file. So we see two test pass for this test file, and they're gonna be test increment, which is a function here, and test set number. What the test keyword does is it runs this function in our test file, it runs all the code inside of here, and it checks to see if some assert is accurate. So what this test does is it first calls this setup function, so it, it'll deploy a new counter contract, sets the number to zero, and then increments that number by one, and then we check to see, okay, well, is the new number of counter equivalent to one? So this assert equals saying, hey, is this equal to this? And since we incremented the number by one, these do indeed, this is indeed true, these two are equal. So that's kind of the basic rundown of this test file. We're gonna be going over it a lot more very soon. So to keep going, let's go ahead and get this set up the way we want. We can delete the three counter files because we don't need them. We're gonna be using our own contracts. Now for this section, we actually wanna start from lesson four, Remix Fund Me. We don't wanna copy paste from our Foundry Fund Me. This is because we're actually gonna modify our Foundry Fund Me a little bit to make it a lot easier to write tests and interact with. So for now, we wanna to go to the Remix Fund Me and copy paste the contracts from here. So we'd come, copy this whole thing, Go to SRC, let's create a new file. We'll call this fundme.sol, paste it in here. Paste it into fundme, and then go back. We'll go over to price converter. We're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna copy this whole thing. We're gonna make our price converter.sol, paste it in here like that. And all right, great. Now, if we try to compile this right now though, forge build or forge compile, you'll see we get some errors. We get a few errors. On eight, we see compiling. Unable to resolve imports at Chainlink contracts, blah, blah, blah. It's having a hard time with both of these imports. In Remix, when we do this at Chainlink slash contracts, Remix automatically reaches out to the NPM package repository. However, Foundry doesn't do this. We need to be very explicit and tell Foundry exactly where we need to pull our dependencies from. And we actually need to download this directly from GitHub. There's a package out here called Smart Contract Kit slash Chainlink Brownie Contracts that has all of the contracts that we need. And this is the GitHub repository that we're gonna pull from. 
I'm going to go ahead and use 1.1.1 because as of recording, that's the latest release. However, throughout this video, you might see references to 0.6.1. When I originally made this course a year ago, that was the most recent version. So I've updated it as of recently to this more recent version. That's why sometimes in the code base, you'll see this shared folder here and sometimes you won't. So if you see that discrepancy, that's why you're seeing it. So what we're going to do is we're going to copy this link and go back into our terminal and we're going to say we're going to install this dependency with forge install and actually we don't need the whole link we just need the name of the org and the name of the repository so it's going to be smart contract kit slash chain link brownie contracts forge install paste that in here and most of the time you're also going to want to add this hash dash no commit and just to make sure that we're working on the exact same version, you can also add this at sign here and choose a version in the releases tab. I'm going to use 0.6.1 since that's the latest version, 0.6.1. For now, just auto default to adding this dash dash no commit. You'll learn about why we need to add that later. But let's go ahead and hit enter. And now it's going to say installing Chainlink Brownie contracts, and it'll give you the path to where we're actually installing them. If you want to download a very specific version of the Chainlink Brownie contracts or any package, you can just add the version number at the end of the install. So we can do forge install smart contract kit slash Chainlink Brownie contracts, or we can do the full GitHub name at 1.1.1 dash dash no commit dash dash no hyphen commit like this and that will install this exact version here you can also do it without the full github link so we can do it just with smart contract kit slash chain link running contracts like this and that will do the same thing so in a lot of this video we're using 0.6.1 however the github repo as of today is 1.1.1 so just keep that in mind as we're going along. So just keep that in mind as we go on here. If we go to our Explorer now and we open the lib folder, we can see we now have Forge STD, which comes default with Foundry, but we also have Chainlink Brownie contracts. And if we click into here and we click contracts, we can see all the list of all these contracts that come with downloading that package. So now we have all these contracts locally in our own environment. And in here, of course, is going to be our aggregator v3 interface.sol. It's in contracts, src, v0.8, interfaces, aggregator v3 interface.sol. So we can go ahead and, and import from here, but we need to do one other thing. Right now, in our contract, we're saying import aggregator v3 interface from at chainlink slash contracts. We need to tell Foundry that at chainlink slash contracts should point to this lib folder. So we need to create something called a remapping. In our foundry.toml under profile.default, we can create a new section called remappings equals, and we'll do this for now. And if you wanna see the entire list of possibilities that can go in here, you can click this link that comes with the repo, which brings you to this config section. And it has all these different endpoints and all these different parameters we can use in our foundry.config. Yep, there's a lot of them. But in this remapping section, we're going to put some text. We're going to tell Foundry, hey, anytime you see at Chainlink slash contracts, that should equal or you should redirect or you should point to the lib slash Chainlink Brownie contracts slash contracts folder. So we're saying, hey, Foundry, if you see this, replace it with this. So in fundme.sol, it's equivalent to us swapping this out with the path to Chainlink Brownie contracts in the library. Cool. Now, of course, if we try to compile, do clear, forge build or forge compile, we still get an error because we can't find price converted at soul. So let's do the same thing. Let's go back to the GitHub repo associated with this course, go to SRC price converter, and let's copy this whole thing. Folders, new file price converter dot soul. We'll paste it in here. Now we'll hit clear. We'll do forge build and awesome compiler runs successful. We can see we've got our little out folder with all this stuff in here about all the compiled stuff. Fantastic. 
All right, great. Also, so it's a best practice when you name your errors, you name them with the contract name and then two underscores. This way, when you do get this error, you can very easily tell what contract it came from. In this case, it came from the FundMe contract. So this is just a nice convention for error handling. So now we have our contract actually compiling correctly. Next, normally we'd go ahead and write our deploy script, but let's actually get used to writing some tests. And we're gonna refactor these tests a couple of times. So stay with me here. You ready? All right, let's write our first test. Now, like I said, tests are absolutely critical for our smart contract development journey. And if you try to deploy your smart contracts without tests or go to a smart contract auditor without tests, they're gonna turn you away. You absolutely are not writing mature code if you're not doing tests. And writing badass tests separates a lot of the mediocre devs between the really good devs. So let's write some badass tests. For now, we're just gonna go ahead and we'll create a new file. We'll call it fundmetest.t.sol. This .t.sol is just a convention in Solidity for saying, hey, this is a test file. So fundmetest.t.sol. And we're gonna write our tests in here in Solidity, exactly as we would write any other Solidity contract. So we're gonna get this started the exact same way we get anything else started. So we'll do SPDX, license, identifier MIT. My GitHub Copilot automatically recommended that. So I just went ahead and hit tab, drag my Solidity, GitHub Copilot again, give me some decent recommendations. And then we can say contract fund me test. Now the Forge standard library has a couple of standard packages or standard contracts that we can import to make running our tests easier. That assert command, for example, is something that Foundry automatically has built in. So for now, we'll do import test from std slash test.sol. And we'll say fund me test is test. So we're, we're going to inherit everything from this test contract. And if you command click into here, you'll see this abstract contract test is a whole bunch of other stuff. And these are all different contracts that help us write our tests. So what's the first thing that we should do when we write our tests? Well, we want to test that our FundMe contract is doing what we want it to do. So one of the first things that we're going to have to do is actually deploy that contract. Now, pretty soon we're going to learn how we can actually import our deploy scripts in here to make our deployment environment the exact same as our testing environment. But for now, we're going to just deploy our contracts right in this test folder. So we're gonna say function setup external like this. And on all of our tests, the first thing that happens is this setup function. And then here is where we're going to actually deploy our contract. Now I do wanna show you something though. Here's what one of our tests is gonna look like. We're gonna say function test demo. We'll make this public. I'm doing this just to have a demo test. If this is your entire test file and you pull up our terminal, and we run forge test, you'll see it'll run this and everything will pass. Oh, I should spell external, right? Now, if we run this, we'll see compiler run successful and we'll see test demo went ahead and passed here. However, setup always runs first. For example, if we have unit 256 number equals one, and then setup, we say number equals two, and then we run test demo where we say assert equals number in two, clear, and run our test, we'll see this indeed does pass. So we first run our setup function, and then we run our tests. Another way to actually test this and actually do some debugging is using something called console.log. So if you control click, if you command or control click or just command P to test.sol, this test.sol is a huge file. And another library that it comes packed with is this thing called the console. You go to the Forge documentation, it talks about this thing called console logging. And we can actually do print statements that will print stuff out from our tests and from our smart contracts. So if I import this console into here, and then I do function test demo public, and I do console.log number, I should get printed out to our terminal, the number associated with number, which should be two. I can also do something like console.log hello, with an exclamation mark. Now, if I pull up the terminal, let's clear what we have so far, and we run forge test-vv, this dash-vv 
specifies the visibility of logging in this test. We can have one, two, three, four, or five. We're just gonna go with two right now. We should see those two logs output. And we do indeed. We see a new section of our output here where we have logs and we see two and hello. We minimize our terminal. We change this to hi mom, pull up the terminal, run it again with the dash VV. We now indeed see two and hi mom. And this can be an easy way for us to start debugging, but it's something I wanted to show you just to show you again, hey, this runs first and then this runs. We're gonna leave console in here for now because you're likely gonna wanna use it later when you run into issues and when you start debugging yourself. All right, great. So now we know how to write a basic test and how the test actually gets set up. And we know a little bit about console logging. Let's go ahead and let's deploy our contract in this setup function. So in order to deploy it, we're gonna have to obviously have this contract know about it. So we're gonna say import fund me from, we're gonna go down a directory. So we're gonna go, so the two dots stands for going down a directory because this is in fund me. So we go down to, to this overall file and then we're gonna go slash src slash fund me dot soul and GitHub Copilot and VS Code are actually even helping me out a little bit there. Now that we have our fund me, we can actually deploy this in our setup. And then actually let's get rid of these lines because we don't need them anymore. So in our setup now, we're gonna say fund me, fund me, right? And so this has a capital F, this has a lowercase f, these are slightly different, equals new fund me. Fund me, fund me equals new fund me, right? A little confusing, but we're saying our fund me variable of type fund me is gonna be a new fund me contract. And if we go to our fund me, we go to the constructor here, we can see that it doesn't take any input parameters, so we can actually just go ahead and deploy this as we see fit. Those of you watching though, know that this address here only works for Sepolia, and we'll see how we can work with this in a little bit. But we've actually deployed our FundMe contract like this. Now in our demo, we can test this FundMe contract, and we could pick a function or a public variable to check to see if what we're working with is good. So for example, since minimum USD is a public variable, we could check to see if the minimum USD is indeed five or five times 10 raised to the 18 or just you know 5e18. So what we could do in our test demo, we could see, we could change the name of this to test minimum dollar is five. I like to make my test names very verbose to explain exactly what they're gonna be doing. But in this function here, we would then call this minimum USD function and make sure that it's equal to five or five E18. In order to call this, we need access to this fund me. And since it's scoped in this setup, let's go ahead and make it a storage or state variable by putting it up here and initializing it in the setup. So now that we've scoped it in this entire contract, we can now do fund me minimum USD. And this test contract gives us access to this assert equal function, and we can just wrap our whole test up like this. So now that we have this, we can pull our terminal back up and run forge test. And fantastic, we see compiler run successful. Test minimum dollar is five is now passing. Great. If we change this to six, we should see that actually fail. So running forge test now, we'll see that it indeed failed because the starting minimum USD is five, and we're trying to check to see if it's six. So let's change this back to five, clear the terminal, rerun the terminal, and boom, compiler runs successful. Awesome, you just run your first basic test. Great job. When you're working with systems where you don't have to work with any external contracts, just continuing to write your tests like this is a great practice. And with the advent of AI, we can go even further with this. So let's go ahead and write another test. Maybe let's check to see that the owner is actually the message.sender. So what we'll do is we could say function test owner is message sender public. And we could say assert equal. And this is the other good thing about writing very verbose tests. It gives GitHub Copilot a better idea of what you wanna do. I'm actually gonna go ahead and hit tab again here, but assert equal message dot, excuse me, assert equal fund me I underscore owner is equal to message.sender. What I can do now, let's go ahead and write forge test. Compiler successful. 
Uh oh, it looks like this actually failed. How can we find out why this failed or what's going on? Well, we can do a lot of different things here. We re learned recently about console.logs. So we could console.log out the actual owner and console.log the message.sender as our starting point. So let's go ahead and clear that. Rerun forge test with two Vs so that we can see our console.log outputs. Huh, we can see that indeed, these are two different addresses. The reason they're two different addresses is technically in our setup function, the fundme test is the contract that deployed our fundme address and would be the owner. Down here, our message.sender is whoever's calling the fundme test. So it kind of looks like this. Us is calling fundme test, which then deploys fundme. Up here, this fundme bit is basically us calling to fundme test, which then will deploy the fundme. So the owner of fundme is actually fundme test and not us. Down here, we shouldn't be checking to see if message.sender is the owner, but we should be checking to see if fundme test is the owner. So instead we could say address this and delete these. Let's see if that works. Aha, that's exactly what the issue was. Great job. So you'll see how using some of these console.logs can be helpful. And like I said, we're going to continue to find more and more helpful ways to write tests. But let's take a pause on these tests for now because we're going to come back to them and refactor them pretty soon. If you've written just these tests, great job. And if you want to even pause and try to write some more tests yourself, feel free. But we're actually going to run into an issue. One of the issues is that we're hard coding this contract address in here. And this contract address only exists on Sepolio, but we're testing on not Sepolio, we're testing on our local chain. So how are we going to deal with that? Keep that question in the back of your mind as we continue with this section. Let's go ahead and let's move on to writing our deploy scripts because we know that we're going to have to deploy this at some point anyways. So let's go ahead and let's write a new file called deploy fundme.s.sol. Remember the .s is a convention that we use to say something is a script. And in here, we're going to do the same thing. SPDX, license identifier MIT. I went ahead and hit tab. Feel free to slow me down if I'm talking too fast or the tabs are too fast. Copilot also gives me the pragma solidity. Now we're going to say contract deploy fund me like this. And remember, since we're using a script in Foundry, we're going to need to import script from forge std script.sol. Once again, GitHub Copilot, thank you for letting me just hit tab. And of course, since we're deploying fundme, we're going to need to import fundme from dot dot slash src slash fundme dot sol. Great. As we know, in order to run a script, we're going to say function run. And remember, if this is confusing to you, Feel free to go back to our lesson six to remember how we did this before. This is going to be an external function. And in here, we're going to say vm.start broadcast fund me, lowercase fund me equals new fund me. And then we're going to say vm.stop broadcast. And we can go ahead, try to make sure this runs by running forge script, script deploy fund me dot s dot sol. Oops, it's saying I can't find the VM keyword. That's because we need to do is script. It's clear, let's redo. Unused local variable. Oh, we actually don't even need this line. We can just say new fund me. We don't love warnings. So let's just do this again. Hopefully we get no warnings. And great, compiler runs successfully. Script ran successfully. If you wish to simulate on-chain transactions, pass an RPC URL. So, fantastic. Now, what's one of the most important pieces of our FundMe that we should absolutely get right? Well, obviously the funding. We wanna make sure that this conversion rate is actually working. And in order for this conversion rate to actually be working, we need to make sure that we're actually able to get the version from our aggregator v3 interface. We're able to interact with them correctly. Let's use this get version function to try testing if our price feed integrations are working correctly. We know from Remix that this get version should return version four. So what we can do is we can go back to our test now and write a, a new test. We can say function test price 
feed version is accurate. Like this, and we'll say now, we'll say fund me dot get version like this. This should return four, and that's a uint two fifty six. So we could say uint two fifty six version equals fund me dot get version, and then we could say assert equal version four. What do you think will happen when we run this test? Do you think this will pass? Go ahead, pause the video and write down what you think will happen. Well, when we run forge test, we actually get an EVM revert. Huh, why did this revert? We don't really have that much information. Now, something that's really annoying is that we're still running these tests and we don't care about them. So what we can do is we can double click this function, copy it, let's clear the terminal. We can do forge test dash M, paste this in here, and now we'll only run that single test. Awesome. But we still don't have that much detail in here. Okay, let's clear. Let's change the visibility using two Vs. Okay, that didn't really do anything. Let's use three Vs. Oh, now we got some more information here. It looks like we get a what's called a stack trace of the error that we're getting. And it looks like we're calling our fund me test, we're calling this test price feed version is accurate. We're calling get version and that get version is reverting. It doesn't tell us why it's reverting, but we know that it's reverting because we're calling a contract address that doesn't exist. Remember, when we run tests in Foundry, when we don't specify a chain, Foundry will automatically spin up an Anvil chain and then delete it right after the test is done. So when we run forge test and we don't give it an RPC URL, it's going to spin up a completely new blank Anvil chain and run our tests. And we're making a call to a contract that doesn't exist. So obviously we're going to get an error because nothing exists at that address. So what can we do about this? Well, we can do a couple of things. And in this course, we're going to talk about four different types of tests, unit, integration, forked and staging. Forked can kind of be considered like a unit slash integration add on, but I think it's important to call out as something a little bit different here. This is something known as a unit test. A unit test is where we test a very specific piece or a specific part of our code. For example, here we're testing a single function. We're testing get version. We're testing to make sure that works correctly. So that's going to be considered a unit test. However, one could argue that it's also an integration test because we're testing this function works. And this function actually calls out to another contract. So in this case, we're testing actually multiple different contracts are working correctly together. A forked test is when we test our code on a simulated real environment. And we'll talk about this soon. And staging test is actually when we deploy our code to something like a testnet or even a mainnet and run all of our tests in that real environment to make sure things actually work correctly. These are all important and they have different trade-offs and they have different best times to use them. For the purposes of this course, we're gonna focus on number one, kind of number two, and especially number three. We're not gonna to do too much staging tests in this course. However, it is definitely something important, definitely something to consider. I've seen protocols skip this step and get screwed because their production environment was completely different than their testing environment. And I'll explain what this actually looks like in a little bit. But let's go back to the problem that we're working with here. What can we do to work with these addresses outside of our system? How do we test our test price feed version when we're working with Forge and Anvil? Well, one thing that we can do is when we run our command here, we can pass what's called a dash dash fork URL. And we can go back to Alchemy, we'll sign back in and go to our, we'll grab our API key. And just so that we'll have it, we're going to create dot env we're gonna say sepolia rpc url equals that and we're gonna make sure the dot env is in our dot get ignore okay great and then actually let's run source dot env so now if we run echo sepolia rpc url we see that we're successfully using this as an environment variable but if we hit up a couple times we can now run this test Price feed version is accurate with a dash dash fork dash URL dollar sign Sepolia RPC URL. This is how we access our Sepolia environment variable. And what will happen is Anvil will actually get spun up, 
but it'll take a copy of this Sepolia RPC URL. It'll spin up an Anvil, but it'll simulate all of our transactions as if they're actually running on the Sepolia chain. So it'll pretend to deploy and read from the Sepolia chain as opposed to a completely blank chain. So if I run this now, what do you think will happen? Whoa, we see we go ahead and we get an okay here. We can see we're getting returned the hex value of four, and we can see that in our test here, we're actually getting four returned. And if we go over to our alchemy node, we hit a little refresh here, we can scroll down and we can see recently, we made a whole bunch of calls to our alchemy node. When we use a fork URL, we're gonna simulate what's on that actual chain. And this is a great way for us to easily test our contracts on an actual network. Now, the downside of doing these forks is that you're gonna make a lot of API calls to your Alchemy node, which can run up your bill, which is why I still think, I still think it's important to write as many tests as possible as you can without forking. But there's going to be a lot of tests that you have to run that can only be done on a fork or using mocking. to Make sure that we get plenty of coverage to test all of our contracts. And that's another interesting thing that you hear me talk about is coverage. So if we delete all this, we can also run this thing called forge coverage. And then if you do dash dash RPC URL or fork URL, those are the same thing. And we can actually see how many lines of our code are actually tested. So if I run forge coverage with fork URL, we'll run our entire test suite, and then we'll actually see how much of our test suite how much of our code is actually tested. Right now, as you can see, a lot of our code is read and not tested, right? Fundme.soul has barely any tests. Priceconverter.soul has barely any tests. We wanna get this up as high as possible. Now, sometimes it's infeasible or doesn't make sense to bring this up to 100%, but 16% is incredibly low. As we're continuing with this course, I'm not always gonna write tests that bring us up to 100%. And the times that I don't, it's on you to actually try to see if you can bring the number up higher or if it even makes sense to bring the number up higher. But in any case, we're gonna set up our contracts here to write an elaborate set of tests so that we can maximize our test coverage. We can write unit tests, integration tests, fork tests, and staging tests, and all that good stuff. And if this is a little bit confusing to you right now, this is one of these times when I am gonna say, don't worry. The more we work with it, the more that it'll make sense to you. Just continue to follow along with me for now, and it'll become clear as we do more of it. Now, the thing is, we wanna make this process even more robust. Right now, our contracts are hard-coded so that this will only work for Sepolia. Sepolia is the only chain that we can deploy this contract to, and it's the only chain that we can actually test our contracts on. That's incredibly restrictive. And if we were to go to change our minds and deploy to a different chain, we'd have to refactor our entire code base. We'd have to consistently update all the addresses in here, both in FundMe and of course in our price converter. And it could take a lot more work to get that done correctly. So what we really wanna do is we wanna make it such that whenever we deploy our contracts, we deploy them in a way that's modular with addresses or external systems. If we deploy our code without hard-coded addresses like this, we can actually make our deployments more modular, deploy to other chains much easier, and actually test much easier no matter what chain we're working on. So we're actually gonna do a little bit of refactoring of our core code base so that it's not just hard-coded to Sepolia. So let's go back to the FundMe. Oh, and we actually wanna do, looks like I copied this wrong. This should be FundMe underscore underscore not owner like this. But let's come back to the FundMe and let's update this so that we're not hard-coding the address here. What we can do is we can actually pass a constructor parameter so that whenever we deploy this contract, we deploy it with the address that we wanna use. And this address will depend on the network we're actually deploying to. When you go back through your code and you change the way it's architected, but you don't really change a lot of the functionality, that's something called refactoring your code. Refactoring is something that's really good for engineers because it helps keep your code maintainable moving forward. So in our constructor, what we could do is we can pass an address price feed as a constructor parameter. And up here, where we have our state and storage variables, we can create a new one, aggregator v3 interface, private s underscore price feed. And then what we can do is in our constructor, say s price feed equals 
aggregator v3 interface price feed. So now down here where we're hard coding the address, we can actually just go ahead and delete this whole thing and do s price feed dot version. Call the version function directly on our price feed variable that we're passing in. And additionally, in our price converter, we can update this function to take in an input parameter for this price feed address. So for get price, we'll just say as an input parameter, it's going to take aggregator v3 interface price feed. We're going to actually just delete this line. And then for get conversion rate, we'll have it also take an aggregator v and v3 interface price feed. And then for this get price here, we'll just pass it the price feed as an input parameter. Now back in fundme.sol, when we call get conversion rate, we will pass in this price feed here. So I know we just did a lot of refactoring, but let's recap. When we deploy this contract now, we're going to take as an input parameter this price feed object. If we were back in Remix and we were to copy paste this into a Remix here, let's go ahead and copy paste both of them, both the price converter and the other one. Let's compile FundMe, looks good. And we were going to go deploy FundMe. We now see in this deploy box, we have this address price feed as an input parameter. That's exactly what we're gonna be doing when we deploy our FundMe contract here. We're gonna pass it a price feed. And this price feed is gonna depend on the chain that we're on. So if we go back to our deploy fundme.sol, we now actually have an error. It's saying, oops, wrong argument given. You need to pass a price feed in here. What we could do is we just stick the price feed in here and now, and it should work. Of course, in fundme.test, we're also gonna have to go and stick the price feed in here. And this is where you're seeing there's kind of a lot of work happening every time we update how we deploy this, right? If I update how I deploy in my script, I'm also gonna to have to update how I deploy in my test. That's too much work. And remember, we're engineers. We wanna do as much work as possible to be as lazy as possible. Additionally, if maybe we update something in our deploy script over here and we forget to do it over here, that means we're not gonna be testing our deploy environment. So how do we set this up so that anytime I change the way I deploy my contract, I don't have to also change the way I do my setup function. Well, what we can do instead of deploying our FundMe contract ourselves in here, we can just call out to our deploy function over here. So let's update this, this a little bit. Let's instead in our FundMe test, let's just import our deploy FundMe contract from dot slash script slash deploy FundMe dot s dot sol. And let's just use our deploy fund me so that we always deploy in our test setup the exact same way we deploy in our script. So let's update our run function to instead return a fund me contract. And now we'll say fund me fund me equals new fund me. And we'll say return fund me. I know there's a lot of uppers and lower cases in here. Make sure we have it right returns. And what we can do is in here, instead of doing this line, we could say, We'll first create a new deploy fund me contract deploy fund me equals new deploy fund me because remember deploy fund me is a solidity contract and then we'll say fund me equals deploy fund me dot run because run is now going to return a fund me contract so now that we have this set up all we have to do is update how we deploy in here and our tests will deploy it the exact same way every single time this is us being much more intelligent with the way we approach the architecture of our code base. Awesome. And once again, I love saying this, but by you learning this, you're already better than half the Solidity developers out there. So great job. Excited that you learned this. And just to make sure everything's working, let's go ahead and run forge test dash dash fork URL, Zipolia RPC URL. Let's make sure everything's working correctly here. And it looks like we broke something in our refactoring. So this is good. We broke test owner is meshed sender. Ah, well, the reason that failed is because now our deploy fund me contract over here is actually doing the deploying. And when you do this VM dot start broadcast, this makes the funder actually message us sender again. It's a little bit confusing. This is one where you don't have to worry too much about it right now. But just know that instead of doing address this now, we can actually go back to message sender. And now if we run our test again, 
Great, we can see everything passes. Fantastic. Now the next piece that we're gonna do is gonna also help, it, help us so we don't have to always be making calls to our Alchemy node here. We don't wanna to have to run up the bill every single time we run a test suite. We wanna be able to do everything locally for as long as possible and not even have to make any API calls to Alchemy. We do want to absolutely test our fork URL, but maybe not all the time. So let's go ahead and clear, hide the terminal, and let's keep going. And this is why it's good to have some tests before you even start doing refactoring. This way you can make sure you don't break anything in the process. But all right, great. So how can we update this now? We said before the whole purpose of this refactoring was so that we wouldn't have to hard code an address in here. And psh, sure enough, here we are, we're hard coding an address in here. This still only works with Sepolia. If I try to run this test without a forked chain, it's just gonna fail, right? Because this test price feed version is accurate, needs to make a call to a contract that exists. So what can we do? We can do something called creating a mock contract. On our local Anvil, we can deploy our own fake price feed and interact with that for the duration of our local tests. And that's what we're gonna do right now. So to work with these mocks, we're actually gonna go ahead and in our script folder, we're gonna create a new contract called helperconfig.sol, excuse me, .s.sol. And in this contract, we're gonna do two things. Number one, we're going to deploy mocks when we are on a local Anvil chain. And number two, we're gonna keep track of contract addresses across different chains. For example, Sepolia ETH USD price feed has a different address, or mainnet ETH USD has a different address. And if we set up this helper config correctly, we'll be able to work with a local chain no problem and work with any chain we want no problem. So let's go ahead and let's do this. So this is a contract. Once again, we're gonna need to do the SP SPDX license identifier MIT. Once again, I'm using GitHub Copilot, which just let me do it by hitting tab. We're gonna do pragma solidity 0.8.18. I hit tab again. Thank you, GitHub Copilot. Contract helper config like this. And this helper config is gonna be a script, which is why we have this .s.sol to signify it's a script. So to do that, we're gonna do import script from forge std slash script.sol like this. And like I said, what this is gonna do, we're gonna say, if we're on a local Anvil chain, we're gonna deploy these mock contracts for us to interact with. Otherwise, let's grab the existing addresses from the live networks. So let's go ahead and create this helper config, which is gonna set this up for us so that we don't have to hard code this address in here. And our test will work no matter what we're on, a local chain, a forked chain, or a real chain. So first, let's create a function. Function, and we're gonna call it get Sepolia ETH config, like this. This is gonna be a public pure function. And what this is gonna do is it's gonna return a configuration for everything we need in Sepolia, or really any chain. All we need in Sepolia is gonna be the price feed address. However, we're probably also gonna want one for function get anvil eth config public pure, which is also just gonna need a price feed address. But what if we have a whole bunch of stuff we need? Maybe a price feed address, a VRF address, gas price. What if we've got a ton of stuff in here? Well, this is where it's a good idea to maybe turn this config into its own type. And how do we create types? You got it, that is with the struct keyword. So we're gonna create a struct keyword and we're gonna call it network config. So we're gonna create a new object of type network config. Right now, our network config is only gonna be one thing, address price feed, which is gonna be the ETH USD price feed address. And we're gonna have both of these return a network config object with this price feed. So both of these are gonna do that. Returns, network config, and we have to use the memory keyword because this is a special object. So we're gonna do that for both of them. Now for get Sepolia ETH config, it's really easy, right? All we have to do is say network config, Sepolia config equals network config. And we'll just wrap, and we'll just create this object by saying price feed and pasting in the address in here. Network config memory. Since this is a struct, obviously we can use these little 
brackets here to say the type and the object. We could also just do this, right? We could delete these and just go like this, but I like to be a little bit more explicit. So put these little squiggly brackets, the name of the thing, and then the address. And then we could just say return Sepolio config. And now we have a way to get the Sepolio config. So great. So we have a way to grab an existing address on a live network using this. How do we get that back over here so we can input into the fund me? Well, what we can do is we can create a new public variable, network config, public active network config. And we can set this active network config to whichever one of these configs is the active network that we're on. If we're on Sepolia, we'll return this. If we're on Anvil, we'll return whatever is in Anvil. And then we'll have our deploy me just point to whatever the active network config is. So how do we, so let's pretend for a second we are on Sepolia. How would we set the active network config? Well, in our constructor, what we do is we'd say if block dot chain ID equals equals one, 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 five, five, one, one, one. I'll explain this in a second. Active network config equals get Sepolia ETH config. Now, what is this chain ID thing? Okay, well, first of all, we know that Solidity has a lot of these global variables. One of these is the block dot chain ID. The chain ID refers to the chain's current ID. We saw a little bit of that with MetaMask and Ganache, and we can see that actually every network has their own chain ID. On this site, chainlist.org, you can see a list of a lot of these different chain IDs. For example, Ethereum mainnet has a chain ID of one or zero X one. Binance Smart Chain 56, Arbitrum 46161, Polygon 137, Optimism 10, Avalanche C Chain, blah, blah, blah. They all have different chain IDs. So Polia has a chain ID of 11155111. So we can just say, hey, if we are on the Sepolia chain, use the Sepolia config. Great. And then we can say, if we're not on Sepolia, let's use the Anvil config. Fantastic. So we'll say else active network config equals get anvil eth config. Okay, so let's try this out. We don't have our get anvil eth config identified yet. We don't have it set up, but that's okay. Let's just make sure that this get sepoli eth config works with our forked tests. So let's give that a whirl. So let's update this now to work with our helper config. So we'll do import helper config from dot slash helper config dot s dot soul. And what we're going to do is before the broadcast, we're going to create a new helper config and GitHub Copilot. Thank you again. I just had to hit tab, but helper config, lowercase helper config equals new helper config. So we're going to create a new contract like this. The reason we're going to do this before the start broadcast is we don't actually want to have to spend the gas to deploy this on a real chain. So this is going to be a little bit confusing, but you'll get used to this. Anything before your start broadcast, it's not going to send it as a real transaction. It's going to simulate this in its simulated environment. Anything after start broadcast, it's going to be a real transaction. So we just want to be very certain and very particular with what we put before and what we put after this vm.start broadcast. So now that we have this helper config, we now have access to this active network config which when we deployed it is going to be updated with the correct helper config here. Now we can get the right address by grabbing it from the helper config. So we can say address ETH USD price feed equals helper config dot active network config price feed, excuse me, helper config dot active network config. Now, normally since we're returning a struct, we would have to wrap this in parentheses. And if we had multiple, return values in the struct, right? If this was like an address and then another address and then another address, et cetera, we'd have to do an address and then another address, you know, and then another address, et cetera. But since it's only one, undo all these as well. But since it's only one, we can wrap it in parentheses like this and Solidity will just automatically take those away. So, so this works. So even though active network config is of type network config, this will work correctly. Great. But now we have the ETHUSD price feed. We can stick it in here. So if we're doing this right, if we run forge test dash dash fork URL, Sepolia RPC URL, 
We should indeed pass. We should have refactored our code correctly. Fingers crossed and boom. Okay, our helper config is coming along fantastically. This is great. Let's clear, let's hide this and let's keep going. So we're able to get this working well. And now this is a strategy we can work with different chains. For example, if we wanted to work with another chain, for example, Ethereum mainnet, we could copy paste this here. We could say get mainnet ETH config, public pure returns network config. We could say ETH config, network config. And we could go to docs.chain.link. Let's scroll over to Ethereum. Let's go to ETH mainnet. Where's ETH USD? Let's scroll. ETH USD, we would copy this address here, we'd come back, we'd paste it in here, copy this, paste it here. And now we would scroll back up and, and again, if I'm moving too fast for you, feel free to pause or slow me down. Copy this, we'll come up here, then we can say else, if, and then Copilot's giving me the answer here, but if chain ID equals equals one, then active network config equals get mainnet ETH config. We can use this little else if syntax here to just toggle through all these different chain IDs. And awesome, now we have a way we could even get the mainnet ETH config. And if we wanted to, what we could do is we go back to Alchemy, create a new app here. We'll call it mainnet. Mainnet Ethereum, Ethereum mainnet. We'll zoom out a little bit so we can click the button. And what we can do is we can grab this key copy the HTTPS, come back in here. Let's go to our .env file, we'll create mainnet RPC URL equals this, pop the terminal, source.env. That way this, if I do echo mainnet RPC URL, I can now see this as an output. What I could do is I could do forge test dash dash fork URL dollar sign mainnet RPC URL and now I can run my test even on a forked mainnet. Awesome. And even that passes. So this is a really important step that we want to get really good at is, is running our tests on a forked mainnet or a forked blockchain that we're actually going to be deploying. So if we wanted to deploy to ETH mainnet, we would do something like this. These days, I don't deploy very much to Ethereum mainnet. I'm usually going to deploy to an L2. So maybe I'll do like a Polygon ZK EVM, Optimism, deploy a lot on Arbitrum, but something like that. And that's where I would do the fork testing against. But in any case, awesome. And the coolest thing about this setup is that if I wanna deploy to mainnet, great, it'll just work. Or if I wanna deploy to Sepolia, great, it'll just work. And if I wanna deploy to any other chain, all I have to do is add an additional network config and we're good to go. But the anvil is going to be a little bit different, right? If we scroll back to the top, we're saying, otherwise grab the existing addresses from the live network. Great. Well, on a local network, those contracts don't exist. So we're going to have to deploy those contracts ourselves on the anvil config. So what we're going to do down here is we're going to do something a little bit different. So one of the first things that we're going to do is we're going to have to deploy the mocks and then return the mock addresses. A mock contract is, is basically like a fake contract. It's like kind of like a dummy contract. It is going to be a real contract, but it's going to be a contract that we own, we can control, etc. So what we're going to do is actually we're going to do a VM dot start broadcast down here. This way we can actually deploy these mock contracts to the Anvil chain that we're working with. And since we're using this VM keyword, we actually can't have this be a public pure. And additionally, our helper config needs to be is script in order to have access to this VM keyword. And let's also add a VM.stop broadcast as well. So in here, let's deploy our own price feed. In order to deploy our own price feed, we're going to need a price feed contract. So what we're going to do is actually in our test file, we're going to create a new folder called mocks. And this is where we're going to put all of our contracts that we need to do testing. It's going to be a real contract, but we're going to put it in the test folder just so that we separate it. We say, hey, this contract is different than our core code base. And we're going to create a new file, call it mock v3 aggregator.sol. Now, instead of us actually creating this ourselves, 
there's actually already a mock V3 aggregator in the Chainlink Browning contracts section. However, it's an older version of Solidity. It's version 0.6.0. So I'm going to save you all some trouble from having to rewrite that in a new version. And if you want to just come to the Foundry Fund Me F23, go to the test folder. Oh, it looks like I don't have it in a mock here, but it probably will be in a mock folder here. And we can just copy paste this entire contract. We'll copy it, go to our code base and paste it in here. This has all the code of a price feed, essentially. We have, if we scroll down, we can see some functions that we're familiar with, like latest round data, which is what we use in our price converter. And if we scroll up, we can see in the constructor, we get a bit of decimals and an initial answer. And we also have an update answer function so that anytime we wanna mess with this contract or update it ourselves in our Anvil tests, we can, which is great. So we're gonna deploy this and we're gonna use this address as the price feed address on our Anvil chain. So in here, well, first off, we need to import that. So let's go ahead and import mock v3 aggregator from dot slash mocks, or excuse me, slash test slash mocks slash mock v3 aggregator dot soul. And down at the bottom, we're gonna say mock v3 aggregator mock price feed equals new mock v3 aggregator. And we can see the constructor of this. It takes a decimals and an initial answer. So we know that the decimals of ETUSD is eight. So we can just put eight in here. And then initial answer, we could do something like 2000 E8. Because it has eight decimals, we could say it starts at a price of 2000. And this will be the address that we put into the network config. So now we could say outside of the broadcast, because we don't need to do this inside of the broadcast, we could say network config, memory, anvil config equals network config, do a little parentheses like this, price feed, and it'll be the address of the mock price feed, like that. We'll add the little semicolon there. And then of course we say return anvil config. All right, great. Style guide tip. So something you'll see me do a lot is talk about this concept called magic numbers. I hate magic numbers. <laughs> I'm not a big fan of magic numbers. If I'm just reading this code and I see this number eight and 2000 E8, if I haven't looked at this code in a while, to me, I like I don't know what these numbers stand for. I'd have to go to the mock V3 aggregator and see, oh, okay, it's the decimals and it's the initial answer and then come back. But if I have a ton of code that I have to do that for, this can be really annoying to do. So I hate magic numbers using, instead of having kind of random numbers lobbed in my code, what most developers will do is they'll turn these magic numbers into constant variables at the top of their contracts. So if we scroll at the top of our contract, maybe we'll make a new line. We can say uint eight, because decimals is gonna be uint eight, public constant decimals equals eight, and then a uint, or excuse me, and then an int 256, public constant, initial price equals 2000 E8 like this. And then what we can do down here is we can say instead of eight, we'll say decimals. And instead of 2000 E8, we'll say initial price. And this makes it much easier for us to know what that eight and that 2000 stand for. That eight stands for decimals and the 2000 stands for the initial price. This makes our code much more readable. And even when I'm doing an audit report, if I'm doing a smart contract audit, this is something that I will point out. It's a lot easier to maintain readable code. And that's something that you'll hear me talk about a lot. Even this is a magic number in a, in a sense, right? I don't think it's that important for me to say, hey, this is the Sepolia chain ID though, because to me, it's kind of obvious. So it's a little bit of an art rather than a science, but a rule of thumb is I hate magic numbers and you'll see me pretty much always do this convention up here. All right, awesome. Now, just one more thing we're gonna add in here is we're just gonna say, if active network dot, I mean, active network config dot price feed does not equal address zero, this, this is a way to get the zero address or the default value, return active network config. And the reason I'm gonna put this in here is if we call get anvil eth config without this, we actually will create a new price feed. 
However, if we've already deployed one, we don't want to deploy a new one. So we do this. This active network config dot price feed does not equal zero is basically saying, hey, have we set the price feed up as something? Remember, because address defaults to address zero. So if it's not address zero, it means we've already set it. So just go ahead and return and don't run the rest of this. And with that being said, the name of this function, I'd argue, is not very good because it's not just getting the Anvil ETH config, it's actually creating the contracts in here. So I would change this to get or create Anvil ETH config and copy this and paste it up here. Again, like I said, I love being very verbose with my functions to make my code much more readable. But okay, so now that we have this, remember before, every time we ran forge test, it failed, right? And why did it fail? Well, we go back to the test. When we call test price feed version is accurate, every time we called get version, this would fail because the contract didn't exist on Anvil. Now that we have our helper config here, we do indeed deploy our own fake price feed. If we go to the fake price feed, is there a get version? There is indeed a version function, which returns zero. And let's actually update this to four so that it actually will pass. Cause right now if it's zero, it'll fail. So version is four. So now it should be able to call this version parameter cause it's a public and return four. So let's go ahead, moment of truth. So if we do forge test dash dash fork URL, it's a poly, uh, RPC URL, we know that this is going to pass because it's going to fork the Sepolia chain and our helper config is going to give it the Sepolia address. We know that if we go to our Alchemy dashboard, go to our Sepolia, we little, do a little refresh here. We're going to see just now we see, we see a whole bunch of calls coming in and we do indeed see this passes. Now Foundry was failing whenever we ran this without a fork. Now let's do a little clear. Now, if I do forge test without a network, without an RPC URL. Let's see what happens. Oh my goodness. And see, this was also so much faster because we didn't have to make any API calls up to Alchemy. We didn't have to say, hey, Alchemy, what's the Sepolia chain look like? And wait for it to tell us what the Sepolia chain looks like. We were able to do everything locally on our own computer here. It was much faster. We didn't have to make it any API calls. And boom, we've got this network agnostic setup so that we can deploy our fund me contract on any network that we want. This is incredibly, incredibly powerful. And I know I keep saying this, but I'm being incredibly honest when I say learning these skills right here is making you all better than the current status quo of Solidity developer out there. I'm giving you the skills to leave this course and not just be a good smart contract developer, but I'm giving you the skills to raise the entire bar of smart contract developing. So. Congratulations for getting this far. And I know we've gone over a lot of stuff and we're not done with this project. We have a lot more to go, but this is a great time to take a break because you have just accomplished in a, a massive amount and learned a ton. If any of this is confusing, remember to use the course resources to your advantage. We have artificial intelligence that can help answer some of these questions. We have the discussions forum as well with a ton of people taking this course with you who can help you out. And remember, you can come in here and you can help other people out as well. So take a quick break. Here's a cute picture of a frog. Here's an even cuter picture of a frog as a reward. And I'll see you soon. All right, welcome back. Hope you took a break. Hope you took a rest. Taking rests are incredibly important, especially in this earlier parts of the course where you're learning a lot of these advanced pieces and it's starting to get a little bit harder. If you try to do the rest of this course in a day, you're not going to learn anything. Repetition is the mother's skill, but that repetition will only result in you gaining that skill is if you take the rest you need for your body to recover. So let's keep going though. We've learned a lot. We're doing fantastic work. Now we've got our deploy fund me. Holy mackerel. We can deploy on any chain we want because we've got this fantastically advanced helper config set up for us. So now that we have this, this means that we can continue to write our tests over here. We don't even have to care or think about which network that we're actually on because our deployment setup is going to work no matter what. All right, great. So let's focus now. Let's switch gears. Now that we have our testing and our deployment harness set up, let's do this again, forge coverage. And now I don't even have to put an RPC URL anymore because this is going to work for a Thanville. Oh, feels good, doesn't it? 
If I do forge coverage, oof, but this doesn't feel so good. If I do forge coverage, you see, oh, we are not testing very much of our code. Now, coverage isn't an end all be all, right? If you don't have 100% coverage, it's not the end of the world. However, if you have 0% or 7%, that's not a great look. So we want to do our best to at least get this up and write some tests for as much of the code as we can. If we don't have a test for it, it could be wrong. The functionality could not work as expected. So let's write some tests so we make sure our code is actually doing what we want it to do. If we look at our fund function, what's the first thing that we want it to do? Well, if we don't send it enough ETH, it should revert, right? Okay, great. So let's write a test for that. So we'll say function test fund fails without enough ETH. And the way that we can test something fails in Foundry is we can use another one of these cheat codes. So if we scroll back over to Foundry, over to the Foundry docs, on the left-hand side here, we can scroll down to cheat codes, cheat codes in the test section. And it tells us all about some of the different cheat codes we can work with. So if you want to learn more about cheat codes, you can select that, or we can scroll to the bottom, go to the appendix, and go to the cheat codes reference. Hit the little drop down. We have environment, assertions, and a whole bunch of other stuff. Let's look under assertions, and we can see there's one called expect revert. It tells us all about this revert bit. Expect revert is a cheat code in Foundry. It allows us to say, hey, if we do vm.expect revert, we're saying, hey, the next line should revert. And so it's kind of equivalent to saying assert this TX fails slash revert. So if I put vm.expect revert, the next line we're telling Foundry to revert. So if I were to run something like un256 cat equals one, this test will fail because this line doesn't fail, which is a little confusing, right? So if we pull up our terminal here, I run forge test dash M, I paste this in. Remember dash M is how we run a single test. I hit enter, you'll see that this fails because this didn't fail, right? So we see call did not revert as expected. So that's a, a little bit confusing. So we need to do something here that fails. So now if I do fund me dot fund, but I don't send any value, right? Remember, if we want to send value, we do it in these little brackets here. If we don't send any value. The zero value is going to be less than the minimum rate, which again is $5, right? So since it's less, it should fail with you need to spend more ETH. So if we add this expect revert, fundme.fund, .fund, we hit clear, or on that single test again, now it'll pass because this line is indeed failing. And that's what we want. So great, we're testing the fund me fails without enough ETH being sent. Great job. Perfect. So what else should we test? Well, okay, let's say it we do send enough. If we do send enough, we update these data structures. Okay, so let's test for that. So we'll say function test fund updates funded data structure. Make this a public function. And now we'll want to do fund me dot fund. And we'll want to send some value. Maybe we'll send, we need to send a value greater than $5. So we'll send like 10 ETH. Why not? Because 10 ETH is almost definitely going to be more than $5, or I hope so. And then we'll need to check if address to amount funded is getting updated. Now I'm going to do a little bit more refactoring here. Now I believe I showed you already that these, these storage variables, which we haven't talked about too much, should indeed start with S underscore. So if you haven't done this already, we're going to do a little bit of refactoring. Address to amount funded, storage variable, funders, storage variable, price read storage variable. So now oh, we just do a little S underscore here. We do a little S underscore here, a little S underscore here, a little S underscore here, S underscore, S underscore. Okay, great. And typically as a best practice, we want to default all of these variables to private. Private variables are more gas efficient than public ones. So we want to default them to private. And anytime we actually need to make the public, we go ahead and explicitly do that ourselves. And this is where if we're not using the updated fundme.soul, be sure to just copy paste it from foundry fundme.soul. It's got everything we want in here. But the most important pieces is down at the bottom, it has these view functions. So in order for us to actually check that these are actually being updated, we want to scroll to the bottom 
and we're going to create a section for our view slash pure functions. These are going to be our getters. So in here, we'll create a new function, get address to amount funded. We're going to do an address funding address. This will be an external view returns view in 256. And this will be return s underscore address to amount funded funding address. I just hit tab there. We want to do this for a couple of reasons. Again, I said we want to make our code very readable and using getters as opposed to kind of this gross s underscore methodology is a lot more readable and a lot more sensical. Additionally, like I said, private variables are more gas efficient. So we just want to default them to private and then only make public or external view functions as we need. So we want to be able to get that. We also want to be able to do function get funder and have a uint256 index be passed in. This will be an external view which will return an address and we'll just say return funders at the index. So these are two getter functions that we can now use to check to see if these are populated. So back in our test, after running this fundme.fund, we can say uint256 amount funded equals fundme.get address to amount funded. And then who are we going to pass in here? And then we're going to say assert equals amount funded 10 e18. So so a couple things are going on here. So this is probably going to be message.sender. But this can be a little confusing. Let's run this test forge test dash m pass that in here. Let's see if this works. Okay, it failed. So it looks like message.sender isn't the one who called fund. Well, it was probably then the address fund me test. Is that who it was? Let's just say address this is that is that correct? Let's try this now. Okay, it looks like it was address this. But as you can see, knowing who's doing what can be a little bit confusing, especially in our tests. So in our tests, we want to be very explicit with who's sending what transactions. And that's where we can use another foundry cheat code called ranking. So if you go to the cheat codes reference, you go to environment, you can scroll down and we can see there's a prank cheat code in here. This prank code sets the message.sender to the specified address for the next call. So we can use prank to always know exactly who's sending what call. And remember, this only works in our tests and this only works with Foundry. So above this fundme.fund, we can create a fake new address to send all of our transactions. So up at the top, let's create a fake user who's going to send all of our transactions. There's another force sheet code called make ADDR where we can pass in a name and it'll give us back a new address. This comes from forge STD as opposed to the VM. So we can just use make ADDR like this. So what we can do at the top is we can say address user equals make ADDR. We can just give it a name of user. And this will be who we use for all of our anytime we want to work with somebody. We can't make this constant because because this isn't compile time constant, but it's tests anyways, so we don't really care. But in any case, so if we scroll down, we can say VM dot prank user, which is saying the next TX will be sent by user. So this fund me dot fund will now be sent by user. So now in amount funded, we can say amount funded equals fund me dot get address to amount funded, delete that, paste that in here. And one other thing we can do to make this cleaner is, as you know, I hate magic numbers. So we're going to make this a constant variable as well. So if we scroll to the top, we're going to make a new value. We're going to say u256 constant send value equals, and we're going to say 0 0.1 ether. Decimals don't work in Solidity, but if you do 0 0.1 ether, that makes it, you know, 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And now we can do back down on our test instead of some value here, we can just boop, use send value each time instead. So let's check to see if this works. We'll hit up a couple times, forge test. Oh, and it looks like we have an issue, and this is good. Let's learn how to triage this issue. So let's hit clear, we'll hit up a couple times, and then we'll dash VVV to see what's wrong with this to see where this is actually reverting. Ah, 
So we pranked the user, but we're getting this error out of fund. So we created a new blank user who doesn't have any money. So they can't send the send value since they don't have any money. So what we can do is we can use another cheat code to actually send him some fake money. So if we go to cheat code references, there's a cheat code called deal, which allows us to set the balance of an address to a new balance. Oh yeah. So what we can do is we can scroll back up to the top and this is a cheat code, not a forge standard cheat. And in our setup, we can just say vm.deal user and we can give them some starting balance. So maybe we'll say you went to 56 constant starting balance equals 10 ether. So we'll give our fake user 10 ether to start out with using a cheat code. And now if we scroll down, we hit clear. Now we run our test. Ta da! we are now successful as we are now giving them some fake money so that they can run our tests. And we have a couple more tests going on here. So now if we pull up our terminal again, we run forge coverage, you'll see we've gotten a little bit better with our coverage. We've gotten a tiny bit better here, but let's keep going. All right, let's keep going. Let's do function test adds funder to array of funders. Make this public. So up here, we're seeing that this get works. Let's also make sure that the this get funder that we just created works. So we'll say vm.prank user fund me dot fund. I'm going to hit tab a couple times because I'm going to do this exact line up here. Thanks GitHub Copilot. And we're going to say address funder equals fund me dot get funder at index zero. So this should be user because we're we only have one funder in here. An important note is every single time we run one of these tests, it'll run setup, and then the test and then start over and then run setup and then run the test and start over. So even though we called fundme.fund up here, we're actually gonna reset every single time. Now that's why if we made this a different user, we would still go to the zeroth index. So now we just do assert equal, we're gonna say funder is user, right? So assert equal, we're saying this equals this, that's what this test is checking. So we'll run this, do a little clear, forge test dash M, paste that in here. Uh, okay, that worked as well. Great, let's keep going. Okay, so we've tested that this data structure is getting updated correctly. This is also getting updated. That's great. We could probably add some more tests to check to see if multiple work, but let's say this is good for now. We probably also want to check this withdraw piece. So task uh, function test only owner can withdraw, right? We want to be able to, we want to make sure that only the owner can call this withdraw function. So we want to make sure this only owner modifier is working correctly. So, well, what can we do? First, let's fund it. So we can copy this line here, paste it in here, and then we'll do vm.expect revert vm.prank user because the user is not the owner. And we'll do fund me dot withdraw. So we're going to fund it with some money with this. And then we're going to have the user try to withdraw because the user is not the owner. Now you'll notice that we're doing a VM that dot expect revert. And I said, Hey, the next line is should revert. It ignores these VM stuff. So this is saying like the next transaction, that's not like a VM cheat code. So it skips over this one and says, this is the one I'm expecting to revert. Same thing with this. If these were in this order, it would say, I'm going to pretend to be the user for not this one, because this is a VM, but for this one. So now if I hit clear, we'll copy this forge test dash M, paste it in. Boom, we see that this is indeed successful. Awesome. Now, as we get more and more advanced with more and more functionality, these tests are going to get bigger and bigger, right? Let's say we want to do test only owner can withdraw after 18 withdrawals have happened, right? We'd have to do maybe a whole bunch of whole bunch of these, whole bunch of these or something like that. We want to make our tests very minimal, like we want them to have minimal lines of code. So a really good methodology by a very well known Solidity dev in the space, Paul, he has a great proposed Solidity best practice, organize your unit tests by using a state tree. Start by defining the parent nodes at specific state conditions that drive the behavior of the smart contract. 
So if this is your contract, write some tests that test something. And once it's good, create a modifier for it. So you don't have to copy paste the code from those tests. If that's confusing, don't worry, I'm going to make it make sense in just a second. We're going to add this modifier called funded like this. And I know we've worked with modifiers before. And in here, we're going to say VM dot prank user fund me fund value send value. I'm going to go ahead and hit tab there and then this little underscore here. Now, instead of every single time we want to fund one of our tests, instead of writing a ton of code, we can just do public funded in the test declaration. And now we can say, okay, any test we write after this modifier, we can add this funded and we can save ourselves a lot of code. Once some setup gets really big, right? Let's say we had to do some setup to write this test that took a ton of lines of code and we needed to write a ton of tests for it. It's going to make it so that we don't have to keep repeating ourselves over and over again. So big fan of this Solidity best practice. Thanks, Paul, for setting this up. And now we can just do this instead. So let's go ahead and try to run this again. Now that we're using this modifier and great, it does indeed pass. Okay, cool. So now let's say let's actually test with drawing and we'll test with drawing that actually works. So we'll say function test with draw with a single funder, we'll make this public funded. And now it's automatically going to get set up to be funded already. So there's a single funder and we're going to go ahead and test with drawing with the actual owner. And this is where I'm going to introduce the arrange act cert methodology for working with tests. Whenever I work with a test, I always think of it mentally in this pattern. First, I'm going to arrange the test. I'm going to set up the test. Then I'm going to do the action I actually want to test. And then I'm going to assert the test. So in a lot of my tests, you'll actually see me write these explicitly out. So mentally, I can compartmentalize the different parts of the test. So for a range, in order for us to test that the withdraw function actually is going to work, we first want to check to see, okay, what's our balance before we call withdraw so that we can compare it to what our balance is after. So to arrange, we can do a UN256 starting owner balance because it's the owner who's going to do the withdraw. And this will be equal to fund me dot. And then do we have a get owner function? I don't think we do. We do not have a get owner function. So let's actually make this I owner private and create a getter for get owner. So we'll scroll to the bottom. We'll do function get owner. This will be external view returns address return I owner. And in my test, I'm going to say fund me dot get owner dot balance. So we're going to get the owner's starting balance. We're going to do a UNT 256 starting fund me balance. So the actual balance of the fund me contract, which since it's funded, it's just going to be this send value. It's going to be equal to the address of the fund me contract dot balance. And now in the act, we're going to do VM dot prank fund me dot get owner because only the owner can call withdraw. So we just want to prank, make sure we're actually the owner. And we're going to call fund me dot withdraw like this. And this is what we're testing, right? We're testing the withdraw. So we put this in the act section. And now we can move over to the assert section. So we'll say UN256 ending owner, or excuse me. Yeah, ending owner balance equals fund me dot get owner dot balance like that. UN256 ending fund me balance equals address fund me dot balance. And we could say assert equal ending fund me balance should be zero. Now I know I said I hate magic numbers, but zero often I don't create a constant for because it's just zero. So we should have withdrawn all the money out of the fund me. And then we can also do assert equal the starting fund me balance plus the starting owner balance should equal the ending owner balance because we withdrew all the money at a fund me. So we should just be able to add it to their address and that should equal the ending balance. So let's go ahead and let's test this forge test dash M paste that in here. Oops, oops I'm doing I owner somewhere. Oh, yep. So this actually fails now. So this should actually be get owner instead. Let's clear run this again. And awesome. So that does indeed pass. Great work. Now let's just do one more test, a test with multiple funders. 
So this is going to be the big function here. So we'll do function test withdraw from multiple funders, public funded. And so it's going to be funded once, but let's add a ton more funders. So let's do a uint 256 number of funders. We'll say there's, we'll do 10 in a uint 256 starting funder index equals two. And you'll see why I'm doing this in just a minute. Let's go through a loop and let's just keep creating new addresses for this number of funders. So we'll do a for loop, which I know we know how to do. We'll do four, uint 256 i equals starting funder index. i is gonna be less than the total number of funders, i plus plus. So we're gonna go, every time we go through a loop, we're gonna add one to i here. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna do a vm.prank and a vm.deal and create addresses and they're going to fund the fund me. vm.prank, a new address. We're gonna deal that new address some money and then we're gonna fund it. So we could do vm.prank and vm.deal, but the Forge standard library, which again is slightly different from the cheat codes, actually comes with this standard cheat called hoax which sets up a prank from an address with some ether. So it does both prank and deal combined. And since it's a forge standard, we can just do hoax, some address, which we'll talk about in a second, and then we'll give it send value. But how do we actually populate the address? Well, I showed you before, we can do address zero to generate an address. Guess what? We can also do address one, address two, address three, address four, address five, address six, et cetera except they must be a uint, instead of 256, a uint 160. As of Solidity v0.8, you can no longer cast explicitly from address to uint 256. You have to do a uint 160. And the reason for this is a uint 160 has the same amount of bytes essentially as an address. So that's a little bit confusing. Don't worry too much about it for now. Just know that if you wanna work with addresses, if you wanna use numbers to generate addresses, those numbers have to be a uint 60. So actually we're just gonna use uint 60 for everybody. And actually we're gonna start with starting index v1, excuse me. But what we can do is we can say address of i, and we'll make this a uint 60 as well. We're gonna create a blank address of i, which starts at one, and we're gonna add send value. And the reason we're starting, our starting index is actually gonna be one here, is because sometimes the zero address reverts and doesn't let you do stuff with it. When you're writing your tests, you just wanna make sure you're not sending stuff to the zero address because there's often sanity checks to make sure you don't do that, so. But in any case, we're gonna hoax that address and, do, and add some ether to it. And since we're hoaxing it, it means we're pranking it. So now we can call fundme.fund with this new address. And we do the value, it's gonna be send value like this. And cool, so we'll have this many funders actually loop through the list and fund our FundMe contract. Awesome. So now we're gonna do some of the same stuff that we did above, right? So this is all in our arrange setup. So we're gonna say UN256, and my GitHub Copilot actually already knows, starting owner balance, UN256, starting FundMe balance. Thank you, GitHub Copilot. I hit tab again. And if you wanna just copy from up here, you can just copy from there as well. And then we're gonna say vm.start prank, excuse me, vm.prank fund me.get owner like this. And then we'll call fund me dot withdraw like this. Now, another thing that you'll see instead of just prank is you'll see start prank and you'll see vm.stop prank. This is the same as start and stop broadcast. It's saying that anything in between start prank and stop prank is going to be sent, pretended to be by this address here. So you'll see this syntax a lot as well. And it's the syntax that I actually prefer to use. And you'll see that I use it a lot. But after we call this withdraw function, which again, this is going to be in the act, we can now move on to our assert phase. And we could say, let's assert that the address of fundme.balance is going to be equal to zero. So we should have removed all the funds out of the fund me. We can assert the starting fund me balance plus the starting owner balance 
equals fundme dot get owner dot balance like this. Okay, great. So let's run this test there. Forge test dash m paste that in. Ta da! That has also been successful. Now, if we run forge coverage, let's see what happens. How good are our tests now? Aha! They're a lot better, at least for the fund me. We haven't done a whole lot of testing and price converter, but that's fine. Fantastic. We can see we've covered at least 93% of the code in our contracts. So this at least makes us feel a lot better that we've done a much better job of writing some tests, right? Like I said, writing tests can be a little bit of an art, but if everything here is red, that's a bad sign. So we have green on this line, so that's a good sign. Now you might be asking, oh, hey, Patrick, we just wrote this test, but shouldn't the balances actually be lower because we spent gas? And that is a wonderful observation, and we will come back to that. So hold on to that. We'll come back to that in a minute, but let's keep writing the rest of these tests. All right, awesome. So now let's look at some other ways that we can actually debug some of our tests. Like if we run into any issues, one of the ways that comes packed with Foundry that I absolutely love is a tool called Chisel. Normally, if I want to test that some Solidity works really quickly, I might come over to Remix and I might do some random code and see if it works. But instead, what I can do is in my terminal, I can just type in Chisel and I'll get outputted into this shell here. If I type exclamation mark help, it'll give me a ton of information about what I can actually do in this terminal here. Chisel allows us to write Solidity in our terminal and execute it kind of line by line. So for example, if I wrote UN256 cat equals one, and now type cat, and I can see, oh, cat is one. I can type cat here again, I can do UN256 cat and three equals cat plus three, do cat and three, and see you know, one plus three obviously equals four. So Chisel is a fantastic tool that I use all the time to quickly sanity check some small Solidity pieces that I need. So Chisel, you can write, you can literally write Solidity right in here without having to go to Remix and test stuff out. Chisel, awesome tool, Solidity in your terminal. Control C, Control C to exit. Now let's go down to this test withdraw from multiple funders. What if I told you there was a way to make this a lot cheaper gas-wise. It, it would cost less gas for us to actually perform. That would be a pretty valuable piece of information, wouldn't it? Every single time we send a transaction or we deploy or we do anything on chain, we have to spend gas. And the more complicated and the more computationally expensive our contracts are, the more gas we have to spend. So what if I told you there was a way for us to make this cheaper? Well, let's figure out how to do that now. How do we even know how much this is going to cost? That would be probably be a good thing for us to benchmark, right? What we can do is run forge snapshot dash m, paste that exact test in. What this is going to do is it's going to create this file called dot gas snapshot for us. And if let's open this up, it's going to tell us exactly how much this single test is going to cost in gas. And if we wanted, we could do the conversion between gas and GUI and price and everything to figure out how much this actually costs. But this is now our benchmark. We now have this in our dot gas snapshot. Test withdraw from multiple funders cost this much gas. Okay. All right, cool. So now that we have these functions here, let's go back up here and talk about that gas thing. Because we did vm.prank fundme.getowner and we called a transaction. We should have spent gas, right? Well, how come when we calculate the final balance, the ending owner balance, there's nothing to do with gas here. This has to do with the gas price of the actual chain we're working on. When you're working with Anvil, the gas price actually defaults to zero. So when working with a local Anvil chain, be it forked or not, it actually defaults the gas price to zero. So for us to simulate this transaction with actual gas price, we need to actually tell our test to pretend to use a real gas price. And this is where there's another cheat code that we can use called TX gas price, which sets the gas price for the rest of the transaction. So what we can do is same as where we're doing vm.prank, we can do vm.tx gas price 
and we can set some gas price. And up at the top, we'll do a U into 256 public, or excuse me, U into 256 constant gas price. And it could be anything. Let's just set it to one. And down here, we'll just say vm.tx gas price. We'll set that to the one. And now in our test here, we'll actually have a gas price. In order for us to see how much gas this is actually going to spend, we need to calculate the gas left in this function call before and after. To do that, we'll do uint 256 gas start equals gas left. This gas left function is a built in function in Solidity. It tells you how much gas is left in your transaction call. Remember how on an ether scan, when we scrolled down, there was a gas limit and gas usage. Whenever you send a transaction, you send a little bit more gas than you're expected to use. And you can see how much gas you have left based on how much you send by, by calling this gas left function. So we can get the gas start. And then after we call withdraw, we can do UN 256 gas end equals gas left. So this is how much gas we used. So let's say we sent a thousand gas. Let's say this cost was 200 gas. That means down here, we would have 800 gas. And so we can say UN 256 gas used from this withdraw transaction is going to be equal to the gas start minus gas end times whatever the TX dot gas price is. TX dot gas price is another built into solidity, which tells you the current gas price. And then we can use this methodology to do console.log gas used, rerun this test with the dash VV, and we'll actually be able to see how much gas that exact call actually did, which is right here. But I'm going to go ahead and now I'm actually going to go ahead and remove all this gas stuff and just bring it back to this. All right, great. Anyways, so we have this gas snapshot. Is there a way for us to make this cheaper and much easier? By golly, there absolutely is. And this is where we're going to actually learn about storage. This thing that I keep talking about and keep referring back to, we're actually finally going to talk about storage up here. So let's watch an excerpt from the previous free code camp video so that we can understand what storage is and what it looks like. We're going to look at one of the first and most obvious gas optimization techniques, and it has to do with all of these variables at the top and this thing called storage. So this gas snapshot, we're actually going to write some code to make this test be much more gas efficient. So let's learn about storage so we can learn this gas optimization technique. Let's say we look at the average gas for these and we go, huh, this looks like it's actually a lot more than what we originally expected. Is there a way for us to make this a little bit cheaper? We go back to our fund me contract. We look at our withdraw function and we notice something. Oh, there is actually a way to make this a lot cheaper. And it has to do with something called storage variables or these global variables that we've been working with this whole time. Let me let me paint you a little picture here. We're going to look at one of the first gas optimization techniques you can take to drop these down. And it has to do within our fund me contract, these state variables and how they're actually stored and how this contract actually keeps track of all this stuff. This section is going to be a little bit more advanced. So we'll have a note here saying that this is an advanced section. And if you want to skip over it, you can, because now we're getting into gas optimizations here. This information still is really good to know. So if you want to skip it for now and then come back later, you absolutely can. But let's talk about what happens when we actually save or store these global variables, aka these storage variables. Now, everything I'm about to go through is in the documentation, and there is a link to this, of course, in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Whenever we have one of these global variables or these variables that stay permanently, they're stuck in something called storage. You can think of storage as a big giant array or a giant list of all the variables that we actually create. So when we say we have some contract called fund of storage and we have a variable called favorite number, we're basically saying we want this favorite number variable to persist, right? We saw in a lot of our examples, we had a favorite number variable that we could always call to see what this contract's favorite number was. Well, the way it persists is it gets stored in this place called storage. Now storage works as this giant list associated with this contract where every single variable and every single value in this storage section is slotted into a 32 byte long slot in this storage array. 
So for example, the number 25 in its bytes implementation is 0x00 with a ton of zeros, 19. This is the hex version of the UNT256. This is why we do so much hex translation. This is the bytes implementation of a UN256. And each store slot increments just like an array starting from zero. So for example, our next global variable or our next storage variable just gets slotted at the next slot that's available. So Booleans, for example, get transformed from their bool version to their hex. And we modified our sum bool variable to be true. And the hex addition of the true Boolean is 0x0001. Every time you save an additional global variable, or more correctly, one of these storage variables, it takes up an additional storage slot. And what about variables that are dynamic in length or that can change length? What about something that's dynamic? Well, for dynamic values like a dynamic array or a mapping, elements inside the array or inside the mapping are actually stored using some type of hashing function. And you can see those specific functions in the documentation. The object itself does take up a storage slot, but it's not gonna be the entire array. For example, my array variable here at storage slot two doesn't have the entire array in storage slot two. What it has actually is just the array length. The length of the array is stored at storage slot two. But for example, if we do my array dot push 222, we do some hashing function, which again, you can see in the documentation what that is, and we'll store the number 222 at that location in storage. The hex of 222 is 0x00000DE. So it gets stored in this crazy spot, and this is good, this is intentional, because 32 bytes may not be nearly big enough to store my array if our array gets massive. And it wouldn't make sense for it to put the elements inside the array at subsequent numbers, because again, the size of the array can change, and you're never gonna be sure how many subsequents that you need. So for my array, it does have a storage slot for the length. For mappings, it does have a storage spot as well, similar to array, but it's just blank. But it's blank intentionally so that Solidity knows, ah, okay, there is a mapping here and it needs a storage slot for its hashing function to work correctly. Now, interestingly, constant variables and immutable variables do not take up spots in storage. The reason for this is because constant variables are actually part of the contract's bytecode itself, which sounds a little bit weird, but you can imagine what Solidity does is anytime it sees constant variables name is it just automatically swaps it out with whatever number it actually is. So you can kind of think of not in storage is just a pointer to 123 and it doesn't take up a storage slot. Well, when we have variables inside of a function, those variables only exist for the duration of the function. They don't stay inside the contract. They don't persist. They're not permanent. So variables inside these functions like new var and other var do not get added to storage. They get added in their own memory data structure, which gets deleted after the function has finished running. Now you might be asking, okay, well, why do we need this memory keyword, especially when it comes to strings? We saw before that we had to say string memory. The reason we need it for strings is because strings are technically this dynamically sized array. And we need to tell Solidity, hey, we're, we're going to do this on the storage location or we're going to do it into the memory location where we can just wipe it. Arrays and mappings can take up a lot more space. So Solidity just wants to make sure, OK, where are we working with this? Is it storage? Is it memory? You have to tell me. I need to know if I need to allocate space for it in our storage data structure. And again, everything here you can read in the Solidity documentation. Now, in the GitHub repo associated with this course, if you go to SRC, you'll go to example contracts, we have this fun with storage here as well. And if you go to the scripts of this, we have a deploy storage fun as well, which has some functions in here called print storage data and print first array element that you can play with to actually see where in storage these are being located. We're not going to code these right now, and I'm not really going to go over what these are doing because, oh, and I'm going to have to change this name here but I definitely recommend trying to run this yourself on Anvil to see what these storage functions actually print out for you. One other thing that's really cool about Foundry, I can actually check my Fundme contract storage a couple different ways. The first one I can do is forge inspect Fundme storage layout and enter, and it'll tell me the exact layout of storage that my Fundme contract has. Whoa, and it gives me this giant object here. If I scroll up to the top, I can see the storage layout here. We can see that this S address to amount funded 
actually is in slot zero. If we continue down, we can see S funders is in slot one. We can see S price feed is in slot two. Then we have all this information about types and some other stuff as well. But this part of the top storage is where we can easily see where stuff is being stored. We can see there too that these immutable variables didn't show up in storage, which it makes sense. Minimum constants and immutables don't get stored in storage. They are part of the contract's bytecode. The other way that we can see storage is using cast storage keyword. If I spin up an anvil chain, create a new shell here, and I run forge script script deploy fundme.s.sol dash dash rpc url. Let's use this. HTTP slash dash, dash private key. Let's use this one right here. Paste it in. We're going to compile. We're going to deploy. Oops, I forgot to do broadcast. Let's do it again with dash dash broad cast. Let's actually deploy this to our own locally running and build chain. Script ran successfully. Awesome. Contract address here. What I can now do, I can run cast storage, paste the contract address here and pick a storage slot, for example, two, which is the price feed address, and it's going to give me exactly what's in that storage slot at storage slot index two. Obviously, zero and one are just going to be empty because those are what? These two arrays, which right now are this mapping and this array, which right now are blank. If you have a connection to Etherscan, you actually don't even need to add an index, and it'll fetch the source from Etherscan and tell you the whole storage layout, but I'm not connected to Etherscan. This will be something that you should try in the future is actually doing cast storage on a live contract and seeing a live contract's storage. So that'll be your homework for later. So this is just a double down that even when you have the private keyword, that doesn't mean your data is private. Everything on the blockchain is public information and anybody can easily read that information off of your or anybody's blockchain. Now you might be asking yourself, hey, cool, Patrick, but why are we talking about this storage thing? Yeah, this is really interesting to know, but I thought we were trying to optimize gas wise. The reason that we're talking about storage is because reading and writing from storage is an incredibly expensive operation. Anytime we do it, we spend a lot of gas. Remember how before when I said, when you compile your code, it gets compiled down to this weird bytecode? Let's go back to Remix. Let's hit compile. Let's go to compilation details. Go to Remix, then we select bytecode and we scroll down a little bit all the way to the bottom. We'll see this thing called opcodes and object. The object is the contract in pure bytecode, and these opcodes are the bytecode converted to something called opcodes. These are the low level computer assembly level instructions that are actually executing and actually doing what our smart contract should do. And guess what? Each one of these incredibly low level codes has a specific gas cost associated with it. If we go to evm.codes, this is a website that actually keeps track of a lot of these opcodes gas costs. And right on the left hand side, we can see the opcode in its bytecode format, and then the name of the opcode, and then the minimum amount of gas it actually spends to do that opcode. So anytime you add two numbers, it costs three gas. Multiplying costs five gas dividing five gas, so on and so forth. And if we keep scrolling, keep scrolling, we're seeing a lot of threes, a lot of twos, a couple of hundreds, some twenties. We get down to here. Oh my goodness. S load and S store are both 100. That's way more expensive than a lot of these other ones that we're seeing, which are like two or three or five. S load is the op code that loads a word from storage. Anytime you read from storage, you're spending a minimum of 100 gas. S store is the opcode that stores a value in storage. Save a word to storage, which also costs a minimum 100 gas. If we look just up above that, we actually see M load and M store, which stand for memory load and memory store. If we load or read from memory, it only costs three gas. So it's almost 33 times more expensive to read and write to storage than read and write to memory. So a real easy gas optimization we could do is we can read and write from memory way more than we should be read and writing from storage. So with this in mind, if we come back to our fund me withdraw function, and we look in here, are we reading and writing to storage a lot in here? Oh my goodness. Let's look at this loop here. So we're saying U and 256 funder equals zero. Okay, sure, whatever. 
funder index is greater than s underscore funders dot length. The length of the funders array is stored in storage. So every time we loop through this for loop, we're rereading from storage. Ah, let's create a new function, function called cheaper withdraw. This will be public only owner as well. Let's keep this memory to storage gas optimization piece in mind. And let's rewrite this function so that we're reading it and writing from storage a lot less. So first off, instead of reading from storage every single time, we could say you went 256 funders length equals s funders dot length. That way we'll only read it from storage one time. And then every time we loop through, we'll only read it one more time. And this is why this syntax of adding this s underscore here is really good. Anytime you see this s underscore, your brain should go, oh my goodness, I'm actually reading from storage. Maybe I should consider not doing that and reading from memory instead. So we're gonna read from storage once here. And for our for loop, we're gonna say for, do the same thing. You went to 256, funder index equals zero. Funder index is less than funders length, which is now a memory variable instead of a storage variable. And then funder index plus plus. Okay, cool. Now, okay, in the withdraw function, what do we do? Okay, we get the funder address from storage. There's really not a great way around this. We pretty much have to read from storage every single time here. So let's go ahead and stick that in here. And then we do this mapping. There's really not another way around this. So we're just gonna stick this in here as well. We still need to reset the storage, so we'll do that. And there's not a whole lot much to do in here. So we'll just do this as well. So we now have this cheaper withdraw function that we're gonna loop through this array reading the length from memory as opposed to reading the length from storage over and over again. So now that we have this cheaper withdraw function, let's go back to our fundme test.sol. Let's scroll down and we have this test multiple withdraw funders. I'm actually just gonna copy paste this whole thing, which wouldn't be good practice in an actual test file, but for us, we're gonna do it. I'm gonna paste it. I'm gonna call this test withdraw from multiple funders cheaper and instead of calling withdraw we're going to call cheaper withdraw and that's it that's the only difference that we're going to do now let's pull up our terminal and we'll run forge snapshot so now we should create a gas snapshot with all of our tests but will we have test withdraw from multiple funders and test withdraw from multiple funders cheaper and if we go to our gas snapshot go to the bottom we see test withdraw from multiple funders, 987915 gas. Test withdraw multiple funders cheaper, 987136. We're saving almost 800 gas by using this cheaper, less storage intensive reads for running our contract. Amazing. This is fantastic. We've learned so much and we only have a couple more things to do for this lesson. And then we're gonna push this code up to GitHub and have your first project, which is incredibly exciting. So I fumbled this a little bit. I didn't really talk about it too much, but I did update some of the errors and I updated some of the variables without explaining it too much. Immutable variables, again, these are not stored in storage. So it's good to have some identifier to say that A, they're unchangeable and B, they're actually not in storage. So I go by the Chainlink style guide, which does this I underscore for immutable variables and uppercase for constant variables. Having style guides is really important and gets more important the more advanced you get because it makes your code much more readable and much, you look like a more advanced developer. So immutables have I underscore, storage variables have S underscore, and we just explained why that's so important to know what storage variables actually are. A lot of people use the Solidity Visual Developer, which also automatically points out storage variables for them as well. I don't really like to use it though because I feel like it clutters up my user experience a little bit. But if you're having a hard time identifying Storage variables, maybe that's an extension for you. The Solidity docs actually have an entire style guide as to what to do for code layout, function names, line length, and all this other stuff. So I've already updated these to iOwner, as price feed. We've added some getters at the bottom. There's a couple of more style guide things for us to do, but we'll do that in later sections of the course. I subscribe to the Chainlink Solidity style guide, which I've left a link in the GitHub repo associated with this course, which talks about everything that we went over here. We want to keep everything private, use S underscore, use I for immutables, S for storage variables, et cetera. And you can read this if you want.
Style guides seem like they're a little bit bored, but the more you code, the more you'll realize how they make your life way easier. But all right, awesome. So we have some tests. We've done mocking. We have a gas snapshot. We're, of course, going to want to add a readme.md at some point. Later on, if you want, you just copy from my readme in here. We've only got a couple of things left to do. These are the four things we have left for this project. Just do a proper readme, a couple integration tests, where we're going to programmatically verify our contracts inside of Foundry, and then we're going to push our code up to GitHub. And this we absolutely need to get here because this is how we're going to build our portfolios. And so I'll and how other people are going to see, oh my gosh, they're such awesome engineers. So let's push through the rest of these. So for a readme, you can use my readme here as an example of what a good readme should look like. A readme in your contract in your GitHub should really explain, hey, what your code actually does and then how to actually do it, right? So you'll notice in most of my readmes, I have a getting started section, which tells you the requirements that you need to actually run anything. We have a quick start, which starts with a git clone, which I'll explain in a little bit, and then how to actually use it. If you look up best readme and Google or Brave Search or whatever you want to use, there's some fantastic templates to write amazing readmes. Okay, cool. That's done. What's next? All right, integration tests. So if we want to actually interact with our contract here, right now we don't have a programmatic way to do that, like funding and withdrawing. And in our tests here, we tested funding and withdrawing but we didn't test funding and withdrawing using the methods that we're actually going to use to do that. When we actually call funds and withdraws, we're probably going to do cast, send, and then, you know, the address and then fund or whatever, and the value and everything, or we're going to do it with forge script, right? Let's do it with forge script so that we can have a reproducible way to actually fund and withdraw. So in our scripts section, we're going to create a new file called interactions.s.soul. And in here, we're going to have all of the ways we can actually interact with our contract. So we're just going to make a fund script and a withdraw script. So let's go ahead. SPDX, license identifier MIT. Thank you, GitHub Copilot. We're going to do pragma solidity 0.8.18. We'll do a little caret. We'll do contract interactions. This is going to be a script. So we'll say is script. We're going to import script from forge std script.soul. We're going to spell contract correctly. Okay, great. Excuse me, not interactions. We're going to call this fund fund me. So this is going to be our script for funding the fund me contract. We're also going to make a contract called withdraw fund me. So this is going to be our foundry script for funding. This is going to be our foundry script for withdrawing. So in here, as we're going to do function run, it's going to be external, external. And this is where we're going to put the code to actually do our stuff. Now, something that's important though, is we are pretty much going to want to fund our most recently deployed contract. So what I typically like to do is I have a script I've got a tool called Foundry DevOps that I use to actually grab my most recently deployed contract address. There's some other Foundry DevOps tools coming out and I will have a link in the description to the most up-to-date one that you should use because I'm probably not gonna maintain this moving forward unless people, unless a lot of people use it. This package helps your Foundry keep track of the most recently deployed version of a contract because I'm pretty much only gonna to wanna to run fund on my most recently deployed contract. So to work with this, we're first going to install it and you'll see why this is important very soon. We're going to run forge install chainxl.org dash foundry devops dash no dash commit. Great. We're going to install that. Now what we can do is say import DevOps tools from, and we'll just grab it right from the package. So we'll say foundry devops slash src slash devops tools dot soul. And in here, in this library, Foundry DevOps, SRC, it has this script called get recent deployment.sh. So in Foundry, you can actually run bash scripts or other types of scripts from Foundry. But in order to do this, in your foundry.toml, you need to set FFI equals true. Now, a word of caution here. 
If you set FFI to true, this means that you're gonna allow Foundry to run commands directly on your machine. More often than not, I recommend you try to keep this off as long as possible. But it is important for us to know how it works and how we can use it for something like this to get our most recent deployments. So this Foundry DevOps tool, you just install it, and then to use it, it has this DevOps tool that get most recent deployment that we can use to get the most recently deployed version of a contract. This way, we don't have to pass the fundme contract address that we want to work with every single time. So the first thing we do in our run function is we can say address most recently deployed equals DevOps tools dot get most recent deployment. And we pass the name of the contract, which is going to be fun to me, and the block dot chain ID. So it knows what to do. The way that this works is it looks inside of the broadcast folder based off the chain ID, and then just picks the this run latest and grabs the most recently deployed contract in that file. So now that we have the most recently deployed contract address, we can just call fund on this most recently deployed address. Now I'm actually going to separate where we actually do the funding into its own function and you'll see why soon. So I'm going to say function fund fund me address most recently deployed. I'm going to make this public. Say VM does start broadcast. And in order for us to actually do anything with the fund me contract, we're going to need to import fund me from at dot slash src slash fund me dot soul. We're going to wrap this most recently deployed address in here. We're going to say dot fund. And I'm going to create a uint256 constant send value equals. 0 0.01 ether send value. We're going to fund value is going to be send value. Close that off here. VN dot stop broadcast like this. And we actually have to type cast most recently deployed as a payable because we're going to be sending value here. But then I like to do a little console.log and we'll say funded fund me with, and if we do percent s, can actually populate that with send value. And so since we're using console, this is also located in the script.md, so we can import console from there. And I just like to see that, hey, this actually went through. So we have this fund fund me, and instead in our run, we're just gonna say fund fund me with this most recently deployed. So we're gonna have our run function call our fund fund, our fund fund me function. Whew big mouthful. So this is what we're actually going to do to fund our fund me contract. So if I pull up my terminal, I would run forge script scripts interaction dot s dot soul. And I'll put this little colon here to pick the contract. So we have fund fund me and we also withdraw fund me. I'm going to pick the fund fund me here. And then I would do dash dash RPC URL blah 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 dash dash private key blah blah. blah. And that's how it actually call fun fund me. So that's how I would call it as a script. And we want to test this as well. And this is where our integration tests are going to come into play. So integration tests are when you test a lot of your interactions, you test combinations of systems. And I usually like to separate my integration tests and unit tests in different folders. So I'm actually going to go ahead and do that. I'm going to create a new folder called unit. I'm going to take this fund me test .soul, stick it in here. And since we did that, we need to update some of our imports because they're now in different areas. I think I did it right. If I do forge test, I'm doing everything right. I'm kind of like halfway done with a bunch of stuff. Yep. Okay, cool. Test pass. That's great. And I'm also going to make a new file called fundme test dot fundme test integration dot dot soul. And I'm going to copy a lot of this from the fundme test, paste it in here. Fund me test integration, or we can also just call this interactions test dot dot soul. So maybe in here, we'll have our function set up, which is going to be external. We're going to say deploy fund me deploy equals new deploy fund me. So we have deploy fund me. Great. 
Say, and then same as the test, we're gonna do this bit here. So I'm just gonna paste that. Uh, let's, let's copy a lot of this actually. Change the name here. Cool, so we copied most of this. Let's change this name to interactions. Test is test. All the setup is the same. The only difference is now we're gonna say function test user can fund and user can fund public. Instead of funding directly with the functions, we're gonna import fund fund me from dot dot slash script slash interactions dot s dot sol. And in here we're gonna say fund fund me fund fund me equals new fund and me. Isn't that wonderful? Stay with me here, I swear this makes sense. And then we can do fund fund me dot fund fund me with the address of fund me. And this is why I separated those scripts out, right? Because I, I can't run with this. I want to run fund fund me and be able to add my own address in here. So we're testing this specifically to make sure our funding works. And we can actually go back to our test and do something similar to when we did the fund, we can make sure that they get added to the list of funders, we can do something like this in our test, paste it in here. Test user can fund inter actions like this. And we'll run this single test, forge test dash M, paste that there. Boom, oh, assertion failed. Oop. And let's actually put these VM broadcasts in the run. That's actually where we're gonna be doing them like that. We wanna put the broadcast down in the run, not up here. And I should probably have deal user just do one E 18. And this is where we're actually going to test that script. But let's also make the withdraw. I'm actually just gonna cheat a little bit. We're just gonna copy pretty much all of this, paste it in here. Instead of fund fund me, we're going to call this withdraw fund me. And instead of fund, we're gonna call withdraw, no value. Close this off, close this off. And instead of fund fund me, we're going to call withdraw fund me. And now in our test, we're going to say first, we're going to call fund me dot fund me with the address fund me. Then we're going to say draw fund me with draw fund me equals new withdraw fund me. We're going to do withdraw fund me dot withdraw fund me address fund me. Stay with me. And we're just going to assert address fund me dot balance equals zero. Stay with me here. So we need to import withdraw fund me from interactions as well. Excuse me, what we're going to do is we're going to fund using our scripts, and then we're going to withdraw using our scripts as well. So let's go ahead, let's run this forge test dash m paste that in here. Looks like we got a revert. Let's do let's do dash v v v v. See what's happened. Oh, looks like we are indeed out of funds. Oh, and in the withdraw fund me, we need vm dot start broadcast. And then of course, vm dot stop broadcast like this. Now let's run this test here. And we get it's passing. Whew. Okay, so I know we wrote a lot here. And I know I went through that kind of quickly. But feel free to pause and take a minute to real understand what we did here, right? So now we can run forge script interactions.s.sol fund fund me and then our network information here so that we're always calling the fund the way we want to call it and then we created some integration tests which kind of bring it all together and then we did the same thing with withdrawing money as well and now we've got a huge suite of tests that we can test all at once with forge test we see we pass everything and then we also can do forge test dash dash fork url sepolia rpc url or even mainnet rpc url and we see everything pass he, passes here as well so even when we're pretending to deploy to a live network everything is passing awesome
Now you might be asking, hey Patrick, running Forge, script, all that other crap, there's so much text. There's so much stuff to do there. I don't want to write all that stuff. And to that I say, you're thinking correctly. We want to work incredibly hard to be incredibly lazy. So I love the way you're thinking. And I know we're diverging from this a little bit, but we learned how to do integration tests. This is what we have left, but we're going to make a pit stop. I lied. Pit stop. How can we make running these scripts a lot easier? And this is where we're going to use something called a make file. So if you right click and you create a new file called a make file, this is where we're going to add some shortcuts for ourselves so we don't have to write those long scripts every single time. A make file is a simple text file used by the utility called make to automate the process of building and compiling programs for projects. It's pretty, it's really popular in the foundry world. You should have, if you create this make file in your folder and you type make, you should get something like no targets stop. If you don't get this, it means you don't have make installed and you'll need to install make. If you have a hard time installing make, be sure to leave a discussion on the GitHub repo associated with this course. Additionally, make files are great because they allow us to automatically grab what's ever in our .env without us having to do source.env every single time. So what we can do in our make file, we can do something like dash include .env, and now we can create shortcuts for commands, including whatever's in our .env file. So for example, if we wanted to make a shortcut for build, which wouldn't be much of a shortcut, we would type build, colon, semicolon, and then just do forge, build. Now what we could do in our terminal is type in make build, and you'll see it'll run forge build. So this was a short example, but what about a much bigger example, right? What if we wanted to do something like deploy Zapolia? What would that look? This little semicolon is if you want to do the command on the same line. If you don't want to do this command on the same line, you just hit enter and then tab and write your command down here. So for deploying this to Sepolia, we've done this a couple of times here, but it would be forge script script slash deploy fund me dot s dot soul deploy fund me dash RPC dash URL is going to be Sepolia RPC URL space dash private key is going to be private key to actually deploy it, we would do dash broadcast. And then finally, we probably would also want to automatically verify it, which we're going to teach you how to do right now, we would do dash dash verify dash dash ether scan dash API dash key and ether scan API key dash one, two, three, four, and then just some visibilities like that. Whew. Now if I toggle my word wrap, this is obviously a very big command. And this would suck to have to write out every single time. For us to verify every single time up oh, and actually, excuse me, in make file, you need to circle your environment variables with the dollar sign and these parentheses. In order for Foundry to automatically verify stuff for us, we need to get, we need to go to Etherscan and we need to sign up for our own API key. So we're going to go ahead and sign up Foundry course. We'll get our email. We'll go ahead and log in. I'm not a robot. And cool, once we're logged in, we can go up to our profile, down to API keys, and we can add to create a new API key, or maybe Foundry full course. And now we can use this API key, copy it, bring it over here, drop it into our .env as our etherscan API key, like this. And while I'm here, I'm also gonna add in my private key. But remember, this is for your W account only. I would never ever add my actual private key associated with real money in a .env file, that is ridiculous. Cool. Let's copy the private key, go back in here, we'll do private key equals this, okay, and cool. And now we have this super giant script, but we can run this whole thing in one command by just saying make deploy Sepolia. Now you don't have to run this command with me because again, we are deploying to a real network here and this does cost money but feel free to watch and follow along here. So now you can see what the actual script is doing down here. And we can see it's actually running our script without us having to do this giant command here. And just to note, I am doing toggle word wrap. All this is on one line, but if you do jump into the command palette, which again, this is command palette, this is file viewer, command palette, file viewer, command palette, and you do toggle word wrap, it'll 
automatically wrap the words around. But we can see we're actually sending this contract. We can see we actually are starting to verify the contract as well, right from our command line, just because we have an Etherscan API key. In fact, now if I go to polia.io, paste this contract address in here, we can see, oh my goodness, it's already been verified for us. We didn't even have to go to Etherscan ourselves and verify. It did it for us. Fantastic. So we deployed it and verified it all programmatically directly from our command line. Great job. So we've done this and we've done this. Now, I'm not going to go too deep into make files. However, I'm going to give you a framework that I like to use to make setting up make files a lot easier. If you go to Foundry Fund Me F23, the GitHub repo associated with this course, and you scroll down to the make file, we've got actually this whole setup to make it a lot easier that you can go ahead and use. Using that make file, if we scroll down to usage in here, oh, and by the way, you can of course always do cast send to interact instead of scripts, but whatever you want to do, you can use this as a much easier way to get set up. So for now, I'm actually just going to copy paste this whole thing, paste it into my make file here. Oh. I copied too much, way too much. Well, wow, okay. Whoopsies. And let's just walk through this. So this dot P H O N Y just tells make that all of these are not folders. And just anytime I have any command here, I pretty much just always put it in dot phony. Default anvil key. This is the just the default private key for anvil. We add this little help section so that if you just run make help, it'll tell you exactly how you can do stuff which is really helpful. So if we want to deploy something, we do make deploy args equals dash dash network Sapolia, which is really nice, or make deploy args equals, or make fund args equals network Sapolia. We can do forge clean, remove Git modules. We can reinstall all the packages, update packages, compile, test, snapshot, format our code, run an Anvil node. And then this is the most interesting stuff down here, because if I wanted to, so if I did this, I could do clear, I could do make anvil, which will spin up an anvil node. I could spin up a new terminal and then run. Well, let's run make help real quick. So I'll do make deploy args equals dash dash network anvil. Actually, we don't need to do any args for anvil because it defaults to anvil. If I just do make deploy, we'll automatically deploy to our anvil chain here. And we do indeed do that. If we wanted to deploy to Sepolia, we would do make deploy args equals dash dash network Sepolia, like that. Like I said, I'm not going to go too deep into make files. If you want to learn more about make files, you can definitely chat GPT them, AI them, or Google them. But they're incredibly helpful for making it so that we don't have to write these super long commands anytime we want to do something basic. Now, there's actually one more thing that we're optionally going to do before we push this up to GitHub. So if you go over to the GitHub repo associated with this course, this Foundry Fund Me CU or F23, depending on when you're watching this, if we go over to the test folder, we go to unit, we go to fundmetest.t.sol, you'll actually see a lot more stuff in here than we just went over, right? You'll see the setup actually has all this extra stuff. You'll see this ZK sync chain checker, this code constants, what, what, what's going on in here? So we didn't actually go over compiling and deploying to ZK sync here for a number of reasons. And one of the reasons actually was because of what I'm about to show you. Basically, certain tests will work on vanilla foundry, but not on ZK sync foundry. And certain tests will work on the ZK sync chain, but not on a EVM chain like Ethereum. And so I've actually created a package inside of our Foundry DevOps tool, well, I've created two packages, one called ZK Sync Chain Checker and one called Foundry ZK Sync Checker and actually help us to see if A, we're working on ZK Sync and then B, if we're working on Foundry ZK Sync. Yes, I know it sounds a little bit redundant there, but trust me, there's, there's a method to the madness here. So I want to just show you and highlight some of those differences. And depending on when you watch this, some of these might be updated. The ZK Sync team is working on reducing a number of these differences. But right now, if you go to the ZK Sync documents, there's a whole lot of differences between ZK Sync and Ethereum. There's a whole 
dock site called Ethereum Differences. Now, we're not going to go over this right now because this gets really low level. We go over this much, much later in the Advanced Foundry section because this is starting to get really low level here. But what I do want to do is highlight and show you kind of what the differences are. So again, remember this is optional. If you do want to follow along, feel free to do so. It is a great exercise for you. So in this GitHub repo, we have this file zksyncdevops.t.sol. And this is a really minimal, small test, kind of similar to the example contracts, where there's a couple tests in here that show you where a test will fail on ZK Sync, but pass on an EVM chain. It'll also show you where a test will fail on Foundry ZK Sync, but pass on what I'm calling vanilla Foundry, right? So what I want you to do is let's go ahead, let's just copy this whole thing. So we're going to copy this. And we're going to go into our test file, into unit. We're going to create a new file called zk sync devops.t.sol. And we're just actually going to paste this directly in here. Now, depending on how you've done your installations, you might get some right squigglies like this. This is because we have not installed Foundry DevOps here. So since you actually just learned about make files, we can go into the make file here and we should use whatever version is in this make file. So in the GitHub repo associated with this course, as of recording, it's 0.2.2, but you should use whatever's in the make file by the time you watch this. And we're actually going to copy paste this line into our code base here and run it. And if you get something like this, this is actually because you have to run this make remove command. Now, I'm going to do something and I want you to follow along with me. You're not going to understand it until the next lesson. Just roll with me here. In your dot git ignore file. You should have a dot git ignore. First, I want you to go in here, add this dot ds underscore store if you haven't already, then add this zk out with a little slash there if it's not already. There's a chance you don't have this file here. That's also okay. Hit control s or save and you should see this zk out file kind of be grayed out. If you don't have it and, and you save, it might be green here, but put this zk out thing in this dot git ignore first. And then we're going to run this make remove command. And again, if this doesn't make sense to you, don't worry about it too much right now, but you can just copy paste this line. What this is going to do is it's basically going to reset our modules here. So if you get that error, just copy paste that. It's going to remove git modules, remove git modules, and then it's going to do a, a git commit. So if that's all super confusing, don't worry too much about it. Then we can just run make install. Or we can say, you know what, let's just copy this whole line here and paste it in. So, and just roll with me. I know this is a little bit confusing right now. This will make sense to you much, much later. Right now, this is optional, but if you can follow along to me at this point, great. Now in our ZK Sync DevOps tool, now all those errors should go away. You should see kind of a setup like this. And what this is going to do is we have two tests in here that are going to show the differences between Foundry and Foundry ZK Sync. And then also the differences between ZK Sync and an EVM chain. So the first thing we're going to do, if you're following along with me, again, this is completely optional. This will be really helpful for later on when you're running tests with ZK Sync and with other EVM chains. What we're going to do is we're first going to run this test here on what I'm calling vanilla Foundry, so the base installation of Foundry. So in our terminal here, we can just run Foundry up to make sure we're on vanilla Foundry. We get an output that looks like this. And then once again, if we do forge dash dash help, we won't get any ZK sync stuff. But if we run this test as is, right? So I'm going to copy this, do forge test dash dash MT, paste it in dash VVV to just run this one single test. It's going to go ahead and pass like this, which is great. Now, though, if I switch to Foundry ZK Sync, so I'm going to do Foundry up dash ZK Sync like this. Now, if I run Forge, excuse me, I'm just going to press up a couple of times and I'm going to run this exact same test. This will also pass. However, if we get rid of this skip ZK Sync here, if we run this again and then add the dash dash ZK Sync flag here and we run it again, Without this skip ZK sync, it's going to compile and it may take a while to compile here. And we can see that this actually failed. Now, the reason this fails is because 
we're calling a very specific address known as a precompile that doesn't exist on ZK Syncat. Again, you don't need to know what a precompile is, but there's some really low level stuff. You also don't need to know what this assembly is. You don't need to know anything about this function. There's some really low level stuff that ZK Sync has that's different from other EVM chains. So this function actually fails like that. So there's going to be a lot of scenarios where a test will actually only pass on an EVM chain and not pass on ZK Sync when you add that dash dash ZK Sync flag. There will also be, interestingly enough, some scenarios where a test only passes on ZK Sync and fails on any other EVM chain. So if we go to this Foundry DevOps package that we just installed and kind of scroll down in here and see what's going on, we can scroll down to this usage ZK Sync checker. So this ZK Sync chain checker comes with a couple different functions and modifiers like skip ZK Sync, only ZK Sync, is ZK Sync chain, is on ZK Sync precompiles, is on ZK Sync chain ID. And you can use these functions and modifiers to basically skip a test or only run a test if you're passing that dash dash ZK Sync flag, okay? So if we put this skip ZK sync flag back in here, what is gonna happen is this test is gonna skip if it notices you're running with that dash dash ZK sync flag and it'll pass, which is what we wanna do, right? So if we run this again, it'll take a while to compile. Now that we have that skip ZK sync modifier in there, this test will pass because we're just skipping the test, right? We're saying, hey, we know that we're doing some stuff in this test that ZK Sync doesn't support. So we're gonna go ahead and skip it. So, and we can see that we passed again because we skipped, right? What we don't wanna do when we write our tests is have a whole bunch of them fail, right? Anytime a test fails, that should be a signal to us, hey, go back and fix this thing, okay? So that's the first thing. This ZK Sync chain checker comes with this skip ZK Sync modifier, which will skip tests if it notices you're passing this dash dash ZK Sync or running on the ZK Sync network. Now, additionally, and here's where it gets a little confusing, there are also some tests that will fail depending on what version of Foundry you're using. So this Foundry ZK Sync Checker is another package that I've created to check to see if you're on Foundry ZK Sync or not. And this test is commented out because it contains, again, some more advanced stuff in here. Again, don't worry too much about what this advanced stuff is. As we go deeper in the course, it'll make more sense. But this one will also fail uh, if you're using Foundry ZK Sync, and it doesn't even matter if you pass the dash dash ZK Sync flag or not, right? So let me show you. So I'm gonna go ahead, I'm gonna uncomment this out. Oops, I'm gonna need to leave that commented out though. And if we say test ZK Sync Foundry fails, this only vanilla Foundry means that this test is only gonna run if you're using vanilla Foundry and it will skip otherwise. So if I'm in my terminal, and then I do Foundry up. So this is gonna switch us back to vanilla Foundry. And I'm gonna run this test. So I'm just gonna do this without the dash of ZK Sync, obviously. Paste that in. This will pass, of course, because we're on vanilla Foundry. Oh, excuse me. FFI is disabled. Uh, we do need to have FFI. So this is one of the more advanced things that I haven't quite taught you yet. So in your Foundry.toml, we'll do FFI equals true, like this. This is something that can be considered a little bit dangerous to use. So just after you're done, you want to delete it. That would be great. We'll learn more about it later, but we'll go ahead. We'll run this again. And now it will actually pass because we have FFI turned on and it does indeed pass. Now I'm going to do foundry up dash ZK sync. We're going to switch over and you'll see that being on ZK sync foundry, even if I don't have this dash dash ZK sync flag. So we can run this without the dash dash ZK sync flag and it would fail, right? So if we get rid of this only vanilla foundry here, let's run this test real quick, paste it in here. It's gonna go ahead and fail. It's saying reason unknown selector. So this is like a very specific cheat code that currently foundry ZK sync doesn't support. Maybe by the time you watch this, it will support this cheat code, but as of today, it does not support this. So we add back in this only vanilla foundry. We'll clear the terminal here and we'll rerun this test and it'll now pass because 
it's now skipping this. And what's interesting is you notice we didn't even do dash dash ZK sync here, right? It's because on ZK Foundry, it doesn't support all the same cheat codes that Vanilla Foundry has. So there's a little bit of a, a difference there. Now let's go back. Let's remove FFI. Let's re-comment this whole thing out. And remember, in our dot .git ignore, we want to make sure we have this ZK out now because you've compiled with ZK sync and we don't want to push that up to GitHub. You'll learn about that in a minute. But uh, this is a little bit more confusing, I know, because I, I asked you to kind of kind of blindly follow me here. But I just want to reiterate what we just learned here. This dash dash ZK sync flag means we're running on a ZK sync type network. And, and if we do a test like we did in here that doesn't work on ZK sync, it'll just always fail. So we can go ahead and we can just skip those tests. Same thing, actually, the other way around, there's some tests that will only pass on ZK sync. So we have this other flag called only ZK sync, where, you know, let's say this was a test that only worked on ZK sync, we would add this only ZK sync modifier. But right now we have this skip ZK sync modifier in here. And if you go to the GitHub, like I said, you'll see kind of those all over the test suite, right? So if we go in here, um, yeah, you'll actually see, oops, sorry, that's the Foundry DevOps one. If we go into the test file of the Foundry Fund Me, we're going to test here, we're going to unit, fund me test. If we scroll in here, we see some of these functions, right? Is ZK sync chain, right? We have skip ZK sync modifier because we're doing something that ZK sync actually doesn't support for this test here. That's actually the only one. Um, but as we get deeper and deeper into the curriculum, into advanced foundry, you'll see this more because some tests won't work on ZK sync and some tests won't work on vanilla EVM. So, so this is the tool that you can use. This is the package that you can use to only run certain tests on ZK sync or only run certain tests on other EVM chains. And this is what you can use to only run certain tests on vanilla foundry or only run certain tests on ZK sync foundry. Again, this is optional. This will be helpful as you get later and later into the curriculum and as you go out and about into the real world and build these protocols and build these things. You want to get really good at knowing, okay, like, yes, this test is only going to work on ZK Sync, so I need to do this. This actually becomes much, much more crucial way, way, way later in the advanced foundry section when we get to minimal account abstraction. If we scroll down in here, there's actually a number of tests that only work on ZK Sync. And you'll see us use this only ZK Sync modifier because the test actually won't work on vanilla EVM because ZK Sync actually has a lot of functionality, a lot of power that is only native on ZK Sync. So, all right, but hopefully you learned some from this optional lesson. When you go through the test suites of Cypher and Updraft and you'll see stuff like this, it's because certain tests only work on either ZK Sync or an EVM chain. So, cool. All right, so now let's finally do our last step here, which is going to be push to GitHub. You have done a ton this project, and this is the final step. Oh my goodness, what a badass GitHub repo you are about to push up. A couple of notes when we do this. The first thing is make sure that .env is in your .gitignore. I additionally like to add broadcast in here as well. I don't like to push broadcast up. Anything that's not in here, you could accidentally push up publicly to your GitHub. So we don't wanna do that. Sometimes it's good to even keep lib out and I'm actually gonna do that here. I'm gonna put, take lib out as well. All right, so let's learn how to push our code up to GitHub. We're using this hard hat free code camp because I've made it in one of my previous videos. And we're starting from a blank GitHub. So. At this point, you should have a GitHub repository. And you'll probably see even less on here than what you see right now, because yours will be totally blank. GitHub and Git and version control is so crucial because it's how most of the crypto community interacts and builds with each other. So anytime you go to any GitHub repository, like for example, the Aave protocol, which is completely open source, you can come in here and you can make issues on the repo. You can make pull requests, you can actively participate in working with these protocols. For example, Solidity, which is what we're working on right now, is also an open source repo. And I know I've been saying this a lot, but repo is slang for repository. A code repository is where all the code of a project belongs. 
It's one of the beautiful things with Web3 and crypto is that all the smart contracts you're gonna work with are open source. You can actually see the code, learn from the code and get better yourself. And if you're asking for places to participate and contribute, most of these protocols have grants and they'll actually pay you to help them work with their code. Or if you just wanna learn, you can make pull requests to code bases as well. When I was first getting started in Web3, one of the best things I did was make contributions to the Brownie repo, which is a Pythonic smart contract framework similar to Foundry. And I did it for free because I wanted to learn and I wanted to see if I could contribute. Doing stuff like this allowed me to learn much faster and get to meet and interact with a lot of people in the community. And it's a ton of fun. And like I said, this will be your profile for careers, for jobs, etc. Anytime I'm interviewing a candidate for my roles, one of the first things I do is actually look at their GitHub. Now GitHub is a centralized company and there are decentralized Git solutions being worked on right now, but none of them are really popular at the moment. So with that being said, if we're at the GitHub docs right now, we can go ahead to get started and we can even go to the quick start. There's a whole lot of docs here. We should of course already have a GitHub profile set up. And if you want, you can go to this create a repo section, which will teach you how to create a repo directly through the website. But we want to do it from the command line. Why? Because we are engineers and we want to do what? That's right. We want to work incredibly hard to be incredibly lazy. And we don't want to have to log onto the internet every single time we want to make changes to our code. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow this documentation called adding locally hosted code to GitHub because our code here is obviously locally hosted. We're going to push it to GitHub. So if we scroll down in the docs here, it gives us a little bit of and we down we get to the, our first bit initializing a Git repository. So if we haven't already installed Git, which we should, you want to first install Git before we keep going. The directions for installing Git can be found here and in the GitHub repo associated with this course. And you'll know you've done it right if you can do Git dash dash version and you see something like this show up could be a slightly different version. If this Git version doesn't pop up, pause the video and go and install Git. If you run into trouble, of course, you can use the discussions here or your AI friend. Now that you have Git, we need to initialize a Git repository. Foundry actually automatically initializes a Git repository for us. Most of the time, you can just run Git status and see some type of output that might look like this. If you don't see an output that looks like that after running Git status, you might have to do Git init dash B main. And if we run this now, we'll get a warning. Reinit ignored, reinitializing existing Git repository because we already have a Git repository in here. If you're using an earlier version of Git, we could do something like this. But then what we want to do is we want to do something called adding our files. So if we do clear now, so first let's make sure we're on this correct folder, right? So we'll do an ls. Ah, we can see all the stuff that we're in. We'll do pwd as well. PWD allows us to see the path that we're currently in. LS prints all the folders and files in our current directory or folder, right? This is indeed the correct folder. If you're not in the correct folder, you can CD down or CD up into your correct folder. But before we do git add, we usually want to do a git status. This git status will tell us, well, let me pull this up here. This git status will tell us what files and folders we're going to push up to GitHub. One of the things we should always check when doing git status is, is a dot env in here, or is there any sensitive information in here? And then I'll explain some of these greens and red stuff in a second. But looking at this, I see git modules, that's fine. Those libs are fine. Git ignore is good. We definitely want to push up git ignore because git ignore is good. We deleted those counters, so those are good. Git snapshot, make file. Okay, the rest of this looks pretty good. Let's clear this for now. If I were to pull this down and I were to open up my dot git ignore, which we can do by either going to here and selecting dot git ignore, or we can open up our file explorer with command P or control P, depending on your environment, and typing in dot git ignore, we scroll to the bottom, we see this dot env. If I were to remove this and then save, pull my terminal up and do git status, you'll now see this dot env does indeed show up in here. We absolutely don't want this because these are the files that we're going to potentially push up to GitHub and expose to the internet. So we don't want to, we absolutely don't want to do this. We want to make sure our dot env is in our dot git ignore. So 
We can do that. Or if you're being a total badass, you've encrypted your key in a separate file outside of this package, or maybe you're just going to use third web deploy instead of actually putting private keys in here. But in any case, we're going to do clear. And now we're going to do git add period. This period says add all of the folders and all the files that are in here in that git status, except for the ones obviously in the dot git ignored. Now, if I do git status now, you'll see they're all green. This means that all these green stuff are changes to be committed. They're staged, if you will. They're in a staged position. These are all the changes that we're going to commit to our history. So if we type git log right now, we can actually see a list of something called commits. We can see two in here right now. You might see a different number. I see two. Git keeps a versioned history of your code base. This way in the future, if you make a mistake, you can revert back to a previous version very easily. So now if we do git status again, we'll see all this green stuff. We'll look through these and it looks like these are good. There's no dot env here in here. All of this looks like looks solid. We'll do our first commit. So we'll do git commit dash M, which stands for message. Our first commit little exclamation point and hit enter. And you'll see something like this pop up. And then you might get something like this. If you've never worked with git before, your name and email were added automatically. We're a little bit confused here. We'll talk about this in a second. Now, if I do git status, it says on branch main, nothing to commit, working tree clean. But if I do git log, I now see a new commit, our first commit, even though it's the third commit, it's fine. <laughs> our first commit, great. But if you flip over to your GitHub and you hit refresh, there's still nothing up here. So this commit history is stored locally in our computer. We want to push up all that code up to GitHub here. And that's what we're going to do next. So we did git add, we did git commit, and then we're going to do this bit, importing a git repository with the command line. After you initialize the git repository, you can push the repository to GitHub using GitHub CLI or Git. One thing we can do is you can download this GitHub CLI with GH. We're going to do it directly with Git because if you want to work with GitLab or Radical or something else in the future, you'll be able to do it fine. So we're going to scroll down to adding a local repository to GitHub using Git. It's important to note that GitHub and Git are actually different. Git is this version control thing. If I do Git log, it's this tool that allows us to do this version control. GitHub is a website that allows us to push our Git logs and our Git commits and all of our Git stuff. So Git is a tool. GitHub is a company and a website that allows us to push our Git stuff. So first thing we're going to need to do is create a new repository on github.com. So we're going to go to GitHub, our GitHub. We're going to go to repositories. We're going to do new. We're going to call this foundry fund me F23 or whatever you want to call it. You can call it foundry first repo, probably no exclamation mark or be like, thanks. Crypto is awesome or something like that. I'm going to do foundry fund me F23. Add a description if you want. Let's make it public. We're going to do some open sourcey stuff and we're going to skip the rest of this for now. If you're really nervous about private keys and stuff, you can make this private, but keep in mind, even making this private doesn't mean your private key is safe because anybody who works at GitHub could see your private key. So we're going to make this public and it's good to get used to making public projects and now you have a project on your resume and that's really cool. If you make it private, nobody can see your sick projects on your resume. So let's create this repository. And now we see we have a repository here and it's completely blank, right? There's no code in here. There's nothing going on in here. So we've done that though. Let's move to the next step. At the top of your repository, click the little copy thing to copy the remote repository URL. So here, so on my GitHub, we scroll down here, quick setup. If you've done this kind of thing before, just go ahead and copy this bit here. And we're going to run a couple of commands here. So first we're going to run git remote add origin and then paste that URL. This remote keyword refers to a website like GitHub. Add is saying we're going to add a remote place for us to push our code. Origin is a shortened name for this giant URL and this giant URL is the actual place. So with that, if we do git remote dash V, we actually can see all the different places we can push and pull our code from. Right now it's just the single because that's the one we added. So fetch is pull and 
push. And they're both pointing to the same place. Next, we're going to do git push dash u origin main. Git push dash u origin main. This is saying we want to push all of our current code to the URL associated with origin, which it's this one right here, and on the main branch. Don't worry about branches yet. Now, if you run into an issue like this, or if you just run into any issue, there's a couple different ways to troubleshoot. One of the ways is actually asking ChatGPT. ChatGPT is pretty darn good at troubleshooting Git and GitHub issues. One thing I can do for me, my issue is that I'm logged in as my main account, but I'm trying to push to this hard hat free code camp account. So I might do git config user.name and then I'll add user.name and I'll add this. And what this will do is it'll change the user that I'm trying to sign in with. And then we can do git push origin because origin is now pointing to this repo that we made and this is where we want to push to. And then we'll say main because main is the main branch that we want to work on. Again, don't worry too much about branches. And for me, it's asking for my GitHub password. And hopefully you'll see an output that looks like this. If you go back to your code and you ref and you hit refresh, you'll see all your code being pushed onto this GitHub repository. Fantastic. Now you have a project on your GitHub. And like I said, if you run into problems, ChatGPT or Find or some other AI buddy are normally very good at helping you out and working with Git and making sure that Git works. This is phenomenal. Now, of course, we're going to go ahead and check this off. Our README looks pretty terrible here. So if this were going to be more professional, we would have a little about section. This is a crowdsourcing app. We'd have a quick a getting started with requirements, quick start, and some and yada, yada, yada. We would do, if we save that, we would do then git add dot, git commit minus m, updated readme, git push. Oops. And then actually we can just do this so that we can just run git push instead of git push origin main every single time. I'm going to copy this line. Now, if I come back over to my project and I refresh, we'll see there are now four commits. This updated readme is my most recent one. If I scroll down to the README, we now have an about, blah, 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 and stuff. If you're looking for some extra credit, try setting up this README without reading my README. And then once you think you have a pretty solid README, go to the Foundry full course, GitHub repo associated with this course, scroll down to less than seven, go to the code base here, and you can actually go ahead and see if your README is better than mine. Now that we know a little bit more about how Git works, you can see actually in my README, if you scroll down, we have this thing called quick start with Git clones. Anytime you want to copy somebody else's code base locally, you can just run this Git clone. For example, if I'm in my VS code, I pull up the terminal. I'm going to go down a directory, PWD. Great, great. I'm here, ls. I can make a directory, Patrick fund me F23. I can come in and do Git clone, paste that URL, the chain Excel org, Patrick fund me F23, hit enter. And now if I type LS, I'll have Patrick fund me F23. And if we do code, Patrick fund me F23, which will open up our VS code or do file open this folder, we can see this, this is actually Patrick's project pulled down from GitHub for us. Awesome work. And with that being said, you now have a project on your GitHub that you can show off. If you're excited about this, just scroll down, hit this tweet me button and tweet at me like this and just get super hyped up, right? Like I said, it's great to celebrate the little wins. Whew. So I know this was an absolutely massive section. So let's do a little refresher on what we learned and then we'll call it a day. So here's what we learned. We learned more about how to set up a Foundry project more professionally. We have our source folder with many different contracts in here. We learned how to refactor our code base so we can make it more modular. We're passing a price feed in so that we can deploy this FundMe contract to any chain we want. We've added an interactions script, which has two different contracts, Fund FundMe and Withdraw FundMe, 
which we can use to withdraw and fund our most recently deployed contract. We learned more about working with mocks in testing, running integration tests, forking testing. We learned a lot about gas. We learned about storage. We learned a tiny bit about make files and we built our first GitHub repo and we pushed it up and we are incredibly proud that we've done so. So now is a great time to take a break. And if you've made it this far, you have most of the basic knowledge to begin going on your own. If you really wanted to, you could stop taking the course right now and just be on your way. <laughs> However, we wanna make you not just okay, but phenomenal and prepared for everything this space has to offer. So take a walk, take a break, get some coffee, get some ice cream, do whatever you want to do to take some you time and we'll see you in the next project. All right, welcome to lesson eight. We come down to the GitHub repo associated with this course. We could scroll down to lesson eight and all the code that we're gonna be working with is here. Now, it's gonna be a little bit easier. You do not have to code at all for this one. Congratulations. For this one, we're gonna do it a little bit different. For this one, I'm going to teach you the basics of how your MetaMask or how your wallet interacts with a website so that you have that foundational knowledge. I think it's incredibly important for you to know how to do this, and it's incredibly important for you to verify that your wallet is sending the transaction that you actually want it to send. We're not going to be teaching you how to build a full stack application here. However, we have plans to launch a full stack course on Cypher and Updraft, so be sure to follow along Cypher and Updraft and see if it's already out. However, this HTML FundMe F23 has a very basic raw JavaScript full website application that if you want to try to replicate it, you can absolutely do so. But it is important that you understand what's going on under the hood when you're interacting with these websites. And the knowledge we're gonna teach you here will work for every single website that you interact with so you can actually know exactly what's going on when you interact with a website sending a transaction to the blockchain. So normally I walk you through what we're gonna do, but for this one, we're just gonna go ahead and we're gonna jump right in. And now that you've downloaded Git and you've been working with Git and GitHub, we can actually start working with this code base as if we had just come across it. So if we pull up our code base, we're at Foundry F23, that repo with all of our code in it. What we can do is we can copy this URL and begin to work with it as if we just downloaded right from GitHub. Now, all of my readmes, like I said, are gonna have this quick start, which you can go ahead and follow. This of course should be Cypher. But what we could do to get started with this Git repo is we can go ahead and clone it, git clone, paste that in here. And then we can code HTML, fund me F23 or file, open that. Oh, it looks like I already have it open here. And great, we have this HTML fund me repo here. Now, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually going to spin up this website. So this HTML fund me has some very basic HTML and JavaScript to run a website. I'm gonna use this extension called live server, which you can install to run the website right from your VS code. Alternatively, you can open this up, you could right click, reveal in finder, or just open this up in whatever file explorer you, that you use, double click it, and open it up right in your browser, and this is what the website looks like. I'm gonna go ahead though and use this go live button instead, which will open it up here, as opposed to in my path, the VS code will actually be serving it up. So this is the website, this is the minimalistic website that we're gonna be using to show you exactly how MetaMask interacts with the website. Now, the first thing to understand when working with a website is this MetaMask bit. If I right click and I hit inspect, I get this little window over here. And if I hit this double arrow, I can go over to the console. Now this is a live JavaScript shell which has a lot of information about the browser that we're working in here. If you don't know JavaScript, don't worry about it. But the most important bit here is that if you have MetaMask or some wallet, what it does is it injects it into your browser object. This browser object in this JavaScript shell is known as the window object. 
And if I type window in here, I get all this stuff, all these functions that I can call on this window object. And one of the objects that comes with the window is this window.ethereum. MetaMask injects this window.ethereum object into our browser. And it's this window.ethereum JavaScript object that these front ends, these websites interact with to send transactions to our MetaMask or to any wallet that we're working with. If, for example, we were to switch to a browser that does not have MetaMask installed, go to that same site, we right click, inspect, we go over to console, and I type in window.ethereum here, we get undefined because this has no MetaMask. It has no API for us to connect with. The MetaMask documentation has all of the information in here that you need to know to actually send and work with this window.ethereum object if you want to learn more. So cool. So this is our website, and we know we have this window.ethereum object. Now, in our HTML fundme F23, if we scroll over to this index.js, we can actually see the code that a website will use to actually interact with our wallet. And usually one of the first things that you'll see is most websites will have some connect button. It's a button for them to know, hey, there is a man of mask here, and there are accounts in here that we can actually connect to and send transactions to. So here's an example, if you go to this index.js file of some JavaScript that allows people to connect and work with the MetaMask. This is what one of those async functions will look like. So one of the first steps they do is they check to see that this window.ethereum object even exists. And if it does exist, they'll do something and they'll call something like this function, await ethereum.request eth request accounts. This is a function that the MetaMask object has that allows the website to see that there are indeed accounts that it can send transactions to. It's not taking your private key or exposing your private key. It's just allowing the website to send transactions for you to actually sign. So in my HTML here, I've got this button. And again, you don't really need to know HTML or JavaScript here, but I've got this button called connect button. And in my JavaScript, I've got this line connect button equals document dot get element by ID connect button and connect button dot on click is going to call our connect function. And this connect function is going to first check to see if MetaMask exists with this line and then try to connect one of those accounts. Right now, if we go to our MetaMask, we can see here that we're not connected to the site. But if we go ahead and we click the connect button, you'll see MetaMask pop up and ask to connect to one of our accounts which we can select an account to connect. And this is how our website actually gets connected. And now we can see, oh, let me switch to account one. Now we can see our account one is indeed connected. Now that we're connected and we have some accounts, we can then lower on call one of these functions. And great. So this website has some functions that look pretty familiar or should look pretty familiar. We have a get balance, a withdraw and a fund. This website is actually designed to work with our Foundry FundMe that we just created. So if we go back to Foundry FundMe, it's designed to work with this contract. If we go to SRC, fundme.sol, function fund, it's designed to work with fund, and then also withdraw, and then finally see the balance. If I right click and I hit inspect, and I hit the drop down, I go to console, I hit get balance, depending on the network that I'm on, I'd get the balance of some address. And if we look in the code, there's this constants folder, which has this contract address that's hard coded in, and we'll get the address of whatever contract is here. On ETH mainnet, apparently there's a contract there. How is it actually making this call? How is it reading off the blockchain? We go back to this index.js and we look for that get balance function. We can see it's doing some interesting stuff here. So first it's checking to see that MetaMask exists, and then it's doing this line, const provider equals new ethers.provider.web3 provider. This ethers package is a JavaScript package that makes it easy to interact and work with MetaMask. Remember how in MetaMask, if we go to our MetaMask, we select the little button, we go to settings, networks, add network. We can actually see in our MetaMask popping up, we can see all these different networks. We can go to add a network manually. Actually, let's just go back to networks. We see that each one of these networks comes with this RPC URL. So what's happening when we call this get balance function, and it looks like for some reason this address has some balance in it, it's making an API call via this RPC URL in our MetaMask. So if we tried to call fund or withdraw, it would try to call fund or withdraw 
onto this address. Now, in our MetaMask right now, we're connected to ETH mainnet. And what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to practice interacting with a real contract using the Foundry FundMe that we just created. So if we pull up our terminal, we'll go down in directory, we'll go to CD Foundry Fund Me F23. What we can do is we can say make Anvil and we'll start a local Anvil chain, create a new terminal here. Now we'll go down a directory, we'll go down back to Foundry Fund Me F23. Now we'll run make deploy. This will deploy a Fund Me contract onto our Anvil chain. Remember, Foundry Fund Me, we go to our Foundry Fund Me repo, we go down to our make file, we go to the deploy target in the make file. We see we're running Forge script deploy Fund Me with network args, which if you don't say anything, it'll default to the Anvil network. So now we ran make deploy, we deployed a contract fund me to this address. And if you look in constants.js, it looks like that's already the address that's right here. Perfect. So what we can do on the front end then is we go up to our MetaMask, we'll go to settings, networks, add network, and we'll go ahead and we'll add a network manually for Anvil. We'll type Anvil, the RPC URL we can find right here from our terminal, we'll copy that. We'll do HTTP dot dot slash slash paste that in. I already have this network, so it's going to tell me, hey, this URL is already currently in use. The chain ID is 31337. Currency symbol is ETH or GO or whatever you want to make it. And there's no block explorer. And then you normally hit save. Like I said, I already have it in here. So we can just select Anvil and boom, all the details are right here. Now in our MetaMask, what we can do is we can flip over to this Anvil chain and begin to interact with this website connected to our blockchain with this FundMe contract that was just deployed. So now we, go and we can go ahead and connect. We can hit get balance, which is gonna be zero because we just deployed this contract. And we have our withdraw and fund functions here. Now, obviously, if I try to fund with 0 0.1, hit fund, we're gonna get an error here because this account doesn't have any money. But what we can do is we can grab one of the private keys from Anvil, we'll copy this, go back, go to accounts, import account, private key, paste it in, hit import, and I've already imported it. So it's saying the account I'm trying to import is a duplicate. Then we can scroll down to that account that we just imported and connect to that account instead. And now we have an account with some actual money in it. Okay, great. So now we have an account that's actually connected via the Anvil chain. Now an important note, if this Anvil chain goes down, or for example, you are following along and you turn it off and you come back to MetaMask, and maybe you'll switch networks, switch back to Anvil, you're gonna get this whirling circle of death and you can X out or do something like that. Or you can kill the network and re-import it. Or you can just turn your chain back on. Come back, switch over to Anvil, and we're connected again. Now, since you just killed this network and restarted it though, if you did deploy, with make deploy, you'd have to run make deploy again. And great. And we can go back to our front end. We can see it was this account four that was the one that actually deployed that contract. So let's do a little refresh to get rid of that warning. We'll go ahead and reconnect. Looks like we're good. If we go to MetaMask here, we're connected. Awesome. So now we can hit this get balance function, like I said, and it's returning the balance of that contract address that we just deployed. So what we can do now is we can call this fund function by putting an amount in the amount section. If I call fund, MetaMask actually pops up saying, hey, do you want to call this fund function? And we're going to go, oh, how does it know actually how to do that? If we go back to our Git repo and we'll go ahead and hide the terminal, not delete it. We can go to our index.js. We'll look for the fund function because we have the fund button. And we're saying fund button on click, call the fund function. We'll scroll down here. What it does when we call this fund function is at first it gets this eth amount by calling document dot get element by id eth amount dot value. So it's grabbing this 0 0.1 out of here on the front end. We're checking to see if MetaMask exists on the front end. We're doing this provider line, which gets the RPC URL from inside of our MetaMask. Again, we use ethers to get the RPC URL out of it. We get this signer, which allows us to grab this contract, this account for that is connected, 
this signer equals provider dot get signer. It gets that account form. And then we're doing this line contract equals new ethers contract. And to interact with anything, remember we need a contract address, we need an ABI, and to send the transaction, we need a signer. So the contract address we're getting from our constants file, which is right here. And if we pull up our terminal, it's the same as what we deployed here. And if it's not the same, we would just copy paste it in there. The ABI we also get from our constants file. And this ABI has all the functions that we can call on that contract. One of them obviously is the fund function down here. I'm gonna, I'll go ahead and hide this again. And then we have this transaction here where we do await contract.fund the transaction and we send some value by doing this ethers.utils.parse ether, which turns that 0 0.1 into way, like 0 0.1 gets sent to 1, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, right? And that's how this MetaMask actually pops up here because we're sending this transaction in JavaScript. Now, what this does is it sends the transaction to our MetaMask. So the website never accesses and never actually sees the private key. The private key always stays inside of this MetaMask. So the website sends a transaction to the MetaMask. The MetaMask pops up and says, do you want to sign this with the private key? And you can confirm or reject. Now in here, there's a lot of data, right? If we go to data, it looks like MetaMask was smart enough to know that this is calling a fund function, but it's having a hard time knowing what is actually happening. But we can see the raw transaction data in this hacks section of the transaction. And then of course we can see 0 0.1 go or Ethereum, the value being 0 0.1, right? So this should be the fund function. And we can actually verify that this is indeed the fund function by using the cast command to verify this data. So here, now I'm going to be teaching you a little introduction to function selectors. And we're going to talk about this a lot more later on. But the important thing to know is that in our contracts, all of our solidity functions get transformed into this thing called a function selector. And like I said, we'll learn more about it a lot later. But if we go to our function fund, this needs to get broken down to some low level bytecode, right? And when we send this transaction, we need to convert this human readable fund into the actual bytecode, the actual EVM low level code for Ethereum to understand what function we're actually calling. So what MetaMask actually does when calling this fun function is it converts it to its function selector. And we can actually find the function selector ourselves by using a cast command. So we'll run cast sig, which stands for signature fund like this, and we'll get an output like this. This means the function signature fund returns the function selector this. And again, don't worry about these terms right now. We're going to explain them in depth much later, and this will make sense much later. But what we can do is we want to make sure that this website that we're using isn't calling a malicious function, right? We want to make sure it's actually calling the fund function. So we can run this command, get this function selector, and then go check out the hex here and say, do these, do these actually match? So I can actually copy this hex data. Maybe I'll drop to the bottom of this, paste it here, and we'll grab what it should be here, and boom. Okay, great. These do indeed match. If I were to, for example, reject this transaction, and I'm going to go to our constants, I'm going to update this fund function from fund to steal money. Let's say there is another function called steal money, right? I'm going to go ahead and save this. Cast sig steal money would have a different what's called function signature. And again, don't worry about it too much, but it just has a different like low level hex encoding of this. So now if we change this to steal money and maybe the website was malicious and instead of the fund function calling fund, it called steal money instead, we would want to make sure that we're not calling this steal money function. So if I refresh the front end, I'll put 0 0.1 in here. I'll hit fund. If we go to the data, if we go to the hex, what we can do then is we can copy this hex, bring it back to the bottom, paste it in here. We can say, oh, it looks like this is the function that our MetaMask is calling. And we can run cast sig, steal money like this and see, oh my goodness, our website is actually calling the steal money function and not the fund function that I want it to be calling. So this is a taste of how we can actually verify the transactions that we're calling.
Now, if this has function parameters, we can do this thing called call data to code. So these are functions that don't have any parameters, right? Fund and steal money both don't have any parameters. If they did have parameters, this hex data would be a lot bigger, right? Because you, we'd have to send a lot more data to call the function. So later on, when you want to verify a transaction that has parameters, what you do is cast dash dash call data dash decode. You would paste the data. Actually, let me see what this does. It goes say call data. So you do cast dash dash call data to code. Maybe something, you know, paste the signature, paste the call data. And if there are parameters in here, and parameters with the call data, it would tell you what each parameter of this function is. And this is not a great example because there's no parameters in here. But like I said, you'll learn about this methodology later. So I just wanted to introduce it to you here that when you are sending transactions in MetaMask, you are going to be the developers. You are going to be the ones smart enough to know how to actually decode them. Like I said, we'll go in depth more with that a little bit later. But I'm going to go ahead and reject this for now. We're going to go back to our constants. We're going to change this back to fund. We're going to refresh. We're going to go back to index and we're going to steal money. We're going to change this back to fund like this. Okay, great. So now if I go ahead and refresh now, I put 0 0.1 in here, hit fund. MetaMask is going to pop up. I can go to hex. I can see this here and go down. I'll do cast. I'll clear. I'll do cast sig fund like this. I'll see that I'm expecting to call this function here. So I'll paste this here. I'll go to my MetaMask, I'll copy this, I'll see if they're the same, and sure enough, they are. Okay, great. So now though, I'm going to go ahead and hit confirm. And when we hit confirm, our MetaMask is actually signing this transaction and sending the function via that API call, right? That 127.0.0.155000, that RPC URL that we gave it for Anvil, right? And if we're on a mainnet or testnet, it's going to be that Infura endpoint that comes built into MetaMask, right? Now that we've sent it, we can actually call get balance now. We can see the balance has indeed increased, right? The balance has upped. What I could do now is withdraw, as we know. We go back to our Foundry Fund Me. We go to SRC. Go to Fund Me. We go to Function Withdraw. We know that this is an only owner function. So if we go back to our, our application here, calling withdraw from the owner will, of course, work. But if I switch, Let's go ahead and switch to a different account. We'll go, actually, let's go ahead and we'll send some money between our accounts. We'll send some money to account three, send maybe a hundred, doesn't really matter. We'll go ahead and confirm this. And this is sending, of course, on our Anvil chain, right? Because that's the one that we're on. Now, if I switch over to account three, which now has 100, I'll connect to my account three. If I try to call withdraw, we're going to get this RPC error, right? Execution error, right? Call withdraw. Maybe we'll go ahead and refresh. Are we still on account three? We sure are. Withdraw, we're getting an error, right? Because it's only owner. But if I switch back from Anvil, from account three back to account four, now we're connected via account four. I'll call withdraw here. We'll see MetaMask does indeed pop up. If we go to the hex. We can see this hex here. I'll pull up my MetaMask to make sure. I'll do cast sig withdraw. Okay, great. This is the hex for our withdrawal function. Those look like they're the same. Awesome. So I can have some assurance that I want to head and confirm and call this withdrawal function. So we're going to get that 0.1 out. Remember before the balance was 0.1. Once this finishes mining, the balance will go back to zero. And sure enough, that's exactly what we see. So I know this was a quick lesson, but I wanted to show you from a low level what actually interacting with these websites really looks like. And if you're interested in doing more full stack work, feel free to come check out this repo, this HTML, which has all the HTML and raw JavaScript for interacting with a website. There are a ton of tools for working with React and Svelte and other frameworks as well if you're interested in building more full stack applications too. And if you're unfamiliar with JavaScript, some of this might have been a little bit tricky, but let's at least do a refresher on the important things to know when it comes to interacting with websites and what's actually happening under the hood. In order for a website to send a transaction to your wallet, you need to connect to that wallet in some capacity. And one of the most popular ways is by injecting your browser extension into right into the browser. A browser can check to see that the MetaMask object is there by doing a check on window.ethereum and seeing if it gets a return. 
There are other ways to inject other types of wallets into browsers as well, like Wallet Connect, Ledger, etc. But at the end of the day, they're all going to connect some type of object to the website so the website can send transactions to the browser. You'll usually hit connect, and then you'll see in whatever wallet you're using that you're indeed connected. When a website wants to send a transaction to our wallet, what it does is it first needs to get the provider or the RPC URL out of the MetaMask. And with Ethers, you see that the line that does that right here. And what that line is doing is essentially is saying, hey, MetaMask, I know you got some settings. I know you have some networks in here. I would like access to that RPC URL, please, so I can send transactions. And additionally, I would like access to one of those accounts in there so I can send transactions to one of those accounts. Can you tell me who's connected so I can go ahead and send transactions? Once it's connected, it'll send a transaction to our wallet. Again, the private key never leaves your wallet and we wouldn't want to use a wallet that actually exposes the private key. So the website sends a transaction to our browser where if we do one now, the browser will prompt us, hey, would you like to sign this transaction to which we have to confirm or deny? We learned a very basic way of checking on something called the function selector or the function signature to make sure that the website isn't trying to be malicious and do a bad transaction for us. We will learn later on in the course how to decode more complex transactions and more complex functions rather than just this one, which has no parameters. But we could go ahead and, for example, confirm this. In my YouTube, I've got a much longer video if you want to check it out which goes over how to actually connect your front end, if you're interested, to your smart contracts a couple different ways. We have a raw HTML, a Next.js and Ethers, Next.js and Web3 React, Next.js and Morales, Next.js and Web3 Model. There's a lot of different ways to actually connect your front ends to your websites. But if you want to learn more about how this works, definitely be sure to check out this video. The link to this will be in the GitHub repo associated with this course. And of course, all the code associated with this lesson is in the GitHub repo associated with this course as well, if you want to learn more about how front ends and websites work. So that's it for this lesson. I know this one was quick, but I do think it's really important that you understand how websites work when working with these smart contracts so you can work with them intelligently and know what to look out for. This was a basic introduction. And as we learn more, like I said, about function selectors and function signatures, we'll get a lot better at working with these websites. And then additionally, being sure to protect ourselves against malicious transactions. So now's a great time to take a break. I know this was a quick one and I'll see you in the next one. All right, welcome back to the next section. This has recently been updated for the new year. And if you're following along with the GitHub repo, when we can scroll down to section nine, all the code that we're gonna be looking at is right here. Or of course, if you're following along with Cypher and Updraft, just write in GitHub resources, scroll on down to section nine, or basically the Foundry Smart Contract Lottery section. Now for this, we're actually not going to be deploying this to ZK Sync. However, we will be showing you a couple of tricks with ZK Sync. The reason we're not going to be deploying this to ZK Sync is we have an integration with a certain chain that isn't active on ZK Sync at the moment. However, we will be showing you other chains that you can deploy this to so that you can have a very cool, very badass final project. This is going to be a wonderful project for your portfolio. Why? Because we are going to not only write an advanced lottery or raffle smart contract, we're gonna give you even more best practices to work with so that not only can you build a really cool project, but you understand the best practices and your code looks phenomenal. So we're gonna be learning a lot in this lesson. We're gonna learn about events, working with true random numbers, working with modulos, chain link automation, and so much more. We are actually going to create a verifiably random smart contract lottery. And we're going to learn a lot of really cool best practices doing this. And let's go ahead and do a quick look at what the final product of this is going to look like. So if we're in our VS code, we can do a quick git clone like this. 
and then open this up by pressing tab, doing a little autocomplete and boom, get this going here. All right, and we can see here what our final project is going to look like. And now that we've cloned everything in here, we can go ahead and we can use the make file. And ideally we use the make file because in here we're gonna have this thing called pinned dependencies, which we'll talk about in a little bit. Do a little make install like this. We're gonna be installing some very specific versions of some different dependencies, some different smart contract libraries, Basically, it's that same equivalent of doing, you know, forge install. Then, of course, we can do a little make build or forge build to actually compile our contracts here. And great. Now that it's actually built, we can actually go into our code base here and we can see exactly what this is going to be. So if you look in here, there's really just this raffle.soul. This is going to be the main contract we're working on here. And we'll get to the sub lesson in a little bit. But at the top here, we see all these comments, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And if we scroll down a little bit here, we can actually see some really professional looking NAT spec. And this is also one of the reasons why I'm so excited for this code base for your portfolio, because when you have really nice looking NAT spec, this is an indicator to other developers and security researchers and other people in this industry that you actually know what you're doing. You actually know what good code looks like. You know how to comment your code. Etc. So we're, we're going to be going a little bit deeper, going a little bit harder with some of this nice NAT spec to really make our code be a lot more readable and look a lot nicer. And we have this raffle smart contract. And what this is going to allow us to do is run a basic minimal smart contract lottery completely automated. So we're going to have this function called enter raffle where people can actually enter this raffle. They can participate. They, this is like kind of the equivalent of buying a lottery ticket or a scratch ticket. We have some interesting functions that won't make sense quite yet, like check upkeep and perform upkeep. But these are going to be the functions that are going to actually kick off and automate it so that once we set this up and fund it, we pretty much can be hands off and we never have to say, OK, start lottery. The lottery will just automatically start whenever it finishes running, right? Whenever one lottery ends, the next one will automatically be triggered and automatically start without us having to interact with it, which is really, really exciting. So we have a lot of functions in here, like fulfill random words, which handle dealing with the randomness. And to work with this randomness, to get this provably random numbers, we're going to be working with Chainlink VRF version 2.5, which is the most up to date version. This fulfill random words function essentially is going to be the function that governs picking the random winners, right? To actually facilitate getting who's going to be the winner of the lottery and then resetting the lottery so that it can start again. So this is actually going to be a provably fair lottery. And then down here, of course, we have a whole bunch of different getter functions to actually read some of those view functions in the smart contract. Then we're going to be writing some more scripts and some more advanced, some more really cool looking scripts here. And we're going to be using some more advanced Foundry code as well. And this is just going to be a really solid example of a very badass, a very cool code base for you to put on your portfolio. And like I said before, we're actually not going to be deploying this to ZK Sync. We're just going to be working with Sepolia because Chainlink VRF currently is not supported on ZK Sync. However, we are going to show you some things about ZK Sync that's needed for us to actually work with this and deploy. If we go into our make file, we can see all the different commands we can work with to actually interact with this code base and interact with our smart contract, like funding a subscription, adding a consumer, create a subscription. These probably won't make sense to you right away, but the most important one here is going to be this deployment piece, right? But with that, now that you've seen a little bit of what the end result is going to look like, let's go ahead and let's dive in. So if you have Git clone this already. We can do a little cd dot dot, go down on directory, rm-rf foundry smart contract lottery f23. This rm stands for remove recursive force. So we're just going to basically delete that folder that we get cloned. And now if we look in our folder, this is kind of our VS code is like, ah, uh, I'm empty now. Uh, I'm a little confused here. Be very careful whenever you run this because you will forcibly remove everything. 
So let's go ahead, let's get started with our classic SPDX license identifier and Pragma Solidity. As of recording, 0.8.27 is just around the corner. However, we're gonna be working with a very specific set of contracts that work best with 0.8.19. So we're actually gonna be using a slightly older version, but that's all good here. Then we're gonna do contract raffle like this pull up our terminal here and just do a little forge build to make sure that uh, stuff is looking good and it looks like it is. So cool. Now, like you saw us just walk through, having NAT spec is a great way to annotate your smart contracts. And especially right at the title, right at the top of your smart contract, you want to annotate it and tell random users or other developers who are going to be looking at your code a little bit about the code base. And if I do a little thing like this, because I have a VS Code plugin, it actually gives me a little pop-up saying NAT spec contract documentation. And if I click it, it automatically populates it with a lot of normally what you'll see in some classic, very nice NAT spec, right? So we're gonna give the title, we'll call it, you know, raffle contract, we'll call it raffle or a sample raffle contract. Author is going to be Patrick Collins, or you know, put your own name here. Don't put Patrick Collins. And then your notice is just going to be some notes here. I'm going to say this contract is for creating a sample raffle. Maybe we'll also do at dev implements chainlink VRF v2.5. This little dev tag is specifically for notes to give to developers. And this notice is really for anybody who's reading this code base. So let's do a little bit of a skeleton setup here where we just kind of name some of the functions here. Oh, and actually I want to do MIT up at the top here. But let's see, we're probably going to want a function enter raffle like this. I would probably make this public or maybe external. We're probably going to want a function pick winner. And this is really all of what our contract needs to be able to do, right? People should be able to enter the raffle. They should be able to buy a lottery ticket. And then the raffle should be able to pick a winner. And that rewards people the money, right? So when people enter the raffle, they buy the lottery ticket, they pay their entrance fee. And then the winner is going to be the randomly selected winner. So in here, this is where we're going to want to have our users enter the raffle and then pay some type of raffle entrance fee that will get added to the pool, right? The pool of money for the winner to actually collect at the end. So in here, this is where we're going to want to have our users enter the raffle and then pay some type of raffle entrance fee that will get added to the pool, right? The pool of money for the winner to actually collect at the end. And this is where we're going to want to make some type of state variable, maybe like a UNT256 uh, entrance fee. And this is where learning some of those advanced pieces from some of our earlier sections is going to help out here, right? We want to think about, okay, well, what should we identify this entrance fee as? Well, for me, I'm always going to default to making these private and then making some getters later on. But we want to ask the question, okay, do we want to make this constant? Do we want to make this immutable? Uh, what, what do we want to make this? Obviously, we're starting to understand some of the trade-offs. If we make this constant, that'll be the cheapest gas-wise. Immutable is also really cheap. However, if we set them as constant or immutable, we can't go back and change them, right? For me, I don't really care about changing this too much. So I'm going to set this as an immutable variable, which means that we're going to need to define this entrance fee right in the constructor. So, and then I gave it that I underscore prefix here to tell me, hey, this is an immutable variable. It's pretty cheap gas wise to work with. However, you cannot change it. So because of this, we're going to go ahead and we're going to make this constructor here. Oh, it looks like GitHub Copilot's already helping me out. And we'll say uint256 entrance fee, like so. And we'll say i underscore entrance fee equals entrance fee. Oops, equals entrance fee like that. And boom, now we have some type of entrance fee. And this is going to be in, you know, the native ETH or the native blockchain currency or whatever chain that you're working on here. And since we're going to have some type of entrance fee, our enter raffle function, of course, should be payable, right? And it should be payable because we're going to have to pay some of that message dot value, right? And so then down below, what we want to do, of course, then is going to 
create some getter functions. And we're going to say function get entrance fee. And this is where GitHub Copilot is very helpful as well. We'll make this external view returns you went 256 and then return I underscore entrance fee like so. And then we'll pull up our terminal here just to do a quick forge build. Make sure it actually is building and it sure is building correctly. Awesome. And now that we're touching on this, we're noticing that every single time we make some of these contracts, we kind of have a very similar layout. We kind of have these state variables at the top. We have different public and external functions here. And then we usually have these view and peer functions at the bottom. And having a very solid style guide or a guide on your coding style that you follow will actually help make your code much more readable later on. And it'll actually help with security because if people can read it easier, then they can know what it's doing much easier, which leads us to the next lesson. So we talked a little bit about the style guide for Solidity and the different code layout and the different, and we talked about NAT spec. However, we didn't really talk about the ordering of our functions and the ordering of our calls. The Solidity docs actually do have an order of layout where we first start with our pragma, which we're actually doing great. Then we do import statements. We don't have any yet. Interfaces and libraries, we don't have any. Contracts comes next. Okay, great. And inside the contracts, do type declarations, state variables. Okay, no type declarations, but state variable right here. No events, which we'll talk about in a little bit. No modifiers. Obviously, we have some functions, which are coming next. Awesome. And even the functions have an order where you do constructor, receive, fallback, and then your external and public functions, and then your internal and private. And then within a grouping, place the view and pure functions last. And I really like that code layout but sometimes I forget to do that. So what you'll see me do actually sometimes at the top of my code is I'll even just paste this at the top, this version E layout, so I remember how to do that. Uh, if you go to the GitHub repo associated with this lesson, we scroll down to, where is it? The code base here, you go into SRC, raffle.soul, you can actually just copy this and paste it at the top. So this is the layout that we're gonna be following here. And I think this layout makes your code base just look so much more professional. And it helps you know where to look for stuff when you're working with code. So this is the layout we're gonna use. If you wanna use your own though, you're absolutely more than welcome to use your own code layout. But this is what the Solidity Docs recommend, and I'm down to go with the Solidity Doc. All right, so now that we've gone ahead and got the layout, we can now finally come back to our enter raffle function and add some require. Okay, so we want people to pay a little bit of ETH to actually enter this raffle, right? So that we can have a pool of money for the winner. So we can add our require statement. So we'll do a little require message.value is greater than or equal, oops, greater than or equal to I underscore entrance fee. We'll do a little comma, not enough ETH sent, sent. This way, if they don't send enough value, boom, It'll revert with not enough ETH sent. However, I have a little update to this. I really wanna teach you require because in a lot of legacy code bases, you'll actually see this functionality. However, there's actually been a couple of updates to Solidity in regards to this require keyword. So as of 0.8.4 of Solidity, they introduced this new thing called custom errors. And you'll see something like this where at the top or somewhere in the code base, you'll have like error, you know, in the example in the Solidity block here is error unauthorized. And you'll see a little conditional or a little if statement, right? If some condition like message sender does not equal owner, revert with unauthorized or revert with the custom error. Now, the reason they introduced this custom errors thing is that they say right here, until now you could already use strings to give more information about failures, but they are rather expensive, especially when it comes to deploy cost and it's difficult to use dynamic information in them. So right now, because we're storing this as a string here, it actually costs a lot of gas to kind of have this as a string and, and store it as such. And you'll learn a little bit later about storing strings versus storing selectors and the, the different sizes that they are. But essentially, just having this string here is actually not very gas efficient. And it's a little bit less performant than we would like. So what we can do instead, let's go ahead and comment this line out. And the way I did that, by the way, on a Mac, I did command 
backspace. I think on Windows, it's like control backspace or Linux, it's control backspace. There's some fun little sh shortcuts like that. Um, but anyways, so let's comment this out with the two backslashes here. And what we want to do instead of this require statement, we can say if our message dot value is less than I underscore entrance fee, then we're going to revert revert with our custom error. And there's a couple different places we can add custom errors. We can add them actually even outside of our contract, like error, you know, not enough ETH. But for testing, this kind of is actually really annoying. So most of the time we want to put it directly into our contract. Oops. And then we'll even have like a little section here where we just say like errors like this. So we'll say error, not enough ETH sent, or maybe something a little bit more descriptive, like send more to enter raffle. And we can say revert, send more to enter raffle. Boom, just like this. Now, us another update to this. As of even newer versions of Solidity, 0.8.26, they actually allowed you to add custom errors inside require because doing this conditional is actually much harder to read than this. So they made another update where you can actually do this. And instead of that, you can just say message value is greater than I underscore entrance fee, send more to enter raffle like this. However, for this video, we actually can't use that feature because we're using 0.8.19 of Solidity. So we actually can't use the custom errors in here. And, and I know this is a lot of information here, so it's okay if you don't remember all this. And technically, this feature is only available if you compile your Solidity with this thing called via IR, which takes a lot of time to compile. And hypothetically, this is still less gas efficient than this. I'm not going to go into why because it's kind of really low level and for stuff much, much later on. But the takeaway from this is that, okay, this is not very gas efficient because we're storing this big string here. This only works on very specific versions of Solidity with a very specific compiler version. And this is the most gas efficient out of all these methodologies anyways. So we should just, so we should just continue to default to this. As you get more and more advanced, you will later on figure out kind of what the differences are. And I'll, you know, we'll go over that much later, but for now, just always default to using this conditional. So if some condition, then revert. And that's how we're going to do our checks in here. Now, whenever we create some type of revert, when we're actually getting these revert transactions, it can be very difficult to tell where these reverts are coming from, right? Imagine you send some transaction and it says, hey, revert, you know, send more to enter raffle, but maybe there's like eight raffle contracts. It can be very difficult to know where the revert is coming from. So a great best practice for errors, for these custom errors, is to actually give them a little prefix of the contract name and then two underscores before the actual error. This way, users who are reading and who get this error code will see, ah, okay, there's raffle, send more to enter raffle. There's an error that says send more to enter raffle that's coming from the raffle smart contract. So this is just a way to make your errors more readable. So in Remix here, we've got an example of two different functions which are essentially the exact same. We have one which is revert with an error. So we're saying if false, do this revert, and we have this error up at the top. And down here we have revert with require, where it's require true, otherwise do this revert. So the functionality of both of these is pretty much exactly the same, right? It's just a little bit backwards. This is saying if false, revert, and this is saying require true, otherwise revert with this. And if we actually deploy these contracts, deploy, drop down and pull up our terminals here. If we call revert with error, we can see how much gas this would have cost if we actually sent it, right? Because remember, even a revert, you're still gonna spend gas. So this revert with error would have spent 142 gas versus revert with require, if we hit, that would have spent 161 gas. And you can even see Remix kind of gives a little gas heads up over here. So this revert with error this custom error is actually much more gas efficient. So whenever we're working with errors, at the moment, we actually don't ever 
even want to work with require. So I know I taught you require and require is important to know because a lot of people still use it. But as of recording, you pretty much should always use custom errors because they're going to be more gas efficient. In the future, I'm willing to bet they're going to allow custom errors in here, but at the moment they don't. So please default to this syntax up here. So, so we've already added in our error here, but we can actually scroll back up and see where we need to put our errors. So if we see layout of a contract, version, import errors. Okay, we scroll back down. Okay, version, we don't have any imports. Okay, cool, errors. So that's how we're going to make sure that we're putting these errors in the right spot in our contract layout. So, okay, great. So now that we've learned a little bit more about that, let's move on to the next step. So we have our function enter raffle, and we want to keep track of all the players who enter our raffle. So we're going to need to keep track of all these players. Now, I want to ask a question. Okay, well, what data structure should we use? How should we keep track of all these players? You've learned about a couple different data structures now, right? You've learned about arrays. You've learned about mappings. You've learned about UNT 256s, different state variables. What data structure should we use to keep track of the players? What makes the most sense? Now, there's not necessarily a right or a wrong answer here. And the more you do this, the more you'll get better at understanding which data structures to use in which scenarios. But most of the time, I'll actually tell you to default to some type of mapping. And that's usually a really good scenario. However, for this one, we're actually going to use an address array. So I'm going to make an address array as a state variable private s underscore players, right? Because it's going to be a storage variable. And this address array is going to be just a list of all the different players who entered this raffle. And I'm making this a storage variable because the number of players, the amount of players is going to keep changing, right? More people are going to constantly be entering. So I don't want to make this immutable. I don't want to make this constant. I want this to be updatable. But I'm going to actually update this. I'm going to make one more change to this as well. Since whoever wins this lottery is going to need to be paid the money, I'm going to make this a payable address array. So this is the syntax for making an address array payable. So we have our players array. And then what we can just do is anytime somebody enters the raffle, we can do s players dot push the payable message dot sender like so. Remember, we need this payable keyword here in order to have an address receive ETH. And now this function's almost done. There's actually one or two more things that we need to do. However, there's a rule of thumb that we should always follow whenever we update something in storage. And this rule of thumb is going to always be emitting an event whenever we update a storage variable. And events are this new place in smart contracts and a new place really in blockchain that we haven't really spoken about. And when I say new place, I mean, they're a, a, a new place that we haven't worked with yet. It's not really new. And we're actually going to watch a little video that I've made before that goes deeper into events and understand why we need them and how to work with them. But the two main reasons that people might want to work with events are going to be making migrations easier. If you ever have to redeploy a smart contract, it can be very difficult to move all the storage to the new contract. If you omit events, it makes them it makes it much easier to do. It also makes front end indexing much easier. And this is something that, to be honest, it's not going to make a lot of sense to you until much, much later in your smart contract development career. The summary is getting data off the blockchain, even though it's this public ledger that anybody can read, can actually be really challenging depending on what type of data you're looking for. Since this isn't going to be a full stack or a front end course, this second section probably won't make sense to a lot of you now. However, much later, we are working on a new full stack course. And those of you who are interested in taking that can feel free. And this second one will make a lot more sense then. But let's go ahead and watch this video I previously recorded about events that will give us a better understanding of what they are, what they look like, etc. But let's go ahead and let's watch this video that I previously recorded about events. Now, I have two videos on this. One is on my channel. One is on the Chainlink Labs YouTube channel. The one on the Chainlink Labs uses Hardhat. The one on my channel uses Brownie. Let's watch just the part about setting these up and working with these. And we won't actually watch the brownie or the hard hat part because we're going to be working with events in Foundry ourselves. 
Now, if you've worked with Solidity, you've probably seen these things called events before. Or maybe you haven't seen something like events, but you've always wondered how Chainlink or the Graph or some of these other off-chain protocols work under the hood. Or maybe you just love watching these VODs. In any case, in this video, we're gonna learn all about logging and events in Solidity, how to view them on Etherscan, and we'll work with them in Brownie as well. Now, if you like Hardhat, once again, I also have a Hardhat version of the code that we're gonna go over, and I've got a Hardhat blog as well. Links are in the description. All right, let's get froggy. Now it's the Ethereum Virtual Machine, or EVM, that makes a lot of these blockchains tick, like Ethereum. And the EVM has this functionality called a logging functionality. When things happen on a blockchain, the EVM writes these things to a specific data structure called its log. We can actually read these logs from our blockchain nodes that we run. In fact, if you run a node or you connect to a node, you can make a F get logs call to get the logs. Good function naming design. Get logs gets the logs. Now inside these logs is an important piece of logging called events. And this is the main piece that we're gonna be talking about today. Events allow you to print information to this logging structure in a way that's more gas efficient than actually saving it to something like a storage variable. These events and logs live in this special data structure that isn't accessible to smart contracts. That's why it's cheaper, because smart contracts can't access them. So that's the trade-off here. We can still print some information that's important to us without having to save it in a storage variable, which is gonna take up much more gas. Each one of these events is tied to the smart contract or account address that emitted this event in these transactions. Listening for these events is incredibly helpful. Let's say, for example, you want to do something every time somebody calls a transfer function. Instead of always reading all the variables and, and looking for some to flip and switch, all you have to do is say, listen for event. Listen for that event to be emitted instead of writing some weird custom logic to see if the parameters changed at the certain time and doing some weird stuff like that. Listen for these events. So a transaction happened, an event is emitted, and we can listen for these events. This is how a lot of off-chain infrastructure works. When you're on a website and that website reloads when a transaction completes, it actually was listening for that transaction to finish, listening for that event to be emitted so that it could reload or it could do something else. It's incredibly important for front ends. It's also incredibly important for things like Chainlink and the graph. Chainlink, for example, in the Chainlink network, a Chainlink node is actually listening for request data events for it to get a random number, make an API call, or et cetera. Sometimes there are way too many events and you need to index them in a way that makes sense so that you can query all these events that happen at a later date. The graph listens for these events and stores them in the graph so that they're easy to query later on. So events are incredibly powerful and they have a wide range of uses. They're also good for testing and some other stuff, but you get the picture, they're really sick. Now that we know what events are, let's look at what they look like, how we can use them and how we might use them in our smart contract development suite. Now here's what an event is going to look like. We have an event here called stored number. So we have basically a new type of event called stored number. We're saying, hey, Solidity, hey, smart contract, we have this new event thing. We're gonna be emitting things of typed stored number in the future. When we emit this event, it's gonna have these four parameters. It's gonna have a UINT256 for called old number, a UINT256 called new number, a UINT256 called added number, and an address called sender. Now for the astute people here, you might have noticed that there is another keyword in here, the indexed keyword, and this is a really important keyword. When we emit one of these events, there are two kinds of parameters. There are the indexed parameters and the non-indexed parameters. You can have up to three indexed parameters, and they're also known as topics. So if you see a topic, you know that that's going to be an indexed parameter. Indexed parameters are parameters that are much easier to search for and much easier to query than the non-indexed parameters. In fact, way back in that F get logs function, it even has a parameter allowing us to search for specific topics. So it's much more searchable than the non-indexed ones. The non-indexed ones are harder to search because they get ABI encoded and you have to know the ABI in order to decode them. If that confused you, don't worry about it. We're gonna explain it. Isn't this video great? Now this just told our smart contract that there is a new type of stored number, a new kind of event here. We need to actually emit that event in order to store that data into the logging data structure of the EVM. To do that, we need to do something that looks like this. 
This is what it looks like when we emit an event. It looks very similar to calling a function. So you call emit and then the name of the event and then you add all the parameters in there that you like. Here's the full example of a smart contract that has an event and it's going to be the example that we're going to walk through in Brownie. Again, if you want to see a hard hat edition of this, link in the description for the hard hat edition, both of this video and the blog. Now in this smart contract, whenever anybody calls the store function, we're going to emit this event. Here's an example of a transaction where we called the store function with a value of one. Let's look into the logs to see what this event actually is going to look like. An event is going to be broken down like so. The address of the contract or account the event is emitted from. The topics are the index parameters of the event data. This is the ABI encoded non-index parameters of the event. What does this mean? This means that we took those parameters that were non-indexed, we matched them together with their ABI or application binary interface, pumped them through an encoding algorithm and boom, this is what we got. If you have the ABI, they're very easy to decode. If you don't have the ABI, they are very hard to decode. These non-indexed parameters cost less gas to pump into the logs and are harder to query, like we said. So if you think something's important, but like not that important, you dump it in data. You dump it into non-indexed. Now in this particular contract, since we have verified the code, we verified the contract, Etherscan knows what the ABI is and we can view this in deke or decoded mode. Hex mode is obviously the non-decoded mode or in its raw hex or hexadecimal or encoded mode. You can read more about the layout of these events in the Solidity docs. All right, great. So now that we've learned a little bit more about events and why we need them, let's go ahead and use them in our smart contract. So for us, we're gonna actually scroll up and see where we should put our events here. We can see that our events are gonna go right after our state variables. So if I scroll down, okay, cool. Here are our state variables. So maybe we'll do a little events comment like this and we'll create our events. And we're gonna to wanna to create an event called raffle entered or raffle enter or whatever you wanna call it. We'll say raffle enter. And I like to do verb based events. So maybe like raffle entered like this. And then here we'll just do address indexed player like this to say, okay, a new address, a new player has entered the raffle. And then in here we can do omit raffle entered message dot sender like so. And now whenever somebody calls this enter raffle function, they will get added to our S players array and we will go ahead and omit this event, which like I said, for now, it's okay if you don't really understand why we need these events, just know as a rule of thumb, anytime you update storage, you want to omit an event like so. And awesome, our enter raffle function is just about done. We're gonna update it pretty soon with something else, but this is pretty good. So seems like our code is pretty straightforward, right? This enter raffle looks pretty good. It's pretty much done. So now we want to go ahead and pick a winner, right? And we're, and you might be thinking, wow, Patrick, this code base is about to be so easy. This is so quick. Well, <laughs> this is actually where it gets really interesting and a lot more advanced. So buckle up. So our pick winner function needs to do a number of things. First off, it's going to need to get a random number, right? Obviously in order to pick a winner. So then it's going to need to use that random number to pick the player. And then three, this needs to be automatically called. I can't be bothered to call pick winner every week or month or however long these lotteries are. I'm busy, I have stuff to do. So I want this to be programmatically automatically called. However, as you may start to be thinking about, huh, smart contracts can't really automate themselves. So how are we gonna do this, Patrick? Well, we're gonna get to that. And we should probably also make this an external function because we want this to be a little bit more gas efficient. We probably should also make our enter raffle external. And again, as you kind of code more and more, you'll get better at sniffing that out. And there are some tools that we can use to help sniff that out, whether to use public or external. But so for now, let's not focus on this number three. Let's just focus on getting a random number and using that random number to pick the winning player. So in order for us to get this random number, we're going to want to check that enough time has passed, right? We want to check that, hey, the lottery has gone for enough time. So it's time to call a random winner. Right? We want to basically deploy the contract, 
say every say every minute we should run a new lottery maybe every day maybe every month maybe this is a yearly lottery whatever we want this to be we want to first check how long it's been and so we're going to need to pick some type of interval for our lotteries to last how long do we want our lotteries to last so up in the constructor I'm going to create a new variable a unit 256 interval like this and I don't really want to change this I want to set it once and then kind of forget about it and because of that we kind of know what type of variable this is going to be so this will be a unit 256 private I underscore or excuse me immutable I underscore interval and this is going to be the interval between lottery rounds so we'll do I underscore interval equals interval and int interval not internal and it's going to be set right in the constructor I'm going to get rid of this line now too and this is where comments are a little bit helpful we'll do a little at dev tag here we can say the duration of the lottery in seconds so this will be how many seconds between each lottery run so now in our pick winner function we want to first check to see we want to first check to see if enough time has passed and we can do that by getting the current time by doing block.timestamp and this is what's known as a globally available unit similar to message.sender and message.value it's going to be the current approximate time of according to the blockchain so we'll get the current block.timestamp minus some last timestamp and it should be greater than the i underscore interval interval right so this is to say let's say the block time is a thousand you know for it's like a thousand seconds the last timestamp we recorded was like at 900 seconds and our interval was you know 50 so 1000 minus 900 equals 100 that's greater than 50 so we can go ahead and start a new lottery run however if the interval was 200 this would mean that only 100 seconds passed we need another 100 seconds so not enough time has passed but what we do though of course is we need to take some snapshot of time right we need to keep track of the every time we picked a winner so that this last timestamp is constantly updated so since this is probably going to be some storage that persists we're going to make this a, a storage variable and we'll scroll up to our state variables and we'll create a new variable here u into 256 private s underscore last timestamp like so and we're going to want to set this right away right in the constructor right when we deploy this smart contract this last timestamp should be the most recent block dot timestamp right so right when we deploy this contract it'll be populated with something that way the lottery doesn't get kicked off right away right when we launch this we'll basically start the clock if you will and then what we can do is now we can say okay well let's do a little conditional here so we'll say if block the timestamp minus the last timestamp let's say actually is less than the interval then what then we should revert right because not enough time has passed and then we're going to want to fix this conditional here and of course since we're going to want to revert here we're going to want to add one of our custom errors so we'll do a little revert in here and I'm going to tell you right now we're going to refactor this pretty soon so I'm just going to leave this like this for now and we'll add the custom error in a little bit so if enough time has indeed passed then we're going to want to go ahead and get our random number now getting random numbers on the blockchain is actually quite difficult for a number of reasons the biggest reason is that the blockchain is a deterministic system by default and we are looking to get a random number in a deterministic system and that's very hard so what we're going to do is we're actually going to go to docs.chain.link we're going to go to the vrf documentation and we're going to work with Chainlink VRF to actually get a provably random number. And to teach us how to get a random number using Chainlink VRF V2, we're actually going to go watch Richard's video from the Chainlink team who will walk us through that. Now, for our code base, we're actually going to be using the most up to date version, which is going to be version 2.5. So the code that we're going to be working with is going to be pretty much exactly what he goes through here. It's going to be slightly different but this will still give you a really good understanding of how it actually works Chainlink's verifiable randomness function or vrf gives developers better scale 
flexibility, and control. Hi, I'm Richard, one of the developer advocates here at Chainlink Labs, and today we're going to take a look at Chainlink's VRF. The big important thing to know about VRF is you're funding a subscription, which is basically an account that allows you to fund and maintain balance for multiple consumer contracts. I like to think of it as a bucket that all your contracts can pull from. Let's dive into the docs and see what using VRF looks like and feels like. In order to show that, let's dive right in to getting a random number from the documentation. So we'll take a look at the documentation now. If you head to docs.chain.link, you'll see this page. And we have data feeds, functions, automation, and VRF. If we head to the VRF documentation, we'll go directly into getting a random number. Now, the documentation does cover a lot of other information that is very useful to know. But for this tutorial, we're skipping right to getting a random number. You can read about subscription management here and how it works. Instead of reading through this, we'll actually just walk through this process. If we click Open Subscription Manager, we'll see the Subscription Manager, and we'll need to create a subscription. Now, you can give it your email and project name if you like. I won't for this example but we'll be creating a subscription. And you'll notice here that we're prompted to actually confirm this on a test network. Now, something to note, I'm doing this on the Sepolia test network. Most of the Chainlink documentation references the Sepolia network as the default test network. So that's what I'll be using just to make life a little bit easier. You can use other test networks that are supported if you like. You will need some ETH and LINK tokens for this. If you don't have those, you can head to faucets.chain.link to secure that. And we'll take a look at that here in just a moment. So we create our subscription. We'll need to add some funds. So click Add Funds, and it'll take us to the next page. And I mentioned the faucet right here. If we need link for testing, you can get that from the Chainlink faucet. It's at faucets.chain.link. You'll need to connect your wallet. I've already done that. Uh, once you have, you'll pick the network that's applicable. Remember, we're using Ethereum Sepolia in this example. Uh, you can request link and ETH. If you do need ETH, you will need to verify via Twitter. But for link itself, you'll just need to complete a CAPTCHA. So once you've done that, you should be able to get your link. So we'll need to add some funds. For this example, I'll just use five. It's going to be more than enough. We'll approve that transfer as well. And our link has been transferred. Now we'll need to add consumers. And this gets to an interesting point in creating Vera. So we've created that bucket, right? That subscription. We have funded it with link and we have what we need there but we haven't actually deployed a contract yet. And the way that VRF works, a mental model think of besides the bucket of link for our subscription, is that you need to let your subscription know about the contract you're deploying. And when you deploy your contract, you're gonna to need to let that know about your subscription. We'll see what that looks like, but basically they need to know about each other in order to function properly. So at this point, we'll head back to the documentation. We'll just leave the subscription manager right here on this add consumer page. As we scroll through the instructions, we'll see deploying a VRF V2 compatible contract. And there's this awesome open remix button here. We'll click that. And from here, it'll take us to remix. So remix will allow us to deploy and interact with this contract on the blockchain. Uh, let's take a look at the actual contract that we'll be deploying briefly. At the top here, you can see that we have our imports of the coordinator interface, our consumer base and confirmed owner. Coordinator interface is gonna be what allows that coordination of reaching out to the Oracle network to get the actual random values. Consumer base contains some functions we'll be importing and using within our contract, as well as confirmed owner, which will bring in information that allows us to ensure that only the owner of this contract can do certain functions. If we look at the contract itself, you can see we declare some events. Uh, we have a struct for the request status that allows us check the status of our request. We have a mapping for those request statuses. We have our subscription ID. This is what I was mentioning. We need to let the contract know about our subscription. So that's what we'll store that information. We have a few variables for the request IDs. We have a key hash. Now this key hash is important because this is specifying the gas lane that we'll be using. It's basically how much we're willing to pay as a premium for gas for faster responses. On the test nets, there's only one. If you take a look at the link there in the documentation, you can see the different gas lanes that are available on the different networks. Each gas lane will have its own address. So it's something to keep in mind. We also have the callback gas limit. The way that VRF works is it goes and makes a request to the Oracle network. And when it makes that request, 
The Oracle network goes off, generates the random numbers, and then comes back, right? And when it comes back, that's when you need to actually do something with the random values that are returned. If you don't do something with them as soon as you get them back, then they're stored and that information becomes public. So they're not really as random as you would like. Now, when it comes to that callback gas limit, that's gonna be the maximum amount of gas that is available to be used in that callback function. And we'll see that callback function here in just a moment. We have a number of confirmations that we would like to have. This is how many block confirmations need to go by before those values are returned. The way I like to think about this is the lower this number, the faster you'll get your response back, but the less secure. The higher it is, the more secure, but the slower. So it's a trade-off. You need to balance it with what's important for your project. And then we have the number of words. When it says words here, if you were to look up words from a computer science standpoint, you'll find that's technically the correct term for the values that we're getting back. I like to think of them as just random numbers because it makes my life a little bit easier when I'm thinking about them. So this is a number of random numbers that you'll be getting back. In this case, we're getting back two, uh, but it can be more than that. And it can be as little as one. So you can get multiple values back in a single transaction, which is really cool. So we have our constructor here where we set things up. We give it the coordinator. When we deploy this contract, we'll give it that subscription ID. And then we have the function request random words. Again, this is gonna be reaching out to the Oracle network to make that request. So we store a few things in here like the request ID and we get that information and we emit the event. Then once everything has happened within the Oracle network, we get our random numbers back. The way it comes back into our contract here is through the fulfill random words function. Now, this function doesn't do much, right? It just stores the information. This is where though you'd want to actually do anything with those random values. Think if you are assigning traits to an NFT or something like that, you'd want to do that here as soon as they come back into your function. We have one last function, get status request, just to see what's going on with our request. So let's deploy this contract now. We'll need to make sure that we change it to our injected provider, and then we need to give it our subscription ID. If we head back to our subscription, we'll notice here our ID is 1923. If you're following along doing this yourself, your ID is gonna be different most likely. Paste our ID in here and click deploy and confirm this transaction. All right, so our transaction is confirmed. We have our contract down here. Now we'll need to grab the address of this contract and head back to our subscription. This is gonna be the consumer address. So we'll paste it in here and we'll add a consumer. All right, so our consumer has been added. Let's look at our subscription now. We can see here a brief history of what's happened, right? We created our subscription, we funded it, and we added that consumer. Now, when we actually make a request, we should see it here in our subscription that the request has happened. So let's go do that now. Let back to Remix and we will request random words. We'll confirm this as well. And then we can head back to our subscription and take a look. But we'll need to wait for our transaction to actually be confirmed before we'll see anything here. All right, so it's been confirmed. If we take a look at this page, now we'll see that we have a pending transaction, right? Now remember, depending on the network you're on, depending on how many block confirmations you said, this can take a while. So we'll wait for this to go through and then we'll see it actually in the history here that we have completed our transaction. While we wait for the transaction to be completed, if we take a look here, and we say last request, and we copy this ID to get the status, we can see that it's actually been fulfilled while I was checking this. So our Boolean is fulfilled is true, and we have our random values. Now the thing to note is that we asked for two random values, right? And if you look closely right here in the middle, there's a comma. So we have one number here and the second number afterwards. So that's it. This is what it takes to get random values back using Chainlink VRF. Now from here, you have tons of opportunities of what to do with this, right? It's everything from determining randomness when it comes to game assets, NFTs, anything that you like, really. So yeah, I can't wait to see what you'll build with this, and I'll catch you in the next one. All right, great. So now we know a little bit more about Chainlink VRF. Let's go through the documentation and actually implement this in our code base. And in particular, I think actually going through the documentation here, even on video with you is incredibly helpful because guess what? You're going to be doing this a lot, going through documentation, 
working with AIs that have read the documentation and can help you implement things. But getting good at reading documentation and traversing documentation is a skill that you will need to get good at. And to work with Chainlink VRF, there's actually a couple different of methodologies you can work with to get it going. There's the subscription method and the direct funding method. So we're actually going to teach you the subscription method because I think it's a little bit more scalable and this will enable us to do a little bit of upfront work so that later on we don't have to do as much work. We want to work incredibly hard to be incredibly lazy and if we can do a little bit of extra work now so that later on we can be very lazy, we will choose to do so. And for people who want to get a really good feel for how Chainlink VRF actually works, I highly recommend you come to the documentation here, go to either the getting started page or one of the migration pages and you could scroll down in here and there's this open in remix button which will open up an example in remix for you to actually work with the Chainlink VRF that you can play with right in remix. This remix example is defaulted and hard-coded with working with the Sapolia chain. So, so if you want to give this a try feel free to pause the video and try this out. So if we go to the documentation on the left side here we can see there's v2 subscription method v2 direct funding and we're actually working with v2.5 but basically you know same thing here and the subscription method is going to be where we're going to have a smart contract a singular subscription smart contract that we send link to we send basically oracle gas to to fund the chain link node and then we have direct funding where we actually directly fund the contract that implements vrf so basically like this would be us directly funding the raffle smart contract versus the subscription method is us funding some separate subscription smart contract. The subscription method I think is arguably a lot better because with the direct funding method every single time we deploy a new raffle we would have to refund it as well whereas with the subscription method we only need to fund that singular subscription and apply that to as many raffles as we want. Like I said we're going to be learning the subscription model however it requires a couple of extra steps. And we're going to learn how to do those extra steps programmatically which is very exciting. Let's go ahead and let's add this randomization. Now remember according to Richard getting a random number is actually a two transaction process. We first have to make a transaction to request the RNG or the random number generator or the random number and then in a second transaction the Chainlink Oracle will actually send a transaction to give us or add some random number on chain. And what we've been doing so far has been atomic or in a single transaction where everything happens automatically. And this is one of the reasons why I love showing the Chainlink VRF functionality and Chainlink automation as well because it's going to get you used to working with some of these two transaction processes. So pick winner is actually just going to be us actually requesting the random number from Chainlink VRF and then the Chainlink VRF is going to give us that random number in what's called the callback function. Basically the function that Chainlink VRF is going to call back to. So we're going to send the request in a transaction that we send and then the chain link node is going to give us the random number in a transaction that it sends. So to begin actually working with chain link VRF and requesting and getting this random number, we can actually go to getting started with chain link VRF 2.5. We can go to this remix example and basically just copy paste some stuff from here. And even if you want to go into remix, you go to remix 2 where that ever that giant remix button is. Boom. Yeah. Open a remix and we can kind of use this as our template here. If we scroll down, in here there is going to be this section here this request id equals s vrf coordinator dot request random words and then it does this huge chunk of stuff here and this is the actual call to the chain link coordinator to the chain link node that we're going to make and there's a whole bunch of stuff in here and don't worry we will explain what everything does so for now i'm actually just going to go ahead and cheat a little bit i'm going to copy this I'm going to come over to our code base here and we're just going to go ahead. I'm going to delete these comments and I'm going to paste this in here. And then if we pull up our terminal now, we do a little forge build. You're going to see, hey, uh, it doesn't actually work. And maybe you even see some red squiggly lines in here. Uh, but don't worry, we're going to fix that very soon. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in here that needs to happen in order for this to work. So uh, first we can see we're having this SV dot request random words. So you can already kind of tell now that you've been learning more and more about smart contracts and solidity like what this is trying to do so we can probably see that this s vrf coordinator is going to be some type of coordinator smart contract right and it's going to have some function called request random words and the first thing we're going to need to do is actually get this vrf coordinator address here so what we can do is actually back in the 
remix back in kind of our, our demo here if we scroll to the top we actually can see two contracts that we're actually importing and then one of them in this example that we're actually inheriting this vrf consumer base v2 plus i know it's kind of a mouthful um so what we can do then is we can actually grab this whole line we can copy it come back over and go all the way to the top and import it here and we're going to tweak this just a little bit so since we're actually importing from the chain link slash contracts here we're going to as you know we're going to have to install this with foundry using the chain link brownie contracts so once again chain link brownie contracts these are going to be these minimized contract examples scroll down here okay cool forge install um we're going to copy this here pull up terminal do a little clear paste it in and for this walkthrough I'm actually going to be using what's called pinned dependencies pinned dependencies this is where we install very specific version of packages so I'm going to be using version 1.1.1 so that no matter when you watch this as long as you use the exact same versions that I'm working with the code will always work so that's what we're going to be doing here so to just do that we're going to do forge install smart contract kit slash chain link brownie contracts at and then we're going to pick a tag in the releases section of github so we're going to do 1.1.1 dash dash no commit and hit enter and this is going to go ahead and install chain link brownie contracts at 1.1.1 so now if we go up here we can see boom chain link brownie contracts is now inside of our lib and we're going to update our foundry.tumul and since this is installed we're going to go to our foundry.tumul and do a little re mapping section right you're already starting to figure out what you need for these and we're going to do remappings equals little at chain link slash contracts like so equals lib slash chain link brownie contracts slash contracts like this and this should now work actually we're even getting a little red underline because this has some of these versioning bits in here so the remix adds kind of these versioning bits in here if you copied right from remix we can actually just get rid of that at 1.1.1 and the rest should be good the file path of this might be a little bit different depending on when you watch this but now we have this vrf consumer base v2 plus and we can inherit all this stuff by just saying raffle is this and obviously you know a little bit about inheritance so if I go ahead command click or control click it'll pull me up right into the code base here and if that doesn't work for you for some reason you can of course go to lib chainly brown and contracts contracts src v08 dev uh vrf excuse me v08 excuse me uh where is it vrf vrf dev vrf consumer v2 base plus dot song vrf consumer base v2 plus dot soul like this and this is going to be the contract that our raffle is going to be inheriting and there's a whole bunch of stuff in here don't worry about it too much for now but in this vrf consumer base v2 plus it has a constructor that looks like this where it takes an address of a vrf coordinator here if you inherit a contract that has a constructor like this what you need to do is in your constructor you need to add that contracts constructor a little confusing right so the raffles constructor right now is just this right we're just kind of adding these variables but if we inherit a contract we also need to add that inherited contracts constructor right so if we say is some contract we've got to add their constructor and the contract here's constructor is just taking this address via coordinator so what we'll do then is next to our constructor we'll add the name of the contract we are inheriting and then add add what goes in its constructor so in its constructor it takes this vrf coordinator which is the address of the vrf coordinator contract so this vrf coordinator contract is the contract we actually interact with to request random numbers right so we need to get that get that address kind of similar to how we did with price feeds from the chain link documentation you would get this directly from the chain link documentation right it's kind of same as what we did with price feeds but what we want to do is we want to make this kind of modular so we want to go ahead and do a little comma we'll say address vrf coordinator we'll put it in our constructor and then pass it from our constructor 
to the Viera Consumer Base V2 Plus constructor, right? So a lot of words there, but summary real quick. If we go ahead and we inherit this, then we need to use the constructor of the inherited code base and we just kind of stick it on like this. This inherited code base needs a VRF coordinator address. We will pass that to our constructor from our constructor to their constructor and boom. Now what's cool is this VRF consumer base V2 plus has this S VRF coordinator variable and now we actually have access to this variable as well. And what's kind of cool, so if I actually come in here, uh, you know, we see all these squiggly lines. Now let's actually just comment this out. Let's do a quick forge build. Just make sure we're doing everything right. It looks like we're not doing everything right. Oh, it's because we need we need to add our fulfill random words function. I'm actually going to copy paste that real quick just so I can show you something cool. Uh, fulfill random words, internal virtual override. Internal. Uh, now let's go ahead, forge build. Okay, cool. So now that we've done that, what we can do is we can do stuff like VRF coordinator dot request random words or whatever, right? In our raffle contract, we've never specified VRF coordinator as one of our state variables, but since we're inheriting it from this VRF consumer base V2 plus, I know it's a mouthful. We can actually work with this SVRF coordinator address as if it was in our list of state variables, which is really, really cool. So if we go ahead and do forge build, boom, it's compiling fine. Pick winner, we're gonna have to update pick winner in a little bit, but because we've inherited that code base, we can now do stuff like VRF coordinator dot request random words like this, because we have access to this SVRF coordinator variable since it's in this VRF coordinator, VRF consumer base V2 plus, right? Mouthful, I know. So anyways, let's keep going. So we're going to call this VRF coordinator dot request random words, and we have to pass a whole bunch of stuff in here. So let's actually go to this VRF consumer base V2 plus. We can see this VRF coordinator is of type I VRF coordinator V2 plus. And if I command click on this, I get brought into the interface. And if for some reason you can't command click or control click, same thing, we can kind of go scroll up, see that this is at location interfaces, VRF coordinator V2 plus. So we'll open up the lib again. We can see there's interfaces, I VRF coordinator V2 plus is here. And we can scroll down and we can look for request random words. And we can see it only takes one variable, it's this, type it's this struct type it's this one single parameter vrf v2 plus client dot random words request call data rec so we've learned a little bit about structs already but now obviously we're getting into more kind of advanced structs here if this is a little bit confusing to you right now don't worry about it just kind of blindly follow along it'll make more sense later on right so if the structs don't make perfect sense don't worry basically we have to pass some this struct this kind of object to our request random words right and we can actually see if we go into our this vrf v2 plus client we can look in that contract for this random words request struct i'm going to command click you can also you know go to the lib look for this specific contract but basically we need to pass it this struct which has these parameters and that's it so we're going to need to populate this random words request with whatever's in here. And if we go back to our raffle, we can actually start thinking about what each one of these is. So in this call, we're going to be calling this external contract. We're going to be calling this coordinator contract with request random words. And we're going to be passing this giant struct object as a parameter. And so I know there's <clears throat> this is kind of confusing here, but uh, well, first we need to do a unit 256 request ID equals this, and I know this is red. Let me just uh, copy this actually, and comment this. I'm gonna make this a little bit easier to understand. Paste this up here. We're basically gonna create this struct here. Put a little semicolon here. We're gonna say VRF V2 plus client dot request random words request equals this, and then we're gonna pass this request object into here, right? 
So doing these two things is essentially the same, but this kind of like might make it a little bit easier to understand. So now this is a way right here. VRF V2 plus client dot random words request is a way to work with this struct. And again, if this is a little bit confusing, don't worry, just roll with me here. Um, but we get this little red underscore because uh, our contract is saying, hey, well, what the heck is VRF V2 plus client? Uh, all I see is VRF consumer base V2 plus. So what we need to do is we need to actually import that VRF V2 plus client contract. And once again, if we go up into our contracts here, we can see this is actually located uh, or even cheat. If you hit command P or control P or depending, you know, or basically just open your command palette, you can actually type this in and see that this is in Chainlink Browning Contracts, Contracts, SRC, V08, VRF, Dev Libraries, and it ha has this struct in here. But we're going to go ahead and import this from at Chainlink slash contracts slash SRC slash V0.8. Again, this might be in a different place depending on when you watch this slash VRF slash dev slash libraries slash VRF V2 plus client dot soul. And now that we've imported this, if we scroll down, oh, some of those red squigglies are gone because now our solidity goes VRF V2 plus client dot random word request. Ah, OK, I know what VRF V2 plus client is. I know that it has this struct random words request. You're trying to create a struct with all these arguments in it. Got it. Makes sense. So this is some syntax here on how to basically make a struct. So you do like the name of the contract, the name of the struct, a little parenthesis here, and then these little bracket people. And we're going to populate uh, all the values in here. So there's a number of different values in here. And if we go to the Chainlink docs, there's a little section which kind of defines what each one of these variables are going to do. So we're going to give this a little bit of read to figure out which each one of these do. So the first thing in here is this little key hash thing. So according to the documentation, the key hash is going to be the gas lane key hash value, which is the maximum gas price you're willing to pay for a request in way. If it functions as an ID of the off chain VRF job that runs in response to requests. So each Chainlink VRF has a specific gas lane, right? If you're going to spend a lot, a lot, a lot of gas on the callback, you need to tell the Chainlink VRF node that upfront. This won't make a ton of sense right now, but that's okay. For, for now, just know that, okay, we need to have some type of key hash variable. No problem. Let's make it modular. Let's go ahead and we'll put that up in our constructor. And maybe we'll call ours bytes32 gas lane. And, you know, this is the key hash. So I think that's a little bit more descriptive. But then we'll do a bytes32 private s underscore key hash. Actually, excuse me, let's do i underscore key hash. Let's do immutable like this. And let's kind of put it up with the other immutable variables. Then in here, we'll say i key hash equals that gas lane. So, and since we're using i key hash instead of s key hash, we're going to swap this out. And okay, great. That red line has gone away. Okay, what's next? Subscription ID. Okay. The subscription ID that this contract uses for funding requests initialized in constructor. So whenever we work with the Chainlink VRF subscription, every single node is going to get its own subscription ID. Like I said, if this is a little bit confusing right now, don't worry too much about it right now. It'll make sense soon. But what we're basically going to do, go back up to the constructor and we're going to go ahead and add a new uint256 subscription ID like so. And we're going to add a new uh, immutable variable, uint256 private immutable i underscore subscription id like this we're going to say i subscription id equals subscription id like this and then we're going to scroll back down paste that over like that okay great what's next request confirmations where is that request confirmations this is going to be how many confirmations the chainlink node should wait before responding so basically after you send a request it'll wait X number of blocks before trying to give you the random number. We are actually going to make this a constant variable. So you're going to get rid of this here. We're going to make this a constant variable. We're going to say, and this is going to be a uint 16 private constant. 
And for constant variables, we like to do request confirmations, and we're going to default to three here. For constant variables, we kind of like this style here where it's cap locks with underscores. So request confirmations, so we're going to scroll down, boom. Request confirmations is going to be request confirmations. The callback gas limit. This is going to be the limit for how much gas to use for the callback request in your contracts fulfill random words function. So when the Chainlink node responds, it's going to call that it's going to call a fulfill random words function, which we have not defined yet. The key hash or the gas lane is going to be the price you're willing to pay. And the gas limit is going to be the max amount of gas you're willing to spend. So this is the gas price. This is the gas limit. I know it's a little bit confusing, but like I said, it's okay if you don't fully understand this. Uh, we're going to go ahead and add this as another variable as well. We're going to say this is a uint32 private immutable i underscore callback gas limit. Oops, sorry, this doesn't go here. This goes up here. Immutable callback gas limit. And then we're going to say uint32 callback gas limit. Paste this in here equals callback gas limit. And you can see that my code base actually auto formatted here. If yours didn't and you want to get it to format, you can just run forge format like that, and that'll automatically format your code as well. So now that we have the callback gas limit, we can copy that, paste that in here. Next is number of words. This is the number of random numbers that we want. We are pretty much just always going to want one. So we're going to do a uint. This is a uint32. We're going to say private constant num words equals one. If you wanted more random numbers, you could set this to being more, but we only care about one. And we're going to get the squiggly line saying, hey, this needs to be memory. So we're going to have this be memory. And then if we uncomment this, this should now compile fine, forge build. And we did compile and we're just saying, hey, we haven't used request ID. But awesome. So this is how we're actually going to populate our Chainlink VRF request. Let me zoom out just a hair here. So we're going to call this contract that we don't really fully understand yet. And that's OK with request random words. And we're passing this request struct, which looks like this. It has a key ash, which stands for some gas lane for some gas price to work with the Chainlink node a subscription ID, and this is going to be how we actually fund the Oracle gas for working with Chainlink VRF. Request confirmations, how many blocks we should wait for the Chainlink node to actually give us our random number. The callback gas limit so that we don't accidentally spend too much gas on the callback. How many random numbers that we want. And then extra args. So this is where we can set some extra arguments depending on the Chainlink VRF version. There is actually a version of the Chainlink VRF where you don't have to pay in link token, where you can pay in native ETH or native blockchain token, whatever you want to do. We've set it to false for now, but if you want to learn more about how to work with native ETH, you can go ahead and check this out. And if you're like, well, pay with link, what are you talking about? Don't worry, we'll get to that too. Now, you saw a little bit before I added this fulfill random words and I set it to override and I didn't really explain why. Um, so let me explain why. The reason we needed to add this is because when we imported, when we inherited this VRF consumer base V2 plus, this was an abstract contract. And in here, there was this function fulfill random words, internal virtual. Whenever you inherit an abstract contract, abstract contracts can have both undefined functions and defined functions. And so the reason Chainlink set this up as an abstract contract is they said, hey, if you're going to go ahead and import this contract, you need to define this fulfill random words. And it's this function that our Chainlink node, our Chainlink VRF node is going to call back to, to do stuff, right? So when we hit, at the moment, when we hit pick winner, this is going to kick off this request. It's going to give us this request ID. Chainlink node is going to generate the random number. And then the Chainlink node will respond by giving us this random number back to us because they're going to call this fulfill random words function. And we need to define, hey, Chainlink node, when you give us back the random number, we're going to do some stuff. And now I had to add this keyword override here because 
in the abstract contract, it was marked as virtual, meaning it's meant to be overridden, meaning it's meant to be updated, meaning it's meant to be implemented in our contract. And so we're basically overriding the functionality of it in here, which in this abstract contract, there is no functionality, right? It's just, it's not a, there's nothing in here. So we need to actually define what the Chainlink node is going to do when it returns us the random number. So if we go back to our Remix example here, and I scroll down a little bit, you can actually see they have a lot of these hard coded in here, like a lot of the same things we worked with, the key hash, callback gas limit, request confirmations, number of words, blah, 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 et cetera. If we scroll down, we can see they call this roll dice function, which does something similar to what we did. But then additionally, they have this fulfill random words function with a whole bunch of comments in here, where they basically do some stuff once they get that random number, right? So you can see the parameters here are gonna be the request ID. And this is gonna be the same request ID that was generated when the request was generated. And then it's gonna have a uint256 array of random words. And I know this is, it's call data. If the call data versus memory thing is a little bit confusing for you now, don't worry too, too much about it. But basically it's gonna give us this array of random words. And since we're only asking for one, we're just gonna get one random number and we're gonna tell our raffle what to do with this random word, which is gonna be what? It's gonna be pick a winner. And I implemented it here already just so that our code would compile. But again, the reason that this is added to this abstract contract is to remind you, hey, you need to implement this. Now you might be kind of astutely asking, hey, Patrick, uh, if that's an internal call, how is this function being called? I thought if it's internal, it, another contract can't call this contract. Well, you'd be right. If we go back to this VRF consumer base V2 plus, right? Remember we are inheriting this in our raffle and we scroll down, we can actually see there is a raw fulfill random words, which is external. Now this raw fulfill random words has basically just one check in it. It says if message.sender does not equal address SVRF coordinator, then revert, otherwise call fulfill random words. So the Chainlink VRF, the Chainlink node is actually gonna call raw fulfill random words. And then raw fulfill random words is gonna call fulfill random words and fulfill random words is gonna be what we define. So we're gonna get the random number back and we're gonna say, hey, once we get the random number, here's what you need to do. We're gonna define it in this fulfill random words function. And of course, we're gonna say, pick the random winner and give them the money. So I know I've talked a lot so far, so let me just do a quick recap of all the different things that we just learned, okay? So first of all, when we want to pick a random winner, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have to make a request to the Chainlink VRF contract. And we're gonna make that request by calling the VRF coordinator contract and calling request random words. We get access to this S VRF coordinator variable because we're inheriting VRF consumer base V2 plus, and it has this S VRF coordinator state variable inside of it. And since we're inheriting it, boom, we get access to these state variables too. This I VRF coordinator V2 plus contract has this function request random words, right? This is an interface, of course. So there's some contract in the world out there that has this request random words function defined, and it actually kicks off telling a Chainlink node, hey, uh, I need a random number, please. Could you please give me a random number? Since we're inheriting this VRF consumer base V2 plus, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get sick of saying that. And this VRF consumer base V2 plus contract has a constructor. We need to add this contract's constructor to our contract. The way that we do that is we just paste it next to our constructor and add whatever variables need to go inside of it, inside of this pasted constructor inside our constructor. Now, to make this to make this request, we actually have to add all of our parameters inside of this struct object, this VRF v2 plus client dot random words request. Since we're inheriting VRF v2 plus client, and this VRF v2 client has this random words request struct, we can actually get this exact same type by doing VRF v2 plus client dot random words request. We can say memory request equals vrf v2 plus client dot random words request and we can populate what's inside of this by doing these little squiggly brackets and we can say okay the key hash of this struct will be our i underscore key hash the sub id will be our i underscore subscription id request confirmations callback blah 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 etc etc then we're going to call request random words with this request struct being passed to it 
and we're going to get back a request ID. And once we send this request, the Chainlink node is going to wait some number of block confirmations, and then it's going to generate the round number, and then it's going to call back to fulfill random words, and that's how we're going to get the random number back. But it's not going to call fulfill random words directly. It's actually going to call raw fulfill random words, which is inside of our VRF V2 Consumer Base Plus. It's going to call this raw fulfill random words, and that's going to call fulfill random words. And since our raffle contract is inheriting this contract, it's going to get all of that functionality. It's not super important you memorize what any of these do. And if you forget, that's totally fine. You can go back to the documentation and check it out. But it is important you do kind of understand some of these other things like working with constructors of inherited code bases, overriding functions from inherited code bases, and getting structs with this kind of methodology here. You can see that this VRF V2 consumer base client is actually a library, and that's how we can get a struct from a library by doing that syntax. So, so we're going to send our request with this function, and then we're going to process the response with this function. Let's learn how to do that now. So now that we have this list of random numbers, or we just have our random numbers, we want to pick a random winner from this S players array. So what we're going to do is something called a modulo function to use that random number to actually pick one of the people in our array. Let's talk about the mod function. Here in Remix, I've got this contract called example modulo with two functions, get mod 10 and get mod 2. This modulo function is going to basically do divide operation. It's going to divide our number by 10, but instead of returning our number divided by 10, it's going to return the remainder. So if we think of it like this, if we think of 10 divided by 10, this divides evenly. So the remainder is zero. There's zero groups or zero numbers unaccounted for. But if we did 10 mod 9, let's think of this even differently, 10 divided by 9 equals one point something, right, some fraction, so basically nine of the 10 are divided evenly, but there's one left over. So 10 mod nine would equal one. Or even easier, we take two mod two, we'll get zero because two and two divide evenly, but two, two mod three would equal two, even though I wrote here one, just sorry, two mod three equals two, not, not one. So our modulo function is going to be, it's gonna get the remainder after dividing. So we can even do some examples of mod 10, and this is gonna be in the GitHub repo associated with this course. If I have one, two, three, I get the mod, we have three left over, because 120 divides evenly into 10, and then we have three. 123, we have three left over. So if I do this major huge number, what do you think our remainder is gonna be? Yep, it's two, because this number divides evenly into 10, and then we have two left over. So if we do mod two, what do you think this is going to be? It's an even number, so it's going to be zero. If I do this, what do you think it's going to be? It's going to be one, right? So this is this modulo function, and we're going to use it to pick a random winner out of our array. So how are we going to do use this module operator, or I said function, but it's really the operator, to get our random winner? Well, let's say that there were 10 players. So S underscore players would be 10 people long, right? So we 10 different people. And let's say our RNG we got back was 12, or I should say our random number, I keep saying RNG, but it's really our random number was 12. Well, what we could do is if we did 12 modulo 10, we would get a two back. We would get two back. And then we would say whoever is at index two in our players array is going to be the random winner, right? This is going to be our winner. Now, in reality, the random word that we're going to get back or the random number we're going to get back is going to look something like this. It's going to be this horribly long monstrosity of a number. What we would do is we would take this huge monstrosity, we would modulo it by 10. And for this one, for example, you know, if our S players was 10, we would get what's the leftover here. It's going to equal to 9. So whoever is at index 9 is going to be the winner. So this is how we can always get a number between zero and nine. Remember, in arrays, it starts index as zero to get our random winner. So what we're going to do then is we're going to say uint256 
u in 256 index of winner equals random words at index zero, right? Because random words, right? Because random words is only going to be an array of size one because that's the num words that we've set. We're going to say modulo it by s underscore players dot length. So the length of the players array or mod, if you will. So this is how we're going to pick the index of the winner. Cool. So then once we get that, we're going to say address payable recent winner equals s underscore players index of winner like this. Ta da. And now this winner, what are we going to do? Well, for me, I like to keep track of this most recent winner, just so that we can have it very easily readable who's the most recent winner. And so maybe up at the top, I'll make a new variable, I'll do address, address, private, s underscore recent winner, like this, I'll come back down here. And we'll say s recent winner equals recent winner like this. And then we're going to want to pay them, right? So we've learned some of the better paying methodologies. So we're going to do a little parenthesis bool success comma equals recent winner dot call value is going to be address this dot balance with this right here. So we're just going to give the recent winner the entire balance of the contract, right? And it's going to have a balance. This contract will have a balance because because even to enter the raffle, they have to give some type of entrance fee, right? So this raffle will have an entrance fee. It will have money. So all the ticket sales are going to go to this winner. Blank bytes for the object. And then we're going to make sure this transfer went through successfully. So we're going to say if not success, then we're going to go ahead and revert. So this little exclamation mark here, this stands for bang, aka not. So anytime you see this, it means like if not success. And we're going to revert with some custom error. So we're going to go up to our custom errors that we have. We're going to create a new custom error. We're just going to say error raffle underscore underscore transfer failed like this. Copy this, scroll back down, paste it in. If this transfer fails for any reason, we're going to go ahead and revert right here. All right, great. So there's a couple of things that we probably want to keep in mind, though, when we make this request, when we pick the winner and we'll use this request ID in a little bit. So if it's if this squiggly line is bothering you, don't worry about it quite yet. But if we're in the middle of picking a winner, right? Remember, we have to wait a certain number of blocks to get that response back. So what we're probably going to want to do, though, is say, hey, if we're in the middle of calculating the winner, we should restrict people to not be allowed to enter. So we should only allow people to enter if we're currently not picking the winner, right? So what we can do is we can actually keep track of the lottery's current state by giving it a new type with something called an enum. So what we could do to keep track of the raffle and figure out, okay, are we in the middle of calculating the winner is we could, you know, we could scroll to the top, we could do like, you know, bool, s underscore calculating winner, and then just like set this to false. And then down here, once we start picking the winner, we could set it to true. But as we create more sophisticated typing and having more interesting requirements, just a bool isn't going to be enough. So we want to learn actually how to create new types using enums. Maybe instead, for example, you know, we had some like, instead of like bool, you know, uh, it, calculating lottery, we had like lottery state. And then this could be like open, close, cal, paying, blah, blah, many different states. A Boolean would no longer be good enough. And I don't want to have to have a different variable for each one of these things. So what can we do? So what we can do is we can create a single variable of a new type that we come up with called an enum. And if we scroll up to the top with this layout of the contract here, we can actually see, you know, we have version, imports, errors, interface, libraries, contracts. We have type decalor type declarations even before our state variables. So an enum is a kind of type declaration that we're going to put up near the top of our contract. So let me even label this. We'll call this state variables, eables, like this. And we're going to add type declarations right here. And this is where we're going to, we're going to create this new enum. 
And in the Solidity docs, we have this section called Enum Types. Enums can be used to create custom types with a finite set of constant values. They are explicitly convertible to and from all integer types, but implicit conversion is not allowed. So we can see here's an example contract and there's this enum action choices, go left, go right, go straight, sit still. And so once we create this enum, they get this new action choices typing that they can use throughout their contract. For us, we're gonna create an enum called raffle state. And this is just gonna be open or calculating. And that's it. These are going to be the two options for our raffle state to be in. It's either open or it's calculating. Either it's open or it's calculating the winner because somebody called that pick winner function and you should not be able to enter the raffle. In Solidity, each one of these states in our new type can actually be converted to integers. So open is going to be integer zero. Calculating is going to be integer one. If we had like another state, that would be integer two and so on and so forth. But now that we have this raffle state type in our state variables, we can create a new storage variable. We can say raffle state, kind of the same as what we've done above here, right? What's where we do like type, visibility, name, and then, you know, constant if constant. So we'll do type, visibility, name, s underscore raffle state. What we can do is we can default this to being open. So in our constructor, we'll say s raffle state equals raffle state dot open. And this is actually the same as if we did raffle state and then cast zero, right? Because raffle state dot open is equivalent to zero here, but we'll do raffle state dot open. So our code is more readable. And then actually I'm going to move this down here as well. So all the immutables are here. The storage ones are here. And then now that we have this in our inter raffle function, we can do a little if s underscore raffle state does not equal raffle state dot open, then we should not be able to enter. So we'll do revert with a new custom error of raffle underscore underscore raffle not open like so. And I need to go ahead and define this up here in my custom errors. So we'll do error raffle not open like this. So you can only enter the raffle if the raffle is open. Now, down in our pick winner, after we do our little check here, and we'll still have to give this a, a custom error in a little bit, but we can do a little update. We can basically now say, okay, s underscore raffle state equals raffle state dot calculating like this. So now, once somebody kicks off the Chainlink VRF request, we will now be in a calculating state. And since this is calculating, people will not be able to enter the raffle anymore. But then when we get the actual winner, we're going to want to flip the state back to open. So after we get the winner down here, we're going to say S winner equals recent winner. And then right below that, we're going to say, oops, say S underscore raffle state equals raffle state dot open. Cool. Now our fulfill random words function is still not done, right? There's still some more things that we need to do. Right now our fulfill random words is like, oh cool, like cool, we have a winner, but the raffles, the S players array is still populated with players, right? We still have a whole list of players. So if more people enter the new raffle, the old players were still able to keep their spots essentially. So we need to actually reset this players array. So we're actually doing a couple of state updates, right? We're saying s raffle state equals raffle state that open. We're reopening the raffle. We also need to update this players array to a brand new array, right? We need to empty out all the players. So what we could do is we could go through the whole players array and like delete one element at a time in the array. And that would be awful and it would take forever. But a much better way to do this is we could just say, okay, s players is now going to equal a new, equal a new address payable array of size zero. And this is going to basically just wipe out everything in that S players variable and just reset it to a brand new blank array. And then additionally, we want to update that under that S underscore last timestamp equals block dot timestamp so that our interval can restart, right? So our clock can restart on on when somebody can actually call pick winner. So we want to add that down here as well. All right. And so since we've learned about events now, we've picked a winner and we've updated the state, we can now emit a log 
So we can do a little emit winner picked, and we'll say the recent, or we'll do the, uh, yeah, we'll do the recent winner in here, s underscore recent winner. And we're gonna take this event, we're gonna copy it, scroll all the way back up to our events here. We'll do a new event, winner picked, and we'll say address indexed winner, like so. But all right, great. So this is starting to shape up. This is starting to look pretty good. Now I wanna say something important. As I'm building this now, it looks like I'm just going from start to finish, right? And a big reason for that is I've already, I've done this demo many times, right? I've written this code many times. I've written a lot of solidity in my career. However, most of the time, instead of me just writing a contract beginning to finish, I don't do it in one go. In fact, it's incredibly difficult to do it in one go. Most of the time instead, I'm actually writing a deploy script and then testing individual components of my contract as I build it out. So at this point in my coding, I probably would have wrote a test get entrance fee function. I probably would have wrote a test pick winner function. I might have wrote a test enter raffle function. I'm writing tests as I'm coding this. The reason that I'm not writing tests and not writing the deploy script right now is we're gonna do a lot of refactoring as we go along here. And the way I'm coding this is I'm coding it in a way to explain the different concepts of what we're doing piece by piece, as opposed to coding it in a way that I would code a real project. But I do think it's important for you to keep in mind that this doesn't actually look like what really coding this project looks like. It's gonna be you going back and forth, you compiling code, stuff not compiling, you going, well, wait, why, why doesn't this compile? You debugging stuff, and that's okay, and that's good. So just wanted to give you that heads up. Now, whenever you're coding functions, there's gonna be a concept that I want you to keep in mind. And this is gonna be called the CEI or the checks effects interactions pattern. And this is gonna be one of the most important patterns for you to keep in mind anytime you're coding Solidity and you're coding smart contracts. And the goal here is that you wanna set your functions up where you do some checks at the beginning our fulfill random words doesn't really have any checks yet. Our fulfill random words doesn't have any checks. But then you want to do effects, which is going to be like your internal contract state changes, right? So this is going to be all our state variables that we're going to update in here. And then we're going to do interactions, interactions. And this is going to be external, external contract, external contract interactions. And I know kind of the E and the I is a little bit confusing here, but yeah, the way I say I think of it as checks, effects, which is internal contract state, and then interactions, which is going to be external contract state. Much, much, much later in the course, we will talk about security and reentrancy and a lot of the and a lot of the trickiness of smart contract development. But for now, if you just keep checks, effects, interactions in mind, that will help you just be safer by default. And of course, if you want to go super, super deep into security, we have our security and auditing course that you should definitely check out. Whether you want to be a top developer or security researcher, it's really, really important to have security in mind whenever you're building smart contracts. So your checks are going to be basically your like requires, right? Requires or your conditionals, conditionals. And if we scroll up, we can see we're actually doing that for pick winner, right? What's the first thing that happens at pick winner? Okay, well, we have a check in pick winner. If we go to enter raffle, we actually have two checks right at the top of enter raffle. So the first thing you always want to do is, is your checks. The next thing is going to want to do your effects, your internal contract state updates, and then finally your external contract interactions. Now, you'll see down here we actually omit this event. Technically, this is internal to our contract, right? This doesn't interact with any external contract, so we actually would want to bump this up up to here and omit our event before we do this interaction, this external contract interaction. And why do you want to start with the checks at the top? Well, the biggest thing is it's more gas efficient, right? If we had, let's actually scroll way up to the top here. If we didn't send any message dot value and this was going to revert, but we did a whole bunch of work first and then we reverted later, like that would really stink. So it's much more gas efficient to revert early than to do a bunch of work and then revert later. And then let me get rid of all this stuff here. The biggest reason for this 
pattern, this methodology is to defend against reentrancy attacks, which, like I said, we'll learn much later. Now, there is some debate about events, and a lot of people will tell you that putting it after an external contract interaction is fine, and that's kind of the default. But I'm going to tell you that it's not fine, and you should practice better best practices and do it before you omit your events, because there is a scenario where an external contract interaction does change a storage variable of yours, and therefore the events that you're omitting are wrong, and, and we don't want that. Biggest takeaway is just remember this design pattern, checks, effects, interactions. All right, great. So our code is starting to shape up here, right? We haven't tested it yet, but it looks like we're looking pretty good, right? We have a way to pick a random number, right? We're getting a random number. Hooray. We're also using that random number to pick a random player and give them the money. Okay, cool. All right, great. Like we're doing that as well. Uh Oh, Oh, we're not doing this automatically. We're not automatically calling this. Hmm. We want to work very hard to be very lazy. I would love to figure out how we can automatically have this called. Well, guess what? There is a way for us to do this. So what we can do is we can use Chainlink automation to automatically kick off calling this pick winner function so that we never have to rely on some good Samaritan calling this pick winner function and our lottery will just run programmatically without us ever having to interact with it. So to get started with Chainlink automation, we can actually go to the docs once again and we can scroll up to the top. Let's go click here. Let's go look for automation and same as normal, we can actually see all the different code in here for working with Chainlink Automation. If we scroll down, we can see getting started with automation. Uh, if you want, you can go through the documentation, deploy this to Sepolia, et cetera, et cetera. For us, if we're working with automation, we can look on the side here. There's some different concepts. There's some different guides. There's going to be time-based versus custom logic versus log trigger. We are going to be using kind of a derivative of time-based, but we're going to be using custom logic stored on chain because custom logic is kind of the ultimate way to do this anyways, where it allows you to do literally anything. You can customize your smart contract to be called at any time. And there's going to be a video that we're going to watch pretty soon that's going to show you how to set up a lot of this code through the UI. There's a website that you can actually go to to help get you a lot of this setup. But like I said, we're actually going to write a whole bunch of scripts so that we can do a lot of this programmatically so that we can have a very professional set up with working with these tools. And if we go to these guides, like create uh, automation compatible contracts, we can scroll down in here and same as normal, we'll get hit with this chunk of code that we can go ahead and select open and remix, which will open up in remix and we'll get this big chunk of code that we can use kind of as a baseline for working with Chainlink automation. So we can really learn what's going on here. And if you want to try this out yourself, by following along with the documentation, trying this out in Remix, I highly recommend you do so. So let's go ahead and let's go back over to Richard, who will go over Chainlink Automation as well and show you how to work with Chainlink Automation. Now, kind of same as with Chainlink VRF, the version we're going to be used is going to be slightly different, but all the high-level concepts are still going to be the same, and it's still good to go over this as well. Now, just a heads up, Chainlink Automation was previously known as Chainlink Keepers, so you might hear that terminology used a, a little bit as well. So just if you hear Chainlink Keepers, just know that that is Chainlink Automation. Hi, I'm Richard, one of the developer advocates at Chainlink Labs. And today we're going to take a look at an update to Keepers. Now, maybe you're like me and, you know, on a regular Tuesday, you're just browsing the Chainlink documentation and you come across these Chainlink Keeper release notes. You say, whoa, what's changed? What's new? Let's dive into that and see what's new with Keepers. If you head on over to the documentation and look at the Keepers release notes, you can dig in and see what exactly is new with Keepers. But I want to jump right in and head on over to keepers.chain.link. When we head there, we'll be prompted to connect our wallet. So let's go ahead and do that first. And then we'll take a look at what's new with Keepers. So here, everything looks mostly the same. But when we register a new upkeep, we're presented with this new option, Trigger. This is amazing, in my opinion, because one of the most common use cases that I use are time-based trigger mechanisms. And that used to mean dealing with block hashes and trying to figure out how to do all that within a contract uh, using check upkeep 
with those block hashes to see if enough time had passed on a blockchain in order to trigger that upkeep. Now, you can do that right here through this UI. I'm gonna head back to the documentation and we'll take a look at creating a time-based automation. Now, this will walk you through all the different steps that you need about connecting your wallet, how to register, and everything like that. But let's look at creating a Keeper compatible contract. This is what we used to have to do every single time. We used to have to create a check upkeep function, and then we had to create a perform upkeep function, right? You remember that? Well, you can still do that if you need some sort of more complex logic behind what's going to trigger an upkeep. If it's not just time-based, you can still use those two functions. But we wanna use that time-based function. How can we make a contract and do that? Let's take this sample contract and we'll modify it and go from there. So we have our sample contract. If we click open in Remix, we'll get it popped open in Remix. And Remix is an online IDE for developing Solidity smart contracts. We've got our contract here and we'll know that this one is based upon the way that we used to always use keepers by creating a keeper compatible contract with check upkeep and perform upkeep, both as functions available within the contract. Now we don't need those anymore. This is a good example, I think, for showing this change because this contract, it checks upkeep based upon the block timestamp, the last time that we did something, and an interval. So when we deploy this contract, we set the interval. That's what the constructor does. The constructors run every time you deploy a contract. And in this case, we pass in an interval to the constructor. Based upon that interval, you then will check the block timestamp and the last time that we actually performed upkeep and compare them to see if enough seconds have passed in order to need upkeep again. This is a perfect use case for that time-based upkeep. So how do we go about doing this? I think probably the best way to start is by creating a new function to count, right? That's what this contract is doing. It's taking a counter, starting it at zero, and then it's increasing it at a regular interval. So let's do that. Let's create a new function and we'll call it count. And it won't need to take anything in because we're just gonna be increasing that counter. And so we'll just say counter equals counter plus one. Now, what type of function does this need to be? We can let anybody run this. So we'll say external. And that should be it, right? We have this function count. It's an external function. And we don't need check upkeep anymore for this use case. We don't even need perform upkeep. We can get rid of both of these. Our contract just got a whole lot simpler, right? So anytime that we want to increase our counter, we just call count. Fantastic. Let's go ahead here and see what we have as far as compiling. We have a warning. It's saying that it should not be a keeper compatible interface anymore. That's true. We don't need that as well. We don't need last timestamp and we don't need interval. We'll set those in the keepers interface so we can get rid of them as well. Suddenly this contract just became really, really simple. So we create a constructor and let's clean it up all, all the way. We have our constructor. It's gonna set the counter equal to zero. It's a public variable that we can see. And then we have a function to increase that counter. That's it. That's all that the other version of this contract was doing using check upkeep and perform upkeep. This one, much simpler. And if you're using a use case like this, where you just need to perform an action based upon time passing, this is all you need. So we're good here, we've got our green check mark, that means it compiled correctly. We'll need to deploy this. So let's do an injected provider. I'm going to be deploying it to the Fuji Avalanche test network. Just picked one. And we have my account, we need to make sure we deploy the counter contract. Let's go ahead and do that. We'll approve this transaction. We should see it pop up here. We've got another green check mark. That means we're good to go. 
We have two values here. We have counter. It'll tell us that we've counted zero times. And we have count. This will actually increment the counter. So let's do that. Go ahead and make sure everything's working before we head over to keepers. Cool. Awesome. We have counted one time. Now, let's head over to keepers. And what will we need over there? So we're going to be using time-based triggering for this contract. Now, we'll need to give it the address of our contract. And this is going to give us a couple of interesting options here. So if we had verified this contract on the network that we're working on, it will populate the values of the functions that it can call. We haven't verified this contract. Are we out of luck? We're not. We can get the ABI, the Application Binary Interface. It essentially gives keepers and other applications interacting with your contract the information about, hey, what does this contract do? How do I interact with it? If we head back to Ethereum, we can see under the compilation tab here, under the compiler, we have an ABI. Now, make sure that you pick the correct contract. This contract is counter. So we'll need to make sure we select that and then we'll click on copy for the ABI. Head back to the keepers window over here, paste it in and click next. At this point, it should give you all of the functions that you can call. Now, our contract's pretty simple. It has one function, it's called count. So we'll use that function, right? We've told it what function we want to call. Now we need to tell it how often do we want to call this function. When it comes to automating smart contracts on the blockchain, we're going to have to wait for blocks to be verified, right? And blocks to be mined on that blockchain. That can affect how quickly we can do things. I'm going to run this every minute. The Fuji test network is pretty fast. Some other networks, it takes a little bit longer for those block confirmations to come in. That's just something to keep in mind. The syntax here is the same as cron. If you're not familiar with cron, there's a basic breakdown of it over here. It has five different values. It's got minutes, hours, days of the month, the month, and then day of the week. Now, you can get really fancy with cron schedules. And there are some tools out there that are fantastic. If you're not familiar with cron, head on over to crontab.guru. And you can kind of get an idea of what is happening. They have an example in here. We'll just talk through it real quick. So the minutes is five, the hours is four. The rest are stars. Stars means always. So this says at 4.05 every day. Every day of the month, every month of the year, every day of the week, right? You can get some pretty interesting things going on. So this one run at midnight, five minutes past it, on the, for like every day in August. Only in August. So every day and every day of the week in August, the eighth month. At 14.15 on the first of the month. This is a great place to kind of get a easy, human readable output from cron tabs. So let's head back here. We wanna run this and I'm gonna say every one minute. And this is what I mean by interesting things. We can divide up every minute divided by one. So that's gonna say every one minute, right? If we had just one, then it would only run on the first minute of the hour. So at one minute past the hour, but we want every one minute. We'll click next. And this is very similar to what the keepers used to look like, right? So we'll say uh, count every, now let's do something more fun. Make every minute count. Uh, we'll give it a gas limit, 15, 150,000, should be plenty. We'll pop in some link. Do you need link? If you don't have link, you can get it from the faucet right here. We've got a link to the link faucet right there. We do ask for your email address. That's to email you in case your keeper starts to run out of link or there's a problem. And you can give it a project name if you need to. We'll click register upkeep. We'll need to approve this on the blockchain. We'll wait for that approval process. We'll need to approve one more time 
to actually request the upkeep as well. So this will transfer the link from our wallet to the Keeper's subscription that we've got going on here, uh, and it will set up our upkeep, and then we can view that upkeep. So if we take a look here, we can see the history. We can see, hey, we set up our upkeep and we funded it. We have when it's going to run based upon our cron expression. Uh, we've got all that information. We also have the ability to say, hey, you know, I don't want to run this every minute. That's way too often, maybe every hour. We can go in here and we could edit the upkeep, change things. We can add more link if we need to. We can edit that gas limit. That will be important too. If you have a function that costs more gas than your gas limit, your upkeep won't run. Just a few things to keep in mind. But you can see here, we've performed our upkeep already. So if we head back to Remix, go back to our contract, right? Last time we ran counter once and then we had one on our counter. If we check now, we can see our counters two. And again, in just a minute, we'll be able to see that our counter has increased again. So just like that, we've taken our contract and we've automated it using keepers time-based triggers to create that decentralized automation of our smart contract. I think that's really cool. This use case, I'm stoked about it because I do this a lot where I want to just have something trigger on a regular interval, a regular cadence, and having the ability to do that is awesome. And it simplifies the contracts down so much, right? Look at this thing. It's tiny. When you compare that to this, my goodness, it's so much easier to understand, so much cleaner because our use case is so simple. So thanks for watching another tutorial and for checking out the new Keepers version 1.2. I'm Richard and I'll catch you in the next one. All right, now that we know a little bit more about Chainlink automation, we can actually use Chainlink Automation, which like we said, used to be called Chainlink Keepers, to actually automatically kick off our lottery so that we don't ever have to call any functions and the lottery will just run. To do this, we're gonna need these two main functions and they're gonna be called Check Upkeep and Perform Upkeep. And Richard went over them briefly in the last video. Essentially, what the nodes will do is they will periodically call this Check Upkeep function. They will call it as a view function, right? They won't actually send a transaction. They'll just keep checking to see if it's time to actually perform an upkeep, aka start the lottery. So they will keep calling this check upkeep. This is where we will define the custom logic. And then we will implement this perform upkeep, which they will call to actually kick off the lottery, start the lottery, which picks the random number, etc. So so our check upkeep is basically going to say, hey, is the lottery done? Is it time to pick the winner? And then perform upkeep is going to say, OK, let's actually pick the winner. So right now in our code base, we have this pick winner function, which we're kind of assuming that somebody is programmatically calling. But we're going to actually revamp this function so that it works with Chainlink automation so that nobody ever has to actually call this function. So we're kind of going to split this function up into a check upkeep and a perform upkeep. So what we can do is right below our enter raffle function, is we can actually create that first new function. So we'll do function check upkeep, keep, I think it's lowercase, check upkeep, yep, like this. And this needs to take a bytes call data like this. So whenever you see syntax like this, bytes call data and then the actual variable commented out like this, this means that it's not being used anywhere in the function. If we want to use check data, we can go ahead and implement it like this. For now, we're going to ignore check data, but check data is a way to further customize your Chainlink automation. If you want the Chainlink nodes to pass some specific information in order to check if it's time to actually do the update. So this check upkeep function, they have it in the docs as external view override. We are going to have ours be a public view override because we're actually going to use this check upkeep someplace else. And I'll show you where in a minute. They're actually using override as well, because in their example in here, they're actually importing this automation compatible interface and implementing it. This is a good best practice to do so that you always implement the functions needed for something like Chainlink Automation. However, we're going to actually ignore it and just not use the override key here. Since, like I said, this is just an interface, 
and I just don't want to add it to make it a little bit easier, make our code base a little bit smaller. And this function is going to return two things. So it's going to return a Boolean called upkeep needed and a bytes memory perform data. So I'm actually going to just copy this whole line, paste it into my VS code here, and then it's saved and it auto reformatted for me, which is nice. So the bool upkeep needed is going to be true or false. Simply, hey, is it time to restart the lottery? Is it time to pick the winner? And then bytes memory perform data. This can be some type of return information about what to do with this upkeep. As you can see here in the example, it's also wrapped in these comment brackets here. So we're going to ignore it similar to how the docs ignore it because we're not actually going to use this perform data in any way. So for us, this checkup keep, we really only need to worry about this Boolean. Hey, when is it time to pick the winner, right? This checkup keep is going to be answering that question. When should the winner be picked and have this upkeep need to be true whenever the winner should be picked? So we can actually write this answer as a bit of NAT spec here. And uh, my VS code auto completed a little bit for me, which is really nice. And what we can do is say at dev, this is the function that the chain link nodes will call to see if the lottery is ready to have a winner picked. The following should be true, should be true in order for upkeep needed, needed to be true. One, the time interval has passed between raffle runs. Right, so that interval is up to date. Number two, the lottery is open. Number three, the contract has ETH. And then number four, implicitly, Lee, implicitly, your subscription has link like this. And the params are going to be uh, null here, ignored. Oh. And then we can just kind of delete this bit here. Just say like null or ignored. It's going to return upkeep needed true if it's time to restart the lottery. And then I'm going to say ignored. Now, what's kind of cool about our returns here is that this is actually a way to initialize variables right in the return section, right? So just by doing bool upkeep needed, this upkeep needed variable is now initialized and we can use it in our function, right? It automatically starts off as false. If we just had like return bool like this in our function, we would need to say like bool upkeep needed, you know, equals true or whatever. But since we have a defined our return function, boom, we automatically get this upkeep needed and it defaults to false. And doing it like this, it'll automatically return whatever's in this bool upkeep needed. Right, so we could have done like bool hello equals true, return hello. Well, we're gonna have to return hello and then also you know perform data, which would be like blank. But what we can do instead is just do this and we can say upkeep needed equals true, and boom, it'll automatically return upkeep needed is true because whenever this function ends, it's gonna return the variables defined in here since we actually defined them there. So a little bit of cool solidity syntactic sugar. So if we said upkeep needed was true, it would return upkeep needed was true. If we said upkeep needed was false, it would return upkeep needed is false. So now that we actually have this, we can actually start to implement this here. And what we can do is we can first say, OK, what's the first one? The time interval has passed between raffle runs. We can actually copy this, paste it here because this is the conditional. And let's do a little bit of refactoring here. Let's say this bool time has passed equals like this. And then block to timestamp minus s last timestamp. This should be you now greater than or equal to because this is going to be time has passed. This was kind of time has not passed. So we're going to say time has passed. Okay, the next one, the lottery is open. So we can say bool is open equals s underscore raffle state equals equals raffle state dot open. This is kind of the equivalent of saying s raffle state equals equals zero. So if it's indeed open, this will return true. Otherwise, this will be false. OK, next, the contract has ETH. This is basically checking to see if the contract has players, right? If people have entered the raffle. So we could say bool has balance equals address this dot 
balance is greater than zero. And you know what? We should probably check for players as well. Like bool has players equals s underscore players dot s underscore players dot length is greater than zero. And then we can say upkeep needed is just whatever the combination of all of these are, right? So if this and this and this and this are all true, then check upkeep should return true. So we'll say upkeep needed equals time has passed, double ampersand is open, double ampersand has balance, double ampersand has players. So this double ampersand is basically saying and, so we're saying if this is true and this is true and this is true and this is true, this whole thing should return true. If any one of these is false, this will be false. So now it would just automatically return upkeep needed and then blank four bytes of memory. However, we, however, it's still best to be very explicit. I don't love just kind of leaving it like this. So we can do return upkeep needed. And then we can kind of do any like OX. OXO for hex, you know, maybe we even type the hex word here. Oh. We could even do this syntax here, hex, and then just like a blank string. We could even just do like a blank string. There's lots of different ways to basically return null here. So, all right, great. So now we have a function to actually check if it's time for this lottery to automatically be called and updated. And so now what we can do is we can convert our pick winner function into this perform upkeep function, right? This is gonna be the function that says, hey, uh, it's time to kick off a VRF call. We need a random number, please. So the chain link nodes are basically gonna continuously call this function. They're gonna call it over and over and over and over and over it again. And whenever this returns true, it's gonna return true and they're gonna go, oh my gosh, it's time to pick a new random winner. Let's call perform upkeep, which is what we're gonna refactor our pick winner function to be. So first, we're gonna to have to refactor our perform upkeep excuse me, we're gonna have to refactor our pick winner function to perform upkeep. So we'll paste it like this. We don't need the override keyword here and boom. And already most of our perform upkeep is looking good. It already has most of what we want here. We're not gonna pass any perform data in here, kind of like what we were saying before, cause we're not returning any perform data from check upkeep. Now, since this is an external function, that means anybody can call this and we want to just have this function have some validation in here. So we wanna make sure that the chain link nodes or really anybody can only call this when it's time to call this. So what we can do is we can say if, and we can actually get rid of this, if, or excuse me, not if, we can do bool upkeep needed comma, and I'll explain this in a second, equals check upkeep with a blank input. So we're gonna get the output of us calling check upkeep, and this is why we made this public. And we get this reg squiggly line here, and I'll explain that in just a second. But then we can just say, if the upkeep is not needed, so bang upkeep needed, then we're gonna revert with some type of custom error here. Now, if we keep the code as such, we're gonna get this error here. Invalid type for argument in function call, invalid implicit conversion from little string to bytes call data requested. So this is a little bit lower level, and this is okay if you don't really remember this quite yet. But in our check upkeep function, we've specified this as a bytes call data check data. Now, whenever you use some type of variable inside of a function, it can never be call data. And the reason for that is because technically anything generated from a smart contract is never called data. Call data can only be generated from a user's transaction input. That's probably a little bit confusing for now, but that's okay. For now, if you see something like this, just swap this over to memory, save, and that will go away. So having this be call data just makes this function a little bit more gas efficient. Having this be memory makes it a little bit less gas efficient. However, it's more permissive. Like I said, you don't really need to worry about the low level differences there quite yet. Now, when we're doing these reverts here, just if you send a transaction and you just get some revert, it might be very unclear to you as a user of this protocol or a developer why this actually reverted, right? And that's, you know, that's why we do these custom errors up here. However, what we could do is we could just, for our revert here, we could say revert, you know, come up with a new custom error raffle, underscore, underscore, up, keep not needed. But you might say, ah, the upkeep's not needed, but I, I don't understand why. So what we can do is we can actually add parameters in our custom 
errors to give more information in reverts as to why this actually errored. So we could add an address this dot balance. So maybe we could check to see maybe there isn't a balance. We could say s players dot length. Maybe there are no players in here. You went to 256 s underscore raffle state like so. So if it's open, right, if we go back up to the raffle state, if it's open, it would be zero calculating would be one. And then in our definitions here, we could say error raffle upkeep not needed. You went 256 balance, you went 256 players length, and then you went 256 raffle state. Now when we revert here, raffle upkeep not needed, we'll have more information as to why we actually reverted here. We could also do raffle state, raffle state, or U and six raffle state, because like I said, each one of these parameters inside of raffle state get mapped to a U and two fifty six anyways. So, but we're just going to do a U and two fifty six s underscore raffle state to make it a little bit easier to understand in the actual revert. All right, great. All right, great. So now we have a way for the chain link automation or the chain link keepers to automatically kick off our raffle to kick off our VRF request. It's the chain link nodes that are actually going to call the chain link VRF for us. And let's just make this a little bit nicer. Let's get rid of the warning here. So we'll just get rid of that. And then we'll also comment this out here just for now. We'll probably add it back in later, but we'll just make it a little bit easier for now. Okay, great. And cool stuff's looking pretty good. Let's just do a little compile here. So we'll do a little forge build or make build and cool compiler run successful. Awesome. All right, great. So we've written a lot of code and we've learned a lot of things. So let's do a quick mid section recap here of what we've kind of learned, what we've gone over. So we're using this layout guide that we just kind of copy pasted at the top of our code base here to guide us into where to actually put our functions. Our raffle is inheriting this VRF consumer base V2 plus and this VRF V consumer base two plus if I command click or control click or open the command palette and go to this contract, it has this S VRF coordinator variable inside of it. Because it has this S underscore VRF coordinator inside of it, it gives us access to this S underscore VRF coordinator. And that's actually what we're using. It's that contract that we're inheriting in our raffle contract to actually call this request random words using this request struct that we built ourselves from the library, right? We're using a key hash, subscription ID, request confirmations, callback, num words, some extra arguments. And this is how we're actually calling the Chainlink VRF to get a random number. And then the Chainlink node will respond to our fulfill random words and we will use the random number it gives us to pick a random winner. Now, because we want to be incredibly lazy here, we are actually going to basically hand off calling this lottery and restarting this lottery to the Chainlink automation. So we have a check upkeep function, which the Chainlink nodes will consistently call to make sure it's time to call the lottery. And then we will have a perform upkeep function, which is what they're going to do to actually pick the random winner. The Chainlink automation is going to call perform upkeep, which will call the Chainlink VRF. The Chainlink VRF will then call fulfill random words. And that's how we're going to get our random winner here. To actually get into the raffle, we have this enter raffle function here, which we have a couple of checks right at the top, which makes sure that they're actually sending an entrance fee and that the raffle is currently open. They will get added to an array and we will emit an event there. And in order for us to work with this VRF consumer base V2 plus, we have to pass the VRF consumer base V2 plus in its constructor by just kind of adding it to our constructor like this. VRF consumer base V2 plus has its own constructor. And whenever you're working with a code base that has its own constructor, you need to also use that constructor in your code as well. And boom, actually just like that, we've pretty much written most of the code to have a provably fair automated smart contract lottery. Let's go. All right, great. So we've actually written some really good code here. So now we want to make sure that this code actually works. It actually does what we want it to do. And we're going to write some tests. And you'll probably hear me say this more and more, but it's really important. We get really good at testing and DevOps and writing scripts with our smart contracts because smart contracts are a little bit different than other software. If you screw up one of your smart contracts, you could potentially lose a lot of money right away. So we want to make sure we 
get really comfortable writing tests because oftentimes writing really robust, really strong tests is actually the majority of your work as a smart contract developer or a security researcher anyways. So now we're actually going to go ahead and go into writing these tests. And we're going to approach writing these tests by following this path here. So first, we're going to write some deploy scripts in order to use directly in our tests so that we can test the exact same way we're going to deploy these smart contracts. And note that deploy scripts as of recording do not work on ZK Sync. So if you wanted to actually test these on ZK Sync on running like a local ZK Sync chain, what you would need to do is you would actually need to write some bash scripts to deploy your smart contracts to a ZK Sync chain, deploy your mocks there, and then run your test suite on your local ZK Sync chain as if it was some type of forked testnet. So the deploy scripts that we're going to write here, they're not going to work for ZK Sync. However, that's how you would do it. And this is just as of recording. There are plans for them to actually add this functionality in. So in the future, your deploy scripts will work exactly the same on ZK Sync as they work on any other chain. But we still want to write these anyways so that we can get a good understanding that our code base is actually doing what we want it to do. So this is the approach that we're going to take. Let's go ahead and let's dive in. And all right, let's go ahead and let's get cracking. Let's open up our code base here and let's go over to script. We'll create a new file called deploy raffle.s.sol. And you already know the drill. We can do a little pragma. My VS code already kind of populates this for me. Let's make this MIT 0.8.19. We'll call this contract deploy raffle is script like this. And we'll say import script from forge sd slash script.sol like that. All right, cool. Let's do a little sanity forge build or forge compile. And yep, looks good here. Okay, great. And what we're going to need to do in here, of course, is we're going to need to create a little function run function like we did with our foundry fund me. And if we pull back up our fund me scripts here, we're going to do something similar to what we did before, right? So we're going to have this run function. This is what's actually going to get called when we call run. We're going to have this deploy fund me script that we're actually going to use in our tests. And this is going to be how we work with this. So I'm actually going to create another function called function deploy raffle. And I know this is a little confusing. The contract name is deploy raffle. And then we're also going to have the function name deploy raffle. If this is too confusing, we can call this like deploy contract. Uh, actually, you know what? Yeah, let's do that so that it's a little bit less confusing here. And kind of exactly as we did with our fund me bit, we're going to have this deploy function return. It's going to be external or, you know, let's just make it public returns. It's going to return our raffle contract and a helper config, right? So that we can use it directly in our tests, which we haven't defined these yet, but you know that we definitely will. So let's grab that raffle first, at least. So we're going to say import, import raffle from src slash raffle dot soul. And what's interesting is that there's actually a couple different ways to do imports. So you can do import contract from and then kind of this direct path, right, where the root directory, where we just say src raffle.sol. We can also do a relative path where we do like dot dot slash src raffle.sol. Both of these work. So raffle.sol is located in relation to the script down a directory and then src raffle.sol. Or we could just say src raffle.sol and You'll kind of understand the distinction there a little bit later, but for now, either way is going to work fine. So let's go ahead. How do we actually deploy our raffle? Well, let's go to the code base. It takes an entrance fee, interval, coordinator, gas lane, subscription ID, callback gas limit. Now, as you know, a lot of these are going to depend on the chain that we actually deploy to. At least the VRF coordinator, the address of that contract is going to be different if we deploy to Arbitrum, Ethereum mainnet, Sepolia, ZK Sync, whenever it's added to ZK Sync. So we're going to have to make a helper config with each one of these parameters. So before we can even finish this, I'm actually going to go ahead and even comment this out. Before we can even finish this, let's go ahead and create a new helper config.s.sol. And this is where we're going to add a lot of that helper config information. So let's go ahead let's add a pragma, make this MIT 0.8.19 contract helper config is script like this. Say so import, import script from forge std slash script dot sol like so. All right, cool. In here, we're going to create our struct called network config. And what do we need to put in here? Well, let's go back to our raffle. OK, 
Okay, we're probably gonna need all of these in here. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say u int 256, u int 256. What else do we have? Entrance fee, interval, coordinator, gas lane. Entrance fee, interval, u int 256, interval, address, VRF, coordinator, gas lane subscription ID, callback limit, bytes, 32, gas lane, u int 32, callback, gas limit, u int 256, subscription ID, Oh, and these should all be semicolons, not commas. Okay, great. Now we're gonna need a couple other things in here in a little bit, but for now, let's just assume that this is correct. Now I'm planning on deploying this to Sepolio. You can optionally deploy this to Sepolio. You do not have to, because like we said, you know, it takes actual test and tokens and those can be a little bit hard to acquire, but I'm gonna set this up as if I'm going to deploy to Sepolio. And this way we'll also set it up to work with a local chain. So what I'm gonna do, I'm going to create a couple of functions in here kind of very similar to what we did with Fundme. Let's first create a little network config, public local network config or network configs or whatever you want to call it. And then we'll say mapping u into 256, 56 chain ID to network config, public net work figs like this. And same as what we did before, let's do constructor. Sorry, I'm kind of, I know I'm kind of going a little bit quick here. Let's create that Sepolia function here. So we'll do function get Sepolia eth config. This will be a public pure, which is going to returns a network config memory. And we'll say turn network config. We'll brackets like this, and then we'll say entrance fee is gonna be what? Let's entrance fee, let's say it's just 0 0.01 ether, or this is kind of equal to, to doing one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one, two, three, four, five, six, right? Or this is also like one E16, those are all the same, so 0 0.01 ether. Then say so interval, We'll give it an interval. Let's say, let's call this every 30 seconds. So this is gonna be, right, this is gonna be 30 seconds, just so that we can kind of test it really quickly. F coordinator, VRF coordinator. This is where we actually have to go back to the Chainlink docs for Chainlink VRF. So let's go back to VRF. Let's go in here to VRF 2.5 supported networks. Scroll down, Ethereum mainnet, Sepoya testnet, VF coordinator, boom, let's grab this address here, paste that there. Next is going to be the gas lane, which also is in the documentation, 100 GUI key hash. Let's do that one, boom, we'll paste that. Next, the callback gas limit. So callback gas limit for us, we can just hard code it to 500,000 gas, so it's gonna be 500,000 gas. That should be plenty of gas for us. And then what do we need? Then we need the subscription ID. Subscription ID, which for us, for now, we'll just leave ours as zero and you'll figure out why. We're gonna do something kind of cool here where our scripts will automatically create a subscription ID for us if we don't already have one. But what we can do is if we default to this, we can now say, okay, uh, network configs of the uh, Sepolia chain ID uh, is going to be, so the Sepolia chain ID is 1115511 equals get Sepolia eth config like this. Okay, cool. Now, as we kind of talked about before, I hate having magic numbers like this without any label in here. So we're going to actually scroll up to the top here. We're going to create an abstract contract just called code constants. And this is where we're just going to add a whole bunch of constant variables in here. And one of them is going to be UN256, public constant Sepolia chain ID, which is gonna be equal to 1115511, like this. And now we can say helper config is uh, code constants, doesn't really matter this order, and script. So what we can do now is we can say network configs, e Sepolia chain ID equals get e Sepolia chain ID. Okay, and then almost done here, We'll do another, we'll do a little function, get config by chain ID. We'll do uint256 chain ID. 
public returns network config memory. And we'll say if network configs of chain ID dot, we could say VRF coordinator. So if the VRF coordinator is not empty, so it does not equal address zero, then we're just going to return the network configs of that chain ID. However, if it is empty, oh, networks, network, network config. However, if it is empty, we'll say else if chain ID equals the local chain ID, which we're going to define. So we'll create this local chain ID, unit256 public constant local chain ID equals 31337. However, if it's the local chain ID, what are we going to do? This is where we're going to get or create anvil eth config, which we haven't set up yet. And then finally, else, we're actually just going to revert with an error that we're going to create for our helper config. Helper config underscore underscore invalid chain ID. So this needs to be error helper config invalid chain ID. Revert like this. So this is looking pretty similar to what we did with fund me. Oh, this needs to be double equal here. So this is looking pretty similar setup. I know it's a little boring, but um, public view. Well, it's not going to be view. Um, so this is pretty similar to what we did before. I know it's a little bit monotonous, but all good. So let's also create this get or create anvil eth. So down here, function get config. This will be a public function. This will definitely not be pure because this is where we might have to deploy some mocks. Public returns network config config memory and okay cool and then in here we're just going to say we're going to check to see if we set an active network config Let's see make sure we actually didn't set any extra mocks so we'll say if local network config dot vrf vrf core denator does not equal address zero then just return the local network config like this And if we haven't set it already, we should deploy some mocks. So let's go over deploying some of these mocks now. And then I can actually uncomment this too. Put a little semicolon here. This will actually be return, get or create anvil eth config. And okay, cool. So if we've already set it up, we'll just return it. Um, but if we haven't, we should set it up, right? So this is where if we're working with anvil, we should deploy mocks and such. All right, so the question then is, okay, Patrick, how do we deploy our mocks, right? If we're working on a local chain, we want to test this so that we want to test this with a mock VRF coordinator contract so that we know everything's working correctly. So how do we actually get one of these mocks? Well, we could 100% create a mock contract ourselves, but that would kind of stink. <laughs> that might be a lot of work. Well, guess what? Luckily for us, if we go into our lib folder, chain link routing contracts, contracts, SRC, V08, VRF, where is VRF? VRF down to mox right here in here this there is this vrf coordinator v underscore two v2 underscore five mock dot soul and this is what we're actually going to be using so we already have a mock vrf 2.5 and this has all the stuff in it that we need so what we can do we can go ahead and import it so import vrf coordinator v2 underscore five mock from at chainlink slash contracts slash src slash v0.8 slash vrf slash mox slash vrf coordinator v2 underscore five mock dot soul and ta-da and now we have this in here this is what we can use to deploy a mock vrf coordinator right locally and this is what we can do to very easily work with kind of a mock, a fake Chainlink VRF. And so now what we can do, so we can actually deploy it. So what we can do is we can scroll down. We can now go a little vm.start broadcast because we actually want this to deploy to our Anvil and then a little vm.stop broadcast afterwards. And we can say VRF coordinator v2 underscore five mock VRF coordinator mock 
equals new VRF coordinator v25 mock VRF coordinator v25 mock and let's go see what this actually takes in its constructor. So it takes a base fee, a gas price and a way per unit link. So let's talk about these different parameters here. So the base fee, whenever you work with Chainlink VRF, you need to pay a certain amount of Chainlink, a certain amount of link token. The base fee is going to be the flat amount of Chainlink token that you're always gonna to have to pay. So whenever the Chainlink node is actually gonna be the one calling this contract, right? Because when the Chainlink VRF is gonna call back, the Chainlink VRF is gonna be the one to actually spend gas to call this fulfill random words. It has to actually spend gas. So we have a little bit of a calculation here of, okay, how much link per ETH are we gonna use? And then we also have this way per unit of link, which is gonna be the link to ETH price in way. And basically all these are just calculations for the Chainlink VRF node to actually calculate, okay, how much it should charge you, right? If it has to spend a ton of gas, and the price of ETH is super, super high for some reason, it's gonna charge you more. If it doesn't have to spend a lot of gas and the price of ETH compared to Link is pretty low, well, it will charge you less. So, and since this is a, and since this is a mock contract, we can just kind of mock these values, right? So up back in our helper config, we're actually gonna put these up in the code constants. And so I'm actually gonna make a little area here called a VRF mock values. So we're gonna say uint, 96 public mock base fee and we're gonna say 0 0.25 ether like this we'll do a uint 96 public mock gas price link equals 1e9 and these are just some default values that will probably make sense and then for the link slash eth price we'll just say int 256 public mock way per u int link equals and then we'll just go with you know four e15 these values don't really matter for our test but you can kind of tweak them if you want to make sure your outputs are something that makes sense so now that we have that we can actually finally go to the bottom and deploy this mock contract so it's first going to take the mock base fee then it's going to take the mock gas price link gas price link then it's going to take the mock way per uint link next okay uh, like this okay cool and now that we have this vrf coordinator mock can we actually get this local network config so if we scroll to the top we have our local network config we could say local oops uh local network config equals network config let's see if we can populate this so the entrance fee entrance fee we'll just say is 0.01 ether still then we need the i'm then i'm actually just going to copy paste this and update these as we see fit interval 30 seconds that's fine vrf coordinator haha -ha. okay this is going to now be the address of the vrf coordinator mock that we just deployed the gas lane this doesn't matter it could be pretty much anything so this one doesn't matter because our mock is just going to have it work no matter what callback gas limit also doesn't matter and subscription id we might have to fix this but i'll show you how to fix this in a little bit so okay cool and then we just can return this return local network config and boom now we have at least a basic minimal get or create anvil eth config that we can now pass into our get configs by chain ID bit here. And this is looking pretty good, nice. And the reason stuff like this is becoming so important is because like I've been saying, we live in a multi-chain world. It's pretty much highly unlikely you're ever gonna deploy a contract to the Ethereum mainnet. You're probably gonna start off deploying it to a layer two or an L2. And there's a good chance that you actually will deploy your smart contracts to multiple different chains. So you want to have a robust setup, a robust DevOps or developer operations process that can handle kind of these different chains, these different L2s, because like I've been saying, like we've been seeing, these different chains have slight differences and they are slightly tweaked. And we wanna make sure that we test them appropriately, no matter which chain that we're gonna be working on. All right, cool. So now that we have our helper config up and just a heads up, we might need to do a little bit of refactoring on some of this. We can go back to this and actually get this to 
work here and then pop it into one of our tests. So let's go ahead and import that helper config from script slash helper config dot s dot so now we have those both working and in here we can do a little helper config equals config helper config config equals new helper config then we could say helper config helper config dot network config memory or I guess I should call this helper config config so this is the helper config contract and this is the network config so we'll call this config equals helper config dot get config so actually I don't think we implemented that so we have get config by chain id let's add one more helper function just to make it a little bit easier function get config this will say this will be public returns returns network config memory and then we'll just return this get config by chain id of block dot chain id so when we call get config if we're on a local network we will call get or create anvil eth config which will then deploy our mocks so kind of these helper functions are just to make our scripts look a little bit nicer so we'll call helper config dot get config now that that function exists and if we're on a local network so if we are local we're going to deploy mocks get local config and then if we're on something like sepolia we will just straight up get the sepolia config get sepolia config like so so now that we have our config here we can start deploying our raffles so we'll do vm dot start broadcast like this and then it'll vm dot stop broadcast like this and in here we'll say raffle raffle equals new raffle and let's go back to our raffle what do we need in here go to the constructor constructor entrance fee interval coordinator gas lane subscription callback so we can kind of cheat a little bit here and we can get all of these values from the config right because get config is going to return our network config which has all of these in it so what we can say then is we can say our config dot entrance fee entrance fee we can say config dot interval we can say config dot vrf coordinator config dot uh, what's next gas lane or key hash or whatever you want to call it uh, subscription id config dot subscription id and then finally config dot callback gas limit nice and then the last bit that we need is we just need to return the raffle and the helper config so at the bottom we'll just do return raffle that new raffle contract and that helper config that we just deployed as well and now we can use this in our tests okay nice now if you want to be a little bit lazy stuff like this subscription id you can just go ahead to the ui you can copy paste it into here but like I said, we're engineers. We want our processes to be very robust. So we're actually going to later on, we're going to do some refactoring of this to make this automatically get a subscription ID, make sure everything's set up correctly. But for now, let's just roll with this and we'll see that when we actually go into the tests here, the test will actually start to break down and that will be the cue to us. Ah, we need to go back and refactor some of our deploy scripts. So it's good that we're starting here. This is the simplest example, but cool. So in our test folder, let's go ahead. We'll create two new folders. We'll create one called unit for our unit tests, and we'll create another one for integration for our integration tests. And in here we'll create a new file. We'll call it raffle test.t.sol or really whatever you want to call it. And you already know the drill. Let's get this pragma snippet going. MIT 0.8.19 contract raffle test let me zoom in a little bit here raffle test is test like this we're going to import test from forge std slash test dot sol like this then of course we're going to import that deploy raffle from src slash or excuse me script slash or scripts script script dash deploy raffle.s.sol like this 
we're going to import the raffle contract itself from src slash raffle dot like that. And for this one, we could do dot dot slash dot dot slash like this to get a relative import, right? Because raffle.t.sol is here. So if we go back one directory, we're in unit. If we go back a second directory, we're in test, excuse me, because we're starting unit. If we go back one directory, we're in test. And if we go back another directory, we're kind of in the root directory here. And then we can go src raffle.sol. So we can do either this relative path or uh, this path like this here. So either way works. So let's go ahead and let's create some of these tests in here. So we're gonna do function setup because we obviously want to be able to set this up here, external or public. So we're gonna go ahead and do deploy raffle deployer equals new deploy raffle like this. And then we're going to get the raffle and the helper config by calling deploy contract or whatever you called it. Let's create those as state variables here. So we'll say raffle public raffle, and then we'll do helper config public helper config config oops and we're going to need to import that too. import helper config from script slash helper config dot s dot sol like this cool and so we're going to do deployer dot deploy contract like this and it's going to return those two values so we would just want to save them directly to raffle and helper config so since deploy contract returns a raffle and a helper config, we can just automatically save it to our raffle variable and our config variable by putting it in this syntax here. And then we should probably make some users to interact with our raffle. So we'll create like a test user address public player equals make a DDR player like this. This will create a this make a DDR, this make adder is a foundry cheat code, which will allow us to just kind of make addresses based off of some string. And we're probably going to want to give them a starting balance so they can actually interact with the lottery, interact with the raffle. So we'll say you went to 256, you went to 256 public constant starting player balance equals, we'll say like 10 ether, we'll give them a ton of money. Now, a quick note here is that in my test files, I'm a little bit more lax with some different conventions like for example like this layout this layout of the contract here i'm really going to be pretty strict about this inside like the contracts that i actually want to deploy i'm going to be a little bit less strict with them in my test it's still good to follow those conventions but but for testing you don't really have to follow it as strictly and then just to make my life a little bit easier in our helper config we have all these variables and i don't really want to have to do config.entranceV, config.interval, config.vrf, blah 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 so i'm actually just going to copy all of these paste it right underneath my helper config like this so we're going to initialize all these variables and then right underneath the deployer contract i'm going to say entrance i'm going to say helper config.network config memory config equals helper config dot get config like this kind of same as what we did before and then just set these with like entrance fee equals config dot entrance fee and then we'll say interval equals config dot interval we'll say brf coordinator coordinator equals config dot brf coordinator gas lane equals config dot gas lane callback gas limit equals config dot callback gas limit and then subscription id of course is going to equal config dot subscription id like so so this is all looking pretty good but let's do a quick test a quick sanity test just to make sure that things are looking good right so in our raffle dot soul we can do a, a simple test to make sure it at least starts in the correct state, right? So we should start as open, right? The lottery should start as open. So what we can do is we can in here in our test, we can say, let me zoom out a little bit, function test raffle initializes in open state like this. And it could be a public view like so. And all we need to do is we just want to assert that that starting raffle state is open. So if we go back to the raffle.sol, how do we get to this raffle state? Is there a way? 
Uh, looks like we actually don't have a getter function for this. So let's go ahead and scroll to the bottom. We'll create a little quick getter function. We'll call it function get raffle state. This will be external view. It'll return a raffle state, which remember we can kind of identify as a uint256 as well. We can type cast it as a uint256, but we can just say return s underscore raffle state like this. And then in our test, then we can simply just go assert raffle dot get raffle state equals. And this is where we can do some pretty cool syntax here to get this enum to get this type here. We can say equals raffle state. Excuse me. We can say raffle dot raffle state dot open. So this is how we're going to get that open enum right here, right? And this could be the same as just doing like uint256, like typecasting this raffle state as a uint256, and then just saying this is going to be zero, right? This would be one way we could write this test, but how we're doing it like this is going to make it much more readable. So this is the preferred way for us to do this. And now we can go ahead and do a little sanity test here. So now we can pull up our terminal, do a quick little forge build, just make sure it builds. Great. And now we can do a forge test. And we only have one test. So that's the test that goes right here. And it looks like it passes. Awesome. Now, this is an optional section here. I want to show you a tool that I use a lot. There is this tool out here by Transmissions 11 called headers and it's built in Rust and I haven't taught you guys how to work with Rust or how to do anything with Rust but essentially if you install this tool and you type headers and then some text it'll print out a perfect Solidity header for you that it will automatically cop copy to the clipboard so I already have this installed so if I do something like so let's say I want to do uh, the enter raffle test next if I do headers enter raffle like this it'll spit this out automatically copy to my clipboard so I can paste it in here automatically. Now I'm not going to show you how to install this because it's with cargo, it's with rust and you haven't learned anything about rust yet. But if you want to pause the video and you want to go ahead and install this so that you can use it to make these beautiful headers kind of automatically or auto magically, if you will, uh, feel free to do so. Give this repo a star. Uh, I use it all the time to make these really, really nice looking headers in my code. So. If you want to do that, go for it. Otherwise, let's start writing a ton of really awesome tests. So now let's go ahead and start writing some tests here. If we go to our raffle, we really probably want to start with our enter raffle function. And one of the first things we should look at is this, this little bit here. If the message.value isn't enough, it should revert. So we should test that it actually reverts if people don't pay the entrance fee. So we'll say a little bit of a function test raffle reverts when you don't pay enough. Make this public and we're going to follow and we're going to follow the arrange act assert. You don't have to type this out. Uh, you don't type, have to type this out every single time, but I feel like if you do, it can kind of really give you a better feel of the layout of all your tests. So in here, we're going to do a little bit of a VM dot prank. We're going to start with that player and we're going to try to enter this raffle without sending any money. And remember, we learned about expect revert. If you want to go back to the foundry book, you can go check out the expect revert in here. But what we're going to do is a little bit of a VM dot expect revert like this. But we can even be more precise than this. We don't want to just say, hey, we're going to revert. We want to say we are expect to revert with a very specific code. That way we know what we're actually reverting with, right? Maybe we we're reverting, but it's because of something unrelated to what we want, right? And we should do this. So if we go back to our raffle.soul, we see that the revert error that we should get is raffle under uh, raffle underscore underscore send more to enter raffle, right? If we reverted with something like this, we would know, uh oh, like our something's wrong with our logic. We're reverting, but like for the wrong reason. So we want to make sure we're actually reverting with this. Now, kind of similar to how we got the enum, the raffle state up here, we can actually get that error, right? So we did what raffle dot raffle state dot open. We can also do raffle dot, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna copy this this error, send more eat to raffle dot, paste that in here, and then we do dot selector. Now I know I, 
We've mentioned selectors before, and I know we're kind of using it here. For now, just ignore it. Just assume that this works. We will teach you about this selector key and what function selectors are a little bit later in the curriculum. And actually, excuse me, this is act slash assert. Because down here, we can just do raffle dot enter raffle like this. So now we're saying, okay, we're going to pretend to be the player. We're going to expect a revert. And then this VM prank only gets applied to this line because this is another cheat code. So the player is going to enter the raffle without sending any money. And this should revert. We can test this out by writing forge test dash dash MT. In a previous version, I did a lot of dash M foundry updated. And so now it's dash dash MT. And it is this test that we want to run. So paste that in here to just run that single test. And boom, it passes. Awesome. OK, cool. Well, what else do we want to test? OK, well, we want to test that the raffle actually updates, right? The raffle actually adds to this player's array when somebody enters the raffle, right? It would be really bad if this raffle didn't record that people are entering the raffle. So we'll do a little function test raffle records players when they enter public and we'll do a little arrange act assert. So for arrange, we will say vm dot prank will prank the player again. We'll pretend to be the player once more for the act here. We actually do want to enter the raffle correctly. And how do we actually enter the raffle correctly? Well, let's go check here. We need to actually send the entrance fee. Uh, we do know it's open because we've already tested that. So what we can do is we'll do a little raffle dot enter raffle with a value of what we want to send that entrance fee. And guess what? We have that saved up at the top here. So value is going to be the entrance fee and we don't have any parameters for enter raffle. So right, it's just be blank. And then we want to make sure the address player recorded equals raffle dot. Uh, do we have a way to actually get the players in this array? Well, where's this players array? Uh, S players. Do we have a way to get the players in here? No, we don't have a way to get the players in here. S so since we actually don't have a way to get the players, we want to add a function at the bottom to get the players. So we'll say function get players or get player u into 56 index of player external view returns address return S underscore players index of player like this and we can use this. There are some pretty clever ways you can actually get storage or get state variable values without having to do this. However, we don't want to really use those super clever things because we probably want to have a way to get the players in the array anyways. So so that's almost like a good reminder to add these these view functions as we're testing. So uh, raffle dot get player at index zero, right? Because they're going to be the first and only player in the array here. And then we can just say assert player recorded equals equals player. We want to make sure that that's the player who got added in here. Now, if we actually run this, you'll notice that this will fail, right? So if we do we'll grab this address or grab this test, we'll do forge test dash dash MT, paste it in. This will actually fail. And I'll tell you why it'll fail in a second. Hmm, so this is kind of exciting. So can you tell without actually debugging this why this actually failed? Go ahead and take a look, try to figure it out. Go ahead and pause the video if you want, because I'm going to run it again. And now I'm going to add dash V, 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 or however many V's you want to add. And this will give us kind of this output now. And we get this EVM error out of fund. Oh, oh my goodness. Player doesn't have any money. Of course not. We forgot to give them money. So they're trying to enter the raffle with the entrance fee and they are broke. So we'll go ahead and give this player some money. We'll scroll up into our setup and we'll do another cheat code here called VM.deal. And we'll say we're going to deal the player that's starting player balance. So we said, hey, we're going to start them off as being super rich. And then we didn't give them a starting player balance. So VM.deal says we're going to pay player 10 Ether. And so they will automatically just get 10 Ether for all of these tests. Now, if we go ahead and clear this out, we rerun that test. It should pass because they now have money. And ta-da, we do now see it's passing. All right, great. Now, Testing events in Foundry is a little bit funky, but we also have this cheat code that we can use called expect emit. And it's a little bit funky and you'll see why. And you can see here, this function takes a bunch of bools, check topic, check topic, check topic, and then check data here. And then we also have expect emit, add or submitter. So there are a couple different ways that we can do this. 
This is the function that we're going to use, right? There's a couple different of these. But if we scroll down, we can kind of see an example of how this works. Let me scroll down here. So down here in the Foundry documentation, we have this test ERC20 emits transfer. And what it does is it does vm.expect emit true, true, false, true. Address my token, and then it actually emits an event. So the syntax here is a little bit odd, but in order to do expect a mint in Foundry, we have to call vm.expect a mint. We say which topics it's going to emit, and we have to say true if it has the topics that are going to be emitted. So topics are going to be your indexed events here. So right, remember you can only have three indexed events. So if you had three of them, like address index player, address indexed or index something else address index something else. If we had three in here, we would have this be true, true, true. And this third Boolean is for any uh, additional data, right? Anything that's not an indexed event. And then the address of the thing that should emit the event. So it's a little odd, but the more indexed events you have, the more trues you had, right? If we had no indexed events and we just had this address player here, it would be false, 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 true, just for data. If we had nothing in here at all. It would just be false, 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 false. And then the address of many of the events. You'll see what I mean as we go through this. Uh, I know it's a little bit confusing right now. But we do this expect emit, and then we emit the actual event. We are expecting that it emits. And then if this exact event is emitted in the next call, it will return true, other fault, otherwise false. So let's go ahead and add this to the test, and then we'll I'll show you two examples here, right? So we're going to do the same thing here. here. We're going to do vm.prank. We're going to act here. We're going to do vm.expect emit. We're going to say true, false, 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 address, raffle. And we're saying true, false, false, true, false, 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 because if we go back to the raffle, the event that we're going to emit here, raffle entered, address indexed player. This player here is an index parameter, and it's the first index parameter. So we're going to say true. There's no additional index parameters, and there's also no non-indexed parameters. So we're going to say false to the rest. We're going to say it's the raffle that's actually going to be emitting this. And then what we can do is we want to actually emit that exact event here. Now, what's kind of annoying is we actually have to copy paste our events into the top of our tests here. And that's just kind of the only way it works. So we have to copy paste it. We'll do emit raffle entered player player like this. And this is us telling Foundry, hey, we're expecting to emit an event. This is exactly the event that we're expecting to emit here. And then we'll actually do the call. So we'll do raffle dot enter raffle, and then they need to send some value. So value is going to be entrance fee like this. And now if we run this, do forge test dash dash MT, paste that in, we'll see that this does indeed pass. Now, for example, if I were to change this to like address zero, the event that we emitted here is going to be different than the event that gets emitted here. So if we try to run this with forge test dash dash MT, paste that in, dash one, two, three, let's do four Vs. And we run this now, you'll see we got a little error here. It'll say reason log does not equal expected log. We can see kind of in here that when we called expect emit like this, uh, we ended up emitting this raffle entered with player with this address here. And then when we called enter raffle, the player address was different, so it failed, right? And then obviously it failed because we emitted our own wrong custom player. Awesome. So events aren't types like enums or structs. So we actually have to do this. I'm hoping in the future we can actually just import them kind of same as we did with the structs, right? Like down here, we did like raffle.rafflestate.open. We can't do raffle. You know, with the parameters in here for some reason. Uh, I'm expecting that to change in the future. And voila, let's keep going. And okay, you know what, let's actually, let's write a test for this after all. So let's go ahead, let's do one more test here. We'll do function test don't allow players to enter while raffle is calculating public like this. And then we'll do arrange act assert like so. So for our range, we're gonna do vm.prank player 
we want to test that this error is going to trigger. And what we can do to make sure this is calculating is we can go ahead and we will actually call perform upkeep, right? Because perform upkeep actually sets this to calculating. So we will have to kind of update the time, make sure some players have entered, blah, 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 so that this check here will at least pass. And then we'll call perform raffle, excuse me, perform upkeep, which will set this to calculating. And then while this is calculating, they shouldn't be able to enter in the raffle, right? Because we have this check here. So we want to make sure that happens. So first we can go through this list of things we need to check to uh, make sure that this perform upkeep will pass. Cause right, cause right now we have, if upkeep not needed, it's going to revert. So we need to make sure we can have upkeep needed. So uh, we need to have some players and it needs to have a balance. So the first thing we can do is we'll do raffle dot enter raffle. We'll do value of entrance fee. Okay, cool. So that means that we're going to have a balance. We're going to have some players. Raffle state will start as open. And now we're going to need to make sure some time has passed. Okay, uh, how do we do that? Do we just like wait? Do we just like sit here and like wait? Do we just like go to bed? Do we like just take a break, go to the gym and then come back and hopefully enough time has passed that this will be updated? Well, this is where we can actually use some more Foundry cheat codes. And in particular, we can use vm.warp and vm.roll. So if we go back to the Foundry book, we can look up vm.warp or, or vm.roll. We can look up vm.warp in here, and we can see that this cheat code called warp will set the block.timestamp. So this is how we can automatically change the block.timestamp to whatever we want it to be. So that's what we're going to first do. So we want to make sure that enough time has passed. So the block.timestamp minus the last timestamp is greater than or equal to the interval. Well, what do we set the interval into our helper config here? Interval is going to be 30 seconds. We're going to need to move our locally running blockchain, right? Whenever we run a test suite, we kind of get a fake blockchain running in the background. We're going to need to move its block time a bit. So what we can do is we can say vm.warp block.timestamp, so the current timestamp, plus that interval plus one, so that it's guaranteed to be one later than how long it needs to be. So this is going to be the current block plus 30 seconds plus one second. Boom. We should now be past that interval, past that deadline for this to work. And then I also like to do this kind of as a best practice. You don't always have to do this, but I like to do this. Uh, we're going to do this vm.roll. So roll is another cheat code that you can use in Foundry, and this will change the block.number. I like to always roll it by the current block.number plus one. And the reason for this is this will really simulate, okay, the time has changed, and then also it's there's one new block has been added. So I like to do both of these to make sure this actually uh, makes sense. So now that we've entered the raffle, the time has passed, the block has actually incremented. I can now do raffle dot perform upkeep and pass in nothing. And hopefully this should pass. And if this does pass, right, it'll call perform upkeep. It'll kick off a Chainlink VRF request here. And since this is just our mock, like we can kind of ignore everything that happens in here. But what will happen is it will set the raffle state to calculating. So then now if we try to enter the raffle, it should revert, right? So we can go back, we can do another one of those vm.expect reverts we can scroll up okay this is the syntax let me just grab this copy that we'll paste it down here so we'll do vm.expect revert and this is actually act slash assert here so vm.expect revert raffle dot oh it's not going to be send more eth it's going to be what what's the error going to be uh it's going to be raffle not open here if they try to enter so it's going to be raffle not open dot selector same there we'll do vm.prank make sure that we are the player and then we'll do raffle dot enter raffle value is going to be the entrance fee like so cool so let's try to give this a whirl forge test dash dash mt paste it in and hmm and we get this error invalid consumer oh no what's what's this that's that's not what we expected we expected to get raffle not open and this is why it's important to actually put the correct error in here Huh, so we get that error. Well, let's let's run this again, but let's add a couple of dash VVVVs on here and let's let's see what's going on here. 
Oh, it looks like our perform upkeep is failing. Okay, so let's dive into this. Why is this perform upkeep failing? I'll tell you right now though, these are correct. So good job adding vm.warp and vm.roll. So if we run this again, like a, like we just did with the with the Vs in here, we see that perform upkeep fails for some reason with this invalid consumer. And so in our test here, it's actually this line that's bugging out. So we need to fix something with perform upkeep. Why are we not able to call perform upkeep? And here's where this is why we do this methodology that I showed you before. This is why we do raffle underscore underscore and then the name of the error. This invalid consumer is actually an error that some contract is throwing. Now, it's not immediately obvious what contract is throwing this error because it doesn't have the name of the contract before it, right? So, so whoever wrote this code, which reverted with this invalid consumer, could have given us a much more helpful error code by actually having the prefix with the name of the contract before this. So, so like I've been telling you, just by you taking this course, you're actually better than a lot of these smart contract developers out there today. We can see kind of in the foundry debugger bit up here though, we can see, ah, it's the VRF coordinator. So perform upkeep is gonna call our VRF coordinator mock, which is gonna call request random words. And it looks like it's in here that we're gonna get this invalid consumer. So we could do like a search just for this invalid consumer, right? We could look up like error invalid consumer. We could hit these three dots. We could say, okay, let's look in like the lib. And we can see, oh, okay, this error is kind of all over the place. There's a whole lot of these, but we can kind of tell just by looking at this piece of code right here that it's probably gonna be this VRF coordinator V2 mock that is throwing this invalid consumer error. So if we go in here and we look up this request function, right? Because what, what's the function we're calling in a raffle? We're calling um, request random words. So let's look for this request random words. We could actually kind of go through this and debug this code a little bit. Non-reentrant, only valid consumer. And we can just look up like revert, invalid, invalid consumer, invalid consumer. It looks like there's this modifier, only valid consumer. And this is on the request random word. So this is probably where this is coming from, right? It's probably reverting here. And for some reason, we're getting this revert because our consumer is not added, whatever that means. And this is actually a little bit more information about working with Chainlink VRF. So if you watch the videos with Richard, you knew that at some point you actually had to create a subscription and then add a consumer. So if you look at the build with VRF 2.5 in the documentation, there's a section called create and manage subscriptions. So you both have to create your own subscription to work with Chainlink. VRF, but you also have to add a consumer. And then you can do this programmatically, or you can do this via the UI or the website that the Chainlink VRF codebase gives you. And the reason that they have this is so that random people or random contracts can't use your subscription. You should be the only one who uses your subscription. I mean, you're paying for it, right? So we actually need to update our deploy raffle script so that when we deploy our contract here, we actually have a valid subscription and we have a valid consumer and we're correctly added to that consumer so that we don't get this weird invalid consumer error anymore. So we're going to have to uh, update our deployment process here. And this is why it's so important that you do test your deployment process, because this would be really annoying if you did this whole test and then you started trying running your lottery and it stopped working and you were like, oh my gosh, I forgot to add a consumer. So we're gonna update our script here so we can have this consumer so that everything will just work. Now we could 100% do this all via the UI. We could deploy this to a test net and just manually have to remember to do stuff, but that's not great. We really want to reduce the amount of manual work we do as much as possible because the more manual steps we have, the more we have a possibility of introducing a bug. We wanna make sure we get everything right so we don't introduce bugs. Doing that is very bad. <laughs> we want to work, as I've said many times, we want to work very hard to be very lazy. And we want to, we also want to work very hard so that we can introduce as few bugs as possible. So we're going to refactor our deploy raffle so that we add this valid consumer so that we can run this test programmatically and so that we can run this test and have this test work. So there's a few things we need to do to refactor this, but let's go ahead and start the refactor. So in order for us to add a subscription, right, to add a consumer, we can go to the VRF subscription manager, create our own subscription, and then we would, there a giant button would pop up called add consumer, and we would get our little subscription from doing that. If I did have a active subscription, kind of like what you see here, we would get this add consumer button. 
we would add a consumer and we paste it in here and boom, we'd have a consumer. However, if we start off as blank, we would need to first get a subscription, right? So like on the UI, we would need to, you know, create subscription by pressing this button over here. But we can also do this programmatically so that all our tests can work automatically. So in our helper config, right, let's go over to our, our helper config. We have this subscription ID set to zero. So what we can do is we can set up our code to say, hey, if you see subscription ID of zero, then you should programmatically create a new subscription and add a consumer automatically so our, all of our tests can work. So what we can do then is in our deploy script here, before we actually start this broadcast here, what we can do is we can say if config.subscriptionID equals equals zero, then, then we should create subscription. Now we could go ahead and put all the code for creating a subscription in here, or what we could do is we could create that new interactions file and put it all in there and import them here. And that'll make our code a little bit more module. And then, if, and then if in the future we want to programmatically create more subscriptions, we can just do it right from the command line. So I'm gonna create a new file called interactions.s.sol, and we're gonna create a new contract in here called create subscription so that we can programmatically create a subscription. We're also going to add an add consumer piece in here. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's do this MIT 0.8.19 contract create subscription is script like this. That means we're going to have to import. Let me zoom in a little bit. Import script from forge std slash script dot soul like oops like this now in our foundry fund me when we created our you know contract fund me fund fund me which the naming there was amazing i know uh, we had to actually first get the most recently deployed contract and then we had to do some stuff with it and put everything in the run we're going to kind of follow the same process here except for we don't need to get the most recent deployment so we are going to create a function called run function run because when we do our scripting this is what needs to be called however once again we're going to modularize this with creating a new one called function create subscription and i'm going to go even one step farther we're going to call this create subscription using config public returns uint 56 uint or public like this and our run function, all it's gonna do is call create subscription using config. Now, in order for us to actually create the subscription, back in our helper config, right, we have this VRF coordinator address. And this VRF coordinator, or even the mock, they both have a create subscription function. If I go back to the UI, I'll go ahead and connect here. Yeah, let's go ahead and connect here. If I go ahead and click create subscription, you know, there's a bunch of stuff that will show up. I'll just go ahead and hit create subscription. In here, we can see on vref.chain.link, I'm calling this address, calling this create subscription function. And I know we've done a little bit of work, only a little bit of work with cast, but I can actually check to make sure that's the function that I'm expecting. I can do cast sig create subscription, make sure the hex is the same. I get a21a23e4. If I go back over here, I see a21a23e4. Aha, I'm gonna reject it for now. But that is going to be the function that we're going to call. We're going to call this create subscription function on the VRF coordinator. We know that we're calling that create subscription function on the front end. We can also call that programmatically in our deploy scripts, or I guess more correctly in our interaction scripts now. Now, let me, let me pull this back up and, and just copy this for a second. Oftentimes, you're actually not going to know what the hex that pops up in your MetaMask stands for even or even does. But there are these things called function signature or function selector databases out there. And one of them is openchain.xyz, XYZ, where if you go to this website and we go to signature database, if you paste in a function selector and search, it has a database of different hashes or hex data and the name of the function associated with it. So you can actually see in openchain.xyz, this hex is associated with create subscription. Now these databases only work if somebody actually updates them. Now Foundry has a really cool way to automatically push them and automatically update them here. 
I'm not going to show you how to do that, but if you want to explore some more via the Foundry docs, I encourage you to do so. And I know I'm not really explaining these functional signatures and these functional selectors right now, but I promise you later on in the curriculum, we will do so. So exactly the same as how the VRF website was going to call this function, we are going to call that function in our script here. And to do that in our create subscription using config here, we're first going to say, okay, helper config, helper config equals new helper config like this. And that means we need to import the helper config from script slash helper config dot s dot soul like this. And then we're going to need to get from this helper config, we're going to need to get this VRF coordinator address. So we're going to say helper config dot get config. And this is going to return the network config for the active network, right? Because if we go back to helper config, we call get config. Where is get config? Where to put it? Get config. It automatically gets the config by chain ID, which does this chunk up here. So we'll call get config. And on this, we could do dot VRF coordinator like so. And this would actually, instead of returning this whole config, it would just return the VRF coordinator, which is really all we want. So we could say, we could do like address VRF coordinator equals helper config dot get config address helper config dot get config dot VRF coordinator. And then what we could do is we could go ahead and create the subscription in here, but I actually want to put it in its own function so that it's a little bit easier and more modular for later. So I'm going to create another function called create subscription, which is going to take an address VRF coordinator as an input parameter. It'll be a public and these will all return some stuff, but uh, I'll show you in a little bit. So we're going to have this create subscription using config call create subscription with that VRF coordinator. And that's going to call this down here. And now I want this to do some console logging to kind of help me tell what's going on. So we'll import this console and technically you should import console two. That's the latest and greatest, but we could just do console if we want. And we could say console.log creating subscription on chain ID and then comma block uh, dot chain ID like this. Then we'll do a little VM dot start broadcast. Oh, thanks. Get up copilot. Then we'll say you into 256 sub ID equals. And if we go into the VRF coordinator v2 mock, we could look for create subscription and we could find that it's actually not in here. It's instead in this subscription API. We can look for create subscription. This is the function that it gives us and it's going to return the UN256 sub ID. So in our interaction here, we're going to say UN256 sub ID equals. And we need to grab that import VRF coordinator v two underscore five mock from at chain link. Actually, let's just go back to the helper config. Where is that? I'm going to just copy paste this in here. Boom. Very nice. Chain link contracts, SSC, V0 rate, VRF mocks, V coordinator, VRF coordinator, V two five mock. That's all. Now sub ID equals the VRF coordinator, V two underscore five mock at address VRF coordinator dot create subscription like this and then vm dot stop broad broadcast like this and now we actually do have a sub id so just running this chunk of code would be equivalent to going to the website and pressing create subscription all right great so then we can do a little console.log your subscription id is and then do comma sub id like this console.log Please update the subscription ID in your helper config.s.sol. Because we're going to want to use this sub ID in our test, we're going to have this a uint 256, and we're also going to want to have it return the address of this coordinator mock as well. So we're going to have it return an address too. So then we'll just say return sub ID VRF coordinator like this. And then I'm going to copy this line, paste it up here, copy this, paste it up here. We'll have our create subscription using config also return both of these. And this will need to be, uh, this will be the UN256 sub ID comma blank. We'll just leave it blank for now. 
we're just going to get the sub ID equals create subscription. Boom. And that looks pretty good to me. Cool. And just for a sanity check, we'll do a little forge build. Okay, nice. So now that we have all this create subscription scripts, all this automation here, we can now take this create subscription contract in our interactions.s.sol, come back to our deploy raffle. We'll import it. We'll say import create subscription from script slash interactions.s.sol like this. And we'll say create subscription create subscription and i know this might be a little bit confusing so we could call it like create um uh, we call it like a subscription contract or, or whatever you want to call it i'm just going to call mine create subscription create subscription equals new create subscription just going to copy paste that and then what we can do is we can call in our interactions we can call the create subscription function using the vref coordinator and the reason i kind of modularize this like this is so that we could either we could pass in our own vref coordinator or we could just use whatever the default in the config is so so that we're extra explicit i want to use the exact same address that is going to be used in this test here so i'm going to say create subscription dot create or what's the name of the function dot create subscription i know that's definitely confusing create subscription dot create subscription with config dot vrf coordinator so we're going to use the exact same address that's that we're using for our test suite and for our deployment here and this will go ahead and create a subscription like this okay nice and of course we're going to want to get the subscription from this so we'll do a little colon equals and we could set it we'll say the config dot subscription or uh, config.subscription id comma config.vrf coordinator equals this. So now we're actually saving. So this returns, right, a unit 56 and an address, the sub ID and the VRF coordinator. So we're now saving our new subscription ID to our config here. So we're now saving it like this. We're also saving the VRF coordinator. And now we will have the config.subscription ID not be zero. It'll be whatever the new subscription ID is. Now we do have to do another step, which is actually going to be called fund subscription because we also need to add a consumer. But I do just want to show you kind of what the full flow looks like. So if I'm on the vrf.chain.link, I'm on Sepolia new. So this is basically a new create subscription place. I can go ahead and hit create subscription. My MetaMask is going to pop up. I can go ahead and check. I'm calling create subscription on this VRF coordinator address on Sepolia. I'm going to go ahead and confirm because I have some Sepolia. You do not have to follow along with me here. And in fact, I recommend that you don't because you're going to have to wait a long time for transactions to go through. At some point, we're going to update all of our curriculum here with something called virtual test nets so that nobody ever has to deal with getting fake faucet funds anymore. So now that we've actually created a subscription, we also want to just sign this to basically sign in. And we now have a subscription created. If you go ahead and select add funds, I'm actually going to select, I'll do this later. Uh, I'm going to do, I'll do this later for consumer as well. You can see in here that when I'm connected, I can actually scroll down and I can see that I have a new subscription here on Ethereum Sepolia. And here's the subscription ID that I was just created. So this subscription ID that it gives me here in my subscription piece is going to be the same as, well, it's going to be the same as if I, like if we said, if we just called create subscription from our scripting and gave us a subscription ID here. So then in order to use the subscription, I would need to actually fund this with link. So if I go to my wallet, let me just check to make sure I have some link in here. I do have some testnet link, but if you don't, you can go to faucets.chain.link and you can pretty much always get some testnet link here. Let's go ahead and connect wallet. I'm going to go get some testnet link. I could also look for ETH with some added additional verification, but let's go ahead, verify I'm human. Let me get some testnet link. This will give me 25 testnet link on Sepolia. And then I'm gonna have to wait a little bit. And like I said, you do not have to do this with me because you're gonna have to wait a whole bunch of transactions, but it's good to kind of see what the UI looks like so that when we go to script it out, it'll make sense kind of what this looks like if it was on the website. And awesome, we have the tokens transferred.
Now in the next lesson, we're going to talk about these ERC20 tokens and these different types of tokens. But for now, if you get the if you did follow along and you did get the 20 test ETH, if you open your up if you open up your MetaMask, you won't see it in here. ERC20 and ERC677 and different types of smart contract based tokens actually are contracts on blockchains as well. And what we need to do is we need to go to docs.chain.link, getting started, scroll down to link token contracts, scroll down to Sepolia testnet, and we could copy this address. You can also just hit this add to wallet button, but we could copy this address, roll up to our MetaMask, hit import tokens, paste it in there for the Sepolia testnet, add custom tokens, import tokens. And now we can see we have Sepolia ETH and we have Lincoln here. So this is just us needing to tell our MetaMask where to look for these different cryptocurrencies. Since there are so many, it's not going to just be defaulted with any, and anybody can create a cryptocurrency. So we need to actually import them and tell MetaMask, hey, can you look at the balance of this token? So now that we have that, on our front end here, we'll do a little refresh. We can see our subscription is active. Let's go to Actions, Fund Subscription. Let's put in three for now, confirm. I'm not actually going to run this. I'm just doing this to see, oh, okay, well, what's the, what's the function being called? Okay, it's this transfer and call function that's being called on, interestingly enough, on the link token contract. So if we go to this contract, it's actually the link token contract that we're calling transfer and call on, not on our VR app or, or anything like that. We're actually transferring tokens to the subscriptions contract and we're calling transfer call on our contract to do so. I'm actually not going to call it. We're going to we're going to do this programmatically and you'll see that our balance right now is zero, but we're going to write a script in Solidity to add link to our ID here. So kind of like what we were seeing there on the UI and learning about these different tokens, we've created a new scription, but now we need to do what? We need to fund it. So you already know, we're going to go back to our interactions here and we're going to create a new contract called fund subscription. Same as what's above. This is going to be a script here. Zoom in just a little bit. And you know, we're going to need a function run, which will be public or external or whatever you want it to be. And then we're also probably going to need a function description using config. And we'll just make this public or excuse me, function. So we're going to need to create a uint256 public constant fund amount. And for us, we'll just set this to be three ether, which is going to equal to three link, right? Because link also kind of runs with this 18 decimal places thing. Now, in order for us to fund our subscription, we're going to need a couple of things. We're going to need that VRF coordinator V2. We're going to need our subscription ID. And then additionally, we are actually going to need the link token, which we haven't worked with quite yet. So I'm actually going to scroll up and I'm going to copy this whole bit, right? Well, not this whole bit, this bit right here, bring it down, paste that in here. So we are going to need the VRF coordinator address, but we're also going to need the subscription ID, subscription ID. And remember back in our deploy contract now, we're actually saving our config.subscription ID we're actually saving the subscription ID to our config object. So this here, if we're looking for our subscription ID, it'll be that new updated subscription ID. Oh, what's it mad about? Oh, excuse me. This needs to be a uint256. And we're going to need the link token because it's the link token that we're actually making the transaction call to. So if we go back to our helper config, we're going to need to add a link token. So for Sepolia, this is pretty easy. We can just do a little comma and we can just say link. And then we go back to the chain link docs, docs.chain.link. Let's go look for, we can see faucets here. Let's go back to docs.chain.link. Let's go over to get started. We can look for the link token contracts page, which is right here. We'll scroll down to Sepolia and okay, we can just grab this or press the copy button here and boom. We now have a link token piece in here. Oh, we're getting this red line because we got to go up. We have to add the address link in here like so. So now we need to go down and we need to fix our local network config as well. For our local network, we're going to have to deploy our own fake link token. Now I'm going to teach you about ERC 20s and how to work with tokens and what they do a little bit later. But for the moment, if you just go to the Foundry full course 
F23. If you go to the, uh, let's scroll down a little bit. Where are we? Foundry, smart contract lottery. Let's go into the smart contract lottery here. Get an SRC. We'll go to test in here. We'll go to mocks. We'll have this link token dot soul. You can actually just go ahead and copy this whole thing. And this is the code base that we're going to use. So uh, don't worry about really what this is doing quite yet. You'll learn more about ERC20s a little bit later. So just in our test folder, we're going to create a new folder called mocks. And in here, new file, we'll call it link token dot soul, paste it in. Now, the only other thing is we're actually importing this ERC20 from this other package called soulmate tokens dot soul, or excuse me, dot, uh, called soulmate. So if we look up soulmate GitHub, we'll actually come to see this GitHub here. As of recording, I'm working with V6 of this code base. So we're going to install this exact code base so that this works. So I'm going to do a little forge install transmissions 11 slash soulmate. I'm going to copy paste it at V6 dash dash no dash commit like this. And we're going to go ahead and install this. Cool. Looks like it was done. And then in our foundry.toml, I need to update this so that we know about this soulmate thing. So we'll say at soulmate equals, uh, it's going to be lib slash soulmate slash SRC like this. And now if we go back to our ERC20, it looks like it's compiling fine. Looks like this is compiling fine. Okay, cool. And so this is going to be our mock link token contract that we use. Like I said, this is just for testing for us here. And if it doesn't have this function, we're going to add a little function called mint address two. It should have this function by the time you get here. <laughs> UN256 value public. And we'll just call mint two comma value. And this way we can just mint ourselves link token for our test, right? It's a test. It's all good. We can do whatever we want with our tests. So, and in our mock, our helper config, we're now going to want to deploy this mock link token, right? And then we're going to use that for our test. So we'll go ahead and import link token token from it's going to be test slash mocks slash link token dot soul. And same as what we did for a mock Chainlink VRF down here. So kind of same as what we did for the VRF coordinator mock. We'll now say link token, oops, link token, link token equals new link token like this. And down in our local network, we can say this is again in that get or create Anvil ETH config. We can add this, oh, add a little comma here, link. And we'll say address link token like this. Cool. So now we're deploying a new mock link token. We're getting the link token address in our config here. We just do a quick forge build just to make sure everything is looking peachy hunky dory. And we have some warnings, which is fine, but stuff is compiling. Hooray. And now we can get that address link token equals helper config dot get config dot link like this. And we can finally create this fund subscription where we pass the VRF coordinator, the subscription ID, and then the link token like this, create this new function fund subscription, which will take an address VRF coordinator, the UNT256 subscription ID, and then the address of the link token public like this. Nice. Okay, cool. And of course, our run function is just going to call fund subscription using config. And in here, we're going to actually finally fund that subscription. And then of course, in here, this is where we're going to do a little console.logging. We'll say console.log. We'll say funding subscription. This is where we'll do the subscription ID like this. We'll do a little console log using VRF coordinator with the VRF coordinator address here. Then a console.log on chain ID with the block dot chain ID like this. And this is where we have to do a little bit of funkiness. And I know I've been saying that a few times for this section in particular, but the VRF coordinator mock has this fun little fun subscription function that you can just directly call. 
However, for working with the actual link token, it's the link token that we're going to use this transfer and call function to call instead. So we're going to just say if block dot chain ID equals the local local chain ID, and we can actually get this local chain ID by having our fund subscription be a script and code constants. And we're going to go ahead and import code constants from the helper config. So if block.chainID is the local chain ID, we'll do a little vm.start broadcast so that this will work on Anvil. We'll say brf coordinator v2 underscore five mock brf coordinator fund subscription. And then we'll pass the subscription ID and the fund amount like this and then vm.stop broadcast. And that's all we need to do. However, else we're going to get a little bit clever here. We're going to say vm.start broadcast. Uh, and then we need to import the link token in here as well. So we'll do import link token from test slash mocks slash link token token dot so like this. We'll go back here. We'll say link token of the link, what do we call it? Link, link token, oh, link token dot transfer and call. So this is some, uh, this is a special link token function. You'll learn about this much later in the course. Don't worry too much about it right now, but we'll call VRF core denator fund amount. And then we're going to do ABI dot encode subscription ID. So we're going to learn a lot about ABI encoding much later as well. So don't worry about this either. Not understanding it right quite yet. We will learn it later in the course. And then a little vm.stop broadcast. So now to show you running this as a script, I'm actually going to run this and we're actually going to fund that subscription that I just made on the UI here. So if we go back to our subscription details, I have this ID right here. Right now it's funded with zero link. And you can actually fund these with native ETH as well, but we're just going to do exclusively link. I'm going to go ahead and copy. I'm going to go ahead and copy this ID. And all I have to do is just drop this into my helper config for Sepolia. We're going to paste that in here. I know it's kind of a massive number, but this is the beauty of writing these scripts. All I have to do is put the subscription ID in here. And what I can do now is I can run this fun subscription piece here. And since we are not going to be on a local chain, we'll be on Sepolia. We'll do this transfer and call bit here. And just to make sure stuff works, let's do a quick forge build. Great. Like I said, I'm going to run this fun subscription as a script. I don't recommend you do it quite yet because like I said, this will take a while and we really want you to get good at doing everything locally. So I'm just going to show you me running it just to show you that if you were to be doing this on a real testnet or a real mainnet, this is what you would expect to see. And I'm going to show you running this using the dash dash account thing that we learned in the last section instead of the dash dash private key. Because remember, using your private key in plain text is really bad. So we really want to avoid that as much as possible. So to run this script, we first we do need to make a dot env dot env. And whenever we make a dot env, we want to make sure it's in our dot git ignore. So let's just check that real quick. It sure is. OK, great. And in this dot env, though, we're just going to add the Sepolia PC URL equals and this is where you'd add like HTTP HTTPS, you know, alchemy dot blah, 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 whatever and your Sepolia RPC URL. Once you've added that in, you can run source dot AMV like this and what you can do and what we can do if we haven't already, we can do cast wallet import my account dash dash interactive and this is where you'd enter your private key, you'd encrypt it, etc. I already have one in here called default, which is attached to my private key over here. So I'm going to, going to use this encrypted private key instead. And we're going to do forge, forge script, script slash interactions dot s dot soul colon fund subscription. We're going to do dash dash RPC URL sepolia rpc url because we've sourced it from our .env file we're not going to do dash dash private key we're going to do dash dash account and then the name of our account mine is called default 
then we're going to do dash dash broadcast like this and it'll compile oh, and we're getting invalid chain id so and if we go to our helper config let's just make sure we actually have this in here i'm going to zoom out just a little bit one 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 five five one 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 oops wrong chain id there's an extra one in here sorry about that so actually we don't need to do chain id let's just run that again with the correct chain id this time and it worked successfully and now we just have to enter our password which it obfuscates from the terminal which is really nice and boom it's sending this transaction and we didn't have to have our private key in plain text that feels very good so this is actually going to send some link or however much we defined in our fund subscription so let's go back to our uh, interactions.s.sol fund amount we set to three ether aka three link so great it looks like that has actually gone through so back on the ui i'm going to hit cancel i do a little refresh i can scroll down i can see subscription funded with the transaction hash the amount here and i now have a balance of three link in my sepolia subscription awesome so this script is actually working hooray so why are we doing all this <laughs> well if we go back to our raffle test why are we doing all this it's because this is failing and the reason that it's failing is because we had invalid consumer and so we need to set up our raffle contract as a consumer on the vrf so we were just doing all the scripting and all the deployment work that we need to do to get all this set up now sometimes when you're actually coding this stuff you might say hey uh i'm not really going to go down that path and maybe i'm just going to kind of mock everything and do everything kind of a little bit scrappier in the setup just to make it quicker you can 100 do that however if you are going to have some of these scripts it's best to have those scripts directly in your testing process so that you can test and make sure that your scripts also actually do what you want them to do so this is ideally the way that you always move forward like this okay so anyways this was the place that we were failing we were getting invalid consumer we finally created a subscription we funded the subscription and now we just need to add a consumer right on the ui we have no consumers this subscription has no consumers yet and we could add subscription but we're going to do it programmatically so interactions.s.so we're gonna scroll down to the bottom contract add consumer is script like this we're gonna have function run external like this for this one though unlike what we were doing before right where we didn't have to grab a raffle contract we are going to need to grab a raffle contract because when we oh let me go reconnect here when we go to hit add consumer here we have to put in a consumer address so we want to get the most recently deployed raffle contract which again we can find in our broadcast section whenever we deploy something so to get that we're going to use that package again and it's been updated and depending on when you watch this it has been updated to make it a little bit easier to work with so we're going to work with the easier version hooray so what we can do is we can go back to this foundry foundry devops repo that i created from cypherin to actually easily get and work with the most recent deployments so if we're on foundry devops we can scroll down into the documentation here uh, there's all this stuff blah 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 we're gonna do this forge install it's just saying hey we need the most up-to-date forge std which we are using so we're gonna go ahead and copy this page right here just forge install Cypherin Foundry DevOps, no commit. So let's go ahead, paste it in here. Okay, cool. So now we have Foundry DevOps installed. We can skip all this. What we do need to do is update our foundry.toml to have re-permissions to the broadcast folder. So we need to copy this, go to our foundry.toml, foundry.toml, and paste this in here. So this FS permissions means that we're going to give foundry read access to the broadcast folder and read access to the reports folder the previous version of foundry devops had ffi equals true which was kind of the nuclear option which basically gave foundry shell access to do whatever it wanted to do and we want to avoid that as much as possible so saying okay foundry you're only allowed to do read on these two folders that's much safer for users to just kind of blindly use so then what we can do is we can copy this kind of top part here go back to our interactions.sol and we can import this devops tool so it's going to be import devops tools from lib slash foundry devops src devops tool.sol and now that we have this we can also back down in our ad consumer do function add consumer using config we'll make this public we're going to 
copy again, some of the same setup as what we do up here. So I'm just going to grab this bit here. Helper config equals new helper config. Then we're going to say the UN256 sub ID equals helper config, helper config dot get config dot subscription ID. And then we're going to say address brf coordinator equals helper config dot get config dot brf coordinator like this. And we're going to create a new function, function called add consumer, which is going to take an address most recently deployed and actually a couple different things. We're going to take an address contract to add to VRF address VRF coordinator. We don't need most recently deployed. We just need this one, but we do need U256 sub ID. I'll make this public. Sorry, I know this is kind of hard to see. Let me zoom out a little bit. So we're going to have add consumer using config. We're going to pass the some contract to add to VRF. We're going to need to add the VRF coordinator. And then we're also going to need to add the sub ID. We can get the most recently deployed by using our run here. So we'll say address most recent recently deployed equals dev ops tools dot get most recent deployment. It's the raffle contract that we're looking for on block dot chain ID like this. And then we're going to do add consumer using config, but we do have to pass the in this most recently deployed bit here. So that means this needs to have address most recently, recently deployed. And we can pass that into here like so. Okay, so DevOps tools that get most recent deployment, kind of like what we did previously. This is a nice helpful tool it just says, hey, whatever the most recent raffle contract, grab that and use that one to add a consumer. Now for our tests, we're probably going to be directly calling one of these functions, either add consumer using config or add consumer. So now that we have the sub ID VRF coordinator and the contract to add to VRF, we can actually add it here. So we can say console.log adding consumer to VRF coordinator comma VRF coordinator console.log or it's called just let's just say adding consumer contract and we'll use this one here console.log to VRF coordinator comma VRF coordinator like this console.log and we're going to be using on chain ID block dot chain ID like so and then finally VM dot start start broadcast like this VM dot stop broadcast broadcast like this and in here we're going to do VRF coordinator v2 underscore five mock VRF coordinator dot add consumer contract to add to I'll add to VRF this should be capital here add to VRF excuse me it needs to be sub ID comma contract add to VRF so if we look in that mock VRF coordinator v2 mock there should be an add consumer oh no sorry it's in the subscription API which is inherited by it add consumer which takes a sub ID and the consumer okay great and this is going to be calling this function here this should be the exact same as if on the website we were to click add consumer by pasting a consumer address in here so they should work exactly the same okay so we have this okay cool getting exciting we're about to finally get past that issue we can now scroll all the way back up or excuse me go back to our deploy raffle.soul and in here so we're going to deploy this contract but if we don't have a subscription id we're first going to create a subscription then we're going to fund it it's all about to come together here so we got to import fund subscription fund subscription and we even tested this one on an actual test net so now we're going to do fund subscription fund subscription equals new fund subscription like this we'll say fund subscription dot 
fund subscription config dot brf coordinator right because in our whoops in our interactions that us that saw we have this fund subscription function which take a coordinator subscription id and link token so we're going to do coordinator config dot and then config dot link like this now we have to add a consumer oh oh wait uh we oh wait, hold on what's vf coordinator vf coordinator there we go we don't have a consumer yet first we need to deploy the contract and then we're going to need to add a consumer. So in our interactions, we're going to also need to import the add consumer, add consumer. What's it called? Add, add consumer, add consumer. There we go. Add consumer. We're going to import add consumer here. And now we're going to do add consumer, add consumer equals new, add consumer like this. And then we're just going to call add consumer dot add consumer. And what is in this again? Contract to add to VRF coordinator and sub ID. So this is going to be our new raffle contract. The raffle contract needs to be our new address here. And then we need the VRF coordinator. So config dot VRF coordinator. And then finally, what's the last one? Um, it's going to be the sub ID. So then we're going to do config dot subscription ID. Boom. Now we don't need to use a prank don't or a broadcast need to broadcast because in our ad consumer, we already have two broadcasts start and stop in here. So we don't need to do that again. Okay. So now that we've done all of this work, right, we've updated our deploy script so that now it automatically adds a consumer if we do not already have one. This is incredibly exciting. Back in our raffle test, we should see this no longer fail because now it won't give us invalid consumer, right? We should see an expect revert. Oops, with this raffle not open dot selector, we should see it revert with this error here. Back in the raffle, we can scroll up if we go to enter raffle and the raffle state is not open. It should revert with not open. And when we call perform upkeep, it sets it. It goes, hey, call perform upkeep. Boom, we are now calculating. We are no longer open. So when we call this test now, it should successfully revert. Moment of truth. Let's try it. Forge test dash dash MT paste. Let's add a couple of V's just in case it does fail. We're compiling. It's got to run all those new scripts that we just added. We can see the logs that were created from our console.logs because we added dash dash v. We can see it successfully reverted. We can see this revert here, raffle not open. And we can see our test has indeed passed because we have successfully reverted with this time the correct reversion error. Amazing job. Whew. Now, this is exceptionally exciting because we just learned to do this whole deployment process, right? With funding it, adding a subscription, adding a consumer, all of this, all in one single function call, all in one deployment process. This is, and then, you know, well, excuse me, actually, obviously you're gonna need to do deploy contract here <laughs> inside of your run if you were to run this as a script. But in any case, what's so exciting about this is you are learning really practical, really powerful DevOps skills that, like I said, a lot of the current environment, a lot of the current developers don't actually have. So you should feel incredibly proud of yourself at this point. At this point, I would love you to give yourself a little pat on the back. Go for a break, go take a walk, maybe go get some ice cream, maybe go to the gym, get a pump in. But you should be very excited with yourself for getting this far. I know that was a lot to take in. Feel free to pause, kind of fiddle with some of the code that you just wrote, try to tinker with this, see if you can get it to do something else. But just by us doing all that work and getting this test to pass, you should be very proud of yourself. If you are a little confused about any of this, be sure to go over to Cypher and Updraft, right? We want to go back to the Cypher and Updraft, go back to the GitHub resources in the GitHub resources. Be sure to jump into the discussion, ask some questions if there's anything that wasn't clear, or maybe just take some time to go answer some other people's questions, right? Because now you've got a ton of knowledge and maybe there's somebody else who has come along the way who you want to give a hand to and maybe be a TA to as well. So I'm going to tell you now is the time to take a mandatory break. I'll see you soon.
All right, welcome back. Oh, we did actually take a break because we're going to continue writing these tests. We've just learned a ton and built actually most of the code that we need to build. But if we do a bit of a forge coverage here, we see what our coverage looks like for our code base. We're going to run all of our tests here and we're going to see, OK, raffle.soul, the code base that we actually care about. We're only really at around 50 percent code coverage. Right. So what's coverage again? It's how many lines of code are actually tested. Now, you don't have to hit 100% test coverage, but that's really what we want to aim for. There's going to be some times where, okay, like writing tests just to write tests is like, ah, oh, cool. I wrote tests just to write a whole bunch of tests, but we really want to be intelligent about how we're writing tests here. Us writing tests actually has already uncovered that we needed to improve our DevOps processes, right? And that when we actually deployed our contracts, there were steps that we might have been missing. So we've actually already learned how to improve our code base just by writing these tests and making sure all the different functionalities work. So we want to keep writing tests. We want to make sure we get this code coverage up a lot higher than it currently is so that we can have some assurance that our code is actually doing what we want it to be doing. If we pull back, if we go back to our raffle contract, We've written a lot of tests for enter raffle. We should probably write some tests for our check upkeep to make sure it actually checks the upkeep at the right time. So what we can do is back in our tests. If you downloaded the headers project headers, check upkeep like this, we can do a little boop, paste it in here like this. If you didn't download this, then you can just create your own little delimiter as you please. There's obviously a number of different tests we need to write here. We should check to see if enough time has passed, if it's actually open, if it has balance players, blah, blah, et cetera. So let's go ahead and rapid fire some of these tests out. So let's actually make sure that we always have some type of balance and that check upkeep will return false if we don't have balance. So we'll do function test check upkeep returns false if it has no balance, balance public. And we'll do a range. We'll want to do kind of similar to what we did before, where we actually do roll the blockchain so at least all of this is valid. So I'm actually just going to copy paste this down here, increase the block time and the block number. But we are not going to enter the raffle, right? We're not going to call enter raffle here. So it should return false. So now we're going to do our act, which is going to be bool up, oops, up, keep needed comma equals raffle dot check up keep like this and then our assert which is going to be assert not upkeep needed like this or bang upkeep needed right so let's go ahead and test this forge test dash dash mt paste that in and that was successful okay great all right what's next we probably want to test that this check upkeep returns false if the raffle is not open. OK, so we'll do that as well. So we'll do a little function function test check up keep returns false if raffle isn't open public. So now that we've kind of gone through this whole process of figuring out how to close the raffle and get into that calculating state, we can actually just copy most of this up here for the arrange step. So we'll prank a player. We'll enter the raffle, we'll change the block time, we'll change the block number, we'll call perform upkeep, and this should close the raffle. So now we can do act. This is going to be the same thing. Bool upkeep needed, comma equals raffle dot check upkeep with blank data. And then for our assert, assert, we're gonna assert bang up keep needed like this. And we can test this as well. Forge test dash dash MT, paste it in. And great, that has passed as well. Now, as we're coding along, right, just doing kind of that coverage port, it might be a little unclear how much more that we need to do. So if we want to get a better idea of what steps we have to take, what lines of code we haven't covered yet, we can actually do forge coverage dash dash report debug like this. And this will actually do that same forge coverage bit, except this time it'll give us a coverage report. It'll tell us what lines in our test suite we have not actually used yet. So what I like to do though, is I like to hit up a couple times here, actually pipe this out. So this little carrot thing is a pipe thing and I, and we'll pipe it out to like a coverage.txt file. And so what this will do is 
once it's finished running we'll wait a little bit wait a little bit for it to do everything is it'll create a new file over here called coverage.txt and it'll have all the output of that terminal command and we can see different sections in here that give us information about what lines are not covered so it talks about script deploy raffle we don't care about that we don't care about helper config we don't care about interactions well maybe we do a little bit but we mostly care about raffle.soul and it gives us different functions and line numbers that we don't have any test for yet so we can see function blank okay that's a little odd but on line 65 let's go in here let's look for line 65 one two three 65 okay that's the constructor ah okay yeah we probably should check to see that all of our setting in the constructor is actually being set correctly ah okay that's a good point okay what else uh, okay and usually I just kind of like skim for the line numbers. Okay, line 73, where's line 73? Uh, oh yeah, okay, I entrance fee equals entrance fee. Yep, we have not checked that this entrance fee is correct. Okay, 74, 75, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, got it, so function blank, this is gonna be the constructor. Okay, cool, so we haven't checked for all these variables in the constructor. Okay, makes sense. Uh, what else? So there's line 80 uh okay cool we have line 129 and line eight let's look at line 129 let's see what's down there line 129 ah okay if upkeep not needed revert we are not checking we don't have a test that checks this revert yet okay good point what are the lines line 130 okay that's still part of that line 130 line 152 okay what's on line 152 let's scroll down Ah, okay, sure, we haven't checked fulfill random words yet. And so this will give you a good idea of, hey, here are the lines that have not been tested yet. So we can go through this kind of one by one, making this smaller and smaller uh, so that we can get that coverage that we need for raffle.soul. So going through this, we could write a lot more tests, right? I'm not gonna write all the tests here, but I encourage you to try to write some more tests and figure out if you can get the test coverage up. That's gonna be your homework, if you will, right? There's gonna be a whole bunch more tests that we need to write that we haven't written yet, right? So this is gonna be your challenge, right? And you don't need to make a PR to the GitHub repo associated with this course. You don't need to do anything. This is really for you and see if your coverage goes up when you write this, right? You're probably gonna to wanna to write a test, check, upkeep, returns, returns false, if enough time has passed. You're probably gonna to wanna to write a test, check, upkeep, returns, true when parameters are good and I actually have written these already they are in the github repo associated with this course if you want to go and check to see what I wrote for them feel free but this is your kind of challenge here to go and write some more of these tests for check upkeep so just for check upkeep we are actually going to walk through some of the perform upkeeps together but if you want to go ahead and pause the video take the time to actually challenge yourself and write the test yourself i encourage you to do so and then you can check the github repo for the answers all right welcome back we're going to write some perform upkeep tests these are going to get a little bit more interesting because we have to do some very specific things here and then we're finally going to do the fulfill random words tests which are going to be the most interesting if you have installed the headers perform upkeep if you have installed the headers tool go ahead and create that little delimiter. Otherwise, do whatever you please to create a delimiter here. And let's write a couple of perform upkeep tests where we will learn some new tooling along the way. So one of the things we absolutely want to make sure of is that perform upkeep is only called if check upkeep is true. So we can create a function there. Function, function, test perform upkeep can only run if check upkeep is true. Make this public. We'll do a little arrange, as you know. Do a vm.prank of the player. We'll need to enter the raffle. Actually, I'm just gonna copy all this because this is all some important information that we need to do. We're gonna enter the raffle with an entrance fee, update the block time, the block number, and we're actually not gonna call perform upkeep. But instead, we're gonna do is act slash assert. And this is where we're gonna say raffle.perform upkeep like this. Now with Foundry, this is a way for us to test if this actually went through, right? If this function errors, excuse me, if this function errors, this test will actually fail. Technically, there is a slightly better way to do this where we do like raffle.call and we kind of pass like 
ABI dot encode data, blah, 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 blah. And then like bool success comma. This is some stuff you'll learn much, much later. And then we do like assert success. But for now, there's some stuff you haven't learned quite yet. So for now, we're just going to say raffle dot perform upkeep upkeep like this. So later on, we'll teach you kind of the better way to test these like this. But for now, just do raffle dot perform upkeep. If this fails, then this whole test will fail. So we can actually test this out forge test dash dash MT paste that in and we'll see that this does indeed pass once everything compiles and runs. Great. And if we were to change this, for example, let's not update the block time, right? If I save, this should fail now. Perform upkeep should fail and therefore our test should fail. So if we run this now, we'll see that our test does indeed fail, which is kind of interesting because in this case, I'm kind of testing the test. Okay, cool. It is indeed failing. So great. So we'll put that interval back in. We'll rerun the test and we'll get a positive output so that our tests are actually working. All right, cool. Great. All right, let's keep going. Next, we're probably going to want to test to make sure we actually do this revert here. And how we're going to test this is going to be new because this is the first time we have a revert code where the revert is actually very specific, right? The revert code has all these parameters. So we need to test that this raffle upkeep dot needed is reverting with the correct stuff in the revert area here. So we're going to do function test perform upkeep reverts if check upkeep is false. We'll make this public like so. We'll do a little arrange uh, range. We'll say unit 256 current balance equals zero. We'll say unit 256 num players equals zero. You'll see why I'm doing this in a second. And then we'll do raffle dot raffle state r state equals raffle dot get raffle state. I'm setting these up because these are going to be the parameters that we're going to, need to pass to our error here. So we can actually just jump right into our act slash assert and we can do vm dot expect revert. I'm just going to do this for now, but raffle dot perform upkeep. So we've done vm dot expect revert a couple times here, right up here. We just said raffle dot, you know, the name of our custom error dot selector. Same thing with down here. However, this one has parameters inside. So if we go back to the foundry documentation and we get our expect revert, we can scroll down and we can see an example with a custom error type with parameters. We have to do this thing called ABI dot encode with selector. Once again, we will actually learn this much later, but for now, just kind of blindly follow along. What we're going to do in here is we're going to say VM dot expect revert ABI dot encode with selector we're going to say raffle dot raffle underscore up keep not needed selector and we're going to pass the current balance the number of players and the r state so we want to make sure oh and then no semicolon here so we want to make sure we're reverting with the correct code base upkeep not needed did I spell it? or we're reverting with the right error raffle up keep not needed up keep not needed did I spell raffle wrong raffle dot raffle up oh I missed an underscore okay cool upkeep not needed now it's probably better if we were to maybe enter with a player right if we did like vm dot prank uh, vm dot prank player and then we did like raffle dot enter raffle value value entrance fee now current balance is going to be current balance equals the current balance plus entrance fee oops entrance fee and then the num players equals one now uh, and then we would just you know get rid of that but in any case we can go ahead and test this now so forge test dash dash mt paste it in i'll add a couple of v's on here as well if you want to see kind of the more debugging output here and great. The test went ahead and passed. It reverted with upkeep not needed and the correct parameters here. So that's very exciting. Nice. So we've learned this more explicit way to do our vm.expect reverts now. Nice. So again here, we're just doing the, the custom errors selector here and then the three parameters that go with that custom error, right? Because this had the balance players length and then the raffle state. And that's exactly what we're expecting for in our assert here. 
Now we're going to do something a little bit different here. So we're actually going to refactor this perform upkeep just a little bit so I can teach you something kind of cool. So in our raffle.soul, when we call request random words, this request random words actually returns something called a request ID. So I'm actually going to do a little bit of refactoring. You would 256 request ID like this. And let's actually have this emit an event. So this perform upkeep, we're going to do a little bit of refactoring so that it emits this request ID. So if we scroll up to the top here, we'll create a new event. We'll call it requested raffle winner with a single you went to 256 indexed request ID. And we're going to have our perform upkeep. Let me scroll all the way down here. Perform upkeep. We're going to say emit request ref winner request ID. Now a quick quiz for you, you know, is this redundant? Redundant. If you want to go ahead and figure it out, I will let you pause the video now because I'm going to give you the answer in a few seconds. <laughs> is this redundant? I'm going to tell the answer in three, two, one. Answer is yes. And that's because that our VRF coordinator is also emitting this event. If we go to the VRF coordinator mock, or you can actually go to the VRF coordinator itself, and we scroll down to request, uh, where is it? Uh, request, 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 random, request random words. You can see in here, it has this emit where it, it emits random words requested. And the second parameter here is actually that request ID. So us actually emitting the event here is a bit redundant because now we're emitting the request ID and the Chainlink VRF is emitting the request ID. So we don't have to do this, but I'm going to add this in here just to make some of our tests a little bit easier, make learning a little bit easier here. So we're going to emit this event here. We want to just make sure it's actually working. We'll do a little quick look forge a little build here just to make sure we didn't mess up any of the events that we wrote. And that actually worked. Now, the question I want to ask you this is, what if we need to get data from emitted events into our tests? And the reason that we're asking this is because, guess what? We actually are gonna need to get that. So how do you think we would do that? Well, there is a cheat code for that. So let's create a new test. We'll call it function test perform upkeep updates raffle state and emits request request ID public like so. We'll do a little arrange first vm.player code's getting a little redundant here. I'm going to scroll up a little bit and we're going to copy these three because I don't feel like writing it again. Paste it here. Enter raffle, warp the block. It's going to be warp the block time, roll the block number. Then we're going to get into act here and we're going to call perform upkeep. But what we're going to do is we're going to record all the logs using Foundry and we're actually going to get this request ID by reading these logs in Foundry. And so Foundry has a cheat code called vm.record logs, where this will literally do as what you kind of expect it to do. It'll record logs. So we can see the record logs in the Foundry book here. And you can see kind of an event, uh, you can see kind of an example in the documentation here. And we're gonna draw some inspiration from the docs over here. So we're gonna say vm.record logs, and we're gonna do raffle dot perform upkeep upkeep and calling record logs and then calling raffle dot perform upkeep this vm dot record logs says hey whatever events whatever logs are emitted by this perform upkeep function keep track of those and stick them into an array so then what we can do is we can say vm dot log array and we're gonna have to import this vm thing import vm from forge std slash vm.soul. So we're gonna have to import this uh, kind of special VM thing. I know it's capital and I know these ones are lowercase. This is a super special log here, or this is a super special cheat code, but we're gonna do vm.log array memory entries equals vm.get recorded logs. And what this line is going to do is it's going to say, hey, all of the logs, all of the events that were emitted in perform upkeep, all the ones that were recorded, stick them into this entries array. And then what we can do is we can actually walk through this entries array and grab the different values in it. So inside of this entries array, there's going to be a lot of logs. Now we can actually even see if we go into the vm.soul, yeah, I know this is kind of big, 
we can look for that struct log and we can see kind of what this log struct looks like. It's going to have a bytes32 array of topics. It's going to have the bytes data and then the address emitters. So remember, topics are going to be any indexed parameter in an event. And then bytes data is going to be the combination of all other events, right? So if we want to get our request ID in the raffle, we would just need to find the event or the log that was emitted and then grab the first topic from it. So. What we can do, and if this is a little confusing, this is a great place to kind of pause, do some console.logging and seeing what is actually being emitted here. But what we can do is we can say bytes32 request ID because everything in these logs is gonna get stored as a bytes32 request ID equals entries one dot topics one. So uh, the first log that gets emitted actually is gonna be from the VRF itself. So that would be like entry zero. That would be from the VRF coordinator. We're gonna go for entry one. Our event is gonna come after the VRF coordinator. And we're using topic one instead of topic zero because the zero with topic is essentially always reserved for something else. And you'll learn about that later, or you can look more into logs yourself. It's not super important. But basically we have this request ID. And so what we can do now with this request ID, now that we've recorded it from the logs here, so we can go into our assert mode assert and we could say raffle dot raffle state full state raffle state equals raffle dot get state like this and we can type cast this bytes 32 request id to a un256 and we can say assert un256 request id is greater than zero so we're just asserting hey just make sure there was a request ID that's not blank or asserted somewhere. And we can also say assert the raffle state equals equals, or excuse me, assert the u into 256 raffle state equals equals one. So we're making sure we get a request ID and we're making sure we get this request ID when the raffle state is actually converted. So this is a pretty advanced test here. Let's give it a try. So we'll do forge test dash dash MT paste it in here dash one, two, three, four. And we'll let this run. And awesome, this does indeed pass here. And if we look at kind of the logs that were created here, if we see this VM dot get recorded logs, we can see the whole list of arrays in here. This is the first one. This is the second one, the arrays of these logs, right? So this, this first one in this array, this is going to be the log emitted by the Chainlink VRF contract. And this is going to be the log emitted by us, right? So it has it has one, two topics. The first topic, like I said, being reserved. The second topic being that request ID, no data, and then the address that was emitted. Very exciting. Now, because we're gonna be copy pasting this a lot, this can actually get really annoying. So what we might wanna do, and what a lot of people will do, is they'll actually create a modifier, modifier called raffle entered, where we'll do exactly this, I'm going to copy this, paste it in here, get rid of the arrange. And then instead of doing this in our test here, we'll just say this public function now has this raffle entered modifier. And that will mean that this modifier actually runs before our test runs. So this is actually a really popular convention for writing your tests. Anytime you have to kind of repeat some type of trivial thing for a whole lot of your tests, it's best to modularize it into one little modifier and then just stick it over here. And now our test is a lot smaller and looks a lot cleaner. Cool, great job. So let's go ahead now. I think we've tested perform upkeep pretty well. If you want to go and take some time to do this yourself now, feel free to do so, but let's go ahead. Let's do a little headers. If you'd installed it, full fill random words, paste this here and let's begin. Okay, all right, so now we're gonna start writing some really cool badass tests, and these are about to get much, 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 much more interesting. So, so fulfill random words. So this should only be able to be called after perform upkeep was called. So we probably want to write a test that says, hey, fulfill random words can only be called after perform upkeep was called. So we could do a little function test full fill random words can only be called after 
after perform upkeep public like so. And we'll want to make this a raffle entered. We'll want to give this the raffle entered modifier so that we don't have to write all this stuff that we did up here anymore. So how can we test that fulfill random words can only be called after this can be called? Well, this is where we can rely once again, a little bit on our VRF coordinator, uh, V2 mock, or just our VRF coordinator, because if you do a request random words in here, but if you do not have a valid request, you should get an invalid request error here. So this is the error that we're going to be looking for. We're going to see if we can get it. So we'll do a little arrange slash act slash assert actually, where we're going to say VM dot expect revert. And we're going to do VRF coordinator V2 underscore five mock dot invalid request. This is a simpler one dot selector. There's going to be no parameters here. And then we can just say, We'll call VRF coordinator two underscore five mock VRF coordinator dot full fill random words. And we'll see in here. So there's fulfill random words override. There should also be fulfill function fulfill random words, which calls fulfill random words override. So we'll call fulfill random words here, which takes a request ID and a consumer. So we'll say fulfill random words. We'll just kind of pick a random one. We'll pick zero and then the address of the raffle here. And of course we need to import this VRF coordinator V2 mock. So I'm gonna scroll back up to the top. We're gonna to import that VRF coordinator V2 mock from at chain link slash contracts slash, uh, where do we, I think we import this in the helper as well. Yep, I'm just gonna copy this line. I'm gonna paste it right here. Okay, cool, very nice. Let's scroll all the way back down. And cool, this is looking good now. Now, when we're running this test here, we're pretending to be the VRF coordinator, right? We're using the VRF coordinator v2 mock, which allows anybody to call fulfill random words because it's a mock, right? In the actual VRF coordinator, not anybody can call this fulfill random words, right? Only the chain link nodes themselves can actually call this function. So this is great. Uh, and actually, let's go ahead and, and test this. So we'll do forge test dash dash MT, paste that in. Let's do a little zoom in, in here. Hopefully this passes. Ta -da. Okay, this passed. Well, that was cool, but we kind of picked a request ID here. So, well, that was kind of a random one we picked. So we should probably also check request ID one, right? Probably also check request ID two and request ID three. Three, and we should test that no request ID works at all. And we should check request ID 407,000 and 8,477,000. As you can see, it's very infeasible to write an ugly test that looks like this with all these test cases. So instead, what we can do, instead of adding, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, is we can write what's called a fuzz test. And for most of your testing, ideally, you do some type of fuzz test or in this case, it's known as stateless fuzz testing for most of your testing. And in the future, you should probably try to default all of your tests to some type of fuzz test. Now we're gonna go much deeper into this much later because there's a lot to unpack with fuzz testing and how it works and what the important pieces are. But for now, let's kind of give you the basic gist of it. So let's delete everything. And we'll just come back down to this. And I've got a number of fuzz testing videos on my YouTube that we're gonna watch much, much later in this course and especially in the security and auditing course. However, if you don't understand this part completely, that's okay. If you just understand kind of the basics high level, great. Instead of us choosing 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, whatever, what we can do is directly in our test here, in this little parameters here, we can say uint256 random request ID. And we can take this random request ID and paste it in here. Now, when we run this test, let's actually see what happens. So the only thing we added was we updated this parameter in here and we added it to our fulfill random words. Now we clear everything out. We do forge test dash dash MT paste it in dash VVV. Now we're going to see a slightly different output. It's still going to pass. It's still going to look pretty much the same while well, we're still going to get our console.logs out, but there's actually a very important difference here. Up at the top here, it says test for full random words can only be blah, 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 whatever. Runs 256 and then some of this stuff here. 
runs 256. What this means is Foundry actually ran this test 256 different times with 256 different random request IDs to try to break this. Where if you give it a value to run as a fuzz test, it'll try to pick values that will break your test. It's attempting to break your test. And that's good. That's what we want it to do. We want it to try to break our test. And like I said, much, much later, we'll learn more about writing really cool, really badass fuzz tests. But if we go back over to our foundry.toml, we can go ahead and click command click or copy paste this link to open up this list of different configs in the foundry configs here. And if we scroll down far enough or just look for fuzz, we can see this fuzz section. So I'm just going to copy these two here. And in my foundry.toml, paste fuzz runs equals 256. So this is foundry going to try 256 different random numbers. If I increase this to 1000, right, fuzz runs to 1000, and I rerun this test, what do you think we're going to get? Well, we're going to look at this line again. It's going to say runs 1000. So it tried 1000 different random numbers. Well, what do you think will happen if I put this huge number in here? Well, uh, don't do this if you don't know how to quit uh, commands, by the way, or I guess not that huge. Let's try this huge number in here. It's going to take a lot longer to run because it's got to try a lot more scenarios. And so this is where fuzzing is really, really powerful. And sometimes people run what's called fuzzing campaigns for a long time. They create a ton of fuzz tests and they just let them run in the background or run in the cloud for a long time to try to break their code base. Because sometimes there are very weird outliers, very weird scenarios where a fuzz test catches something crazy. So it's great to default it to 256 for now. And fuzz testing is probably one of the most important, probably one of the most powerful testing methodologies you will learn in your smart contract development journey. And we're not going to go over it super deep quite yet. But like I said, later on in the course, we're going to go crazy, crazy deep, especially at that stable coin section. We're going to go super deep. If you do get to the security curriculum, we go even deeper into fuzz testing over there because fuzz testing is absolutely crucial. But you've written your first stateless fuzz test and you'll learn what stateless fuzz tests mean much later. And this is very exciting because this is one of the most important concepts in your entire journey. And just by you learning this, it's crazy that I even say this but you are already better. You know more than a lot of the current smart contract developers. So heck yeah. All right, so we could probably keep writing more tests, but I think at this point, you're really getting the gist of what I want you to learn. However, I do want to write one final giant end to end test just to kind of test all the functionality, right? And there's probably a whole bunch more coverage that we could do. Like I said, at the end of this, if you want to go try to get the coverage up as some practice for yourself. Awesome. Highly encourage you to do so. But let's just kind of end to end write a test and then we'll use that as a baseline for an integration test as well. You ready? I sure am. Let's get into it. So we're going to call a function called test fulfill random words picks a winner resets and sends money. This will be a public raffle entered function. So we're going to do kind of an end to end test. We're going to say once the chain link VRF calls fulfill random words, it's going to reset the whole array. It's going to send the winner the money. And yeah, we're going to pick a winner. So this is kind of like the pinnacle test here. This is really kind of putting all the pieces together. And we're going to make this a little bit complicated because we want to really make sure our functionality works here. So we're going to do a little arrange a little, a little setup here. So we're going to say u256 additional entrance entrance equals three. So we're going to have four people total, four people total actually enter this lottery. Uh, additional entrance, additional entrance. I think I spelled that right. <laughs> and we're going to say u256 starting index equals one. And you'll see why I'm doing this in a second. So we're going to have four different players actually enter this lottery. And we're going to do that by creating a for loop for u256 i equals starting index. i is less than starting index plus additional entrance i plus plus like this. And we're actually going to start with one because we don't really want to start with address zero. But we're going to say address new player 
equals address you went 160 i so this is kind of a cool cheaty way to convert any number into an address so starting index will, is going to be one this is kind of equivalent to us being like address of one or address of two or address of three etc cetera, etc cetera. so address new player equals address like this and we need to give them some ETH so we could do a VM dot deal and give them some ETH. However, we're going to use a cheat code, another cheat code just called straight up hoax. And if we go to the foundry documentation, this sets up a prank from an address that has some ether. So what we can do is we can say hoax new player and then just give them one ether. So this sets up a prank and gives them some ether and we can say raffle dot enter raffle. Uh, with value entrance fee like this so we're having three additional players enter the raffle right because we're raffle entered the first player has already entered we're adding three more players here just to get a more realistic example of what a lottery is going to look like then just to make sure uh timestamps are actually going to get updated we're going to keep track of the s last timestamp and i don't think we have a getter for that so let's go ahead and create a function get last time stamp external view returns u into 256 return s underscore last timestamp great so we're going to say u int 256 starting time stamp raffle dot get last timestamp okay cool now we're going to get into the act now to actually for us to call this fulfill random words right with a correct request id we're going to have to generate that request id remember we did that way up here where is it way up here where is it uh, record logs record logs oh uh record logs we did that up here we're actually going to do this exact same methodology so i'm going to copy this I'm going to come down here. I'm going to paste this here. So we're going to record the logs. We're going to perform the upkeep. This is going to kick off the Chainlink VRF. The Chainlink VRF is going to create a bunch of logs. We're going to get that request ID from that list of logs. And then what we have to do finally is we're going to pretend to be the, if we go back to the raffle, we're going to pretend to be the Chainlink VRF node and call fulfill random words. However, we're not going to call fulfill random words. No, no, no. We're actually going to call coordinator v2 mock. It's going to be, uh, oh, never mind. I lied. It is fulfill random words. So we're, we're going to call fulfill random words here. So we're going to say VRF coordinator v2 underscore five mock of the VRF coordinator. So this is simulating getting that random number back. Coordinator fulfill random words. A uint 256 request ID. So we're going to typecast this bytes 32 back to a uint 256 and then the address of the raffle. So this should give the random number to our raffle, right? Because our VRF coordinator mock is going to call our raffle here, which is going to call this fulfill random words. And all of this is going to run, which we haven't tested yet, right? So now we get to go and make sure that all of this actually worked correctly. So now that we've done the act, we can go right into the assert. So what do we want to do? Well, we want to make sure the winner is correct. So we'll say address recent winner equals raffle dot get recent winner. We want to say raffle dot raffle state raffle state equals raffle dot get raffle state oh actually do we have a get recent winner function i'm kind of just assuming that we do get recent winner oh no we sure don't so let's create that so let's say function get recent winner external view returns address like this and then we'll say return s underscore recent winner and i know i'm going a little bit quick feel free to pause me if you need to so raffle.get recent winner, raffle.get raffle state. We'll say unit 256 winner balance equals recent winner dot balance. Let's get their balance. Unit 256 ending timestamp equals raffle.get last time. Is it get last timestamp? What do we just call it? Get last timestamp. Yep. Get last timestamp. 
And then we'll do U256 prize equals raffle entrance fee times additional entrance plus one. So since, oh, excuse me, not raffle entrance fee, it's just going to be, what is it, uh, entrance fee. So since four people have entered the raffle, this should be, this basically should be four. We're taking the entrance fee times four, and that's the prize that should have been given to the recent winners. We wanna make sure that that's actually what happened. And so I kind of already cheated and looked ahead and did a little bit of math, but I also found the expected winner. So what I'm gonna do also is I'm gonna say address expected winner equals address one, like this. And we're gonna get their starting balance. So we're gonna say U256, Winner starting balance equals expected winner dot balance like this. And for our asserts, the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna assert the recent winner is gonna equal the expected winner. We're gonna assert the UNT256 raffle state is now zero. It should be back open. We're gonna assert the winner balance is going to be equal to the starting balance, or excuse me, the winner starting balance plus the prize. And we're going to, uh, excuse me, and we're going to assert the ending timestamp. Timestamp is greater than the starting time stamp. And I'm going to run this and it's going to fail. So we're going to do a little forge test dash dash MT. And I'm intentionally running this to fail because I want you to try to figure out why this is failing for you to do a little little debugging because guess what a lot of your coding is going to be writing tests and then it's going to be debugging tests and you getting really good at doing this is going to be really helpful so if you're getting an error like this great if you're not getting an error like this I guess you lucked out because maybe you changed something but if you're getting an error like insufficient balance this is a great time to pause the video and try to figure out, hey, why am I getting this error? Why am I getting this bug? So if you want to pause the video, challenge yourself to figure this out, to do a little bit of debugging, then come back. We will walk through debugging this kind of similar to how we did before. So go ahead and pause the video now. All right, cool. Well, hopefully you tried to figure this out yourself, but if not, that's also okay. However, you're just cheating yourself, and that's kind of lame. <laughs> so let's go ahead, though, and let's figure out what this issue is. So if we, again, we could just kind of search this, search for like a revert in all of our files and we kind of see this all over the place. Um, but if we look in our debugging trace here, we can see it called VRF coordinator V2 mock fulfill random words. And it was this function that failed, right? That's why it's red. And we see kind of this revert kind of pointing back up to this call. So we know the VRF coordinator V2 mock it failed in here with insufficient balance. So if we look up insufficient balance, we can see uh, there's a couple places where it's calling insufficient balance. So basically we're not using native payment. So something in here is erring. Are we are we not funding it? I thought we I thought we funded it, right? We we definitely funded it. And this is where maybe we could do like some console.logs on, you know, previous balance, payment, you know, do we do we fund it enough, et cetera. And we would have to import console into here, of course. Uh, but I'm going to tell you just straight up, we set our helper config uh, parameters kind of high, which made this a little bit difficult to get the price. So we could either drop those down or I'm just going to be a little bit cheatier in our fund subscription. I'm just going to say fund amount times 100. So we're actually going to fund our local chain smart contract with 300 link. And when we rerun this, we will see hopefully that this passes and everything else is correct. And what do you know? It sure is. Wow, that is exciting. Okay, so now that we've done this giant test, we can do another forge coverage here. Let me zoom in just a little bit. And we won't do the whole debugging bit, but we'll just get a better idea of how much better our tests are. And if we scroll down, oh, okay, we got some green here. So we're like 80% of all functions, 75% of all branches or like conditionals, 81% of just all statements in our code, and then 78% of all lines. Oh, we're starting to look pretty good here. So it's still not perfect, but it's much better, right? We could keep testing, we could keep adding tests. I know I challenged you 
to write some more tests. Typically, you're aiming for maybe 90% or more, but each code base is going to be a little bit different. Maybe you have some really sophisticated fuzz tests or form of verification or some, you know, we haven't talked about form of verification, but maybe you've got some other sophisticated stuff they use it to test and that's okay. But typically you're aiming for 90% or more on coverage. But this was still phenomenal. We wrote we wrote a massive giant unit test just to kind of see the full flow end to end. Things are passing, so this is a very good sign. So our tests aren't done. We probably want to do more testing of these as well. But the most important thing for me here is that you're getting a better understanding of how to write tests, where to write tests, and the importance of tests. Now, so this is great. So this will work perfectly for our local Anvil tests, right? Because we just tested it as such. But will it work for our forked tests? Well, pause the video and see if you can figure out that answer. So if we run forge test dash dash fork URL and we do Sepolia RPC URL, let me zoom in a little bit more. What do, you, what do you think will happen? Do you think it'll pass? Do you think it'll fail? Well, we're gonna try it. So I have this as my environment variable and I am already getting a failure. Setup failed, must be sub owner. Okay, well, let's just double check that forge test still works. All of our tests, okay, yep, all of our tests run. Okay, so something's wrong with forking tests. So why is this failing? And remember, our fork tests are so important because we wanna make sure that Hey, if we actually ran this in a real environment, would all of our tests pass? So we can do this again with a dash V, 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 V and see the output here. Now that we're going to get some better debugging here and we can see we're getting this test on VRF coordinator at consumer must be sub owner. Ah, so maybe the private key that we're using is actually wrong. Now we're getting this issue because we are adding consumer and back in our deploy raffle here, and maybe for some reason you're not, but for some reason the broadcast address is wrong, right? When we run this on a forked chain, right? It's just gonna use some random private key, but when we run this on the actual testnet, it's gonna use the correct testnet. Now we could say, okay, let's just go into our helper config and we'll scroll all the way down here. So right now I have a subscription ID. I could just set this to zero and right, me setting this to zero will make it so that this code base automatically gives me a subscription and I could rerun this and see if this fails. And this one also fails. We get ERC20 transfer amount exceeds balance because because we're trying to transfer some link token that the test addresses that we came up with don't have any of them. So that that doesn't work either. Ugh. So how can we write these fork tests in a way that makes sense? Also, I don't want to have to delete my subscription ID on my Sepolia config. That also stinks. So what can we do here? So let's go about fixing this so that this will work both for our forge tests and for our forked tests here. Now, of course, if we were just doing our scripts locally, we could just go ahead and say, hey, you know what, vm.prank, and then, you know, whoever we wanted to do. But we want this set of scripts to also work with a real network, so we're using vm.start broadcast. This vm.start broadcast is actually a little bit more powerful than what we're using it for. So you can use vm.start broadcast and it'll automatically work with whatever network it's given. So like if I do, you know, if I do forge script, you know, whatever the script dash dash account, blah, 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 whatever account or, you know, or the horrible dash dash private key, blah, 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 blah. This private key or this account will be the one that's actually doing the broadcast, right? That's actually doing the transactions here. However, what we can do as well is we can actually pass an address who or a private key into this start broadcast, and it'll use that as the address to broadcast things. What I used to previously teach was sticking this vm.env unit private key as an environment variable and grabbing it into the start broadcast. But as we know, we don't wanna do that because that would mean we would stick our private key in here. So what we can do instead is just stick the address of the account that we're going to work with into this start broadcast and same as kind of what we saw before. If we were to send this now, we would just get prompted for a password to decrypt that key and it would work kind of normally. So what we can do then is we can make this address that we're using a little bit more modular by going to our help config and creating a new section in here. So in our config, what we can do is we can scroll up to the top and update our network config here and we can add an address 
account. And so for each one of our networks, for Sepolia and for our local network or in mainnet and anything else, we can choose a different account that we're expected to work with. And that way we can prank or start broadcast that specific address. So for get ETH Sepolia config, this is where maybe you'll put in your private key that you're going to be working with. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and grab mine and paste it in here. And this, of course, is going to be a burner wallet of mine, one with no real funds associated with it. And then down here, we're gonna do account. And for this one, we're actually gonna do a special account here. Now, if I look up base.soul, this is abstract contract common base. This is in the Forge SCD SRC base.soul. In here, there's this default sender address, address internal constant default sender. And this address is gonna be this one right here. This is the default sender that whenever Foundry needs to use some type of address to send some stuff, this is the address that it's going to use. So we can use this to our advantage in our helper config. We can set the local network default account to being this local, to being this default sender. This way we don't have to do any weird key stuff or, or enter any passwords or anything. So now if we set this up as the account for our local testnet, this foundry default sender. And if you're having a hard time finding this in the code base, you can also go to my GitHub repo as well and grab it from there. Uh, but if we set that up as such, <clears throat> and we set up an account that actually has some link in it that has some testnet ETH, what we can now do is we can now refactor all of our stuff. Anytime we did a vm.start broadcast in our script, here, we can update this to use, excuse me, in our script and exclude our lib. We can update these, ah, we can update these so that they use this new account, right? So we're getting our config right here. So we can do vm.broadcast config.account. So this will now be the account in our helper config. So same thing with our helper config, vm.broadcast, it matters a little bit less here because this is only going to be when working with a local network anyway, so we can actually skip this one. But this one, we're probably gonna have to do a major refactor, create subscription. Let me just do a little word wrap here. Is we can have this also take an address account, pass the account in here. Then up here, we're gonna have this take some type of account that we get, and we'll say address account equals helper config, config dot get config dot account like this. Okay, that looks good. Do we need to update anything else? No, that looks fine. Okay, great, what's next? Okay, this is fun subscription. Okay, if we're on the local chain ID, doesn't really matter. But what we can do, same thing here, we can have this take an address account and we'll say vm.start broadcast from the account and then scroll up fund subscription using config. This will also take an account that we'll get from address account equals, I think you GitHub Copilot, paste that in there. Cool, that's local, great, that looks good. Then right here, same thing, we'll do account. We'll have this take an address account. We'll have this pass it an address account, and then we'll say address account equals helper config dot get config dot account like this. Great. Right. We'll do a little forge forge build just to make sure it's actually working. Oh, and I forgot to add the accounts in here. So in our deploy raffle, we're gonna have to do config dot account. Add that here. We're gonna have to add it here. Or else we're gonna have to add this vm.start broadcast config account. Okay, cool. Let's try a little forge build now. Oh, we forgot one more. So this is also gonna have to be config.account for add subscription. Okay, cool. Anything else? Do another forge build. All right, perfect. Compiler runs successful. So let's see if this now cleaned it up for us. Let's do a forge test. Ah, oh, everything passes for forge test. Okay, well, what about forge test dash dash fork URL, Sepolia RPC URL. Let's see if it works for Sepolia now. 
Oh, it looks like two of them failed. Which one's failed? Test fulfill random words can only be called by perform upkeep and test fulfill random words picks a winner and sends money. How do we fix those? Well, let's see those two tests here. It was our last two tests that failed. Test fulfill random words and test fulfill random words. Now, here's why these are always going to fail on a fork test. We are mocking, we're pretending to be the Chainlink VRF coordinator. And of course that's going to fail. The actual Chainlink coordinator have access controls and only let the Chainlink nodes call fulfill random words. And we're pretending to call random words on both of them. So if I were to just run maybe this giant test, right? Forge test dash dash MT, paste it in dash dash fork URL, Sepolia RPC URL. Oh, and uh, excuse me, let's add a bunch of V's as well. Dash V, 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 V. Let's see what we get here. Uh, fulfill random words, meta multi-sig wallet. So we're getting some error here called meta multi-sig wallet. EVM error revert. We can see the VRF coordinator 2.5 fulfill random words is actually failing. Why is it failing? Well, because we're trying to call it with an address that doesn't make sense. So what we have to do is we have to create a new modifier in here. We call it modifier skip fork like this. And we're just going to say if block dot chain ID does not equal local chain ID, then we're going to return otherwise pass. And so local chain ID looks like we don't have this. So we're gonna have to do import code constants from script script slash helper config dot s dot so like this and our raffle test is code constant test now we should have access to that and we sure do and then these fulfill random words should be a skip fork test so these should not run when we're doing a fork test so now we can rerun this and everything should pass because now we're going to skip those two that don't make sense for us to to fork let's get rid of the test let's just run all of them as a fork test and everything's passing. All right, let's go. So we could 100% make this even more. We're gonna run a, a more strict, a more resilient fork test. We're gonna actually going to prank be the VRF nodes and we're gonna encrypt the data the same way the Chainlink VRF does. And we're gonna try to get the random number the same way. At some point, you're gonna have to call it. So I think for what we're doing right now, this is okay. As you get better and better at doing this stuff, you will understand where it makes sense to call it or where it makes sense to have more tests. For our code base here, this is pretty good. And like I said, as we continue with the course, you'll get much better at writing different types of tests. All right. So we've written some really badass unit tests, which is awesome. However, you, you thought you're done writing tests. You're not done writing tests. There are more tests to write, but I'm going to give it to you as a challenge to do, right? Maybe we do integration.t.sol, or we could call this inter actions.t.so where we test kind of all our scripts in here. Remember, there are several different stages to us writing tests. We have our unit tests, which are kind of the most basic tests that we really just went through in our raffle test.t.so. Then we can do our integrations test, which is going to be de testing all of our deploy scripts and how all of our contracts interact with each other. Then we could go to the next step if we really wanted to, to what we would call a staging test. And this is where we deploy to a mock environment, a live-ish environment. This could be something like an actual test net, a virtual network that other people are interacting with, but basically some type of pre-deploy, like you're almost done, you're pretending like it's, it's the real thing. Oh, and then actually before that, we also have our forked test, which are kind of like pseudo staging. We just did a couple of examples of those where we basically fork or take a copy of the actual test nets and kind of like locally install them. Now, we're not going to be doing a whole lot of these staging tests here. However, for a professional project, it might be a good idea for you to do them. This might be with a test net, a virtual net, etc. I'm planning on in the future going to be teaching most of this curriculum with something called a virtual network, which hopefully will make this a lot easier because doing things on a test net is really difficult right now, especially to get enough test net funds. Some people even deploy their code bases to a really cheap live network just to have a better understanding of how their code's gonna work. There are some blockchain networks like Polkadot that actually have an entire blockchain dedicated to running what's called like a staging environment with like real-ish money. So the, their staging environment is worth real money and then their production environment is worth 
even more real money, right? So there's lots of different ways we can approach these tests. And, and it's important to think about the different stages and the different trade-offs between each. And this isn't even the full scope of all the tests that it's good practice to have. So we talked a little bit about fuzz, fuzzing and fuzz tests, but there's actually even more advanced type of tests like um, stateful fuzzing, which you'll learn much later in the course, which is probably one of the most important types of fuzzing that you can do. There's stateless fuzzing, which we introduced a little bit here. And there's even crazier type of tests like formal verification, verification. We do not teach formal verification in this course. However, we do have an assembly and formal verification course on Cypher and Updraft that you should definitely check out if you want to learn how to turn your code into mathematical proofs. Crazy, I know, that's what formal verification is. Now, this is a great time for you to try to write some integration tests and maybe try to get your, your code coverage a lot higher, maybe even try out some more interesting forked tests. And if you want to, go ahead and read about some of these other types of tests, because like I said, the stateful fuzzing, in my opinion, one of the most testing methodologies you can possibly do in the smart contract world. But I'm not gonna walk you through doing some integration tests. If you want to do some interactions.t.soul or some integration tests, I highly recommend it. I am going to walk you through doing this whole thing on the Sapolia test net. However, you do not have to follow along with me. If you want to, which you absolutely can, come to the GitHub resources on Cypher and Updraft. You can scroll down, and I believe we have a recommended test nets section, recommend test net, yep, Sepolia, and we have some test net faucets as well, some of them with different requirements. Like I said, depending on when you watch this, we might have moved over to virtual networks, but I'm going to walk you through doing this whole thing. You do not have to do this with me, but it's a good idea to follow along to really see kind of this process end to end. So for those of you who are looking to really go above and beyond, this is your current code coverage. Go ahead and try to get this much higher, especially with maybe some of your scripting, maybe some of the interactions in particular. These are all part of the smart contract world. Well, obviously, except for this mock down here. These are all part of your project. And even though these three scripts here aren't necessarily part of your contract, they are important to the overall health and the overall processes of your smart contract here. So for those of you who want to go above and beyond, take this time, pause, try to write some extra tests yourself. This will make you a better developer and I'll see you soon. All right. So now the time a lot of you have been waiting for. Let's see if this all actually works. Hey, Patrick, cool. You're making us do all these tests and all this weird stuff. Show me this lottery. Show me this lottery in action. Let's go ahead and I'm going to show you deploying this onto a real test net. Like I said, you do not have to follow along with me, but I'm going to show you anyways, just so you can kind of see the whole process. Now I could just do, you know, forge script, blah, 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 blah in here, but I'm not going to do that. Why? Well, because I am lazy and I want to work incredibly hard to be incredibly lazy. So I'm gonna make this thing called a makefile, which we've briefly talked about, makefile. And I'm gonna put all the commands that I wanna do and I wanna work with inside of this makefile. So this is going to be some new stuff here. So if you want to just copy paste from my GitHub repo to make this makefile, feel free to do so. Or you can go ahead and code along with me. The code in the makefile is just to make it much easier to write really long scripts. And like I said, you'll, you'll see in a minute. So the first we wanna do is dash include .env. So that if you have a .env file with your like Sepolia RPC URL, for example, the make file will automatically pull all those variables into here. Then we're going to do dot phony all test deploy. And this dot phony thing basically just tells our make file, hey, these are targets that we're going to use and don't do any weird thing with these keywords, reserve these keywords to actually run the scripts that we're going to do here. So let's go ahead and write our first target. We'll do a little build here which will be, and we'll add a uh, colon semicolon, which makes this be basically a target. And we'll just say forge build. Now, with just this, just this little bit of code in our make file, I can now run make build. And this is basically just running forge build. Uh, we're getting a an issue. Source file does not uh, require specify compiler version. Oh, yep. Let's go back to this. Sorry. Let's just do SPDX license. Identifier MRT, Pragma, uh, Solidity, 0.8.19, just to, so that we don't get those warnings. Let's run make build again. Okay, cool. So forge build, great. Usually you'll have some type of test target, which will just be forge test, and we can run make test now, and that will just do forge test. Okay, perfect. And if you get rid of the semicolon, you would just put your thing, you put your command on new line. So if I still write make test here, it still runs forge test. But 
most of our commands are going to be pretty small, so we can just kind of put them all on the same line here. Okay, what else do we want to do? Well, we probably want to do an install where people if people want to use this smart contract project, they can install exactly the, the dependencies that we need. And you might have forgotten them by now because we installed kind of a lot of stuff, but don't worry, uh, I will walk you through. So we have a number of things. So we want to do forge, install, siphon <clears throat> slash foundry DevOps at 0.2.2. And this is really important as well. We want to do very specific dependencies so that other people who come across this project they're not using the wrong version of one of these packages. But then dash dash no dash commit. And what are the, what else? This double ampersand is like and for bash commands. So we would run this and then we would run forge install smart contract kit slash chain link brownie contracts at 1.1.1 dash dash no dash commit. I'm going to do a little toggle world word wrap here. So toggle word wrap in my command palette. Oops, toggle word wrap like this and forge install foundry RS slash forge STD at the 1.8.2 dash no dash commit and forge install transmissions 11 slash soulmate at V six dash dash no dash commit. So I know there's a lot of stuff here, but now, and, and this is why it's so good to just have these little make files here, because before I would have to copy paste all this or remember how to write all this, but now I can just write make install and it will run all those commands for us. Very nice. So anybody who comes along to this repo, you could say, Hey, just write, just run make install and it'll automatically install all the correct versions and dependencies for you. Very good. Uh, all right, great. Now let's finally do a little deploy here. Uh, and I want to point something out in previous editions of this course, and you'll definitely still find a lot of project kind of doing it like this. I tried to make a lot of this make file modular. So you can kind of switch between networks pretty easy. And I tried to do some really clever things to do that. But I'm going to almost make this less clever, but like more clever at the same time, just by making it easier. So I'm actually going to do deploy Sepolia like this, and we're just gonna hard code this so that if you run deploy, make deploy Sepolia, it'll deploy to Sepolia. Before I was being really clever with it and I would do like make deploy dash dash network Sepolia. That kind of was a lot of code and wasn't really the cleanest syntax. So we're gonna kind of do it the easier way for now, easier way to understand, easier way to teach. And it's a little bit more straightforward as well. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna run to actually deploy our code base, we are going to do this on a new line just because it's kind of a lot of things to write. We're going to first do this at sign and do forge. And the reason we're doing this at sign is it's going to obfuscate, obfuscate the output or obfuscate the command so that it doesn't show up in the terminal. And that's what we want. Don't worry too much about what that means right now. But we're going to do forge script, script slash deploy raffle.s.soul deploy raffle dash dash RPC dash URL and we're going to do Sepolia RPC URL dash dash account. We're just going to do default or whatever your account is here. I have imported an account and called it default. Whoa, I've also imported one and called it yellow. So whatever your imported your remember, we did that cast wallet import bit cast wallet import and then the name of your account. Remember how we did that. So I'm going to use default here. Then we can do dash dash broadcast. Then to automatically verify this as well, we would do dash dash verify. And then if we have an etherscan API key, we can do etherscan etherscan API key with our etherscan API key like this. And then I like to add the dash v v v v at the end just so that we can have um, even more information. So what this should do is it should deploy our raffle to Sepolia and then automatically verify it. So I already have done uh, source.emb with my Sepolia RPC URL and with my Etherscan API key. So if you don't have an Etherscan API key, obviously you can come over to Etherscan pretty easily. Or, and this, since we're doing Sepolia, you can do Etherscan Sepolia or Etherscan mainnet, doesn't really matter. You can sign in, get an Etherscan API key, and then just stick it in your .emb. So I've already done that though. So in our helper config, I'm going to keep this subscription ID because 
I want to use one that we've already created. I don't want to have to redeploy or redo anything here. And what this should do is we're not going to create a subscription because we've already added one. So we're going to skip creating it. We're going to skip funding it, but we are going to deploy the raffle. And then we are going to automatically add that consumer to our subscription, basically. And what we can finally do is just run make deploy Sepolia and it, it'll compile. Oh, exciting. So now that it's kind of simulated the transaction here, it's going to say, hey, uh, enter the key store password. So we can decrypt our key to send these transactions. And oh, it looks like we're decrypting them and we're pending sending these transactions. That's so exciting. And voila, we have successfully deployed the contract and we have successfully set this up. So let's go ahead. Let's grab this contract address. Let's go to Sepolia, Sepolia Etherscan here. Let's paste this address in here. We look at the contract. It looks like it didn't quite verify correctly. That's kind of annoying. Uh, sometimes test nets have a hard time verifying contracts. We could verify and publish it manually, but I'm not going to bother. That's really annoying, but all good. So, okay, well, we've at least deployed it here. We can verify it later. And now we can go to our vrf.chain.link here. Do a little refresh on our subscription here. I'm going to connect our wallet. We can now see we have a new consumer added. Ah, very nice. So we have six link in our balance. We now want to go over to automation here and we're going to register a new upkeep. We could have done this programmatically as well. Uh, however, we did not. Let's go ahead and let's connect our wallet here. And now that we're connected, we're going to register a new upkeep. We're going to do custom logic. Next, the contract address, that is this one here that we haven't verified yet, but we will. And I'm going to show you the super way to kind of finally verify it. We're going to paste this in. We're going to hit next. Upkeep name is going to be raffle. Gas it looks fine. Starting balance, we'll just say one. Check data, none. Nope, skip, skip, skip. Register. Our MetaMask will come up. We're going to confirm. We are now registering an upkeep. This is going to register Chainlink automation to automatically check our contract. Oh, and then we're gonna and then we're gonna sign this as well, and then close this. Once that transaction goes through, we'll be able to see this on our Chainlink automation home. It looks like upkeep registration request submitted successfully. So now we can go home. We can now see we have an active upkeep. Very exciting here. And what I can do now is we're gonna finish kind of verifying this so we can enter the raffle a little bit easier. Uh, we're going to do forge, verify contract, dash dash help. And we're going to do kind of this nuclear option or like the ultimate option, I sometimes will call it. So there is this command in here called like show standard JSON input. It's this one right here. What we can do is we can run our verify script again. Show standard JSON input. Ah, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> Run this again, paste it out to json.json. And now we're going to have this file, json.json. If we go to the top of it, we, uh, we can format this document. This is what's known as the standard JSON. And this is what the verifiers will use to actually verify a contract. And we can go back to our contract here. We can say verify and publish. If it doesn't automatically verify, we're going to do Solidity standard JSON input. We're using 0 0.8.19. We're going to use MIT continue. Uh, we're going to upload a file. We're going to upload this JSON.JSON in here. So we're kind of speed running you through this. Like I said, you don't have to follow along. And constructor arguments are already set up for us. So all we have to do now is I'm not a robot. Verify and publish. And this pretty much is going to be the way that if for some reason your code doesn't automatically update, your code doesn't automatically verify, this is how it'll do it. So we see successfully generated bytecode for ABI. We can now click this. We now see the contract is successfully verified. Okay. So if we're on our automation here and, excuse me, and we're on our, let's go to vrf.chain.link. So if we're on our automation and we're on our vrf.chain.link, we have a consumer on our VRF here. We have six balance for our VRF. We have our automation. We have one link for our balance here. If we look at our contract, 
and we do read contract let's like connect to web3 here metamask yep if we call checkup keep oh, with nothing with just anything in here we get bool false why well nobody's entered the lottery of course i'm now going to switch over to write contract and we could of course write a script to enter the lottery as well but i'm just going to cheat and use the ether scan here we can go ahead and hit enter raffle i'm going to do what did we set the payment as i think it was 0 0.01 Ah, okay, there we go. So 0 0.01 Sepolia ETH. Looks like this is going to pass. We're going to now confirm. As this transaction is going through, back in our read, we have get recent winner, which is going to be nobody. The owner is going to be this. Get player at index zero. This should error. Yep, it sure did error because our transaction hasn't gone through yet. Okay, it looks like it just finished going through. Now, if we hit index zero, this is actually returning something. Now, if we hit check upkeep needed, oh my God, it's returning true. Now, if we go to our automation and return, let's see if the Chainlink nodes have caught wind of this. So raffle is active. Looks like if we look at pending, okay, no upkeeps needed. Pause, no, 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 no. Any second now, the Chainlink nodes are gonna see, hey, uh, it's time, the raffle is up. And they're gonna automatically pick this up and they're going to automatically kick off a Chainlink VR request. If we give this a little refresh here too. You have pending transactions due to low balance. Pending requests will fail to 20, 24 hours. Please add funds to your subscription. Oh, whoops. Uh, well, okay, let's add some funds here. <laughs> so uh, I'll give it 15 link. This is testnet link anyway, so I don't care. And this is where the UI is can be really helpful, right? Kind of triaging some of these. We could have done this programmatically, seen it wasn't working, and then had to debug it, but it's definitely quicker just to hit the add funds button on the UI sometimes. Might be a good idea to go and update our scripts to give more link to our smart contracts as well. Okay, funds added. Now let's do a little refresh here. Let's see, okay, we have some balance for our VRF now. Latest fulfillment was very recent, was like basically just now. Oh, but we barely spent any ETH, or we barely sent any link, huh? Okay, well, what about our automation here? Our automation went ahead and kicked off. That's very exciting. So if we go back to our raffle now, if we go down, Go to the contract here. We go to read contract. We go down to recent winner. Give this page a little refresh here. Connect to Web3, yep, yep. We go down to get recent winner. Oh my goodness, we have a recent winner. And it was us. So the Chainlink automation automatically picked up our lottery, kicked off a transaction to the Chainlink VRF to get a random number, and it gave us a random number and picked us a random winner. And if you go to the transactions tab, you can see we entered the raffle. And if you go to internal transactions, you can see this parent transaction hash where fulfill random words was called by the Chainlink VRF. This is so cool. Now, even though I just showed you this, I don't want you to ever, never, 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 never test on Sepolia or a testnet or a mainnet without first testing locally on something like Anvil. So you could also have like a deploy anvil here where you pull up here, you do like a little anvil, you get a kind of local blockchain running first, and then you deploy to anvil and you work with all your scripts on your local blockchain. This should always be your default way before you even think about doing any test net tests. Additionally, all of your tests should be immaculate before you even think about doing test net tests. The test net test if you decide to do it, should absolutely be the last stage in anything you're working with. The test net or a really cheap main net, never, ever, ever, ever have this be your first step. You are going to waste a lot of time waiting for transactions to go through. You're going to, the test nets are technically a public resource as well, and we don't really want to abuse the public resources. Absolutely, 100%, be sure to do this locally before we try it out on a test net. <sighs> Now we're just about done with this banger of a project here, but there's two more things I want to show you around debugging. So we got stuck on a couple of things a few times and we've used console.long before, but we could have also imported console from forge std, uh, excuse me, from forge std slash console.sol or console2 right into our contracts themselves and done console.logs in our contracts. So for example, I could say enter raffle and I could do like console.log, hello, like this, and then maybe console.log message.value. And now 
if I run like forge test dash VVVV like this, and I know this can be a lot of tests here, <laughs> but I probably should have just done three Vs. Um, we see hello and a zero here. So we can actually do console.log directly in our contracts themselves. And that's a great way to help debug our transactions. You want to be careful, though, because if you do this, you want to make sure to remove them before you actually deploy this to production or deploy this to an actual network. Because if you leave those in, it will cost gas and you don't want to have to spend extra gas where you don't have to. I also spelled sample wrong. There we go. Now, one other tool that we haven't really talked about and we won't talk about until way, way, way later in the curriculum is this debug tool. But I absolutely love it for low level stuff. What you can do is you can do you can take some test and do like forge forge test dash dash debug paste the name of a test in here and what it will do is it'll drop you into a inline opcode debugger where you can literally go through the low level bytes of a smart contract so i can literally like see all the opcodes that are happening all the low level all the crazy stuff that's happening in our contract to get a better idea of exactly what is happening with memory, storage, call data, all that good stuff. We will learn about this and we will use this way, way, way later. And if you get to the security and auditing curriculum, we will definitely go over this. But with that being said, we learned a ton. So let's do a recap of everything we learned. Ooh, sit back. All right. We deployed a provably fair raffle, a provably fair lottery. This is crazy exciting. Now you should ask the question, does it ever make sense for you to play another lottery that isn't on the blockchain ever again? And the answer is no, because no other lottery is going to give you the transparency of true randomness that the blockchain is. So we created this lottery contract. At the top, we've got a whole bunch of custom gas efficient errors, including one that takes many parameters. We learned about type declarations like enums that have different values that can also be wrapped as uints. We made some beautiful events and state variables, all of them starting off as private. And we made getters for the ones that we wanted at the bottom. Oh, so nice. We have this verbose constructor so that no matter what chain we want to deploy this contract on, we can adjust the deployment parameters so that it works flawlessly. Additionally, it'll work flawlessly if we're forking a testnet, if we're forking a mainnet, et cetera. All we have to do to update for a different network is to add a different network config. That's it. We created a raffle that emits a log for to make migration easier and make front end indexing easier. We worked with Chainlink automation to automatically call our smart contracts. And in fact, if I flip back over to our automation upkeep and I do a little refresh, we scroll down, we can see that it ran once because the perform upkeep was indeed met. It hasn't run again because why? Because we have this check. It doesn't have any players. It can only run if it has players. So the check upkeep checks if it's time for a new lottery draw and then perform upkeep actually kicks off the lottery draw, which kicks off a call to a Chainlink VRF. This function call is called by an external party. It's called by a group of Chainlink nodes for us. We could call this ourselves, but we're lazy. We want automation to take care of it. We want the decentralized Chainlink network to take care of it. Once it kicks off, the Chainlink VRF will respond and end up calling this fulfill random words, which picks our random winner. And this function we used, we learned about the CEI checks effects interactions pattern, where we do our checks first. We didn't really have any checks here, but then we do all our effects on the contracts. And then finally our external interactions outside of our smart contracts. Then we have a whole bunch of getter functions. This code base was really only 200 lines of code, but yet it felt like it took so long because we learned a ton of really advanced scripting and deployment methodologies. So we deployed our contract using our helper config so that no matter what chain we deploy this on, it's going to work flawlessly. If we work on Sepolia or another mainnet, we just add the parameters in here that we want. If we work on Anvil, we deployed mocks, fake contracts for us to interact with as if we were working on a real chain. If we don't have a subscription, we programmatically created one in our script. We scripted in Solidity, insane. 
Then we started our broadcast and actually deployed our raffle ourselves. And then finally, we added a consumer programmatically to our VRF. Probably also could have added an upkeep to the chain link automation, but we didn't have to do that for our testing because we could just pretend to be chain link automation ourselves. We created this interactions bit so that we could run commands to add consumers, fund subscriptions, or create subscriptions right from our command line, much easier than having to work with cast. We wrote a lot of unit tests. However, we still left some testing for you if you want to go back and level this up. We worked with a mock chain link token. We learned some really interesting testing skills, such as being able to capture the event outputs to use them later in our tests, skipping a test based off of the chain ID. We doubled down on working with modifiers. We expected a revert with this ABI.encode selector thing, which we're still not sure what it does, but we'll learn about it later. We did some perform upkeep and all these other tests. And then at the end of this, you didn't have to do this, but I went ahead and did this, but I deployed this lottery on chain onto an actual test net. We funded our subscription with, we funded our automation subscription with link. We funded our VRF subscription with link, and we saw the chain link nodes take care of all of this. No problem. Whew. This was a large project and we did a lot of coding here. If you made it to this part of the course, you should be incredibly proud of yourself and give yourself a massive pat on the back. Take some time right now to go on a walk, do some push-ups, do some pull-ups, go get some ice cream, go grocery shopping, take a break, post about this on Twitter, post this to your GitHub. This is an awesome project to post to your GitHub, by the way. Post to your GitHub and be excited that you've made it this far. If you're in the GitHub repo associated with this course, you know that we have a lot of lessons left. However, getting this far is a phenomenal achievement. And like I was saying, you have the basics of Solidity knowledge down. The next couple courses are gonna teach you more intricate knowledge about the Web3 ecosystem itself. So take that break and I'll see you soon. All right, welcome to Advanced Foundry. We're gonna learn a lot of really cool stuff in this course. We're gonna play the best practices just to get started here in case you forget any of the best practices. So be sure to watch that first. This course is directly after the Intro to Foundry course. And it's probably one of the most important pieces to becoming an advanced smart contract developer, period. So let's do this. All right, and now we're at the section of the course where we're going to start talking about ERC-20s and tokens. So you can find the code associated with what we're going through in the GitHub repo, of course, associated with this course. Now, before we actually even go into building one of these, I know we've actually worked with them a little bit with the link token, but let's actually understand what an ERC-20 is, what an EIP is, what an ERC is, and I actually have a video from my previous course which goes over this, so let's go ahead and watch that. Before we can understand what an ERC-20 is or even what one of these tokens are, we first need to understand what is an ERC and then also what is an EIP. In Ethereum and Avalanche and Binance and Polygon, all these blockchains have what's called improvement proposals. And for Ethereum, they're called Ethereum Improvement Proposals or EIPs. And what people would do is they come up with these ideas to improve Ethereum or improve these layer ones like Polygon, Matic, Avalanche, etc. And on some GitHub or some open source repository, they'll add these new EIPs, they'll add these new improvement ideas to make the, these protocols better. Now, these improvements can really be anything. They can be anything from a core blockchain update to some standard that is gonna be a best practice for the entire community to adopt. Once an EIP gets enough insight, they also create an ERC, which stands for Ethereum Request for Comments. So EIP, Ethereum Pro Improvement Proposals, ERC, Ethereum Request for Comments. And again, these can be like BEP, PEP, you know, et cetera, for all these different blockchains. Both the improvement proposals and the request for comments all have these different tags. Now, they're numbered chronologically. So something like an ERC-20 is going to be the 20th 
ERC slash EIP. The, the ERCs and the EIPs share that same number. And their websites like eips.ethereum.org, they keep track of all of these new Ethereum improvement proposals. And you can actually see them real time go through the process of being adopted by the community. Now, one of these EIPs or ERCs is going to be the ERC20 or the token standard for smart contracts. This is an improvement proposal that talks about how to actually create tokens and create these smart contract tokens. I made a video about this recently. So in the GitHub repo associated with this course, we're going to have a sub lesson and we're going to watch a quick video that explains more about these different tokens. Now, first, let's define even what are ERC-20s. So ERC-20s are tokens that are deployed on a chain using what's called the ERC-20 token standard. You can read more about it in the ERC-20 token standard here, link in the description as well. But basically, it's a smart contract that actually represents a token. So it's a token, but it's a smart contract, it's both. It's really cool. Tether, Chainlink, UniToken, and DAI are all examples of ERC-20s. Technically, Chainlink is in the ERC-677, as there are upgrades to the ERC-20 that some tokens take that are still backwards compatible with ERC-20s. And so basically, you can think of them as ERC-20s with a little additional functionality. Now, why would I even care to want to make an ERC-20? Well, you can do a lot of really cool stuff with it. You can make a governance token, you can secure an underlying network, you can create some type of synthetic asset, or really anything else. In any case, how do we build one of these ERC-20s? How do we build one of these tokens? Well, all we have to do is build a smart contract that follows the token standard. All we have to do is build a smart contract that has these functions. It has a name function, a symbol function, decimals function, et cetera, all these functions. We need to be able to transfer it. We need to be able to get the balance of it, et cetera. And again, if you want to check out some of the improvements that are still ERC-20 compatible, like the ERC-677 or the ERC-777, you definitely go check those out and build one of those instead. All right, let's go ahead and get started here. This is going to be one of our fastest lessons. We're going to be building a repo or a repository or a project that's going to have our own token in it, our own ERC-20. And to get started, we're going to go ahead and run the same command we've been running this whole course, forge init. Oops, excuse me. We're going to run make di mkdir foundry ERC-20 F23. Clear cd foundry ERC-20 F23 code period or file open to open this up in a new VS code here, like this. Then we're going to open up the terminal and run forge init. We're going to initialize a blank repository here. Now, one thing I haven't actually talked about yet is this dot GitHub slash workflows. This is something called your CI CD pipeline, and it's a way to automatically test your code in GitHub. Not really going to go over it, but it is a popular tool that a lot of projects use so that whenever they make a change to their code, the test suite automatically runs. And if the test suite fails, the code doesn't get pushed. But that's beside the point. Anyways, we have our basic setup here. We're going to go ahead and delete the three of these again. Goodbye. Just so we can start from scratch. Now let's go ahead and create our token. We're going to create our own token here. And I'm going to show you a hard way to do it first. And then I'm going to show you a much easier way. So first, let's go in here and let's create a token. So we're going to do new file. We're going to call it manual token .soul. We're going to do the same thing we've always been doing. SPDX license. Tab that out. Thanks, Copilot. Pragma solidity. Thanks, Copilot. Let's use 18 contract manual token like this. Now, like we were saying earlier, in order for us to actually implement an ERC 20, all we have to do is follow the EIP slash ERC token standard. And if we go to the EIPs, we can go to 20, we can scroll down, and all we have to do is add all these methods that they say we need to add. Okay, let's go down. And the first method we need is a name. Okay, so let's create a name. Function name, public view returns string. Okay, cool. So let's go in here, we'll do function name, public view returns string. This is actually gonna be a string memory. And then we'll just say return manual token. This will be the name of our token. Okay, cool. That's it. And this can actually be pure instead of view pure got added later. But okay, cool. We have a name a symbol is optional. So I'm gonna skip it decimals are optional. I'm gonna skip it. Okay, a total supply, we need a total supply. Okay, great. So let's do function total supply public will make this pure returns you in 256. Let's say return 100 ether. So we'll say this token needs to be 100 ether big. Now again, since Solidity doesn't work with decimals, 
we probably should have a decimals function to tell users that this big number, right? Because 100 ether is actually going to be, it's going to be 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. We probably should have a decimals function. So let's actually create a decimals function. We'll copy this, paste it in here. Function decimals, public, we'll make this pure, returns 18. So we're going to tell everybody that the total supply is actually going to be 18. Oh, return 18. The total supply 100 ether has 18 decimals. So we know that this big number really is just 100. Okay, great. What next do we need? Okay, we need a transfer. We need a balance of function. Okay, let's copy the balance of function. Let's paste it in here. Zoom out a little bit. And let's turn on toggle word wrap. Okay, function balance of address owner public view returns their balance. So how do we get their balance? Well, we probably should have a mapping somewhere to map people's address to their balances. So let's go ahead and do that. At the top, we're going to do a mapping of address to uint 256 called balances, or this should be s underscore balances. And we'll make this private balances. And we'll say return on s underscore balances of the owner. And now you can see just from adding this little piece here, someone's balance is really just some mapping in this token contract, right? That's it. Like somebody has just assigned, you know, if I have 10 tokens in this mapping, it's just going to be my address is assigned to 10 tokens, right? That's it. So holding tokens of an ERC 20 just means you have some balance in some mapping in the contract. That's really it, right? So we can keep going. There's a transfer function, right? We could actually, do this out and everything. Oh, and yeah, we could probably do instead of a function stuff like this, we probably could just do string public name equals manual token, right? Because if we do a string public like this, it's, it's the same as creating a public function like this. So we can 100% do this. So either one is pretty much the same. There's some gas trade offs, but I'm not going to go into those now. We could then create a transfer function where we do function transfer. We would say address underscore two, you went to 256 amount. This will be a public function. And we would say something like, first we would get the you went to 256 previous balances. Previous balance equals balance of from plus balance of two. So the previous balances, actually if we're gonna say from is gonna be message.sender. So previous balances of both of them and then balance of is actually a public. Oops, I'm sorry, this should be like this. We're gonna get the previous balances. We'll say balance of from. We're gonna do this minus equals, meaning we're gonna subtract this amount from them. And then the balance of two is gonna plus equal that amount. And then we're gonna do a require or an assert require a balance of from plus balance of two equals previous balances or something like that, right? Oh, instead of from, it's going to be, excuse me, that's the sender, this is that sender, right? So it's going to be something like that. And then balance of, oops, there should be parentheses like this. More parentheses. Oh, I just did all the wrong parentheses. Oh, we actually can't do this. So hold on S underscore balances. There we go. This is how we should do it. There we go. So we're going to assign those mappings. Now we can keep just ripping through the rest of these functions and adding them ourselves. And we could 100% totally do that. Or we could do what most people do and just use an already deployed, already audited, already ready to go contract. So one of the most popular frameworks out there is this Open Zeppelin contracts project. So if we go to the Open Zeppelin documentation, we go to products, go to contracts, start coding, they actually have a ton of contracts that we can actually use and just copy paste into our code. They also have this really cool wizard, which allows you to make contracts really easily yourself, right? You wanted to make a token, an ERC-20, some governance, some other custom contract, they have a wizard that automatically allows us to create these much easier. So instead of me making me randomly 
me implementing the token myself, what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, we're going to make a new token called our token .sol. And in here, same as always, SPDX, license identifier, MIT, pragma, solidity, like that, contract, our token, like this. And we're going to install opens up on contracts. And the way that we do that is let's go to their GitHub, open Zeppelin. So I'm going to copy this bit, open Zeppelin slash open Zeppelin contracts. When we install open Zeppelin to make sure we're working on the exact same version of open Zeppelin that we're working with for this video here, we're going to do forge install open Zeppelin slash open Zeppelin dash contracts at v5.0.2. And same thing, as always, if we go to the GitHub resources here, and we go to the actual token contract here, we can go into the GitHub repo, you can look at the make file to make sure that you're working with the versions that we want to be working with uh, for this video here. So be sure to check out the install target in the make file to make sure you're working on the correct versions here. Open Zeppelin slash opens up the contracts. Oops, and I got to do dash dash no commit. All right, cool. It has been installed. If you accidentally install the wrong version, you'll have to run this remove command that is also in the make file in the GitHub repo. Now in my lib, I have this open Zeppelin contracts, contracts, and if we scroll down in here to token, we can see in this ERC20 folder, they have this ERC20.sol, which is already implemented for us. Huzzah! Another one that we actually worked with before was Soulmate, Transmissions 11 Soulmate. This is another fantastic repo I recommend checking out if you're looking for another fantastic package with a lot of contracts already built for you. But now that we have this contract, we can just go ahead and import it and inherit it. So first, we're going to need to go to our foundry.toml, though, do some remappings. We'll say remappings equals at open zeppelin slash oops open zeppelin equals lib slash open zeppelin slash contracts and now in our token we can just do import at open zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash erc20 slash erc20 dot soul and we can just have our token inherit everything from this erc20 dot soul which already has everything implemented so we just say our token is ERC20. And now this ERC20.soul has a constructor, right? Where it takes a name and a symbol. And remember, if an inherited contract has a constructor, we need to use that in our constructor. So we could say constructor, constructor. We'll do a UNT256 initial supply. And we need to pass the ERC20 constructor. And we've got to give it a name. Let's call it our token. Let's give it OT as a symbol. And then what I like to usually do is most of these come with a mint function, an internal virtual mint function. And I just like to mint the original sender, that initial supply. So mint message as sender, the initial supply. Cool. We can test this out with a forge build, of course. See if all of our stuff's working. And it's indeed working. Great. So now we'd want to write some tests and we'd want to write some scripts to deploy this. As you know, we probably want to work on our script first. So let's go ahead and deploy our token.sol. And this isn't going to need a helper config, right? Because our token is going to be exactly the same no matter what chain we deploy it on, right? There's no special contracts that we need to interact with. Oh, and this should be our token.s.sol. There's no special contracts we need to interact with. There's nothing really particular we need to do that requires a config. So we're just going to ignore that step. We're just going to make our code a lot smaller. But let's go ahead and make some deployment scripts. Solidity 18 contract deploy our token is script. So let's import script script from forge std slash script dot soul. Let's create our function run. It's going to be external like this, we're going to need to import our token from 
dot dot slash src slash our token dot soul like this. And in our run, we're gonna need to do vm dot start broadcast like this new our token. And we'll let's give it some initial supply. So let's do un256 public constant initial supply equals 1000 ether. So we'll deploy our, our token with that initial supply because our token takes an initial supply and then vm.stop broadcast. Boom, like that. All right, cool. We could make this more robust by changing the deployer key, kind of like what we saw before using the environment variable. But for this one, we're just gonna make it real basic here. Boom, this is our script. And now we can do a little cheatsiness and we can either copy from our last project or copy from the Git repo associated with this course. We'll make a little make file. We'll go to foundry erc 20 f 23. We'll go to this make file and we'll just kind of copy some stuff. So let's just copy the whole thing actually. Yeah, you know what? Yeah, copy the whole make file. No reason to not paste it in here. Oh, actually don't need this verify thing. And I should just be able to run make deploy. Oh, we're getting an error. So we'll run make anvil. Create a new one, make deploy. Compiler runs successfully, script run. And we were successfully able to deploy to our anvil chain. Okay, great. So what about some tests? Let's write some tests. Now for a lot of these more basic contracts, especially like this our token, we can actually use AI to get jump started, right? And I want you guys to use AI to get jump started and use AI to help you learn. I don't want you to use it to substitute learning. Oh, and oh my goodness, I almost didn't do a named import. That would have been embarrassing. I want you guys to use AI to help you learn not to substitute learning. Because if you substitute the learning with the AI, the 10% or the 5% of the time the AI, the AI gets it wrong, you're gonna have no idea how to fix it. It's really important that you still learn all these concepts because AI is still gonna get a lot of things wrong. But AI is usually pretty good at writing tests. So let's start writing some tests. And we're not gonna write all of the tests. We're actually just gonna write a couple and then we're gonna see if our AI can auto-complete it for us. So let's do our token test.t.sol. Let's make some really basic test stuff here. SPDX, you know the drill. Pragma solidity. Contract our token test is test, which means we're gonna to need to import test from forge std slash test capital dot sol. Okay, we're gonna need a function setup, which will be public. Oh, we're gonna need our deployer here, like this. We're gonna import, deploy our token from dot dot slash script slash Play our token .s .so, like that in our setup. Oh, we probably want our script to return our token, right? So we're gonna say our token ot equals new our token return ot returns turn. Okay, cool. So now at the top, we're gonna want to import our token as well from dot dot slash src slash our token dot soul. At the top, we're gonna wanna do an our token, public OT, yeah, our token. Now we're gonna do, we'll make a deployer as well, deploy our token public deployer. We're gonna say our token, oops, no, sorry, deployer equals new deploy our token. Our token equals deployer.run, thanks GitHub Copilot. And that's pretty much all we're gonna need. But let's also make some addresses so that we can interact with people. So we'll make an address Bob equals make ADR Bob. And then address Alice equals make ADR Alice. So we have a Bob, we have an Alice. We'll have the two of them play around with deploying and working with tokens. The owner of our token should be the deployer. So let's do vm.prank address deployer 
And then let's do, let's transfer some tokens to Bob to get started. So we'll say our token dot transfer Bob. And then let's do a little UN 256 public constant starting balance equals 100 ether. So we'll give Bob 100 ether and we'll do a little test. We'll do function test Bob balance public assert equal starting balance it's going to equal to our token dot balance of up oh. all right let's test this test dash m test bob balance oops forge test transfer amount exceeds balance the actual owner's message that sender not the deployer sorry so now let's do this again and hooray okay that looks cool Great. So that's one test. Let's write a couple more tests and then let's try to see if AI can do it for us. So let's even just write just like test allowances. So we'll say function test allow and says public. Now something important about ERC 20s is that they have this function called transfer from. And this is a really important function. We saw it a little bit in the last section, but if I want my contract to keep track of how many tokens it has from you, it needs to be the one to actually transfer the tokens from you to itself. In order for it to take the tokens from you, you need to allow it to do that, right? If we just allowed anybody to take tokens from anybody, that would be really bad. So these ERC-20 tokens, if we go to the back to the standard, they have this thing called in the transfer function, you can actually read about it here. The transfer from method is used to withdraw workflow, allowing contracts to transfer a token on your behalf. This can be used, for example, to allow a contract to transfer for tokens on your behalf and or charge fees for sub currencies. The function should throw an issue unless from has deliberately authorized the sender of the message via some mechanism. And this is this allowances thing. And you'll see on most UIs, on most applications, you need to approve the contract to pull your tokens first. And sites like etherscan.io have a beta tokens approval section where you can actually connect your contract, connect your address, connect, connect. And you could see, oh, let's switch to ETH mainnet. And you can see all the approvals that you have. I don't have any on ETH mainnet on this address again, because this is my dummy address. But it's usually a good practice to see what these approvals are and then revoke them, especially if you don't trust the contract. Because if you approve a contract to do transfer from on whatever they want, then they could just steal all your money, right? It's a good idea if you're making your own token to make sure allowances work well. So we're going to write a real quick test on this. So we'll say UNT256 initial allowance. We're going to say test allowance works. Terrible test name, but whatever. <laughs> it's just a dummy. Test allowance equals just say a thousand, All right? Now we're gonna say Alice proves Bob to spend tokens on her behalf. Let's close this. So we're gonna do VM dot prank, or excuse me, Bob. Bob approves Alice spend tokens. So we'll say VM dot prank Bob, and we're gonna run our token dot approve Alice initial allowance. And if we go to our token, if we could. Command click or control click into the ERC-20 and we look up approve. There's this approve function, which has this inner function approve, where if we command click or control click on that, we update this allowances mapping. And if we go to our transfer from function in here, let's just look around for it. Here it is. We see that it calls this spend allowance function, which if we look at that one, it requires that the current allowance is greater than whatever amount that you're approving, whatever amount they're spending. So you have to explicitly approve other people to use your tokens. And you don't actually have to approve anything sometimes, right? You don't have to approve anybody to use your tokens. And that's probably the way you ideally want it. <laughs> but sometimes you do if a contract wants to keep track of how many tokens that you've sent it, for example. So we're going to prank Bob. We're going to approve Alice to use our tokens. And what we can do then is we're going to vm.prank Alice. And now she is going to take our tokens from Bob because Bob approved her to do so. So now we're going to do our token dot transfer from, and we're pretending to be Alice here, transfer from Bob. We're going to say from Bob to Alice 
And then we're going to create some transfer amount. We'll do like unit 256 transfer amount equals let's do half of the allowance at transfer amount. We have to do this transfer from function. If we were to do just transfer, transfer, if you do just transfer, whoever is calling this transfer function automatically gets set as the from. So if you call transfer, it automatically sets the from as whoever's calling. So that's the difference. So transfer automatically sets the from as whoever is sending the message. Transfer from, you can set anybody from, but it'll only go through if they are approved. That doesn't make sense. Ask questions in the GitHub repo. Now we can do a little assert equal. Our token dot balance of Alice is going to be that transfer amount, right? Because she took it from Bob. And then, oops, yep. And then assert equal our token dot balance of Bob is going to be that starting amount, starting balance minus the transfer amount. Transfer, there we go. Let's spell this right. And let's run this test forge test dash m paste it in. You can tell that I've written forge test dash m a billion times and it does indeed pass. Okay, great. So if we do forge coverage, we're gonna get hey, you got barely anything covered. Yep, sure. We have barely anything covered. So I actually wrote and we want to write some more tests for this. Now tests are something that AI is actually very good at doing. And let's go ahead and actually practice sending ChatGPT or any AI a prompt to actually generate some tests for us. If you want, in the Foundry ERC20 F23, we've got a little prompt for you to work with if you want to just copy paste it. So I'm going to copy mine, bring it over here, paste it in. But I'll tell you what it says. It says, here's my Solidity ERC20 token. And we literally paste it in the token that we just created. And here are our first couple of tests written in Solidity. So we wrote those couple of tests in here. Can you write the rest of the tests? Please include tests for allowances, transfers, and anything else that might be important. And let's see what it gives us. And we get an output. Looks something like this. So we can go ahead and grab this and stick it in our test and see what happens. So I'm going to go ahead and copy it. And I'm going to paste it. And I'm going to highly recommend you don't just blindly copy paste code from ChatGPT. That is a very quick way to accidentally get wrecked if the AI gives you a bad answer. I've already read through this, so we're going to be good to go. But you'll notice it, it already did a couple of weird things to us. So it removed the import deploy our token from our deploy script. And so I have to add that back in. Setup looks okay. It also removed Bob and Alice. It did some other weird tests. So I'm actually going to not blindly copy paste it. I'm actually going to undo that copy paste. And what we're going to do is instead, we're going to be a little bit more intelligent with how we work with AI. So I'm just going to take the stuff that I want out of here. Test allowance. I like our test allowance. Test transfer. Okay, we'll grab that. Test balance after transfer. Okay, test transfer from. Sure, let's grab those and see if those are good tests. Test transfer. Amount equals 100 gives us a dummy receiver, our token dot transfer receiver amount. So it equals our token dot balance of receiver is going to be amount. That's a good test. Test balance after transfer. It's going to doing another transfer and testing our balance. Okay, so that's pretty good. And then test transfer from it's doing some approve. It's doing an approve and a transfer from on itself. So that's like redundant. This isn't a great test, but whatever. Let's see how it did. Forge test. And we have some issues because of course we do. So we get test balance after transfer. This one fails. Why does this one fail? Let's do forge test dash M. Do that specific test. We'll do with some dash VVs in here. And we could see transfer amount exceeds balance. Why does this fail? Because we're not vm.pranking the message.sender. So we got to do that vm.prank message.sender. And we're gonna have to do that for everybody. Test transfer from vm.prank, vm.prank, although this is definitely redundant. Okay, no, that actually works. We'll vm prank the message sender. We'll prove address this and we'll do that. That one looks good. This one's gonna need a vm.prank. 
Okay, let's try this again. Forge test. A couple of these still failed. Test balance after transfer failed. Ah, it's because we're getting the address of this. We need to get the message.sender. So it should be the balance of message.sender instead. But you can see as I refactor this that AI can be helpful. It gave us the scaffolding to a lot of this, but we're still having to go back and redo some stuff. And this is why it's so important for us to actually understand what's going on. Still gets so much wrong. We get an insufficient allowance down here. So our token approving address this amount. Our token to transfer from address this to receiver. We would need to transfer from message to sender. Now that should be most of it. Forge test. And great, now all of our test passes and they actually pass and they're actually doing some coverage, right? It's not perfect. So if we run forge coverage, it's definitely not perfect. In fact, it barely did anything, but it did more tests for the ERC-20. But we could go back to ChatGPT and say, hey, great job. Can you write some more tests? Give us some more prompts, et cetera. But you can see that at least it can be very helpful in getting you started, getting you going, write tests if you haven't before. And of course, if you want to actually deploy this to a real network, you would do what? You would put your .env, your .private key, or you use third web deploy or something, and you deploy to a network. So that's it for this lesson. I know this was a quick one. Congratulations. I know this one felt a lot quicker and easier than the last one because now we're getting more advanced. Now learning actually becomes easier now that we have a solid foundation beneath us. So take a break, get some coffee, get some ice cream, and I'll see you in the next one. All right, welcome back to the next lesson in this course. You're getting closer to being able to go out in the world and actually be a Solidity developer and know what you're talking about. This is incredibly exciting. We've got a couple more lessons coming up. We have our NFTs, then we're gonna go into DeFi. Well, all of this is DeFi. Upgradable contracts, governance, and then a brief introduction into security. And then we can send you on your way to go start being a successful smart contract engineer in this space. So for our NFT project, let me do a quick overview of the code base that we're gonna be going over and what we're actually gonna be building. So here's the code base in my VS Code here. And what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be creating NFTs of these dogs, and we're gonna be creating dynamic NFTs that actually can change and have their values change. And we're gonna learn everything about what an NFT is, why they're special and what they do. And when we're finally done here, when we go up to our MetaMask, we'll actually be able to even import our NFTs and see our NFTs right in our MetaMask. Now, we're going to make two kinds of NFTs. We're going to make, first off, a basic NFT, which is just going to be this little dog, this little pug stored in IPFS. And then we're going to make a more advanced NFT where the entire NFT is actually stored 100% on chain, truly decentralized. And we'll learn a little bit more about the difference between those very soon. Additionally, the SVG on chain will change depending on some state that we give it. This is going to be our mood NFT. So it's going to change based off of our mood at the moment. So these are the two types of NFTs we're going to see, and we're going to be able to populate them into our MetaMask, which right now it's completely empty. Then we can go to a platform like OpenSea and actually start selling our NFTs or interacting with our NFTs or doing whatever we want there. So, and then we're also going to be finally teaching you all about what this ABI and code with selector that we saw earlier and, and that weird function selector thing that we kept hearing about. We're going to finally learn what those do. So strap in, let's get going. And let's first learn about what an NFT even is. So I made a video about NFTs a while back. For those of you who have never heard of an NFT, let's jump in and learn what those are. We're going to watch a portion of the previous Python edition of this course where I explain NFTs from a high level. And then, of course, we're going to get into the ultimate NFT tutorial. So let's learn about NFTs. Look, NFTs are hot right now. NFTs, also known as ERC-721s, are a token standard that was created on the Ethereum platform. NFT stands for non-fungible token and is a token standard similar to the ERC-20. Again, ERC-20 is like Link, Aave, Maker, all those goodies that are found on the Ethereum chain. An NFT or a non-fungible token is a token that is non-fungible. 
This means that they are starkly unique from each other, and one token isn't interchangeable with any other token of its class. A good way to think about it is one dollar is interchangeable with any other dollar. One dollar is going to have the same value of another dollar. Those are fungible tokens. That's like ERC-20s. One link is always going to be equivalent to one other link. By contrast, is going to be NFTs. Those of you nerds out there would know, like, a Pokemon would be a good example of an NFT. Your one Pokemon is going to have different stats, different movesets, and isn't interchangeable with any other Pokemon. Or maybe a more relatable one is like a trading card, a unique piece of art, or the like. So that's what these NFTs are. They are non-fungible, non-interchangeable tokens that, for the moment, are best represented or thought about as digital pieces of art that are incorruptible and have a permanent history of who's owned them, who's deployed them, etc. Now, like I said, NFTs are just a token standard. So you can actually make them do much more than just be art. You can give them stats, you can make them battle, you can do really unique things with them, you can do pretty much whatever you want with them. But right now, the easiest way to think about it, and the most popular way to think about it, is by calling them art, art, art. It's art! Or some type of collectible, or just anything that's unique. So like I said, they're just tokens that are deployed on a smart contract platform, and you can view them on different NFT platforms like OpenSea or Rarible. And these are the NFT marketplaces that let people buy and sell them. You obviously can do that without these marketplaces because it's decentralized, but they help and give a good user interface. Now, like many of you out there, my initial thought to NFTs was, okay, this sounds pretty dumb. But I think that that was dumb. I think art does have a lot of value, and I think that artists are not always paid fairly for what they do. And this is actually a huge issue right now in the modern day world, where an artist can make some type of art, people just copy paste it, you know, everywhere, and, uh, and they never get attribution for what they made. So having a really easy decentralized royalty mechanism or some type of mechanism where these artists can get accurately comped for what they're doing, I think is really important. I love music. I love movies. Those are pieces of art that I digest and I really like. And I think it's fair for them to get comped appropriately because they are providing value to my life. I think NFTs are a great way to solve this issue as kind of having these decentralized audit trails and, and royalty trails that we can set up and and see really transparently without having to go through some centralized service. So that's the basic gist of it. Let's talk some more about the standards. The ERC721 standard or the NFT standard. This is the basis of it all. There is another standard that's semi-fungible tokens, the 1155. We're not going to talk about that here, but you can check it out. The main differences between a 721 and an ERC20, on ERC20s they have a really simple mapping between an address and how much that address holds. 721s have unique token IDs. Each token ID has a unique owner. And in addition, they have what's called a token URI, which we'll talk about in a minute. Each token is unique. Each token ID represents a unique asset. So since these assets are unique and we wanna be able to visualize them and show what they actually look like, we need to define those attributes of the object. If it's a piece of art, we need a way to define what that art looks like. If it's some type of character in a game, we need a way to define that character's stats in the the NFT. This is where metadata and token URIs come in. So if you know anything about Ethereum, you know that sometimes gas prices can get pretty high, especially when it comes to storing a lot of space, it can get really, really expensive. So one of your first questions might be, well, are they storing these images and, and these art pieces on chain? And the answer is sometimes. Back when they were coming up with NFTs and artists were deploying stuff, the ETH devs and the artists were like, yeah, art, let's do that art. I'm just gonna deploy this one megabyte image onto the Ethereum chain and oh God, it's so much gas expensive. How do I hit the delete button? How do I? It's not dumb. It's not deleting. <laughs> and they realized that if they put all this art on chain, it was going to be incredibly expensive. So to get around this, what they did is they put in the standard what's called a token URI. This is a universally unique indicator of what that asset or what that token looks like and what the attributes of that token are. And you can use something like a centralized API or IPFS to actually get that token URI. A typical token URI has to return something in this format like this, where it has the name, the image location, the description, and then any attributes below. There is often this talk of on-chain metadata versus off-chain metadata. Because it is so much easier and cheaper to store all your metadata off-chain, a lot of people will use something like IPFS that is decentralized, but does take a little bit of centrality to keep persisting, but they can also use their own centralized API. However, obviously, if that goes down, then you lose your image, you lose everything associated with your NFT. Because of this, most NFT marketplaces actually can't and won't read off 
on-chain attributes or on-chain metadata because they're so used to looking for the token URI. Obviously, if you do off-chain metadata, you can't do anything really cool or really interesting or have any games with your NFTs. For example, if you wanted to create an on-chain Pokemon game, all your attributes would need to be on-chain in order for your Pokemon to interact with each other because if it was off-chain, then that becomes a lot harder to cryptographically prove. So if you're new with NFTs and you're like, wait, this is kind of a lot of information, I'll make it easy for you. If you're looking to render an image of an NFT, add your image to IPFS, add a metadata file, point to that image file on IPFS and then grab that token URI and put it and set it as your NFT. The Chainlink D&D article does a great job of walking you through this and showing you how to do this. So be sure to read that if you're looking to learn how to do that. We're not going to cover that in this video, but we will be deploying our first NFT with some on-chain attributes. Again, having your attributes on-chain is really going to allow you to build really creative NFTs that build games or have interesting properties and, and really makes the authenticity of your NFT guaranteed because those attributes are always going to be on chain. All right, great. So now that we know what an NFT is, let's begin to work on the full code. And remember, and again, for those of you who want to follow along, you can come on down to the course and find all the Git code associated with this lesson. And like I said earlier, we're going to be deploying our first NFTs and learning some incredibly advanced pieces of Solidity as well and some low level functionality. So let's begin. So same as always, MKDIR, Foundry, NFT, F23. Let's open that up. Code, Foundry, NFT, F23, or file, open, folder. Boom, blank, VS Code. Here we go. Pull that terminal back up. Let's close the Explorer. There. Forge, init, brand new, blank folder. All right, cool. Boom, boom, boom. Let's remove these three. Goodbye. Goodbye, counter. Dot get ignore. Okay, dot emv is in here. We're going to add broadcast as well. Okay, great. Now let's start to create this NFT. Like we said in the video, it's really just a token standard, just like the ERC20, the non fungible token standard. So, same as the ERC20, what we could do is we could walk through all of these functions and implement them ourselves, or we could just use, once again, our favorite package, Open Zeppelin. So if we go to the open Zeppelin contracts, we go to contracts, we scroll down, they have a token folder with an ERC721 in here, and an ERC721.sol with most of the functionality that we need already in here. So let's go ahead and use this instead of having to rewrite all these functions out. So in here, we're gonna go ahead, src, new file, basic nft.sol, and you know the drill, spdx, License, identifier MIT, pragma, solidity, 0.8.18, contract, basic NFT, like this. So let's go ahead, let's install this Open Zeppelin contracts. So if we scroll up, we're going to install Open Zeppelin slash Open Zeppelin contracts, forge, install, Open Zeppelin slash Open Zeppelin contracts, dash, dash, no dash commit. Great. And now that we have that, we're going to go to our foundry.tama. We'll do a little bit of remappings equals at open Zeppelin slash slash contracts equals lib slash open Zeppelin. And I'm going to do a toggle word wrap open Zeppelin dash contracts slash contracts like that. Okay, cool. So now we should be able to use open Zeppelin in here. So we'll do a little import at oh, even auto populates a little bit open Zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC 721 slash ERC 721 dot soul like that and then we can say our basic NFT is ERC 721. We will get a little red underscore here saying no arguments passed to the base constructor. If we command or control to click into this or just go to this folder up here, we scroll down to the constructor. We can see it takes a name and a symbol. So because of that, we're gonna have to copy this, create a constructor, boom. And then also use the constructor of the NFT base class, copy, or actually we're gonna call this dog. Instead of basic NFT, this is gonna be doggy like this. Okay, cool. 
So what do we need to do now that we have this? Are we done? Well, no, not quite, right? We didn't define what this is actually going to look like. We didn't define how to get this. There's a, there's a bunch of things we didn't quite finish doing yet. So let's add our own token counter just so that it's very easy for us to tell which number is which. And if we go back to this ERC20 token standard, there is a balance of function. But remember, these are unique. Even if I have 10 NFTs of a collection, those 10 NFTs aren't necessarily all worth the same. So there's this owner of function where we pass a token ID. When we launch this doggy ERC20 contract, it actually represents an entire collection of doggies. And each doggy in this doggy basic NFT collection is going to get its own unique token ID. So unique NFT is a combination of the contract address, which basically represents the collection, and then the token ID. So for us, we're just going to have a token counter represent each token ID, right? So we're going to say UN256 private S underscore token counter opens up and also has a built in plugin for this, but we're just going to roll with our own. And right when we deploy this contract, we're going to set S token counter to zero, right? Because this is going to be a storage variable and we're going to update it a lot. Every time we mint a new dog, we're going to update this token counter, right? Okay, cool. So now let's learn how to actually mint ourselves one of these puppies. So we're going to say function mint NFT public like this. And this is going to be the function we're going to do to do so. Now, if we scroll down to the bottom of the ERC EIP 721 section, we will come across one of the most important functions in the EIP 721, which is this token URI. What's crazy about this is this was originally considered an optional parameter. So a token URI stands for a token universal resource indicator, excuse me, uniform resource identifier. And a URL on the other hand, like what we see up here in the browser is a uniform resource locator. We can kind of see the difference between the two right here. A URL provides the location of the resource. A URI identifies the resource by name and the specified location or URL. You can basically think of this as a URL, but the difference between a URI and a URL are slightly different. But this token URI actually is an endpoint, some type of API call hosted somewhere that's going to return the metadata for the NFT. And it's going to return an object that looks just like this. It'll have a title, a type, some properties, etc. And it's this that defines what the NFT looks like. So for us to create this NFT, each token counter, each token URI is going to need to have this URI that points to what it should look like. Okay, and if that's a little bit confusing, don't worry, we're going to explain it as always. So why don't we do this first, we're actually going to skip this mint function and just go right down to function token URI. So the ERC 721 has a in open Zeppelin has a token URI function that looks like this. So we're going to override this since it's got the virtual keyword. So we can override this and write our own token URI function. Whenever you want to look at what an NFT looks like, it's this function that they're calling. So we can actually see any if we go to open C, you can really go to any popular NFT, I'll go to pudgy penguins, for example, we'll select any pudgy penguin, I'm just going to pick the one on top. We can go down, we can go to the details, contract address for this. We can see the token ID is 1378. We'll go to Pudgy Penguins, we'll go to the contract, we'll go to read contract, connect to Web3, sure, sure. We'll scroll all the way down to token URI, and I'll put in that token URI, I'll hit query, and then we get a response back that shows an endpoint that should return that metadata. And if we copy that, we paste into the browser, we indeed see we get some raw data that looks like this, with all the traits of this NFT. And then we also get this image section, which has this PNG, where if we put that in the browser, we do indeed get what the image what the penguin actually looks like. So this is hosted on IPFS. We'll learn what IPFS is in a little bit. Okay, great. So let's do this token URI bit. So the token URI needs to have a you went to 256 token ID passed, and this is going to be a public view, we need to override the base class implementation, and it needs to return 
a string memory, right? Because it needs to return, if we go back to the Pudge Penguin, it needs to return a string like this. Now, in V1, in, with our basic NFT, we're also going to use IPFS. And then in our second NFT, it's actually going to return a URI that's completely hosted on chain. Crazy, I know. Stay tuned. String memory. Okay. So what we could do in here, if we wanted to just have all of these be exactly the same, we could say like return, and I could even copy this if I wanted to, return, and just boom, paste it in like that. And now all of our dogs are going to have this pudgy penguin NFT token URI, right? We don't want that. We want to have our own metadata. So for your convenience, I already have a couple of images that we can borrow. So if you come to the GitHub repo associated with this lesson, go down to images, we go to dog NFT, you can feel free to pick the puppy that you want to use for your project. The pug, the Shiba Inu, maybe the St. Bernard. They're all so adorable. It doesn't matter. I'm just going to pick the pug because that's the first one. I'm going to save this image. I saved it to my downloads. I'm going to come to my files in here. I'm going to create a new folder, IMG, which stands for image. And I'm going to drag and drop this image in here or just paste it in there, whatever you want to do. Now that we have this image in here, we can use this. We can use this to get our token URI for our basic NFT. And there's a couple of different ways that we can use it. But first, we need to understand what IPFS is and how it actually works. Now, let me explain a little bit about how IPFS works. It's this distributed, decentralized data structure that's not exactly a blockchain, but it's it's similar to a blockchain. There's no mining though, but there is pinning data. You can add data to this. So let me explain how this actually works. And you can read how this works on the site. There's gonna be a link to this in the GitHub repo associated with this course, but let me give you my basic take on it. So we have our code or, or our file or whatever it is, right? We have some piece of data. Now, as we know, when you really have anything, you can hash that thing, you can hash that data, right? And you can get a, a unique output. So, and that's actually the first thing that IPFS does. It hashes our data to get a unique hash that only points to that data. Yes, a massive code file, a ton of text. Yes, you can encode all of that into a single hash function. Your IPFS node does this hashing for you. And every single IPFS node on the planet has the exact same hashing function, kind of like a blockchain, right? They all kind of run this same spec, the same specification. So we can hash our data on our IPFS node and get this unique output. What we can do then is we can then pin that data or pin that code or pin that file or pin that whatever to our node. We have some data, we get a unique hash of it. All it does is host this data and have these hashes. That's it. Our node is connected to a network of other IPFS nodes. So there's a massive network of people running IPFS nodes. They're incredibly lightweight, way lighter weight than any other blockchain node, and they all talk to each other. So if I ask the network, hey, I want to get this hash, all these nodes would talk to each other, and eventually they'd reach up at our node saying, oh, I found a node that has that hash. Here is the file associated with it. Now you might be thinking, okay, well, that's kind of centralized because we have the data on one node here, right? Well, you're right. Well, here's the thing. What other nodes can do is they can say, oh, that data looks really cool. I want to have that persist. What they can do is they can pin your hash. They can pin your data and they'll get a copy of your data on their node. And you can keep doing this. And so you easily allow an entire network to easily replicate any code or any data in a decentralized sense. And they're incredibly easy to spin up and they're incredibly easy to work with. Something about IPFS that makes it drastically different than a blockchain is they can't do smart contracts. There's no execution. It can really only store. It's just decentralized storage that IPFS can do. Now, the issue here is that in order for our data to really be decentralized, another node does need to pin our data, right? Because if we're the only IPFS node, that's got this hashed, it's kind of centralized on our node. If our node goes down, that data is gone and the network won't be able to access that data anymore. So we'll talk about strategies in the future about having other people pin your data. But for now, this is a way we can host data, we can send code and have it be in a decentralized context. So unlike a blockchain where every single node in a blockchain is going to have a copy of the entire blockchain, IPFS nodes get to optionally choose which data they want to pin. 
and they can't do any execution. So you could have an IPFS node half a megabyte and you could have an IPFS node that's several terabytes. It's up to the node operators how much data and what data they want to pin. Now that we know about IPFS, let's actually deploy our wonderful application to IPFS so that anybody can use it and anybody can connect to it so long as our node is up. Are you ready? Okay, get excited here. We're first gonna do this kind of the manual way because I'm gonna show you how to install IPFS and, and work with IPFS. Hit get started. There's a number of ways to install and work with IPFS. You can get it with a desktop application, get a command line, and then we can also add IPFS to our browser. If you're using something like Brave or I think Firefox 2, some of this IPFS router is automatically built in. But if you're using something like Chrome, you might have to add a little companion because what we want to do is we can actually use those little hashes as URLs for websites, right? And so we want to be able to put that URL in our browser and connect to that node or that piece of code. So what we're going to do is we're going to have you install the IPFS desktop. So you're going to hit that. And when you do that, you should be able to open up IPFS. Now, if you install it, you might get this little guy, this little box here in your upper section. Otherwise, you might be able to open it up with, with IPFS desktop and see it as a, a regular desktop app. But once you install it, you might see IPFS is running. You can restart, stop, you can do all this stuff. We're gonna go to the files section and we're gonna get a little pop-up that looks like this. Now, I've got a ton of stuff in here because I've been using IPFS for some time. In here right now, you might have no data. So let's just go ahead and import some file. And maybe for now, we'll just import Import, you know, our next.config.js, right? It doesn't matter, just import something. And now in here, we have this next.config.js or whatever file you imported. So what we can do with this is we can actually copy the CID and we can view this in our browser. So if we do IPFS dot dot slash slash, and we paste it in, we hit enter, we can give our browser access to actually rendering IPFS URLs. If you're using Brave, you can just do use a Brave local IPFS node, or let's go ahead and download this IPFS companion. So we'll hit get IPFS companion. There's a Firefox install for Chrome, Brave, blah, blah, blah. I'm gonna, so I'm gonna go to the Chrome store to get it for Brave. We're just gonna hit add to Brave, add extension. But once you download it, you'll get something that looks like this. Even on a little browser companion, we can see like import, we can see stuff about our node. If we click our node, we'll see a very similar setup but now that we have the companion in our browser, we can copy that CID, that hash. Now Brave, we can just do use Brave local IPFS node and will automatically get dropped into the file. Now, if IPFS companion doesn't work for you and you can't see the URL inside of something like Google Chrome or some other browser, what you can do is you can use something called the IPFS gateway. Now using a gateway, you're not actually directly requesting the data through IPFS requesting the data through another server, which is requesting it through IPFS. But if you are having some trouble accessing these files, you can use the gateway. So what you'll do is you'll do HTTPS slash slash IPFS.io slash IPFS slash, and then paste the hash code there. And you'll be able to see your file. Now, if you do it like this, you won't even need IPFS companion at all. Now that we've learned more about IPFS and the token URI, we can actually go to a marketplace like OpenSea and actually see this for ourselves. OpenSea is a marketplace for selling NFTs. And if we scroll down, we could go to really any NFT. Like for example, the Pudgy Penguins here, we could scroll down, really pick any NFT and look at it here. And if we go to its on-chain details, let me click this, we can see the source code of this. And if we scroll to read contracts, let's connect to Web3. Yeah, sure. Yep. We scroll all the way down and we click token URI of which ID was this? 4785. Grab that, paste it in here. We'll get this back. And if we copy that, paste it up here, we can see this metadata object similar to what we were looking at before. It's got some attributes, it's got a description, and then importantly, it has this name piece here. And if I copy this and paste it, we can see what the image of the NFT actually looks like. Now, important note, they're using HTTPS IPFS.io, which is okay because they're still using this IPFS. They're still using IPFS, 
But if the IPFS.io website goes down, this would render nothing. So ideally, when you're using IPFS, you use this syntax where you do IPFS colon slash slash and then the hash because this starting your URI with this will point to the IPFS network as opposed to using this will point to the IPFS website. So this is a centralized website. If you start with HTTPS, IPFS.io, this is pointing to the IPFS network, which is a distributed decentralized network. So they're definitely different here. The reason a lot of people do this though is because not a lot of browsers actually support IPFS. So this is HTTP and anyone can view it in their browser, but we could also use the IPFS.io of this. So I can even just grab this hash here. I can do IPFS colon slash slash, paste the hash in here. And since I'm using Brave, I can actually see this penguin folder in here and I can see all the different pieces that go in this folder. And then I would do penguin 4785, let's look at 4785. Boom, and I can see this right off of IPFS. Now this only works for me because I'm using Brave with a built-in local IPFS node. If you're using Chrome or Firefox or something like that, you can grab IPFS companion, add to Brave, or you can just go to the IPFS site, IPFS here, install IPFS desktop, and then I can pull up my IPFS UI. And what I could do is I could once again, grab this IPFS hash, copy it, paste it into my IPFS UI. And once again, I'd see the penguin folder. See there's three gigabytes in there. We could scroll through the folder and look through the files again. So you don't have to download the IPFS extension if you don't want to. However, it is a nice thing to have in your browser because a lot of projects do use IPFS and it's much easier to render them if you're using that IPFS companion, if you're using Chrome or something, or just use Brave Browser because Brave Browser comes with a built-in IPFS node. And the other thing is, once you get your own image, what you could do is either in your own IPFS node in your browser, or you could then upload this image to your IPFS node and get the hash and use that as the image URI for your own NFT. But if you want to make this a little easier on yourself for now, for now, we can just go to Foundry NFT F23. Let's go to script. I know we haven't written this yet, but we go to interactions.s.soul. We copy this IPFS hash. We copy this IPFS URI, paste it into the browser. And if you do have the IPFS node working, then you'll be able to actually see it like so. This is gonna be the metadata for the pug that we're gonna use. When you're uploading to IPFS, you'd have to upload both this image and this file, which on the image section has the URI of the image. So you'd upload the image first, get the image URI of the image, and then upload a file that looks like this with the image URI like in here so that we can see this little puppy. But for us, if you want to do all that, feel free to try it out. Feel, feel free to give it a whirl. But for now, we're just going to use this. Anyways, okay, back to our NFT. We could just literally paste the token URI in here so that every one of our dogs would be exactly the same, but let's make ours a little bit more creative. Let's allow people to actually choose their own token URI, choose their own what each one of their tokens will look like. So we'll allow them to pass in a string memory token URI. And then what we'll do is we'll say, <clears throat> we'll have a mapping at the top here, a mapping of UN256 mapped to a string we'll called do private S underscore token ID to URI, where this mapping will get a token ID and we'll get out a token URI. So we'll say S underscore token ID to URI. S underscore token counter equals token URI. And then we're gonna have to do S underscore token counter plus plus like that. We're gonna have to add one to it. And then we're gonna want to mint an NFT. We're gonna wanna set the balance of this and everything. In the Open Zeppelin ERC721, there's a safe mint function that we can actually call. So we're gonna call this safe mint function underscore safe mint message dot sender underscore s underscore token counter. So this safe mint function makes their balance plus one, it sets up their token counter and a few other things. So we'll have the safe mint. And then down here, instead of just returning some string, we'll say return s underscore token ID to URI token ID like this. Okay, cool. 
So now we have this real basic NFT, although it's even a little bit more advanced, right? Because anybody can mint an NFT and make it look like whatever they want, right? And if you do mint this NFT, this is a great opportunity for you to play around with minting NFTs that look different. All right, nice. So now that we have this basic NFT, let's go ahead and write a little deploy script. So we'll do deploy basic nft.s.sol. You already know the drill here as well. Let's zoom in a little bit. SPDX, license, identifier, pragma, solidity, contract, deploy, basic NFT is script. Import script from forge std slash script. We're going to have our function run, external returns. And we've done this enough. We're probably going to use this for our testing as well. So we'll have it return a basic NFT. So we're going to want to import that as well. Import basic NFT from dot dot slash src slash basic NFT dot soul. And in here, we'll do vm dot start broad cast like this. We'll do basic NFT basic NFT equals new basic nft like this vm.stop broadcast return basic nft okay that looks pretty good let's do a quick forge compile nice compiling successfully and you already know what comes next it's time for some tests but look at how fast we're going here so basic nft test t dot soul once again same business, SPDX, license, identifier, MRT, Pragma Solidity, 0 0.8.18, contract, basic NFT test is test. That means we're going to have to import test from forge std slash test.sol like this. In here, we're going to need our function set up. This is going to be public. We'll make a deployer. We'll do a deploy basic NFT deployer, say public deployer. And then we'll also have a basic NFT, public basic NFT. Up at the top, we're going to do import deploy basic NFT from dot dot slash src slash script slash deploy basic NFT dot s dot soul. Import basic NFT from dot dot slash src slash basic NFT dot so what I do here deploy NF deploy basic NFT dot s dot so oh not here there we go all right cool so now we're gonna say deployer equals new deploy basic NFT basic NFT equals deployer dot run looks good and let's write a test so we're not going to write all of the tests here but i do highly encourage you to pause the video after we write a couple tests here and you continue and write some of your own tests so let's start here and let's just make sure that the name is correct so the name here we have is doggy and dog let's go ahead and write a test to make sure this name is correct so we'll say function test name is correct this will be a public and I know this is going to be a view function, so I'm going to do view. And now here's where we run into our first issue. So string memory expected name is what? It's going to be doggy, right? That's the expected name. And the string memory actual name is going to equal what? Basic NFT.name, right? The open Zeppelin package that we imported, if we click into it and we click into this, we scroll down, there's this function name down here, which just returns the name, right? This is a public view. So we know it has this name function that we can call. So in our test, we could do basic nft.name. But if we do assert, well, assert equals or assert and do the equal stuff. Actually, let's do assert. We can't do expected name equals equals actual name. If we do it, we get this little red squiggly line that says built in binary operator equals equals cannot be applied to types string memory and string memory. And why not? Well, remember how we said strings are a special type, right? Strings are an array of bytes, 
or bytes array, right? And with bytes arrays, we actually can't compare arrays to arrays. We can only we can only compare primitive types or elementary types like a UN256, a bool, an address, bytes 32, etc. Right? We can't compare array of bytes, which means we can't compare strings since we can't compare arrays. So how do we make sure these strings are the same thing? Well, since it's an array, we could do like a for loop and loop through the array and then compare the elements of the array, right? If it's an array of bytes, let's say it's a array of bytes 32, right? Bytes 32s we can compare. So why don't we just loop through and do that? Well, we could, but to be honest, that's kind of too much work for us. <laughs> we, we want an easier way to actually compare these things. Now, what we could do is we could do this thing called abi.encode pack the entire array and take the hash of that. Remember what a hash is. A hash is a function that returns a fixed sized unique string that identifies that object. So if we hash these arrays, that would be an easier way to actually compare the two of them. We would just compare the hashes instead of looping through the array, which is going to be a lot more coding and it's going to be a lot more verbose. So this is something again, where your whatever AI buddy you're working with will probably get this right. We ask them, how can we compare two strings in solidity or strings? I should spell correctly. ChatGPT and hopefully most AIs are actually able to get this for you. Hey, strings are more complex types. They're essentially dynamic arrays. Yep. And therefore can't be compared directly with equals equals. So if we scroll down, they're doing something similar. They're converting the strings to bytes and getting the hashes of that. That works too. We're going to convert them to bytes using ABI and code packs. Now, this is where I will often use a tool like chisel, which comes built in with foundry to help me get a good idea of what I'm doing makes sense, right? So what I can do is I can say string memory cat equals cat, say string memory dog equals dog. If I put type in cat, I get this crazy weird output that looks like this, but this is kind of the hex of this cat, if you will, right? What I can do is I could say bytes memory encoded cat equals abi.encode packed cat. And now I have encoded cat, which is of type dynamic bytes. And now we have a bytes object. We can actually hash a bytes object. So we could say bytes 32 cat hash equals kid check 256 encoded cat. And now we have a cat hash, which is just a simple bytes 32. So we can convert our strings to bytes and convert the bytes to a bytes 32. And we just compare the hashes of both of those. So we'll hit control C twice to exit, clear the terminal. And let's use that methodology here. And I know I haven't explained this ABI dot encode hacked yet, but I will very soon in this lesson, I promise. So for now, just kind of think it's magic. All right. But I promise I'm going to explain it very soon. So what we can do is we can do assert kitchak 256 of the abi.encode packed of the expected name is going to equal kitchak 256 of the abi.encoded to be a code encode packed actual name. And I'm going to open up the command palette, do toggle word wrap here like this. And this is how we can actually compare the two strings by encoding them. So now if I pull up the terminal, forge test dash M, test name is correct, or just forge test. Boom, we get this indeed passes. So this is how we can tell these two names are the same. If this was something like Toggy, and we ran this now, you're going to see that it's going to fail. Fails. Great. So let's bring it back to Doggy. Awesome. So we have a way to actually test if these strings are the same. Let's write two more tests. So we'll do function test can mint and have a balance. Make this public. Let's create some user. So back up at the top, we'll do address public user user equals make ADDR user like this. We'll make a user down here. We'll prank them BM dot prank user. We'll do basic NFT dot mint NFT. 
And this is where we're going to need to add some token URI. And this is where I'm going to recommend we come over to the GitHub repo associated with this course. And let's for now just grab an IPFS hash to use. So we're going to say string memory. Actually, let's just do this at the top. String memory public constant pug equals paste it in here. Oh, sorry, not memory. Obviously, this is a storage variable. And then if you want to, I recommend you trying to upload your own metadata file to IPFS. Remember, it needs to be in this JSON format with a list of attributes. And then the image is going to be its own file uploaded to IPFS. And then you're going to take that and put it in the image section here. Definitely recommend you guys trying it out. But we have this pug. We're going to use this down here, mint NFT pug. And then we can do a little we can do a little assert. We can say assert first off basic NFT dot balance of user is going to be equal to equal one. And we can also do a little assert. We can make sure that the token URI of this NFT is this pug, right? So we can say assert. And this is where we do the catch act 256 again, ABI dot encode packed pug is going to be equal to a check. Oh, it's just K. I don't think it's CK. 256 ABI dot encode act basic NFT dot token URI zero. Ooh. All right, let's try this one. Let's just do forge test. Let's run both tests. And we did it. Okay, awesome. Now we're probably going to want a way to mint this token programmatically, we could of course use cast, but maybe we want to do an interactions.s.soul. And here, you already know the drill, we're going to do SPDX license identifier, IT, pragma solidity contract, we'll call it mint basic NFT is script, import script from Forge std slash script dot soul. In here, we're going to have a function external, oops, function run external, which is going to mint our NFT. And we always want to be working with the most recently deployed NFT. So we're going to, we're going to use this foundry DevOps package. We're going to go ahead and install this, copy the URL, forge install cell slash foundry devops dash dash no commit clear it out and in here we're going to say address most recently deployed equals oh we're going to have to grab this devops tools so we're going to say import devops tools from foundry devops slash src slash devops tool dot so and this is actually lib right here now we're going to say equals this, this most recent deployed is going to be the DevOps tool dot get most recent deployment. And we're looking for the basic NFT, comma block dot chain ID, oops, like this, and I'm going to toggle the word wrap here as well. And then we're going to have a mint NFT on contract function where we're going to pass in the most recently deployed, and I'm going to make a function mint NFT on contract, address, contract, address, this is going to be a public function, vm.start broadcast. And then we'll take this address, we'll say basic NFT, contract address dot mint NFT. And I'm actually going to grab this pug string from my test, paste it into the interactions up at the top, pug, mint NFT, Pug, beam dot stop broadcast. All right, cool. And I probably need to import this basic NFT. So import basic NFT from dot dot slash src slash basic NFT dot soul. All right, cool. So we have a way to deploy this, a way to mint this, and all those goodies. Now, there's a couple of ways we could actually see this for real. Right. So having it in our test here is cool, but I want to see it like in my MetaMask, right? Right now, if I go to NFTs, I don't see it in here. 
So I am going to deploy this to a test net, but another way we could work with this is we could deploy this to Anvil. We could deploy this to our own Anvil and we could switch over to Anvil, right? Oh, obviously my Anvil isn't up right now. We could switch over to Anvil and we could see it in, in an, on the Anvil chain. If you don't want to have to wait for the test net, if you don't want to spend the gas, I recommend that you do that. But for now, I'm going to go ahead and deploy it to a test net. You do not have to follow along with me here, but if you want to, you can. Now, once again, though, uh, I'm going to make a make file just so I don't have to write out those super, super long scripts here. And I'm going to save you the trouble. If you just come to the Git repo associated with this lesson, you can just copy my make file instead of having to rewrite all this stuff yourself. Copying stuff is usually pretty good. There's going to be a couple of these that uh, don't exist yet. So actually, if you want to just copy everything down to the deploy, go ahead and do that. I'm going to paste everything in there here. It's got most of what we've already talked about. We've got our deploy script, which this is what we're going to run to deploy our basic NFT. And then let's also add a mint in here. And I don't have this, but we'll, we'll I will add this. And this will be forge script script slash uh, interactions dot s dot soul mint basic NFT network args. And of course, we should write some tests before shipping this on a test net. But I just want to show you guys what this NFT looks like. So we're going to do make deploy args. Oh, and actually make sure to add our dot I'm going to add my Sepolia key in here and my private key. Since I'm going to be working with my make file, I don't even have to run source.env since the make file includes the .env. But now I can just run, scroll down in my make file. Let's run make deploy args equal dash dash network folia. And we're going to go ahead and deploy this. We're deploying our basic NFT to this contract address. Okay, great. We're gonna have to wait a little bit for it to be verified. All right, cool. After it's up, we could even go see this on Sepolia testnet. Contract is verified. Okay, very nice. We could go ahead and write contract from Etherscan, but we're gonna do it the cool programmatic way. So now that we have this, we're gonna have our broadcast folder, which is gonna have our latest run in here with our created basic NFT. And because it's in here, that's how our DevOps tool actually works. It grabs the most recent from that folder. We do need to turn FFI equals true in here, FFI equals, in order to run this command. So what we can do now, and remember, anytime you set FFI to be true, you want to just double check that the package that you have is actually going to do what you want it to do. So if we look in this lib, Foundry DevOps, we go to SRC, we can see the actual bash script that's going to be running. If I guess if you're familiar with bash, you could read through this and figure this out. You drop it into you could also copy paste this into something like ChatGPT and say, what does this code do? Paste it in. ChatGPT and most AIs are usually pretty good at bash. So it gets it right. This bash script is is designed to search through JSON files in a specified directory and find the latest created contract address for a given contract name on a specified blockchain. That sure is what it's supposed to do. So, and just one more thing on this DevOps thing. So this is kind of my temporary solution to not seeing a better DevOps tool in the wild. I'm going to have in here as well, up at the top, similar to recommended testnet, I'm going to have a recommended DevOps package. So right now, the one that I'm using is the one that I made, but I'm going to have a recommended DevOps package because a couple other people are working on improvements to this. So FFI equals true. Now that we have all this, we're going to run make deploy or excuse me, make mint args equals dash dash network sepolia like this. And now we're going to grab that most recently deployed basic NFT and we're going to call the mint function on it. Now, while this is minting, what we can do so we can come up to our MetaMask here. We'll go to this contract address that we just deployed. We'll copy this. And once this finishes going through, once this transaction finishes going through, we can copy this address, go to our MetaMask, 
go to NFTs. Oh, let's actually switch to Sepolia. Go to NFTs. We'll select import NFTs and we can paste the address and then our token ID should be zero because we should be the first ones to have created this and we'll hit add and it'll wait a little bit and then we'll be able to see our NFT right in our MetaMask. We see our cute little doggy and we can do whatever we want with it. We can see it's smart enough to grab this token URI. We can see the image here and we can see the contract address on chain. We can send it, we can do whatever we want with it, right? So we can see the NFT right in our MetaMask. And this is what we would see on a marketplace like OpenSea as well. Fantastic. All right, we deployed an NFT. We can see it in our MetaMask. This is great. Now there's a couple of things that we still need to go over. Number one, what's the issue with this NFT? Why might IPFS not be the best place to have your image stored? It's better than using HTTPS and then a website, but why might this not even be as good? And then additionally, what the heck is this ABI.encode pact? We've used this ABI encode function selector, encode this, encode that. What is this? Well, one at a time. Let's first answer the question, why might this still not be the best place to host this data? So if we host our image on a website, right? Like you saw some of the pudgy penguins were HTTPS. You saw a couple of my images use HTTPS. Again, like I said, if those websites go down, if you go to view that NFT, you're going to get nothing back. You're going to get a broken JPEG link, making your NFT essentially, well, worthless, right? So IPFS is much better because anybody can pin this and keep that image up forever. So let's actually begin to work on a solution where we can actually host our NFT on a more decentralized, more censorship resistant, more permissionless, more immutable way. The issue, as I was saying with IPFS, is that if I'm the only IPFS node that has this data pinned, and my node goes offline. For example, if my IPFS node is just on my computer right here and I turn my computer off, nobody can have access to that file, which means that if we went to my MetaMask or to OpenSea, we would see a broken JPEG image here, right? We wouldn't see anything. The reason IPFS is better than a centralized server is because other people can pin this, right? If I put this NFT up and other people like this NFT collection or this NFT, they can pin it to their own nodes. But this method is so popular because it is incredibly cheap to do, right? It's really easy to spin up an IPFS node and pin your data to that node. This method that I'm about to show you is a little bit more expensive, but it's way more decentralized because all of your metadata is actually going to be on chain. Now, here's one thing that you, here's one thing you can do so that when you pin data to an IPFS node, it actually stays up there for a good. What you can do is you can come to different services like pinata.cloud and actually have them pin your metadata for you. So what I can do is I can come here, let's start building, sign up, I'm a builder. And once we're logged in here, just like an IPFS node, we can hit add files, choose a file, and then just drop your file in here. And when you do that, you'll be able to get a hash of each one of your projects like this one. And this way, you know you have somebody else at least pinning your data. And whenever I'm using a project that uses some type of file in IPFS, I always deploy the file to my own IPFS node, and then I'll also pin it to something like Pinata as well. But what we can do is we can use something called an SVG. Now, I've got a tutorial on this using Hardhat with your SVG being 100% on chain. If you want to go check that out, it's going to be very similar to what we're doing here. And we've got an example of a totally on-chain SVG, which this looks pretty ugly, I know. But this was a, a project where I had a chain link VRF create random lines to make a provably random SVG on-chain. So we're going to use this strategy where we're going to basically encode our image as an SVG type, and this image is stored 100% on-chain. Now, this image is gross and doesn't really look like anything. The images that we're going to do we're going to be in this image folder, dynamic NFT. It's going to be like this happy SVG and that sad SVG, right? So a little bit more interesting. So let's first understand what an SVG even is. 
So if we go to w3schools.com, we can go to this SVG tutorial. So SVG stands for Scalar Vector Graphics. And we can actually scroll down and we can see an example right in this SVG example, right? So this is it. So it looks, it's just kind of this tag where it has very specific parameters for defining what an image looks like. And the reason that SVGs are so cool is because no matter how big or small you make them, they're always going to have the exact same quality because they are scalable. You know how like if you take an image like this one, let me view this. Now if we take this image, right, and I make it super, super big, I'll make it super big, the bigger I make it, the worse the quality gets. With an SVG, you don't ever have to deal with that because you define exactly what it'll look like no matter what size. And what we could do is we can actually make our own SVG sort of like this, right? And if you're in the W3 schools, if you hit try for yourself, you can see my first SVG over here. And I could change this. I could say the fill is now blue. We'll run and it now it turns blue. I can say the stroke is black, right? And it turns black. So there's a ton of different parameters and functions that we can do to make an SVG look a certain way, right? So if we're back in our VS code, we can even go up to IMG, new file, example.svg, we can code some SVG in here. So we'll do SVG, XML and S equals, and this is just some versioning stuff, HTTP, www.w3.org, slash 2000, slash SVG, give it a width of 500, a height of 500. These need to be in strings. And then we'll have a closing SVG tag. And here we'll make some text. We'll say fill equals black. Hi, you decoded this backslash text. Like this real minimal SVG like this. And then if we go to extensions, we can look up SVG. And there's a couple of different SVG viewers and SVG previewers. I forget which one's the best one. Let's go with this one for now. And now what we can do is go back to our SVG, open up our command palette, type in SVG, preview SVG. I'm going to install this SVG preview. I'm going to go ahead and hit install. Now we can come back to our SVG, open up SVG preview, open preview to the side. And it looks blank. So let's fix that. We'll say x equals zero, y equals 15. x equals zero, y is 15. Fill is black. Text. Okay, that looks good. Preview the SVG and boom. We can see oops, this little high your browser decoded this on the side. Now, this is just the SVG. And this storing all this on chain is not a URI, right? Our NFT needs a URI, right? It needs this string. This is not a URI, this is an SVG. But what we can do is we can actually convert this into a URI that our browser can understand. And we're gonna pass all the data we need in the URL of our browser. So it's gonna sound really bizarre, right? But what we're gonna do is we're gonna CD into that image folder and we're gonna run a command called base64. Now, not all computers have this. You can check by doing base64 dash dash help. If you don't have this, don't worry. You can just copy paste what I'm going to be doing. We can actually base64 encode the out everything in here. And what I can say is I could do base64 dash i, which means we're going to input a file and we're going to pass in this example.svg. We'll see we get this weird thing as an output. So now if we take this weird thing, and I'm going to actually create a little little readme to make some notes here. So this weird output is the base64 encoded example.svg we just created. Now at the start of this, we can add a beginning piece to tell our browser that this is an SVG. So I'm going to say data colon image slash SVG plus XML base64 comma like this. And if I copy this whole thing, oops, sorry, this isn't, this should be a semicolon here. If I copy this whole thing and I paste it into any browser, we're going to get this hi, your browser decoded this. So basically, what we did was we encoded this SVG file and put this data image SVG plus XML colon base64. So our browser knew how to decode it and then just passed the entire image through 
our browser URL. And boom. So we can also do this with images. So if I go back to the repo associated with this lesson, go to images, dynamic NFT, we go to happy SVG, happy.svg, we go down to code instead of preview and see the exact code here, right? So we create this view box, oops, we create some circles, we create this path, which is how we just kind of draw lines. And I can copy this whole thing, paste it into my image. So I'm going to say, oops, image, I'm going to do happy SVG, happy.svg, paste it in here. If I pull up the preview, I see the preview is a happy. Now what I can do is I can do base 64-i happy.svg. We get this output. I can copy this output. Let me go over to the readme, paste it. I'm going to add this beginning piece to it and then copy this whole thing. Go back to my browser, paste it in, and boom! We passed all of this data to generate this SVG right in the URL. And this is, looks like, yes it does, a token URI, right? So now, instead of using an IPFS hash for our token URI, we can actually 100% on-chain use this SVG thing. And because this SVG is basically code on chain, we can update it and interact with it to make it do whatever we want it, right? For example, if our has happy SVG, we could say, okay, if, if somebody has 10 tokens, right, they get 10 circles or something like that, right? We can do whatever we want with this. So let's learn how to make one of these SVGs on chain and we'll make it so that our NFT is actually dynamic so that our NFT can change, it can evolve, it can grow, whatever we want to do with it. And then at the end, we'll finally learn what this ABI and code packed stuff is, right? And this is going to be incredibly important for those of you looking to go the extra mile, looking to go really far and looking to become really advanced smart contract developers. So let's build our mood SVG NFT, which can change its mood, change the image of the NFT, and it's 100% stored on chain. So let's show you what we're gonna be building. We're gonna be building this NFT called a mood NFT, a mood NFT. And in here, we're gonna have a function called flip mood. And what this is gonna do is if we're happy, it's gonna make us sad. And if we're sad, it's gonna make us happy. And it's gonna flip between these two images between the happy and sad, right? If I go to images, dynamic NFT, we have this happy SVG. If we're happy, our NFT will show happy. And if we're sad, we'll show sad, right? We're gonna have this 100% beyond chain. We're gonna learn more also about how to work with this metadata and everything. And we're gonna do this end to end. So let's create this mood NFT. So let's go to SRC, new file, mood NFT.soul. And you know the drill, SPDX, license, identifier, MIT, Pragma, oops, Pragma, Solidity, 0 0.8.18, little carrot. Contract, mood, NFT, like this. This is gonna be an NFT, so we're gonna copy some of the stuff from the basic NFT. We're gonna copy this import, paste it in here. And all right, we're gonna say this NFT is an NFT, make a constructor, ERC721, this is gonna be called mood NFT, NMN for mood NFT, like this. And we're going to write in the constructor, we're gonna pass the happy mood and the sad mood SVGs. So an image, right here we have our happy SVG, great. If you guys wanna create your own sad SVG, go for it but I recommend you just come here, go to code, and let's copy this new file, sad.svg, paste it in here, like this. I don't know why I have this first line, I'm gonna delete that, preview it, yep, looks good. So we have a sad face and a happy face, nice, okay, cool. And then yeah, actually, if we pull up our happy face, right, if we preview this again, and we're gonna change the circle from like 61 to like 20, I'm like literally moving the eyes <laughs> as we go, you can make whatever monstrosity you want. Feel free to do that. But we're gonna take those SVGs as input parameters. So we're gonna say string memory sad SVG 
string memory happy SVG. All right, cool. And you'll see why we do that in a second. Let's create a token counter. So we'll do u into two to six private s underscore token counter. We'll set the token counter in the constructor to zero. And let's save these as well. So we'll do string private s underscore sad SVG string private s underscore happy SVG. We'll say sad SVG equals the sad SVG. Oops, equals sad SVG and happy SVG equals happy SVG. Okay, cool. So now we're going to make it so that anybody can mint one of these. So we'll say function mint NFT. This will be public. Anybody can mint their own mood NFT. We'll do a little safe mint function where we'll give the message dot sender the S underscore token counter. So they get their token ID. We're going to say S token counter plus plus. We'll add one to it. And that looks pretty good. And now we'll want to define what this NFT actually looks like. So this is with the token URI function, of course, which takes a UNT56 token ID. It'll be a public view override, and it's going to return a string memory like this. Now, how do we actually get our NFT to show this stuff, this SVG NFT? Well, we're going to pass the SVG text in here, right? But what we could do instead of that is we could just pass in the encoded image already, right? We could just encode these images ourselves. So if I, for example, and we kind of already did, right? If we open up our readme, I'm just going to delete everything. Let's do happy SVG. What we can do is we could pull this up, clear. We could do base 64-i, happy SVG, copy this, hit enter. We need to prepend with data, image slash SVG plus XML, semicolon, base 64, comma, paste that in. If I copy this, I can just double check by pasting it in the browser. Yep, okay, that looks good. So that's going to be our happy SVG. We can do the same thing with our sad SVG, base 64-i, sad SVG. Do the same thing. We're going to copy this output it gave us, which is a lot bigger. Paste it in here, and we're just going to prepend it with this as well. Boom. Copy the whole thing. Paste it in here. And cool. We have a sad SVG as well. Nice. So we have those already. So why don't, instead of us passing in the text, of the SVG and the NFT, instead of passing in these, we just pass in the already encoded version, right? It'll save us a step. We can base 64 encode these on chain, and I'll show you how to do that in a second, but it'll probably save us some gas if they're already encoded. So instead, let's say sad SVG image URI, set happy SVG image URI. Let's have these be the imports instead. And it's important that it's just the image URI we're passing. We're not passing the token URI right? Why not? Because well, the token URI, if we go back to our, our pug test, the token URI is going to look like this, where it's not the actual image. It's this JSON object. It's this metadata object. The actual image URI is here. The actual token URI is here. Okay, so this is the token URI. This is the image URI. Token URI, image URI. This is what the NFT looks like. This describes everything about the NFT. This is the token URI. So this, in our readme, this giant thing, well, or this thing is the image URI. It is not the token URI, it's the image URI. So back in our mood NFT, we're getting that image URI. So let's make this more specific. Let's call it sad SVG image URI, happy SV image URI. So sad, happy. So we're gonna pass this already encoded data to our NFT. Nice. So how do we actually store this, this object on chain? Well, we can actually encode JSON objects the same way we encoded SVGs using that base 64 stuff. And we can actually do it on chain using Open Zeppelin's base 64 package. Open Zeppelin has some utilities where one of them is a base 64. 
Base64 utils allows you to transform Bytes32 data into a Base64 string representation. So that's what we're going to do now. We're first going to make our metadata JSON object, and then we're going to use OpenZeppelin to convert this JSON object into a JSON token URI. So let's learn how to do that. So we already have OpenZeppelin installed. Oh my goodness, I'm such a noob. I'm so sorry. Named import from, here we go. Okay, cool. Now let's go ahead and let's import. We're going to import this base64 file from at open zeppelin. We've already got the remappings and everything. Contracts slash utils slash base64 dot soul. It's in the package, I promise. And we can use this base64 thing to actually encode stuff. So let's scroll down to our token URI. And let's first, let's just write out this as if it were just a giant string. Right, let's just create this metadata object. So first, boom, name. Let's get rid of that. What's our name going to be? And let's make this just a giant string. So let's say string memory token metadata equals name. And we're going to need to combine this string with the name of our NFT project here. We'll do a little comma, boom, boom. We could do this. Oh, and then. Little comma here, but we could do abi.encode hacked to concatenate this whole string together. Or we learned another way to combine strings. We could do string.concat like this. Boom. So we can concatenate this. And what this will print out is name mood NFT, right? Because we're combining the name and the mood NFT. So that looks pretty good. However, we need the rest of the stuff. So we need name, description, image, and then attributes, right? So we got a name in here. Let's keep going. What else do we need? Well, we should do, so we shouldn't finish it here. Let's even just delete this. We should do a comma, space, and I'm going to toggle word wrap again, just so that it's on. Description, and then we can just add whatever we want in here. Let's say an NFT that reflects the owner's, oops, the owner's mood. Great. We'll do a comma attributes. Now our attributes are going to be in this list style here. So we're going to say attributes, little list here, another bracket. We're going to say trait type, say just kind of a silly attribute here. Moodiness value 100 and then close it off, close off the list. Okay, cool. Looks good. Image. And now this is finally where we put our image URI, right? Image URI, and then we'll say comma, and then we'll finally close off the text here. So this is going to be the metadata of our token. Since we're parameterizing it a little bit, it, it will look like this once this, the two of these populate, right? Our image URI though, we need to derive based off of the mood of each person, which we haven't defined yet. So we should make a little mapping of like token ID to mood. So we can do that up here. We'll say mapping you into 256 to, to mood. And let's even create an enum mood of happy and sad. And this way, if we wanted to add more moods later, we could add more moods later. So mood, this will be a private S underscore token ID to mood. And when an NFT gets minted, let's just default them. We'll say the mood is going to be of S tone counters will be mood dot happy. So we're going to default them to being happy. So to get the image URI up at the top here, we could do a little if statement. We could say if S underscore token ID to mood of the token ID equals mood dot happy. Let's do this. Let's create this blank string memory image URI. We'll say image URI equals S underscore happy SVG image URI. And we'll say else image URI equals S underscore sad image URI. So now we have a way to add the image, whether their person is happy or sad, right to the token metadata here. Of course, we're probably going to want a way to flip our, our mood and we will add that later. So this is looking pretty good, but this is just the token metadata. 
right? This isn't uh, this isn't the whole thing. This isn't the whole shebang. Because this is just a string. We need this token URI to return a string that looks like like this, a string we can post in the browser. This string, eh, you can't really post this in the browser URL, right? So what we need to do is with this token metadata string, we do string.concat or string.concat is nice, but we actually need to convert it to bytes. And we need to do abi.encode packed like this, and it needs to not be a string. abi.encode backed, and we need to make it a bytes like this. We actually could do string.concat, but we just do abi.encode packed because we need to convert this to bytes in order to use the Open Zeppelin Base64 encoder. If we look at the Open Zeppelin Base64, it says it allows you to transform bytes data into strings. And you can see actually in the examples here of the Open Zeppelin docs, it also uses an NFT as its example. So we need to convert abi.encode packed to bytes, and then we can do base64.encode this whole thing like that. And now, now that we're base64 encoding it, that's equivalent to us getting this giant piece when we did it from the command line. We still need this beginning piece. So we can get that by just adding, concatenating this beginning part. So this is where we're gonna need this beginning part. Now, since this is a JSON object, it's not a data image SVG XML, we're gonna need to create a function. Let's create a function called underscore base URI. It's gonna be internal pure override because the ERC721 also has a base URI function that we're just gonna override. It's gonna returns string memory. For working with JSON objects, we'll say return data application slash JSON semicolon base 64 like this. So this is gonna be the base URI of our metadata return. We're gonna concatenate this with this by doing abi.encode packed or string.concatenate abi.encode packed like this. And then we're gonna wrap this whole thing up as a string like this and then return it. Okay, that's kind of a big thing here. So we'd still wanna be able to flip the mood and everything, but let's write a test just to see if this is working correct. First, we created this string. We concatenated together using abi.encode packed. We turned it into a bytes object. Then we encoded that bytes object. We combined that with a base URL, and then we turned that whole thing into a string and return that. So let's do a quick sanity test here. So we're gonna create a new file, mood nft test.t.sol. And we're not even gonna write a deploy script yet. We're going to write a deploy script, but we're gonna skip it for now. And we're gonna do, and we're gonna just make sure that this token URI function is working correctly, right? It should default to the happy SVG. So we'll do SPDX, license identifier, pragma solidity, carrot 0.8.18, contract mood NFT test is test. Import test from forge std test.sol function setup public. And we're gonna, of course, need to import our mood NFT from that dot slash src slash mood NFT dot sol. We'll say mood NFT, mood NFT up at the top. And then we'll even just deploy this ourselves. We'll say mood NFT equals new mood NFT. And our mood NFT takes what? Takes the sad SVG URI and the happy SVG URI. So we could do string public constant happy SVG, happy SVG URI equals, we'll go back to our readme because we already created these. And we'll copy this little string here like that. And then we'll do the same thing. String public constant sad SVG URI equals, same thing. We already created this one. We're gonna copy this paste it in here, semicolon. So what goes first, the happy or the sad? Sad goes first, okay, why did we put the sad first? Sad first, happy SVG URI. Okay, cool, so now we have our mood NFT. 
Now we'll do function view or function test view token URI like this. We make this a public view or no, just public actually. And what we'll do is we'll do mood NFT dot mint NFT. Now we should have look at our mint function. We should now have a token URI, a token zero. And then we can just do a console.log mood NFT dot token URI of zero. Right. And of course we're gonna need to import console from test.sol. We can do that console.log. Okay, cool. We'll pull this up, go down to the foundry NFT F23 directory, PWD. Cool, we're in the right one. Forge test dash M dash VV. So we can see the console.logs. Transfer to non ERC721 receiver implementer. So this is already an interesting error that we're getting. So when we call mint NFT in our test, we're actually minting it to this test contract, right? And this test contract doesn't have a receive function and open Zeppelin baked in some code so that people wouldn't accidentally send NFTs to contracts that can't transfer them or do anything with them. So instead, we're just gonna do vm.prank, we'll create a user, we'll do address user equals make ADR user, and we'll prank the user so that it'll go to a user, it'll go to an address as opposed to a contract. So we can actually see this error. We go to the ERC721 contract, we look for that error, and we see on the safe transfer from, there's this check on ERC721 received. And if we click into this function, it does a whole bunch of checks in here, it basically checks to see if there's a function selector called on ERC721 received, right? And again, the reason for this is to make sure that if you're sending this NFT to a contract address, it's expecting to get an NFT so it could possibly remove them, right? Or, or transfer them or whatever, right? So for now, we'll just prank a user. We'll rerun our test, pull this up. And okay, we get this as our log. So this is gonna be our token URI. We can see the data application slash JSON base 64. And we're assuming this is the encoded JSON object. So if we grab this, paste it into our browser now. Okay, that looks pretty good. That looks like a JSON object. Then if we grab this, paste this into our browser, we see the happy SVG NFT. So this is how we can know that our token URI function is actually working correctly, right? Because we can see that it's printed out. And what we could do if we wanted to is we could start up our Anvil chain, right? Make Anvil and deploy to Anvil, then mint an NFT on Anvil, switch over to Anvil and try to see it in our MetaMask as well. So if you want to do that, highly recommend you give that a try. Our NFT is looking pretty good here. We got our token URI to work. We just need to be able to flip it, right? We need to be able to change its mood. We also need to write a deploy script as well. Let's write the flip mood function, and then we'll work on the deploy script. So down here, we'll create a new function called flip mood, where we're just going to change the mood of the NFT. So you and 256 token ID, it's going to be public. Now first, we're going to say we only want the NFT owner to be able to change the mood, right? So first, we're going to have to make sure that it's the actual owner that's calling this. And the ERC721 from Open Zeppelin actually comes with a function called underscore is approved or owner. So we can say, okay, if they're not approved or owner before we're sending this message of the token ID, then we're gonna gonna go ahead and revert, right? So if they're not approved or owner, we're gonna revert. And we're gonna make a new error at the top. Errors. We'll say error. Mood NFT underscore underscore can't flip mood if not owner like this. Copy this, come down here, and we will revert with that. And then all we're gonna do is we're gonna say if s underscore token ID to state or to the to mood of the token ID is equal to mood dot happy, then we're gonna change their mood to sad equals mood.sad. 
else, we're going to copy this line again, else we're going to change them to happy. All right, cool. So now we have a function that can actually flip their mood as well. Great. Everything's looking pretty good here. Let's go ahead and create a deploy script. So new file, deploy, mood nft.s.song. All right, so let's go ahead and deploy this mood NFT or write the script to deploy it anyways. So you know the drill, SPDX, license, identifier MRT, pragma, solidity, oops, like so, contract, deploy mood NFT dot, or contract deploy mood NFT is script. We're gonna import script from forge std slash script dot soul like that contract con rect and this needs a semicolon okay nice we of course need a function run external we already know this is going to need to returns a mood nft which let's import that now import our mood nft from dot dot slash src slash mood nft dot soul bada bing bada boom we are cooking all right now our mood nft how do we deploy this bad larry well let's go to it what does it take as input it takes a sad svg image uri and a happy svg image uri now we could hard code those in here right right like we did in our little little kind of test over here we could definitely hard code these but I'm gonna teach you some fancy schmancy ways that no matter what is in here, no matter what text you put in here, it'll automatically encode this for you, right? So you can make this SVG, whatever your heart desires, and this will automatically encode it for you. So I'm gonna create a little function down here, first of all, called function SVG to image URI. And we're gonna pass it a string memory SVG public here returns string memory memo. Let's zoom out just a little bit. And we're gonna have this function do this base 64 dash I blah, blah, blah thing for us. That way we don't have to do that step and it'll automatically base 64 encode it for us when we deploy this. So we're just gonna make our lives a little bit easier here. So for example, right, we're gonna pass in something that looks like like this, right, as text. So SVG with blah, 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 something like this. I'm just gonna copy part of this. Boom, something like this, dot, 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 something like that. We're gonna be able to pass this in and we're gonna get as a return data. Let's go back to that. Test, or yeah, that works too. It's gonna return something like this. Boom, 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 dot. It's gonna return something like this. We're gonna pass this in, return something like this. We're gonna do it all from our Solidity scripting. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna say string memory base URL is gonna equal that data image slash SVG plus XML base 64 comma, right? Because this is always gonna be the prefix, which is easy enough to do, but how do we do the postfix? How do we encode that SVG stuff on chain? Well, this is where we're gonna use that open Zeppelin base 64 package again. It can already do this for us. So we're gonna go ahead and import base 64 from at open zeppelin slash contracts slash utils slash base 64 dot soul like that looks good and down here we're going to do something very similar to what we did in our mood nft where we encoded it with the open zeppelin package we're going to go ahead and do string memory svg base 64 encoded equals base 64 dot encode bytes. Yeah, and it looks like GitHub Copilot is being correct here. String ABI dot encode packed SVG. So what we're doing is we're doing ABI dot encode packed the SVG. So we're taking this massive input and we're packing it together as a bytes objects. We're converting it to a string and then converting it to a bytes and then encoding it. I know that's a little confusing, but that's what's going on here. So that way we can actually base 64 encode it. And then we just combine this encoded string with the base URL. And we can just say return string abi.encode 
packed or string.concat base URL, comma SVG base 64, 64 and coded. We probably should use string.concat instead of this abi.encode packed, but I'm just so used to this abi.encode packed and I'm not really sure which one's more gas efficient. Maybe I should do some benchmarking later on. Or maybe you can tell me which one's more gas efficient yourself. So we have this function now where we can actually take an input of the SVG and convert it to this. But we should probably test to make sure it actually works, right? Well, why not? Let's do a little test. Deploy mood nft.t or test.t.sol. I'm actually going to copy a lot of the setup from our mood NFT stuff over here. I'm just going to paste it in like this. Deploy. This is going to be deploy mood NFT test is test. We don't need this mood NFT yet. We do need deploy mood NFT from deploy mood NFT script here dot s dot so I know it went kind of quick there, but this is where it's getting it from. And we're going to do function setup, of course, public. And we're going to need one of these deploy mood NFTs deployer. We'll even make this public. Why not? And we're going to say deployer equals new deploy mood NFT like this. And now let's test it out. Function test convert SVG to URI public. And now with our deployer, we're going to call this SVG to image URI, we're going to pass it in SVG. So we can just to test here, we can take one of our SVGs, for example, this one, right, we can put everything on the same line. And this is going to be the high your browser decoded this, right? I can run base 64 dash I, we're going to go to dot slash image, example that SVG, and it'll give me this output, right? And then if I copy this, we'll go back to the readme. I'm gonna scroll down, paste this in here. I'm gonna say like example. And then I'm just gonna grab this prefix, paste it here. If I copy this, stick it in my browser. Boom, higher browser decoded this. Okay, cool. So this URI is correct. So what we can do in our test here, I know we have a lot of stuff open. We can say string memory expected URI equals and just paste that super long string in here. That's gonna be the expected URI. And then we're gonna say string memory SVG equals, and we'll go to the example that SVG, everything is on one line here, we're gonna copy this whole thing, come back here and use a single quote, to paste it in, because we're using double quotes in here. So we'll use a single quote. And what we'll do is we'll do Employer dot, what's the name of the function? SVG to image URI, SVG, like this. And we'll say string memory created SVG equals deployer, excuse me, created or actual URI. And now we'll just assert that. And we got to compare these strings. So how do we compare strings again? That's right. We'll do a little to check 256 ABI dot encode hacked actual URI equals to check the six ABI dot encode packed the expected URI like that wonky function. And then this is probably going to be a view. Yep. Okay. So we're gonna do a view function here. Great. And now let's test this forge test dash M paste it in. So it looks like our way of encoding an SVG in Solidity is matching our command line way of doing it. And remember, if your command line doesn't have base 64, that's okay. There's some online decoders as well you can use, or just follow along with me. Like I said, it's all good. Okay, phenomenal. So tested that works. Great, let's keep going. Let's zoom in a little bit, a little zoomed out here. So now let's actually read in these files, these SVG files into our solidity. Now you can only do this in Foundry, right? Because you can't actually read in scripts in Solidity Smart Contracts. You can only do this in Foundry and we can do this with another Foundry cheat code. Go in the search bar here. There's a read file cheat code, file signature. There's this read file here and we can use this to read an entire file and we can read an SVG. Now, in order to do that, we're going to need to 
go to our foundry.toml and our project. And we're gonna need to add this FS permissions per missions equals access equals read path equals dot slash images. Cool. So now we can read from different paths and that's the only access that we're gonna give. And this actually brings up a good point. In our actions, soul, we're using this DevOps tool, which requires FFI to be true. I'd much rather this DevOps tool use this, this read permissioning instead of just saying, hey, do whatever you want in the shell. It's much safer to just say, hey, you're only allowed to read what's in the shell. So if somebody wants to refactor this DevOps tool to instead of having F FFI be true to only allow the FS permissions to be true, that would be great. The repo is open source. I highly recommend you contribute. Maybe even come to it you scroll down and, and you'll see something on top. Hey, it's congratulations. It's been revamped to not use FFI as true. It now uses the read permissions. You really don't want to have FFI equals true in your founder.toml if you don't have to. So in fact, anytime you're working with code outside of my tutorials, try to make this false. Okay. Try to make this false any and everywhere you can. Okay. Deployed moon NFT. Great. So now what we can do is we can use this read file cheat code and read in our SVGs. So we'll do string memory sad SVG equals vm dot read file dot slash image slash is it just an image here? Yep. Image slash sad dot SVG. Why do I keep doing the sad ones first? String memory happy SVG equals vm dot read file dot slash image slash happy dot SVG. We would probably want to write tests for this too. But if I want to just kind of quickly sanity check it, we'll add the console in here. We'll do a little console.log sad SVG. We'll pull up our script. We'll do forge script script slash deploy mood nft.s.sol. We'll hit enter. It should run this on its own fake anvil chain. The path is not allowed to be accessed for read operations. Oh, that's because not images this should just be image that's clear let's read this now aha and cool that looks correct enough yep that looks correct enough okay awesome so it's reading in this path perfect so now what do we do well we finally do vm.start start broadcast mood nft mood nft equals new mood nft and we're going to pass in the mood. So the mood NFT needs what? It needs those image URIs as input. So we're going to say SVG to image URI of which one goes first? I think we keep doing sad first. Yep, sad first. Sad SVG. Oops, that should be a comma. Copy that. SVG to image URI. Happy SVG like this. Semicolon. And we'll do a little vm.stop broadcast like this, and then we'll return our mood NFT. And now we can use it in our tests. Nice. Okay. All right. So now that we have this up and running, this actually shows a little bit of some of the difference between integration tests and unit tests. So this is kind of more of a unit test, right? We're deploying kind of our own way here, just to say, hey, mood NFT is this new mood NFT, whereas we could use our script and that would be more of an integration test. So if we even want to do that, Right. This is a better example of us saying, okay, new folder, unit, and we're going to put both of these in here. Well, actually, this one is using the deployer, right? So that's kind of more of a staging test, or that's kind of more of an integrations test. So integrations, we're going to put both of these over here. Mood NFT test. So, oops, deploy mood. This is also going to go, oh, no, sorry. This is going to go in units since we're not using, since we're just deploying like this. And we screwed up some of our imports. Let's fix the imports in here and in here and in here. All right, cool. But now we could do another, we could do a new file, mood NFT integration, integration test.t.sol. And I'm actually just gonna copy this whole test, paste it in here, change the name, moon NFT integration test. And instead of deploying like this, 
we're going to use the deployer. So we're going to import deploy mood NFT from dot dot slash dot dot slash script slash deploy mood NFT dot s dot sol. Copy this. And instead, here we're going to say deploy mood NFT deployer like this. And we're going to say deployer equals new deploy mood NFT. And we're going to say deployer dot run. This is going to equal our mood NFT. Boom. And this function test view token URI integration should work pretty much the same. So now if we run forge test dash M paste it in, sure enough, it works exactly the same here. Awesome. Okay, so one thing that we have definitely not tested, and I'm just gonna do it in this integration test because I way prefer and I want you guys to get used to also testing your deploy scripts. I've seen way too many projects not do this and then get wrecked. So I'm gonna, we're gonna do most of our stuff in here. We'll do function test flip token to sad. We're gonna test flipping it from happy to sad. Remember it starts with happy. I'm gonna do a vm.prank our user mood NFT dot mint NFT like this. We're gonna do VM dot prank user again. I should do start prank instead of two pranks, but whatever. Mood NFT dot flip mood zero. And then we're gonna assert this is now a sad NFT. So we're gonna assert tic -tac 256 ABI dot encode hacked of the mood NFT dot token URI zero equals hack 256 abi dot encode packed sad what is it called sad svg uri boom oh and then semicolon spell kachak wrong again i've seen this word so many times and i've heard it pronounced correctly and i still i don't know if it's kachak or kakak i think it's kachak kakak i don't know forge Test dash M, paste it in. Failed. Let's do some dash VVs. Let's see what's up. Oh, that's not enough Vs. Four Vs. Okay. Assertion violated. Move token URI is going to be this. Hmm. And so this is actually where I prefer assert equal rather than assert. Because if we do assert equal, we can put a comma here and it'll print out both of the results for both of these. I'm gonna do a comma, we're gonna do a cert equal. I'm gonna try this again, pull this up, and we'll see. Oh, maybe it didn't print out both. Oh yeah, it did print out both. So, yep, so print out the left val and the right val. So it looks like these are different for some reason. So do we not, hmm. Well, this is where we can do a little console.logging. Let's do console.logging. Mood.tokenuri of zero. So let's see what this token URI is. So let's run this again. Now with the console.log and practicing debugging is really important. So that's why we're gonna actually do this together. Dash VV so we can see this console.log. Let's pull this up a little bit here. We'll see logs. So this is that token URI that we're actually seeing. So this should be sad. We copy this, paste it. We see we get the metadata. Let's copy the image, paste that. Okay, we do indeed get sad. So what's wrong with this? Sad SVG URI. And this is the sad SVG URI. Oh, I'm being silly. Okay, so this is the sad SVG URI, sad SVG image URI. Okay, so that's where it's, Good to be explicit. Image, image URI, image. So these are obviously not gonna be the same because one is an image URI and one is not. But so we want this token URI to equal not the sad SVG image URI, right? We don't care about that. We want it to equal our sad SVG URI, which I'm just going to paste in here. String public constant sad. SVG URI equals, and we already tested this actually. I know we're running around kind of like a lot. We tested this in here. Expected URI. Is this the happy one? 
let's see. Let's paste this in the browser. Oh, that's just the your browser decoded this. I'm gonna cheat a little bit. I'm actually just gonna copy this and do sad SVG URI and just paste it in here. Copy this, paste it here, run this again. Cheating a little bit here, but that SVG URI looked right to me. And now we're gonna go ahead and pass. Okay, cool. Awesome. So let's talk about what we what we just did, because I know we've done a lot. So I kind of sped through integration unit test stuff over here, but this was a really good example of some of the differences between a unit test and an integration test. So in this unit test, we only tested one specific function on our deploy mood NFT. Additionally, we only tested one specific function on mood NFT, although we didn't put an assert here, but you get the picture. Our integrations test, we combined the deployer with the mood NFT, or excuse me, the basic NFT. On both of these, we did that, right? So these are a much better showing of what an integration test would look like, right? And now, if we run forge test, we'll get everything to run. Everything looks good. And if we test this on a fork, everything should look good too. Forge test dash dash fork URL, Sepolia, RPC URL. Remember to run source.env if you haven't already. And that passes as well. Nice. Good. Okay. So we have all that. We have a script where we can deploy both of these. We can flip the mood of our NFT as well. We don't want to have to write all that forge script stuff. So we're going to come in the make file. We're going to add a line in here called mint mood NFT at forge script script slash interactions dot s dot soul mint mood nft do we actually have that i don't think we have that interactions mint basic we only have mint basic we don't have mint mood oh okay we should have a script for minting the mood we should also have a script for flipping the mood but i'm going to skip those because there's no real more information it's just practice i highly recommend you try to actually implement these yourselves right try to implement a script for minting the mood nft a script for flipping the mood NFT as well. And you can do it with cast or forge scripts, whatever you want to do here, okay? So we have a way to deploy both of these. We have some tests, some real basic tests. So your other action item here is gonna be, you guessed it, get that coverage up. If we do forge coverage, what do you think we're gonna get? Sure, oh, whoa, okay, basic NFT looks good. Mood NFT looks okay. It definitely should be tested more, but some of these scripts don't look so great. We should definitely be testing our scripts more. So, you guys ready to see this for real? See this in our MetaMasks and everything? For you all, I'm gonna recommend you actually do this on an Anvil chain instead of on a testnet. If you wanna to deploy to a testnet, you're free to do so. But remember, testnets are slow, they're annoying, and we should be able to do all of this with Anvil. So in our make file, if you copy pasted it with me, we do a toggle word wrap. There should be an Anvil target. There sure is. So we're gonna do this Anvil target here. Make Anvil. We spun up a chain, create a new one, create a new shell. And now we're gonna run make deploy on our mood NFT. Oh, we should do that. Deploy mood. This one we do have a script for, forge script, script slash deploy mood. What is it called? Deploy mood NFT. Deploy mood NFT, mood NFT dot s dot soul. We're gonna be calling deploy mood NFT network args. Great. And so now if we just run make deploy mood, it should deploy, oh, an error here. No such file or directory. And I'm getting this error here. <coughs> I think it's because I don't have deploy mood in phony. Yep, I sure don't. Let's add deploy mood in here. So now it knows that that's a target. Let's try this again. Nope, still getting that error. Ah, it's script. Whoops, dot s dot soul. There we go. So now we can go ahead and deploy this. We deployed the moon NFT to here. And we could write a make file. Actually, I am going to write a make file to mint one, but I'm just going to use cast. So I'm going to recommend you guys do this on the anvil chain. Let's go ahead and get our Anvil chain set up. Let's go to our MetaMask. Let's go ahead and do add network. And we're just gonna go ahead and reset our Anvil chain. 
The way we can do that is by using this make and build target here. Now that we have a target, go ahead and like just edit this a little bit. 377, boom. You can change the currency to like go or something, save. Now that our anvil is up, we should reset the chain. Great, it looks like we do indeed have an address in here. Our account four, if you don't have an account four, we can just import one from one of these private keys, right? Just import a private key. So now that we have an anvil chain, a fresh new anvil chain, let's also go to accounts, settings, just to make sure, advanced, we'll do clear activity tab. Great, now that we have this here, we can do a make deploy mood, which should deploy to our anvil chain. Oh, looks like we're, oops, we need this. Let's try this again, make deploy mood. Okay, cool. We now have a contract address, mood NFT. What we can do is then copy this and use some cast. So we'll say cast send the contract address, we'll call mint NFT like this. This will mint us an NFT. Oh, we need to actually pass in a private key, dash dash private key, which we're gonna use the private key from this account, which I already have mine here. Dash dash RPC URL is gonna be our Anvil RPC URL, which we can also find in the make file. Copy this, paste it here. Kill me. Do account details, export private key, put in our password, copy the password. Do this cast send with a private key that actually has some money in it, paste it in. And cool, we now have a transaction. And what we can finally do, is we can grab this contract address on Anvil, go to import NFTs, paste it in, add the token ID, hit add, and we have a mood NFT in here. Now let's flip it. So now we can do, we hit up, we'll do the same command, but we'll change the function that we're gonna call to what, what's the flip flip function called? It's called flip mood. We call flip mood on token zero. This is how you do that. You put flip mood, you went to 256 as the input it takes with token zero. All the rest is the same. Looks like it's in here. And what we have to do for MetaMask to get this reflected though, is we need to copy this address again. We're gonna go ahead and click on this mood NFT, hit the little quotes here, remove NFT. And then we got to re-add it, import NFTs, paste it in, token ID is still zero, hit add, and now it's sad. And we did it! We created an NFT 100% on-chain. We deployed it to our own local network on Anvil. We showed it in our MetaMask, and it is showing up correctly. And we could 100% deploy this to a testnet if we wanted to. We could deploy this to a mainnet if we wanted to. And we have just done amazing work learning about FGs to make sure our NFTs are 100% on chain and not centralized by using like a website or anything like that. Okay. So all of you who are here learning about this, when you go make your NFTs, remember to try to keep these as decentralized as possible when you're storing that NFT metadata. Now I will point out there are a couple other decentralized storage solutions out there where you can store your NFT metadata. Arweave is one of them, and Filecoin is another one. These are two of the most popular ones. There's a great site called NFT.Storage, which will help you actually deploy your NFT metadata onto Filecoin, onto this decentralized storage solution. So you don't have to just do SVGs on chain. You can also do actual images on decentralized storage solutions. If you want to learn more about Filecoin, I've got a video on it on my YouTube, just a quick eight minute video to explain Filecoin a little bit more. And if you go into this video in the description, there's a blog that teaches more about decentralized storage and some of the different solutions out there. It's a really interesting space and I'm expecting in the future decentralized storage to become more and more prevalent. All right, this is phenomenal. You have deployed an NFT, possibly to a test net, hopefully at least to your own local Anvil net. We've learned a ton about IPFS, SVGs. We've learned a little bit about decentralized storage solutions. The only thing we haven't covered is what the heck is this ABI.encode pack stuff? You, we've been using it this entire course and I don't know what it does. Well, guess what? It's time for us to explain that to you. Let's jump back into Remix and we'll explain it. 
Remember, all the code that we're going to be working with can be found in SRC, sublesson, right in here. So, and you can find all the images that we're about to show you in here as well. So from a really, really high level, this is basically how you concatenate strings, right? This is how you combine strings together. And we're going to jump over the remix to actually explore this ABI.encode pact and this ABI encoding stuff a little bit more. Now, the section that we're about to go through is definitely advanced, and we're going to be going over some really low level stuff and how Solidity works behind the scenes, how the binary works, and this thing called opcodes, and all this crazy, low-level, tricky, difficult things to understand. If you want to move past this section, there are timestamps in the GitHub repo to help you move past this. However, I do encourage you to at least try to absorb most of this material. If you don't understand it the first time, that's 100% okay. This is more advanced anyways. For most of your basic projects, you won't really need this information. It's only later on, once you get more advanced, that knowing all this is really going to make you a phenomenal Solidity developer. And when you approach this section, when you approach this sub-lesson on EVM opcodes and coding and calling, just know that if you don't 100% understand it the first time, that is okay. If you want to watch this section a couple times, fantastic. So if you want to jump over to Remix and follow along, let's do it. Now in our contract section, let's go ahead and create a new file. We're going to call it encoding.soul. And remember, all the code that we're going to be going with in here is going to be in this sublesson folder of the Hardhat NFT FCC. And all the code we're going to be working with is going to be in this encoding.soul. And then in a little bit, we're going to work on this call anything.soul. So we're in this encoding.soul, and let's just make our basic code here. So we'll say SPDX license identifier MIT pragma solidity caret 0.8.7 like that. We'll do contract encoding. Boom. Compile or command S or control S. Great. Things are looking good. Now, remember, the whole purpose for this is to first understand what's going on here and more about this ABI.encode packed stuff. So let's first just write a function that shows us wrapping ABI.encode packed with some strings and wrapping it around a string is going to return a string. So we could do function combine strings or concatenate strings. This will be a public pure since we're not going to be reading any storage. We'll say returns string memory and we'll say return string abi.encode packed hi mom comma let's put space in here miss you like so so we need another parenthesis here okay great now let's go ahead and deploy this we'll stay on a javascript vm we'll deploy encoding coding.soul and we'll come down here we'll click combine strings and we get that whole string output hi mom miss you so what we're doing here is we're encoding hi mom miss you together into its bytes form because abi.encode packed returns a bytes object and we are typecasting it by wrapping it in this string thing to be a string. And Solidity says, okay, yeah, bytes to a string, that's fine, that totally works. And this abi.encode packed, one of these globally available methods and units. And actually in Solidity, there's a whole bunch of these. There's this Solidity cheat sheet, and there's going to be a link to this in the GitHub repo as well, that has a whole bunch of operators, and it has a whole bunch of these global variables and methods. You can see if we look in here, we look for abi.encode packed, we see abi.encode packed right here. If we scroll down, we'll see some more that we're familiar with as well. Like, for example, message.sender, sender of the message, message.value. There's a whole bunch of other globally available methods and variables that we can use when we're coding our stuff. Now, I will say though, in 0.8.12 plus, you can actually do string.concat, you know, string A, comma, string B, if you want to, instead of doing this ABI.encode pact, but I still wanted to show you the ABI.encode pact because it's a great segue into all this ABI stuff that we're about to go over. But let's focus on this encode pact thing. So what is actually going on here? Well, before we dive deeper into this encode pact, let's understand a little bit more about what happens when we send a transaction. So when we compile our code, and again, all these pictures are going to be in the GitHub repo, 
remember back to ethers.js, we had those two files. We got a .abi file and a .bin or .binary. Back in our ethers simple storage, when we ran yarn compile, the two main files that we got were this simple storage.abi, which was this, you know, th this ABI thing that we've become familiar with. And then the simple storage.bin, which is the binary, which is a whole bunch of just numbers and letters and stuff we didn't understand. And you can see that in Remix too. Like if we were to compile this, you go to compilation details, you get a whole bunch of stuff in here, right? You can see the ABI in here, which this is kind of like a different way of viewing that ABI. We also get this bytecode bit and it's this object that has the same stuff that has like those random numbers and letters, but this is actually the binary. This is actually what's getting put on the blockchain. It's this binary, it's this low level stuff. Now, when we actually send these contracts to the blockchain, we're sending, like I said, we're sending this binary thing. That's exactly what we're sending to the blockchain. And remember how, again, back in our ethers project, we saw what is a transaction, right? A transaction has a nonce, it has a gas price, gas limit, two value data, we kind of skimped over the VRS a little bit because that's kind of that mathy component of the transaction signature. But again, back in our ethos project, we did this as well, right? In our deploy script, ended up sending a transaction ourselves using just ethers. We passed a nonce, a gas price, gas limit, two value. Data was this massive thing to deploy our contract and then also the chain ID. We didn't work with the VRS because Ethers does that for us, but there's also this VRS component that we, we don't bother to look at. When we send a transaction that actually creates a contract, the two is going to be empty. We're not going to send this contract deployment to any address, but the data of this is going to have the contract initialization code and contract bytecode, right? So when we compile it, we, we get all this code, like how do you initialize the contract and then what the contract actually looks like. So if you look at any of the contracts that you've deployed, for example, I'm going to look at our raffle that we deployed. If you go to the transactions of your contract, we can see create raffle, right? Let's go to that transaction. If we go down and click to see more in Etherscan, we can see this input data thing. And once again, it's got all this random garbled numbers and letters. This is that binary data of the contract initialization code and the contract bytecode, right? What we send in our transaction is this data thing. We send this, this weird bunch of jarbled nonsense. Now we're gonna head back to Remix and I'm just gonna leave this as comments in here. In the encoding.soul and the GitHub repo, there is a ton of comments in here explaining exactly what I'm explaining. So if you wanna follow along there, you can as well. But now in order for the blockchain to understand, okay, what do these numbers and letters even mean? You need a special reader. Ethereum or the blockchain needs to be able to read all this stuff. It needs to be able to map all these random numbers and letters to what they actually do. How does Ethereum or Polygon or Avalanche know that all this nonsense is basically telling it to make a contract? You kind of think of it as saying like, take off your coat. The only reason that we as human beings understand what take off your coat means is that we understand English. We're all reading English. For Solidity and for blockchains, instead of English, they read these numbers and letters kind of like words. Just instead of take off your coat, it's like deploy contract and the contract does X, X Y, Z and all this random stuff. So this bytecode represents the low level computer instructions to make our contract happen. And all these numbers and letters represent kind of an alphabet just like how take off your coat is an alphabet. And when you combine them like this, it makes something that to us makes sense. You can kind of think of the alphabet for these as what's called op codes. If you go to create a new tab, if you go to evm.codes, we'll get to this place where it just has a list of all these instructions. On the left side, you can see this thing called op code, and then you can see name. So this op code section is saying, hey, if you see a zero zero in this byte code, that zero zero represents this opcode stop, which does what? Which halts execution. If you see a zero one, you're going to do some addition stuff. A zero two is multiply. There are all these opcodes that are kind of like the alphabet or the language of this binary stuff, right? And they go all the way down to, to FF self-destruct. These opcodes also have, and that's what this is reading. Right, so if we look at our transaction here, and your, yours might be a little bit different, 061 says, okay, the first thing we want you to do is the 061 opcode. And if we go to EVM opcodes, we look up for 61, 
saying push to place two byte item on the stack. That's exactly how it's reading this. Any language that can compile down to this opcode stuff, down to this specific set of, of Ethereum opcodes or EVM opcodes is what's known as the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. So being able to read these opcodes is sometimes abstractly called the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine. The EVM basically represents all the instructions a computer must be able to read for it to interact with Ethereum or Ethereum-like applications. And this is why so many blockchains all work with Solidity, because Solidity compiles down to this bytecode here, and Polygon, Avalanche, Arbitrum, Ethereum, they all compile down to the exact same type of binary, and they all have the exact same readers. Now, why are we telling you all this stuff? You might be saying, hey, Patrick, this is cool and all, but it looks like ABI.encodePact, all that does is concatenate strings. ABI.encodePact can do actually way more. And if we look at these global variables, ABI.encodePact is like, what, the third one down the list? Because it's a non-standard way to encode stuff to this binary stuff that we just talked about. We can actually encode pretty much anything we want to being in this binary format, basically. And let's take a look at, at encoding something. So let's create a function called encode number. And this will be a public pure function since we're not gonna read any states. And we'll say returns a bytes memory. We're gonna have this function return a bytes object. We're gonna have it return the what this number is gonna look like, but in binary. So we'll say bytes memory number equals abi.encode one, and then return number. So we're gonna encode number down to its ABI or its binary format. So I know a lot of the times when we say, oh, what's the ABI, what's the ABI, right? Previously, we say, oh, the ABI is, is this thing, right? It's, it's, it's all these inputs and outputs. This is kind of the human readable version of the ABI, but again, the ABI is the application binary interface. We want to encode our numbers down to its basically its, its binary. This ABI.encode is gonna be a little different than like the ABI that you see when you're looking at compilation details. This is technically like the ABI, it technically is how to interact with this contract. However, it's not the actual binary version of it. So we're saying, okay, uh, encode this number one down to its binary version, so that our contracts can interact with it in a way that they understand. So we're just saying, okay, cool, that number one, let's make you machine readable. And if we go, we compile this and we deploy this, right? Let's delete that, that old contract, we deploy this. We now have combined strings and encode number. We click it, we get this big hex thing. This is how the computer is gonna understand the number one. Now we can encode pretty much anything, actually. We could encode a string, so. We'll say function encode string. We'll make this a public pure as well. It'll return a bytes memory because we want to give it that binary stuff or that bytes stuff. And we'll say bytes memory some string equals abi.encode some string and then return some string. Now let's compile that. We'll delete our old contract, deploy that encode string. We get this big 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 object here and this is the binary now you'll notice something here there's a ton of zeros and those zeros take up space right that's a lot of space for the computer to take up even though they're not really doing anything they're just kind of taking up space so solidity also comes with this abi.encode pact which performs pact encoding of the given arguments and you can read more about it in the solidity docs if you want and this is called the non-standard pact mode and it does the same encoding with some stipulations. Types shorter than 32 bytes are concatenated directly without padding or sign extension. Dynamic types are encoded in place and without the length. Array elements are padded, but still encoded in place. You can kind of think of encode packed as sort of like a compressor, right? It's the encode function, but it compresses stuff. If we wanted to encode some string, but we wanted to save space and we didn't need the perfect low level binary of it, we could do function encode string packed, make this a public pure and have it return a bytes memory. And we could say bytes memory, some string equals abi.encode packed. Once again, some string. And so we're doing encode packed instead of encode. And we'll return some string here. We'll compile this and we'll see the difference, right? We'll compile, we'll delete our old one. We'll deploy this. 
Now we have encode string, which again, that's what encode string is going to give us. And we have encode string packed, which returns us this much, much smaller bytes object here. So you see the size difference. If we're trying to save gas, encode string packed is going to be a way for us to save a lot more gas. Now, abi.encode packed is actually really similar to something that we've done before, which is typecasting. If we did function encode string bytes, public pure returns bytes memory, bytes memory some string equals bytes some string turn some string. These two are going to look nearly identical, right? So if we compile, we'll delete our old contract, we'll deploy this encode string bytes, which gives us this and encode string packed using the ABI encode packed. They give us the exact same output, whereas encode string still gives us this big piece. So the two of these get the same result, but behind the scenes, they're doing something a little bit different. And I'm not going to go over exactly what that is, but uh, I've left a link inside of the code here if you want to learn more, which is exactly what we're doing in our NFT, right? We're doing ABI encode packed. We're combining two strings by putting them together. We're encoding them to their bytes implementation, to their packed bytes implementation. And then we're just typecasting them back from bytes to string. And that's how we concatenate them. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, OK, cool, great, Patrick, I'm all set. I understand this. I'm happy to go back to my project. And if you want to do that, absolutely go for it and skip over this section. But some other views might be going, OK, Patrick, this is seems pretty cool, but I'm sure this encode packed and this encode function aren't just here to concatenate strings. They probably have some other function. What, what do they actually do? Well, if that's what you're asking, I'm glad you ask and I'm glad you're curious because we're going to find out now, not only can you encode stuff like strings and numbers and really anything, but you can decode stuff. So I could say function decode string public here returns string memory, string memory, some string equals ABI dot decode. This is going to take a couple parameters. So if we look in the docs here, ABI dot decode, it takes as a first argument, the encoded data, and then it takes a tuple. You can kind of think of it as a list, but not quite a list, a set of types to decode this into, and it returns the number of parameters that you gave it. So we might want to say this string memory, some string, let's give it as input, this encode string function, the result of this encode string function, right? Which again is going to be this big thing. So this is kind of equivalent to sticking this massive thing in here, but we're just not going to stick the massive thing in there because that's really big. So we're going to say, let's decode the result of encode string and let's decode it into a string because we need to tell solidity. Hey, we're going to decode this, but it, it doesn't know what to decode it into. It, it's like, okay, cool. I can decode this, but like, what, what do you want me to do with it? And we say, oh, oh, this is a string. So decode it into a string and then we can do return some string. Now, once again, we deploy that old con or we delete the last contract. We deploy this new one. So encode string encode string, where is encode string encode string returns this massive thing as a human being. We're like, God, uh, I, I can't read that. Computers can read that, but we can't really read that. So we say, OK, let's decode that back into its string form. We hit decode string and we get back some string. And now we can actually multi encode and multi and decode, right? We can encode as much stuff as we want. So I can say function multi encode public pure returns bytes memory. We're going to encode a couple things. We'll say bytes memory some string equals ABI dot encode some string comma. It's bigger. So we're going to encode two strings here. We're going to encode some string and it's bigger. So we have two strings we're going to encode and we'll return some string, even though it's, you know, bytes. And then we can actually multi decode. So we'll say function multi decode. This will be a public pure returns. We'll say it returns two strings, string memory and string memory. And instead of doing string memory, some string equals ABI decode, we'll say string memory, some string comma string memory, some other string. So we're going to get two returns equals ABI dot decode. Let's decode this multi encode 
result, which is the doubly encoded strings, into a string and another string, and then we'll return both of these. Or some string. There we go. And then we'll return some string and then some other string. I need a semicolon here. So now when we deploy this, let's close this out, deploy this new one, right? We now have this multi encode, which gives us this even bigger bytes object, right? Because this is two strings encoded. And now if we hit multi decode, take a second, what do you think it's going to put out output? Let's go ahead and hit it. Now it's going to give us two strings, right? It's going to give these two strings, some string, it's bigger. So we can tell solidity to encode a bunch of stuff. And then we can even decode it by telling it, okay, this big object here, it's two strings combined, and then we decode it. Now you can even multi encode with that encode packed thing, right? We could do function multi encode packed public pure returns bytes memory, and then bytes memory some string equals abi done code packed some string comma, it's bigger, and then return some string. We could do this, right? But this is going to give us the packed version of these two strings. So the decoding actually isn't going to work on this because this is packed encoding. So if we tried to do, and I'm going to say this doesn't work. We tried to do function multi decode packed public pure returns string memory, string memory, some string equals abi dot decode multi encode packed and then in a string kind of exactly what we did above to if we do return some string, what do you think is going to happen? Well, let's, uh, let's try it. Delete the old contract, deploy a new one. We'll do multi decode packed, multi encode, multi decode packed. And we actually just get an error. Solidity basically goes, um, yeah, this looks like it's packed. I don't know how to decode that. But instead, what we can do is we can do function multi string cast packed, make this a public pure returns string memory, string memory, some string equals string multi encode packed return some string. This one will work, right? Because again, this packed encoding is kind of similar to just typecasting. So we'll compile, we'll redeploy multi string cast packed, we get some string, it's bigger, right? And we don't have a space here, but we should have put a space in there. Now that we've learned more about this in ABI dot encode and decoding, and we know that, okay, this is what the computer, this is what Ethereum, this is what the EVM or any EVM compatible chain is looking for. It's looking for this byte code, it's looking for this this binary stuff. And we just learned a little bit more about how to encode different variables into the binary into that data bit. Well, uh, what do we do now? Now, since we know that our transactions are just going to be compiled down to this binary stuff, what we can do then is we could actually populate this data value of our transactions ourselves with the binary the code is going to use. So here's our transaction for a contract deployment. The data field of the contract deployment is going to be all that binary code of the contract. For a function call, the data piece is going to be what to send to the address, what data, what function to call on the to address. Let's look at another one of our transactions on Etherscan, right? On one of our contracts. You don't have to. I'm going to look at enter raffle from a previous section. And if we select down, we look at input data, it says function enter raffle method ID. But if we look at the original, this is what's getting sent in the data field. It's this binary, it's this hex, it's this weird, low level bytes thing. This is how the Ethereum blockchain or the or whatever EVM chain you're working with knows which function to call it translates this into a function. And we can do the exact same thing and call these functions ourselves. So what we can actually do with this crazy newfound data encoding stuff, what we can actually do is send the data field of a transaction ourself in a transaction call. Remember back in this ethers throwback where the, this data thing was the contract creation code? Well, instead, we could populate this data thing with our function call code, the exact function that we want to call in the binary in the hex edition. 
Now you might be thinking, oh, well, why would I do that? I can always just use the, the interface, the ABI, all that stuff. Well, maybe you don't have that. Maybe all you have is the function name. Maybe all you have is the parameters you want to send, or maybe you want to make your code be able to send arbitrary functions or make arbitrary calls or do random, really advanced stuff, right? That's where sending our function calls directly by populating this data field is going to be incredibly important. So remember, I said you're always going to need the ABI and the contract address to send a function. Now, when I said you always need the ABI, originally we were kind of talking about this thing, this big, this big thing, which is cool, which is the ABI, but this is like the human readable ABI. You can also do it with the not human readable ABI. And additionally, you don't need all this stuff. You can really use just the name of a function and then the input types to send a function call. So the question is then, okay, how do we send, how do we send transactions that call functions with just the data field populated? And then the next question is, how do we populate the data field? What do we populate the data field with to, to make one of these function calls? And then how do we send these transactions? Solidity actually has some more low level keywords, namely static call and call. We actually, we've used call in the past before. Does this code look at all familiar to you? Well, it should, because this is, we used a similar setup in our fulfill random words for our lottery, right? We sent money doing this recent winner dot call, right? Recent winner was the address of the recent winner and we did dot call. And then we had this weird stuff in this brackets here and then nothing in the parentheses. So we did actually, essentially, we used this call keyword previously, but we didn't really tell you what it did. So call is how we can call functions to change the state of the blockchain. Static call is basically how at a low level we call our view or pure functions, right? Static call is going to be like, okay, don't change the state of the blockchain with this one. Just give us the return value. So this is kind of similar to like a view or a pure function at, at low level. There's also a send word, but like, basically forget about it. <laughs> We're just gonna be working with call and static call. And you know, later on, we'll learn about another one called delegate call, but don't worry about that for now. Recent winner dot call like this in these little squiggly brackets, we said, okay, we updated the value directly of our transaction in solidity. So which again, if we have these transaction fields and we just directly updated value in these little brackets, right? We can also directly update gas limited and gas price in these little brackets if we wanted to as well. And in here, these parentheses is where we're going to stick our data. Since all we wanted to do with our withdraw function previously was send money, we said, okay, send money, change the value that we're going to send, but don't pass any data. Keep that data bit empty, which is why, again, remember how we hit this button before, right? And we had call data be empty. That's the, essentially running this command with call data be empty, with this section be empty, and then just updating the value that we sent with the transaction. And so it's this section that we can use to populate data to actually call specific functions. I'm going to put a whole bunch more comments here. So in our squiggly brackets, we're able to pass specific fields of a transaction like value. And in our parentheses, we're able to pass data in order to call a specific function. But in here, there's no function to call since we were just sending Ethereum. If we want to call a function or send any data, we can do this in the parentheses. Oh, and I think I spelled that wrong. Now, we've learned a ton here, so let's do a quick refresher of what we just learned. And then we're gonna actually learn how we can call any function just by using this syntax here. What we learned from really high level, if we wanna combine strings, we can do abi.encode packed and then typecast it to a string. And in newer versions of Solidity, you can do, you can do string.concat, you know, hi mom, comma, miss you. In newer versions of Solidity, this works as well, but not in older versions of Solidity. Then we learned a lot about some low level stuff. We learned, okay, when we compile our contracts, we get an ABI file and this weird binary thing. It's that numbers and letters stuff that gets, when we deploy a contract, that gets sent in the data field of our contract creation transaction. So for contract creations, the data is populated with that binary code. For function calls is going to define which functions to call and with what parameters. And this is what we're going to go over next. Now we learned that we can actually encode stuff into this binary, into this low level code. And any program, any process that can read 
this low level stuff and execute accordingly, read this EVM stuff, read the specific binary that Ethereum has specified or the EVM has specified is considered EVM compatible. We can encode numbers, we can encode strings, we can encode pretty much anything we want to encode. To save space, we do encode packed. We can decode stuff that we've encoded, but we can't decode stuff that we encode packed. We can multi-encode stuff and then multi-decode stuff. And then finally, we can use this call function and add data in here to make any call that we want to any smart contract. And this is what we're going to learn next. All right, so now's a great time to take a break because we just learned some really difficult concepts. And like I said, if you don't get it the first time, that is okay. All right, welcome back. Now that we've learned about this encoding stuff, let's learn how we can populate this parentheses, this data field, so we can call any function and we can do essentially what the blockchain is gonna do at the low level. We can work with just that binary. We can work with just that bytes. We can work with that hex to interact with our smart contracts. So let's create a new file and we're going to call it call anything dot soul. I uh, start off with SPDX license identifier MIT and let's talk about this. Now in order to call, now in order to call a function using only the data field of the call, we need to encode the function name and the parameters that we want to add, right? Because when we call a function, we call the function name and we call the parameters. So we need to encode these down to the binary level so that the EVM or these Ethereum based smart contracts, the Solidity stuff can understand what's actually going on. In order to do this, we're going to need to work with two concepts. To encode the function name so that the EVM or Solidity can understand it, we actually have to grab something called the function selector. Now the function selector is going to be the first four bytes of the function signature and the function signature is just going to be a string which defines the function name and parameter. Now, what does this actually mean? Well, if we have a transfer function, this right here is known as the function signature. So the function name is going to be transfer, and it's going to take an address and a U256 as its inputs. If we encode this transfer function, and then we take the first four bytes of it, we get this, which refers to the function selector. So that's how Solidity knows. So in the byte code, in the binary code, this function selector is how Solidity knows, oh, they're talking about the transfer function. They want me to call the transfer function. And this is one of the first things that we need to use call to call any function that we want. We need to get the function selector and we can get it a number of different ways. But one of the ways is by encoding the function signature and grabbing the first four bytes. So we'll create this contract. We'll do pragma solidity 0.8.7, say contract, call anything. And we'll give this two storage variables. Give this two storage variables an address public s underscore some amount or some address and then u and 256 public s underscore amount and then we'll create a function called transfer function transfer now normally in here we would actually do like transfer for like an erc20 transfer but we're just going to do address some address and then u and 256 amount amount here we'll make this a public function and then all we'll do is we'll set s some address equals some address and then s amount equals amount so here's going to be the function that we're going to work with and the function selector for that function is this the function signature is this so it takes an address some address amount that gets boiled down to the function selector and the function signature and of course in our bytecode there's going to be some code saying okay here's what this function does blah 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 so we can actually even write a function to get that function selector so we can say function get selector and I'm going to say get selector one because I'm going to show you a few ways to get the function selector. We'll make this a public pure and we'll have this return a byte for selector. We could say selector equals bytes for and then we hash with the check 256 of the bytes of that signature, which is transfer and it takes an address and a uint. 256. Right, if we compile this and then we run it, oh, let's get rid of our old contract, deploy, make sure we're on call anything if you have the other one up. And here now we have a couple of things. If we hit get selector one, we get this OXA905, blah, blah, blah. Right, and that's the same as the example I just gave. So this right here tells Solidity, tells our smart contract that, okay, when we make a call to this contract, 
if you see this in the function data, this is referring to our transfer function with an address and a UN256 as input parameters. So we see address UN256, our function knows to execute this data here. Great. And then of course, S amount and S address are zeros. Now, while we're here, we can also see, okay, what happens if we call the transfer function, right? It takes an address and an amount. So let's just give it its own address for an address. And we'll do 777 for an amount. If we hit transfer, we have the log up, right? We'll get a little check mark here saying success. Now, if we hit S amount, we'll get 777 and then the address will be the same, right? So that's us directly calling transfer. When we directly call transfer, we're, we're basically saying, hey, grab this function selector and then do some other stuff, which we'll, we'll tell you the other stuff in a minute. Now we have the function selector. Okay, great. What else do we need? We also now need the parameters we want to add. So we're going to need to encode those parameters with our function selector. So what we're going to do is we're going to say function get data to call transfer. And in here, we're just going to have this get data to call transfer. We're going to have it take these input parameters and we're going to encode these to work with our function selector. So we're going to say address, some address, UN256 amount, public pure returns, bytes memory. And then we can return and use one of those ABI encodings from the cheat sheet. Now, so far, we've just been doing ABI encode for a lot of our encoding. So it's, since we have the function selector, we can actually do abi.encode with selector. This ABI encodes the given arguments starting from the second and prepends the given four byte selector. When we do encode with selector, we're just sticking our selector onto the data that we're going to give it. So we're going to do return abi.encode with selector, and we're going to pass it the result of get selector one. And then we're going to give it some address and amount. So what this is going to do, it's going to give us all the data that we need to put in that data field of our transaction to send to this contract to let this contract know, hey, go use the transfer function, pass in some address and then an amount. And then if we compile this, we run it, let's delete our old contract, we'll deploy it. We now get a new function called get data to call and transfer. We'll just pass, you know, We'll just pass this contract's address and then we'll also do 777 again. And so this thing right here is what we're going to put into the data field of our transaction in order for us to call transfer from anywhere. So this is the bytes. This is the binary encoded data of, hey, call the transfer function with this address that we specified with, you know, 777 amount. So what we can do once we have all this, we can actually call our transfer function without even having to directly call it. So what we can do is we can say function call transfer function directly, or I guess with binary might be a better title, but you get the gist. We'll say address sum address, UN256 amount. So we'll make this a public function and we'll have a returns, a bytes four and a bool. You'll see why in a minute. And we'll do that same call thing that we did to send our raffle money. So what we'll do is before we did recent winner dot call, right? We're going to do some address. And then for us, we're going to do address this dot call. And then we're saying this contracts address, which we could put any address here, address dot call. And we're going to call the encoded data that points us to the transfer function with some parameters. So we're going to do address this dot call. And we could just do get data to call transfer some address amount, right? We could do it like this, or we could do it kind of the raw way. We could do ABI dot encode with selector, get selector one, comma, some address, oops, comma, amount. And actually, there's no semicolon there. Sorry. So those are going to be the same. And this dot call thing, right? It's going to return exactly what we saw before. It's going to return a bool success. So whether or not the transaction was successful, and then bytes memory return data, which is going to be, you know, whatever the call returns. So right, and this is where we put like require success, right? But for us, we're just going to do return bytes four, bytes four of return data, and then success. So we're just going to return the first four bytes of whatever data we get returned. And then we're going to return whether this was successful or not. So this function is going to have us directly call 
tr the transfer function by passing these parameters without us having to do like contract dot transfer or or transfer or whatever right and you could do this across multiple contracts across different contracts just by changing the address that you call on so let's go ahead and compile this we'll run this now we'll delete our old contract we'll deploy call anything now if we if we were so right now s amount and s some address are both zero now if we do call transfer function directly and we'll pass in this one's address and then we'll do 777 now if we pull up the logs we hit this we're going to get this transaction response here but if we scroll down we'll be able to see the decoded output which is a bytes four of just a bunch of zeros right because our transfer doesn't actually return anything so it's just gonna be a whole bunch of zeros and then our boolean true which means it was successful so since it was successful these two should have changed based off of that. So let's go ahead and try them out. And we do indeed see that they're changed. So we have just directly called this transfer function without having to call the transfer function itself. We can also do encode with signature instead of selector. So if we go to our cheat sheet, there's also this encode with signature down here, which takes the string memory signature and it's equivalent to doing abi.encode with selector, bytes four, kakak, bytes, you know, signature. It's, pr it's equivalent to doing exactly what we did up here, but it does this step for us. So we could copy this whole thing, paste it down here, right? And we could do, instead of encode with selector, we could do encode with signature, the function signature, and then we'll copy our function signature from up here, paste it in here, compile, we ran into a compilation error. Oh, these are the same uh, call transfer function directly sig. Call it that. Compile, delete our old contract, deploy. Now these two are both zeros again. Now if we copy the contract address, we do call contract, call transfer function directly sig. We paste that in here. We do 777. We call it. Then we check these. We can see that that does the exact same thing. So this is abi.encode with signature. This is abi.encode selector. Encode with signature just turns this into the selector for us. That's all. Up here, we just we encoded the selector ourselves. Now, there are a whole bunch of different ways to get the selectors, and I'm not, we're not going to code these out ourselves. I'm just going to say a bunch of different ways to get selector. And who knows why, why you might want to use one of these other reasons, right? There's, there's a ton of reasons why you might want to get the selector a different way. And here's some. Now, in this video, we're not going to explain or go over all these different, all these different function selector getting methods. But if you go through them in the GitHub repo associated with this course, they all have a ton of commas to explain what they're doing. What we are going to show you, though, is actually how two contracts can interact with each other without actually having all of the code for each contract. So we're going to make a second contract that has all this binary, this bytes information to call the transfer function on a different contract. And we're going to show you how that can work. Uh, this is just another contract that I made called call function without contract. Actually, down here, we're going to call the transfer function just by using the address and the function selector signature and stuff. We're going to update these storage variables in our call anything contract from another contract just by doing this binary calling, if you will. All right, so let's compile. Let's go to deploy. We can actually leave this up, right? We can leave this up is let's deploy our call function without contract. We'll pass it as an input parameter. The call anything contract address we will deploy it. Now in here, I can call the transfer function directly by, you know, maybe I'll switch it to this, this contract address, this new contract address, and we'll give it a new number of one, two, three, right? And we'll click call transfer function. And then when we go back up here, we see that this has indeed been updated. Now doing this call stuff is considered low level, and it's a best practice to try to avoid it when you can. So if you can import an interface, it's much better to do it like that because you're going to have the compiler on your side. You're going to be able to check to see if your types are matching and all this other stuff. So usually doing these low level calls, some security auditor checkers might say, hey, like uh, this spooks me out a little bit. You you doing this low level stuff. But with that being said, you have just learned a ton about lower level solidity. This is some really advanced stuff. And like I said, if this was hard, if you're kind of confused here, don't worry. You can always come back to this section and try it again when you're a little bit more advanced. If you want to try to understand it all now, awesome. Absolutely. We've left some links in the GitHub repo associated with this lesson that I definitely recommend you check out. One of the ones you should definitely check out is going to be this Deconstructing Solidity by Open Zeppelin. 
it really breaks down exactly what's going on behind the scenes of a contract. If you want to learn more about op codes, about low level stuff, definitely give this a read. It is a phenomenal read. So essentially, it breaks down a little bit more than what we went over here. Uh, a couple other videos as well. And I've left a whole bunch of links in here too. Now we can finally go back to what we were talking about with MetaMask and that decoding the transaction data and all this weird stuff. If we come to a contract address, and this is WETH, this is a contract that wraps native ETH and turns it into an ERC-20 token. But if we come to a contract, right, we hit write contract, let's connect to Web3, sure. You don't have to actually do this, just feel free to follow along with me. We're gonna open up our MetaMask, let's go to Sepolia here. I'm gonna connect here, okay, cool. And we want it to call transfer from, right? And let's just add some stuff in here. Let's do source, address, and you know, this. This is probably won't go through because I don't have any weth right now, but let's just hit right, right? This transaction's MetaMask is probably gonna be like, hey, this is gonna fail, or whatever. Yeah, sure, whatever. But when we get a MetaMask transaction that pops up, if we scroll over to the hex, we scroll down, we can now actually start to understand what is going on here. And this is what we always want to make sure is actually correct when we're working with our MetaMask and when we're dealing with all this. So what we can do is we can actually copy this whole thing and pull up our terminal here. I'm just going to make this nice and big here. What we can do is we can do cast dash dash help. We hit cast help and we scroll all the way up. There's a command in here called call data to code. Decode ABI encoded input data. So if we do cast dash dash call data decode like this, we can see we need to pass in a SIG and the call data. So luckily for this transaction, our MetaMask was smart enough to know that we're calling the transfer from function, but sometimes it's actually not gonna be smart enough to figure this out. So that's where we are gonna need to match what we expect this to be calling to what, to what it's actually calling, right? So first off, we are expecting this to be calling the transfer from function. So I can grab this function selector, which we just learned, come back here, I can do cast sig, and I'll pass, pass in here transfer from the whole function signature, which what? It takes a address, address, and a unit 256. So we'll do address, address 256. And we'll see that this is what the function selector should be. So I can say, okay, great. The two of these match. This is indeed calling the function selector that I want it to call. Okay, awesome. If it doesn't match, what can happen sometimes, again, we can go to something like the Sam CZ Sun signature database or open chain .xyz signatures, paste this in, hit search. And we can see that there's actually two different functions that have the same Signature, one is transfer from, and one is gas price bit ether with an int 128. So what's interesting here is you can't have a function with the same function selector. So if I actually went into remix, .eth.org, let's actually create a new contract called conflicting.soul, right? And we'll do a little, little zoom in here. It's PDX license identifier, MIT. Contract conflict. If I made a function called transfer from with an address u and two fifty or address hi u and two fifty six hello u and two fifty six sup public like this, and then I also have a function function with this one gas price bit ether paste it in here gas price bit ether int one twenty eight sup public, and I try to compile this. Guess what's going to happen? Compile. Oh, that's pragma solidity 0 0.8.18. This should be an address too. And now I try to compile. If we scroll down, it'll say function signature hash collision for gas price bit ether. You can't have a contract in solidity where two functions have the same function selector. So, in any case, we could be calling one of these two functions on our. This is where it's important to actually go through the contract code and say, hmm, okay, there could be a couple different function selectors here. Let's make sure it's the one that we expect, right? So in any case, so this is calling this transfer from function. If this contract has a gas bit, gas price bit ether, it might be calling that. 
But in any case, we know, so we could go through the code, right? We go through transfer from, okay, great. There's a transfer from function. That is indeed what we want to call. Function selector is working. Perfect. Okay. So now that we've verified the function selector, we should also verify the rest of this stuff. So now that we know what the function selector is, and we know what the function signature is, we can take this whole hex here and go back into our terminal and use that call data decode. So we can say cast dash dash call data decode. And we can see what it what we need. We need the sig and the call data. So I'll hit up the sig is going to be transfer from and it takes an address, an address and a uint 256, right? We can just double check that address address, address, uint 256, sure does. And we can paste in that call data and hit enter. And we can see what this call data stuff is using for input parameters to that function. So it's our address, our address, and then 1000. And then if that's what we expected, so let me reject this for now, go back to write. And, that, and if that's what we wanted to call on this function, we would go ahead and put this through. This is especially important when we're using front ends, like for example, if I wanted to use Uniswap, right? Let's go ahead and connect here, the MetaMask. Yep, connect, looks good. Go away, go to, let's say if I was on ETH mainnet, I wanted to swap ETH for, so, so I'm on a testnet here, so obviously nothing's showing up, but when I hit swap, if I was on a real network with real money, what I want to do then is do that same process of going through and checking to make sure that the transaction that it's sending is actually the one that I want it to be sending, right? So if we want to be absolutely sure of what our transactions are doing, we can first check the address. We can take these exact steps to say, I know exactly what transaction, I know exactly what function my transaction is calling. So we check the address to make sure that the contract is what we expect it to be. And then we can read the function of that contract that we want. We check the function selector that we're using so that it, it so that we know that it is indeed the function that we're calling. And then we decode the call data to check the parameters that we're sending. So this is how we can actually make sure our wallets are doing what we expect them to do. And you think, hey, Patrick, why doesn't our wallet just do this by default? And I agree, it should. At the moment, there's projects being worked on. One of them is Fire, where they get some of the transactions right but more wallets are being created right now that actually decode these call datas by default. And I hope more of them show up so it's easier to be safe. We've seen people send transactions, not checking every detail of the transaction. And sure enough, it was a malicious transaction, right? So you wanna make sure you check the details of your transactions, especially when you're sending and working with a lot of money. Whew. Guess what? We just learned a ton this lesson. And you learned ways to be safer with your wallets, which is even more exciting. So let's do a quick recap of all the things we learned, because I know we learned a whole heck of a lot. So first off, we learned about what an NFT even is, right? And we created our own basic NFT, which had all the main functions that we needed. The token URI, which pointed the metadata, we had a mint NFT function and all of that. We stored, our NFT on IPFS. We learned about the difference between IPF storing on IPFS, which is going to be a little bit cheaper, versus storing on versus storing our metadata on chain, which is going to be a little bit more expensive, but it's going to be a more decentralized version of our. We also briefly touched on Filecoin and Arweave, which are two decentralized storage platforms that we could alternatively use instead of IPFS or instead of actually even storing on ETH mainnet and just point to our Filecoin or our Weave implementation. We didn't show you how to do that, but those are definitely resources for you to check out. We learned a couple more cheat codes in our scripts. We're gonna actually read from files, and we were able to base64 encode our files to a data URI. We learned about base64 encoding as well, which is something cool in itself. We learned how to call anything, even if we don't have the interface. All we need is the function signature. We learned what this ABI.encode with selector finally is. We learned about function signatures, function selectors. We learned all about the different types of encoding and the different things that you can do to actually encode your data and what is really going on when we send transactions. 
And then finally, we learned exactly what's going on under the hood when we have a transaction. So we can even start viewing some transactions on our block explorer, scroll down to more details, and we can even see what input data people have sent with their transactions. So if I go to one of my accounts and I select one of my previous transactions, for example, the enter raffle from a previous lesson, I go click to see more, and we can see the method ID or the function selector here, enter raffle is gonna be this. And I can view this as the original, which shows the input data is just this. And I can go ahead, maybe I could go to the Sam CC Sun database, hit enter. It looks like this, sure enough, this function selector is for enter raffle. And we learned how to decode hex data. So we can actually make sure the transactions that we send in MetaMask are secure. Now is a perfect time to take a break, take some rest, go get some ice cream, go get some coffee. Tweet at me on Twitter because you're so excited that you learned all these super advanced methodologies. Just by you getting this far, I'm being 100% honest, you are better, you have learned some skills that even some top Solidity devs don't even know. So you are growing incredibly quickly and we're not even done. We've got a few more lessons left. We're gonna to get to the most advanced section next, which is gonna be this Foundry DeFi stablecoin. I'm probably gonna combine these into one or two lessons instead of three, then upgrades and then governance and then introduction to security but you are on your way to becoming a phenomenal smart contract developer. So take that break. You need it. You deserve it. And I'll see you in the next one. All right, welcome back. Welcome to the DeFi section of this course. We scroll all the way down here, Foundry DeFi. You can see the code that we're gonna work with for this course. Now, I gotta say ahead of time, DeFi is an absolutely massive topic. Quite frankly, that deserves an entire video of itself. So we're just gonna give you a brief rundown of what DeFi is, what you can do with it, and some of the most popular apps out there. So first, to get started, we can use this site called DeFi Llama to get a snapshot of what's going on in the DeFi world right now. The total value locked in DeFi, some of the dominant apps, and what the dominant protocols are doing. For me, we can look at some of these top five for now too. Lido is a liquid staking platform, which I'm not gonna go into right now. MakerDAO is a CDP, or a collateralized debt position protocol for making stable coins, which is what we're gonna be building. Aave is a borrowing and lending protocol, like an open source decentralized bank. Curve Finance is a decentralized exchange, more specifically for working with these stable coins. And then Uniswap is a general purpose exchange for swapping tokens and different types of assets. To me, if you understand some of these top ones, as you go down the list, you can get more and more intricate or more and more specific different types of DeFi protocols. The beauty of DeFi and decentralized finance is that you get access to sophisticated financial products and instruments in a decentralized context. If you're not super familiar with financial terminology, some of this might be a little bit difficult to grasp, but it is a phenomenal rabbit hole to go down and it is a absolute ton of fun. There's so many cool things you can do in DeFi. And in my mind, DeFi is one of, if not the most interesting and most important industries and applications that smart contracts enable. So I highly recommend you get used to some DeFi. Some great places to learn about DeFi are going to be places like Bankless, which has a podcast that I listen to. Again, like I said, MetaMask Learn to learn more specifically about wallets and safety about wallets and honestly, so many more. Most concepts that you've learned in Web2 or traditional finance translate over to DeFi really well. And one of my favorite things to tell people to do is to try out Aave and Uniswap to really see how some of these protocols work. So if we scroll down here, we can go to the website. Same thing with this one, we'll scroll down, we can go to the website here. In Aave, we can even launch the app and we can see what this app even looks like. Let's go ahead, connect our wallet here. 
I am going to switch to, I'm going to check my chain that I'm on. We're on Sepolia testnet. If you look up at the top, one thing that's really cool is you can see this little IPFS thing here. This little IPFS thing only happens with Brave, but it means that this site is also hosted on IPFS, right? Web3, all about decentrality. But if we scroll down, we can see we can supply different assets and get an interest rate on those assets if we supply them. For example, if we were to supply USDC, which is a United States dollar peg stablecoin, we get 2.45% interest, similar exactly to how a bank account works. The reason that we get this interest is because there are other people who are borrowing these assets, again, similar to a bank, and they get charged an interest rate for borrowing these assets. So if you supply assets, you get given an interest rate. And if you borrow assets, you get you have to pay some interest rate. And this is why this protocol is so cool. It's permissionless banking, permissionless borrowing and lending of assets. Uniswap is another really cool application where you can very easily swap tokens between each other. For example, let's if I were to switch to Ethereum mainnet, I could choose something like ETH and swap to an asset, the Aave governance token. And it's a permissionless decentralized exchange and really enables access to financial markets in a much more transparent, more accountable and fair way. And I just get absolutely excited about working with these. For those of you looking to get started here, I definitely recommend trying to use some of these on test nets. Unfortunately, not all of these work on test nets, but I have a couple of videos that shows actually working with some of these that we can that we can go ahead and actually watch, such as leverage trading in DeFi, become a DeFi quant, flash loans with Aave, which is an advanced DeFi tool, and a couple of more. And when working with these, I don't recommend doing this on the Ethereum main chain. I would recommend doing something like Polygon, Optimism, or Arbitrum, where it's going to be a lot cheaper to make transactions. Ethereum fees right now are too high, and that's why we have scaling with layer twos like Arbitrum and Optimism. One other thing that I should absolutely mention now that we're getting into DeFi is that there's this topic that we're not going to have time to go over called MEV. MEV, or Minor Extractable Value, or Maximal Extractable Value, depending on who you ask, is something that plagues the DeFi industry. It's something that a lot of ETH core devs and protocols like Flashbots are working on right now. Basically, the concept is if you are the validator who gets to order the transactions in a block, you can order those transactions in such a way that benefit you. There are a lot of different protocols working on mitigating MEV and preventing MEV in the future or making it more fair. And there's all types of opinions on MEV. I 100% recommend that if you're looking to go more into really deep MEV, more into really deep DeFi stuff, you check out this flashbots.net new to MEV repo and check out some of these videos and blogs. They are absolutely astonishing to read. They are a ton of fun to read and also show a terrifying side to the Ethereum world as well. But in any case, the project that we're going to be building in this course is going to be a stable coin. Now, the concept of stable coins is a bit of an advanced topic, believe it or not. Maybe you've heard some stuff about it, maybe you haven't. In any case, we're going to watch a video that I made previously about stable coins and what they really are and what a lot of mainstream media actually gets wrong about them. And by doing this, we as developers are going to have a much better understanding of what these stable coins really are and how they actually work under the hood. This is going to be a tough lesson. I'm going to say this straight up. It's going to be very difficult. There's a lot going on here. I want you to be absolutely sure to go to ChatGPT and ask ChatGPT questions. Absolutely, in the GitHub repo associated with this course, be sure to use this discussion tab and ask a lot of questions. In fact, if you want, you can even browse around the MakerDAO forum, which is the protocol behind the DAI token, which is what our product that we're going to build is very roughly based off of and kind of read what people in the industry are actually working with and actually doing. Like I said, there is a lot to DeFi. And this project that we're making, I'm actually planning on getting audited after we release this course. And this is easily going to be our most advanced project in the course, hands down. Even though we have a couple lessons after this, upgrades, governance, and introduction to security, this Foundry stablecoin project is the most advanced product we're working with, hands down. If you're able to go through this and understand everything in this lesson, you should be incredibly proud of yourself and incredibly excited to move forward because this is a hard project and that's okay. Take your time. Don't overburden yourself. There's a lot to go through here.
If you've never understood DeFi, take some time and look into DeFi. If we go to Google, we look up like Learn DeFi, we get a Coin Telegraph article, get some Medium articles, maybe even Udemy, Coinbase. Coinbase actually has a great article on this. There's a lot of places to learn about DeFi. So yes, I do recommend if you're completely unfamiliar with DeFi, pause the video now, take at least 15, 20 minutes just to do some Google searching around, right? Any knowledge that primes you for this next section is great. And there's really just so much to DeFi. The main thing is that DeFi is permissionless, open source finance. And to me, it is the absolute best thing about smart contracts. With DeFi, we can actually move away from financial institutions and products that have no transparency, that don't help you, that have centralization risk. And the last 20 years have been a history lesson on why we need DeFi to take over the world. So definitely want you to do a little bit of research here. So let's do a walk through the code and then let's walk through this video on what stable coins actually are. So here's our code base. If we go into SRC, we see two main files. We have decentralized stablecoin.sol. And if we look into here, it's a real minimalistic, very basic ish ERC20. We've got some more interesting, more advanced imports such as ERC20 burnable and ownable. But here it looks real similar to an ERC20, right? We've got a constructor with ERC20. We have a burn function where we can actually burn tokens, remove tokens, and we have a mint function where we can mint and print new tokens. But the main contract is this DSC engine.sol. So this decentralized stablecoin is controlled by this DSC e engine. And this has a ton of stuff in here. Some of the main functionality in here is going to be where we deposit collateral and mint DSC. So this stablecoin is going to work because it's going to be backed by collaterals that have monetary value. We'll talk about more about that in a minute. You can redeem your collateral, remove your collateral. Look at all this NAT spec, by the way. Look at all these, these comments. We can burn DSC. We can burn our decentralized stablecoin. People can get liquidated. What the heck is liquidation? We'll talk about that later. They can mint DSC if they have enough collateral. And we'll talk about collateral soon. Deposit collateral, redeem collateral, etc. But there's a whole bunch of collateral stuff. And we'll explain that in a little bit. We have this test folder where we have our unit tests, where we go over engine, where we test the engine, the stable coin, and also this Oracle lib thing. We have mocks, which we know what mocks are. And then we have this thing that we kind of briefly went over, which is fuzz tests. And we have this invariant thing that, what is this invariant thing? And we have this new type of invariant underscore tests, which we're going to go over and we're going to explain. These invariant tests separate, these invariant tests in my mind, separate mediocre Solidity developers from incredibly powerful, incredibly advanced Solidity developers. We've got our scripts as well, real minimal here. We mainly just deploy the stablecoin. We're going to be using Chainlink price feeds to measure the price of the underlying collateral. Again, we'll talk about that soon, but this is really the, the high level walkthrough and you can find all the code and all the information you need on this repo. Like I said, this is going to be an advanced section. Take your time with it. Be sure to ask questions. Use all the tools you have at your disposal to code along and understand what we're doing. But the other reason why I want to make a stable coin here is because I strongly believe Stable coins are going to be one of the most important DeFi primitives or DeFi products that Web3 has to offer. And in my opinion, right now, the current solutions aren't good enough. So hopefully this inspires some of you to go out and build a better one. But let's go ahead. Let's go into this video. Let's learn about stable coins and take your time learning this. All right, let's watch this video. When you research stablecoins today, you get a lot of misleading information. And that's what we're here to clarify today. In this video, we're going to teach you everything you need to know about stablecoins. But actually, what are stablecoins? Why we care? Categories and properties, designs of top stablecoins, and then the real reason behind what they do, what stablecoins really do. This video is for both everybody technical and non-technical. And we're going to correct a lot of the misleading information out there. There's going to be a lot of information here for people less familiar with DeFi. So as always, don't be discouraged if something doesn't 
make sense the first time you hear it. Buckle up. Buckle up, dum dum. We're in for a volatile ride about stability. A stable coin is a non volatile crypto asset. That's it. Fleshed out, we could rephrase it to a stable coin is a crypto asset whose buying power fluctuates very little relative to the rest of the market. And this is the first place where we disagree with traditional media. If you Google what is a stable coin, you'll see something like this response everywhere. Stable coins are cryptocurrencies, the value of which is pegged or tied to that of another currency, commodity, or financial instrument. And to that, I disagree. I think that's an easy initial way to understand them, but not the whole story. A stable coin is a crypto asset whose buying power stays relatively stable. A good example of buying power would be an Apple market. If you went to a market to buy apples with Bitcoin six months ago, the number of apples you could buy would be drastically different than the number of apples you could buy today. That's an example of buying power changing and not being very stable. However, someone buying apples with dollars would probably be able to buy the same amount of apples six months ago to now. That's an example of buying power staying relatively the same. Since we could buy the same amount of apples today than six months ago, a dollar would be considered a more stable asset, whereas Bitcoin would be much less stable. This is what we mean by buying power. An asset whose price fluctuates rapidly all the time is a poor example of stable buying power. Oh, it went to zero! Yeah! This, for example, would not be a stable asset. Now, a stable crypto asset is just a stable asset that's a cryptocurrency. Most cryptocurrencies, by nature, aren't stable. But we will give examples of stable coins. So, summary here, a stable coin is a crypto asset whose buying power stays relatively the same. And if that's all you take from this video, Perfect, great, let's keep going. Now, why do we care about stable coins? Because money is important. But not like, oh, I love money type of important. In everyday society, we need some type of low volatility, aka stable currency to fulfill the three functions of money. And for Web3, we need a crypto version of this. The three functions of money are storage of value, unit of account, and medium of exchange. Storage of value is a way for us to keep the value and wealth we've generated. Putting dollars in your bank account or buying stocks slash cryptocurrencies is a good example of storing your value. Apples would make for a poor storage of value since they would rot over time and lose their value. Unit of account is a way to measure how valuable something is. When you go shopping, you see prices being listed in terms of dollars. This is an example of the dollar being used as a unit of account. Pricing something in Bitcoin would be a poor unit of account since the prices would change all the time. Medium of exchange is an agreed upon method to transact with each other. Buying groceries with dollars is a good example of using dollars as a medium of exchange. Buying groceries with car tires would make for a poor medium of exchange since car tires are hard to transact with. In order for our everyday lives to be efficient, we need money to do all these three things. And like I said, in Web3, we need a Web3 money. We need to be able to know the value of stuff in Web3, to be able to pay for things without prices going crazy, and we need to be able to store our wealth in Web3. In a decentralized world, we need a decentralized money. Assets like Ethereum work great as a storage of value and medium of exchange, but fall a little bit on their unit of account due to their buying power of volatility. However, maybe in the future, as Ethereum becomes more adopted, it'll become stable and we won't even need stable coins. But right now, it's a little too volatile. And yet, I'll still tell you it's ultrasound money, since I do think it's an amazing store of value. But that's a conversation for another time. Bankless, don't kill me. I, I love your content. Also, if you're here, be sure to like and subscribe, because we're just cooking the fire up, and we are about to pop off. Anyways, okay, so now we know what a stablecoin is, why we care. Let's talk about the different categories of stablecoins. And here is the second place I strongly disagree with traditional media. If you search for types of stablecoins, you'll get something that pulls them into categories like this. Fiat collateralized, crypto collateralized, commodity collateralized, and then algorithmic. Now, this isn't too bad of a categorization. It does make it easier for new people to understand, but I think it paints a inaccurate picture. So let's categorize stablecoins. But actually, the categorizations that I like are relative stability, stability method, and collateral type. So what are these categorizations? Let's start with relative stability. When we talk about stability, something is stable only relative to something else. The most popular type of stable coins is pegging or anchored stable coins. And these are stable coins that are pegged or anchored to another asset like the US dollar. Tether, DAI, and USDC are all examples of US dollar pegged stablecoins. They follow the narrative of one of these coins equals $1. And that's how they stay stable. It's stable because they track the price of another asset that we 
think is stable. And most of these stable coins have some type of mechanism to make them almost interchangeable with their pegged asset. For example, USDC says that for every USDC token printed or minted, there is a dollar or a bunch of assets that equal a dollar in some bank account somewhere. So the way it keeps its value is that at any time, you should be able to swap your USDC for the dollar, or at least hypothetically so. Something like DAI, on the other hand, uses a permissionless over collateralization to maintain its peg. But we'll get to understanding that a little later. However, a stablecoin doesn't have to be pegged to another asset. It can be floating. Remember, to be considered a stablecoin, its buying power just has to stay relatively the same over time. So a floating stablecoin is floating because its buying power stays the same and it's not tied down to any other asset. With this mechanism, you could hypothetically have a stablecoin that's even more stable than an anchored or pegged stablecoin. Let's look at an example. Let's say I can buy 10 apples for $10 today, but in five years, I can only buy five apples with $10. So it would cost me $20 to buy 10 apples. This isn't an unheard of phenomenon to happen and is commonly just referred to as inflation. Now let's introduce a stable coin whose buying power floats up and down with the market. For now, let's just pretend it does so magically and let's call it Apple coin. Today, you can buy 10 apples with 10 Apple coins. And in 10 years, you can also buy 10 apples with 10 Apple coins. Which one of these assets would you say is more stable? Yes, the Apple coin's buying power stayed the same over the five year period. So we'd say it's a more stable asset, even though it's not pegged to something like a dollar. And yes, stable coins like this do exist. And they use a lot of clever algorithms to do this. One such example is the Rye stable coin by Reflexor Labs. How Rye works might be its own video, but we've left some links in the description for you if you want to learn more about how it works. Because this concept can be a little hard to grasp, to further explain it, let's go through another analogy. Let's look at the anchor and the buoy in this image. Which of these do you think is more stable? The anchor or the buoy? Well, it depends on what you're comparing them to. Compared to sea level, the buoy is more stable since it'll always be at sea level. As the water level rises and falls, the distance between the anchor and the sea level is constantly changing. The buoy is an example of a floating stablecoin. Now, if we compare these two to the ocean floor though, the anchor is more stable of the two since it'll always be right on the ocean floor. This is analogous to a pegged slash anchored stablecoin. Now, if we're gonna be really serious with this analogy, then the question might be, well, what happens when a storm comes or what happens when the water's crazy or the tide's crazy or something? And to that, I'd say you're right. And a stablecoin needs to take extra precautions to take these into account and maybe get the average sea level over the course of time. And most popular floating stablecoins have some mechanism to account for turbulence like that. Summary, peg stable coins are tied to that of another asset while floating stable coins use different mechanisms to keep the same buying power over time. Number two, stability method. The stability method is this mechanism that keeps the coin stable. If it's a peg stable coin, what is the pegging mechanism? If it's a floating stable coin, well, what is the floating mechanism? And it typically revolves around minting and burning the stable coins in very specific ways. And it usually refers to who or what is doing the minting and burning. These are on a spectrum of governed to algorithmic. In a governed stablecoin, there is a governing body or a centralized body that is minting and burning the stablecoins. You can imagine the maximally governed and least algorithmic coin would be a single person slash entity minting new stablecoins, promising that the coins are not volatile. But it could also be an organization like a government or even a DAO choosing to mint and burn new coins. These governed coins are typically considered centralized since there's a singular body that is controlling the minting and burning. You can make them more decentralized by introducing a DAO and that kind of makes them more algorithmic, but we'll get more into that later. Coins like USDC, USDT, and TUSD are examples of governed stablecoins. On the other hand, an algorithmic stablecoin is a stablecoin whose stability is maintained by a permissionless algorithm with no human intervention. And this is the third place where I disagree with traditional media. A coin like DAI, I would consider much more algorithmic than governed because it uses a permissionless algorithm to mint and burn tokens. Whereas traditional media might say an algorithmic stablecoin is always under collateralized or follow senior in shares or something like that. But an algorithmic stablecoin is just when a set of autonomous code or algorithm dictates the minting and burning. There are zero meddling humans. Would have been mine if it hadn't been for those meddling kids. Examples of algorithmic stablecoins are going to be DAI, FRAX, RAI, and yes, 
the $40 billion disaster, UST. Yes, we're going to talk a little bit more about classic UST and Luna. Now, a token can have algorithmic and governed properties in the same way that it can be somewhere in the middle of being floating and pegged. DAI, for example, does have an autonomous set of code that dictates the minting and burning, but it does also have a DAO where they can vote on different interest rates and what can be collateral types and different things like that. So technically, it is a hybrid system. It has some governance mechanisms and also some algorithmic ones. USDC would fall purely in the governed category because it's controlled by a centralized body. UST and Luna would fall almost purely in algorithmic. The Dirt Roads blog has some amazing takes on these pieces and a wonderful visualization of where on a spectrum of coins that are more algorithmic or governed. They use dumb as the opposite of algorithmic instead of govern, which probably isn't wrong. Most classically categorized fiat collateralized stablecoin almost all fall into the govern or dumb section since they are dealing with fiat currency and you need a centralized entity to onboard that fiat to the blockchain. You'll also notice on this chart, they have anchored versus reflexive on the x-axis. That's referring to how the collateral type affects the stablecoin, and collateral type is what we're going to cover next. So the summary here, though, is algorithmic stablecoins use some sort of autonomous permissionless code to mint and burn tokens, whereas a governed stablecoin have some human interaction that mints and burns the coins and keeps them stable. Now, before we go into our final category, let's look at this chart again. We could replace the word anchored with exogenous and reflexive with endogenous. And we'd have a chart that shows collateral type versus stability mechanism, which brings us to number three, collateral type. Now, when we say collateral, we mean the stuff backing our stable coins and giving it value. For example, USDC has the dollar as its collateral, and it's the dollar that gives the USDC token its value because you hypothetically can swap one USDC for one dollar. DAI is collateralized by many assets. For example, you could deposit ETH and get minted die in return. And UST was in a roundabout way collateralized by Luna. Exogenous collateral is collateral that originates from outside the protocol and endogenous collateral originates from inside the protocol. So one of the easier ways to define what type of collateral a protocol is using is to ask this question. If the stablecoin fails, does the underlying collateral also fail? If yes, it's endogenous. If no, it's exogenous. If USDC fails the protocol, does the underlying collateral, the dollar, fail? No, so the protocol has exogenous collateral. If the USDC stablecoin fails, the dollar is gonna keep being the dollar. If DAI, the stablecoin fails, does the underlying collateral ETH also fail? No, so the DAI system is exogenous. The value of ETH isn't dependent on the value of DAI. If UST fails, does the underlying collateral Luna slash Terra fail? Yes, absolutely. And this is exactly what happened that caused the system to lose $40 billion in what seemed like a day. Exogenous collateral originates from outside the protocol. Endogenous collateral originates from inside the protocol. Two other good tests that you can ask are, was the collateral created with the sole purpose of being collateral? Or does the protocol own the issuance of the underlying collateral? If the answer is yes to either one of those, then it's endogenous collateral. Now, the traditional media usually says that algorithmic stablecoins are to blame, but I think what they're really referring to is endogenously collateralized stablecoins. It makes sense that they can be scary and potentially dangerous because their value kind of comes from nothing. Exogenously collateralized stablecoins are typically over collateralized, meaning there's more value of collateral than there is of the stablecoins. Here we have another image from Dirt Roads comparing different stablecoins the exogenous versus endogenous collateral of the protocols and how much they have. MakerDAO slash DAI has almost all exogenous collateral. Frax, which is another stablecoin we haven't really spoken about too much, has a mix of exogenous and endogenous collateral. And the old Terra Luna and UST system had mainly endogenous collateral, which is how the system was able to crumble so quickly. So yeah, endogenously collateralized stablecoins don't have a great track record. So why would you want to make one? Well, the answer is scale. And oftentimes people also say capital efficiency. With exogenously collateralized stablecoins, the only way you can mint more stablecoins is by onboarding more collateral. You can only have a stablecoin market cap that is high or as high as that is the value of all your collateral. So if you want to have $68 billion in stablecoins, then that means you need to have $68 billion worth of collateral. And that's a lot of money that you would need to onboard to your system. If you have an endogenously collateralized stablecoin, 
you can have zero dollars worth of collateral, meaning it's much easier to become massive faster. Now, I agree with the Dirt Roads publication when they say that exogenously collateralized stablecoins can't scale. And I've talked more about that in the blog associated with this video. So if you're interested, be sure to check that out after the rest of this video. But watch the rest of this video because we're just getting started. In the blog, we also talk more about seniorage shares and shelling coin logic, which if you're interested in that stuff, definitely check it out. Most of these endogenous coins can be traced back to a paper written by a man named Robert Sams, where he talks about how to build an endogenously collateralized stablecoin using a seniorage shares model, which again, I'm not going to go into, but I wanted to mention it because it's probably one of the most influential papers when it comes to these endogenously collateralized stablecoins. Endogenously collateralized stablecoins. That's a lot of words. Now there's more information on the endogenous collateral debate in the blog, but let's do a thought experiment that I do think is compelling for endogenous collateralized stablecoins. Endogenously collateralized stablecoins. Imagine you have a currency and it's collateralized 100% by gold and you run a bank and it's open 24 seven to allow people to exchange your generic coin for gold in your vaults. People love the convenience of our stablecoin instead of having to lug around their gold. So they treat our stablecoin as if it was gold because they know that at any time they can exchange it at the bank. This is an example of our generic coin being exogenously collateralized by gold, pegged to its price and governed by us, by me, by our entity, since we own the issuance and burning of the coin. You come to our bank, we'll issue this coin, or we'll burn it once you redeem your gold. And since you can always exchange our coin for gold, our coin keeps its value. Now let's say the bank is only open five days a week. Does our coin lose its value now that you can't always exchange it for gold? Well, probably not. The market probably won't even care. Now let's say you need to close the bank for a week for renovations. Does our coin lose its value now? Well, let's say we close the bank for a month or a year or a decade forever. If we get to the point where you could never actually exchange our coin for gold or the underlying collateral again, maybe do people just use the coin as its currency backed by nothing? In a way, now it's moved from being exogenous to now being endogenous since it's now backed by, well, itself. This is why Dirt Roads has reflexive on their chart. One of our coins is no longer equal to some amount of gold. It now equals one of itself. Okay, I know there's a lot here and there's even more in the blog. So if some of this confused you, don't be discouraged. You can always come back. There's a ton of supporting documents and blogs and links that I personally watch to learn a lot of this as well. So be sure to use that if you get confused. But now let's look at some of the top stable coins, what their properties are, and then we're gonna get to some really interesting stuff. We're not gonna go too deep into the architectures of these stable coins. We are gonna go over DAI a little bit more though because the DAI slash MakerDAO system is a pretty standard model for what a stable coin could look like. And it was one of the most influential stable coins ever created, so there's that. And it's important that we go through these so we can understand what's currently out there and why they're currently out there. And then we can reveal why they're really out there. Why there's so many stable coins. What are the incentives for people to mint them? And it may just blow your mind. So let's start with DAI. As we've mentioned before, DAI is a pegged, algorithmic and exogenously collateralized stablecoin. It's one of the most influential DeFi projects ever created and was a huge factor in supercharging the DeFi space. Roughly the way it works is you deposit ETH or some other crypto collateral into the smart contract that has this DAI algorithm code. And based off the current collateral to US dollar or ETH to US dollar price, it'll mint you some amount of DAI. You can only mint less DAI than the total value of collateral or ETH that you have. This way, the system always has more collateral than they'd have minted DAI. Additionally, every year or so, you'll get charged something called a stability fee, usually around like 2%. And now you're free to do whatever you want with your DAI. If you want to get your ETH back, you have to give your DAI back to the smart contract, which will then burn your DAI. It'll use the current price of ETH to figure out how much money it should give back to you. It's because of this stability fee and collateralized ETH that people often refer to this system as a collateralized debt position. Since we technically owe DAI back to the protocol at some point. So yes, all the DAI that's in existence, somebody minted from the maker protocol and needs to pay it back at some point. 
If you can't pay your stability fees or the price of ETH tanks, and now the value of our collateral is less than the value of the die that we minted, people can liquidate us, which means they can take our collateral. Protocol always needs to have more collateral than minted die. So this is sort of your punishment for not keeping the collateral up and a way to save the system from becoming under collateralized. And then there's also a maker token that's used to vote for stuff. Now, the reason I give this overview is I want your brain to be asking the question, hey, uh, I get charged to mint a stable coin, all the die in the world, somebody is being charged to have it out there. Someone could take my collateral if I don't monitor the balance? And most importantly, why would I spend money to mint this stable coin? Why would I be the one to do that? Great question. That is the fundamental question, and we'll get to that. USDC. USDC is a classic pegged, governed, exogenously collateralized stable coin. It's backed by real world dollars in a bank account. Not much else to say here. UST and Luna. The classic old UST and Luna. We know it collapsed, but we can learn from what happened to hopefully prevent it in the future. UST was a stable coin pegged to the dollar, algorithmic and endogenous, and it imploded on itself. Using what we know about stable coins, can you guess why? Well, since the system was endogenous, once UST lost its peg, Luna became less attractive to hold. Since people weren't holding Luna, the price fell and it made it harder to keep the peg of UST, which made Luna's price fall, which makes UST harder to hold its peg, which makes, you see the pattern? People still want to try using these endogenously collateralized stablecoins because they do scale so quickly. So protocols like Frax have come a long way to do some type of hybrid between endogenous and exogenously collateralized stablecoin. Rai. Rai is one of the few floating stablecoins where it's not pegged to any other asset. It's focused on minimal governance, being floating, and using only Ethereum as their type of collateral with a nearly purely algorithmic stability mechanism. In a way, one could argue that because their collateral is only ETH, the price of Rye will always be somewhat pegged to the price of ETH, but that might be a longer argument. Due to these, it's floating, algorithmic, and exogenously collateralized. Now, they use some really cool supply and demand mechanisms to keep the price stable and non-volatile, but it's not really important how it works for the purpose of this video. So once again, I'm gonna leave some links in the description if you want to learn more about Rye, the video on screen right now, I think is particularly good at explaining exactly how it works and explaining why it's such a good stable coin for normal average people to have. So now that we've gone over some stable coins, we've gone over the categories, why we care, what is a stable coin? Let's talk about what they really do. We can start by asking the question, okay, which one of these is the best stable coin? And to that, I need to ask the best stable coin for who? Centralized governed coins obviously have the issue of centrality, which sort of defeats the purpose of being in Web3. So maybe we want some flavors of algorithmic stable coins. Maybe that's probably what we want for Web3. But these algorithmic coins might feel untested to non-crypto people and the fees associated with them might be a little bit scary. For me personally, like I said, I really love the idea of Rye. The idea is to have stable buying power as opposed to being pegged to some other asset and it's algorithmic in nature as opposed to being centralized. So it's a decentralized stablecoin. That's what we want. But every coin has their trade-offs and I'd argue there is definitely no best coin right now. The stablecoin that's best for the average person might matter much less. It's the stablecoin that's best for rich whales might be what's more important here. Yes, the stablecoins the whales like might be what's more important. Now, for most algorithmic stable coins, you'll see this, some sort of fee associated with minting the coins. Protocols do make money off of the stable coin systems, which I think is good. Sometimes they need money for maintenance, incentives for the stability of the coin, or money for improvements. So I do think these fees are good. And we need stable coins for the three functions of money, storage of value, unit of account, and medium of exchange. But are you going to be the one to pay these fees to mint them and keep them in circulation. Someone has to pay to mint these coins and often keep paying. The market cap for some of these stable coins is in the billions. If there is a 1% fee on these and the market cap is 1 billion, we're talking about $10 million. Are average people going to collectively pay $10 million a year to keep these in circulation? No. So average people aren't printing these for the three functions of money. Well, then who is minting these? So let's play a little thought experiment. Let's say I have ETH as an investment and I've bought up all the ETH. I've sold my house. I've sold everything I own and I've used everything I have to buy Ethereum, but I want more. What can I do? I can put my ETH into one of these stablecoin protocols 
get the minted stablecoin, and then sell the stablecoin for more ETH. You might have heard concepts like leverage investing or margin trading, and this is essentially the Web3 equivalent. It's kind of funny. Why are stablecoins good? Well, because we need those three functions of money. But why are stablecoins minted? Well, because investors want to make leveraged bets. In fact, most stablecoin platforms have this as one of the biggest reasons to mint their stablecoin, to multiply exposure or to maximize your position on some crypto asset. Now, for sophisticated investors, this isn't new information at all. This is like investing 101. However, it does feel weird that we need stablecoins for the three functions of money, but that's not why they're minted. So even though I said I really like Rai as a stablecoin for the people, a reason DAI might be higher market cap is that investors like the leverage opportunity much more than they like the leverage opportunity that Rai offers. It could be something else, but that might be a big reason. How much stablecoins are minted are based off of how much investors think they can use that stablecoin to get more exposure to assets that they really want. So I know we've gone over a lot here and the rabbit hole really doesn't end there. Curve.finance being one of the most important protocols for stablecoins is a really interesting story as well. My friend Garrett, who teaches about technology and finance, has a fantastic example as to why a stablecoin exchange might be so important. You might wonder how a stablecoin exchange ever got off the ground. Is there really any demand out there to trade $1 for $1? Then I think back to my university days. One weekend, my laundry pile grew so disgusting, I was desperate to use the washing machine immediately. But the laundry machine took quarters and I only had dollar bills. Quarters were in such short supply around the dorm room that I was willing to pay more than $1 for four quarters. In this urgent moment, I had specific utility in mind and that changed my personal equation for this. And Ave and Curve both looking to launch their own stablecoin soon is gonna be really interesting as well. So we'll just have to see how these unfold. I do think though that we are going to get better and better at creating these stablecoins because we do need them, they are important. And for you developers watching who want to build one of these, we have some minimal stablecoin contract examples in our DeFi minimal repo, link in the description. So if you're looking to tackle this problem, definitely be sure to get started there. I'm really excited for the future of DeFi and for the future of stablecoins, as I think they are a wildly important primitive for DeFi. And I know that this was a long video, but I hope you all learned something. And I hope this gives you a better idea of what stablecoins really are and how they're created. If you learned something, leave a comment in the comment section. If you didn't learn something, leave a comment in the comment section. Or if I got something wrong, leave a comment there. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. All right, we have now learned a ton about DeFi, and hopefully I piqued your curiosity on how much more there is still to learn. But now we're gonna move on to creating our own stablecoin here. So again, you can follow along with all the code that we're gonna be going over in this Foundry DeFi Stablecoin F23 section of this course. And like I said, I'm planning on getting this code actually audited. So be sure if you have your GitHub repo, be sure to watch this repo and look for updates because I will be posting the audit reports in this as well. I've got a couple videos on what smart contract audits are and why they're so important. And I'll leave a couple links in the GitHub repo associated with this course. For those of you looking to go down the security track, definitely be sure to watch this video. But all right, we are finally in our GitHub repo. Let's build this stablecoin. MKDIR, Foundry, DeFi, Stablecoin, F23. Let's open this up with code or you know the drill, file open folder. We're gonna be going a little faster this lesson because a lot of what we're doing is just gonna be drilling in information that you already know. We have a couple of new things to go over such as stateless fuzzing, which we'll talk about in a bit, but a lot of the coding aspect of this, you already know. All right, we're in our folder, forge init. Clear. Let's make a little readme over here and talk about the design of our protocol. So we're going to make a stablecoin. But if you watch that stablecoin video, we're going to make a stablecoin that is one, anchored. So when we're talking about the relative stability, it's going to be anchored or pegged to the US dollar. So this means we're going to have to put some code in here to make sure that our stablecoin is always worth $1. Number two, the stability, the stability mechanism or the way we do minting is going to be algorithmic. This means that this is gonna be a decentralized stablecoin. There's not gonna be any centralized 
entity that's going to mint or burn or maintain the price. This is going to be 100% on-chain and algorithmic, which is ideally what we have for the future of stablecoins. There's no controlling entity that controls our stablecoins. So this is great. A better stablecoin for Web3 probably isn't anchored or pegged. It's probably floating, but that's a much harder mechanism to do. So we're going to go ahead with the anchored or pegged for the moment. And then finally, the collateral type is going to be, you guessed it, exogenous. And it's going to be crypto collateral. We're going to use cryptocurrencies as collateral for this currency. We're going to use Ethereum and Bitcoin as the collateral for our system here. So with this being our architecture, we're going to keep this in mind. Okay, how can we actually make sure that this is always pegged to a dollar. And one way we can do this is with a chain link price feed. So with a chain link price feed, we get the price feed and we set a function to exchange ETH and Bitcoin for whatever their dollar equivalent is. And this way, if right in our contract, we have this exchange set up, the price of this stablecoin should hypothetically always be around a dollar. To make the stability mechanism algorithmic, we're going to say people can only mint the stablecoin with enough collateral. And that's going to be coded directly into our protocol. And the collateral type being exogenous, of course, we're only going to allow these two types of cryptocurrencies to be deposited. Specifically, we're going to use wrapped ETH and wrapped Bitcoin. So the ERC20 version of ETH and the ERC20 version of Bitcoin. Some might argue that this wrapped Bitcoin is a little bit centralized depending on who is onboarding the Bitcoin into Ethereum, but that's another conversation. So over collateralized stablecoin with WEF and Bitcoin as the collateral for this. Let's do this. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, well, we're going to get rid of all these. Goodbye, 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 delete. And now we're going to create our two main contracts. New file, D decentralized stable coin do a capital C dot soul and this is just going to be the actual token so I'm actually going to copy paste my layout of functions because I like them I like to have this and at the top of course SPDX license identifier MIT if you want you can just copy this directly from the github repo associated with this course SRC in here, copy this layout here. I like to have it as a reference. Then you already know, pragma, solidity, 0.8.18. And we'll do contract, decentralized, stable coin, boom, like this. And now this is gonna be one of the main differences between this code we're writing here and all the other products that we've done. We're going to be very verbose with our code documentation. And the reason for this is, is when it comes to security professionals who are gonna review this code, we're gonna make their lives so much easier if we have a ton of text explaining what our code is doing. Additionally, if you work with AIs, AIs are fantastic at reading and understanding language. So the more language that we have to explain what our code should do, the better off our code can be sent through some AI model to make sure that it doesn't have issues. So we're gonna go ahead Add a little bit of NAT spec here, right from the get-go. At title, Decentra by Stablecoin, all one word. At author, Patrick Collins, or put your name here. Yep, this is open source, MIT license. You could do whatever the heck you want with it. I'm even gonna say collateral, exogenous, ETH and BTC. Minting, or the stability mechanism, is gonna be algorithmic, meaning it's decentralized. Relative stability is going to be pegged to USD. And then I'm going to say under here, this is the contract meant to be governed by DSC engine. This contract is just the, I'm going to toggle word wrap here, ERC20 implementation of our stable coin system. So that's what this is going to be. This decentralized stablecoin is purely going to be an ERC20 with minting and burning and stuff, right? It's not going to be, it's not going to have any of the logic. The logic is going to be in a separate contract. 
So let's go ahead and let's make this. So first, constructor. Boom. And we're going to use Open Zeppelin to get this kick started. So right at the top, import. Well, actually, before we even do that, forge install Open Zeppelin slash Open Zeppelin dash contracts dash dash no dash commit. And we go ahead, we went ahead and installed that. Now we're going to open up our foundry.toml. We're going to add some remappings in here. So remappings equals at open zeppelin slash contracts equals lib slash open zeppelin slash contracts slash contracts. That looks pretty good. Right up at the top of this now. Import, little named import, ERC20. We're gonna import this ERC20 burnable contract. I'll explain this in a second. And then also ERC20 from at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC20 slash extensions slash ERC20 burnable dot soul. Did I spell this right? Looks like that's right. So what did I, oh, oops, looks like I spelled contracts wrong. Let's spell it right. Okay, cool, that looks good. Now what we're gonna say is that our decentralized stablecoin. let me even zoom out a little bit. Yep, this is going to be a big one. So we're going to zoom out a little bit here. Hopefully you all could see this is ERC20 burnable. Okay. And the reason that we're going to use this contract, if we command click in it, or just look it up, is it has this burn function. And we want this burn function because this is going to help us maintain the peg price, we're going to be burning a lot of these tokens, you'll understand that in a bit. Now, same as an ERC20. So the ERC20 burnable contract is an ERC20 which is why we can import the ERC20 contract from it as well. And the ERC20 burnable constructor is an ERC20, which means we have to use the ERC20 constructor as well, which takes a name where we're going to call ours decentralized stablecoin and DSC like this. And that's it. This is going to be our whole constructor. We're not going to touch it. That's all we're going to do. Let me zoom in a little bit. I'm going to keep zooming in and out. Hopefully it's not too crazy. Now we want this coin to be 100% governed by our engine. And our engine is going to have all this stuff about what collaterals to use, how to use it, what to peg it to, etc. This is purely just going to be the token. So since we want this token to be 100% controlled by our logic, we're going to make this ownable as well, which means we're going to have only owner modifiers where the owner is going to be that immutable logic we're going to create. So Open Zeppelin has a package for that too. So we're going to do import ownable from at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash access slash ownable dot soul. I'm going to copy this. So our contract is going to be ERC 20 burnable, and it's going to be ownable. And there's going to be two major functions that we want our engine to own. And those functions are going to be function burn, where it takes in a unit to 56 underscore amount public, we're going to override the burn function and burnable. And this is going to be only owner, so that only the engine, only the logic that we give it can mint and burn. And we're going to say UN256 balance equals balance of message.sender. And we're going to make sure that somebody when somebody tries to burn some token, they at least have that much token. So we're first of all going to say, if the amount is less than or equal to zero, then they can't burn, right? We don't want people to try burning zero. That's silly. So we're going to revert with an error. We're going to put all of our errors right up at the top here. Error, essentially stable coin, underscore, underscore, must be more than zero like this. So we're going to revert with this error. And then we're also going to say if the user's balance is less than the amount that they're trying to burn, then we're going to revert with another custom error, I'm just going to copy paste. And I'm just going to say, burn amount exceeds balance, boom, paste that in like this. And then finally, we're going to do this thing called super dot burn, which we haven't talked about yet. So this super keyword basically says, hey, use the burn function from the parent class which in this case is the ERC20 burnable. So all of this code is going to run. It's going to hit this line. It's going to say, hey, go to the super class and use the burn function there. So our code's going to go, oh, okay, well, ERC20 burnable, that's the super class or the parent class. 
Ah, just use the burn function in here, which calls the burn function here in the erc20.soul, which does all this stuff in here. So that's what the super keyword does. Only owner, only engine is going to add this. Now we're going to do this function mint. This is going to be an address two and a uint 256 underscore amount. This is going to be public. Excuse me. This is actually going to be external. Also only owner. This one probably could be external as well, but that'll come out in the audit. External only owner. And this is actually going to return the Boolean. When you do mint, you want to have a return a Boolean here. When you do a mint, we're going to return true if it actually works. But we're going to say if two equals equals address zero, we're going to do a little sanitization of the inputs here. Then we're going to revert, revert with a new error. Error, decentralized stablecoin, not zero address. We're not going to let people accidentally mint to the zero address because that happens kind of a lot. And we're going to say if the amount is less than or equal to zero, then we're also going to revert with this more than zero error here. Boom. And then finally, we're going to return true. Oh, and then obviously we should run mint underscore two comma underscore amount. So we're not overriding any functions in here. Right, we're just calling the mint function over here. We had to do super because we're overriding the burn function. We're saying, hey, do all this stuff and then do the regular burn. There is no mint function. There's an underscore mint function that we're going to be calling. And guess what? That's it. This contract's done. We're not doing any more here. Forge build. Cool. And then we probably want to write some tests for this, write a deploy script, but we're going to do all that in a little bit. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to build the engine, the engine to the car, the main components of this contract. If you want to take a break and be proud of yourself right here, go for it. If you want to even pause the video, start writing some of your own tests, write your own deploy scripts, go for it. But let's go ahead and start building this engine. And we're going to be building this a little bit different than some of the other projects. We might even be testing some of this along the way to make sure we get things right. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new file, D-S-C-E-N-G-I-N-E dot soul, decentralized stablecoin engine, and let's build this engine to this car. All right, let's go back to, let me grab, I'm just going to copy paste this beginning part. Let's come to the engine, paste that in. We have SPDX, layout of contracts, pragma solidity, contract, D-S-C engine this. And let's give this a lot of NAT spec. All right, title DSC engine. I don't want that at author ah, or Patrick Collins. The system is designed to be as minimal as possible and have the tokens maintain a $1 maintain a one token equals equals one dollar peg. I'm gonna to toggle the word wrap. This stable coin has the properties genus collateral, dollar pegged, algorithm, algorithm stable. It is similar to DAI if DAI had no governance, no fees, and was only backed by wrapped ETH and wrapped Bitcoin. At notice, this contract is the core of the DSC system. It handles all the logic for minting and redeeming DSC, as well as the positing and drawing collateral. At notice, this contract is very loosely based on DAI, on the MakerDAO DSS DAI, system. You might be asking, Patrick, that's a lot of text here. Yes, we want a lot of text. When people read our code, our code should be readable. Remember, your code is going to be written once, read hundreds of thousands of times. I have read the Ave and Maker code so many times, and so many other people have as well. You want your code to be very verbose so that other people can come and understand what's going on. So 
Let's begin. So let's think about what are the main functions that our project should have? What are the main things that we should do, right? Before we start, even start coding anything. And oftentimes, a lot of people will take this step and will actually create an interface for their code. They'll create an interface and say, hey, here's all the functions that I want this to do. And then they'll say, hey, our contract is that interface so that they don't forget any of those functions. For us, I'm just gonna go ahead and write them out here. So I want one function to be function, deposit collateral and mint DSC. I want people to be able to deposit their DAI or their Bitcoin and mint our DSC token. I want people to redeem their collateral or DSC, right? When people are done with doing whatever they want with the stablecoin, they can turn the stablecoin, the, D the DSC, decentralized stablecoin, back in for whatever collateral they originally used. I want people to be able to function, burn their DSC. And the reason for this is if they're nervous that they have too much stablecoin and not enough collateral and they want just a quick way to have more collateral than DSC, they can quickly burn stuff, which is another part of the system. We should even put a point in here. Our DSC should, our DSC system should always be over collateralized. At no point should the value of all collateral be less than or equal to the value of all the DSC or the dollar backed value of all the DSC. We should always have more collateral than DSC in the system at all times. And we need to code in such a way. So burn DSC is a function that will make more sense in a little bit. We should have a function called liquidate. And this is gonna be a really important function. The reason that we're always gonna have more collateral, if the value of their collateral drops too much, let's say, let's say I put in $100 worth of ETH and I minted $50 worth of DSC. I have more collateral than DSC, that's good. What if the ETH price tanks to $40, 40 ETH? Now we are under collateralized, right? Now we have less ETH than we have DSC. And keep, and this user should get what's called liquidated. They shouldn't be allowed to hold a position in our system anymore. So ideally we set some threshold that's too low. Maybe it's, maybe it's 20%. And if you hold $60 worth of ETH and $50 worth of DSC, you should get kicked out of the system because you're way too close to being under collateralized. This liquidate function is gonna be the function that other users can call to remove people's positions to save the protocol. And we'll talk about that a little bit more very soon. And we're gonna want a function health factor. This should be an external view function or excuse me, get health factor. And this will allow to see how healthy people are. So let's go back up to this example here. So if, if the price of ETH dumps to $40, we're now $10 under collateralized, right? And that's not good. That's really bad. We never want this to happen. So what we can do is we can set a threshold to let's say for this example, 50% or 150%. So if you have $50 in the system, you need to have at least 75 ETH at all times. This way, there's a little bit of a buffer. That way we can never be under collateralized if the price tanks here. If you go to $74, now what we can do is we can liquidate and we can say, hey, if someone liquid, if someone pays back your borrow, your minted DSC, they can have all your collateral or a discount. So maybe we say, hey, somebody pay back this 50 DSC and you can have this $74 worth of ETH. Somebody's gonna be very incentivized to do this because they're gonna make 20, $24. So we'll set some threshold, maybe 150%, and we'll, we'll say, hey, anybody who liquidates your position, if you're under the threshold, they can have as a reward some of your extra collateral. And this will incentivize people to always have extra collateral. Otherwise, they're going to lose way more money than they borrowed. If that didn't make sense. So one more time, let's do that example. So if I mint, so if I put down $100 worth of ETH as collateral, and I mint $50 worth of DSC, now I'm going to go off and do whatever I want with DSC. 
price of my ETH tanks to $75, or better yet, let's say $74, some other user is going to see, oh my God, under collateralized, and we're going to let people liquidate their positions if they become under collateralized based off the threshold. Some other user is going to see that and they're going to say, okay, I'll pay back the $50 of DSC. I'll pay back the $50 of DSC. So now this person has zero debt and in return, get all your collateral. So now this person has $0 worth of ETH and this user got the $74. And all they had to do was pay $50 of DSC to get $74 of ETH. So this person is now up, just made $25 or $24 by liquidating you. They're incentivized to make money. And this is your punishment for letting your collateral get too low. So hopefully that makes sense. If this system of liquidations doesn't make sense to you, you know where to go. Come to the GitHub repo system with this course and start joining the discussion. All right, so hopefully this made sense. If it doesn't, use the discussions tab, of course. Now these are kind of this combination function. We're probably gonna want a function just called deposit, like this, deposit collateral, external. We're probably gonna want a function redeem collateral, external. And then we're probably gonna want, along with a burn DSC, we're probably gonna want a function mint DSC, external. And these look like these are probably gonna be the majority of what our protocol does. And what a lot of people even do is sometimes they'll even write tests right now, describing what each one of these should actually do to the system, right? We're not gonna do that, but we may actually write some tests as we go along here. And I like to write my deploy script kind of early, and you'll see me do that here. That way I can write tests using my deploy script. So let's go ahead though. Where is the best place to start tackling this? Well, to me, the easiest place to start is actually with the depositing, right? Because that's the first thing people are realistically gonna do with this protocol is actually deposit the collateral. So I'm gonna start there. So for this deposit collateral function, what are they gonna to wanna to do here? Well, we're gonna to need to let them pick what collateral they wanna deposit. So we'll say address, token collateral address, and then also the unit 56 amount collateral. And we're gonna do a little toggle word wrap. All right, cool. So deposit collateral, the token collateral address, and then the amounts that they're gonna to wanna to do. So already we can see that there's gonna be a whole bunch of stuff that we're gonna to wanna to do here. So let's even do a little bit of NAT spec. In that spec here, we'll say at param, we'll just explain what the params are. And this is where GitHub Copilot is really helpful because oftentimes it's really good with docs. So we're gonna say at param, rm. So both of those are good. Token collateral address, the amount of token to deposit as collateral, amount of collateral, the amount of collateral to deposit, right? Real simple. So we're gonna want a couple of things here. We're gonna to wanna to sanitize this a little bit. So the amount collateral, we're definitely gonna want this to be more than zero. So we're probably gonna want a modifier called more than zero that we can use throughout these functions. Sometimes people might accidentally send a zero transaction. We want to automatically revert those. So if we scroll up to the top here, we see our modifiers come before our functions. So we're gonna create our modifiers here and we're even gonna add like a little, little section a whole bunch of these here, boom, 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 modifiers like this. Cool. And we'll say modifier more than zero. And this modifier will take a UN256 amount and we'll just say if amount, amount equals equals zero, then we're gonna go ahead and revert with a new error. Where do errors go? Let's scroll to the top, errors go right underneath imports. Actually, it's not quite right. They're gonna go right underneath the contract. So we're gonna do, we're gonna copy this whole section. We're gonna say errors. We're gonna go here. We're gonna say error, DSC engine, underscore, underscore. What do we wanna call that? But just needs more than zero. Needs more than zero. Like this, and we're gonna revert with needs more than zero. And of course, add the little underscore here. Cool. So now we have a more than zero modifier. So we can make this external more than zero and we'll pass the amount collateral and boom. Okay, cool. We're doing a little sanitization here. What else should we do? 
And you know what, let's even copy this. We'll paste this here. We'll say functions. And we're gonna have a constructor. So I'm just gonna put this here for now. Constructor, I should spell constructor right. And then we're gonna have a section after functions, like a subsection. We're gonna call it external functions. Like this, external functions. Cool. Because we wanna go receive and fallback. We're not gonna have those, but then external and public. So external function first. Anyways, okay. More than zero, got that. And we probably don't want people to use any collateral, right? We probably only want them to use certain collateral that we allow. So we're gonna have to create a new modifier called is allowed token. So we're gonna do modifier is allowed token. And this is gonna take a address token. Basically, we're gonna say, if the token not allowed, the token isn't allowed, then revert, right? However, at the moment, we don't have like a token allow list. So let's create that. This is probably gonna be a state mapping. So let's scroll to the top. Where do state variables go? So errors, type declaration, state variables. Okay, errors. Great, let's put it here. State variables. Okay, and let's do our, let's create an allowed list of mapping. So we'll do mapping address to bool, you know, private s underscore token to allowed. And we could do this. However, I already know that we're going to need price feeds. So instead, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to do an address to bool. I'm going to do an address to address. And this is going to be our price feed mapping. So this is going to be s underscore price feeds. And normally I do the syntax token to price feed, right? But for this one, we're just gonna call this price feeds and we're gonna use the newer solidity named mappings to make this a little bit clearer. So I'm gonna say address token maps to address price feed. So now this is S price feed and anybody can look up and go, ah, oh, okay, so this is token to price feed. Cool. So we're gonna have this list of price feeds and where should we probably set this? Well, we're probably gonna to wanna to set this up right in the constructor, right? Right when we deploy this contract, that's when we're gonna say, okay, these are gonna be the allowed tokens, these are the price feeds, and that way it's gonna be like that forever, right? We're never gonna be able to change this. So what we'll do is in our constructor now, we'll take in the, the allowed tokens and their price feeds, right? Because in order for this system to work, if we go to like data.chain.link, in order for this entire system to work, if we want to know how much value our Ethereum that people deposit in here is worth, we need to have the pricing, right? The only way for us to know if we're over collateralized, if we know the value of our ETH and our Bitcoin. So we're gonna use these two price feeds to, to maintain that. Because these price feeds are gonna be on different addresses on different chains, you already know that we gotta parameterize it. So we'll do an address array, memory, token addresses comma address array memory price feed addresses as input parameters. And we're gonna say token address zero maps to price feed zero, token address one maps to price feed one, et cetera. And while we're in here, I already know that our DSC engine is gonna need to know about our decentralized stablecoin. Why? Because our DSC engine is gonna need to know to call burn and mint. So in here, in the constructor, this is also where we're going to pass the address, DSC address, decentralized stablecoin address. And so in here, let's do some sanity checks on this. We'll say if the token addresses dot length does not equal the price feed addresses, price feed address is price feed addresses dot length, we have an issue, right? Because if there's more tokens or more price feeds, that means we messed something up. So we're gonna go ahead and revert with a new error. We'll go to our errors here. We'll say error, DSC engine, underscore, underscore, token address is, and price feed addresses must be same length. It's a massive error, I know, but I like being verbose, like I've told you before. So if those don't match, we're gonna go ahead and revert. Then we're gonna loop through the token addresses and update our mapping that we just created. 
here to say, okay, the token address is mapped to the price feed address. Now, in order for us to get a pricing, we're gonna have to use the USD price feeds and everything, every price feed that we're gonna to have to use is gonna be the USD backed price feed. So for example, it's gonna be ETH USD, BTC USD, MKR USD, etc. Okay, so we're gonna loop through, we're gonna say four, U and 256, I equals zero, I is less than token address says dot length, I plus plus. So we're gonna loop through this token addresses array and we're gonna say S underscore price feeds of token addresses I is gonna to equal to price feed addresses of I. So we're gonna set up this price feed. So whatever the token, so the token of I is gonna equal the price feed of I. And that's how we're gonna set up what tokens are allowed on our platform. If they have a price feed, they're allowed. If they don't, they're not allowed. And then I know we're gonna do a lot of stuff with our DSC. So this is where, this is definitely gonna be an immutable variable. So we can scroll up, take a immutable variable. We'll say, so we'll say decentralized stablecoin, private I underscore DSC, cause we're gonna make this immutable. And since we're using decentralized stablecoin, we're gonna have to go ahead and import this. So let's go to the top here, do import decentralized stablecoin from dot slash decentralized stablecoin dot soul. So now decentralized stablecoin, private IDSC, we can now do, oh, excuse me, this is gonna be private immutable. A little bit down in the constructor, we're just gonna say IDSC equals decentralized stablecoin DSC address like that. Again, using GitHub Copilot, if you don't have GitHub Copilot, that's okay. There's a lot of other free AIs that you can use as well. Okay, cool. So we set up our constructor. We're going back down to deposit collateral. The whole reason we were doing this is we're saying, okay, we should only allow certain kinds of collateral on our platform. So now we can create a new modifier called is allowed token, where we can just say if S underscore price feeds of token equals equals address zero, then we can go ahead and revert with a new, oh, that looks like a good one, DSC engine token not allowed. I'm just gonna copy that, go to the top, and thanks GitHub Copilot, just auto-filled it in for me. Okay, great. And then of course we need to do this down here. Cool. So is token allowed more than zero? Is allowed, or excuse me, is allowed token, token collateral address like this. All right, cool. And then additionally, I'm gonna add a non-reentrant modifier here as well. We're gonna grab this from Open Zeppelin. Whenever we're working with external contracts, it might be a good idea to consider making your function non-reentrant. Reentrancies are one of the most common attacks in all of Web3. And to be honest, sometimes I'll just rip a non-reentrant modifier, even if I'm pretty certain it's not vulnerable to a reentrancy attack. I feel like, to be honest, most functions should be non-reentrant by default, but especially when working with external contracts, it's a good idea to maybe put this modifier here. Now, this might go to audit and we might say, hey, well, we don't need this non-reentrant modifier and maybe we get rid of it, but maybe we don't. The trade-off is it's a little bit more gas intensive to have this here, but it's also safer. So I'm just gonna stick it in here, even if I'm pretty certain I don't need it. We're gonna get this from Open Zeppelin has a non reentrance a non reentrant modifier from their reentrancy guard. So we'll import. Actually, my GitHub Copilot automatically had it. Reentrancy guard from Open Zeppelin contracts security reentrancy guard dot soul. Yep, that's actually exactly correct. And then what we can do is scroll down and we can see our DSC engine is reentrancy guard. And by doing this, we now have access to this non reentrant modifier. And now this function is non reentrantable, which is what we want. Okay, cool. Now we can finally start doing some collateral stuff. So we're going to go ahead and deposit this collateral. First thing we're going to need to do is a way to track how much collateral somebody has actually deposited. So what's that look like? Well, that probably looks like a mapping to me. So let's go to the top. We'll create a mapping of address user to mapping of an address 
token to UN256 amount private S underscore oh, collateral deposited. So this is a mapping to a mapping. Crazy, right? So we're going to map the user's balances to a mapping of tokens, which is going to get mapped to the amount of each token that they have. All right, so let's scroll back down to our deposit collateral function. So now we have a collateral deposited mapping. So we can do s collateral deposited of message.sender of this token collateral address. Now that we know it is an allowed collateral address, it's going to be plus equal to the amount collateral, right? And and I'm actually running into an issue here where when I do forge format, formats the code look like this, but right now when I'm saving, it's reformatting in a different way. So what I'm going to do is it looks like it's using a different formatter that I don't like. So I'm going to go to the extensions, Solidity hard hat, hit the settings here, extension settings, and we're going to change this from prettier to forge because I want to use the forge format settings. Now if I hit save, okay, great, it saves and formats the way I want it to. Okay, great. So as you can see here, we're updating state. And what should we do when we update state? We should omit an event. So we're going to omit collateral deposited. We're going to have it be the message sender who is depositing the token collateral address and the amount collateral as well, which means that we have our first event. All right. So let's go on up here. Let me zoom back out. Scroll all the way up to the layout. Where do events go? Events go after the state variables. Okay, so I'm going to copy this. They go right after the state variables before the modifier. So we're going to say events. We're going to go here. We're going to say event. And get up copilot automatically filled it in for me. Awesome. Address indexed user, address index token, UN256 amount. We don't really need to index that. Maybe we do. Why not? Let's just index it. All right, cool. And just to note, a keyboard shortcut that I use a lot is control back or control minus, which allows you to go back to the last spot you were in your code. If we do control shift minus, it'll go forward. And I use this all the time. So for example, if I'm way down here in my code and I hit control back, I'll just go right back to the last place my cruiser was. And I use this all the time. I'm not sure what the keyboard shortcut on Windows or Linux is, but on a Mac, it is control back and control shift back. And I use it all the time. Anyways, so we are in deposit collateral. We have this emit here. We finally have the event and okay, cool. So we're updating the collateral internal record keeping. We're emitting event. Now, of course, we should actually get the tokens, right? And you can see here we're following CEI, right? So we do a little notice follows. CEI, checks, effects, interactions. So all the checks are happening in our modifiers here. These are all the checks. Our effects are right here. And then finally, our external interactions. So this is where we're going to do that transfer from. And we're going to need to wrap our collateral as an ERC20. So we're going to need to call transfer from on it. So I'm going to go ahead and import IERC20 from at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC 20 slash I ERC 20 dot soul control minus to go right back down to here. Isn't that nice? And we can finally do IRC 20 of the token collateral address dot transfer from message dot sender to address this amount collateral like this. And we'll say so this function actually returns a Boolean bool success. And we want to make sure that this is actually being true. So we want to say if not success, we'll just revert BSC engine underscore underscore transfer failed like this. What's this an error? You bet it is. So we're gonna put this at the top error DSC engine transfer failed. And I'm going to hit control minus to go right back down to the code that I was working with. Okay. So this function looks pretty good to me. I'm able to deposit collateral in here and update our mappings. Now might be a good time for us to start writing some tests for this, right? And we could do something similar to what we did before, where we just kind of threw together a real quick setup in our unit tests and then had our integration tests be 
what our deploy script actually uses. Well, let's write a couple more functions first, and then we can go ahead and, and do all that work. So we have a way to deposit the collateral. Okay, awesome. What should we do next? Well, the next thing that we should do is have a way to mint our DSC token, right? Once they deposit the collateral, they should be able to mint the DSC token. And then the combination of those two will, will be this function, deposit collateral and mint DSC. Let's go ahead and actually create this mint DSC function. Because now that they have some collateral, we should be able to mint some DSC. And now this is actually going to be a surprisingly involved method, right? Because in order to mint DSC, we need to check if the collateral value is greater than the DSC amount. And this is obviously going to involve a number of things, right? It's going to involve price feeds. We're going to be checking values. We'll be checking a whole lot of stuff. Okay, so this is actually going to be a little bit more of an in depth function here. So let's create this mint DSC function. And we'll have this get passed in a UN256 amount DSC to mint. So people can pick how much DSC they want to mint. So let's say, for example, someone deposits $200 worth of ETH, maybe they only want to mint $20 worth of DSC, right? So they can pick how much they want to mint here. So amount to mint here. And let's add some checks here. We should have them mint more than zero. Amount DSC to mint like this. What else? We probably want this to be non reentrant, even though we probably don't need this to be non reentrant because it's our DSC token, but mm, let's put it in here anyways. It's probably all we need for now. We probably want to do some, looks like GitHub Copilot even gave me some, some follows CEI. Yes. Oh, that's wrong. Amount DEC to mint, amount DSC to mint, the amount of decentralized stable coin to mint. At notice, they must have more collateral value than the minimum threshold. We're going to figure out what that means in a second. So, mint DSC. We'll need to keep track of how much everybody has minted, right? So whenever they're minting DSC, they're in a way they're minting debt, right? So we're going to need to keep track of that. Where can we do that? Well, we can do that as a state variable. So we'll do mapping of an address user mapped to their uint256, which is going to be an address user mapped to the uint256 mount DSC minted. It's going to be private s underscore. DSC minted like this. Now I can go back down here with this new mapping SDSC minted message sender plus equals amount DSC to mint. So we're going to keep track of all that they minted. Again, this is going to follow CEI. So now we want to do a little check here. If they minted too much, for example, like they minted 150 or $150 worth of DSC but they only have $100 worth of ETH, that's gonna be way too much. We should 100% revert if that happened. So I'm actually gonna make a function. I'm gonna make an internal function called revert if health factor is broken with the message.sender being sent. So we're gonna create this new internal function. So up here we have external functions. We're gonna scroll down here. We're gonna make this private and internal functions like this, like this. And we're only going to be able to call this if we're only going to be able to call this internally, right? So we're going to create this function function revert if health factor is broken, address user, it's going to be an internal view function. And we're going to basically one check health factor, which is basically, do they have enough collateral? right? And then revert if they don't have a good health factor. So this health factor is actually a term that I borrowed from the Aave documentation. For each wallet, these risk parameters enable the calculation of health factor. And you can see a little bit of an image here that shows it. So additionally, we're going to need to make a function that checks the health factor. Actually, these are going to be private and internal view functions. So first, we need to make a function that can get the health factor. So we're going to make another function here called function underscore health factor. Where we're going to take an address user 
And you see, we have this leading underscore to tell us as developers that this is an internal function. So let's actually give this an underscore as well. Funk, oops, health factor. This will be a private view. It's gonna return a uint256. So what this health factor thing is gonna do, let's give it a little bit of nat spec. Yeah. We can say, this is going to returns how close to liquidation a user is. Say, if a user goes below one, then they can get liquidated. So we're gonna figure out what the ratio of collateral to DSC minted that users can have with this health factor function. We're gonna be building a lot of stuff here. So in order to figure this out, what do we need? Well, we're gonna to need to get both their total DSC minted, right? And we're gonna to need to get their total collateral value, right? Not just the total collateral, we're gonna to need to get the total collateral value to make sure the value is greater than the total DSC minted. So we're gonna to have to make another function. We're gonna to need to get the UN256 total DSC minted and the UN256 collateral value in USD. We're gonna create a new function called get count information from that user. So we're gonna do another one. Boom, function underscore get account information like this. We're gonna take an address user. This will be a private view. And we're gonna return two things, UN256 total DSC minted and UN256 collateral value in USD. Two functions here. To get the total USD, that's easy, right? We just do total DSC minted equals this array, this, excuse me, this mapping that we just created, right? We're keeping track of this exactly. So all we gotta do is this. To get the total collateral value in USD, we're going to need to do some more math. So I'm gonna say collateral value in USD equals get account collateral value, and we're gonna pass some user. So this is going to be a different function. And we're gonna make this a public function so that anybody can call this function themselves. So we're actually gonna copy this, private and view internal functions, public internal view, and then we're gonna do view and pure public and external functions all the way at the bottom. So we'll say private, instead of we'll say public and external view functions. We'll do function, get account collateral value, address of the user. This will be a public view so that anybody can call it. Returns a uint 256. Stay with me, I know we're kind of going down this tree. Stay with me here. We're about to go even further. Now to get the actual value, what do we need to do? Well, we need to loop through each collateral token, get the amount they have deposited, and map it to the price to get the USD value. So we're gonna need to loop through all the collateral tokens. Uh-oh, do we have a way we can do that? Let's scroll to the top. Well, we have a mapping of the price feeds, but we don't have a way to loop through them. So what we can do is we could just have like, you know, address WEF and then address, address wrapped BTC. We could just have two tokens like this and we wouldn't have to loop through anything. We're gonna make this system a little bit agnostic so that you could deploy this with any amount of stable coins, any amount of collaterals. So we're gonna make a new state variable. It's gonna be an address array, private S underscore collateral tokens. And what we're gonna do is write in our constructor, when we update our price feeds with the token and the price feed, we're also gonna add the tokens addresses of I to this array. Now we have this array of collateral tokens that we can loop through, and that way we can calculate how much value people have based off of all of the tokens. So, get account collateral value, we're gonna say four, u and 256, i equals zero. i is less than s collateral tokens dot length, i plus plus, address token equals s collateral tokens of i, and we'll get the amount. So this is the token that we're working with. We'll get the amount by UN256 amount. 
that is deposited by this user by S underscore collateral deposited user token like this, then total collateral value in USD plus equals, uh oh, now that we have the amount, we're going to need to get the USD value of this. And this is probably a function that we're going to want to have be public so that other people can use this as well. So create a function, get USD value, or somebody at, passes in an address token, EU and 256 amount. This will be a public view returns you into 256. And this is where we're going to do some price feed stuff, some stuff that's very familiar. So we're going to need to get the price feed for the token, and then times the amount by the price. So we're gonna have to work with aggregator v3 interface again, that chain link data feeds. So import, and I know we've worked with this before, aggregator v3 interface from looks like GitHub Copilot's got my back at Chainlink slash contracts, blah, blah, blah. This means we're gonna have to install that. Remember, we can install the smaller one with forge install smart contract kit slash Chainlink brownie contracts at 0.6.1 dash dash no dash commit like this. Chainlink brownie contracts. Awesome. Then we're gonna have to go to our foundry.toml, add some remappings in here. So we're gonna put a little comma. And we're gonna say at chainlink slash contracts equals lib slash chainlink brownie contracts slash contracts like that. So now we have the aggregator v3 interface. Scroll down to the bottom, get USD value. I know we've done this before. I know this is familiar to a lot of you. But we're going to say aggregator v3 interface price feed equals aggregator v3 interface of s underscore price feeds of the token. So we're going to get the price feed of the token we're looking to get the value of. Now we have the price feed here. We're going to do this. Wow. Get a copilot spot on. We're going to get the price by calling price feed dot latest round data. And this is where we're going to do a little bit of math, right? Let's say one ETH equals $1,000. The returned value from CL will be 1000 times 1E8. How do I know this? Well, if I go to docs.chain.link, go to data feeds, I can scroll down to price feed addresses, and I can see if I do show more details for ETH USD, ETH USD, it has eight decimal places. And I know Bitcoin USD also has eight decimal places. We could add some code in here so that we make sure we're getting the right decimals, but I'm just going to go with eight for now. And now we can do a little bit of math here. So we're going to need to do the price times the amount, right? But is this all we need to do? Return price times amount? No, because the number is going to be way too big, right? Let's say the price is a thousand times one E8. And now we're multiplying that by, let's say the the amount is a thousand times one E18 because it's going to be in way. This number is going to be absolutely massive, right? So first we need to multiply this a thousand by a number to get this number to match this one. So these need to be the same units of precision. So that's going to be, we're going to have to multiply this first by one E10. And because I don't like magic numbers, we're going to scroll to the top, create a new state variable right in here. We're going to do a uint256 private constant additional feed precision equals 1e10 like this. And now it's not a magic number. So instead of doing this now, we're going to say, okay, price, and we're going to wrap it as a uint256 so that everything's now in 256. We're going to say the price first needs to be multiplied by the additional feed precision. So that now both of these are U and 256s and they both have 1E18. But then we're going to have to divide all of these by 1E18 as well so that this number doesn't look super wonky. So we're going to have to wrap this whole thing by 1E18. And as I hate floating magic numbers like this, so we're going to scroll back to the top, copy paste this. This is now just going to be called precision 1E18, grab precision, 
divided by precision. So U into 56 price times additional feed precision times amount divided by precision, and we should be good to go here. This is where my brain immediately goes, okay, definitely need to write some tests for this. So once we finish going through this, we're definitely going to read, we're definitely going to write some tests at least for get USD value here. So let's go back up through our massive tree of functions that we just created that are not complete. So let's go back to get account collateral value. And this is going to be the total US, the total collateral value in USD. It's going to be get the USD value of the current token we're on times the amount that we're working with. Total collateral value in USD. Actually, let's put that there. Boom. And that's it, right? So we just loop through all the tokens in the token array and we just add up the value in USD of each one of these tokens. And I know we don't need a return here, but I'm going to add a return here anyways. Return this. So cool. So now we have a way to get the collateral value in USD. We needed that way up here. Oops, let's do collateral value in USD. Get collateral value. Oops, let's do this. And awesome. So now our get account information is going to return the total USD minted, the total DSC minted, and then the total value of all the collateral here. Okay, great. Now we can scroll up again. We have this revert if health factor is broken, which is still busted because this function doesn't do anything. But now we can actually have it do something because we have this health factor here. We're going to update our health factor function because now we have the two of these. What we can do is we can just get the ratio of these two. So we could say collateral value in USD divided by total USD minted. This is what we're going to return for a health factor, right? Well, not quite. So let's say we minted, we have 100 collateral divided by 100 DSC, right? This is one to one. If we go down a, if we go down a penny, we're going to be under collateralized, right? And we don't want to go under collateralized. We always want to be over collateralized because if this ever goes below 100, our system is is bunked up, right? So we want to set the threshold to be like, hey, if you go under 150 collateral, you can get liquidated, right? Because if we go under 100, it's already too late. So we want to say, hey, we want you to go at least 150. So we're going to create a liquidation threshold, and we're going to do this at the top. So we're going to say, you went 256 private constant liquidation threshold equals 50. And this means you need to be 150 or no, this means you need to be 200% over collateralized, I think. It might be 150, but we'll find out in the test. So now if we go back down to where we were, to get our health factor, we're not just going to divide these two. And even this doesn't really work because if we have 150 over 100, 150 divided by 100 is equal to 1.5. Decimals don't work in Solidity, so it would just be 1. I guess that would work. But we want we want to know exactly what the health factor is, right? With precision. So first off, let's instead of just doing this, let's say you went to 256 collateral adjusted for threshold equals the collateral value in USD times liquidation threshold. And then we should divide by 100, right? Because the liquidation threshold has is multiplying, it's making our number much bigger. We should divide by 100 as I don't like floating numbers. So we'll do UNT 256 private constant liquidation precision equals 100. So we'll go back down, divided by the liquidation precision. So now we have this collateral amount adjusted for this, this threshold, right? So now you can kind of think of it as instead of, say we have $150 of ETH divided by $100 of DSC, right? This would be 1.5. But now they need to multiply by 50 as well. But now this collateral value is multiplied by essentially one over five, right? Let's let's do the math here, right? If we had, say, $1,000 of ETH, we just times that by 50, which gets us to 50,000. But then we divide it by that by about 100, which equals 500. So if we had $1,000 of ETH times 50 equals this divided by 100 is 500. 
Same thing with this, this example down here. If we had $150 worth of each ETH, we say 150 times 50 equals 7500 divided by 100 equals 75. And then if we do 75 divided by 100, that is going to be definitely less than one, right? So we we're basically saying with this 50 threshold, 50 over 100 is essentially one over two. We're saying you need to have double the collateral in here. So yeah. So now that I'm talking it out loud, this 50% liquidation threshold means we need to be 200% over collateralized, right? We need to have double the collateral that we have the minted DSC. Anyways, so a whole bunch of math. Hopefully this makes sense. If not, definitely work with your AI to make sure this makes sense or ask questions in the discussion, right? I know some of this math can get a little bit tricky here. So collateral adjusted for threshold. And now we can return the collateral adjusted, oops, this collateral adjusted for threshold times precision divided by that total DSC minted. And now this will give us our true health factor. And if this is less than one, you can get liquidated. Now, this is one example, right? Let's look at another example. Let's say, I guess this is two examples. So let's say they have $1,000 worth of ETH and 100 DSC, right? So let's do the math here. 1,000 times 50 equals 50, one, two, three, divided by 100 is equal to 500, 500 divided by 100, which is definitely greater than one, right? 500 divided by 100 is five. So this person with $1,000 of ETH deposited and 100 DSC minted would have a health factor of 500. Nice. So now that we have a health factor, we can actually finally do this revert if health factor is broken function, where we say, we can even put this above this as kind of like a pseudo nat spec. We could say, u into 256 health factor equals underscore health factor of the user. And we say if the user, excuse me, actually let's do user health factor. And if the user health factor is less than the some min health factor, which is going to be one health factor. So let's go ahead and create this. Let's go to the top because we hate floating numbers. U into 256 private constant min health factor equals one. If the user health factor is less than the min health factor, then we're going to go ahead and revert. I don't love this. We're going to do DSC engine underscore underscore breaks health factor. And we're going to pass in this health factor that we break with. Boom. New error. Scroll to the top. Error. Engine breaks health factor. U in 256. Health factor. Factor. All right. Looks like we still have some red here. What did I forget? Okay. Revert if health factor is broken. Underscore like this. Boom. Now it looks like nothing's red. Let's just make sure. Forge build. Successful. Nice. Okay. Where were we? Mint DSC. Okay. Mint DSC. So we added some more DSC minted. And if adding this DSC breaks the health factor, because breaks the health factor, we should revert. We should not let anybody mint DSC if they're going to cause themselves to get liquidated. I mean, we could go ahead and let them do it, but like, let's not, because that's not a very good user experience. Now, what we want to do is we want to actually mint the DSC. So this is where the DSC has this mint function that's only owner, and the owner of this is going to be the DSC engine. Now we could say, and if we look at this mint function, it returns a Boolean. So we'll say bool minted equals I underscore DSC dot mint. And what does it take for parameters? Address two and amount. So address two is going to be message dot sender. And amount is going to be amount DSC to mint. And then we'll say if not minted, we'll just say revert DSC engine underscore underscore mint failed, and which is a new error. So scroll up to the top, error DSC mint failed. Okay, cool. So now we have a mint function and we have a deposit function. So we can deposit collateral 
we can mint DSC, but additionally, we can get account information, we can calculate someone's health factor, we can calculate the USD value of these different tokens. So at this point, I'm like, oof, I have no idea if what I'm doing makes any sort of sense. I want to make sure I write some tests here. So this is where we could go ahead and create a new folder, unit tests. And if you wanted to, you could skip writing the scripts and just kind of deploy in your unit tests and then do some integration tests. But I'm just going to have my unit tests also be my integration test for this one. So let's go ahead. Let's write a script. Deploy dsc.s.sol. You already know the drill for this. SPDX license I. You can even zoom in a little bit. Dentifier MIT contract deploy DSC is script import script from forge std script dot soul like that. Pragma solidity 0 0.8.18. It's good. In here, we're going to have our function run external. We've done this a hundred times. Exter null. And this is going to return a couple of things. It's going to both return the DS, a decentralized stable coin and the DSC engine. And it's going to return something else, but I'm not going to put it in quite yet. So to do that, we're going to have to import the centralized stable coin from dot, dot slash src slash decentralized stablecoin dot sol. We're going to close and reopen my VS code. It's being really weird right now. There we go. All fixed. So the two of these, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to do a VM dot start broadcast like this. VM dot stop broadcast like this. Oh, and we need the DSC engine import DSC engine from dot, dot slash src slash DSC engine dot sol. And in here, we're going to deploy both of these. So we'll say centralized stablecoin DSC equals new decentralized stablecoin. Does our decentralized stablecoin have any parameters? It does not. We're also going to deploy our DSCE, our DSC engine, engine equals new DSC engine. This takes a whole bunch of stuff, right? This is going to take, we go to the constructor, token addresses, price feed addresses. If we toggle, oops, toggle the word wrap. Addresses, price feed addresses, and the DSC address. So we have the DSC address. Boom. It's going to be this one. Where do we get the price feed addresses? And you guessed it. We're going to make a helper config. So what does this DSC engine need? Constructor, an array of token addresses, an array of price feeds, and then the DSC address. So where are we going to get those addresses from? You guessed it. A helper config. So new file. Helper config.s.sol spdx license identifier mit pragma solidity 0 0.8.18 contract helper config is script import script from forge std slash script dot soul for now let's do this on the sepolia chain so we'll do struct net work config. What do we need in here? We're gonna need an well, we're gonna need weth and wrapped Bitcoin, those price feed addresses and those DSC addresses, address, weth, USD, price feed, address, wrapped Bitcoin, USD, price feed. Again, weth is the ERC 20 version of Ethereum. I've got a example weth token contract on Sepolia. And if you look at it right here, we go to write contract. It's got this function deposit where you deposit ETH and it'll return to you an ERC20 version of ETH to your MetaMask called WETH. Then whenever you're done with it, you just withdraw your ETH and burn your WETH. Wrapped Bitcoin is something similar, but with Bitcoin. The difference is since Bitcoin doesn't originate on the ETH blockchain, there is some risk in bridging it over, but I'm not going to go into that. That's something for you to look up. So we're also going to need the address of the WETH token itself. We're going to need the address of the wrapped Bitcoin itself. And we're going to need a UN256 deploy, deployer key, kind of like what we did in one of our previous lessons. 
we're gonna have network config public active network config and then we're gonna have constructor like here we're gonna have a function get sepolia eth config public view returns network config memory like this and then we're gonna return network config we're gonna have with usd price feed b let's go to docs.chain.link let's go to the polia the polia where's eth btc eth or excuse me eth usd right here copy that paste comma we're gonna need wrap bitcoin usd price feed on sepolia bitcoin usd right here grab that we need the weth contract address which i have here this is one that i deployed with here we're gonna need wrapped bitcoin and if you're looking for all of these and you want to just copy them out of the github repo associated with this you can go to src you can go to script upper config and they're all in here if you want to just copy paste by the way but also wrapped bitcoin which i guess is this address but i had a different one well whatever we're gonna use this one and if it doesn't work that's fine we're gonna use this one and of course Player key, vm.env unit, private key, like this. Okay. And then we're going to do function get or create anvil eth config public returns network config memory. And we're going to do a little bit of mock deployments here. But we're going to say if active network config dot with usd price feed does not equal to the zero address then we've already set it turn active network eth config we're going to do some broadcasting so we're going to need a couple of couple of mocks in here we're going to need some mock price feeds and some mock erc20 tokens so we're going to need a mock v3 aggregator which we're going to go to test new folder mocks and I'm going to copy paste a mock from this repo. If you want to copy paste as well, go for it. Test mocks, mock v3 aggregator. Copy this. New file mock v3 aggregator.sol. Cool. Import that. Imports mock v3 aggregator from dot slash test slash mocks slash mock v3 aggregator dot so we have that we're also gonna need some mock erc 20s we can get those actually directly from open zeppelin so if we do import erc 20 mock from at open zeppelin slash contract slash mocks slash erc 20 mock dot so and if we command click into this or you open this up you can see there's a whole bunch of stuff in here. Like we can mint as much as we want, burn as much as we want, do transfers and stuff. We can do pretty much whatever we want. And that's why it's a mock token. Good for testing. So down here, vm.start broadcast. We're going to create a mock v3 aggregator ETH USD price feed equals new mock v3 aggregator. And what does this take for the constructor? It takes decimals and an, and an initial answer. So we're going to scroll up here. We're going to say uint two fifty or excuse me, uint eight public constant decimals decimals equals eight. And we'll say uint or not uint excuse me. Int two fifty six public constant eth USD price equals two thousand E eight. And then we're gonna do the same thing, but instead of ETH, it's gonna be BTC, and we'll make this 1000 E8 ETH USD. Scroll down. All right, new mock. What does it take? Control click. U into eight decimals initial answer. Control minus to go back. Decimals, and then the initial answer. Take those. Okay. Oh, and let's do VM dot stop broadcast. Now we're gonna do ERC20 mock with mock equals 
new ERC20 mock. What does this one take? Name, symbol, initial account, initial balance. Okay. Say WEF, WEF, message.sender, 1,008. We probably want to do more than, we probably don't want to have these floating numbers in here, but yeah, it's just a mock. It's not a big deal, I guess. Now we're going to copy paste all of this for BTC. BTC. We're going to say BTC. It's going to be the wrapped BTC, wrapped BTC, wrapped BTC, like that. Stop the broadcast and then return network config with USD price feed is going to be address. Oh, thanks. GitHub Copilot. Thanks, GitHub Copilot. Thanks, GitHub Copilot. Thanks, GitHub Copilot. And this is actually going to be the default Anvil key, which if you want, you can just go back to here again and copy paste it out of here. Or you know what? We just run Anvil. Scroll up. Boom. Private key right here. Cancel that. We'll say UNT256 public. Or excuse me. Int 256 public default Anvil key equals paste that in. And we'll say we'll just use the default Anvil key if you're working with Anvil. Okay, nice. So now we have get or create Anvil, get Sepolia. Let's update our constructor. So we'll say if lock dot chain ID equals equals one 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 five five one 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 then active active network config equals get sepolia eth config else active network config equals get or create eth anvil config nice so we've got a little bit of a helper config here a little semicolon down here. This looks pretty good. What's wrong here? Sorry, this is a uint 56. Okay, cool. So now that we have a helper config, we can go finally back to our deploy DSC. Let's import that in here. Import upper config from upper config. Right at the top, we'll say helper config config equals new upper config. And out of this config, we're going to get all of this with Bitcoin, with rep Bitcoin, deploy key, etc. I'm going to say address with USD price feed. Oh, I can even just hit tab and it looks like it has most of it. Yep. With USD, rep Bitcoin, with rep Bitcoin, deploy key equals config dot active network config. Cool. That's good to me. I'm going to toggle word wrap so that it wraps around. Okay, cool. We have all of those. Now our DSC engine takes an array of token addresses and array of price feeds. So we can say so right at the top, let's make those arrays. We'll say address, array, public token addresses, address, array, public price feed addresses. And we'll say token addresses equals with and wrapped BTC price feed addresses equals with USD price feed address, wrap Bitcoin, USD price feed. Okay, cool. I think that's everything, right? Yeah, so now we can go back to this line now. DC engine, engine, new DC engine, and it takes the token addresses, price feed addresses, and DSC. Okay, cool. And then finally, something we haven't really talked about too much, but this decentralized stablecoin, like I said, it's ownable, but it needs to be owned by the engine. So this ownable actually has a transfer ownership function. And we're going to call that to transfer ownership to the engine. So we'll go back to our deploy here. Oh, sorry, this is in DSC. It's going to be address DSC. So then we're going to call DSC dot transfer ownership to the address DSC engine. Now only the engine, oops, engine, excuse me. Only the engine can do anything with it. And then we're gonna return all these. Return DSC and engine, nice. Oh, and the deployer key is gonna go here. Okay, cool. So the reason we did all this was because I wanted to write my unit tests using actual deploy scripts because I prefer to do that. But like I said, 
it might be a good idea for you to write unit tests before you write your deploy scripts and then integration tests with your deploy scripts. But in any case, let's go ahead and finally create a test in here. DSC engine test.t.soul. And remember the whole reason we're doing all this, I know we've been coding a lot, is in the DSC engine. We added a ton of functions in here. Some of them like get USD value, which we definitely want to check. Get collateral account value. We want to make sure minting works, our constructor works, depositing works, etc. So we're just kind of testing as we go along. Which, like I said, when I'm actually coding this, I did write tests and I did write deploy scripts because I did want to test as I was going, right? I didn't want to have to go back and refactor and rewrite my code if I made some glaring mistake, right? It's really good to test while you're building as well. And to be honest, I, I feel like it makes me go faster because I have more confidence that what I did was correct while I'm coding. So SPDX, license, identifier, MIT, pragma solidity, 0 0.8.18, little carrot here. Contract, DSC engine test is test, import test from forge std slash test. That's all, like this. All right, cool. Function setup, public or external. We're gonna need to deploy, to deploy our contracts. So we're gonna import deploy DSC from dot dot slash dot dot slash script slash deploy dsc dot s dot soul deploy dsc deployer we're gonna say deployer equals new deploy dsc like that again i'm using a lot of tabs here and we're gonna say we're gonna need the import decentralized stablecoin from dot dot slash dot dot slash src slash Decentralized stablecoin dot soul. We're also going to need to import the engine, the SCE from. Again, this is where GitHub Copilot can really make your life a lot easier. Just being able to hit tab here or just whatever AI that you're working with. Now we're going to say DSC. Let's actually make these. We'll say decentralized stablecoin, DSC, and DSC engine. We'll call DSCE. That's confusing. You could call this like engine or something. I'm going to call my DSCE. So now our deploy returns DSC and the engine. So we're going to say return DSC, DSCE equals deployer.run. Okay, that looks pretty good. There's a bunch of stuff more for us to do, but at least we have our tests set up here. So one of the first tests that we want to do is this price feed test, right? We want to make sure this get USD value, this math that we're doing here, because we're doing some weird math stuff. We want to make sure this is actually working correctly. So I'm going to do, I'm going to set up a little price feeds test section, price tests like this. We're going to say function do test get USD value. And here we're going to test our get USD value function. So it gets past the token address and an amount. So we're going to need to get those tokens that we use to deploy this. We can get that pretty easily from our helper config. So what we can do actually back in our deploy, we can also have this return the config. And just at the bottom, we'll also have a return config. Comma config and config will be the helper config, helper config, config, import that. Import helper config from dot dot script helper config dot s dot soul. Okay, cool. And now we can get the WEF address and we can also get the ETH USD. So we'll put those up at the top two. We'll say address ETH USD price feed and we'll say address WEF. Get this from the helper config. So those are the first two. So it's ETH USD price feed. Bitcoin price feed goes here. So comma, weth, comma, this is the Bitcoin token, comma, this is the deployer key equals config dot active network config. Cool. We have the price feed and we have weth. So now we can finally go down here and set this function up. So we'll say UN256 ETH amount equals, let's say there's 15 ETH right? 15 ETH. 
we have 15 ETH times it by $2,000 for ETH equals what? 30,000 to 30,000 E18, right? Real simple, simple math. So let's do that. U256 expected USD equals three thirty one two three thirty thousand dollars And we'll say U256 actual USD equals dsce.get USD value, WEF and ETH amount. And the reason this should work is because in our engine, we pass the token and the amount and internally it uses the price feed associated with that token calls the price to get the amount. And now we should be able to just do assert equals expected USD and actual USD. All right. I know there's a lot of setup just to write this one test. But like I said, I like making sure my deploy scripts are part of my test suite right from the beginning. But it might be a good idea to just do them as integration tests. So forge test dash m test get USD value. And it works. Now I will point out the first couple of times that I ran this test, I actually failed miserably. I got a number of things wrong. And that's okay, because you will. And that's why you write tests. So I also while I'm here, let's also write at least one deposit collateral test. So let me copy this, paste it here, because we're going to write a lot of deposit collateral D deposit collateral tests. make it look a little bit pretty at least like that we do some more simple tests like function test revert reverts if collateral uh, zero public uh, we will prank a user so up at the top we'll do an address public user equals make ADR user like this make user capital user let's say vm dot start prank our user now will at least approve the token can go to the protocol. So we'll do ERC 20 mock WEF. Do we have that imported? Nope, we're gonna have to import that import ERC 20 mock from at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash what is it mocks slash or contracts mocks ERC 20 mock. Okay. ERC20 mock dot soul, ERC20 mock weth dot approve uh, address D S C E some amount. Let's do it at the top. Let's make another U256 public constant amount collateral equals, let's say 10 ether worth of collateral down here. We'll approve that 10 collateral and then we'll do vm.expect revert with DSC engine dot. We're going to need to use that needs more than zero in here. Needs more than zero dot selector. And now you guys know what the selector bit means. DSCE dot deposit collat collateral say with zero like this. And then vm dot stop prank. And actually, this might fail for a different reason. But let's go ahead and try a forge test dash m. Oops. Okay, cool. And this actually did pass. Now, if we want to make this a little bit better of a test, we should also mint our user some weth. And we probably should do that right in the setup. So we don't have to do that for every single test. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do erc 20 mock weth dot mint user, we're going to do a u into 256 public constant, starting here's 20 balance, balance equals, and let's say this is 10 ether as well, 10 ether, starting here's 20 balance. Boom. All right, cool. So now, forge test, all of our tests are passing cool. And like I said, I'll do this kind of as a sanity check make sure that my architecture is even making sense, right? So we what we probably also want to do next then is have a test for collateral is being deposited in these data structures. But for now, I'm content with these tests. So I'm just going to go back to writing my contracts. 
like I said, there's no one single process. And I don't think I've ever written a smart contract completely in one go. I'm pretty much always writing tests as I'm writing the code. So it is a really good idea to, to do this. Yes, you do not have to write the deploy script as you're writing your code, but it's something that I like to do. And then, you know what, while we're writing these tests, let's also do dash dash fork URL, Sepolia RPC URL. Let's also do this, because this probably will fail actually, because we can't just mint weth out of thin air and we do indeed fail, test get USD value. Oh, interesting, that's the one that fails. Test get USD value, ah, this one fails because we're hard coding the expected USD right here. And of course, the price on Sepolia is the actual price as opposed to kind of this fake price that we're making up. So we should probably update this test to make it more agnostic, right? We probably should update this test so that instead of just hard coding 3000 in here, update this test to use the price of the actual price feed. For now, I'm going to leave it as is and then I can fix it later for running those fork tests. So where are we now? Okay, so we have a way to deposit collateral. We have a way to mint. We don't really have too many tests here. We're just assuming that this kind of works for now, which is okay, but this is good, right? We're getting somewhere. So we can mint our debt or our DSC. We can actually now we can get a whole lot of information as well, which is awesome. Let's now combine these two into kind of this main function that we're thinking a lot of people are going to call this deposit collateral in mint USD, right? The purpose of this protocol is to mint this stablecoin, right? Deposit collateral and mint DSC, which is just going to be the combination of deposit collateral and mint DSC. So in here, what this this is going to take, it's going to take similar stuff to deposit collateral and address token collateral address, a UNT256 amount collateral, and then also a UNT256 amount DSC to mint. That. And here we're just going to call. So deposit collateral is external right now. We'll make this a public function. So we'll change this to deposit collateral, where we give it the token collateral address and the amount collateral. And then we'll call mint DSC, amount DSC to mint. Boom. So that's all this function does is just combines the two of them. Oh, and mint DSC. Mint DSC is not defined because it's external. We'll make this public as well so that our contract can also call it. Toggle word wrap, put that back on. Okay. And cool. So this is going to be one of our main functions we're thinking. So let's add some NAT spec to it. We'll say at param. And this is where GitHub Copilot is really helpful. Token collateral address, the address of the token to deposit as collateral. At param, amount collateral. Yep. At param, that looks good too. And then we'll at notice this function will deposit your collateral and, and mint DSC in one trans action, right? Because otherwise we're gonna have to pe have people call deposit collateral and then mint, but some people they're probably just gonna wanna do both at the same time. Cause that's kind of the purpose of this protocol. Okay, great. So we have a way to, for people to get money in how do they get their money out? So we're gonna to need to write this redeem collateral, right? So in order for them to redeem collateral, let's talk about this. In order to redeem collateral, they need what? One, their health factor must be over one after collateral pulled. So we're gonna to wanna to put some checks in here to make sure that they have enough money in here. And that's kind of the main thing, right? That's all we really need to worry about. So let's go ahead and start writing this. So first we should let them choose which collateral they want. So address, token collateral address, and then obviously the amount, amount collateral. And we're gonna wanna add this more than zero modifier in here for the amount collateral. We don't want them to be sending accidental zero transactions. And because we're gonna be moving tokens around, we'll just do non-reentrant better safe than sorry, we can figure out later and kind of like a gas audit if this is even needed. Now I'm going to write this function as if somebody redeeming collateral is the only time they actually redeem collateral. However, we're going to refactor this in the future. 
to make our code much more modular. There's this concept in computer science called dry. Don't repeat yourself. If you find yourself coding the same thing, that, that should send off a light bulb in your head going, oh, maybe what I'm doing isn't the best practice. So we're going to code this one way. And then I'm telling you right now, we're going to go back and we're going to refactor this in the future. But I want to code it this one way first, just to show you the process that you'll probably go through and how you'll probably refactor it when you come across this yourself. So we're going to code this one way now. Let's do it. We're going to need to pull the collateral out and we're going to update our internal accounting. So we have this S underscore collateral deposited of message.sender of the token collateral address, right? This is the our internal accounting, how much collateral they've added. We're going to do minus equals amount of collateral. So this is assuming we're going to pull it out. If they try to pull out more than what they have, we're relying on the Solidity compiler a little bit to throw an error, right? If in their balance they have 100 and they subtract, try to pull out 1,000, right, it'll revert. Because as of newer versions of Solidity, they don't let you do this unsafe math stuff, which is awesome. It saves us a lot of hassle. So, and then since we're updating state, we're going to emit an event. Let's call it collateral redeemed. We'll say it's message.sender. So from message.sender, the amount collateral, uh, the token collateral address like this. So we're going to go to the top. We're also going to refactor this event, but uh, you'll understand why later. Event collateral redeemed address indexed user address indexed token uint256 indexed mount like this. Okay. Control minus go right back down to where we were. Okay, amount collateral. Oh, what's wrong with this? Oh, these are backwards. Okay, cool. So now, all we have to do is return the money. Well, how do we do this? So we want to follow CEI, right? Checks effects interactions, checks effects interactions. But we also want to make sure the health factor is good after collateral collateral is pulled. And this is where sometimes you'll see CEI be violated. When I need to check something after a token transfer has happened, sometimes you'll see this CEI be violated a little bit. And what you could do is you could do like calculate health factor after and then like simulate it. But a lot of people choose to not do this because this is really gas inefficient. So what a lot of people do is they just go ahead with the doing the token transfer first and then checking this and reverting if this happens. And that's usually fine though, because we're going to revert the transaction if it's bad, right? So what we'll do is we'll do this token transfer and then we'll make sure the health factor is okay. So you know how to move tokens around. So we'll say bull success equals I or cert 20 token collateral collateral address dot we can just do transfer instead of transfer from since transfer is when you transfer from yourself transfer from is when you transfer from somebody else so dot transfer and we're going to be sending it to message dot sender and we're going to send amount collateral and then if not success if if not success we're just going to go ahead and revert d s c engine we'll just do transfer failed like this. And then we want to make sure that the health factor isn't broken. And we have written a function that does that already called revert if health factor is broken. So we could just grab this, go back up to our redeem and just do revert if health factor is broken for the message dot sender. Okay, cool. Like I said, we're going to refactor this very soon. Okay, but it looks like this is actually pretty good for redeeming collateral. Now this revertive health factor is broken is a little bit troublesome with just this raw redeemed collateral. Let's say I put $100 in and then I mint, let's say $20 worth of DSC. Put $100 worth of ETH in and I mint $20 worth of DSC. Let's say I'm done. Like I wanna burn all my DSC and I wanna withdraw all of my ETH. Well, if I try to redeem all my ETH, it'll break, right? It'll break my health factor. So what I need to do first is I need to first burn back my DSC, and then I need to redeem ETH. So it's a kind of this two transaction process here. 
this kind of stinks. So let's turn it into a one transaction process. So we're going to combine redeeming your collateral with also burning your DSC, which means we're going to need to create a burn DSC function. And we're also going to refactor this in a little bit, but I'm just going to write it as if this is the only burn DSC function for now. So let's have people burn their DSC, right? This is when they, they say, hey, I'm done with these tokens. And this will reduce that if we scroll up to the top, we have this mapping here, SDC minted, it'll reduce this SDC minted. So essentially, it'll reduce their debt in the system. So burn DSC, we're going to add some modifiers here, there should be more than zero. Amount, so we want to do a U256 amount, so they can burn as much as they want. And then what we're going to want to do is we're going to say, s underscore dsc minted of the message dot sender is going to minus equal amount. So we're going to remove that debt, remove that dsc minted. And then we're going to do a little bool success equals i underscore dsc dot transfer from ds uh, message dot sender to address this amount. And we could also send this to the zero address, but we're going to just send it to our address for now because the decentralized stablecoin ERC20 burnable has its own burn function. And we're just going to call the burn function directly on the token itself. But first, we're going to take it from them, bring it into our contract, and then we're going to burn it. So if not success, then we'll revert DSCE transfer failed like this. And this conditional is kind of hypothetically unreachable because if the transfer fails up here, we're going to throw the transfer from fail error. But let's say this DSC token is implemented wrong. Great. We kind of have this backup. But so they're going to send their DSC token here. Then we're going to call IADSC dot burn amount. Now, since we're burning DSC, question is, do we need to check if this breaks health factor? Well, probably not, right? Because we're burning DSC, we're burning debt. It's highly unlikely that burning your debt, removing your debt is going to break the health factor, right? So we probably don't ever need this. But I'm just going to add this in here for now. Just as a backup in a gas audit, we can figure out if we actually need it. I don't think this would ever hit. And this is where when I do go to an audit, when I do go to security professional, I can make sure to point this line out say, Hey, I don't think this line will ever hit. And I'm thinking of pulling it out. What do you think? Right? It's good to call these out in your comments so that when you do go to professional, who knows, they can help you out figure this out. So for now, we're gonna put it in here, although it's highly likely we don't even need this. And we're gonna refactor this function pretty soon anyways. So we have this burn DSC function. We're gonna make it public, because we're gonna be burning DSC and redeeming collateral at the same time. So now we have redeem collateral, we have burn DSC. Now we can write this redeem collateral for DSC, where we send DSC and redeem collateral at the same time. And so in here, we're gonna say address token collateral address, you into 256 amount collateral, you into 256 amount DSC to burn, we'll have this be external. So then we're going to call burn DSC with the amount of DSC to burn. We're also going to call redeem collateral. So we're going to burn the DSC first, and then we're going to redeem their collateral with the token collateral address and the amount collateral. Redeem collateral. Oh, this is external. Let's make this public. Let's go back. And then, of course, we should revert if health factor is broken. But if we look, our redeem collateral function currently does this already. So we don't need to do that here. So I'm just gonna put this comment, redeem collateral already checks health factor right here. And then we'll add a little bit of NAT spec here. So at param, boom, that's not even the right param. So in collateral address, the collateral address to redeem at param, amount collateral, the, the amount collateral to redeem, Ram amount DSC to burn the amount of DSC to burn. This function burns DSC 
and redeems underlying collateral in one transaction. Okay, cool. Are we gonna refactor these two functions soon? Yes, absolutely. But I want you to understand why we're gonna refactor them. So we're gonna leave them in as they are for now. Okay, cool. So this is looking pretty good. So we have a lot of stuff in here. Uh, we have deposit collateral and mint DSC. So people can mint our stable coin by depositing collateral. People can just straight up deposit collateral. People can then redeem their collateral for the US for the DSC that they minted. They can just straight up redeem collateral. They can just straight up mint DSC so long as they didn't break the health factor. They can burn DSC to go help their health factor. I don't think this line will ever hit. We've got to do a couple of more things here. Most importantly, we've got to do this liquidate function. So this liquidate function is kind of the, the key thing that holds this whole system together. If we do start nearing under collateralization, we need someone to li start liquidating positions, removing those positions. We need somebody to basically call redeem and burn for you if your health factor becomes too poor, right? Because the worst thing that would happen is, let's say there's $100 worth of ETH backing $50 worth of DSC, and then the price of ETH tanks to $20, right? $20 of ETH backing $50 of DSC. Well, now the DSC isn't worth $1, right? The DSC then is going to be worth, you know, whatever 20 over 50 is. So we can't let this happen, right? We need to make sure we liquidate people's positions. We remove people's positions in the system if the price of the collateral tanks, okay? And this is where liquidation comes in. So we say if someone is almost under collateralized, we will pay you to liquidate them. So we have kind of this gamified incentive system here where people can get basically free money for removing other people's positions in the protocol. So in this situation up here, as the price is going down, let's say the price goes down to $75, backing $50 of DSC, this is way lower than our 50% threshold. So what we're going to do is we're going to let liquidator, liquidator take this $75 backing, takes the $75 backing and pays off the $50 DSC and burns, burns off the 50 DSC. So we're going to have somebody able to take their money in exchange for them, making sure our protocol stays collateralized. So that's what this liquidate function is going to do. So first off, they're going to be able to choose the collateral, the user that they want to liquidate, and the UN256 debt to cover. And they'll be able to track the users and their positions by listening to these events that we've been emitting, which is exciting. We're going to definitely want a lot of NAT spec for this. So at param, collateral is going to be the collateral to liquidate, or better yet, the ERC20 address, collateral address to liquidate from the user at param user, the user who has broken the health factor. Their health factor should be below min health factor at param debt to cover is going to be the amount of DSC you want to burn to improve the user's health factor. Okay, we're going to add a lot of at notices here. At notice, you can partially or liquidate a user. Just so, as, so long as you improve their health factor, that's all we care about. At notice, you will get a liquidation bonus for taking the user's funds, right? We want to incentivize them to, to actually do this, right? If we say, okay, cool, you'll get the $50 back for paying off the $50 debt, it's going to be hard to incentivize people to do that. But if we say you get all $75 and all you have to do is pay back 50, then that's going to be a bonus that they should be able to take to incentivize them to do this. At notice, this function working assumes the protocol so call will be roughly 200% over collateralized 
in order for this to work. Why? Well, because in this scenario, if this drops down to $20 backing $50 of DSC, and if I pay back the 50 DSC and I get $20, well, then I, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm not going to pay $50 to get back 20. So this whole system only works if the system is always over collateralized. The only way we can give liquidation bonuses is if we're over collateralized. So the only way we can incentivize people to liquidate poor users is if we are over collateralized. So we could say at notice, a known bug would be if the protocol were 100% or less collateralized, then we wouldn't be able to incentivize the liquidators. And then we would just say like, for example, if the price of the collateral plummeted before anyone could be liquidated. So hopefully this makes a lot of sense. If this doesn't make sense, you know what to do. Ask ChatGPT, ask in the discussions forum, Google it, use the resources that you have to your advantage. Yes? Yes. Okay, good. <laughs> so debt to cover. We probably want to do more than zero. Very lame if they did just zero. So we're going to do more than zero here. We're going to be moving tokens around. So we're going to do non reentrant as well. Maybe we'll do some more modifiers, but that looks pretty good to me right now. So now what do we need to do? Well, we need to do a bunch of stuff here. Well, we first need to check health factor of the user, right? Is this user even liquidatable, right? Remember, we want to do follows CEI, checks, effects, interactions, right? We always want to follow CEI. So we should do some more checks here because we should only liquidate people who are liquidatable. So first thing we should do, unit 256, starting user health factor equals underscore health factor of the user, right? Because we have this health factor function, which gets that health factor. And what we can say, and let's put this above. Now we'll say if the starting user health factor is greater than or equal to the min health factor, which what's our min health factor again? One, actually it should be one E18. And we're definitely gonna write some tests to make sure this is correct. So one E18, cause we're using our precision here. What else are we doing health factor? Why don't we write tests elsewhere? Revert if health factor is broken. Oh, I guess we haven't tested this yet. Well, I guess we're gonna be testing it very soon. Make sure that that health factor bit is right. So the starting user health factor is greater than or equal to the health factor, then we revert, right? Revert. DSC engine underscore underscore health factor. Okay. Right. Health factor is fine. Got a new error. Let's go to the top. Scroll down. Error. Health factor. Okay. Back, back. Go back down here. Remember, I'm doing control minus to go back. It might be something else depending on your setup. So let's do some thinking. So now we have their starting health factor. What do we want to do? We want to burn their DSC debt, right? We want to reduce the amount of DSC they have and take their collateral. We want to remove them from the system basically, right? So how do we do that? Let's say they have 140, $140 of ETH deposited and $100 of DSC. With a setup like this, their health factor should be below what it currently is. What we could do is we can say, okay, we're going to cover so this is what bad user, this disk, bad user has. That means we could cover, we could say, okay, we're going to cover debt to cover. It's going to equal that $100 and we need to pay back $100. So we're going to have to get a UNT256 collateral or token amount from debt covered, covered, cov covered. So we need to figure out, okay, if we're covering $100 of debt, $100 of DSC equals how much ETH? So we're going to pay back $100 of debt. And how much ETH is that? Okay. How much ETH is that? So we're going to get the token amount of death color, the ETH basically equals, and we're going to have to do some pricing stuff. We're going to have to say it equals get token amount from USD. So we're going to add the collateral and the debt to cover. 
So we're going to figure out, okay, how much of this token are we going to get, right? We're going to cover $100 worth of debt. How much in ETH or whatever collateral token is $100 worth of debt? So we're going to create a new function, get token amount from USD. This is going to be a public view function. So we're going to scroll all the way down here, public and external view functions, function, get token amount from USD. And we're going to pass an address token or collateral, units 256 USD amount in way. This will be a public view returns unit 256. And we're gonna have to do some price feed stuff. So we're gonna need what are we gonna need to do? We're gonna need to get the price of ETH or the token. And then we're gonna have to say, okay, so if the pricing is dollar per ETH, and we have ETH, how do we get the dollar? Well, if we do some math here, let's say it's $2,000 of ETH, and we have $1,000, right? How much ETH is that? We're going to do the 1000 divided by 2000, which is going to equal 0 0.5 ETH, right? So we're going to do this number divided by this number, the amount, the USD amount and weigh divided by the price. And that's how we're going to get this token or collateral amount from the USD amount. So we'll say aggregator v3 interface price feed equals aggregator v3 interface of s price feed of token. Oh, wow. It even build in a lot of this for me. That's great. Yes, this looks right. So we're going to get the price feed of the token and get called the latest round data on it to get the price here. And then we're just going to do this right here. So we're going to say the amount USD in way divided by the price, or well, unit 56 price. Is this the full story? No, absolutely not, because we should always multiply first. So we're gonna do this times our precision. Then we can divide by the price, but is that the whole story? No, because the price has eight decimal places and we need it to have 18. So we're gonna do additional feed precision like this. Does that look right? So if we have Let's say we have 10 E 18 for a mountain way. We're timesing that by one E 18 like this. We're saying divide that by the price. Let's say the price is $2,000, $2,000 E eight times the one E 10, the additional piece here. This looks pretty correct. Do we need anything else? Let's even just pull out the calculator, right? So 10, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 times one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10 divided by two, one, two, three, 2000, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight equals this number, which is probably a half, right? One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Is that right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight, nine. Zero point. Is that right? Oh, because it's ten dollars, duh. Yes, this is right. I was like, I thought we did a thousand dollars, but this is ten dollars. Yes. Okay, cool. That looks good to me. Great. And then obviously we're gonna test this soon to make sure that it is right. So we have this function where we get the token amount from the USD. So we're saying, hey, we're gonna cover a hundred dollars of your debt or something like that. How much ETH is $100 worth of your debt? Maybe it's if the price is $2,000, we obviously we would do 100 divided by 2,000, 0 0.05 right there, right? This is going to be something like 0 0.05 ETH or whatever it is, right? Cool. So we have how much ETH we need to take away from their collateral as a reward for paying back this DSC. But additionally, we also want to and give them a 10% bonus, right? Because we want to incentivize them. If they're just, if it's just a one for one, they're not going to want to do this. So let's say we're going to give them a 10% bonus. So we are giving the liquid dator $110 of weth for 100 DSC, whatever $110 of weth is going to be. We should implement a feature to liquidate in the event, the protocol protocol is insolvent. We're not going to add that in yet, though, but we should probably add something like that. And then and sweep 
extra amounts into a treasury, but we're not going to add either one of those. So don't worry if that's confusing. Don't worry about that. We're not even going to implement that anyways. So we'll say UN256 bonus collateral equals this token amount debt covered times some liquidation bonus that we haven't defined yet, although we're going to do 10% divided by 100, but I hate these floating numbers. So we're going to do something better than 100. We're going to do liquidator precision, which is 100. And we'll do unit 256 private constant liquidator bonus equals shun bonus. It's going to be 10. Be like this means a 10% bonus. And since it's going to be 10 divided by 100, that's going to be 10%. Let's go back down. Liquidation bonus divided by liquidation precision. So the bonus collateral is going to be 10%. So let's say it was 0 0.5, 0 0.05 ETH. We're going to multiply that by 0.1, right? Because we're going to multiply first and then divide to get 0 0.005 ETH. So as a total, or that's not quite right. It's going to be 0 0.005. 0 0.05 times 0 0.1 one equals yes. So that means they're going to get 0 0.055. Is that right? I think that's right. Why, why am I being bad at math? Time point one. Yes. Okay, cool. Great. So that's what they're going to get this bonus collateral. We got to add the bonus collateral to, to the actual collateral. So we're going to say like you went to 256 total collateral collateral to redeem equals token amount from debt covered plus bonus collateral like that. And so, and now we need to redeem this amount of collateral for whoever's calling the liquidate function, right? We need to redeem that collateral. And then we also need to burn the DSC from this user as well. So we need to give them the collateral and burn the DSC that they're covering with their debt to cover. Now though, if we look at our redeem collateral, in collateral function, which is public right now, we can see as inputs, it takes token collateral address and amount collateral, right? And it is hard coded to message.sender. Our third party user isn't the one with the bad debt, right? We need to redeem a random person's collateral. So what we can do is we can refactor this code so that there's an internal redeem collateral function that can redeem collateral from anybody, right? and only very permissioned functions can call redeem collateral. So what we're going to do is actually we're going to take all of this code and we're going to change it and we're going to delete it and we're going to put it into a different function all the way down to the in private and internal functions here. We're going to make a function underscore redeem collateral. And this is going to be an internal function where we can actually redeem collateral from anybody. And as input, this is going to take address token collateral address, same as the regular redeem collateral, also the unit six amount collateral, but we're going to add address from and address to. So this way, and this is going to be private. So this way, somebody can liquidate an address from and then get the rewards too. And this is where I'm going to paste all that code we got from above. And I think this looks good. Yeah, we're just going to paste that code exactly like this. Instead of doing message.sender, this is just going to be from and emit collateral redeemed. We're going to update our collateral redeemed to redeemed from. We'll do address redeemed from, address redeemed to. We'll do the token and then we'll have amount not be indexed. So from, to, token, and amount. Now we got to refactor some of these collaterals. So from when we do just the regular redeem collateral, we'll update this in a minute, actually. Yeah, we'll update that in a minute. So in this internal function, it's going to be from from to address collateral. And then we're going to transfer, we're going to transfer the tokens to whoever the two is. So this is going to be like the liquidator amount collateral and do that. And now we're going to use this internal function up in our regular redeem collateral function that we just created, right? Uh, up here, oh, no, up this one. Up here, we're gonna dump all this and just use this underscore redeem collateral. 
And for here, we're just going to say message.sender. So from message.sender to message.sender, token collateral address, amount collateral. And now that we have this internal function, we can use this redeem collateral bit down in our liquidate, which is down here. We can now just say redeem collateral from the user that's being liquidated. So from user to whoever's calling liquidate here, this is going to be message.sender, the collateral token that we're liquidating, and then finally the total collateral to redeem. So this is why I said we were going to do a little bit of refactoring soon, right? We generally only want to redeem collateral from and to the same person. However, when we're doing a liquidate, we're going to redeem to whoever's calling the liquidate. So they're going to get that reward. The total collateral to redeem is that total amount debt to cover plus some bonus here. And now we actually need to, yeah, we need to burn the DSC now. So right now, if we look up burn, burn DSC, we have this public function which just does the same thing. It just does, it just burns from message.sender. We're gonna have to do the same here. We're gonna wanna make an internal burn DSC function that allows us to burn from anybody, right? So if we scroll down to where we're doing those private functions or scroll up, so we have this internal redeem collateral. We also are gonna need an internal burn DSC. So function underscore burn DSC, you want Six amount DSC to burn address on B half of like whose DSC are we burning for? Whose debt are we paying down? And then address DSC from where are we getting the DSC from? So we have private and we can go back to the burn DSC. Let's burn DSC function, right? And same thing, we can just copy all of this, go back to our internal burn DSC function, paste this in here. We're going to want to update this, right? Instead of message.sender, this is going to be on the half of. We're going, to bur we're going to take away their debt. We're still going to do this, but instead of message.sender, it's going to be DSC from, and it's going to be amount DSC to burn. This is still fine. This just needs to be amount DSC to burn. And we don't need to check health factor yet because this is going to be our internal function. So we might even say, like in the comments here, low level internal function or at dev, low level internal function, do not call unless the function calling it is checking for health factors being broken. So now we have this burn DSC, we can go back up to our burn DSC function, we can just swap, delete all of this, call burn DSC, and this is going to be message.sender, message.sender amount, right? If somebody calls burn DSC themselves, great. We'll just have them call this burn DSC amount to burn on behalf of themselves from themselves. Oh, it looks like I got this backwards. Amount should be the first one. Okay. And now we have this burn DSC function. We can go down to liquidate and we can call burn DSC. What are the uh, amount on behalf of from? So the amount is going to be this debt to cover amount on behalf of is going to be the user and the one who's going to be paying this is going to be message.sender right because it's the whoever's the liquidator whoever's calling liquidate is going to be the one who's paying down the debt to cover right paying back that minted dsc and now since we're doing these internal calls that don't have checks we absolutely need to make sure we're checking this health factor is okay right so we're going to do uint 256 ending user health factor equals underscore health factor of the user. And if the ending health factor is less than or equal to the starting health factor, right? If we didn't improve the health factor, we should revert DSC engine underscore underscore health factor not improved. Copy this, go to the top. We'll do error DSC engine health factor not approved. Go back down. So if we don't improve the health factor, we should 100% revert. And then also, if calling this liquidate function, if paying down some debt and doing all this stuff actually hurts the liquidator's health factor, we should also revert, right? So we should also call revert if health factor is broken for the message.sender, right? If this process ruined their health factor, we shouldn't let them do this, okay? So we're following checks, effects, interactions here. For the most part, 
these two functions are making external calls to external contracts, right? And then we're doing kind of like a check afterwards. Again, this is a bit of a trade-off. We could calculate before and then run this, but that's kind of gas inefficient. We're just gonna check after we do all this. Hey, just make sure that the health factor is okay. Make sure that we didn't break anyone's health factor. So now we have this liquidation function, which is incredibly powerful and kind of what ties this whole thing together, right? There's an incentive here for people to call liquidate so that our protocol is never insolvent, right? And I know I've been kind of throwing around a lot of these financial terms, but our protocol always has more collateral than it has minted DSC. The value of the collateral should always be more than the minted DSC, always. Incredibly powerful function. We're obviously gonna be testing the living hell out of this, right? Because we wanna make sure it actually works. Woo, okay, what do we need now? Oh, well, it looks like we broke some stuff. Oh, this needs a semicolon. What else did we break? There's a little red thing down here. Let's go fix it. Amount, this should be amount DC to burn. Got a couple more red things. Redeem collateral, user message to sender, redeem collateral. Uh, oops, we did these backwards. I'm gonna copy these, put these at the front. Okay, oh, looks like that fixed pretty much most of this. I don't see any more red stuff on the side here. So we're gonna go ahead and run forge build, make sure everything's at least compiling. Awesome, maybe we'll even run forge test. I don't think this would have broken any tests. Looks like those are working fine. But all right, we're doing some fantastic work. And like I said, at this point, I probably would be running tests with this, but we're almost done with all of our code here. So we're just gonna keep going, right? And this code's starting to look pretty darn good, right? We've got these amazing Nat spec comments in here. We've got comments all over the place. Maybe these probably should be cleaned up a little bit, but that's fine. We've got a little, this little dev thing, a shout out saying, hey, don't let anybody call burn DSC without checking the health factor, right? This is really good to tell auditors and security professionals about this, right? It's really good to call this out. So we've now have this internal redeem collateral function, so it can be used for the liquidate or the redeem collateral. Health factor, it looks like pretty much all the functions that we originally wrote are working in here, right? And the reason, again, that this all works is because when we mint DSC, we can only mint as much as we have collateral in the system. We're sending this exchange rate essentially for our protocol. Hey, cool, you have $100, you have $150 worth of ETH deposited. Great, you can mint $100 worth of DSC. So it's this exchange rate that we're setting, which is maintaining the price. Let's just double check that we have kind of most of the functions that we want here. And let's also check that they're in the right place. So we go to the top here. Got a whole bunch of errors, that's great. Got a whole bunch of constants because we hate magic numbers. We have a mapping of price feeds, a mapping of collateral deposited from user to token to the amount they have deposited. We have their debt or their DSC minted, collateral tokens, the IDSC token. We've got some events in here, a couple modifiers, some functions. We've got a way to deposit collateral and mint DSC in one transaction. We've got a way to calculate health factor. I'm gonna tell you right now, there's actually a bug in here. Ho oh, ho. Not gonna tell you what that bug is yet though. <laughs> Maybe you can figure it out. We've got some view functions down below. We're probably gonna add more as we write tests, but this is looking pretty darn good. Now, like I said, there's at least one big bug and there might even be, and there's likely more, but there's at least one big bug in here. So now would be a good time to take a break because after this, we're gonna go deep into writing tests for this protocol. We're gonna write some new tests and we're gonna show you some really advanced testing methodologies. So take that break, go for a walk, and I'll see you in a few. All right, so let's pull up our terminal here. Forge, coverage. Oh, we got some work to do. All right, well, no time like the present. Let's get into it. So we have some price feed tests over here. We probably also want to set up some constructed tests, right? We want to make sure that stuff is being initialized correctly. So let's copy that. 
We'll do con constructor constructor tests like that. We'll fix this so our ADHD doesn't go crazy. And we'll do function test something. <laughs> what are we testing? Uh, let's go down to the constructor here. And what should we be testing? Okay, well, we're doing this revert here. So we should make sure we actually are reverting correctly when the lengths aren't the same. So function test reverts if token length doesn't match price feeds, feeds, public, we'll zoom in, we'll zoom in. We're going to be in here a while. So function like this, and we're going to do, we're going to create some address arrays, address array, public token addresses, address array, public price, price feed addresses. We're going to say token addresses dot push. We're going to push weth into here. Feed addresses add dot push f usd price feed. And we're going to push two in here. Oh, cool. BTC. Do we have, I guess we should pull BTC USD price feed. Let's get this too. So f usd BTC USD price feed. Okay. Oops. Price feed addresses, price feed addresses. So we'll push the two of those in there. Now we'll do vm dot expect expect revert dsc engine dot. What's the name of the error? We're gonna copy this. Boom dot selector selector like that. We're doing some toggle word wrap now. Expect revert. Now we call a new dsc engine with the token addresses. Any price feed addresses. Oh, what else goes in the DSC? Oh, we also need the address DSC, right? Address DSC. So this should revert. Let's see. Forge test dash M. Nice. Okay, that's passing. All right, cool. Price feed tests. We're testing getting the USD value. Uh, I think we had another one down here, right? We had some like get token amount from USD, we sure did. This is a public view. So let's test this one as well. Do function tests. And I usually just like to paste the function names, especially when they're like this public. So we're going to do basically the opposite of this, this got the USD value of some ETH amount, we're going to do you and 256 USD amount, right? Equals, we'll say 100 ETH, 100 ether. And then you at 256 expected with we'll do a little bit of math here. If we have if it's $2,000 per ETH, and we have $100, we're gonna do 100 divided by 2000. So 100 divided by 2000 0 0.05. So we can say expect a WETH is 0 0.05 ether. Now we'll do you into 256 actual WETH equals DSCE dot this function with the lowercase pass and with and then the USD amount, assert equal expected x expected width and the actual width, the two of them should be the same. Let's test it out forge test dash M. Nice that pass. All right, let's keep going. Posit collateral tests, test revert of collateral zero. That's good. What else? Let's go to this deposit collateral deposit collateral function. Okay, we should also revert here. We're basically just going to go through this whole function and kind of test each line. We just tested this one. Let's test it this one. So this will be something like function test reverts with unapproved collateral public. We'll make an ERC 20 mock some ran token, right, we'll just make some silly token, new ERC 20 mock, ran will be the name ran will be the token. Do we have a user in here? I think we do have a user, right? Okay, yeah, we do have a user. Let's give this money to a user. And then we'll give them some starting amount. I think we have starting ERC 20 balance or amount collateral. Yeah, we'll do amount collateral, give them the amount collateral. We'll do vm dot start prank this user who has this token. 
and they're going to try to deposit this collateral and we're going to expect it to revert. So VM dot expect revert. And this error here is allowed token right now doesn't take any parameters. So that's easy enough for us. Let's just copy this. We'll do DSC engine dot this dot selector. And then we'll do we'll call the deposit collateral. So DSCE dot deposit collateral address of that RAND token, right RAND token or random token, we'll do amount collateral as well. So it'll just be that whole amount. And then we can do VM dot stop prank. And that should work. Forge test dash M. Let's see if that's correct. Yep, looking good. All right, let's keep going. What else? What's next? Deposit collateral. Not that one. Okay, did this, did this non reentrant, we could be go ahead and test reentrant. I'm going to skip doing that for now. But we probably do want to do some reentrancy tests at some point. But yeah, I'm gonna skip them for now. And all right, cool. So then we can start testing some of this. So if they deposit collateral, we should see that they actually do this, we should see that they emit an event. Let's go ahead and do that. So let's do function test can deposit collateral collateral and get account info. Because once they deposit, we have this get account info. Oh, it's private right now. So let's actually go to the bottom. Let's create a public version of that. So we'll do function get account information. This will be uh, external external view returns uh, return this account address user returns these two. I'm going to copy this. Go back down. Uh, external view returns these two things. And we're going to say total DSC minted comma ladder value in USDC equals this internal function. And that should be good, right? Oh, we're going to do instead of message sender, we'll do address user, like this, paste the user in here. So now we can get the total DSC minted and their collateral value in USD from an external view function, we should be able to get that information. So let's have them actually deposit collateral in here. And since we're going to be doing a lot of deposited collaterals, we know we can actually make a modifier called deposited collateral. Like this VM dot start prank user ERC 20 mock West in order to deposit West, we need to approve address DSCE comma amount collateral. We're going to do DSCE dot deposit collateral with amount collateral VM dot stop prank VM dot stop prank underscore like this mod if fire right and we'll have this can deposit collateral and get account info we'll have them deposit collateral and we'll now get that account information so we'll say you into 256 total DSC minted you into 256 collateral collateral value in USD equals DSCE dot get account information from the user. Oh, from the user. And now what we're going to say, we're going to make sure these two numbers are correct, the total DSC minted, and the collateral value in USD, they should have minted no DSC. So you into 56 expected expected total DSC minted, yep, equals zero. You into 56 expected collateral value in USD equals this is going to be that DSCE dot get token amount from USD with collateral value in USD. So expected collateral value should just be this function. And then we can say assert equal total DSC minted should be this expected total DSC minted. And then we can do assert equal collateral value in USD. It's going to be this expected collateral value in USD. All right, clear. Forge test dash M. 
All right, we have a fail. You know what to do. We're going to run it again. Dash V V V V. Let's see what we messed up here. It says the assertion failed. Left is this number and right is a much smaller number. This is why it's not cool to do two types of asserts, but I know it's the second one. So we're saying the collateral value in USD is this, but the right side is expected collateral value is going to be this. So let's see what's wrong here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's saying collateral value in USD is 20 grand. Does that make sense? Well, it's 10 ether times $2,000 equals 20 grand, right? So that is, so the collateral value in USD is right. It looks like my right is wrong. Collateral, expect a collateral value in USD, DC dot from token amount with, oh, what the heck? Why am I doing that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's saying that $20,000 is equal to 10 ETH. So I don't know why I'm calling this. Oh, this is actually expected, expected deposit amount. And we shouldn't be comparing these two. This should be compared to the amount collateral, right? So 10 is how much collateral we're putting in here. And then collateral value in USD. Yeah, that's correct. So we're getting, we're using this collateral value in USD to get the expected deposit amount. That looks more correct. Okay, cool. Forge test dash M. And this is one of the kind of weird parts about writing tests, right? Okay, cool. We fixed it. Sometimes your test is wrong. Like what we just showed here, I wrote my test wrong, but sometimes your code is wrong. And that's what these tests really should be testing. Hey, when is the code actually wrong? We're making some progress. Forge coverage. Not a whole lot of great coverage here. <laughs> Let's keep going. So instead of me just kind of walking you through the rest of these tests, you know how to write these tests. In this file, I'm not really going to show you any more unique tests, right? But like I said, there is at least one glaring issue in our DSC engine.sol. There's a big issue in here, right? We definitely need some more getter functions as well. So write getter functions as you test, but there's at least one giant issue. So what I'm going to do now is instead of me literally walking you through the rest of these tests, I mean, it's, you can see all the tests in here is I'm going to challenge you to write these tests yourself to get this forge coverage up. Remember, you can do forge coverage to obviously see what's going on. We're focusing on this one right now. You can also do forge coverage dash dash report to see oh, dash dash report debug to actually see the exact lines that are missing, right? And all these things are just kind of line items, line items, whatever. I see doesn't matter. Scroll, 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 scroll. Okay, these are the ones that are actually issues, right? What, which one's this? Oh, that's the essential. That is the decentralized stable coin. We want to write tests for that as well, but let's just focus on this massive list up here. DSC engine, focus on this list and write some tests for this. Because yeah, the rest of these unit tests or staging tests, we're not going to learn anything new. This is just one of these things that you got to do, that you got to get good at, that you got to write. Now, you don't have to get it to 100%. If you get it to like 85, 90, that's pretty good. Some of these tests are actually very difficult to write, but you should, writing these tests, should find a glaring bug in at least one of these functions. And maybe if you find more than one glaring bug, that's great. Make a PR, make an issue to the repo, but I want you to pause the video and take some time, right? It might be an hour, it might be two hours, it might be 30 minutes, right? Depends on how quick your AI buddy is, how quick you are. And write some more tests. And sometimes, actually, you can even come to your contracts and you could do something like grab this, go over to your chat, GTPT, and say, hey, this is one of my Solidity functions. Can you write some tests for it? For it in Foundry. And because it doesn't know what Foundry is, it's going to totally bunk it up. But you could use ChatGPT to help you write some tests as well, help you get your coverage up. But there's definitely one major issue in here. You might even need to go back and refactor some code, right? I'm going to say keep that to a minimum, though. But there are some spots where 
Maybe you need to refactor your code to make writing tests easier. Maybe you need to write some more helper functions, right? Take this time to experiment and tinker and think, what should I do? How can I make sure my code is safe? And importantly, how can I write enough tests to find this bug that Patrick is talking about, right? Maybe you do some refactoring. Now, don't write any fuzz tests yet. We are going to go over fuzz tests in a little bit. But yeah, just try to write the rest of these unit tests, rest of these pseudo integration tests. And I'll see you when you come out the other side. But when you finish writing the tests, take a break. Take a minute. I want this to sink in. This is one, this is the most advanced lesson that you're going to take in this course. And to be honest, probably it's going to be one of the most advanced courses you'll ever take in Solidity. Okay. So I want you to take your time with this. I want you to understand what's going on. Sometimes it might even make sense for you to go, oh, well, what does MakerDAO do? How can I learn more about stable coins? Where else can I go? Maybe I can ask ChatGPT for questions, right? For those of you who are going, ah, I really don't want to do that. You can 100% just copy paste mine, but I recommend you go through this exercise. Okay, block off some time and I'll see you soon. All right, so let's pull up our terminal here. Forge, coverage. Ooh, we got some work to do. All right, well, no time like the present. Let's get into it. So we have some price feed tests over here. We probably also want to set up some constructed tests, right? We want to make sure that stuff is being initialized correctly. So let's copy that. We'll do con Structor, structor tests like that. We'll fix this so our ADHD doesn't go crazy. And we'll do function test something. <laughs> what are we testing? Uh, let's go down to the constructor here. And what should we be testing? Okay, well, we're doing this revert here. So we should make sure we actually are reverting correctly when the lengths aren't the same. So function test reverts if token length doesn't match price feeds feeds public we'll zoom in we'll zoom in we're going to be in here a while so function like this now we're going to do we're going to create some address arrays address array public token addresses address array public price price feed addresses we're gonna say token addresses dot push. We're gonna push weth into here. Feed addresses add dot push f usd price feed, and we're gonna push two in here. Oh, cool. BTC. Do we have? I guess we should pull BTC USD price feed. Let's get this too. So f usd BTC USD price feed. Okay. Oops. Price feed addresses, price feed addresses. So we'll push the two of those in there. Now we'll do vm dot expect expect revert dsc engine dot. What's the name of the error? We're gonna copy this. Boom dot selector selector like that. Doing some toggle word wrap now. Expect revert. Now we call a new dsc engine with the token addresses. And the price feed addresses. Oh, what else goes in the DSC? Oh, we also need the address DSC, right? Address DSC. So this should revert. Let's see. Forge test dash M. Nice. Okay, that's passing. All right, cool. Price feed tests. We're testing getting the USD value. Uh, I think we had another one down here, right? We had some like get token amount from USD, we sure did. This is a public view. So let's test this one as well. Do function tests. And I usually just like to paste the function names, especially when they're like this public. So we're going to do basically the opposite of this. This got the USD value of some ETH amount, we're going to do UN 256 USD amount, right? Equals, we'll say 100 ETH, 100 Ether. And then you at 256 
expected with, do a little bit of math here. If we have, if it's $2,000 per ETH and we have $100, we're gonna do 100 divided by 2,000. So 100 divided by 2,000, 0 0.05. So we can say expected WETH is 0 0.05 ether. Now we'll do U into 256 actual WETH equals DSCE dot this function with the lowercase, pass in WETH, and then the USD amount, assert equal expected X, expected WETH and the actual WETH. The two of them should be the same. Let's test it out. Forge test dash M. Nice, that passed. All right, let's keep going. Deposit collateral tests. Past revert of collateral zero. That's good. What else? Let's go to this deposit collateral, deposit collateral function. Okay, we should also revert here. We're basically just going to go through this whole function and kind of test each line. We just tested this one. Let's test this one. So this will be something like function test reverts with unapproved. Collateral, collateral, public. We'll make an ERC20 mock, some RAND token, right? We'll just make some silly token. New ERC20 mock. RAN will be the name. RAN will be the token. Do we have a user in here? I think we do have a user, right? Okay, yeah, we do have a user. Let's give this money to a user, and then we'll give them some starting amount. I think we have. Starting ERC20 balance or amount collateral. Yeah, we'll do amount collateral. Give them the amount collateral. We'll do VM dot start prank this user who has this token. And they're gonna try to deposit this collateral and we're gonna expect it to revert. So VM dot expect revert. And this error here is allowed token right now doesn't take any parameters. So that's easy enough for us. Let's just copy this. We'll do DSC engine dot this dot selector. And then we'll do, we'll call the deposit collateral. So DSCE dot deposit collateral address of that RAND token, right? RAND token or random token. We'll do amount collateral as well. So it'll just be that whole amount. And then we can do VM dot stop prank. And that should work. Forge test dash M. Let's see if that's correct. Yep, looking good. All right, let's keep going. What else? What's next? Deposit collateral. Not that one. Okay, did this, did this non reentrant. We could be go ahead and test reentrant. I'm going to skip doing that for now, but we probably do want to do some reentrance of these tests at some point. But yeah, I'm going to skip them for now. And all right, cool. So then we can start testing some of this. So if they deposit collateral, we should see that they actually do this. We should see that they emit an event. Let's go ahead and do that. So let's do function test can deposit collateral collateral and get account info. Because once they deposit, we have this get account info. Oh, it's private right now. So let's actually go to the bottom. Let's create a public version of that. So we'll do function get account information. This will be uh, external, external view returns, uh, return this account address user returns these two. I'm going to copy this, go back down. Uh, external view returns these two things. And we're going to say total DSC minted, comma, ladder value in USDC equals this internal function. And that should be good, right? Oh, we're going to do instead of message.sender, we'll do address user. Like this, paste the user in here. So now we can get the total DSC minted and their collateral value in USD from an external view function. We should be able to get that information. So let's have them actually deposit collateral in here. And since we're going to be doing a lot of deposited collaterals, we know we can actually make a modifier called deposited collateral. Like this vm.start prank user. 
ERC20 mock weth. In order to deposit weth, we need to approve address ESCE, comma, amount collateral. We're going to do DSCE dot deposit collateral with amount collateral. BM dot stop prank. BM dot stop prank. Underscore like this. Modifier. Right. And we'll have this can deposit collateral and get account info. We'll have them deposit collateral. And we'll now get that account information. So we'll say UN256 total DSC minted. UN256 collateral. Lateral value in USD equals DSCE dot get account information from the user. Oh, from the user. And now what we're going to say, we're going to make sure these two numbers are correct. The total DSC minted and the collateral value in USD. They should have minted no DSC. So you in 256 expected, expected total DSC minted. Yep. Equals zero. UN256 expected collateral value in USD equals this is going to be that DSCE dot get token amount from USD with collateral value in USD. So expected collateral value should just be this function. Then we can say assert equal total DSC minted should be this expected total DSC minted. And then we can do a search equal collateral value in USD. It's going to be this expected collateral value in USD. All right, clear. Forge test dash M. All right, we have a fail. You know what to do. We're going to run it again. Dash V V V V. Let's see what we messed up here. It says the assertion failed. Left is this number and right is a much smaller number. This is why it's not cool to do two types of asserts, but I know it's the second one. So we're saying the collateral value in USD is this, but the right side is expected collateral value is going to be this. So let's see what's wrong here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's saying collateral value in USD is 20 grand. Does that make sense? Well, it's 10 ether times $2,000 equals 20 grand, right? So that is, so the collateral value in USD is right. It looks like my right is wrong. Collateral, expect a collateral value in USD, DC dot from token amount with, oh, what the heck? Why am I doing that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's saying that $20,000 is equal to 10 ETH. So I don't know why I'm calling this. Oh, this is actually expected, expected deposit amount. And we shouldn't be comparing these two. This should be compared to the amount collateral, right? So 10 is how much collateral we're putting in here. And then collateral value in USD. Yeah, that's correct. So we're getting, we're using this collateral value in USD to get the expected deposit amount. That looks more correct. Okay, cool. Forge test dash M. And this is one of the kind of weird parts about writing tests, right? Okay, cool. We fixed it. Sometimes your test is wrong. Like what we just showed here. I wrote my test wrong, but sometimes your code is wrong. And that's what these tests really should be testing. Hey, when is the code actually wrong? We're making some progress. Forge coverage. Not a whole lot of great coverage here. <laughs> Let's keep going. So instead of me just kind of walking you through the rest of these tests, you know how to write these tests. In this file, I'm not really going to show you any more unique tests, right? But like I said, there is at least one glaring issue in our DSC engine.sol. There's a big issue in here, right? We definitely need some more getter functions as well. So write getter functions as you test, but there's at least one giant issue. So what I'm going to do now is instead of me literally walking you through the rest of these tests, I mean, it's, you can see all the tests in here is I'm going to challenge you to write these tests yourself to get this forge coverage up. Remember you can do forge coverage to obviously see 
what's going on. We're focusing on this one right now. You can also do forge coverage dash dash report to see oh, dash dash report debug to actually see the exact lines that are missing, right? And all these things are just kind of line items, line items, whatever. I see doesn't matter. I'll scroll, 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 scroll. Okay, these are the ones that are actually issues, right? What, which one's this? Oh, that's essential. That is the decentralized stable coin. We want to write tests for that as well, but let's just focus on this massive list up here. DSE engine, focus on this list and write some tests for this. Because yeah, the rest of these unit tests or staging tests, we're not going to learn anything new. This is just one of these things that you got to do, that you got to get good at, that you got to write. Now, you don't have to get it to 100%. If you get it to like 85, 90, that's pretty good. Some of these tests are actually very difficult to write, but you should, writing these tests, should find a glaring bug in at least one of these functions. And maybe if you find more than one glaring bug, that's great. Make a PR, make an issue to the repo, but I want you to pause the video and take some time, right? It might be an hour, it might be two hours, it might be 30 minutes, right? Depends on how quick your AI buddy is, how quick you are and write some more tests. And sometimes, actually, you can even come to your contracts and you can do something like grab this, go over to your chat, GPT, and say, hey, this is one of my Solidity functions. Can you write some tests for it? For it in Foundry. And because it doesn't know what Foundry is, it's gonna totally bunk it up. But you could use ChatGPT to help you write some tests as well, help you get your coverage up. But there's definitely one major issue in here. You might even need to go back and refactor some code, right? I'm gonna say, keep that to a minimum though, but there are some spots where maybe you need to refactor your code to make writing tests easier. Maybe you need to write some more helper functions, right? Take this time to experiment and tinker and think, what should I do? How can I make sure my code is safe? And importantly, how can I write enough tests to find this bug that Patrick is talking about, right? Maybe you do some refactoring, now, don't write any fuzz tests yet. We are going to go over fuzz tests in a little bit, but yeah, just try to write the rest of these unit tests, rest of these pseudo integration tests, and I'll see you when you come out the other side. But when you finish writing the tests, take a break, take a minute. I want this to sink in. This is one, this is the most advanced lesson that you're going to take in this course. And to be honest, probably it's going to be one of the most advanced courses you'll ever take in Solidity. Okay. So I want you to take your time with this. I want you to understand what's going on. Sometimes it might even make sense for you to go, oh, well, what does MakerDAO do? How can I learn more about stable coins? Where else can I go? Maybe I can ask ChatGPT for questions, right? For those of you who are going, ah, I really don't want to do that. You can 100% just copy paste mine, but I recommend you go through this exercise. Okay, lock off some time and I'll see you soon. All right, welcome back. Did you find the bug? How are your tests looking? If you run forge coverage, do they look something at least like this? Do they look better? Do they look worse? So I copy pasted a whole bunch of my tests and we're looking pretty good here. We definitely should be increasing the test coverage of our branches and we can definitely get these a little bit higher, but for at least the DSC engine, we have a much better code coverage going on here. And I hope your code coverage looks like, looks like this too. Now, additionally, I did a little bit of refactoring writing these codes. One of the main things that I added was I added this calculate health factor function. The reason I added this calculate health factor internal function was so that I could have this public calculate health factor function. And then in my tests, what I could do is have an expected health factor. And that way, when a function breaks health factor, I can pass that into the expected health factor error revert here in one of my tests, right? When we're testing to expect an event, I added this new function to do that. And having a public function like calculate health factor might make it easier for people to see what their health factor might be if they make some change, right? So that was one of the big ones I made. And the bug was in the health factor as well, or at least the bug that I planned to be in there. So in my calculate health factor, which instead of in our underscore health 
factor function, I'm just calling this calculate health factor function, right? I'm getting the account information and then just passing it to this calculate health factor. And in this, we needed to add a checker for if the total DSC minted was zero. And if it's zero, then we said, okay, cool, your health factor is gonna be the max U at 256 or something like that, right? And the reason that we need this is if someone deposits a ton of collateral, but has no DSC minted, well, their health factor is gonna divide by zero, which we can't have. So calculating someone's health factor after they deposit collateral would result in an issue. We'd break stuff. We don't wanna break stuff. And then the final piece that I did was I added a ton of external view functions just to make it easier to read and interact with this protocol. So those are some of the refactors that I did. And then obviously we added a ton of tests. There's nothing really new in here. It's just, you gotta write the tests, right? Everything in here you've learned, you can do. And if you wrote some tests and you got this to a high level of coverage around 90%, you should be incredibly proud of yourself. This is hard to write tests for. This is a very difficult project. So you should be incredibly proud of yourself for just getting this far. But guess what? We're not even done because we wanna make this code so freaking amazing. We need to think a little bit about security and we're not gonna go too deep into security. However, we should ask ourselves some questions, right? When we're working with a code base, we wanna say, hmm, we should always, always ask, what are our invariants slash properties? What are the invariants slash properties of the system? And that way we can write some stateful and stateless fuzz tests. Now I know we briefly went over one form of fuzz testing, but now we're gonna go a little bit deeper. And I made a video on stateless and stateful fuzz testing recently, and we're gonna go ahead and watch that so you can have a better understanding of what stateless and stateful fuzz testing is and why it's so important, especially for a project like this that has potentially a lot of money moving around. So let's understand what fuzz testing is. Let's watch this video. All right, contracts are written and tested. Can I ship my code? No, I can easily break this with a flash loan attack. Ah, oh, crap, I didn't think about that. Let me fix. All right, how about now? If I make a flash loan on Aave, I can use that loan to lock up a CDB on FakerDAO, and I can exploit the Oracle by re-entering your dinner reservation at Chili's, causing a bridge malfunction on the flux capacitor, bypassing the possibility media I can exploit your contract. I exploit your contract. Most of the time, hacks will come from a scenario that you didn't think about or write a test for. But what if I told you that you could write a test that cannot check for just one scenario, but every scenario? Let's get froggy. Fuzz testing or fuzzing is when you supply random data to your system in an attempt to break it. So if this balloon is our system slash code, it's us doing random stuff in an attempt to break it. <clears throat> this is chain link. Now, why would we want to do all that? Let's say we have this function called do stuff. It takes an integer as an input parameter, and we know that no matter what we give it as an input, our variable should always be zero, should always be zero. The fact that this variable should always be zero is known as our invariant, or our property of the system that should always hold. In our balloon example, if we market our balloon as indestructible or unbreakable or unpoppable, the invariant that would hold would, this balloon cannot be broken. And unlike this balloon in real life, we can write a test that will call the do stuff function many times with random data and check to see that our should always be zero variable is always zero. Now, a normal unit test for our code might look like this. We pass a single data point, we call the function, and then we do our assertion to make sure that should always be zero is in fact zero. And with this, we might think our code is covered. But if we look back at our do stuff function a little bit closer, we can clearly see that if our data input is two, should always be zero will end up being one. This would break our invariant. Should always be zero will not be zero. Now this may seem obvious for this function, but sometimes you'll have a function that looks like this. It would be insane to write a test case for every single possible integer or scenario, so we need a programmatic way to find this scenario. Now in our code, we also see a second exploit, but we'll get to that in a minute. Now there are two popular methodologies to find these edge cases, fuzz tests slash invariant tests and symbolic execution slash form of verification. We'll save the latter for another video. If we were writing our code in Foundry, this would be our unit test. Writing a fuzz test in Foundry where we do all this random inputting is gonna be really similar. Instead of us manually selecting our data, right in our test parameter, we'll add our variable, comment out this line, and that's it. 
Now, when we run a Foundry test here, Foundry will automatically randomize data, run through our code with a ton of different examples. This is as if they ran with data equals zero, data equals one, data equals this number, that's a T, but whatever, you get the picture. Now, if I run my unit test, you'll see that the unit test actually passes. However, if we run this fuzz test, you'll see it actually gives us an output where it says assertion violated counterexample gives us the call data and the arguments. It was able to find out by randomly throwing data at our function call that two breaks our invariant, AKA it makes it such that should always be zero is not zero. Now it's really doing semi-random data instead of purely random data. And the way your fuzzer picks the random data matters. It won't be able to go over every single possible UN256. So understanding how your fuzzers pick the random data is an advanced thing that you should learn later on. At the moment, I think the trail of bits echidna slash optic integration is probably the best fuzzer out there and it easily has the best logo of all time, but ripped Jesus is a solid second. So now that we have our counter example here, we can use this to go back into our contract, find out, ah, okay, so we are doing this wrong, delete this line, and then run our test again and see that it does indeed pass. What's important is this number down here, the number of runs. So this did 256 different random inputs to make our test run. In Foundry, you can change the number of runs in your foundry.toml file by just adding a section like this, rerunning your tests, and now you'll see it did a thousand different examples. The number of runs is really important, obviously, because more runs is more random inputs, more use cases, more chance that you'll actually catch the issue. And now congrats, that's the basic of fuzz testing. Let's just do a little recap here before going further. The first thing you need to do is understand our invariant or property of the system that must always hold. And our example should always be zero was our invariant. Understand your invariant and then write a test that would input random data to try to break that invariant. Now, if we go back to our example contract though, you'll see with our fuzz test, we were able to find this first use case. However, it didn't find this second scenario where should always be zero was set to one if hidden value was seven. In order for this to revert, hidden value would need to be seven. And the only way to set hidden value to seven would be to first call do stuff with seven, which would set hidden value down here and then call do stuff again with anything. Our fuzz test as written would never be able to find this. That's because this fuzz test is known as a stateless fuzz test, which is where the state of the previous run is discarded for the next run. If we go back to our balloon example, stateless fuzzy would be doing something to the balloon for one fuzz run, then discarding that balloon and blowing up a new balloon for each fuzz run. However, instead of doing stateless fuzzing, we could do stateful fuzzing. Stateful fuzzing is where the ending state of our previous fuzz run is the starting state of the next fuzz run. For example, instead of blowing up a new balloon for each one of these runs, we just use the same balloon to do multiple random things to it. Combined is considered one fuzz run. So a single fuzz run on a stateless fuzz run would be having data be seven, calling do stuff, just using the same contract that we just called do stuff on and then call another function on it. If this was a unit test we had, we would of course see this get violated. But as you can see, with sufficiently complicated code, coming with these very specific scenarios are gonna be missed. To write a stateful fuzz test in Foundry, you need to use the invariant keyword and it requires a little bit of setup. And don't get too confused by the invariant keyword here. Yes, it's being a little overloaded. Write an invariant test in Foundry. We first need to import this STD invariant contract and inherit it in our test contract. Then we need to tell Foundry which contract to call random functions on. Since we only have one contract with one function, we're gonna tell Foundry that my contract should be called and it's allowed to call any of the functions in my contract. So we'd say, hey, the target contract for you is gonna be the address of example contract. Foundry is smart enough to know, okay, it's gonna grab any and all of the functions from my contract and call them in random orders with random data. So it's gonna call do stuff with random data, and then it's gonna call do stuff with random data, and then it's gonna call do stuff with random data since do stuff is the only function. Now we can write our invariant by saying function invariant test always is zero public. And we can just add our assert, assert our example contract that should always be zero is zero. So it'll run do stuff with some random data, if it happens across seven, it'll set hidden value to seven, and then it'll call do stuff again with hidden value starting at seven, which will trigger this conditional. So now if we run this test, we can see it does indeed find a sequence where our invariant or our assertion or our property is broken. We can see first on my contract, it's gonna call do stuff with an argument of seven, and then it's gonna call my contract with an argument of some random number, because it doesn't matter what the input is after it sets it to seven. So now that we have that, we can go back to our code, remove this, come back to our test, rerun our test, and we'll find that our code is now safe and sound because our invariants hold up. Now, an important aside on the term invariant, Foundry uses the term invariant 
to describe this stateful fuzzing. Stateless fuzzing is when you give random data to an input to a function to see if it breaks some invariant. Stateful fuzzing is when you give random data and random function calls to a system to see if it breaks some invariant. In Foundry, fuzzing is stateless fuzzing and invariants are stateful fuzzing. So when people are talking about invariants in Foundry, they're usually talking about stateful fuzzing. If they talk about fuzzing in Foundry, they're talking about stateless fuzzing, even though they're both technically fuzzing. There's an issue on the repo to potentially change the name, but I digress. So in a real smart contract, your invariant won't be that a balloon shouldn't pop or some function should always be zero. It might be something like new tokens minted is less than the inflation rate. There should only be one winner in a random lottery someone shouldn't be able to take more money out of the protocol than they put in. And let me tell you what, at this point, congratulations, you've learned the basics of fuzzing. This is something that even some of the top protocols in this space don't use. And this is something that we in Cypherin use to find high severity vulnerabilities in smart contracts. Hey, I'm Alex Rohn, co-founder at Cypherin. We use invariant tests during our audits to identify vulnerabilities that are often difficult to catch purely with manual reviews. That's not to say they're a silver bullet. They are in no way a replacement for experts' manual review, but they certainly can aid in the audit process. This needs to be the new floor for security in Web3. If you're working with a protocol that isn't doing stateful fuzzing or invariant or fuzz tests, red flag, get them to use it, make a PR. Number one, understand what the invariants are. Number two, write functions that can execute them. Do not go to audit without these. And don't let your auditors let you get away with not having them. So this video was just to give you the basics. And if you want to learn the advanced fuzzing strategies and how to fuzz like pro, be sure to watch our next video on the topic as that'll give you the keys to write professional fuzz and professional invariant tests. Come on, gang. Let's make Web3 better and I'll see you next time. All right, so now we've learned a little bit about invariant tests or fuzzing tests and why they are so absolutely crucial, especially for a project like this. So we're gonna write some stateful fuzz tests or invariant tests in Foundry so we can have some more confidence that our code actually does what we want it to do. And the method that we saw in that video that we just watched is kind of the most basic methodology out there. And if we go to the Foundry docs, we can go on the left side, go all the way down to fuzz testing, or excuse me, go all the way down to this invariant testing, which, which invariant testing, like I said, is stateful fuzz testing. And we can read more about some of the more advanced ways to do these fuzz tests or these invariant tests. We're still gonna do the target contracts, but what we saw in the video was a type of open testing, right? Where we just have function invariant A and then the assert. And what this does is it just calls all the functions on this contract to try to break that invariant. Now this is good, this is great for an initial run of the code. However, we want to do for more advanced systems like ours, handler-based testing. Sufficiently complex protocols are going to have so many different random intricacies that we want to narrow down the random call so that we can have a higher likelihood of getting and catching actual errors. So we're going to do this handler-based type of testing. In this example here, in this open testing, it just calls any of the functions in the contract in any order and handler-based testing, if we scroll down, we can kind of see this example here where we create a contract called handler where we only call functions in specific ways. For example, when depositing tokens, we need to make sure an approve happens beforehand. If you just call deposit without approving that token, that's kind of a wasted fuzz run. And if we only have 200 fuzz runs and we're wasting them on failed fuzz runs, well, we're, the chance of us actually finding a bug becomes smaller. So if you think of the open fuzz testing like this, where you have foundry, you call a whole bunch of functions on the protocol with the asserts. Handler is gonna call functions in specific ways to the functions so that we have a higher likelihood of calling functions in orders that we want. So we're gonna learn about this handler-based methodology and we're gonna build an incredibly verbose fuzz testing or invariant testing setup. Now, in our foundry.toml, to work with these fuzz or these invariant tests, we can do this in variant section here. We can say the number of runs, we'll say is 128. We can also say the depth, which is the number of calls in a single run, which we might do 128. And then one of the most important keywords you're gonna run into is this fail on revert. So let's talk about this fail on revert keyword and setting. So to create some invariant tests, let's create a new folder or 
fuzz test called fuzz or invariant or whatever you want to call it. And in here, we're going to need to actually create two different files. We're going to do invariance, invariance, test.t.sol, and then handler.t.sol. This invariance file is going to have, have our invariance, aka our properties of the system that should always hold, right? That we just learned from that video. And this handler, this handler is going to narrow down the way that we call functions. This way, we don't waste runs, like I was saying. Again, if we call deposit collateral in our stablecoin without approving that stablecoin, that's kind of a wasted run. And we don't want to waste runs. So this handler is going to set our code up, set our contracts up so that we don't waste these runs. And we're going to come back to this fail and revert in a second. For now, let's actually set this to false and we'll set it to true soon. But so the first thing we always want to do when writing invariant tests, when working with this, is we want to ask the question, what are our invariants? What are the properties of the system that should always hold? Well, we can think of some, right? Well, one, the total supply of DSC should be less than the total value of collateral. Follow the word wrap. We should, the total supply of DSC, which is essentially the debt, should always be less than the total value of collateral. Great, we have an invariant that we can test, and we should throw a ton of random function calls to try to break this one. Okay, what else? What other invariants should we have? Maybe our getter functions, our getter view functions, should never revert. And this is actually sort of an evergreen invariant. Most protocols can and should probably just have an invariant that looks like this. Getter view functions should never revert. Now, we can probably think of more, but because doing these invariant tests can be a little bit time intensive, we're just going to focus on these two for now. These are going to be the two invariants that we focus on and we try to work with. So let's begin working and writing our invariant tests. And then we're also going to write our handler to help make sure all the function calls that we're working with actually do what we want them to do. Okay, let's do it. So this is going to be another test file. So SPDX license identifier MIT pragma. So oh, well, that's nice. That kind of just automatically added it for me. So let's put this to the top. Zero point. 8.18, little carrot here, contract, invariance, test, like this. And to do this, we're going to say, we're going to have to import some stuff. We're going to import test from forge td slash test dot sol and import std in variant from forge std std in variant dot sol contract invariant test. And then we're gonna say this is STD invariant, and it's test. So this STD invariant contract, if we click into it, it has all this stuff that we're going to need to work with the invariants. One of the most important functions that it gives us is this target contract, where it says, Hey, this is the contract I want you to call all these random functions on. Okay, great. Now, just like our normal tests, we're gonna have a function set up external this and we're going to set up some stuff, right? A lot of this is going to look similar to our unit tests. So we're going to have to import deploy DSC from dot dot slash dot dot slash script slash deploy DSC dot s dot sol import DSCE engine from dot dot slash dot dot slash SRC slash D sc engine dot so like this and we'll say the deploy dsc deployer 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 equals new deploy dsc and then of course dsc engine dsce dsce equals deployer dot run and this actually returns a whole bunch of stuff essentially stablecoin dsce and helper config so this is going to be, we also need a DSC. So we're going to import that, import the centralized stablecoin from dot dot slash dot dot slash src slash decentralized stablecoin dot sol. So we're going to do decentralized stablecoin DSC. And let's get the helper config as well. Import helper config 
config from dot dot slash dot dot slash script slash helper config dot s dot sol helper config config right and so this turns the dsc dsce and config equals deployer dot run right and now if we were doing this open testing methodology right if we go back to the docs here if we're doing this open testing methodology we could kind of finish this right now what we would do is we would say target contract address dsce like this paste this in here and then just by adding this we're telling foundry hey go ahead go wild on this right go absolutely wild on this and actually let's even rename this call this open invariant test.t.sol open invariant test.t.sol so we'll say absolutely go buck wild on this and now we can add our invariant right we'll say function invariant variant un underscore protocol must must have more value than total supply and this will be a view function and what we can just say is we want to get the value of the of all the collateral in the protocol compare it to all the debt or the dsc so we can do that pretty easily by using the collaterals itself right using our helper config we'll say helper config dot active network config we can get the well, what does this one do again let's open up the helper config we can get these two tokens and just say okay well what's the balance of these two tokens in our dsc engine and then what's their value right so we'll just get those two tokens. So we're going to do nothing, nothing, weth, Bitcoin, nothing. So we'll do blank, blank, weth, BTC, nothing. And then those are ERC-20s. So we'll import, import IERC-20 from, all right, cool. That looks good. So we'll say ERC-20, weth, IERC-20, BTC. This is wrapped BTC, wrapped BTC. Oops, sorry, this is config dot active network config. And we need to wrap this in IERC20, IERC20, like this. What am I messing up? Oh, let's just do, do address with then. Address with, address BTC, like this. All right, cool. So we're getting with and Bitcoin. It's gonna be wrapped ETH and wrapped Bitcoin. And now what we can do is first we'll say UNT256 total supply equals dsc dot total supply so this is the total supply of all dsc in the entire world right and we know the only way to mint dsc is through the dsc engine so through people depositing and withdrawing collateral now what we can do is we can say okay let's get the uint 256 total total weth deposited equals and this is where we can do ierc20 weth dot balance of address DSC. So this is going to be the total amount of WETH deposited into that contract, or just the total amount of WETH sent to that contract. Then we're going to say UN256 total BTC deposited equals IRC20 wrapped BTC dot balance of address DSC. So we have the total WETH, total Bitcoin. Now we can get those values. We can say UN256 with value equals we have a function here called get usd value where we can get the usd value of any token of any amount so we're just going to use that with value is going to be dsce dot get usd value with and the total with deposited un 256 uh, wrapped btc value same thing get usd value wrapped btc total btc deposited and now what we can do is we can do assert the with value plus the wrapped Bitcoin value is greater than the total supply. And this is all we would need to do for this open testing, this open invariance. That's it. We're done. Boom. And this is why this is the easiest type of invariant test. But you'll see running this, we won't get great results. So let's do forge test.m. And now what this is going to do is it's going to call all types of functions on our DSCE and try to break this invariant. So it looks like 
it was able to break this really easily. So let's clear this and we'll add our dash VV VV. We'll see what's up. Yep, assert yep, assertion violated. We're having a hard time actually seeing the numbers. So we're going to import console in here, test console. And we're just going to say console dot log with value, semicolon with value, or that's wrap BTC, wrap BTC with, with wrap BTC value, console dot log, total supply, total supply. Let's run this again. Now, what do we get? Well, we got our first issue is that these are all zeros, right? And if they're all zeros, then this doesn't hold. So we can do greater than or equal to. This is kind of a bit of a cop out, right? Because if they're equal, that makes us nervous, but it's fine, right? We should always at least have more collateral in the system than total supply. So now let's try again. Run this test again. Compiler runs successful. And we get, hey, you pass. There's no way for us to make it such that the total supply is lower. So this is awesome, right? Well, it's not that awesome. We didn't find any issues. We're looking to find issues. So maybe we need to bump up the number of runs. Maybe we need to bump it up to a thousand. And let's run this again. Now we're, you're going to see this is going to take a lot longer because before it was doing a hundred runs at 128 depth. Now it's doing a thousand runs, and each one of these runs has 128. So it took a lot longer, and you can see that it took 14 seconds as opposed to what it did before with 128. If we run that. It did it in one and a half seconds. But if we look up here on this line, this line is incredibly important. We have calls and we have reverts. So this made 16,384 calls and reverted 16,384 times. So basically, it wasn't even able to do anything, right? So what if we bump this up to 1,000? Clear, run this. We're going to have to wait a few more seconds again. Ugh. So it did this many calls and it also reverted this many times. And the reason that this is still saying pass though is because we have this fail on revert equals false. And this fail on revert equals false has some pros and it has some cons. The pro of fail on reverse equals false is that we can very quickly write open testing functions like this and we can very quickly write minimal handler functions that aren't perfect. But the downside is it's hard for us to make sure that all the calls we're making actually make sense, right? Because this could be calling on our on our engine. Maybe it's just trying to, to deposit collateral, but it keeps using random collateral out addresses that don't make any sense. So maybe it's calling this 128,000 times with 128 different collateral addresses, but only two work, right? So doing like this is cool for kind of some sanity check and maybe it'll catch something, but it seems like it's not actually catching anything, right? And that's not a very good use of this. So revert on false is fantastic for quick tests. And often if I'm doing a competitive audit, which you can learn more about in the security course coming out soon, hopefully, if I'm doing competitive audit, a lot of times I will have revert on false be false, just so I can write up invariant tests quickly, I will also write handlers as well, like mini handlers, just so I don't have to get every nook and cranny, but I still will write a handler so I can narrow down some of the functions. But this open invariant seems to have this major flaw where it's probably making a bunch of silly calls. So this is great for very small contracts, but the more complex you get, like our system here, this open invariant system, it probably doesn't make sense for us to do because it's not going to catch anything. It's just going to keep breaking. Now, if we set this to true, we open this back up, we run this again, you'll see exactly one of the calls it makes that breaks. So it looks like it called redeem collateral for, you, for DSC. This is the first function call it made, which obviously doesn't make any sense because you can't redeem any collateral unless you have deposited collateral. And you, just, and you can see the args it put in, it put in some random address, some random amount, a random amount, and then another random number. Right. And you'll see we can call this many times, 
and it'll keep giving us different places that it ran into issues. When we say revert on false is true, this can give us some peace of mind knowing that if this test passes, that means all of the transactions that went through actually went through and it didn't make a bunch of really dumb calls here, right? So here, fail on revert was false. We called liquidate first, which obviously doesn't make any sense with this, with some horrible random address, some horrible random address, some random amount, right? None of these make any sense. We call it again. We failed again. It called deposit collateral mint DSC, which is good. All right, so we're trying to deposit collateral but it used some random address that isn't approved, some horrible amounts here, and it just keeps failing, right? So we want to try to prevent, and you can see here in the call summary, it made one run, one call, and that call reverted, right? So we wanna narrow this down to say, to try to point our fuzz, our random runs in a direction that makes a lot more sense, right? So this is cool, not great. Open invariance, I'm just now gonna comment out this whole page because we're not going to use this anymore. Okay, we're going to, I'm going to leave the file in here, though, we're going to create a new file, though, we're going to call this invariance t.sol. I am going to copy this whole invariance thing, paste it in here and uncomment it. And we're going to level this up. So that this invariance file, actually, let's just call this invariance. So that this new one is using this handler method, it's using this handler method to narrow down the function calls. And we'll do a mix of setting this to true and false, and you'll see where some of the advantages and disadvantages are. So we have our invariance file, we have our target contract here, but we want to make sure we call this in a sensical order. For example, hey, don't call redeem collateral unless there is collateral to redeem, right? Maybe we want to set this up. So we're going to create a handler, which is going to handle the way we actually make calls to the DSCE. So it's basically going to, instead of us just randomly calling redeem collateral, we're only going to be able to call redeem collateral if there is collateral to redeem, right? Because otherwise the transaction is just going to revert and that's a waste of a function call. So now we're going to create this handler. And instead of our target contract being the DSCE, our target contract is going to be this handler, which handles the way we make those calls. Okay. So we're going to do SPDX license identifier MIT, as you already know, pragma zero solidity 0 0.8.18, a little carrot contract handler like this. And then we're going to say well, this contract handler is going to be test as well. And this is definitely some advanced code here. So don't get too discouraged if it doesn't make sense or if it's hard the first time. Okay. So we're going to import test from forge std slash test dot soul. Remember to ask questions and use the forms. So what's one of the first things we want to do? Hey, don't call redeem collateral unless there is even collateral to redeem, right? We want to make sure that that's this is a valid run. Hey, only call redeem collateral when there is collateral in there. So this function, this contract is going to do that for us. We do need to make a constructor though, so that this handler contract knows what the DSC engine even is, right? Because it's going to be the one making the calls to it. So we do need to import the DSC engine from dot dot slash dot dot slash src slash DSC engine dot soul. We also need to import the decentralized stablecoin from the decentralized stablecoin dot soul constructor. And these are going to be the main functions. These are going to be the main contracts that our handler is going to call. So we're going to say DSC engine DSCE. And then we're going to say decentralized stablecoin DSC. And in the constructor here, we're going to say DSC engine underscore DSC engine and decentralized stablecoin underscore DSC. And then we're just going to say, oh, cool. It already added it. DSCE, DSC engine, and DSC is underscore DSC. So because these are the contracts that we want the handler to handle making the calls to. Great. Makes sense. So let's talk about this redeem collateral, right? Let's just focus on on making this not revert. So we're going to say, okay, call this when you have collateral. So the first thing we probably need to do is what? Probably deposit collateral, right? So we'll create a function called deposit collateral. And this function is going to look a little different than the deposit collateral in the DSC engine, right? If we look in here, this is what it does. 
Well, we're going to set this deposit collateral function up in our handler so that this transaction always goes through, right? It doesn't revert. But we do want to keep the randomization, right? We want it to deposit random collaterals that are valid collaterals. So what we can do is we can create a unit 256 collateral seed and a unit 256 amount collateral. Collateral. And this is actually really similar to the fuzz test. So in your handlers, whatever parameters you have are going to be randomized. So we're going to pick a random one of the valid collaterals to deposit, and we're going to pick a random amount of collateral. Now I'm going to write this function without any guardrails, and it's going to break, and that's okay, and we're going to fix it as we go along. But if we were to just not have any guardrails on this at all, we would just say dsce dot deposit collateral collateral, and we would do you know collateral and an amount collateral. We could actually just have this be address collateral and amount collateral. And we'd say deposit this collateral and amount collateral. And this, of course, is probably going to break a lot, right? Because the collateral we're going to pass is going to be wrong. This is a random address. There are so many addresses. And the amount of collateral could also break because deposit collateral reverts on zero, right? But I do want to show you what we're actually going to do in our actual contract here. Instead of having our target contract be the DSCE, what we're going to do is we're going to say handler, because we're going to import this handler. So we're going to do import handler from dot slash handler dot t dot sol handler handler. We're going to say handler equals new handler DSCE and DSC. And now we're going to say our target contract is just the handler. Okay. Excuse me, the address handler. Now with this, the handler only has this one function. So we're going to call deposit collateral through the handler, which is going to call our engine. And since this is the only function for it to call, this is all we're going to see if we see our invariance break. So if I do forge test dash M paste this in, we're gonna see it break almost instantly with an issue, but it's only going to be deposit collateral because it's the only function that we have, right? We run it again. It's still going to be deposit collateral because that's the only function the handler has. Yes, makes sense. Okay, cool. Hopefully it makes sense. In our foundry.toml, we could say fail on revert is false. And we could run this again. Let's make this a little bit lower 128. And let's see if we get any valid runs, right? Let's see if we pick miraculously a valid address and we get success. But oh, it looks like we did do some valid ones, but we've got a ton of reverts here. We've got so many reverts here that almost half of these runs, almost half of these calls were bad. That's not a great use of our, and this isn't really super helpful because of course, of course our invariant here is going to hold because the only thing we've allowed our system to do is deposit collateral, right? Ridiculous. So if we turn this back to true, we run this again, we're, we're of course going to break now because some of these deposits are going to fail, right? So it looks like if we call deposit collateral with some horrible address, it fails, right? So that's one of the first things we want to, to have our handler do. We want to say, hey, you're only allowed to deposit valid collateral. So what we can do in our handler is we can set that up. Hey, you're only allowed to deposit valid collateral. Instead of passing any address as collateral, we'll say U256 collateral seed, okay? And what we're going to do with this seed is we're going to have it pick from our two collaterals. We're going to have it randomly pick either WEF or BTC. So we're actually going to create a function, helper functions. We're going to say function underscore get collateral collateral from seed, U256 collateral seed. And we're going to make this a private view function. It's going to return an ERC and IERC20. Actually, we're going to do an ERC20 mock, and I'll explain why in a bit. We got to import that. Import ERC20 mock from at open Zeppelin contracts mocks slash, uh, what is it? Mock ERC? No. ERC20 mock.sol. Cool. And so, what we're going to do instead of this line is we're going to use this line, this function to do it. We're going to say if collateral collat. Or all seed 
modulo two, because we're only we only have two collaterals, equals equals zero, then return with. We can get with by sticking at the top. We'll say ERC twenty mock with ERC twenty mock wrapped Bitcoin. And right in our constructor, we can get all of our collateral tokens. The so I made a function way down at the bottom here called get collateral tokens, which returns the full array of collateral tokens. If you don't have this, feel free to pause and implement this. But what we can do, we can say address array memory collateral collateral tokens equals DSCE dot get collateral tokens like this. And we can say weth is zero and wrap BTC is one. So that's how we can get those collateral tokens. So weth wrap BTC. If collateral C divided by two is zero, return weth. Otherwise, return wrapped BTC. So now we have a function where we can only get a valid collateral type. So instead of just depositing any collateral type, we can say uh, ERC20 mock collateral equals get collateral from seed, collateral seed. And now we're still depositing a random collateral, but this is, oh, it's gonna be address. But this is a valid collateral address. So we're probably more likely to actually pass a transaction that will actually go through, making us have more solid, more good random calls. So let's try to run this function now. Great, successful, but we ran into an error, right? Let's see what the error is. So it deposited collateral, U U256, U256, with this huge collateral seed uh, and nothing. So it looks like we failed here. It's clear, let's rerun it with dash VVVV so we can see a little bit of output of why we actually failed. Okay, we ran, we still, the only function we're calling is deposit to collateral. Looks like this failed again. We called deposit collateral with some weird args. We could scroll up and see exactly why we failed Oh, we ran to this. DSC engine needs more than zero. So it looks like we tried to deposit zero collateral. Um, amount collateral was zero. Yep, okay, so, yep. so we tried to call with zero. So amount collateral was zero. So we know that this is gonna fail. So how can we make it so that this doesn't fail? Or maybe you're like, hey, like sometimes it will be zero, like whatever. I, I just want a sanity check. You can make fail and revert false, right? And we can run this again. And now we'll see how often this actually fails. Hopefully we cut down on the amount of times it failed. Oops, let's remove those Vs. Great, it actually, it does look like we cut down on the amount of reverts we got. Not a lot, but we, we did cut down on the amount of reverts at least by adding this bounding of the collateral types. But let's keep cutting down on these reverts and potentially even have revert on false be true. Right, you're not always gonna have revert on false be able to be true. And sometimes it's quicker just to have it false and write all your invariants and stuff. But if you want kind of, but it's good to aim for this. Now the downside of always aiming for this is that if you make your handler too specific, maybe you'll actually narrow it down and remove edge cases that would break the system that are valid, right? So it's kind of this balancing game you have to play with these fuzzing tests and whether fail and revert to be true or false. There's definitely a little bit of an art to this. So the more you do it, the better you'll get. But in any case, collateral seed, amount collateral, we need to now change it so that this amount collateral is bounded between one and some max number, right? So we don't want this to be able to be zero. So what we can do then instead is we can actually, we actually can bound this. So that in the same way we got a valid collateral, let's get a valid amount collateral. So we can say amount collateral equals bound. This is a function that actually comes with STD utils and it bounds the result to an amount. So we wanna say, okay, this amount collateral, we're gonna bound our amount collateral to being between one, we don't want it to be zero, and then some like really, really big number. What I like to do is up here in the state variables, I'll do u in 256, max deposit size equals, and I'll do type uint, 96 dot max. And this allows us to get the max uint 96 value. Why are we not doing the max uint 256? 
Well, if we do the max U in 256 and we try to deposit more collateral later, if you do the max U in 256 plus one, you'll get a revert. So this is going to give us a really, really, really big number, but we're at least not going to hit the absolute top of amount of deposits we can deposit. So we're going to say we're going to bound this amount collateral between one and max deposit size. Okay, cool. So let's put this back to false. Let's run this test again, and let's see if we cut down on the reverts some more. Aha, a couple more, right? Only a few hundred, but we did cut down on the amount of reverts. Why? Because we're passing valid. Well, okay, that one didn't go so well, but we are cutting down on the amount of reverts piece by piece. We're able to bound the collateral, but there's more. If we do, fail on revert back to true, we can see exactly why it's failing, right? We'll do dash VV VV. We can see an example that is indeed failing. And whoa, these are getting more intricate, right? Before it was just a single call was breaking it. Oh, okay, so a single call still is breaking it, but they are getting a little bit more intricate. So it looks like this one failed because what? We called deposit collateral. We scroll up, we're getting this insufficient allowance. Oh, okay, so that's why we actually weren't cutting down on the reverts at all because we're getting insufficient allowance. Of course, we need to approve the protocol to deposit this collateral. So of course this is breaking. This is always gonna break. So let's do a little prankage. So we'll do vm.startprank. We'll just do message.sender and we'll, we'll allow this message sender to mint some of this collateral so that they can actually deposit it, right? So we can set this up so that whoever's calling deposit collateral actually has the collateral and actually will approve to deposit the collateral. So, and this is why I'm using this ERC20 mock so that we can actually mint some of this collateral. So we'll do collateral.mint message.sender amount collateral. We'll do collateral collateral.approve address DSCE for the amount collateral. Then we can deposit it and then we'll do vm.stop prank. Okay. Now let's clear this. Let's have revert on false to be false. And let's see now if we cut down on the amount of reverts that we get. Oh, and I added too many Vs. Let's get rid of those. Let's run this again. And yep, there will be some brief delays in here, of course. Whoa, we cut the amount of reverts down to zero. Now all of our function calls are passing, which means every single run was a valid run, meaning we're using our runs much more wisely. We're not wasting runs on failed reverts. So now I can even set this to true, run this again, and we'll see this passes and none of our runs failed, right? So this means, what does this mean from a security standpoint? It means that no matter how often we call deposit collateral, no matter how much we deposit our collateral, we will never make this invariant false, which isn't saying too much because of course, we're not even, the total supply is always zero. Of course this holds. So this makes a lot of sense. So let's actually keep writing more functions to do more with the system, but set them up so that Whenever we call them, they're always going to be valid calls, okay? So now we're talking about redeem collateral, right? Okay, cool. So now there's actually, now we actually have a function, a valid function to deposit collateral. Now let's actually have a valid function to redeem collateral. So we're going to do the same thing. Function redeem collateral. Collateral. We're going to do the same thing. It's going to take a unit six collateral seed for which collateral to redeem, you and 256 amount collateral. So we have public, and we're gonna do something very similar here. We're gonna say, we're only gonna choose a valid collateral by saying ERC20 mock collateral equals underscore get collateral from seed, collateral seed. And now we should only allow people to redeem the maximum amount they have in the system, right? So we're going to say uint256 max collateral collateral to redeem equals DSC engine engine dot get total get collateral balance 
of user. Do we have this function? DSC engine. So this is one that I added in. It's going to get the collateral balance of a user if you pass in the user and the token. So if you want to pause and add this in, feel free to do so. Get collateral balance of user, where we add the address of the collateral and the uh, message sender. So it's going to get the total balance of a user. Oh, and this should be DSCE. And then we're going to bound the amount collateral to this max amount that they have. To make these always valid, they should only be redeeming as much as they put in the system. Amount collateral equals bound amount collateral. Uh, we're going to say redeem between one and the max collateral to redeem because we don't want them to redeem zero, of course. And then we're going to say, oh, it's going to be public. Then we're going to say DSCE dot redeem collateral address collateral and amount collateral, right? So now we have two functions to randomly call. So we're going to be depositing collateral and redeeming collateral. Let's run this invariant. It only has two functions it could call. We go to the foundry.toml, fail and revert is true. Oh, and it looks like we found an edge case. So now we can read this and see what it's doing. So it's depositing some collateral, 1381 and 82, and then it's redeeming the collateral. Hmm. I'm actually sure what's going on. So let's add this dash VVVV to see more into the actual transaction that's failing. Oh, my goodness, we got an even bigger one here. So what are we saying? Oh, max is less than the min. Oh, looks like I'm messing up with my bounding. So it's not even really an issue. So if we go back to the handler, bound max collateral, one max collateral to redeem. Ah, okay. So if max collateral to redeem is zero, this will break. So we actually do need to keep zero in here. And then we can just say if, you know, amount collateral equals equals zero, we could say if it's zero return, or what we could do is we could use this keyword called assume, like vm.assume, which will say, if the Boolean expression value is to false, the fuzzler will discard the current fuzz inputs and start a new fuzz run. So we're gonna do if the amount collateral is zero, just return, don't call this function, right? Because this is going to fail. So let's go ahead and run this again now. Compiler unsuccessful. Well, would you look at that? We are now passing again. So people can, if we go back to the handler, people can now redeem collateral and all of these redeemings are going to be valid. And all of these deposits are going to be valid, right? They can only redeem valid redemption amounts. Now here's where this fail and revert equals true is can be a little bit deceptive. Let's say right now we're only letting you redeem the max collateral to redeem. Let's say there was a bug where a user can redeem more than they have. This fuzz test wouldn't catch this. It's because we have this fail and revert is true. If this fail and revert was false and we didn't have this line, right? And we just said this is the max deposit size. This is a test where we might actually catch that bug, right? And if we run this now, oh, and with fail and revert is false, we are going to get a whole bunch of reverts. We are going to get bad transactions. However, and you can see, we can see the number of reverts over here, and it actually is way less than it was before, which is awesome. And if we run it again, still way less than 8,000, which is what it was before. But if we have fail and revert false, we can actually catch this. So the Foundry team is actually working on allowing some tests to be fail and revert and some tests to be not fail and revert. So you can kind of pick which one for which functions instead of kind of having to blanket everything. So just keep in mind the dangers here, okay? Of always defaulting to fail and revert equals true, okay? They have their trade-offs. And if you do fail and revert equals false, you can sometimes write these handlers a lot quicker. But okay, so we have some stuff here. We can deposit collateral, we can redeem collateral. What else? So we probably should figure out a way to get some total supply, right? So what we're gonna do is now we're gonna finally make our mint function. So function mint DSC, public like, like this. And what do we wanna put in here? Well, if we go to the DSC engine, Go to mint DSC. 
go to this mint DSC function, it takes an amount of DSC to mint. So we'll do the same thing. We'll say uint256 amount, and that's it. We'll mint a random amount. So in here, of course, we can't have amount be a number of things, right? We can't have it be zero, and they would need to not have their health factor be broken. So we're gonna say amount equals bound amount one, and let's say max deposit size. And then additionally, this amount better be more than the value of the system, right? Because we have this revert if health factor is broken. But maybe I don't even want to do that narrowing down. Maybe I just say screw it. I'm going to make revert on false, revert on fail on revert false. And I'm just going to leave it like that because I'm nervous that I'm going to narrow it down too much. So then maybe I just go screw it. VM.start prank message.sender. And we call in the DSC engine mint DSC, DSCE dot mint DSC, and the amount. And then VM dot stop prank. And this is where actually you'll see sometimes some people will have continue on revert and a fail on revert. Fail on revert. See people, some people can have two types of folders. Continue on revert is going to be the quicker, looser tests where it might look like this. The fail on revert is going to make sure that every single transaction that you run your invariant test suite on is going to pass. I personally think it's good to have both. When I'm writing invariant tests, I actually start with the continue on revert because they're faster. Oftentimes you can find bugs as long as you narrow down them enough. So for now, let's go ahead. Let's have this be false. See if we can find any issues like this. So we'll go up, up. So we'll run forge test dash M. I'm just going to run this invariant test. Boom. Let's see if we get any issues here. We'll see how many reverts we get as well. We got a similar amount of reverts, which is good. Similar amount of calls, which is all right. And then actually, if we do dash VV, we can even see the console.logs at the end. It looks like it hasn't found a way to mint more tokens than collateral in the system. Oh, and even it looks like the last run, it ended with a total supply of zero, right? But maybe I'm paranoid. Let's actually go back to true and let's just stay true for the rest of the rest of this. But like I said, I think it's good to have both types of tests. Anyways, handler. So this mint DSC, we should only be able to mint DSC if the amount is less than the collateral. So what we can do is we can call this get account information, which gets the total collateral value in USD and total DSC minted and make sure that we're always going to mint less than the collateral value that we have. So we can say, we can actually just copy these two, paste it in here, equals DSCE dot, copy this function, paste, message dot sender. So we're gonna get the total DSC minted, collateral value in USD. And what we can do is we can say, we'll just have them always mint the max DSC they can mint. So we'll say UN256 max DSC, to mint equals collateral value in USD. We could say the collateral value in USD divided by two minus the total DSC minted better be greater than zero, right? Better not be a negative number. So we can even do like an int 256. And then if this is negative, then we're just gonna return. Otherwise, we're gonna say amount, we're gonna equals bound this again say amount zero comma max DSC to mint. And then we're also gonna say if amount equals zero, we're gonna return. Oops, and then actually we need to grab this start prank, put this down here. That's all we need to do. And we should probably just grab these, put them down here. We don't need both of these. So we just need this, I think. Yeah, we don't need both of these. We only need one of these. So we'll do UN250, we'll convert this back to a UN256. And if amount is zero, return. This looks pretty good to me. Let's see if we made this actually work. Let's run this. And now we can mint DSC. Successful. And bada boom. So we have some calls. We have no reverts. This is great. But I keep getting total supply is zero down here. So we have plenty of weth, plenty of wrapped Bitcoin. 
are we ever calling this function? Hmm. We keep getting a total supply of zero down here. Why is that? How can we figure out if our mint DSC is actually getting called? Let's first off see if this mint DSC is even being called. We can use something called a ghost variable to track this. So in here, up at the top, we'll make a function called uint256 times mint is called. We'll make this a public variable. And at the bottom of mint DSC, we'll do times mint is called plus. Now, back in our invariants, we do a console.log times mint called, comma, handler dot times mint called. And then we'll run our test again oops, with dash VV. And we can see, oh, mint is actually never called. How is that possible? Well, it must be because one of these returns is hitting and it's not finishing this call. So we could keep moving this up to figure out where it's actually being called and to continue to debug this. But I already know how to debug this, of course, because I've done this a while. If you want, take this as a challenge for you to answer the question, why is this never being called? Why is time spent being called never being called? Why is it never finishing? So feel free to pause the video, try to debug this yourself and find out. And then I'll tell you the technique that I used to debug this and figure out why this Mint DSC was never being finished. All right, welcome back. Did you actually pause the video? Did you actually try to figure it out? If you didn't, I'm giving you a second chance. Pause the video, go find out. Pause the video and take this as your opportunity to try to debug, okay, why is this not getting hit? Why is this line not hitting? Welcome back. Now, there's a couple different ways that I used to actually debug this. One of them was having this times mint called plus equals one and then moving it up so I found the line that it was breaking on. Once I found the line that it was breaking on, I console.logged all the values of the different variables around. One of the most important variables that I dumped was going to be the message.sender. So when you're working with invariants, remember it's going to call this contract with a ton of different functions and a ton of different calls. However, it's also going to call them with random addresses as well. So in order for us to mint DSC, we need to only mint DSC with an address that has actually deposited collateral because it's impossible for someone to mint DSC without them depositing collateral. Now, again, if we restrict this function like this, maybe there is a case where you can mint DSC without depositing any collateral that we don't know about. This is again why it's important to have some open invariant tests, some continue on revert, and some fail on revert as well. So if we want to have this be fail on revert, we would need to only pick a message that sender that has some deposited collateral. So what we can do is actually keep track of people who have deposited collateral, and then when we go to mint, we just choose an address from somebody who already has deposited. So how can we do that? Well, we can just keep track of an array of addresses that have collateral deposited. So up at the top, well, let's actually keep this times mint is called, and we'll put it at the bottom, times mint is called plus plus. And this way, we know how to test this, right? If times mint is called increases, we've known, we will know that we fixed the actual issue. So times mint is called plus plus, at the top, we'll do a address array, public users with collateral deposited. We'll copy this address. And now in deposit collateral, users with collateral deposited dot push message dot sender. Now there's some caveats here. This will double push, obviously, some people. So this will double push. If the same addresses push twice, but for now, let's just keep it simple and let's go ahead and just leave it like this. We probably should check to see if someone has already deposited collateral, but whatever, we're gonna go with this for now because it's simple. And then now in our mint DSC, we can do something similar to what we did with collateral. So we'll do a underscore 
you went to 256, address seed. And instead of bounding to message.sender, what we can do is we can say address sender equals users with collateral deposited. It's going to be the index of the users with collateral deposited of address seed mod users with collateral deposited dot length. And now, now instead of message.sender, we're going to use sender in here. And same thing with down here, we're going to use sender. Now let's run this and see if Mint is ever actually called. Aha, so this was very helpful. Let's do dash VV, VV. Ah, okay, so at least we're getting something different here, right? We're getting an error, division or module by zero. Ah, okay, of course we're getting module by zero. Because if the collateral length is zero, then obviously sender is going to be zero. So we can do if users with collateral dot length equals equals zero, then we're going to return. We're going to skip this one. So let's run this again. Ah, okay. So we're getting some stuff passing. Let's actually just do it two V's so that it's easier to read than all those events. Aha, total times mint was called is now 31 and we're getting a total supply. So our mint DSC function in our handler is now actually working. We're now successfully calling mint DSC and it looks like our protocol is holding up. All right, it's fantastic. So we're getting closer to building this handler to actually have a solid recreation of all the possible functions we can actually do in this system. Something I didn't show you was we should pretty much always use a given invariant called function invariant getters should not revert like this. And then we just put in here all of our invariants like DSCE dot get liquidation bonus, DSCE dot get precision, etc. Put all of our getters in here. And oh, and this could be public view. And if any of these revert, then this will fail. This invariant test will call a ton of different functions on the handler. And if any of the function combinations break any of our getters, we know we broke an invariant. This is a layup invariant that everyone should always 100% include. A way to make sure that you're including everything is you can run something called forge inspect DSC engine methods, and it'll print out all the different methods that this function has in addition to its function selectors. So you can kind of use this as your checklist of all the different functions you can call on a contract and you can look for all the view functions in here. This is additionally why it's great to have get in front of these words because it becomes very easy to figure out which ones are getters. But it doesn't reflect the whole world, right? One of the other really fantastic things we can do with the handler is we can both handle our DSC engine, but any other contract that we want to simulate for as well. And there's a lot of things we want to take in mind when writing these, especially the other contracts that we interact with. What are some of the other contracts that we interact with? Well, one of them is going to be the price feed. One of them is going to be the WETH token, the wrapped Bitcoin token. So our handler should probably also show people doing random weird things with WETH and wrapped Bitcoin right? Because people are going to do random weird things with both of these tokens. And we want to make sure our system can work with them appropriately. Now I'm actually going to skip them for now. But I am 100% going to do one with price feeds, because price feeds are definitely a system that can change and definitely a system that greatly affects our protocol. So we're going to include price feed updates in our handler. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and do import the mock v3 aggregator from dot dot slash dot dot slash mocks slash mock v3 aggregator dot soul or where is this located oh just one like this okay and this mock v3 aggregator has some functions that allow us to just easily update an answer right which is what something that we want to do we want our protocol to be able to easily update answers so we'll take this mock v3 aggregator and let's at least get the WETH price 
from our system. So I have a view function, dsce.get collateral token price feed, and I'll pass the address with, oops. And I'll say ETH, and I'll make another variable, mock v3 aggregator, public ETH USD price feed. I'll say ETH USD price feed equals this. And we just got to wrap this up as a mock v3 aggregator like this. And great. Now we have an ETH USD price feed. And now we can add a new function in here. So we have mint DSC, deposit collateral, redeem collateral. We can add a new one called function update collateral price. We'll do a uint 96 just so that the number isn't too big, new price. And then we could also randomize the collateral, but for now, we'll just have it be the ETH USD. So we need to convert the uint 96 to an int 256, new price, int equals int 256, new price, because price feeds take int 256s. Oops, sorry, this should be in. And to convert a uint 96 to an int 256, we actually have to wrap it as a uint 256 first, and then to an int 96. Dot update answer, or set price, or whatever we want to do to this new price, like this. Boom. And now, simple as that, we have an update collateral price, well, an update ETH price anyways. So now we can do three things in our system. We can update the price, redeem collateral, deposit collateral, and mint DSC. So before we actually run this, what do you think? Do you think we'll get an error? What do you think will go on? Let's run this. Oh, it looks like it found a sequence. It found an issue. The reason, assertion violated, which means that our invariant here was broken. The WETH value plus Bitcoin value now is no longer the total supply. So let's scroll up. Let's see what the issue is here. All the way past everything. And if we read the sequence, we can figure out why this broke. We can see exactly what happened. Okay, so first it called deposit collateral. Okay, cool. So it deposited some collateral. And then we minted some DSC. Okay, cool. We minted some DSC with some stuff here. And then we updated the collateral price to 471. So as we know, our handler update collateral price, if we scroll all the way to the bottom, update collateral price 471 updates the ETH collateral from $2,000, which is 2000 E8 to 471. So this remember is 2000, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It went from this to 471. So of course it reverted, right? Because people minted a ton of collateral, they deposited collateral, they minted a ton of DSC, right? Look at this input, it's massive. And the system broke. And if we run this again with fewer Vs, right, VV, we'll be able to see that total supply. If we scroll up, we'll be able to see the WETH value wrap Bitcoin value and the total supply here. So actually it looks like in this one, it set the new price to three. So obviously the WETH value is probably zero or just about zero. It let them mint DSC because originally the collateral was, wor was worth something and now it's worth almost nothing, right? So this is a, an important thing for us to take in mind in our system. Hey, if the price drops or spikes quickly, our system is screwed. Our system is busted. And this is something we would want to know about and potentially go back in our code and fix. Hey, what do we do when the price plummets in a single block? Right now, we have kind of this assumption in here where we have this liquidation 10% bonus and the collateral always needs to be 200% over collateralized. With this, we're saying, okay, between 200% over collateralization and one 10% over collateralization, as long as our system is within this, it's still safe. I mean, obviously it's better if it's above this, but as long as our system is within this, it's still safe. But if the price plummets of some collateral, and let's say that's the only collateral, maybe we get to 50% collateralization rate, and that would break our entire system, right? That would break our invariant, 
our system will be screwed. So we can go back to the drawing board, figure out how to smooth this out, or we can say this is a known bug. If the price fluctuates or explodes too quickly or too slowly, this protocol becomes worthless. And that's kind of not a great solution, right? So these are things we absolutely want to keep in mind. And these are things that we can find with invariant tests. And this is why they're so important. So for now, in our handler, I'm actually just going to even comment this out because it does break our test suite. But I'm going to put a little comment here. This breaks our invariant test suite. And this would 100% be something that shows up in a smart contract audit saying, hey, if the price of an asset plummets too quickly, the system's breaking because it breaks the invariant. All right, great. Now, there's a few more things I want to teach. Only a few, and then we're done with this section. We're going to teach, one, some proper Oracle use. And then two, we would need to write more tests, which we're not going to do. I'm going to leave that to you. But we have a whole bunch of other contracts in here, like the decentralized stablecoin. And then three, some smart contract audit preparedness. So smart contract audit preparation. So let's start with some Oracle proper use. So in our DSC engine, we're of course using an Oracle, right? We're using Chainlink price feeds. Now, this is kind of an assumption that we have in our protocol right now. A, price feeds are just going to work. But price feeds are a system just like anything else. And we should add some checks in our code here just to make sure that if this breaks or if something in here breaks, our system isn't broken. So what we're going to do is we're actually use that library methodology we made years ago to write some checks on this price feed. So I'm going to make a libraries folder. And we're going to make a new contract in here called Oracle lib salt. And what we want to do is we want to check to make sure that these prices aren't stale. If we click on any one of these prices like ETH USD, let's scroll up to show more details more details. You can see they have this heartbeat where a new price should show up at least every 3600 seconds. I believe what this is, right? Yes. On the Sepolia testnet. We want to write some checks to make sure that this is actually updating every 3600 seconds. And if it's not, we should probably pause the functionality of our contract. So we're going to make a SPDX license identifier MIT pragma solidity like this. We're going to do a library, Oracle lib, and let's put a little nat spec to explain what this is going to do. Say at title, Patrick Collins, oops, title, Oracle lib, at author, Patrick Collins, at notice, this library is used to check the chain link Oracle for stale. If a price is stale, the function will revert and render the DSCE engine unusable. This is by design. So we're going to say, hey, if a chain link price feed is stale, just stop. Don't let anything happen. Because if a price is wrong, if a price is bad, our whole protocol is kind of bunked, right? So we want to just freeze everything. So we want the DSC engine to freeze if prices become stale. So if the chain link network explodes and you have a lot of money locked in the protocol, too bad. <laughs> this is something that's going to be a known issue, right? If the chain link network blows up and all the prices become stale, eh, you're kind of screwed, right? And maybe this is something we want to account for. But for now, I'm just going to say that's a known issue and we're going to move on. And this is where you'll see me start to get more and more partic particular about stuff. This is where, as we get more and more advanced, this is where the details start to matter more and more, right? All those little little things that I kind of gloss over, they become to, they start to become more and more important as this becomes closer and closer to a real production product that should go to audit, right? So let's create a stale price check function. So we'll create a function, stale price check. And we'll have this stale price check be on an aggregator v3 interface So I'm actually going to copy this, paste it in here, toggle the word wrap. 
And so as an input parameter, it's going to take aggregated v3 interface, price feed. This will be a public view, which will returns a uint 80, int 256, uint 256, uint 256, and a uint 80. The same return value of the latest round data function in an aggregated v3 interface function like this. Uint 80. Okay, cool. And in here, what we're going to do is we're going to call price feed dot latest latest round data. And I'm even just going to cheat a little bit. We're going to control click into this. We're going to copy this line, paste it here equals boom, just so I don't have to type as much. Cool, we have all those. And what we're going to say in here, and we're probably not even going to use all these, we're going to have some stale check, right? So each one of these price feeds has their own heartbeat. So we probably should ask them what their heartbeat is, but I'm just going to hard code it for this one. I'm going to say uint 256 private constant timeout equals three hours. And this is a constant in Solidity. It stands for three times 60 minutes times 60 seconds equals uh, this many seconds. So looks like this heartbeat is actually much longer than the one the chain link should allow. So 360 seconds is 3600 seconds is just one hour, right? We're going to give it three hours. So what we're going to say in here is we're going to say, first, we're going to do a unit of six seconds since equals block dot timestamp. And then we'll have, uh, excuse me, minus updated app. And then we'll say, so this will get the current block timestamp minus this updated app. So this should basically get us the seconds since this price sheet was updated. Then we'll say if seconds since is greater than our timeout, then we're going to revert with a new error. Error. Oracle lib underscore underscore stale price. Like this. Revert with stale price. And then we're just going to return all of this stuff. So return. Round ID, answer, started at, updated at, answered around. And I'm going to change this name to stale check latest round data. Now, what we can do, since this is a library on our price feed, we can use this stale check latest round data to automatically check to see if the price is stale. So now in our DSC engine, Anytime we call latest round data, we just swap it out for stale check latest round data. So long as at the top we go after our errors, we're going to put our types. So after the errors, we're going to put types. And so this is where we would do using Oracle lib or aggregator v3 interface. We need to import Oracle lib. Let's import Oracle lib from there's going to be dot slash libraries, libraries, slash Oracle lib, that's all like this. And now, yep, any place we use latest round data, we can now use stale check latest round data where we have this stale check baked in. And cool. Now we did a ton of refactoring. Let's run forge test just to run this whole test suite, including the invariant test suite. Okay, and stuff's looking good here. And you can see that it even took a lot of extra time to run this last bit. So cool. So we've we got a little check here. Great. We're not going to write some more tests. This is something that you should 100% do. If we pull up our terminal here, we run forge coverage. What do you think we get? At this, which you can see there's a whole bunch of contracts that we need to test. This Oracle lib could probably use its own test suite, even though it's looking like a lot of it's tested. We probably should definitely test this ourselves. We need to write tests for this. We probably want to test our, uh, our DSC some more for sure. So we should definitely write some more tests. I'm going to leave that to you. With this little little finger here. And then finally, some smart contract audit preparation. 
So we talked a little bit about what a smart contract audit is. And we haven't covered a whole lot of security stuff yet. We're going to do that later in the course. But a solid place you can look is this audit readiness checklist from the nascent XYZ GitHub repo, which has a lot of different things that you should and keep in mind when running your tests. For those of you looking to be really serious about actually launching a protocol and really having the security mindset that you need as well, be sure to get to this last section in the course about intro to security, because this is where we're going to give you a lot of that lower level security stuff, at least from a smart contract developer perspective. We're going to give you all the basics that you need to be aware of in order to stay secure. So we're not going to talk about it too much in this one, but it is something that if we were to actually launch this, we would need to keep in mind. So I'll put a little soon emoji here for coming very soon. All right. So with that all being said, we've done an absolute ton here. This is 1000% a project you should push up to your GitHub repo. And this is 1000% a project that if you made it this far, you should be incredibly proud of yourself. This is the hardest, most complicated, most advanced project in this course. And to be honest, probably the most advanced project you'll work on in almost all of Web3. There is so much going on here. We learned about DeFi. We learned about advanced state-of-the-art modern fuzzing techniques. We learned a tiny, tiny bit about security. We used oracles in a safer way. We wrote this crazy, amazing test suite. We wrote deploy scripts for this. We wrote, we interacted with a couple different libraries. We learned about this fail on revert, runs, depths, and variants. The only thing we didn't do was write a proper readme, which you 100% should write a proper readme. And if you want, you can check out the Foundry DeFi stablecoin readme to see how it actually works, of course. Even for me, this was a long, difficult project for me to build because there's just so much to think about. Like I said, this is a project that I am planning on getting audited. So what you're gonna see in this repo is you're gonna see kind of this main branch, which is what you're gonna be working on, but I'm, but I'm additionally gonna make a new branch called like audited or post audit or something like that. And if you wanna follow and watch this GitHub repo, you can see the progress and you can see the audit reports that come out on here so that you can be intimately familiar with this code base already because you wrote some of the code and then also see as it progresses through its security journey. And for those of you who are looking to actually release production code, you definitely need to be at least aware of how security works and the security paths that your code should take. But all right, with all of this being said, you know what time it is. It's time for you to get a break. You deserve it. You should 100% go take a lap, push this code base up to GitHub, and actually clean it up a little bit. I'm gonna be cleaning this up a little bit before I push the rest of it to this GitHub repo. So you should clean it up a little bit, make it yours, make it the way that you wanna make it. Maybe even improve on it, right? We saw with the invariant test that there is at least one other glaring issue with this protocol. If the price of the assets collapse too quickly, our protocol becomes insolvent. So maybe you come up with a method to fix it. And then maybe you launch your own stablecoin. Why not, right? In any case, good luck to you. Take that break. We only have, we're getting so close. We only have one, two, three more lessons. And these ones are actually easier than the one we just did. We're gonna learn about upgrades and proxies. We're gonna learn about governance. And then we're gonna do an introduction to smart contract security. These are much easier than everything you've done so far. So. Take the break, give yourself a pat on the back, be incredibly excited, celebrate this win. This is a huge achievement getting this far, and I'll see you very soon. Three more left. And as a bonus piece of content here, another one of the reasons that I absolutely love the Aave protocol and the Aave team is that they're just shipping protocols and shipping amazing products and features and services for the Web3 community. One of those protocols is something called Lens Protocol, which is a decentralized social layer or a decentralized social platform for building social medias. 
So to give us some information about this, we have the head of DevRel for Lens Protocol on the Aave team, Nader Dabit, to talk a little bit more about Lens. Hi, my name is Nader Dabit. I wanted to give you a quick introduction to Lens Protocol and why it might be interesting to you as a smart contract or Solidity engineer. Lens is the social layer of Web3. It allows developers to build social applications or to implement social features into their existing applications. There are 4.9 billion people in the world today already using social applications. So these types of apps provide a use case that people already know, understand, and value. They also present a wide variety of value propositions and opportunities for developers to take advantage of and build on. And with Web3 features like native payments, ownership, and composability also provide a lot of primitives to build on that were not available with traditional social applications or infrastructure. Lens allows developers to extend the core smart contracts by building out their own custom modules. This would be similar to as if Twitter, Instagram, or other social applications allowed developers to send pull requests into their backends and APIs. This opens the door to a lot of interesting and powerful functionality that we're seeing developers integrate into their applications, build out new different ideas, but also integrate into other parts of Web3 like DeFi. In addition to that, you can call Lens smart contracts from other smart contracts. So if you'd like to build out something that is composable with the Web3 social graph, Lens is a great place to integrate. If you want to get started building on Lens, check out the docs at docs.lens.xyz and be sure to check out how to deploy the protocol on your own so you can check out the smart contract code and play around with it and also look at how to build out and create your own custom modules. Thanks for checking this out. Okie dokie. Alrighty. Welcome back. You may have noticed that my voice has got slightly higher and less caramelly and that's because I am Kira, not Patrick, and I am going to be taking you through the next section of this course. So for this project, we are going to be exploring Merkle trees and signatures to build our very own airdrop contract. Let me take you through the code and what we are going to be learning very quickly before we get started. So first of all, what is an airdrop? So essentially, as you can see from my awful drawing here, an airdrop in the context of blockchains is where a token development team send or allow people to claim tokens. These tokens can be any type of token, so ERC20s, ERC1155s, ERC721s, but in this section, we will be creating an ERC20 airdrop. These tokens are gifted or given to usually for free, aside from the gas fees, certain wallets. So normally there's some kind of eligibility criteria such as having developed on their protocol on GitHub or maybe they're part of the community or the like. And this helps to bootstrap the project. So usually there is going to be some kind of list of addresses which are able to claim tokens. Let's walk through this code base very quickly. So if you head inside source, then you'll be able to see the bagel token. And this is the ERC20 token that we are going to be airdropping. And it's a very minimal ERC20 token, similar to what we have done before. And then back in source, you can see this Merkle airdrop contract. And this contract is going to be using Merkle proofs to prove that an address is eligible to claim. It's going to implement a claim function to allow people to receive the airdrop, but it's also gonna allow anyone to call claim so that allowed addresses can receive the airdrop without paying for the gas fees but we are also going to implement signatures to prevent people from receiving airdrops that they actually didn't want to claim. So we're going to finally learn what this V, R and S mean, how to validate signatures, how to create signatures and everything to do with signatures. We are also going to create some scripts to generate our Merkle tree, to generate the proofs and the root hash and also to deploy the contracts and interact with them. We will be taking a small segue into, of course, Merkle trees and Merkle proofs, signatures, ECDSA, what the heck does that mean? And also transaction types. So buckle up because this is gonna be a big one. I'm going to show you a brief demo on a ZK Sync local chain running in Docker. However, you're not expected to run a local ZK Sync Docker node if you don't want. So I'm going to run this script just to show you what we are going to be building. So I'm initializing a ZK Sync local node. I then deploy my bagel token contract. I deploy a Merkle airdrop contract. I then sign a message to allow someone else to be able to call claim for me and give them permission to be able to call claim so I can receive the airdrop tokens. 
I then create some initial supply of my tokens. I send it to the airdrop contract to be able to issue to all of the claimers. I then claim the tokens on behalf of the claiming address. So the function is called by another person so that they can pay for the gas using my signature that I created. And then the address receives the airdrop tokens and we can see a nice little balance here. Now that might sound confusing, but as we walk through things, I hope things will become more clear. So now that we are airdrop experts and we know exactly why we are going to want to airdrop our tokens, let's go ahead and make a project to airdrop our special tokens to some users that we specify. So the first thing that we need to do is to create a repository to create our project into. So I'm going to do a little MKDIR Merkle. And um, you might be thinking right now, what does this word Merkle mean? You may have seen it in the project overview, but we will explain what this means in a second. So then I'm going to navigate inside this repo and then I'm going to make sure that I'm on the regular version of Foundry rather than the ZK version of Foundry by running a Foundry up. Okie dokie, Artichoke. And now we're going to open this up in our VS code. Now you can see that we've got an empty repository and we can run forge in it to initialize an empty Foundry project in our repo. We can go ahead and delete these usual files as we have done so, or Patrick has done so every other time. So delete, delete, and delete. And then we are going to make a new file. We're going to call it Merkle airdrop .sol. Oop, airdrip. And then we're going to do the usual SPDX license identifier MIT pragma solidity 0.8 point. And as I'm recording this, the most recent is 25, but I'm going to use 24. And then contract Merkle airdrop like this. So what do we want to do in here? So I want to have some list of addresses and then I want to be able to allow someone in the list to claim tokens. So I'm also going to need to create a token contract. So I am actually going to create a token called bagel token because I don't know about you, but bagels are pretty good. I am a big fan of bagels. So the very first thing we need to do is we need to create these tokens for people to be able to claim. So we're going to do the very, very same. We can go again, SPDX, license, identify MIT, and then we can use Pragma Solidity 0.8.24. And then I'm going to do contract bagel token. And then I don't want those comments this time. So what we're going to do is we're going to use Open Zeppelin to create our ERC20 token to airdrop to our list of addresses. So these want to be ERC20 tokens. First of all, I'm going to just run a forge import. Oh, sorry, forge install. So the next thing I need to do is I need to install Open Zeppelin. So I need to run forge install open Zeppelin, open, open Zeppelin slash open Zeppelin dash contracts, no dash commit. In the Foundry Tommel, we can just create a remapping. Remappings equals open square brackets. And then we can do at open then slash contracts slash equals lib, oops, lib slash dash contracts slash contracts. And I think I did a back tick here. I did. That needs to be a single quote. Okay, so let me just check that remapping. Yep, that's all good. So now we have our remapping in place, we can head back to bagel token. And now we need to import ERC20 from Zeppelin slash contract slash token slash ERC20 slash ER20.sol. Thank you very much, Copilot. And then we are also going to import the ownable. Oops, I did have it there for a second. We're also going to import Ownable from Open Zeppelin as well, because we want our contract to have an owner so that they can mint tokens to whoever they choose, etc. So our bagel token is ERC20 and Ownable. Again, thank you, Copilot. Now we need to have our constructor and we do want it to inherit from ERC20, like it's saying. We actually also do want a mint function so that we have the ability to mint, but actually we don't want this initial supply. So we do want a mint function. So we do want to be able to mint tokens to people like the owner to be able to mint tokens to whoever they choose, but we don't want this initial supply. So we can remove that. And so here we need, yes, we do need to pass some constructor params to the ERC20 constructor. And then we also need to pass the message sender 
to the ownable constructor. And this is just saying that whoever deploys the contract is going to be the owner of this contract. And so that is it. We have now our very, very simple bagel token contract. And so if we head back to our airdrop contract, now in our tests or when we're deploying, we'll be able to use this bagel token. And actually what we're going to probably do is we're going to pass it through to the constructor of our airdrop contract. We're going to want this contract to be adaptable for any ERC20 of our choosing. So we want to be able to pass in whatever ERC20 we choose. Let's say I was the owner of USDC. I want to be able to airdrop USDC to my trusted, loved followers. Or maybe I'm an artist and I have my artist token and I want to airdrop my artist tokens to the holders of my NFTs. I'm going to want a contract that I can pass this ESC20 through. So I'm not going to hard, hard code it. But before we do that, let's just have a think about how we're going to airdrop our tokens to our list of addresses. Now you may think maybe I'm going to have some kind of address array and these are going to be like my claimers. And then I'm going to say, yep, this is my address. And then I'm going to make some function claim, which is going to be external. And then it's going to do something like for I, and then it's going to be like, blah, 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 like claimers.length check some past an address. So address, um, some account and I'm going to check the account is in the claimers. However, there's a problem with this. The problem with this is that each time someone claims, we're going to have to loop through this array. Now, what happens if this array is super, super long? What happens if I've got hundreds of claimers? You can imagine that the gas to call this function is going to be extortionate. I'm going to have at some point some kind of DOS, denial of service, where someone calls this function and they're going to run out of gas because they're going to be looping through a mahoosive array. So in order to solve this problem, we are going to use Merkle proofs. Now, what are Merkle proofs? Essentially, Merkle proofs allow us to prove that some piece of data that we want is in fact in a group of data. So if we've got some group of data, like a group of addresses all with an allowed amount, is my address in that group of addresses? Merkle proofs enable us to do this. And Merkle proofs come from Merkle trees and Merkle trees are the data structure that is used here. And now in the next video, we are going to explain this in a little bit more detail because that sounds super duper confusing. So you're going to have to hold tight with me for a second and we will come back once you understand what Merkle trees and Merkle proofs are and then we are going to implement it. Have you ever heard the terms Merkle tree, Merkle proof, root hash? What the heck do all these words mean? Merkle trees are a data structure in computer science. Merkle trees are used to encrypt blockchain data more securely and efficiently. It was invented by Ralph Merkle in 1979. He also happens to be one of the inventors of public key cryptography. In order to understand what a Merkle tree actually is, it's easier to just see a visual representation. This is a Merkle tree. Here you can see at the base of the tree, there are four distinct pieces of data. These are known as the leaves or leaf nodes of the tree. And each one represents the hash of some data. And at the top or the root of the Merkle tree is the root hash. And it's created by hashing all of the individual nodes together as leaf node hashes. So adjacent nodes are hashed together and then the output hashes are also then hashed together in a tree-like structure. A Merkle proof is a way for someone to prove that some data is in one of those leaves to someone who only knows the root hash. For example, if we had some data which we could hash to produce hash one, we could prove that that data was in the Merkle tree. So for example, let's say we had a club where there were different tiers or levels to the club. Maybe we had like a bronze, silver, gold, platinum situation or something like that. And for each of those levels, you have a password to prove you're part of the club. You could create a Merkle tree and then a Merkle proof for someone to be able to prove that they are in a club. So in order to prove that the data in hash one was present in the Merkle tree, or if someone wanted to prove that they were part of a club, all we need to do is provide hash two and hash three, four. So the proof would simply simply be the array of these two hashes. Since we can compute hash one, we can then hash that with hash two to produce hash one, two. And given that hash three, four is in the proof, we can then hash that together with hash one, two to produce the root hash, 
which we can then compare with the expected root hash. And this provides the root verification. Note here that for a successful Merkle proof, you need to provide all sibling nodes at every tree level, which since we were able to calculate these values, we have done. Since secure hashing functions like KKAC256 are used to create the hashes, it's practically impossible to create a hash collision. So the likelihood of two different messages, two different pieces of data, two different inputs creating the same hash is practically impossible and won't happen in practice. Therefore, if you receive a matching root hash in the Merkle proof, you know the item really must have been in the Merkle tree and part of the original root hash calculation. Merkle trees are used in lots of different circumstances, most notably proving smart contract state. For example, they are used in rollups to prove state changes and verify the order of transactions. They are also used in efficient airdropping to prove that a potentially claiming address is part of an allow list of addresses which are able to claim. Using Merkle trees, we can enable some addresses to claim and others not by including the addresses that we want to be able to claim as leaf nodes as part of a Merkle tree. Now you might be thinking, hang on a second, Kira, why would I need Merkle proofs for my airdrop? Can't I just use an array of addresses? And so if we look at this example where we are in fact using an array of addresses, you can see that every time someone calls airdrop, they would have to loop through all of these allowed addresses. Now imagine if this allowed addresses array is extremely long. Maybe thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people are in this allowed address array. At some point, the gas to call this airdrop function is going to exceed the gas limit and it's going to become extremely expensive to call. And loops through unrestricted arrays can lead to a denial of service in which someone is unable to claim the airdrop. Therefore, we need to use Merkle proofs instead. The MerkleProof.Sol smart contract from Open Zeppelin is an easy way to implement Merkle proofs into your smart contracts. Let's take a look quickly at how they implement that. The verify function in this smart contract takes the proof, the Merkle root, and the leaf that we want to verify as inputs. Typically, the root is stored in the smart contract somewhere and the proof will be created off chain. This then calls process proof, which then iterates through each element in the proof array provided. We start by taking each leaf node and then the computed hash is updated at each step by hashing it with the next element in the proof. Note here that hashing two hashes together, it will always take the smaller of the two hashes first. And Open Zeppelin uses KEKAC 256 for the hashing algorithm. Here you can see that they are in fact using assembly, but this is essentially the same as ABI encoding the two values together and then hashing that output. Process proof then returns the computed hash and this is a calculated root which is then compared to the expected root to determine whether the provided leaf was in fact present in the Merkle tree. And that is a very brief summary of Merkle trees and Merkle proofs. Merkle trees are just a cryptographic data structure using hashes and Merkle proofs are just a way of proving that some data is in fact in the tree. And they are often used in airdrops and also verifying state changes in smart contracts and in rollups. And that was a very quick video on Merkle trees and Merkle proofs. Okay, now you understand all about Merkle proofs and Merkle trees, let's go ahead and implement this into our project now. So like I was saying earlier, we are going to want to have a constructor which you can pass in your ERC20 token. Now, the other thing that we're going to want to pass in is the Merkle root because we're gonna need it to be able to compare the proofs and the calculated root hash from the proofs for each user when they try and claim. And when we deploy the contract, we're gonna to wanna to specify what that list of addresses and what the amounts are that each address can claim. And that is going to be defined by the Merkle root. So we're going to define a, our constructor right now. So we've got constructor, and then I'm going to have in here byte 32 Merkle root. Then I'm also going to pass in IERC20. Uh, oops, that's not spelled right. IERC20 drop token. And then in here, I'm going to want to save these values as storage values. So I'm going to have bytes 32 private immutable Merkle root. And then because this is immutable, I want I underscore. And then in here, I can go I underscore Merkle root equals Merkle root. And then actually I underscore airdrop token, which we need to define equals airdrop token. So then I've got IE also 20 private immutable I airdrop token. And then the other thing we need to do is we need to import the IERC20 interface from Open Zeppelin so that we can use the functions on this airdrop token. 
Now we need to create a function in order for our users who are in this allow list, which is defined in our Merkle tree to be able to claim. So we're going to create a claim function. So we've got function claim external. This function is going to take as parameters the address that wants to claim. And this allows other people to be able to claim for us and pay for our gas. uint 256 amount, and this is the amount that we want to try and claim. Bytes 32, call data, because we need to specify where we want to be saving this because it's a bytes 32 array. And arrays, you need to define where they are stored. We're saying this is call data, and we're going to name this Merkle proof. Okay, so we've passed through the account that wants to claim, the amount that they want to claim, and then also an array of the proofs, the intermediate hashes that are required in order to be able to calculate the root. And then we can compare that to the expected root or the actual root. So next we need to calculate using the account and the amount, the hash, which is going to be the leaf node. And this is because this is what our Merkle tree is actually going to look like. And you can see here, these are the values in the Merkle tree. So you have an address and an amount to claim. And in our claim function, we provided an address that would like to claim and an amount that they would like to claim as well. So we need to calculate the leaf hash so that we can use the leaf hash alongside the proofs provided to calculate a root hash, which we can then compare to the expected root hash, which we provided in the constructor of the smart contract. So let's make that right now. So we've got bytes32 leaf equals kerkak 256 ABI encode packed. We don't want packed. We just want to ABI encode them. <laughs> Account and amount. Okay, cool. So what does this mean? So we've, we've encoded the numbers together. We've mashed them together and then we have hashed them. So we've made them into one value and then we have hashed them together. Okay, that makes sense and looks like it should work. But actually when we're using Merkle proofs, we need to do something very particular. And I'm going to show you that right now. We actually want to hash it twice. So we're going to do a kerkak 256 again. But also before we do that, we need to do bytes.concat first. Now, why do we do this? Why do we do both of these hashes and why do we concatenate the bytes? When we are using Merkle proofs and Merkle trees, we want to hash it twice and this avoids collisions. So if you have two inputs that produce the same hash, then that's obviously gonna be a problem. So if we hash it twice, then we are going to be avoiding that problem. And this is known as a second pre-image attack. I will leave some resources in the GitHub repo associated with this section if you'd like to learn more about second pre-image attacks. Now, Kerkak 256 is actually resistant to clashes for the most part, so it shouldn't be a problem, but it's standard to do this twice. So you can kind of just think of this as just like the general way that we encode and hash leaf nodes. And you'll see this again in a second. So now that we have the hash, we have the leaf, we now need to verify the proof. So to do that, we are going to use Open Zeppelin's Merkle contract. So if we head into lib, Open Zeppelin contracts, contracts, utils, cryptography, and then Merkle proof, this is the contract that we're going to want to be using. And we're going to call this function verify, which takes in as parameter that byte 32 array of proofs, which we passed as a parameter to our claim function, the root, which we've stored in the contract already, or when we passed it through as the constructor, and the leaf, which we just calculated. And so then it will call process proof as we were looking at in the other video. And then it computes this computed hash, which is going to be the expected root. And it will compare that back up here, we'll compare that to the route that we provided. So if we head back into our airdrop contract, we can now import Merkle proof and use it to verify our leaf. So now to verify it, we need to first verify that the leaf provides a route that matches the expected route. And then if it doesn't, we want to revert. And then we want to say if the Merkle proof fails, so not Merkle proof dot verify, then we want to be reverting. Now I'm actually not going to use this revert message. I am going to revert with a custom error. So we're gonna go vert, revert, Merkle airdrop, because it's customary to do the name of your contract first. And then we're going to say invalid proof, which basically says, if this fails, then revert with this error message. And we need to declare this at the top of our file. So we need to first say down here before we declare our storage variables, we want to have our error. I need to have the keyword error here. 
and add a semicolon. Okie dokie. So cool. This now succinctly verifies our leaf. If they have in fact passed this, then we want to continue with execution and we want to be able to mint them the ERC20 tokens. Now, before we actually send the tokens to the claiming account, we first want to emit the event. So we're going to emit claim account amount. We need to add this in as an event, event claim, address account, uint su56 amount. And then we want to be transferring the tokens. And yes, Copilot, you are correct. We want to take the ERC20 token. We want to call transfer account amount. Now, what happens if this account doesn't accept ERC20 tokens, what's going to happen? Well, nothing really is going to happen and the execution is not going to revert. So instead, what we are going to do is we are going to use safe transfer, which means that up here, we need to import safe ERC20 from Open Zeppelin. Now, actually, we need to change this import because we're not going to be importing from the IERC20 file. We are instead going to be importing from safe ERC20, which does also contain this interface. And this is going to be utils. So if we now click into safe ERC20, you can see here that it imports the IERC20, which means we can, Im we can import it from this contract like we are. So we can import it from here. And then also we have this library, safe ERC20. And it says here that it's a wrapper around ERC20 operations that throw on failure. So we are going to be using this safe transfer, which transfers the value amount of tokens from the calling contract to two. If the token returns no value, non-reverting calls are assumed to be successful. So it basically just means if we can't, for some reason, send tokens to the address, then it'll handle that for us. I'm going to say using safe ERC20 for IERC20. And this means that we can call the functions defined in here on any variables of this type. So if we scroll back down here, so now rather than transfer, we can do a safe transfer. Great, now let's see if that compiles. Let's run a little forge build. And that was successful. Now our smart contract takes as argument the Merkle root to compare to and the airdrop token, the token that we wish to airdrop to our users or anyone in our Merkle tree. We then have a claim function for people to call where they pass an account that they would like the tokens to be airdropped to, an amount, and the Merkle proofs. It calculates the leaf hash, which it hashes twice to prevent collisions. It ABI encodes together the account and the amount. And then it uses this leaf alongside the root and the proofs to calculate an expected root and compares that to the actual root to see whether this leaf was in fact in the Merkle tree. If it wasn't, it will revert. And if it was, it will safe transfer the tokens to the account with the value of amount. Now you may be thinking, Hmm, Kira, there's a little bit of a problem with this smart contract. Can you think about what that problem might be? So what happens if my account is in the Merkle tree, I'm allowed to claim, I call this function one, and then what happens if I call it again? Now there's nothing to stop me continually claiming over and over again until I drain the contract of all the funds. So what we need to do is we need to keep track of who has already claimed to stop them claiming more than once. So the way we're going to do that is we're going to declare a mapping of address to Boolean to say whether the address has claimed or not. So we're going to say mapping of address user or claimer to bool claimed. Oops. And this is going to be private. And this is a storage variable. So we're going to say S underscore has claimed. And now you may think that after we've transferred the tokens, oh, we can just update this mapping. So we can say that S underscore has claimed account equals true. Now this would be wrong, not just because I've spelt it wrong. Now this is incorrect because it doesn't follow the checks effects interactions pattern, which means that it could be vulnerable to a re-entrancy attack where the function is called continually and the state is not updated to prevent the account from claiming. So what we want to do is we actually want to do that before we emit the event or transfer the tokens. Now this is great. It says it's true. Cool. But there's no check to see whether they have actually claimed or not. So now we need to implement a check to say whether they have claimed or not. So we can say if has claimed, revert with not invalid proof this time, already claimed. So we're saying if they have already claimed this passes as true, then revert with this error message. So now we need to add this error message to the top 
of our smart contract like that. Thank you, Copilot. Great, now we are preventing people from claiming multiple times. So let's go ahead and build that again just to check that everything is going as smoothly as we would like and it compiles. Great. Now, before we start testing our smart contract, the other thing we want to do is we just want to add some quick getter functions because we have some private variables here that we want to actually be able to read. So I'm going to add in a function, function, oops, get Merkle root. That's correct. Thanks, Copilot. And then we're also going to want another one, which is going to be function get airdrop, oops, token so that we can see what the airdrop token address is. Fantastic. Now let's go ahead and start testing. So if we create a test file, we're going to call this Merkle airdrop, oops, t.sol. And then we're going to do spdx license identifier MIT pragma solidity 0.8.24. We need to import the test contract from the foundry standard library. So forge std slash test sol. And now let's actually add in the remapping in the foundry toml. So we can go in here, do a little comma, and then we can go forge std equals lib slash forge std slash src slash. And now we can make a little contract. So we can go contract Merkle airdrop test is test. And we're going to write a very quick test to test that our functionality works as expected. Now, in order to be able to do this, we need to set up our Merkle tree and we need to be able to calculate the proofs and the root. So we need to create two scripts. The first script needs to create the input file. And now this is going to look like this file, input.json. So we're gonna create a JSON file, which includes these types. So this is the data types inside the Merkle tree. So we've got address, which is the address it's going to be able to claim, and uint, which is like a uint 256. So it's the amount that the person is going to be allowed to claim. So we have a count of four, which means that there are four leaf nodes and then the values inside those leaf nodes. So we will be hashing these values. Well, first we'll be encoding together and then hashing these two values together. And we've got four different nodes. So these are the different addresses they're allowed to claim and then their associated amounts. Now, the second file that we are going to need to produce is going to be this output.json. And this output file is the Merkle tree. So it contains all of the leaf nodes, all of the proofs and the root hash. You will have the input and then the proofs associated with that input, the root hash, and then the leaf hash. So this is the hash of these two pieces of data. And then this is the root hash. And you'll see that for all of the different leaf nodes, all of the different inputs, the root is the same because obviously they are part of the same Merkle tree. Therefore, they're all going to be hashed down into the same root for that Merkle tree. So let's go ahead and create those two scripts to produce these two files. Now to do that, we are actually going to use Merkey from DMF. X, Y, Z. So what we're gonna have to do is we're gonna have to import this into our project. And then we're actually going to be using a script in here. And I'm going to have modified this. So we'll walk through this in a second, what this does, but we're gonna modify this very, very slightly. And I will have already done this. You can get this from the GitHub repo associated with this course, and you can just copy and paste it in and we'll walk through it in a second. So the very first thing we need to do is we need to do a forge install. And let's just check what the path was. DMFXYZ, DMFXYZ slash murky dash dash no dash commit because we're going to be using this repo in our script and our script is going to be producing our proofs and our root. Now the next thing that we need to do, if we close out our lib, is we need to create a script file. So we're going to make a script called make merkle.s.sol and also in the script here I'm going to create a new folder called target and this is going to be the target files this make merkle script is going to hit. So we're going to have a new file called input json and then a new file called output JSON. So this input file is going to contain, as it sounds, the input for our Merkle tree. So it's going to have a list of addresses with an associated list of amounts that those addresses can claim. And it's going to be in the JSON format. And then this file, which is going to be created by the way, using a script, which again, we are going to be copying from the GitHub repo associated with this course, which is gonna be called generate input. This input file is then going to be used by make Merkle to create the output JSON file. 
the output JSON file is going to contain all of the leaf nodes. So the hashes of the information in the input file. And for each of those leaf nodes, it will have the associated proofs. So the intermediate nodes that are required to create the root and then also the expected root hash. And now there's one final script that we are going to be copying, which is going to be generate input s.sol, which again, we can copy from the GitHub repo and I will walk you through very quickly. So let's first do the generate input. If you head over to the GitHub repo, then you can get this generate input file and you can copy and paste it in there. So all this is doing is it's setting the amount that we want our addresses to be able to claim. We've got this types array, which is just the types of the values in the tree. So for us, it's going to be an address and an amount. Account, which is the number of addresses that are going to be able to claim. Whitelist, which is just an array of addresses that we're going to be setting as the addresses which are going to be able to claim. We are going to be looping through it, but because this is a script which is not going to be executed on chain, then we don't need to worry about DOS or gas or anything like that. The input path, which is going to print the Merkle tree to, which is going to be input.json script slash target, which we just made earlier. And then <clears throat> inside the run function, we set the type of the first type to be address, the second type to be uint. And then we have four addresses, which are the addresses that I am saying that I would like to airdrop my tokens to. The count is the number of addresses. So it's the array, the length of the array. And then I'm going to call this create JSON to create the input file which basically just concatenates a load of strings together with the variables such as the addresses, the amounts, and creates the input file structure. So we set that to the variable input, and then we write file to the input path, the input that we just created using this cheat code write file, and it concatenates the strings together. And then this is just the root of my project. And then this is the specific file that we want to be writing to. And then we log that we have done this. So if we save that, we can then run it. So if we run lodge script, generate input, s.sol, colon, generate input. If we've done it correctly, then it should work. And it won't work because I haven't put said the path correctly. So this is going to be script slash generate input s.sol. And you will now see this little error. Okay, the path script slash target slash input.json is not allowed to be accessed for write operations. Huh. That's annoying. How come we can't write to files? Now this is easily rectified. If you just head into the foundry toml, then you can just set in here the FS permissions. So FS permissions, ooh, permissions equals, and then we do an array and then we say in here, then we want to say it, be able to say we can read and write. And then we the path of all of the files that we want to be able to read and write to is just the root of our directory. And now we're saying that we can read, the scripts are able to read and write to anything in our directory. So now if we go ahead and run the script again, we have an issue. What's the issue? We've got our equal sign, need a little equals in there. Now if we run our script again, done. The output is found at, so if we head to input and then we go control shift P, format document, then you can see that we've got the types in the Merkle tree, the count, which is four, the values, which is the addresses with all of the different amounts. We now have the structure for our Merkle tree. Now, if we head back to make Merkle.s.sol and we copy the make Merkle script from the GitHub repo associated with this course, which has been modified from that murky GitHub repo. And actually we are using murky in this file. So we've got this Merkle from murky. And you'll see that we've got some squiggly lines under murky, which basically means we need to add it to our remappings as per usual. So comma, and then we've got murky equals lib slash murky. And now if we head back to our make Merkle, these should go away. So we've added the remapping into our foundry toml. I'm not sure why it's still squiggly, but if we run forge build, then there's no issue so far. So we're going to ignore it for now because sometimes VS code just screws up and shows a squiggle, even though it can actually find the file. So we're going to explain this first and then we'll run the script and see if it works. I have added in some comments, which are just my thoughts of why we need to do things. So first of all, it does this using J std json for string, which enables us to use the json cheat codes for strings, which we'll do shortly. We then create a new instance of the Merkle contract from Murky. So if we head into Murky, Merkle, then we can see that what it's doing is it's creating these hash leaf pairs. So it creates, and as it says here, it creates the proofs 
and verifies. So the first thing we need to do is we need to then define the input path, which is where we just made our Merkle tree. And then the output path, which is where we're going to print the proofs and also the root. And then this elements basically just reads that input file. We're then getting the types from the JSON using the cheat code, read string array, which is why we needed this std JSON. And then we are reading uint to get the number of leaf nodes. So this is count. We then declare some arrays. We've got bytes 32 leaves. We've got a string array inputs and a string array outputs, and then this string output, which basically just enables us to save all of the intermediate variables to retrieve the output file. Now we've got some helper functions here, get values by index, which just enables us to format the data so that we can print it to the output file and then create JSON entries. Again, just formats some of the data into JSON format. The majority of the logic is in the side this function run. So what we are going to do is we're going to loop through all of the leaves. We're then going to declare some arrays again. So the stringified data and then the actual data. So this would be like an address and an amount in a string, but then this would be the actual address and the amount in bytes 32. And then what we're going to do once we've looped through each of the entries is we're going to loop through for each entry, the address and the array. So this types.length is like the number of variables in. So if we had like an address and two uints, then it would be three and J would go from naught to two because it's J less than types.length. So when we see an address, we're going to do this read address to the, to get the value. So we get the value of the address. And then because you can't cast straight to bytes 32 for an address, you first need to cast to a uint 160 and then a uint 256 and finally a byte 32. This is just a standard thing for if you're casting an address to a byte 32. And then we save that in the jth element of data. And then we will store the input as the stringified value because this is the actual data in byte 32, whereas this is the stringified data. And then for all of the others, so the uints, then we want to pass uint to get the value. And then we can bytes 32 that value because it was a uint 256, of course, because we said it was a uint. So then we saved that bytes 32 value, which is the amount in data J. So this is gonna be one for the uint because it's the second value or zero for the address because it's the first value. And then we stringify that amount and have it in input. And then down here, as my notes were saying, we create the hash for the Merkle tree leaf node. So this is like address and amount, this data in here. We ABI encode the data. The helper from Merky LTRIM64 returns the bytes with the first 64 bytes removed. And this is because the offset of the encoded bytes and there's an offset because the array is declared in memory. This is an array, so we need to trim that off. Then we hash the encoded address and amount together. This then turns the bytes 32 to bytes. And then we hash it again. We need to kekak 256 hash the value twice to prevent collisions. Then we convert the string array to string using this script helper from Merky, which basically means that we can have all of the corresponding value inputs for each leaf node. And then finally, once we've done that for each leaf and we have stored the leaf data and also the input, then we can loop through those so each address and amount, and we can get the proof. So we can use the Merkle contract to get the proof for each leaf. So this takes the whole array of leaves, all of the values, and then this is the specific one that we want. So for instance, the first value, so this would be zero. And then we also calculate the root hash. So we, on the Merkle contract, the Merkle, Merkle contract, we call get root, which calculates the root hash for all of the leaves. And then we get the specific leaf data and we get the stringified input, so the address and the amount again. And then we generate the JSON output file. So this is akin to if you've used Open Zeppelin, the tree.dump. So it generates an output for each of the elements, all of the leaves, so each address and amount. And then we get all of those string arrays and we make it into array string. So we stringify the array of strings into a single string and then set it to output. And then we write that to the output path finally. 
Now that is a little bit complicated and some of that you don't you don't really need to understand 100% how this is working. Essentially it's just taking in all of the inputs and then using this Merkle contract to get the proofs for each of the leaves, get the root and then store the actual leaf hash and then also the input and then printing them to the output file. So if we run this by running forge script, script slash make Merkle dot s dot sol colon make Merkle make Merkle. Then it says here, generating Merkle proof for this input. Done. The output is found at output.json. So if we head in here, we go control shift P format document. Then you can see here, as we said before, you print the inputs. So we've got the address and the amount, the actual values. This is what we were saying. So this input is that address and amount. You've got the proof for that specific leaf for those inputs. And that's this proof. We've got the root, which we calculated here, which is going to be the same. You can get it. It's going to be the same all the way through the file. And then the leaf hash, which is going to be this leaf, which is just the specific leaf that you're working on, the inputs hashed together twice, as we said earlier. And that's it. So if you want to modify which addresses are going to be allowed to claim, you modify the addresses in this generate input, you'll run generate input, and then you can run make Merkle to produce this output file to get the proofs for each of the addresses and to get the root. And now finally, we can use this in our test to test that things actually work and to check that these addresses can in fact claim. Now let's continue with writing our test. So if we just get rid of our terminal for a second so that we can see what we're doing. So we're going to want a function to test that users can claim. So function test users can claim. Can me with a eligible address claim the airdrop. So the first thing we're gonna to wanna to do is we're gonna to want to deploy both our token contract and the airdrop contract. So we're going to need to store those in variables and we're going to need to import the files. So we can import Merkle airdrop from source Merkle airdrop. And we also want to import the bagel token because, you know, everyone wants more bagels. So I'm going to airdrop some people some bagels. Alrighty, tidy. Now we need to save them in some variables, airdrop and token. And I'm going to make these variables public. That's not public. Public and public. And then we're going to have a setup function, function setup, which will run automatically when we run our script. And this is not going to be the correct route. So we've got this token, new bagel token to deploy our bagel token contract, and then airdrop equals new airdrop token to deploy our airdrop contract. And we need to have this route. So let's save that in a variable, which we are going to call, we're going to say bytes32 public root equals and then if we go into our output file then you can copy this root here so if we go back in here then we can say that the root is that paste it in and then also i very cleverly if i do say so myself made the first address this one the address that was generated from doing a make adder and key of the string user what do i mean by this basically i created a an address user so we've got address user, and then we're going to say, oh, and then we've also got un256 user key. And then in our setup function, we're going to say, oh, you can also pass through the root here. Now that we have it, we're going to use a little function that we get from Foundry. We're going to say user and user priv key equals make adder and key of user. Now what this will do is it will create an address and a private key. But the way that it does that is it actually uses this to create the address. It's predictable. So because this user address is the address that's going to want to be claiming, we're going to need to add the user address to the generate input file and then recreate our input and output JSON files so we can get the proofs and the expected root. And we're going to want them to be able to claim, so they need to be in the Merkle tree. So to do that, all I am going to do is make sure that I've imported the console from the Forge standard library. And then I'm going to do a console.log the user address. And then if I open up my terminal 
and I just run forge test and I make sure I add dash VV. Then you'll see that I've got this user address, which I can now copy. And then if I head into generate input, I can put that in my array of addresses, which are able to claim. Now, because I have sneakily already done this, the address is gonna be the same, but I'm gonna run through the motions just in case you have an, a different address that needs to be able to claim and you want to know how you're going to add that to the Merkle tree. So I've added it to the array in the generate input file, and then I need to run these two scripts. So I need to run the generate input script, and then I need to run make Merkle to create first the input, and then the output file to add it to the Merkle tree and generate the proofs and the root. So I need to run forge script script slash generate input dot s dot sol to generate the input file. And then I need to run forge script script slash make Merkle dot s dot sol to generate the output file. Now, if we head in here, we can do a command shift P format document and you can see this address is in the input file and then if we head to the output file we do the same command shift p format document you can see we now have again the address with the amount that they're able to claim we've got the leaf so the hashed these two values hashed together the proofs that we need the root and everything that we need to add into our test file. So now the address that we're using to, that we want to be able to claim is this user and it is in fact in the Merkle tree. Great. Now the reason I've used make adder and key will be obvious very shortly. Right now we're not actually going to be using the private key but I think it's important to show that you can create an address and a private key because the other one that we're going to use is just going to be make adder, but we're going to do that later. And that just makes an address rather than, make, rather than creating the private key as well. So now in our test users can claim, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to store their initial balance just to double check that it is in fact zero. And we're going to get the balance of the user. And then we're going to use the cheat code vm.prank to prank that the user is calling the function to say airdrop.claim user amount to claim and then here not root we need proof so now we need to define these two values and this is going to be capitals and this we're actually going to name amount and they're going to be magic numbers so we're going to say uint 256 amount equals 25 bagel tokens and because the number of decimals is 18 that's why i've got this here and then i'm going to say bytes 32 array public proof equals and then I'm going to have an array here and what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into this output and then for this input I need to copy these two proofs and put them into my test file right here and then I'm going to copper separate them go back in get the second one copy that in paste that in there save and now I have my proof and now what we can do is we can get the ending balance now, remember that vm.prank just pranks the next line. So now it will have already stopped. There's no need to do stop prank. We can get the ending balance and then we can console log it just because that's nice to do. And we need to make sure that we get the console from the Forge Standard Library. Uh, just double check that that's an export. Yes, it is. Cool. We can console log the ending balance like this. And then we're going to say it here so that we know what we're looking at. Do a little comma there. And then finally, we're going to assert equal. So assert that these two values that I'm going to type in are equal. So it's going to be ending balance minus, oops, minus starting balance is equal to amount. So I want to check that this amount was in fact transferred to my user. Great. Now we haven't used a, a script to deploy the token and the airdrop contract but we can do that and we can modify it soon now when we run this contract so if we go forge test dash vv we have an issue here and this is because we first need to store these values as intermediate bytes 32 and then pass them through so we'll do that right now so we go bytes 32 proof one and then we got same thing equals that and then we can pass through oops proof one and proof two let's run this again and it failed. So interesting. How come it failed? It says ERC20 insufficient balance. So the reason this is failing is because our Merkle airdrop contract needs to hold tokens to be able to send them to the user. Because if we head inside our Merkle airdrop contract, we're doing a safe transfer from this contract to this account. So once we have deployed these two contracts, the first thing we need to do is we need to do token.mint to create the supply. 
the token dot to the owner of the token and then we're going to send them amount times four which we're actually going to save in a variable. So now we're going to do uint 256 because we don't like to have magic numbers inside function calls. So we're going to say this in amount to send equals and then four times amount. Let's change this amount to claim to make it nice and verbose. And then whenever we've used amount, we can do hold options and then click to do select both of them. Amount underscore to underscore claim, save. And then here I can do amount, oops, amount to send. And then once I've minted to the token contract owner, which is going to be this contract, then I can do token dot transfer to the airdrop, the amount to send. So now the airdrop holds all of the tokens needed for all of the addresses to claim. So now if I save this and I run the test again, I haven't declared amount because I renamed the variable. So amount to claim. And then we run it again. Ah, and then because airdrop is of type Merkle airdrop, we need to cast this to an address to make sure that it is the right type for this function call. Amazing, our test has passed and we have successfully airdropped the user bagel tokens. Yay! Now that we have written our test, let's make a deployment script so that we can deploy our bagel contract also our airdrop contract, and then we can use them in our test. So let's create a new file in script, if it's gonna work for me. <laughs> new file, we're going to go deploy Merkle airdrop or s.sol. Now you could make this so it just deploys the Merkle airdrop, and then you pass through hard code and address for what you want your token contract to be if it already exists. But for this example, I am going to deploy my bagel token contract, and then I'm going to pass it through to the airdrop contract. And that's just how I'm going to do it for this, but it would be pretty easy to modify it. So as per usual, we go SPDX license identifier MIT Pragma Solidity 0.8.24. And then we need to import the contracts that we want to be deploying. Import Merkle airdrop from Merkle airdrop. We also need to import the, import the bagel token. And then we need to make sure we are also importing script from the Forge standard library. I'm not sure why this is complaining at me, but we'll see if it runs. And if it does, we can just ignore it. And then also we're going to need the IERC20 because we're going to have to make some transfers like we did in the test. So we can go IERC20 from Open Zeppelin contracts. Cool. Now we have all the imports we need. We can go contract, deploy, Merkle, airdrop. Ooh, airdrop is script as we do normally when we create a deployment script. I'm going to create a function run which needs to be external and it returns both of the contract the contracts that we deploy so Merkle airdrop and also the bagel token and then in here this is not returned this is returns and then in here we are going to return deploy Merkle airdrop which we are going to implement now. So if we make a function deploy Merkle airdrop and it's going to be public returns both of those contracts, the Merkle airdrop contract and the bagel token contract. And then in here, we need to deploy those contracts. So as before, as normal, we do vm.start broadcast. We're going to deploy the bagel token. Then we're going to deploy the airdrop contract. Now here we are going to need the Merkle root. So we're going to save this in a storage variable, Merkle root. And we're going to declare that up here. Right, search to Merkle root equals that. And this you can retrieve from your output file as before. And we pass through the bagel token. Then we need to mint the deployer amount to airdrop. So we need to do token dot mint token dot owner, which is going to be whoever called this contract. And then we send them amount to airdrop, which we need to define. You have 256 amount to airdrop is 25 bagel tokens and we need to actually send them we need to send the contract four times this because there are four people who are going to be claiming so this actually shouldn't be amount to airdrop it should be amount to transfer let's change that to transfer cool cool and then once we've minted it to the 
contract owner, we need to transfer it to the airdrop contract so that it is in the contract to be able to be claimed by the claimers. And then we can stop the broadcast, vm.stop broadcast, and then we can return the contracts. And that's it. That's how we write our deployment contract. So now if we go back into our test, we can use this in here now. But what we're going to do need to do in order to be able to do that is we need to install Foundry DevOps. So we need to go forge install and let's just check the path of it. So it's Cyphrin slash Foundry dash DevOps. So forge install Cyphrin slash Foundry dash DevOps. No dash commit. And this enables us to get the most recently deployed contract and also means that we can do some ZK sync special stuff. Okay, now in our setup, we now need to check whether the chain is a ZK sync chain. If it is a ZK sync chain, we still want to be doing all of this. If it's not, then we want to be using our deployment script because as of recording right now, you can't use scripts to deploy in ZK sync environments. So ZK sync local nodes, ZK sync Sapolia or ZK sync mainnet. Now, the other thing I want to briefly mention here is that it is completely optional to work on ZK sync. If you didn't want to work on ZK sync, you would simply not implement the if else statement and everything in the if you would just put in your setup function. This will make sense in a second, but you won't have to have the if ZK sync logic. You can just purely use your deployment script in your test. So within Foundry DevOps, we have this nice little helper ZK sync chain checker from this path. And this basically just checks whether the chain that you're working on is ZK sync or not. And then we can just inherit that from our test. So we can go ZK sync chain checker and test. And then in our setup, we can say if not is ZK sync chain. Oops. So if you're not working on ZK sync, then deploy with the script else we want to be, we're on a ZK sync in chain and we want to be deploying as we were before. So to deploy with the script, we need to import this script to this contract. So we need to say import deploy Merkle airdrop from script slash Merkle airdrop dot s dot saw. And then we can say deploy Merkle airdrop deployer equals new deploy Merkle airdrop. And then we can say drop token equals deployer dot deploy Merkle airdrop to call the function. And that's it. So now if we run our test again, we are not working on a ZK sync chain. We're currently just testing in a normal environment in the test environment and our test passes. Amazing. We have now tested our deployment script. This contract you may have noticed allows other people to call claim for another account. I could call claim with Patrick Collins address and he would receive these tokens whether he wanted to or not. So maybe we want a way for these accounts to be able to say, yes, I want this airdrop or no, I don't want this airdrop. Now, what we could do is we could remove this account and just use message sender throughout, which would mean they would have to call with their own account and they would have to pay for their own gas fees and everything. And that would work and would mean that no one else can claim for them. They can't receive anything that they don't want. But maybe we still want other people to be able to pay for our gas. Maybe we still want other people to be able to call claim for us and we want to be able to receive the airdrop. So we need a way to be able to say, for me to be able to say, hey, Patrick, here you go. Here's permission to call claim for me. You can pay for my transaction fees. Thank you very much. And I will receive the airdrop because my account is in the Merkle tree. I'm allowed to be able to claim, but I don't want to call claim myself. So I don't want message sender to be in here but I still want to be able to receive the airdrop and I want you to pay for me. So the way that we are going to do that is by using signatures. We are going to have a message which essentially says, yes, you can claim for me. And I'm gonna sign it with my account and my private key to say, here you go, Patrick. Here's this message that I've signed using my very own signature to say that you can claim for me. And then he can call claim and then claim will check, is this signature originating from the account that you are wishing to claim for? If yes, are they in the Merkle tree? If yes, then they can claim the airdrop. So to understand how to implement this, we need to backtrack a second and we need to understand what are signatures and how do we implement signature verification into our smart contract? How do we check that the signature was signed by the intended signer by this account. 
So let's explain that very quickly now. In this video, we are going to go through everything that you need to know about signing and verifying signatures by learning about and understanding Ethereum signature standards. We will be going through EIP191, EIP712, and how you can verify your signatures in your smart contracts. Let's jump into it. In order to understand signature creation, signature verification, and preventing replay attacks, EIP191 and 712 must be understood first. Let's quickly go through why these Ethereum improvement proposals were introduced. When signing transactions, we needed an easier way to read and understand transaction data. Before these standards were created, the following message was displayed in MetaMask when signing a transaction. Pretty ugly, right? Difficult to understand whether what I'm signing is correct. Not what you want to see. These standards meant that the transaction data could be displayed in a nice, readable way. Additionally, EIP 712 is key to preventing replay attacks. Spoiler, the data to prevent replay attacks is encoded inside the structured data. So let's go through these standards now, step by step. Let's first start with simple signature verification and implement it into a smart contract. So if we create a function get simple signer, which takes a message to sign, and this can be any data at all, preferably the string Kira is awesome, but it's up to you. Notice here the V, R, and S arguments. These are components of the signature that we are providing. This function, get simple signer, hashes the message and then retrieves the signer using the precompile EC recover and then returns the result. As I said, EC recover is a precompile, so it's a function that's built into the Ethereum protocol and retrieves the signer from any message using the V, R, and S components of the signature. We then create a function verify signer simple, which then compares the retrieved signer to the expected signer, and then it reverts if they're not the same. This is how signatures work at a fundamental level. Take some hashed message plus the signature of the message, retrieve the signer, and check that the address was as expected. There was an issue with this though. There needed to be a way to send transactions using pre-made signatures aka sponsored transactions. There will be a future video on account abstraction, so remember this, as this will be important. This was already possible outside of smart contracts. However, there needed to be a way to build this into functions in smart contracts. For example, Bob signs a message, aka a transaction, and gives that signature to Alice. Alice then uses that signature to send the transaction, meaning that Alice pays for Bob's gas fees. And so EIP191 was introduced. EIP191 is the signed data standard, and it proposed the following format for signed data. First off, OX19, this is the prefix, and this just signifies that the data is a signature. The decimal value of OX19 is 25, and this was chosen because it wasn't used in any other context. And due to how Ethereum transactions are encoded, it ensures that the data associated with the signed message cannot be a valid Ethereum transaction. Next, we have the one byte version. This is the version that the signed data is using. And this allows different versions to have different signed data structures. The allowed values are 0x00, which is data with an intended validator. The person or smart contract who is going to validate the signature is provided here. 0x01, which is structured data. This is the one that's most commonly used in production apps and is associated with EIP 712, which we'll discuss shortly. And finally, 0x45 personal sign messages. You then have the version specific data. This is data associated with that version and it will be specified. For instance, for 0x01, you have to provide the validator address. The next section is the data to sign. And this is purely the message we intend to sign, such as a string, Kira is awesome. Let's now modify our code for EIP191. The following get signer 191 function demonstrates how to set up an EIP 191 signature. So you can see here we have the bytes one prefix, which is that OX19. You then have the bytes one EIP 191 version, and we're using version zero. Then we have the version specific data, so the validator address, which we're saying is this smart contract. And then we have the application specific data, so some message. And we can see it follows that format that we said just a second ago. We then ABI encode this data. We hash it together to produce a hashed message. We then use the EC recover precompile with the hashed message and the signature to recover the signer. As you can see here, retrieving the signer is much more verbose now. As before, we can then compare this calculated signer with the expected signer. 
However, what if this data to sign the message is a lot more complicated? We still don't really have a nice way to display this information, for instance, in MetaMask. So we needed a way to format this data that could be more easily understood. So we needed to standardize this, which was done in EIP 712. EIP 712 structured this data to sign and also the version specific data. This made signatures more easy to read and meant we could display them inside wallets and also that we could prevent replay attacks. So now the signature has the following structure. We again have the prefix from before and the version. We now have this domain separator and this is the version specific data. Note that we're working with here with 0x01 and this is the version that's associated with EIP 712. The domain separator is the hash of the struct defining the domain of the message being signed. And in the case of EIP 712, the EIP 712 domain looks like this. So you have a struct that has the name, the version, the chain ID and the verifying contract. This means that smart contracts can know whether the signature was created specifically for that smart contract because the smart contract itself will be the verifying contract and it will be encoded in the data. So we can rewrite the data as OX19, 0x01, the hash struct of the EIP 712 domain, and then the hash struct of the message. Now we need to define what hash struct is. The hash struct is the hash of the type hash plus the hash of the struct itself, so the data. The type hash is a hash of what the actual struct looks like. So what are the types involved here? What is the name of the struct and what are all the types inside that struct? And then we hash that together to create the type hash. We then create a domain separator struct by providing all of the data necessary. And then we hash together the type hash with all those individual pieces of data by first ABI encoding them together to create some bytes and then hashing that data. But the hash struct is basically what does the data look like? And what actually is the data hashed together? Now we have the hash struct of the message and this follows very similarly. So what is the type of the message? And then what is the message itself? So we have a struct message, which has the member number. So then the message type hash will then just be the hash of the type message UN256. The hash struct of the message then becomes the ABI encoded type hash alongside the actual message struct data encoded together and then hashed. And this is the hash struct of the message. So we can think of this EIP 712 data as just OX19, OX01, who verifies the signature and what the verifier looks like, a hash of the signed structured message and what the signature looks like. Putting this together, we then create a get signer EIP 712 function, which first takes the prefix, the EIP 712 version, which is OX01, the hash struct of the domain separator, which we created by hashing together the type hash and the domain separator struct data. We then encode together the prefix, the version, hash struct of the domain separator and the hash struct of the message. And this combined together is known as the digest. The definition of a digest is just any data resulting after a hash. And you often see it referred to when talking about signatures after you have hashed the message and combined it with all of the other data associated with EIP 712. So don't be confused if you see digest in another context. We then call EC recover with this digest and the signature to retrieve the actual signer. We can then compare that to the expected signer as before in this verify signer 712 function. This may sound extremely confusing, but using Open Zeppelin, a lot of this can be done for us. All we need to do is create the message type hash and hash that together with the message data to create the hash struct of the message. We can then pass this as an argument to the function underscore hash type data v4. And then this will add the EIP 712 domain and the domain type hash and hash it all together to create the digest. So we pass our message through to get message hash to do all of that for us, do all of the hashing for us and get the fully encoded EIP 712 message. And then we pass that through to our get signer open Zeppelin. And this does the same as what we were doing before. So when we were using EC recover directly, but instead it uses ecdsa.tryrecover from Open Zeppelin. Try recover then checks the S value of the signature to check for signature malleability and then uses the ecrecover precompile 
to retrieve the signer. It then also checks if the signer returned is the zero address because if the signer is not valid, then EC Recover will return the zero address and we'll retrieve the expected signer which we can then compare to the actual signer that we had to verify the signature. So as mentioned earlier, EIP 712 is key to preventing replay attacks. Replay attacks are where the same transaction can be sent more than once or the same signature used more than once. The extra data in the structure of EIP 712 prevents these replay attacks. So that is a lot of information and it may sound super confusing, but I encourage you to try and use this in practice because this is where the knowledge is really gonna be solidified. And so to summarize, EIP191 standardizes what the sign data should look like. EIP712 standardizes the format of the version specific data and the data to sign. So to implement signatures and signature verification into your smart contracts, it's imperative to understand these two EIPs. So now we're well on our way to writing secure smart contracts. This is super confusing stuff and it took me a long time to get my head around. So don't worry if you're a little confused. This is confusing stuff. Now, before we go ahead and implement this into our smart contract, let's take a little segue into ECDSA signatures. What are those VRNS components that we pass through? We said that they were components of the signature, but what actually are they? Let's go into that now. Have you ever heard of ECDSA and ECDSA signatures before? And what are these V, R and S values? Where do they come from? Everyone just says ECDSA is just some math magic and don't worry about it. And that V, R and S are basically just the signature. But like, what are they? Really? I'm gonna take you through that right now, but don't worry. You don't need to have some crazy in-depth math knowledge. You don't need to have a maths degree to understand this. I'm gonna be taking you through things from a high level so we can understand ECDSA signatures, how they work and what the heck V, R and S are. Let's get into it. ECDSA stands for the Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm. Bit of a mouthful. And it's based on elliptic curve cryptography. Don't worry, we'll go through what that means in a second. But it's used to generate keys, authenticate, sign and verify messages. But first of all, what actually are signatures? Let's do a brief explainer. Signatures provide a means for authentication in blockchain technology, allowing operations such as sending transactions to verify that they have originated from the intended sender. Proof of ownership in Ethereum is achieved using public and private key pairs, and they are used to create digital signatures. Signatures are analogous to having to provide ID to withdraw from the bank. They're kind of like a digital fingerprint and they are unique to you, the user. This public private key pair is used to verify that the sender is the owner of the account. This is of course known as public key cryptography and involves asymmetric encryption, which sounds confusing, but more on this later. The private key is what is used to sign the message and is used to derive the public key. The public key is used to verify the owner knows the private key. It is extremely difficult and we can assume impossible to derive the private key from the public key, even for a computer, ignoring quantum computing, but don't worry about that right now. And this means that knowledge of the public key does not grant access to the account. This is why if you share your private key, that is a big problem because you can access the account. But if you share your public key, then you're fine. If I give Patrick Collins my address, he can't steal anything. These public and private key pairs define Ethereum externally owned accounts or EOAs, and they provide a means for interacting with the blockchain by signing data and sending transactions without others being able to access accounts they do not own. An Ethereum address is used as identification and is the last 20 bytes of the hash of the public key. But how do we create public and private keys? How do we create signatures? And how do we verify signatures? Let's now dive into ECDSA, how it works and what it is. ECDSA is a signature algorithm based on elliptic curve cryptography. And it is the cryptographic algorithm used to do those operations we were talking about. Create keys, create signatures and verify signatures. And we need to understand how they work from a high level in order to be able to implement these things into our smart contracts and ensure that they are secure. The specific curve used in ECDSA in Ethereum is the SECP 
256k1 curve, and it was chosen for its interoperability with Bitcoin, its efficiency and security. And as with all elliptic curves, it is symmetrical about its x-axis. Therefore, for every coordinate on the curve, there exists another coordinate at the same x point. And each point on the curve is your v, r and s. They are the coordinates of the points on the curve. Each point is a unique signature. Now for every x coordinate on the curve, there exists two valid signatures, which means that if a malicious actor has access to one of those signatures, even without the private key, they can compute the second one. This is known as signature malleability, which is a form of replay attack. Resources will be left down below if you're watching this on YouTube or in the GitHub repo if you're on Updraft, if you would like to learn more about replay attacks. Now there's a couple of constants that we need to quickly define associated with the SecP 256K1 curve. The first is the generator point, G, and is just, we can assume, random point on the elliptic curve. It's purely a constant. The second one is N, which is the order of the subgroup of the elliptic curve points, and it's generated by G. And all you really need to know about N is that it defines the length of the private key, and it's a prime number. Now it's not crucial to understand what these constants mean, we purely just need to remember that they are constants. They are just constants that are gonna be used in subsequent calculations. ECDSA signatures contain three integers and they might be familiar to you, V, R and S. Therefore, signatures can be denoted as V, R and S. R represents the X point on the elliptic curve based on some random point capital R on the curve, but it's just the X coordinate. S serves as proof of the signer's knowledge of the private key and is calculated using a random constant k which ensures that the signature is unique every time. V is used to recover the public key from R and represents the index of the point on the elliptic curve, whether the point is in positive y or negative y. This is known as the polarity. Let's now go through how public and private keys are generated. The private key is generated as a random integer within the range 0 to n minus 1, where n is again the order. The public key is an elliptic curve point, calculated by timesing the private key with the generator point. But how do we know the ECDSA private keys are secure? This is because of the complexity of the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem, which basically says that if we times two big integers together, the output being a giant integer, using just the output, we cannot feasibly calculate the inputs. Since point arithmetic in a finite field does not support division, a computer would instead have to use brute force to determine p, even though g is known. And this involves trying every possible value of p to find the correct value, which is not feasibly possible. Imagine I have two large prime numbers and I times them together and I give you this output. Do you think you could calculate the inputs? Unless you're a quantum computer? I don't think so. So we can assume this is impossible even for computers. Now, how are signatures created? Signatures are created by combining a hash of a message with the private key. This combination is done using the ECDSA algorithm. Firstly, using the SHA-256 hashing algorithm, we hash the message. Then, secondly, we generate a securely random number k, the nonce. We then calculate a random number capital R, which is the nonce times the generator point, and take its x coordinate. This is R, lowercase r, v, s, r. This is the r part of our signature. Using the following formula, we then calculate s, using the nonce, the hash of the message, the private key, the r part of the signature, and the order n. V then defines whether we are using the positive part of the y-axis or the negative part of the y-axis. Finally, how are ECDSA signatures verified? The ECDSA verification algorithm takes the sign message, the signature from the signing algorithm, and the public key, and outputs a boolean representing whether the signature was valid or not, whether the recovered signer matches the provided public key. This works in reverse of the signing algorithm. We convert the S coordinate back to an R coordinate and verify that the provided R coordinate matches the calculated R coordinate. 
This is done using the following formula, which is essentially just a reverse of what we did when we were signing. The EVM precompile, EC Recover, does this for you in smart contracts. It enables us to retrieve the signer's address of a message that has been signed using their private key using ECDSA. And this is what allows smart contracts to verify the integrity of a signature and retrieve the signer. Using EC Recover directly can lead to some security issues. So the first, as we discussed, is signature malleability, where because the curve is symmetric about the x-axis, there are two valid signatures for each value of R. So if an attacker knows one signature, they can calculate the other one. This can be mitigated by restricting the value of S to one half of the curve. If S is not restricted, the two valid signatures exist and therefore the smart contract can be vulnerable to signature malleability attacks. However, if you're using Open Zeppelin's libraries, such as the ECDSA library, to verify signatures, then you are protected against signature malleability attacks, as long as you're using versions greater than 4.7.3. For example, as you can see in the code from this Lava Labs Code for Arena audit, you can see that EC recovery is being used directly without any checks on S. So there is no restriction and both signatures would be valid. You shouldn't implement EC recover directly. Therefore, Open Zeppelin's ECDSA library should be used to validate signatures. Aside from signature malleability, the other issue with using EC recover directly is that if the signature is in invalid, EC Recover will return a zero address. Now, if this is not handled correctly in the implementation in the smart contract, then this can lead to issues. So there should be a check in the smart contract if EC Recover is returning the zero address, and then the smart contract should revert. If you're using Open Zeppelin's ECDSA library, then this check already exists and you're protected against this vulnerability. Now, this was a lot of information and this may be overwhelming. So well done. Give yourselves a pat on the back for getting through this. If this was confusing to you or you need to rewatch this video, go read some other articles, immerse yourself in some maths magic then go ahead because this is extremely complex stuff and you're probably not gonna get your head around it the first time. But well done, because now you understand ECDSA signatures. We know that ECDSA is used to generate public and private keys, generate signatures and verify those signatures. And we have walked through step by step how this is done. So thank you for watching. Now that we've learned all about signatures, EIP 712, EIP 191, ECDSA and Merkle trees, and we have implemented that into our smart contract, there is one last concept that we have not talked through yet. And we now have all the tools to be able to understand. Do you remember when we deployed our contract to ZK Sync and the transaction type was 113? Patrick gave a brief explainer of what this means, but let's go into this and what the transaction type means and what's actually going on here. If you don't remember, not to worry, we're gonna go through it right now. Okay, here we are over in Remix and I have a smart contract that I wish to deploy. This is in fact the simple storage smart contract back from Solidity 101. Now this could be any smart contract that you want to deploy, but if you remember before, we are gonna use the ZK Sync Remix plugin to deploy our smart contract. And then we need to make sure that our environment is set to wallet and that we connect our wallet to the site so that we can deploy using our MetaMask. So the first thing that we need to do is we need to hit compile to compile our smart contract using the ZK Sulk compiler, click accept. And then when we hit deploy, something very interesting is gonna happen. Here, we have a signature request. We are in fact not sending a transaction, which we would normally do when we deploy a smart contract. Instead, we are signing a message. Sign this message. So here we have the information to do with the message. And it's broken down all nicely for us. What does this kind of tell you? The fact that we have all of this lovely, amazingly laid out information for us. It kind of tells us that it's EIP 712 message. And here you can see that the transaction type is 113. Hey, that's pretty cool, huh? How come we were in Remix and we expected to do a transaction, but instead we're signing a message? So if we hit sign, then you can see here the information in the terminal that we just signed. So how was that possible? In order to understand this, let's go through some transaction types on Ethereum and ZK Sync so that we can understand this type 113 transaction here.
When sending transactions throughout this course, you may have noticed something called transaction types. For instance, when we deployed a smart contract on ZK Sync using Remix, we signed a message which contained the transaction type 113 in the message. Additionally, we added the dash dash legacy flag when we deployed our smart contracts with Foundry ZK Sync. You may also notice on Etherscan or ZK Sync block scanners the attribute transaction type on all of your transactions. And in this example, it says transaction type two. Let's go through and break down all of the different transaction types and what this means. Ethereum and ZK Sync share four transaction types. First, transaction type zero, legacy transactions. When we added that dash dash legacy flag, we were specifying transaction type zero. This was the Ethereum transaction type before Ethereum transaction types were even introduced. And it was the very, very first transaction type. Secondly, we have transaction type one, zero x zero one. There were some contract breakage risks associated with EIP 2929 and EIP 2930 optional access lists solved this and introduced transaction type one. And this contains the same fields as legacy transactions with an additional access list parameter, which contains an array of addresses and storage keys. And this enables gas savings on cross contract calls by pre-declaring the allowed contracts and storage slots. The next transaction type was introduced by EIP 1559. And this is transaction type two or 0x02. And it was introduced in Ethereum's London fork. And this transaction type aimed to tackle high network fees and congestion. And it was all around gas fees. Legacy transactions had the gas price parameter. And this was instead replaced with a base fee, which was modified for each block. It also added the following parameters. Max priority fee per gas, which is the maximum fee the sender is willing to pay. The max fee per gas, which is the maximum total fee that the sender is willing to pay. So like how much extra are they willing to pay to have priority plus that base fee is the max fee per gas. It should be noted here that ZK Sync does support type two transactions, but it does nothing with the max fee parameters because gas works a little differently on ZK Sync. And finally, we have type three or 0x03 transactions. And this was introduced in EIP 4844, proto dank sharding or blob transactions. And this was introduced in Ethereum's Denken fork and provided an initial scaling solution for rollups while their usage was still low or is still low, depending on when you're watching this. And it introduced a couple of new parameters alongside those introduced in type zero and type two transactions. It introduced max blob fee per gas, which is the maximum fee per gas the sender is willing to pay for the blob gas. So this was a separate market from regular gas. It's like the maximum extra fee for for the blobs. And then also it had blob versioned hashes, which was a list of the versioned blob hashes associated with the transaction blobs. The blob fee is actually deducted and burned from the sender before the transaction executes, which means in the case of transaction failure, it's actually not refunded. And in a second, we will go into EIP 4844, proto dank sharding and blobs in more detail in Patrick's video. So wait a second for that. But we have two more transaction types to go through. And these are ZK Sync specific transaction types. So first we have EIP 712 transactions on ZK Sync and these are those type 113 transactions or 0x71 transactions and it defines typed structured data hashing and signing. As we know, EIP 712 introduced a way to standardize the version data and also the data to sign so that it could be decoded and understood in applications like Metamask. Type 113 transactions enable us to access ZK Sync specific features like account abstraction and paymasters and smart contracts must be deployed with these type 113 transactions. The fields for type 113 transactions are the same as standard Ethereum transactions plus a couple of additional additional fields. Gas per pub data, which is a field denoting the maximum gas the sender is willing to pay for a single byte of pub data. Pub data is simply the L2 state data that is submitted to the L1, the data that they are sending. Custom signature, which is a field for the custom signature for when the signer's account is not an EOA. Paymaster params, these are parameters for configuring a custom paymaster, so a smart contract that is going to pay for the transaction for us, and also factory depths. So this should contain the bytecode of the smart contract that is being deployed. Now, finally, we have type five transactions or 0xff. And these are priority transactions and they enable us to send transactions from the L1 to the L2 directly in ZK Sync. And so now we know all of the different transaction types. Before we head back to Remix, 
Here's Patrick, who's going to explain to us all about blobs, protein dank sharding, and EIP 4844 type 3 transactions. In a normal transaction, all your transaction data is stored on chain forever. That shitcoin that you bought, you thought would moon and went to zero? Yeah, everyone can see you did that forever. Blob transactions, a new transaction type, aka type 03, however, give you a box to cram in data that will eventually be deleted. Once the transaction is included in the block, it stores everything per usual, but after a short delay, maybe 20 to 90 days, we delete whatever you put in this box. This is known as the blob, which is sort of an acronym for binary large objects. A lot of people have been using the sidecar analogy, with a blob being the sidecar of a motorcycle, the motorcycle being the transaction, and we eventually light the sidecar on fire and throw it away. Blob transactions were included in the Ethereum Denkun upgrade on March 13th of 2024, and rollups have been absolutely loving it. These blob transactions came from EIP 4844, aka Proto Dank Sharding, which is a really cool name, but it was actually just named after the researchers who came up with this. So why do we give transactions this optional box for them to dump this temporary data? Well, it goes back to Ethereum's biggest issue today. That sending $1 cost me two dollars. Ethereum right now is crazy expensive. This is due to the blockchain trilemma problem and some other stuff, link in the description. Rollups are the solution that we've come to know to help scale Ethereum so that our transactions aren't this expensive. You can go to ZK Sync, Arbitrum, or Optimism, and you can send that $1 for substantially cheaper than you could on the Ethereum main chain. And we as a community have essentially settled on rollups being the way we're going to scale Ethereum for the next few to several years. The way they work is they essentially execute a bunch of transactions on their own chain, bundle up and compress the transactions into a batch and submit that batch back to Ethereum. With many L2s processing transactions, you can get a lot more transactions for a lot cheaper because you're compressing all these transactions on all these rollups or all these L2s. Now, when these L2s submit these batches back to Ethereum, Ethereum has to do a little work to verify that the batch of transactions is actually good. And that right there, is where the issue is. When the L1, when Ethereum verifies that a transaction is actually good, it only needs the compressed batch of transactions once to verify that it's good, and then it doesn't care about the data anymore. But before this upgrade, when you submitted this batch of compressed transactions, you had to submit the whole chunk of transactions and permanently stored on every single Ethereum node on the planet. You see the issue there? We needed this data for like a second and then every single node would have to hold on to it, even though nobody ever cared about that data ever again. It would be like if every single time you pass an exam in school, you had to carry that exam around with you at all times. What's more important than this state blow is actually the gas costs. If you store a ton of data on Ethereum or any L1, that means every single node has to store that data as well, which requires them to go out and buy more hardware or do more computation. And so if you want to store more data on Ethereum, you have to pay more gas. And since this compressed batch of transactions is still a ton of data that before this upgrade, we were permanently storing on Ethereum, rollups had to pay a ton of gas. So uh, the rollups were kind of pissed. They didn't love this and neither did the Ethereum community. So these rollups essentially said, hey, so like we're the future of Ethereum scaling, but this call data is super expensive. What if we just like deleted it after we validated our transactions were good? We'll post our compressed batch, we'll check that it's good, and then we'll dump it. That way we don't have to pay the cost of storing that data forever. And then we as the Ethereum community went, yeah, that sounds like a pretty good idea. And so the blob transactions were born. So, how are blobs used in practice? Embrace yourself, we're going to get a little technical here for a second. This is an example of a transaction on the Ethereum main chain where ZK Sync actually sent its batch of compressed transactions to the Ethereum L1. If you scroll down in here on Etherscan, you can actually see this new section here called Total Blobs. And if we click into this, which if we scroll down in here and we click one of these blobs here, we can see this massive chunk of data, like literally absolutely massive, that is not being stored on Ethereum because it was instead sent as a blob and will eventually be deleted. What's cool too is Etherscan gives us this little blob gas used and blob as call data gas here, where it shows you how much more expensive this data would have been if it was submitted as call data as opposed to blob data here. Obviously, it's way, way cheaper for rollups to submit this data as a blob than as call data, which is what they previously would have had to have done. Getting more technical here, what's interesting is that the L1 Ethereum smart contracts have to validate that this batch of transactions is actually good. They have to validate 
essentially that this blob is good. However, if they get access to the blob and they do computation with the blob, they would have to have access to the blob, which means they would need to store it on chain, which we can't do. So what the hell? And this is where the proto dank sharders were actually smart enough to see this coming and actually created a new opcode and a new precompile to do some math magic to verify these blobs. They created a new blob hash opcode and a new point evaluation precompile. And with these two new tools, that was all we really needed to do math cryptography magic, which there's a lot of that in Web3. The blob hash will instead essentially grab that whole blob and hash it using some math magic. And we can use this hash actually combined with some proofs that we submit in a function to actually verify that these blobs are good. For example, if we actually open this up in Tenderly and we scroll down, we can see there's this function here called verify blob information that gets called, which does exactly what it says. It's gonna verify the blob information. Looking at this function, we can see it takes some bytes call data called pub data commitments. This is essentially gonna be some cryptographic proofs that we generate off chain and some other data. And then the list of blob hashes, which we access with that blob hash opcode. And in this function, we eventually call this internal function called point precompile, which is where we send all that data to that precompile to help make sure that this data is actually solid. The exact function that's actually called with this ZK sync transaction in specific is this commit batches where it sends a ton of data, including these cryptographic proofs that's gonna combine with these blob hashes to make sure that the blob is actually solid. And boom, with this information here, we can now verify this blob, this batch of transactions is actually solid without having to store that massive chunk of data on chain and bankrupting these L2s, which are definitely not making a shit ton of money right now. And we're able to do a lot of this due to the beauties of cryptography. And that's how blobs work. So a quick recap of what blobs are. Blobs are a new transaction type that allows us to store data on chain for a short period of time. We can't access the data itself, but we can access a hash of the data with the new blob hash opcode. And blobs were added because rollups wanted a cheaper way to validate transactions. Now we showed you a quick example of ZK Sync, but in essence, this is how a lot of these rollups actually work. Quick summary of how the rollups actually validate these transactions. You submit your transaction with a blob along with some type of proof data. The contract on chain accesses the hash again of the blob with the blob hash opcode. It will then pass your blob hashes combined with your proof data to that new point evaluation opcode to verify the transaction batch using some math magic and boom. To demonstrate how to send your own transaction using a blob, I've actually created a little GitHub repo, link in the description, showing us how to send one of these transactions. First thing you're gonna wanna do is set up a connection to the blockchain per normal, and then just create some encoded text. For example, we're using this as our blob data. Now, the thing is blobs have to be at least 4,096 words of 32 byte words combined. So we actually have to take this encoded text and combine it with a ton of basically zeros so that we can create this, this blob. You cannot have a small blob, they're all big. Then what we do is we actually create our transaction object as you normally would. One of the big differences is we're gonna change the type of transaction to a type three transaction. Normally you'll see normal type two transactions, which is that EIP 1559 transaction and it's the default transaction now. Additionally, we wanna add some blob gas feed parameters to our transactions as well. One of the other really interesting implications of adding blobs is that we've essentially created a new type of gas market, a gas market for blobs, which has a whole bunch of interesting downstream effects video for another time. And then finally, we set up a gas estimate, we sign our transaction, and all we do is we add our blob data to a little blob compartment of our transaction, we sign it, and then we send it. If I wanted to run this on a local blockchain, we go just set up Anvil, set up my Anvil chain to run. And for this, I'm using Rye, which is like a Python thing. I would do Rye, run, send blob, actually run this. And we can see two responses here. We can see a transaction receipt right here. And then if we scroll up, we can see the actual blob that we're sending. And yes, I'm scrolling up this whole time. It's this massive object that we send. EIP 4844, aka Proto Dank Sharding, is this intermediate step in the Ethereum's long tail scaling roadmap and is a prerequisite to dank sharding, which includes a lot more cool features. Cooler than the name dank sharding too. But rollups are happening now and we said, hey, rollups are happening now. We need them cheaper now. So the Ethereum community implemented dank sharding. 
the Ethereum docs actually do a phenomenal job of explaining dank sharding, where it's going, what it's going to look like in the future. So now you understand blobs, proto dank sharding. If you want to try out sending your own blob transaction, check the link in the description. Thanks for getting froggy with us and we'll see you next time. Let's go back to Remix and have a look and see if we can understand what was going on there. Okay, so now that we understand both about EIP 712 signatures and transaction types, what actually is the mechanism or format that allowed Remix to be able to send a transaction for us in Remix by signing a message? Now, what happened here was it used something called account abstraction. And ZK Sync has native account abstraction, which means it's built into the blockchain. Account abstraction enables users' assets to be stored in smart contracts rather than externally owned accounts. This means that users can use smart contracts as their accounts rather than something like MetaMask. On Ethereum, there are two types of accounts, externally owned accounts, where you have a public and a private key and a user has to initiate and sign transactions. And then also contract accounts, where the smart contract itself is the account and any arbitrary logic can be implemented. So you can have things like multiple signers or the ability to have other people pay for your gas and send transactions for you. Accounts in ZK Sync era can initiate transactions just like an EOA, but can also have arbitrary logic implemented in them. And so they have account abstraction natively. And since smart contract accounts are fully programmable, this allows various customizations such as signature schemes, having multi-sig capabilities, you can set spending limits, etc. And this is the mechanism that allowed Remix to be able to send our transaction for us by us signing an EIP 712 message. And since ZK Sync has account abstraction natively, my Ethereum address on ZK Sync is automatically a smart contract account. And so Remix was able to send the transaction for us. Do not worry if you do not understand this because Patrick is going to be going through account abstraction in depth in the next section. So now that we understand all about signatures, how they work and how we can verify them, let's implement some signature verification into our smart contract right now. So the first thing that we're going to want to do when implementing this into our smart contract is we're going to want to pass the signature through to claim so that we can check it. I sign a message to say that yes, you can claim for my account so that I can receive the airdrop. So we are going to want to pass through the V, R and S components of our signature. So the types are uint8 v bytes32 r and a bytes32 s. First thing we're going to do is obviously check whether they've claimed or not already, because otherwise we don't want to check anything else. And then if they have, we want to check the signature. So if the signature is not valid, then we are going to want to revert with an invalid, not proof, signature custom error. So let's copy this and then declare that at the top. So now we have this custom error. So if the signature is not valid, then revert with this custom error. So how do we check whether the signature is valid? Well, let's create a function is valid signature. And it's going to be an internal function. So I'm going to start with a leading underscore is valid signature. And then we're going to want to pass through the account some message, which we'll define in a second, the V R and S components of the signature. And then also we only want to revert if this is false. So it's not a valid signature. Now, what is this message? So this message needs to be the digest, which we were explaining in the video earlier. We are going to create this message digest using a function and we're going to name it get message. And we're going to pass in here the account that we are wishing to claim for and the amount that they are wishing to claim. So that is the specific information about their function call. So let's implement that function now, those two functions. So we've got function get message to create the message digest. And this is going to take the address account and uint256 amount. And it is going to be public so that we can use it later to get messages so that we can sign them. And it's going to be view and it's going to return the bytes32 digest. And then we are going to return underscore hash typed data v4, which we need to get from open Zeppelin. And then we are going to Kekak encode hash together, ABI encode to glue these pieces together. 
the message type hash with the account and the amount. And here we need to make sure that this is a struct just to be extra verbose. You don't need to do this, but we are going to do so so that it's nice and clean. So first of all, we need to declare a struct. So let's create a struct and we are going to name it airdrop claim, if I can spell. And in here, we're going to have address, account and amount. And then additionally, we also need to declare the message type hash, which is going to be this hash of the type. So we've got the type hash now. Amazing. So now we can use that in here. So instead of this, we are actually going to say, we're going to say airdrop claim. And then in here, we're going to do named components. And then now we have the struct. So we have the message type hash and the message. We are encoding these together and then we are hashing them. And then we are passing that as an argument to underscore hash type data v4 which we need to get from open Zeppelin. So this underscore hash type data v4 is from the EIP 712 contract from open Zeppelin. So if we scroll down here, then we can see this hash type data v4. So what this function does is it returns the hash of the fully encoded EIP 712 message for this domain. So it sticks on all the extra information to make it EIP 712 compatible. So if we head in here, into domain separator v4, and then we go build domain separator. We can see that it's encoding together this type hash with the hash version, the address, which is because we're inheriting from this. Remember that it, the address this is going to be this contract. So we need to inherit from it is EIP, it's not 721, 712, so that we're using it. So that we are now inheriting all of these functions and we can use them in our smart contract. So now we have the version and the version specific data tagged onto our message and it is fully EIP 712 compatible. We now need to make sure we are calling the constructor of EIP 712. And this takes a name and a version. So I'm just gonna call this something like Merkle airdrop and I'm gonna say it's version one, something like that. And now we can use all of the functionality. So this function should behave as expected. Now there's something wrong here. I think I might have too many brackets. Nope, I'm just missing a semicolon. Right, so now the next function that we need, need to implement is going to be is valid signature. And this function needs to take the account that we want to check that the signature was signed by, the bytes32 digest and the signature. So uint8 v bytes32 r and yes, all of the rest is correct apart from this line. This is going to be slightly different because we don't want to be using EC recover directly. Internal view returns. This is actually going to be pure because it's not going to be modifying anything. Returns Boolean, whether it is valid or not. So now we are going to be using ECDSA try recover. So we're going to have some parentheses. We're going to go address actual signer that we have recovered. And then we don't need the error and we don't need the signature length equals ECDSA recover from open Zeppelin. And we pass through the digest, the V, the R and the S. And then we return actual signer equals equals this account. So now we need to import ECD, the ECDSA library from open Zeppelin so that we can use this function. And all this function is doing again, it's recovering the sign up from the signature. And then it calls this internal try recover. And then what try recover does is it checks the signature malleability, which we talked about earlier. So checks it that the, the S is in fact restricted. And then it uses EC recover to get the signer and checks that the signer is not the zero address. Like we were saying earlier, we want to make sure we are not returning some erroneous zero address that we will need to check for. We need to then return the signer. So we've returned the signer here, which is the actual signer of this signature. And then we compare it against the account. So if we scroll back up here and here we've got a message error because I've done 721 rather than 712 as per always. So if we scroll back up here, we now do check if the signature is not valid by getting the message digest, passing it through with the account. And we check whether this account is the same as the one recovered by the signature using the digest. And then if it's not valid, we revert. Phew, that was a lot. 
let's try and implement this back into our test now. Don't worry if this seems a little bit confusing. I'm hoping that by going over things in the previous lesson and then seeing this again implemented, this might be starting to come together and make some sense. But what we've basically done is we've implemented a signature so that someone else can call claim with our address and we, part, we give them a signature to say, yes, you can claim. I would like to receive this airdrop, but I don't want to pay for my gas fees myself. And it enables someone to be able to call this function for us to pay for our gas fees with our permission. So let's implement this into our test right now. Okay, so now we're back in our test. User wants someone else to be able to claim for them. So we're going to create another address, which is going to call claim. And then user is going to sign a message using their private key. Remember I said earlier, this is why we're going to be using make adder and key, because we're going to use the private key to sign a message to say, yes, you can claim for me. So we need another address. I'm just going to put it up here. Address. We're going to call it gas payer because we're super creative like that. And then we're going to use make adder gas payer equals make adder, which is again, just one of those helpful things that comes with foundry. And we're going to call this gas payer. And then in our test function, we want to prank the user to sign a message, which then the gas payer calls claim using the sign message to send the transaction for them and pay the gas. So we prank that the user signs a message first. So the first thing we need to do is we need to get the message digest. So we've got bytes32 digest equals, and then we can, because we made it a public function, we can call the airdrop contract and we can say get message hash, I think it was called. Did we call it get message hash? No, we didn't, but let's call it, I guess, get message hash because it's more clear. User is the address that we want and amount to claim. So now we have the digest, we can then sign the digest. To do this and get the V, the R and the S, which is gonna be a uint 8 V bytes 32 R bytes 32 S equals, we can use the cheat code vm.sign, which will take the private key. So we've got that user proof key from before and the digest. So now we have this V at the R and the S. Now, when we call claim, we can pass through the V, the R and the S. Now we need to prank this vm.prank gas payer to make them the person that's calling this function. And now this will all be the same as before. We want to check that the user's balance has in fact increased. So if we save this, open up my terminal again, let's run the test. Ah, we now have an incorrect identifier because I changed the name of the function, but then when I used it, I didn't change the name accordingly. So let's run the test again, see if there are any errors. Cannot overwrite a prank until it is applied at least once. We don't need to prank the user because this is just signing. We don't really need them to call it. We've got their private key. So let's run the test again and it passed. We have now used signatures to say that someone else can claim the airdrop for us. They can pay for our gas fees and we don't have them sending these transactions without our permission. We are giving permission for them to do that by implementing signatures into our Merkle airdrop contract. This is massive. We have gone through a lot. We have understood Merkle trees and Merkle proofs and we have implemented them into an airdrop contract. We have then done the same with signatures, understood transaction types. We have then implemented signature verification into our smart contract and we have tested it. So now, before we make an interaction script and we start deploying to Anvil and to a ZK Sync local node and to ZK Sync Sepolia, I think this is probably a good time to go and take a break. As Patrick would say, go get a drink, go get a coffee, go get some food, go get some ice cream and let this information marinate. If you have any questions, leave them in the discussions tab of the GitHub repo associated with this course and shoot us with all of your questions so we can answer them and I will see you very shortly. This section is optional if you don't want to be working on ZK Sync. Now, before we continue, let's just test that all of this works as expected on ZK Sync. So to do that, we are going to run foundry up dash ZK Sync, and this is going to install the ZK Sync fork of foundry. And once that is done, we can run forge build dash dash ZK Sync to compile our smart contracts using the ZK Sync compiler. 
which works a little bit differently than the Salt compiler. So we need to double check that everything builds correctly for when we're going to be deploying to ZK Sync. Amazing. We've got some warnings here, which normally you should not ignore warnings, but essentially what it's saying is that we shouldn't really use EC recover unless we're sure that the signature comes from an account with an ECDSA private key attached as ZK Sync era has native account abstraction. So there may be other accounts which have other signature schemes rather than ECDSA. So we need to make sure that these accounts on Ethereum are not smart contract wallets. They are in fact EOAs and then they will have a smart contract account on ZK Sync because ZK Sync has native account abstraction, but that's fine. As long as it implements ECDSA signatures and it has an EOA associated with it, on Ethereum and it's not a smart contract wallet on Ethereum, then everything should work fine. So we can safely ignore all these warnings and we are in fact using an interface like ERC20, IERC20. So this warning is also fine. Right, so now if we run forge test dash dash ZK sync dash BV to test on ZK sync and it passes. So our tests now pass on ZK sync as well. Amazing. Okie croaky. So the next thing that we are going to want to do is create an interaction script so that we can claim the airdrop. And what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to sign a message using one account who is in the Merkle tree to say that another person can claim the airdrop for them. And then in our script, we are going to use that signature to claim the airdrop for another account that is in the Merkle tree. To do that, we need to create, of course, an interaction script. So let's create a script inside the script folder called interact.s.sol. And then we shall do the regulars. So SPDX, license, identify MIT, pragma solidity 0.8.24. And then we're gonna import script from the Forge standard library. And then also we are going to want to get the most recently deployed airdrop contract. And to do that, as per usual, we are going to be using the DevOps tools from Foundry DevOps. So we can go import, Dev ops tools from not the Forge Sun library, from the foundry dash dev slash source slash DevOps tools. Cool. So the other thing I noticed earlier was that we had a little lib slash here like this, and I just went ahead and removed it. And then in my foundry toml, I just added this line to say foundry DevOps slash equals lib slash foundry DevOps slash so that I didn't have to say lib every time. You could have left it as is and added lib here, but I just, I wanted to do it like this. And the other thing we're going to need is we are going to need our Merkle airdrop contract so that we can call a claim. We need the ABI. So we're going to need it. I'm going to call it claim airdrop is script. So we have all the script functionality. Then we can create a function run to run the script, make it external. And then in here, we are going to want to get the most recently deployed Merkle airdrop contract. So we've got an address, most recently deployed, same as usual, equals dev ops tools dot get underscore most underscore recently underscore recent underscore deploy. And then in here we need the name of the contract, which is just Merkle airdrop. And then we need the chain, which is going to be block dot chain ID. And then we need to pass this contract address through to a function, which we're going to create in a second. So I'm going to call my function claim airdrop and I'm going to pass through the address. Let's now create that function. So we can do function claim airdrop, not with a capital, the lowercase c, which is going to take an address. We're going to call this airdrop, make this public. And then in here, we're going to want to call claim. So we need to wrap the address in Merkle airdrop, the interface, so that we can get the function. We can get the function signature so we know what things to pass through. And we can call claim. And then in here, we're going to need the claiming address, which is the address who's going to be receiving the airdrop, the claiming amount, the proof array, and the V, the R, and the S components of the signature. We're also going to want to do a little vm.start broadcast as per usual and then vm.n broadcast. Let's try and declare some of these variables. So, so we're going to do an address, claiming address equals 
and I am going to make this script work for Anvil. You could switch it out this claiming address for whoever is going to be signing the message, but I have in this input file made this second address the default Anvil key so that we can sign the message and run end the end-to-end -end flow on Anvil. You could switch this out for whatever address you have that you want to be claiming the airdrop and then in your interaction script, you're gonna to want to put that address there, but we are using the default Anvil address. So now we have the claiming address. Now we need to have the claiming amount, which is gonna be 25 bagel tokens, and it has 18 decimals. And now we need this bytes 32 array proof. So as before, we need the bytes 32 proof one, and then we are also going to need the bytes 32 proof two. And both of these things, again, like with the test, we can get from the output. So if we find the address input, it's this, then these are the two proofs. So if we copy the first one, chuck it in there, and then we copy the second one, and then we chuck it in there. Great. Now we need to set them to proof. So we need to put them inside the array. So we're gonna have proof one and proof two inside the array. And now we can pass this through, great. Okay, so what about this VRNS? Okay, so to get the VRNS, we need to sign the message using this account, the account that we want to claim. They are going to be in this demonstration different from the account which is going to be calling this script, is going to be running this script and calling claim. This account, the default Anvil account, can receive the airdrop for free. So we need to give them permission. So that means we need to sign a signature. There are a couple of ways with Foundry that we can sign signatures. The first one we have already seen, and that was when we use this vm.sign. And we could create another script in which you do another vm.sign, and that would work perfectly fine on Anvil or any chain in which Foundry scripts run correctly. So it wouldn't work for ZK Sync, for instance. At the time of recording, you cannot run scripts correctly on ZK Sync. And the other reason is because maybe you don't want to be creating a script. Maybe you're just interacting with a protocol and you just want to be able to create a signature quickly. So I'm going to show you another way that we can create signatures and that is using cast wallet sign. And what this command is going to do is it's going to create us a signature, which is going to have the VR and S components all together. It's going to be one bytes object. And then we're going to have to break it down into the VR and S components. So let's go ahead and first create our signature. Okie dokie, let's create a signature using the default Anvil key to say that the second default account who is going to be running this script can in fact claim for us. So firstly, to do that, we are actually going to want to get the data to sign. So I'm hoping that at this point you have an Anvil running, an Anvil local node, and you have deployed both the bagel token and the airdrop contract to it. But in case if you have canceled your Anvil node or whatever, let's run it again. The first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is a little Foundry up to make sure that we're on the vanilla version of Foundry, not the ZK version of Foundry. And then you can copy the make file associated with this course so that we can run make deploy. And what this is gonna do is it's just gonna run our script. Nope, first I need to, start my Anvil local node. And then once that's done, I can run make deploy. And then up here, you can see we have the Merkle airdrop token and the bagel token successfully deployed. So now what we can do is we can copy this Merkle airdrop token and we can call on this contract, get message hash to get the data to sign. So let's do that now. We can run cast call, paste in the address of the airdrop contract get the function signature, which is get message hash. And this takes an address and a uint256. And then we need to put in those two variables. So we copy the address and the claiming amount. And then we need the RPC URL, which is just HTTP colon slash slash low post colon 8545. And now we have the data to sign. So now we can use cast wallet sign to sign this message. And the other thing that we're going to add is we're going to add dash dash no dash hash so that so that this command doesn't hash the message again because sometimes you can use this to sign a message that is purely a string like Kira is awesome and you can sign that. However, because we already have bytes, we don't need them to hash that again. So we can just add this dash dash no hash and then we paste in the bytes to sign and then we're going to do dash dash private key and then we're going to paste the first default Anvil key private key. 
Now, if you were doing this on a test net or and using an actual address, an actual account, then you are not going to be doing private key here. You're going to instead do dash dash account and then you're going to use your key store account to sign the message. So you're not going to be using private key. The reason I'm pasting my private key in here is because it's not mine. It's the default Anvil key that is public. So if we scroll up here in the terminal, in our Anvil terminal, we can get the first default Anvil key. We can paste that in there and we can sign the message. Now we want to copy this message apart from the O and the X so that we can use this signature, we can break it up into the VRNS components and pass it through to claim. When you use cast wallet sign, you create one single signature. However, what we need is we need a V and R and an S broken up individually because that's what our API is taking. We could have designed this just to take a simple bytes signature, which had all of the, this information, the V, R and the S packed together. And the way we would have had to do this is when we verified the signature using this try recover. So you could instead use this try recover from Open Zeppelin, which takes just a signature and then splits it up itself into the V, the R and the S. And it does this using assembly. So it takes the first 32 bytes and sets it to R, the second 32 bytes and sets it to S, and the final byte and sets it to V. And then it uses the regular version of try recover that we were using before that takes the V and R and S individually. So it's up to you how you want to design your protocol. Do you want your users to be having to provide their VNR and S separately or just one signature? Different signing methods output different things. So some, including cast wallet sign, output just the byte signature. Whereas if you use vm.sign, it gives you the V, the R and the S separately. So it's up to you how you want to implement it, but we have chosen to design it with VNR and S separately. And then I will show you how we can unpack a signature into the individual components and how we're going to create signatures in a second. But I just thought it was worth noting that you can do either or and it's a very easy swap out. Let's split up the signature into the VR and S components now. So the first thing we want to do is we want to save this byte signature as a variable. And the way we do that is use the keyword hex and then you have quotations and then you plonk the data in there without the OX. And let's just make this private because we don't want inheriting contracts, inheriting scripts to, to use it. Right, so now in order to be able to pass this through, we need to break it up. So let's create a function that will do that. So we've got uint eight, v bytes 32 r and bytes 32 s equals. Now you might think that you could do like an abi.decode. However, the signature is not created using ABI encode, but instead it's an ABI encode packed. So all of the V, R and S, well actually in this case, it's gonna be R then S then V, are packed together, they're concatenated together. Instead you've just got this whole thing is literally just the V, the R and the S. The first one is R, which is the first 32 bytes. The second part is S, which is the second 32 bytes. And the final byte is V. So we purely just need to break this up to find them. So instead of doing ABI decode, we're gonna make a little function called split signature. Then we're gonna pass through that signature. Let's create that function now. So we've got a function called split signature, which is gonna take a bytes object, call it sig. Let's make it public, returns uint 8 v bytes 32 r and bytes 32 s. And then in here, we are going to do something very similar to what this copilot code is saying. So we first need to require that the length of the signature is equal to 65 bytes. And that's because 32 plus 32 plus 1 is 65. And then that's the length of v, r and s altogether. And otherwise we will return with this string invalid signature length. Now we need to do the exact code that it says here. So we are using assembly to break up the signature into V, R and S. Now, weirdly, when you have a signature, which is combined together, the V, R and S, R is actually first. So it goes R, then S, then V. However, when you're using functions, so like when you're using Open Zeppelin or you're interacting with an API of some description, it usually follows the format V then R then S. It can be a little bit confusing, 
But if you're using a function, typically it's going to be V, R, and S. And then if you're looking at a signature, you're breaking it up, you're packing it together, it's going to be R, then S, then V. So what this assembly code is doing looks kind of scary, but don't worry too much. We don't need to worry specifically about what all these words mean. This will be covered in depth in a later part of the course. There is actually an assembly and formal verification course, and it will be covered in depth there. But from memory, we are loading the first 32 bytes and then setting it to R. Then we are getting the second 32 bytes and setting it to S. And then we're getting the final byte and setting it to V and returning it. So actually, rather than doing a require here, I'm going to do a custom error. So we're going to say if the signature length is not equal to 65 bytes, then we're going to revert with not invalid signature. I'm going to do underscore underscore claim uh, drop script so that we know where the error is coming from underscore invalid signature length. And then let's copy that, add that to the top of our script contract. So we can say error that. And then we can also restrict this to pure. So if you see here the require statement instead of the if and then revert in the rest of this recording, or you see the contract without this error message, just note that I had to make this modification afterwards because I wanted to save the gas. So you should be doing this, not a require statement, and you should have this error at the top of your script. Now we have used cast call to get the message to sign. And then we've used cast wallet sign dash dash no hash to sign the message. And then we have split up the message into the V, the R and the S. So now if you ever need to have a signature to interact with a protocol that requires you to have a signature, you can do it both if it's the full signature or even if you need the V and the R and the S split up separately. You know how to do both, which is amazing. Right, so now that we have done that, we can safely run our script and hopefully it'll work as expected. So we can run forge script and then the path script slash interact dot s dot sol colon claim airdrop dash dash rpc dash url http colon slash slash localhost 8545 private dash key again this is going to be dash dash account if you're working on an actual test net or main net chain not on like a local node However, I am actually going to use this second Anvil key so that I can claim and pay the gas fees for this first one. So the second Anvil key is the one that's going to be calling claim so that the first address is the one that is going to receive the tokens. And then we need dash dash broadcast. And I think that is everything that we need. So we can run this command and we have an error. I've been silly. This isn't end broadcast, it's stop broadcast. No matter how many times I run scripts, I always forget what the API is like, okay, let's run it again. Remember chain ID not found. Have I spelt it wrong? Yes, I have. Missed an I and then let's run again. And I've also spent spelt deployment wrong. <laughs> deployment, there we go again. And we have successfully completed the claim. However, we're gonna wanna check this. We wanna check whether the first address has in fact received the airdrop. So we can run cast call on the token contract. So if we just scroll up, we can retrieve this token contract address so that we can get the balance of that first default Anvil address. We need balance of, and this takes an address, and that is the function signature of the balance of function on the token contract. And then the address that we are going to want is the first Anvil address. And if we execute that, then we get this horrible looking piece of data. So we now need to do cast dash dash two dash deck to convert this data into decimals. And you can see this is in fact the amount that we airdropped to them. They have received the airdrop. Fantastic. Our script worked. We airdropped 25 bagel tokens to the default Anvil address using the second default Anvil address to pay for the gas by using a signature created using the first default Anvil address. They said, yep, go ahead, use my signature and you can claim so that I can receive the airdrop. And it all worked as expected. Amazing. This section is optional if you don't want to be working on ZK Sync. Let's now do the same thing, but on a ZK Sync local node. So the first thing that we want to do is we want to run foundry up dash ZK Sync to get the ZK Sync fork of foundry. And we also want to kill this Anvil node. Now, Things are a little bit more tricky and difficult on ZK Sync and ZK Sync Local Node, 
because we cannot use scripts at the time of recording. So I have gone ahead and made a bash script to run all of the commands. And what we're gonna do instead is we're going to run through what the script looks like. I'm gonna walk you through what commands it's running. And then we're just gonna go ahead and run it. And it's gonna be one command. It's gonna be super pretty and lovely. Instead, you're just gonna understand exactly what commands you are using. And you could then go and do it from scratch yourself. But I don't expect you to write this bash script from scratch. Instead, I want you to copy this from the GitHub research repo associated with this course. We're gonna create a file called interactzk.sh. And then you can paste in the script, which is called the exact same thing on the GitHub repo. So in here, we have different variables that we need. So we've got the default ZK sync local key. This is the private key for this address, which is the default ZK sync account. And this is the account which is going to be calling claim. It's going to be paying for the gas so that the default anvil key, the same address as before, is going to receive the airdrop. So as before, we need the private key so that we can sign the message. And we're going to do that the exact same way as before. Then we also have the root and two proofs. We have the proofs for the default Anvil key. So we've got the root and the two proofs, same as before, because we're going to need to deploy the bagel token contract and also the airdrop contract. So we need to pass through the root to the constructor. So the first thing this does is it starts a ZK sync local node using the ZK sync CLI. So to be able to run this command, you actually need to have Docker installed and running. So make sure Pause here if you need to do that. And then it deploys the token contract, the bagel token contract, and just prints that to the terminal so we can see what's going on. Then it uses that to deploy the airdrop contract and it passes through the root and the token address as the constructor arguments. And then it prints that to the terminal again. Then we get the message hash by calling get message hash using the default anvil address and the number of tokens that we want them to be receiving. We get the message hash. Then we sign the message again using cast wallet sign. We get the private key for the default anvil key, the one who wants to be receiving the airdrop. And then we clean that signature by again, removing that OX at the start. And then we print that clean signature to signature.txt. We then run a script called split signature. And that is going to do the same as what we did before when we used assembly to split the signature into V, R and S. And it's gonna take the signature from the signature.txt file. And then it will output the V, the R and the S to the terminal. We will go ahead and create this file in a second. I will loop back to it. So then we need to send tokens to the token owner. So we are creating an initial supply and we can do that because we are in fact, the deployers of the token contract, therefore we are the owner. And then we need to transfer those tokens to the airdrop contract, which again, we can do because we are the owner of the bagel token contract. So we created an initial supply, then we sent them to the airdrop contract. Then we call claim on behalf of this default Anvil address, but using the default ZK sync address. And we pass through the proofs and the signature, as well as the address that we want to be claiming and the amount. Then we get that hex balance by again doing cast call to get the balance of the default Anvil address on the bagel token contract. And then we output this to the terminal in a very nice way using cast dash dash to deck, the same as before. And then we just clean up by removing that file, the temporary file that we did to put the signature into so that we could read it in our script. Let's create that script very quickly now. So we're going to call it split signature.s.sol. And then again, because we've already run through this, you can just go ahead and copy and paste this from the GitHub repo. And this is doing the exact same thing as before. It's using assembly to get the first 32 bytes, setting it to R, the second 32 bytes and setting it to S, and the last byte and setting it to V. And then in run, we are reading this signature.txt file. We're passing the bytes to get it into bytes form from string. And then we are splitting it into V, R and S using that split signature function. And then we are logging that to the terminal so that Interact can read from the terminal the V, the R and the S so that we can then use them when we are claiming. So make sure you have Docker running. And then we are gonna run chmod plus x interact zk and and dot slash interact dot sh. And what this is doing is this part makes the script executable. Then we've got and and to say we've got another command and then dot slash which runs and then the file which is interact zk dot sh to run the file. Let's enter that. So we're creating a zk sync local node, deploying the token contract with the address deploying the Merkle airdrop contract with the address. We're now signing the message. 
So we're calling the function to get the message hash, and then we are running cast wallet sign to sign the message, we're getting the V and the R and the S, and then we can pass it through to claim. We claim the tokens, and then we can see that the balance of the claiming address has in fact increased. It worked, amazing. Let's finally deploy to ZK Sync Sapolia so that we can wrap all of this up and then we will be all finished here. Let's do that now. Here we are going to be deploying to ZK Sync Sapolia, but feel free to deploy to whatever rollup of your choosing. Okay, finally, let's deploy to ZK Sync Sapolia. How exciting. We're going to have to do everything from scratch, not using scripts, which I don't actually recommend. I recommend when you're deploying even to a test net, you don't want to be getting things wrong and wasting funds. So you ideally want to be using a script. So feel free to go ahead and choose another chain where you can literally just run this deploy Merkle airdrop script to deploy the contracts, and then also this interact script to interact with your contract. You can do that from another chain that supports vanilla foundry and you can run scripts. But as of, as of recording, you cannot do that on ZK Sync. So I'm going to be doing everything using my terminal instead. So first of all, we need to deploy the token contract. So we can run forge create. Ah, there's actually something I wanted to explain very quickly now. The first thing I want to explain is that I'm going to be doing everything using an already imported wallet. I have two wallets in my MetaMask and I have named them Updraft and Updraft2 as key stores. So I can do dash dash account and then I can say Updraft or Updraft2 like this. So what I'm gonna do is because I've already put my account address for Updraft2 that is in my wallet key store in the input here. So this address is actually mine. So it's already saved in my key store so that I'm never gonna be using dash dash private key. And then the other account that I'm gonna be using is Updraft, who's gonna be deploying all the contracts and calling claim for Updraft2, which is this address. So forge create, let's deploy that token contract. And then we need the path source slash bagel token dot s dot sol. No, it's not a script. <laughs> We've been doing too many scripts. Dot sol colon bagel token. And then we don't have any constructor arcs, so I can just do dash dash RPC dash URL dollar curly brace ZK sync subpolia RPC URL. Now make sure that in your ENV file, you already have this and you've run source.env to make sure that your command line can see these variables. And you're going to want to use this RPC URL here. As of recording, the Alchemy Arc PC URL is not working 100% correctly. Maybe when you run this, it could be up and running and work completely fine. But I was having issues, so I'm using this RPC URL. And then we are going to add dash dash account. And for me, it's going to be Updraft. That's what my Updraft. And that's what my key store wallet is called. It's called Updraft. And yours might be default or default key or something like that. And then we're going to add dash dash legacy to make it a type zero transaction and then dash dash ZK sync. Now, maybe I didn't actually run source.env and let's run it again. And now I need to enter my key store password for updraft. I'll go ahead and do that now. So we have now deployed the bagel token contract to this address. Now let's save that as a temporary local environment variable by using the keyword export. And we're gonna call it token address equals and paste it in there so that we can use that later. Now let's deploy our airdrop contract. So again, forge create source slash Merkle airdrop dot sol colon Merkle airdrop. And now we need the constructor args dash dash constructor args. Then we need the token contract token address. And then we need that root hash, which we can get from our output file root copy it, paste it in there. We don't need to save this as environment variable because we're only going to use it once. And actually this needs to be the other way around. So. Let's remove that, swap them around because it's the root first and then the token contract. So dollar token address dash dash RPC dash URL ZK sync Sapolia RPC URL dash dash account updraft dash dash legacy to make it type zero dash dash ZK sync. Enter your password again. By the way, we don't need to worry about these warnings here. I think I mentioned that earlier, but it's fine because we all we need to do is make sure that these inputs, these addresses are not smart contract accounts on Ethereum. And also because we are using EC Recover, the other thing we need to do is make sure 
that the smart contract account, which is native on ZK Sync, is using ECDSA signatures. Other signature algorithms can be used. So just be careful on ZK Sync and make sure that the addresses you are airdropping to do use ECDSA signatures and not some other signature algorithm. So we have successfully deployed our contract to this address. So let's again, save that to an environment variable. So we can run export airdrop equals and then paste it in there. So the next thing we need to do is we need to get the message to sign. And then we need, I need my account to the one that's in the Merkle tree, this OX2EA blah, 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 to sign the message. So we can run fast call airdrop address. Function signature is get message hash and it takes an address and a UNT 256. Then the address that we want is going to be this one. This is the one which is going to receive the airdrop and the amount is this 25 bagel tokens dash dash RPC dash URL dollar ZK sync RPC URL and that's it. So now we have the message to sign. So now we can use cast wallet sign using my second wallet in my key store, my second account on MetaMask to sign the message. So we can go cast wallet sign then we need dash dash no hash like before then we need the bytes to sign then i'm going to use dash dash account and i'm going to use updraft two to use my second account the one who is in the merkle tree and is going to receive the airdrop so i need to enter my password so now i have the bytes i can go ahead and copy that and then i can go into split signature and i will need to make a little file called signature.txt and i need to paste that in there and remove the OX. So I'm just kind of doing what the script was gonna do for me. And then that means that split signature can use the signature.txt file to get the signature and split it up into the V, the R and the S. So let's run this script now. So we can run forge script, script slash split signature.s.sol colon split signature. And now we have the V, the R and the S components. Let's save them into variables. So export V equals 27, export R equals, copy this, paste it in there. Export S equals, copy this, paste it in there. And now we can run claim. So we can claim on behalf of account two. But first we need to create an initial supply and we need to transfer the tokens to the airdrop contract. So let's quickly do that now. So we're gonna run cast send. We need the token address. We need to mint tokens, which takes an address and a uint256. And we are going to mint to my address in my MetaMask the one who deployed the contract, the owner, and then the amount, which is going to be four times the amount that each person can claim so that the contract holds the entire amount that needs to be airdropped. Oops, don't know why I press enter. And then we need dash dash account. And then this is going to be first account because they are the owner of the contract. Then we need dash dash RPC dash URL, ZK sync, Sapolia RPC URL. And the transaction has been successful. So now we need to send those tokens to the airdrop contract so that it can perform the airdrops. So we can run cast send. We're almost there. We need the token contract. We want to run transfer, which takes an address and an amount UN256. Then we want to send to the airdrop address and we want to send them four times the amount that each person can claim. There are four claimers again, and then dash dash account. And then it's going to be for me called updraft, but this is whoever you have been deploying all the contracts with and the person who's going to call claim dash dash RPC URL, ZK sync, Polia RPC URL. And we've now transferred the tokens to the airdrop contract. So let's call claim. Let's use our first account to claim for our second account where the second account is in the Merkle tree. I know it sounds like I keep repeating this, but I feel like it could be a little bit confusing. So I just want to keep repeating. Right. So we've got car sent. We're calling the airdrop contract. We are calling claim, which takes as parameters an address. The UNT 56 bytes 32 array, which is the proof. UNT 8, which is V. Bytes 32, which is R. Bytes 32, which is S. Now let's put all those parameters in. So the first one is the address that wants to claim, which is my second address then the amount, then the proof array. So we've got an array like this. And then in here, we want to be putting the proof. So let's get those proofs for my account. So we need to find that address. This is my address. So I need to get those two proofs, number one and number two, and then we can get V, R and S. Then we need dash dash account, updraft, dash dash RPC, dash URL. 
ZK Sync, Sepolia, RPC, URL, enter my password. And it says we have successfully called claim, but let's check that. Let's run cast call on the token contract to check the balance of my second address. So we need balance of an address, function signature, and then the address is my second account. So let's copy that address, put it in there, dash dash RPC URL. So the last time you're gonna have to do this, ZK Sync Sepolia RPC URL. You can see it's non-zero. Let's do a little cast dash dash two deck. Amazing. You can see that on ZK Sync, we have in fact claimed 25 bagel tokens for my second account using my first account to pay for the gas by signing a transaction with my second account to say, yes, my first account can call claim and have the tokens airdropped to my second account. Let's have a look at this on ZK Sync Scanner. So you can see in here, we have in fact got a transaction. 25 bagel tokens were sent to my account. It has worked. We haven't yet processed on Ethereum, so this is not completely final, but we can consider this as final because we're on ZK Sync and it's amazing. That was so cool. So now we can just wrap things up and give a brief summary of everything that we have learned. Okay, so in this module, we have learned what an airdrop is, what a Merkle tree is, and the fact that we can use Merkle trees to prove that some data is in a group of data. We can use it to verify that they are in fact in that data. We can use this to airdrop tokens without having to loop through an array. We have learned how to use signatures, how to create them using both vm.sign and cast wallet sign. We've learned how to use signatures inside our smart contracts and verify them using Open Zeppelin, which implements EC Recover. And we've done this in a safe and secure way. We have tested our smart contract. We have created a script to deploy our smart contract and interact with it. We have then done that on Anvil, on ZK Sync Local Node, and then finally on ZK Sync Sepolia. We have learnt what different transaction types are, how signatures work and how ECDSA works. There was a lot of information here, so don't worry if you feel a little bit confused. Don't worry if you're completely confused. Feel free to watch the whole thing again to read up some more as always, as this was a lot of information and it was a lot to take in. But with that said, it's done. So as always, time to take a break. Let this information solidify and come back to have some more Patrick fun. And I will see you very shortly and enjoy the rest of your course. All right, and welcome to lesson 13, Boundary Upgrades, where we're gonna learn about upgradable smart contracts, the pros and their cons. Now, I've actually done a couple different versions of this type of video in the past. So we're gonna go through an old video explaining the concepts of this. Then we're gonna move over to Remix and we're gonna explain an important sub lesson. And then we're gonna go to our VS Code and we're actually gonna do all of this in Foundry. Upgradable smart contracts are something that I'm gonna go ahead and just say right out loud, we should deploy as little as possible. We should not be defaulting to upgradable smart contracts. It sounds like a good idea in theory, but we've seen time and time again, whenever a protocol has a centralized control over contracts, issues happen, full stop. So when going through this course and when learning about this, keep this in mind, what are the downsides of upgradable smart contracts? And then you can begin to ask questions. Have we seen examples in real life where these downsides have come to a fruition? And I'll say right now, 100% the answer is yes. So keep that in mind when watching this and use this knowledge to make yourself be an even better smart contract dev. So let's learn. Now I'm editing this video much later after I filmed it, hence why I have a beard. So I'll be jumping in from time to time, updating some of the sections. When deploying your smart contracts on chain, we all know that those smart contracts are immutable or unchangeable. But what if I told you that they were mutable? Well, technically I wouldn't be correct. However, smart contracts actually can change all the time. When people transfer tokens, when people stake in a contract or really do any type of functionality, those smart contracts have to update their balances and update their mappings and update their variables to reflect this. The reason that they're immutable is that the logic itself never changes and will be on chain like that forever. 
So technically, yes, once they are deployed, they are immutable. And this is actually one of the major benefits of smart contracts in the first place, that nobody can tamper with or screw with our smart contracts once we deploy them. However, this can be an issue if, for example, we want to upgrade our smart contract or protocol to do more things, or we want to fix some glaring bug or issue that we have. Now, even though we can't change the specific code that's been deployed to an address, we can actually do a lot more than you think. And in this video, we're going to explain the different methodologies behind upgrading your smart contracts, and then we're gonna show you how to do it with Hardhat and Open Zeppelin. Huge shout out to a lot of Open Zeppelin and Trail of Bits articles that helped me put this video together, uh, and a number of other sources as well, links in the description. So let's get to it. Now, at first glance, you might be thinking, rum, 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 rum. if you can upgrade your smart contracts, then they're not really immutable then. Rum, 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 rum. And in a way, you'd be right. So when explaining kind of the different philosophies and patterns that we can use here, we do need to keep in mind the philosophies and decentralization implications that each one of these patterns have, as they do all have different advantages and disadvantages. And yes, some of the disadvantages here are going to affect decentrality. So we need to keep that in mind. And this is why it's so important that before you go ahead and jump in and start deploying upgradable smart contracts, you understand the trade-offs. So we're going to talk about three different ways to upgrade your smart contracts. The first one being the not really slash parameterized way to upgrade your smart contracts, the social migration method, and then the method that you probably have heard about, which is proxies, which have a ton of subcategories like metamorphic contracts, transparent upgradable proxies, and universal upgradable proxies. So let's talk about the not really upgrading method or the parameterization method, or whatever you want to call it. This is the simplest way to think about upgrading your smart contracts. And it really isn't upgrading our smart contracts because we can't really change the logic of the smart contract. Whatever logic that we've written is there. We also can't add new storage or state variables, so this is really not really upgrading, but it is something to think about. Upgrades is just parameterizing everything. Whatever logic that we've deployed is there, and that's what we're interacting with. This function means we just have a whole bunch of setter functions and we can update certain parameters. Like maybe we have a reward parameter that gives out a token at 1% every year or something like that. Maybe we have a setter function that says, hey, update that to 2% or update that to 4%. It's just a setter function that changes some variable. Now, the advantages here are obviously this is really simple to implement. The disadvantage is that if you didn't think of some logic or some functionality the first time you deployed their smart contract, that's too bad. You're stuck with it. You can't update the logic or really update anything uh, with the parameterization, aka not really method. And the other thing you have to think about is who the admins are. Who has access to these setter functions, to these updating functions? If it's a single person, Guess what? You have a centralized smart contract. Now, of course, you can add a governance contract to be the admin contract of your protocol, and that would be a decentralized way of doing this. So just keep that in mind. You can do this method, just need a governance protocol to do so. Another example of this might be a contract registry, and this is something actually that early versions of Aave used. Before you call a function, you actually check some contract registry that is updated as a parameter by somebody, and you get routed to that contract and you do your call there. Again, this really doesn't allow us to have the full functionality of upgrades here. You can argue that this registry is a mix of one of the later versions, but for all intents and purposes, this doesn't really give us that flexibility that we want for our upgrades. But some people might even think that upgrading your smart contract is ruining the decentrality. And one of the things that makes smart contracts so potent is that they are immutable and that this is one of the benefits that they have. So there are some people who think that you shouldn't add any customization or any upgradability. You should deploy your contract and then that's it. Trillabits has actually argued that if you deploy your contract knowing that it can't be changed later, you take a little bit extra time making sure you get everything right and there are often less security vulnerabilities because you're just setting it, forgetting it, and not looking at it again. Now, if I wanted to upgrade a smart contract with this philosophy in mind, the philosophy that I do want to keep my smart contracts immutable, we can instead use the social migration method, which I previously called the yeet method, and now I think it's less funny, so we're just gonna stick with social migration. The social yeet method, or the migration method, is just when you deploy your new contract not connected to the old contract in any way, and by social convention, you tell everybody, hey, hey, this new contract, this new one that we just deployed, yeah, this is the real one now. And it's just by convention of people migrating and over into using this new one that the upgrade is done. Hence my slang name of social yeet, because you yeet the first one out of the way and you move to the second one. I think I'm funny. Yeet! This has the advantage of truly always saying, hey, this is our immutable smart contract and this is our new one. This is really the truest definition of immutable because since you give it no way of being upgraded in place, 
then if somebody calls that contract in 50,000 years in the future, it'll respond exactly the same. Another huge disadvantage here is that you have to have a totally new contract address. So if you're an ERC-20 token, for example, you have to go convince all the exchanges to list your new contract address as the actual address. Keep in mind that when we do this, we do have to move the state of the first one over to the second one. So for example, if you're an ERC token moving to a new version of that ERC token, you do have to have a way to take all those mappings from the first contract and move it to the second one. Obviously, there are ways to do this since everything is on chain, but if you have a million transfer calls, I don't wanna have to write the script that updates everyone's balance and figures out what everyone's balance is just so I can migrate to my new version of the contract. So there is a ton of social convention work here to do. Trailer Bits has actually written a fantastic blog on upgrading from a V1 to a V2 or et cetera with this Yeet methodology. And they give a lot of steps for moving your storage and your state variables over to the new contract. So link in the description if you wanna read that. Now let's get to our big ticket item. So in order to have a really robust upgrading mentality or philosophy, we need to have some type of methodology or framework that can update our state, keep our contract address, and allow us to update any type of logic in our smart contracts in an easy way. Which leads us to our big ticket item, the proxies. What's our big ticket item? Proxies. It's people. Proxies. Proxies are the truest form of upgrades. Since a user can keep interacting with the protocols through these proxies and not even notice that anything changed or even got updated. Now these are also the places where you can screw up the easiest. Proxies use a lot of low level functionality and the main one being the delegate call functionality. Delegate call is a low level function where the code in the target contract is executed in the context of the calling contract and message.sender and message.value also don't change. So you understand what delegate call means now, right? Great. And in English, this means if I delegate call a function in contract B from contract A, I will do contract B's logic in contract A. So if contract B has a function that says, hey, store this value in a variable up top, I'm going to store that variable in contract A. This is the powerhouse, and this combined with the fallback function allows us to delegate all calls through a proxy contract address to some other contract. This means that I can have one proxy contract that will have the same address forever, and I can just point and route people to the correct implementation contract that has the logic. Whenever I want to upgrade, I just deploy a new implementation contract and point my proxy to that new implementation. Now, whenever a user calls a function on the proxy contract, I'm going to delegate call it to the new contract. I can just call an admin only function on my proxy contract. Let's call it upgrade or something. And I make all the contract calls go to this new contract. When we're talking about proxies, there are four pieces of terminology that we want to keep in mind. First is the implementation contract. The implementation contract has all of our logic and all the pieces of our protocol. Whenever we upgrade, we actually launch a brand new implementation contract, the proxy contract. Proxy points to which implementation is the correct one and routes everyone's calls to the correct implementation contract. You can think the proxy contract sits on top of the implementations, the user. The user is gonna be making contract and function calls through the proxy contract and then some type of admin. The admin is the one who's going to decide when to upgrade and which contract to point to. In this scenario, the other cool thing about the proxy and delegate call is that all my storage variables are going to be stored in the proxy contract and not in the implementation contract. This way, when I upgrade to a new logic contract, all of my data will stay on the proxy contract. So whenever I want to update my logic, just point to a new implementation contract. If I want to add a new storage variable or a new type of storage, I just add it in my logic contract and the proxy contract will pick it up. Now using proxies has a couple of gotchas and we're gonna talk about the gotchas and then we're gonna talk about the different proxy contract methodologies because yes, there are many proxy contract methodologies as well. And this is why Trillibits doesn't really recommend using upgradable proxies for your smart contracts because they're fraught with a lot of these potential issues. Not to mention, again, you do still have some type of admin who's gonna be upgrading your smart contracts. Now, if this is a governance protocol, then great, you're decentralized. But if this is a single group or entity, then we have a problem. The two biggest gotchas are storage clashes and function selector clashes. Now, what does this mean? When we use delegate call, remember, we do the logic of contract B inside contract A. So if contract B says we need to set value to two, we go ahead and set value to two. But these smart contracts are actually kind of dumb. 
we actually set the value of whatever is in the same store's location on contract A as contract B. So if our contract looks like this, and we have two variables in contract A, we're still gonna set the first storage spot on contract A to the new value. This is really important to know because this means we can only append new storage variables in new implementation contracts, and we can't reorder or change old ones. This is called storage clashing, and in the implementations we're gonna talk about, they all address this issue. The next one is called function selector clashes. When we tell our proxies to delegate call to one of these implementations, it uses what's called a function selector to find a function. The function selector is a four byte hash of the function name and the function signature. Don't worry about the function signature for now. Now it's possible that a function in the implementation contract has the same function selector as an admin function in the proxy contract, which may cause you to do accidentally a whole bunch of weird stuff. For example, in this sample code in front of you, even though these functions are totally different, they actually have the same function selector. So yes, we can run into an issue where some harmless function like get price has the same function selector as upgrade proxy or destroy proxy or something like that. This leads to our first out of the three implementations of the proxy contracts. This is called the transparent proxy pattern. In this methodology, admins are only allowed to call admin functions and they can't call any functions in the implementation contract. And users can only call functions in the implementation contract and not any admin contracts. This way you can't ever accidentally have one of the two swapping and having a function selector clash and you running into a big issue where you call a function you probably shouldn't have. If you're an admin, you're calling admin functions. If you're a user, you're calling implementation functions. So if you're an admin and you build some crazy awesome DeFi protocol, you better come up with a new wallet address because you can't participate. The second type of proxy we're gonna talk about is the universal upgradable proxy or the UPS. This version of upgradable contracts actually puts all the logic of upgrading in the implementation itself. This way, the Solidity compiler will actually kick out and say, hey, we got two functions in here that have the same function selector. This is also advantageous because we have one less read that we have to do. We no longer have to check in the proxy contract if someone is an admin or not. This saves on gas, of course. And the proxy is also a little bit smaller because of this. The issue is that if you deploy an implementation contract without any upgradable functionality, you're stuck and it's back to the yeet method with you. And the last pattern or methodology that we're gonna talk about is the diamond pattern, which does a number of things, but one of the biggest things that it does, it actually allows for multiple implementation contracts. This addresses a couple different issues. For example, if your contract is so big and it doesn't fit into the one contract maximum size, you can just have multiple contracts through this multi-implementation method. It also allows you to make more granular upgrades. Like you don't have to always deploy and upgrade your entire smart contract. You can just upgrade little pieces of it if you've chunked them out. All the proxies mentioned here have some type of Ethereum improvement proposal, and most of them are in the draft phase. And at the end of this explainer, we will do a demo of showing you how the delegate call function works. And the end of the demo is right now. So let's look at delegate call. Now we're going to learn about how to actually build these proxies, how to build these upgradable smart contracts. And to do this, we first need to learn about this delegate call function. And it's going to be really similar to the call function, which we learned much earlier. If you haven't seen that, be sure to go back to our hard hat NFTs. We have a sub lesson in there about EVM opcodes and coding and calling, and we'll give you all the context for delegate call. Like I said in the explainer, it's very similar to call. However, the way that I think about it is one contract says, oh, I really like your function. I'm going to borrow it myself. And we're going to be looking at Solidity by example. I'll leave a description in the GitHub and all of the code for this will be in the GitHub associated with this lesson as well. Now we have two contracts. We have this contract B that we're going to be deploying on Remix. And it looks like a real minimalistic, real simple contract. We have a couple of storage variables here. And then we have a function that updates our values. We have a function called set vars and it updates our uint public num. Now, as we learned before, whenever we have some type of contract with storage variables, they get stored in, in this storage data structure that's indexed starting from zero. Right now, our uint public num is at index zero, our senders at index one, our values at index two, et cetera. Now we're gonna deploy a contract A. And now this contract is actually gonna use the delegate call function. Now a contract A, this is gonna look a little bit different, but it's still gonna have this set bars functions, except it's gonna make a delegate call function call to our contract B. 
The difference here is we're doing contract.delegate call. What this call does is something very similar to call. Normally, if we did contract.call on this contract, we would just call this, we would just be calling this function set vars, which would update contract B's storage. But instead, we're saying, hey, call that set vars function and then pass this as an input parameter, but call it in our contract, call it on contract A. We're kind of borrowing a function for our contract. And so instead, what we're gonna do is we're gonna borrow this set vars and run this set vars function over here. Now, the difference is instead of num equals num, the variables could be named different than the variables on contract A. So instead of num equals num, our contract is gonna say, hey, whatever's at storage of zero, have that equal to whatever we pass as an input parameter. And if that's a little bit confusing, just stay with me. Let's go ahead and let's see this in Remix. So I'm gonna copy paste this code into Remix here so we can kind of test and see what this looks like. Again, there's a link to this in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Feel free to pause the video to grab this link. It's solidity by example.org slash delegate call. Or you can just grab the code directly from lesson 16 hardhat upgrades. So let's compile this code and let me show you what I mean. So I'm gonna compile it and we'll go to the run tab. And first let's deploy this contract B. We'll hit deploy. We now have a contract, num, sender, and value are all blank. We'll update the number to something like 777. We'll hit set vars. Set vars will change the storage variable num to 777. And then we're changing the sender and the value. Sender and value is zero. Now let's deploy contract A. So we'll scroll back up. Contract A, deploy. Of course, we're on the JavaScript VM. Now we have this contract A with num, value, and sender are also all blank. But when we call set vars, it's going to borrow this set vars function from contract B and run it in contract A. You can almost think of it as if we're copying set vars and pasting it into our contract A just for one run and then immediately deleting it again. That's what this delegate call function does. So when I call set vars, I'm gonna pass it this contract address as an input parameter so it knows to call this contract's set vars function. When I pass it the address and I pass 987, since we're borrowing the function, we're not gonna update this num on contract B, we're gonna update the num on contract A. So when I hit set vars, we see num now has 987, we see sender and we see value still being zero here. Because again, we're borrowing this function and running it here. Now, the way that this works uh, is it actually doesn't look at the names of our storage variables. It looks at the storage slots. So when we borrow this function using delegate call, so we could have this these variables be named anything. Instead of num, we could call this first value. Sender, we could call something else. And then value, we could call woo or whatever you want here. And when we borrow this function using delegate call, instead of us grabbing the actual names of the variables, our contract will swap out these variable names with the storage slot. So it says, oh, okay, well, in contract B, you're accessing the num variable, which is, which is at storage slot zero. So when we borrow set bars in contract A with delegate call, we'll say storage slot zero is gonna equal that underscore num, which for this contract, storage slot zero is first value. So we'll say first value equals underscore num. Something else is gonna be storage slot two. So it's gonna say, okay, storage slot two, we're gonna update storage slot two to mess.sender. Okay, value here is storage slot three. So whatever's in storage slot three, will update with message.value like this. So that's essentially what's going on behind the scenes. So let's go ahead, let's delete those and redeploy, redeploy them. So we'll deploy contract B, we'll deploy contract A. Right now in B, once again, if we do one, two, three for set bars, we have one, two, three. And in contract A, now even though these variables have different names, we could grab contract B's address, paste it in, do 654, hit set vars, and first value is now 654. So delegate call allows us to borrow functions and then just transposes whatever is in here to the storage location equivalents. And the other thing that's interesting is that even if you don't have variables, it'll still save to storage slots. So in contract A, if we didn't have any of those variable names, storage slots zero, one, and two would still get updated. 
Now, here's where things can get really interesting. Let's delete our contract A again, and let's change the type of our contract A's first value to from a uint to a Boolean. Let's save that. And now let's deploy contract A. Now, when we call set vars on our contract A, it's still going to use the set vars function of contract B, which takes a uint and assigns the first storage slot, that number we pass it. But our first storage slot is now a Boolean. So what do you think is going to happen now? Well, let's try it out. Let's copy contract B's address, paste it in here. We'll pass, we'll do 222 as our input parameter. We'll hit set vars. Our transaction actually does go through. And now when we look at first value, it says true. Huh, that's really weird. Well, what if we change set vars to zero and hit set vars? And now first value is false. In storage here, when we add a number with set vars, it's going through because it's just setting the storage slot of the Boolean to a number. And when Solidity reads it, it goes, oh, well, first value is a Boolean. So if it's anything other than zero, it's going to be true. So this is how you can actually get some really weird results if your typings are different or if your storage variables are different. What if we made this an address? So this is where working with delegate call can get really weird and really tricky really fast. All right, now with all this being said, let's turn up the heat and let me show you a small proxy, a minimal proxy example that shows how a contract can be used as a singular address, but the underlying code can actually change. And all the code we're gonna be working with once again in the Hard Hut Upgrades FCC sublesson smallproxy.sol. And you can go ahead, copy paste this code if you want to follow along. So you don't have to code along with me here, but you absolutely can if we want. Now, I will say this is going to be one of the most, if not the most advanced section of the entire course. So feel free to go ahead and skip over this sub lesson if you want to just move on to learning how to actually build these proxies without really understanding what's going on behind the scenes. However, it is still really powerful if you do understand what's going on behind the scenes. So I have this minimalistic starting position right here. I have small proxy is proxy and I'm importing this proxy.soul thing from Open Zeppelin. Open Zeppelin has this minimalistic proxy contract that we can use to actually start working with this delegate call. Now this contract uses a lot of assembly or what's something called Yule and it's an intermediate language that can be compiled to bytecode for different backends. It's a sort of inline assembly inside Solidity and allows you to write really, really low level code close to the opcodes. Now we're not going to go over Yule, but I'll leave some links to the Yule documentation if you want to learn more. Even if you're a really advanced user, you really want to try to use as little Yule as possible because since it is so much lower level, it is much easier to screw things up. However, like I said, for this example, we are going to be using a little bit of Yule. Now in this proxy that we're going to be doing, we have this delegate function, which inside this inline assembly, which is Yule, it does a whole lot of really low level stuff. But the main thing that it does is it goes ahead and it does this delegate call functionality. If we look here, we can see it's using a fallback function and a receive function. So whatever it receives a function it doesn't recognize, it'll call fallback and fallback calls our delegate function. So anytime a proxy contract receives data for a function it doesn't recognize, it sends it over to some implementation, to some implementation contract where it will call it with delegate call. In our minimalistic example here, we have a function called set implementation, which will change where those delegate calls are going to be sending. This could be equivalent to like upgrading your smart contract. And then we have implementation here to read where that implementation contract is. Now, to work with proxies, we really don't want to have anything in storage because if we do delegate call and that delegate call changes some storage, we're going to screw up our contract's storage. The one caveat, though, to this, we do still need to store that implementation's address somewhere so we can call it. So EIP-1976 is called the standard proxy storage slot, which is an Ethereum improvement proposal for having certain storage slots specifically used for proxies. And in our minimalistic example here, we set byte32 private constant implementation slot to that location in storage. And we'll say, okay, whatever is at this storage slot is going to be 
the location of the implementation address. So the way our proxy is going to work is any contract that calls this proxy contract, if it's not this set implementation function, it's going to pass it over to whatever is inside the implementation slot address. That's what we're going to build here. So we have this small proxy is proxy and we'll create a real minimalistic contract. So we'll say contract implementation A and we'll just give it a UN256 public value and then function set value UN256 new value public. We'll say value equals new value. And so this is going to be our implementation. So now anytime somebody calls small proxy or small proxy contract, it's going to delegate call it, it over to our implementation A and then save the storage in our small proxy address. So we're going to call our small proxy with the data to use this set value function selector. So let's make it a little easier just to figure out how to get that data by creating a new helper function. We'll do function get data to transact. And we can get the data using the abi.encode with signature that we learned in an earlier lesson. So function get data to transact. We'll pass it a uint 256 number to update. So we'll give this the number we want to call a new value. We'll have this be a public pure that's going to return a bytes memory. And we'll just say return abi.encode with signature set value uint256 comma number to update. So you remember this from our call anything section. And if you don't remember how to do that, remember to refer back to our NFT section to learn how to call anything and use abi.encode, abi.encode with a signature and call anything with its raw bytes. We're going to get the data to transact. And we know that when we call implementation A from our small proxy, we're going to update our small proxy's storage. So we'll create a little function in Solidity just to read our storage in small proxy. So we're going to say function read storage. And this will just be a public view. And we'll do returns, returns, you went to 256 value at storage lot zero. And we are going to use a little bit of assembly here since we are doing all this low level stuff. And we're going to call the S load opcode to read the value at storage slot zero. We'll say value at storage slot zero, and we're going to set it. And then in assembly, this is how we set things. We're going to set it equal to S load of storage slot zero, and then it will return this value here. So we're reading directly from storage. Oops. And then we need a little parenthesis here. Sorry. So now so let's go ahead and deploy our small proxy and let's deploy our implementation A. Now our small proxy has a function called set implementation. So we're saying, okay, anytime we call this proxy contract, we're going to delegate call the functions over to here. So we're going to grab con implementations A's address, paste it into set implementation. Seven, seven, seven. So this is the data of set value UN256 with that number to update encoded in it. So if we call our small proxy with this data, our proxy contract is going to go, oh, okay, this is a function. Uh, I don't, I don't see that function here. We're going to call our fallback, right? Which again is coming from open Zeppelin and our fallback is going to do this delegate, which is this low level stuff, but it's basically just doing a delegate call. We're going to call our fallback function, and then we're going to get the function in the implementation A. We're going to borrow this function, and we're going to use it on our on ourself. So if I copy this, the implementation has been set to being this address down here. So all the logic is going to be down here. So when I go ahead and I grab this, I paste it into call data, and I hit transact. Looks like it went successfully went through. If I read storage now, we see that it is indeed 777 which is incredibly exciting. Now, this is incredibly beneficial because now let's say we want to go and update our code, right? We don't like contract implementation anymore. So let's go ahead, copy contract implementation A, and we'll make a new one called implementation B. Now let's say whenever somebody calls set value, we do value equals new value plus one or plus two. Let's go ahead, let's save this, let's compile this. 
and let's deploy implementation B. We'll grab implementation B's contract address. We'll call it on set implementation in our proxy. And essentially we have now upgraded from implementation A to implementation B. Now, if we use this same data here, we're still gonna call set value with 777, but instead we're now delegate calling to implementation B instead of implementation A. So if I call, if I put this data into the low level call data and I hit transact, it looks like it went through. Now I read storage and now is 779 since doing value equals new value plus two. So this is a minimalistic example of how upgrading actually works. Now this is incredibly beneficial because we can always just tell people, hey, make all your function calls to small proxy and you'll be good to go. But like I said before, this also means that the developers of this protocol can essentially change the underlying logic at any time. This is why it is so important to be sure to read contracts and check to see who has the developer keys and if a contract can be updated. If a contract can be updated and a single person can update it, well, guess what? You have a single centralized point of failure and technically the contract isn't even decentralized. Now, something else I was talking about in the video is function clashes, function selector clashes. Right now, whenever we call set implementation, the proxy function set implementation gets called because we don't trigger the fallback because we can see the function is here. However, if I have a function called set implementation in our implementation, this one can never be called. Whenever we send a function signature of set implementation, it's always gonna call the one on the proxy. This is where the transparent proxy that we're gonna be working with can help us out here and the up universal upgradable proxy can help us too. And I'm not gonna to go too much deeper into these now, but we've left some links in the GitHub repository to teach you more about these selector clashes and how those two proxy patterns that I just mentioned, the transparent and universal upgradable can get around these. If you're confused by anything in here, go into this discussion thread and make a new discussion about proxies. Make a new discussion about the assembly, about the Yule set implementation. This is a great time to connect with other people taking the course and ask questions here. Because I know that this is a really advanced section and requires you haven't gone through a lot of those sub lessons that we've gone before. And if it takes you a couple times of playing around with Solidity and playing around with Remix, I definitely recommend you do so. This is a section where seeing really is believing. And I want you to jump into Remix and I want you to test this and I want you to play around with this and see what you can break and fiddle with. All right, so now that we've learned all about this delegate call function and what it can do and the power of it, let's actually put it to use. Let's actually build an upgradable contract example so we can really see this power. So let's go ahead and let's start doing this. Of course, all the code that we're gonna be going over with is available in the GitHub repo associated with this course if you wanna follow along. So let's go ahead, make a new directory, foundry upgrades dash F23, let's code Foundry upgrades F23 or file open folder. You know the drill. Now I know in that video, we talked a lot about this transparent proxy pattern versus the UUP ups. We're actually gonna be teaching the UUPS proxy. In the UUPS proxy, the upgrade is handled by the implementation and can eventually be removed. And this is incredibly important, especially if we want to heed my warning I made at the beginning where we wanted really do this as little as possible. And this is kind of a crutch to get started. And we've seen issues where if you have upgradability and you have a centralized entity that can upgrade and change your contracts, those are often exploited. So the UUPS proxy allows us to eventually remove the upgradability so that the code is truly immutable. And also UUPS proxies are technically a little bit cheaper to deploy. You can read more about the differences between the two proxy types in the documentation for Open Zeppelin. And additionally, if you go to the contract wizard in Open Zeppelin, most of these types in here have a upgradability option with UUP apps that we could even open in Remix and see exactly what some of these might look like. So we're gonna be going through that with our own example here. So we're gonna go ahead, we're in our folder. We're gonna do forge init, of course. And we're gonna go and delete these once again. Goodbye, goodbye, goodbye. 
delete with the trash. I held down command so I could select all three. And let's create a very minimal contract that we're going to actually upgrade. So we're going to say a box v1 dot soul. And this is going to be what we're going to upgrade. So in this box v1, we're going to do this PDX license identifier MIT, you know the drill, MIT, pragma solidity 0 0.818 with a little carrot here. Contract box v1 like this. Cool. Now, so since we're using the UUPS proxy, we're actually going to need to add all of the proxy upgradability into this contract as well. So we can actually borrow from Open Zeppelin, kind of like what we were seeing here, because they have all of these contracts already created for us. But let's actually just write out what our what we'd want our box to do first, and then we'll go ahead and do that. So we'll say a UN256 internal value or number, a little bit less confusing. We'll have a function get number, public view, or better yet, external, external view returns UN256, turn number, all of this is something you all get because you did the stablecoin video, which was a monster of a project. Version external here returns you in 256 return one. And that's it. This is all our box is going to do. Now let's copy this box. Let's go to our source. We'll create a box v2 dot soul. Paste all that in here. And let's change this a little bit. Let's have the version return to get number will still return number, but let's add a function function set number u256 underscore number. So be external, no, like this. But so here's oh, and this rename this to box v2. Okay, cool. So now we have our box v1. We're going to deploy box v1 and then at the contract address of box v1, we're going to upgrade it to box v2. Now remember though, if we upgraded it, changed some storage variables, we would mess it up, right? So if you go to the open Zeppelin documentation, let's actually reopen this back up in remix here. We can see kind of what's going on here. So this token example that they have, they say it's initializable, upgradable, ownable and UUPS upgradable. They say it's all this stuff. So for us, we're going to go ahead and we're going to install this Open Zeppelin contracts upgradable package. And this is actually at a different Open Zeppelin repo. If we look up Open Zeppelin contracts upgrade, GitHub. There's this Open Zeppelin slash Open Zeppelin contracts upgradable repository that we can use. And this is the one that we're going to want to install. So we're going to copy this like that. Forge install this, this dash dash no dash commit. All right, great. We've installed it. Now we can start using these contracts upgradable code in here. Let's just go in here, do a re mappings equals. We'll say at open zeppelin slash contracts upgrade a bowl equals lib slash open zeppelin and let's do a toggle word wrap zeppelin contracts gradable slash contracts hopefully that looks right let's go to lib opens up a contracts gradable yep that looks right okay cool so now we can start using this so in this remix example, it can be a little bit confusing because there's a lot of imports going on, right? So let's kind of break this down. So the first thing that we're going to need is going to be this UUPS upgradable contract. And I'm just going to copy this line. Feel free to copy this line as well or, you know, write it out yourself. And I'm going to toggle the word wrap here. And of course, we're going to do named imports because we're good engineers. Uh, what did I mess up? Oh, I don't need this versioning. Okay, cool. And if we control click into this or we command click in this or we just open this, we can see exactly what is in this upgradable code here. So we have this UUPS upgradable contract. It's initializable. It's some proxy stuff, you know, yada, yada, yada. If we scroll down, got some modifiers. 
it has this function upgrade to at its new implementation, upgrade to and call, and it has this gap at the bottom. So let's talk about these. So this upgrade to function, this is the function that gets called when we wanna upgrade our box. So we're gonna say our box is UUS, UUPS upgradable. And then it's gonna say, hey, uh, it should be marked abstract because we don't have all of the functions defined in here. And this contract is actually known as an abstract contract. Abstract contracts have some functions defined and some functions undefined, and they expect their child classes to implement those functions. So for example, at the bottom here, we have this authorize upgrade function, which isn't defined. So an abstract contract basically says, hey, you better define this authorize upgrade function because I'm not gonna do it. You need to do this. And this can be helpful for a lot of reasons, right? For example, let's say you want to make sure to not forget to add some function. So this is something that we're gonna to need to define. These are how we're gonna actually do the upgrades. We see that this is you know, obviously the function that we're gonna to have to define. So we can add authorization parameters in here, such as who can actually do the authorization. If I toggle the word wrap, we can see function that should revert when message.sender is not authorized to upgrade the contract. So for example, if you wanted your proxy to be owned by a DAO, you would update this to be ownable or only owner or something like that. But then they call this upgrade to and call UUPS, which if we control click into, or we just go to where it's defined, uh, we toggle the word wrap here. We can see this performs the implementation upgrade with security checks for UUPS proxies and additional setup. So if we scroll into here, this is the code that's actually doing the upgrade and it's really low level, right? So we call this function set implementation, which now routes all contract calls via delegate call to this new implementation address that we set. And then it does a couple of checks in here and then it calls upgrade to and call, which, which calls upgrade to, which calls set of implementation, which mainly just sets the implementation slot, which basically, like I was saying before, it says, okay, all contracts are gonna be routed to this address now, right? But if we go all the way back, all the way back, that's kind of the long of what this upgrade to is going to do, right? So it's going to change where we route all of our delegate calls. And then if we have any data we want to send, it'll call this as well. The data is obviously going to be none uh, if you just call upgrade to. Anyways, I'm getting kind of in the weeds here, right? This is the function that it has set up to, to do the proxy stuff we showed before, right? This changes the implementation address. So we obviously need this. We also need to implement our own authorized upgrade function. So we can just go ahead and copy this. And in here, we'll paste it in here. And for us, uh, we need to make this override instead of virtual. I'm just gonna leave it blank because I don't want any, I don't really care. I don't want any authorization stuff in here, right? But this is where I put like, you know, require, or excuse me, if, you know, message.sender does not equal owner, you know, revert, right? right? But for us, I don't really care. So I'm just gonna leave it blank, right? And so this is gonna say anybody can upgrade this. So this is why this is going to be the most important one, right? This UUPS upgradable is doing all that proxy upgrade stuff. All right, cool. So what else? Now, you'll also notice here at the bottom, there's this gap thing. Now you can read the docs here. This empty reserve space is put in place to allow future versions to add new variables without shifting down storage in the inheritance chain. What, 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 what the heck? What are you talking about? Storage gaps. The reason these proxies work is that they point to the slot number instead of the name of variables. So if I were to upgrade from box V1 to box V2, and I put in another other number here, guess what? If I did this upgrade, whatever number was in box V1 is now set to other number instead of number. This is because proxies point to storage slots. They don't point to variable names. They point to storage slots. If we upgrade to V2, other number is now in storage slot zero, whereas number was in storage slot zero over here, right? So what is the best practice to do is to have this gap at the bottom. So a U into 256, you can put really whatever number you want here, which basically just says, hey, we're gonna save 50 storage slots in storage for adding new variables in the future. You could have this be, you know, 100, 
you know, a, a, you know, whatever whatever amount you want, right? And this is just so that in the future, if you need to add more storage slots, you don't collide with other places that storage is already being reserved. So it's really important that they have this gap, especially for UUPS. If this doesn't make sense, definitely 100% be asking questions about it. And you'll see a lot of people will ma even manually add their own gaps sometimes. So sometimes you'll even see somebody go, you know, like gap two or whatever they want, right? So that they have additional gaps, whatever they want to do. Cool. So this is why we need this. Now, right like this, we could ship this code and this would be upgradable. Now, of course, box V2 is not upgradable, um, but box V1 would be upgradable. So why is Remix adding all this other stuff? What is initializable? Well, let's copy this and let's paste it in. And you can also see all this weird initialized stuff. What, what, what is going on with that? Well, let's, let's add this in. And of course, we're going to do a named proxy. If you want to write this out yourself, feel free. Uh, excuse me, we're going to remove this because we did not add the version in here. Uh, initializable. So what is this? Why is Open Zeppelin telling me I could do I got to do this initializable thing and it's doing all this weird initialized stuff. So let's go into initializable. Oh, and if it doesn't let you do that, let's open up our File Explorer, we'll look for initializable.so, and let's see, let's read this. So if you wanna pause and you wanna read this, I'm even gonna toggle the word wrap. If you wanna pause and you wanna read this, feel free to do that. But the main thing we know is this piece here. Since proxies contracts do not make use of a constructor, it's common to move constructor logic to an external initializer function. You might be thinking, wait, 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 what? they don't use a constructor? Remember, storage is stored in the proxy, not the implementation. So we have proxy, which will direct all call to the implementation, but it's like borrowing the implementation functions, right? So all the storage is happening over here. If the implementation has a constructor and it sets number to one, right? The proxy will have number still set to zero because the when you deploy a contract, the constructor gets called from the implementation. So proxy contracts or contracts that are meant to be used via proxy don't use the constructor. So what you need to do is then with a proxy, you need to first you need to deploy implementation, then you need to call some initializer function. Now the initializer function is going to be essentially your constructor, except for it's going to be called on the proxy. So that's kind of the difference. If that doesn't make sense, please ask questions about it because it's really important. So constructors are not used in proxy contracts. So what a lot of upgradable contracts do is they first, they call this disable initializers function in constructors, like you see here. And I'm actually going to copy this, paste it into my box v1 like this. And then often you'll see this comment. I'm going to paste this over here. Because sometimes different linters will say, hey, you're using a constructor in a upgradable contract, you shouldn't do that. So we just say, hey, like, let it happen, right? What this disable initializers function does is it says, hey, don't let any initialization happen. So if we go see this, we say require that you're not initializing, right? You can't call any initializer functions. So you could just as easily just just do this, right? They're kind of the same. But this is much more verbose, right? This is making sure, hey, don't do any initializers. Constructor, don't do anything. So this and this are almost the same, but this is more verbose. As you know, verbose is better. But let's say we do want a constructor. What we would do is we'd add an initializer. So we do something like function initialize public initializer. Initi initializer. And of course, we'd say our box v1 is initializable, public initializer, like this. And we would add whatever we want to initialize. And then what we're going to do is we're going to deploy the contract. And then we're going to have the proxy immediately call our initialized function. Instead of doing this constructor, instead of the implementation having the storage, we want the proxy to have the storage. Typically, you'll see initializer functions 
have two underscores like this. So if we want our box v1 to have an owner, right, we can't set storage, we can't do like owner equals message.sender in the constructor like we normally do with a ownable contract. Instead, we need to put that in the initializer function. So what a lot of people will do is they'll add double underscore like ownable underscore init. Like let's say we did want this to be upgrade uh, ownable and actually let's go ahead and add that right now. We're gonna add this ownable upgradable. I'm gonna paste it in, I'm gonna remove that. Ownable from like this, comma. I know I kind of was quick, but I, uh, I know you all are advanced enough to kind of know what I just did here. I refactored this a little bit, so that's a named import, remove the version, and now we're doing this ownable upgradable instead of ownable. I'll explain what that means in a second. Oh, and this actually goes here. A note, if you see this linearization of inheritance graph impossible, this means that we're trying to inherit stuff in the wrong order. So we'll just do this. Oh, is that the right order? No, that's still the wrong order. Is that the right order? Cool, that's the right order, okay. So what you'll see is these upgradable initializable functions will be prepended with double underscores, right? And so what this is doing is it's sets the owner, it's setting the owner to message sender. And if I command click into this, or I command click into this, we look up ownable init. We see it does this ownable init unchained. All it's doing is calling transfer ownership, right? That's it. So this is essentially the same as setting owner equals message.sender, right? But we're just prepending with the double underscore to say, hey, this is an initializer function treated as such, right? It should only be called in this initialize section. Additionally, most of the time you'll see this initializer function, which doesn't do anything, but it's best practice to have this in here to say, hey, this is a UUPS upgradable contract. We're gonna treat it as such, okay? So you'll see this in here a lot too. But I know I kind of went through this a little bit quickly, but let's just do a quick recap of what we learned. We can't use constructors with our proxies. A constructor adds storage to the implementation. And if we have a proxy pointing to an implementation, the implementation would have the storage of where the owner is, and we need the proxy to have the storage of where the owner is. So we need to call initialize through the proxy, not through the implementation. The initializer function is essentially a constructor for proxies. You can almost think of it like that. We want to prepend them with this double underscore to know that they're initializers, and we don't want any initializers to run in the constructor, and we only want them to run once. You'll also see this initializer modifier, which basically just says, hey, you can only initialize one time, right? A contract can only be initialized once, otherwise it'll error. Great. And that's pretty much gonna be our box. So now we made this ownable. So since this is ownable, down here in our authorized upgrade, we could add an only owner modifier in here so that only the owner could upgrade it if we wanted to. But we're not gonna add that, but I wanted to add this ownable init here just to show you, hey, like, so this is what you do instead of working with constructors. So that's our box v1. Let's fix our box v2. So our box v2, we're gonna do pretty much the same thing. So we're gonna grab all these, paste it in here. I'm gonna toggle the word wrap. We're gonna make this initializable. Uh, ownable upgradable and UUPS upgradable is like this. We're going to need to add authorize upgrade, which we're going to keep blank. But if you want to play with this, you can obviously implement this. We're going to want to add a constructor and an initializer. So we're going to copy both of these and just paste it right in here. A constructor which disables constructors and then an initializer, which is going to be really what we want. And that's pretty much it. That's the only changes that we need to make. Now we can make this even smaller, right? We could say, okay, cool, we don't care about upgrades. We don't care about initializing. And we just say, Psh, goodbye. This doesn't need an initializer. This doesn't need any of that stuff. And we could even delete all this if we wanted. And now it's just UUPS upgradable, right? Without any initializer and without any constructors. And we could do the same thing with box v1, but I just wanted to demo what it lo would look like if you did want a constructor. But now that we've done all this work, Let's actually show you this in action. So we're gonna deploy box v1. Uh, we're gonna get an address. We're gonna use that proxy address to 
make sure that these functions work. We're going to then deploy box v2. We're going to point our proxy to box v2, which will essentially mean we upgraded our contract and it's all going to be from the same address. So let's do this. We're going to make a, a little two scripts. We're going to make one called deploybox.s.sol and a new one called up, upgrade box.s.sol. So we're going to deploy the box and then we're going to upgrade it. So let's deploy it. SPDX, you know the drill, license, pragma, solidity, 0.8.18, contract, deploy, box is script, import, script from forge, std slash script dot soul. We're gonna need to implement, import box v1 from dot dot slash src slash box v1 dot soul. Function run external external returns. I'm gonna I'm gonna return address and you'll see why in a bit. Returns address. Address proxy equals deploy box turn proxy. And I'm gonna create a deploy box function. Function deploy box. So this is a little bit different. This will be a public returns address. And what we're gonna do is say box v1 box equals new box v1. This is gonna be our what? Our implementation. This is gonna be our logic, right? This is where our proxy is gonna to point to delegate call, right? To borrow those functions. Now, we're gonna to need to get a proxy on top of this. The proxy that we're gonna use is the ERC 1967 proxy. And we can learn more about this proxy in the Open Zeppelin documentation, we can learn more about this at uh, the EIP for ERC 1976, whatever you want to do. But it's going to be this proxy that we're going to use to point to our implementation, right? To point to our box v1, which has all this upgradable logic in it. So we're going to import that. We're going to import ERC 1967 proxy from. And this is actually just a regular open Zeppelin contract. So we're going to do forge install open Zeppelin slash open Zeppelin contracts. So this is just a regular one contracts. Oops. Uh, dash dash no dash commit. We're going to go to our foundry.toml and this is a remapping comma at open Zeppelin slash contracts equals lib slash open Zeppelin, uh, open Zeppelin dash contracts. I think that's what it is, right? Lib, open Zeppelin contracts and open Zeppelin contracts are upgradable. Okay, open Zeppelin contracts slash contracts like this. And oh, port this from at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash proxy slash ERC 1967 uh, like this. So this is the proxy type we're using. Now we're going to say ERC 1967 proxy equals new ERC 1967 proxy. And if we command click onto this or control click or just look at this, this does have a constructor. We can pass in the logic and the data. So we basically say, hey, proxy, this address is going to be the implementation, the logic that you're going to use. And then any data you want to pass to the initializer, right? If we could look at upgrade to and call, we call upgrade to, and then if there's any initializers, call that afterwards, right? Uh, we're not going to have any initializer stuff, so we're not going to do that, but we're just going to say address box because we just deployed this box, no data. This is where, like I said, this is where we put the initializer stuff we wanted, but then we're just going to say return address proxy. So cool. And let's just make sure stuff is working. Forge build, or at least we're going to make sure code is compiling and source file that's not specified required compiler version. That's because we have implemented that. That's fine. Cool. This looks good. And we're going to write some tests to show you this actually working in a little bit. But cool. So we have a deploy box. Let's actually write an upgrade box script now, and then we'll write a test to show both of them. SPDX license identifier MIT pragma 
Solidity 0.8.18 contract upgrade box is script import script from forge std slash script dot soul script script cool function run external returns address oops i'm gonna have this external oops i'm gonna have this use the most recently deployed box so to do that we're going to actually install forge install chain excel org dash foundry devops dash dash no dash commit like i said there might be a better devops tool than this you can find the recommended devops tool in the github repo associated with this recommended tool is going to be foundry devops so great so that's what we're going to use i've worked with this one before so we're going to say address most recently deployed equals devops tools dot get most recently deployed there's gonna be deep meant and this is where we're gonna get the erc 1976 proxy let me oops toggle the word wrap here move this down on block dot chain id oh let's import that as well imports from Oh, and I got to go to the foundry.toml. Do a little bit from lib slash foundry devops slash src slash devops tools.sol. Looks good. Get most recently. I spelled that wrong. Get most recent deployment. So we're going to get the most recently deployed proxy first. And you'll see why in a second. And first, we're going to actually deploy box v2 so we're going to import box v2 from dot dot slash src slash box v2 dot sol oops dot sol so we're going to do a little vm dot start broadcast oh do we do that in box deploy box oh we should do that here oh, back in the deploy box we're going to do vm dot start broadcast and then a stop broadcast like that okay VM does start broadcast in the upgrade box. We're gonna say box v2, new box equals new box v2, VM dot stop broadcast. And then we're gonna say address proxy equals upgrade box. And I'm modularizing this for our test cases, but we're gonna say we're gonna create a new function called upgrade box where we're gonna pass in the proxy address, right? This is the proxy address and then the address of our new box. And then we're gonna say return proxy. So we're gonna create this function upgrade box, which has our previous proxy, and then the address of our new box for us to do. So we're gonna say function upgrade box, address proxy address, uh, address new box. This will be a public returns address. We can do a little vm.start broadcast so okay so we're going to call upgrade box we have the proxy address and we want to call upgrade on this right since this is just an address we can't call upgrade on an address we're going to need to call upgrade on using the abi of box v1 right so let's import that as well import box v1 from dot dot slash src slash box v1 dot sol we're going to say box v1 proxy equals box v1 of the proxy address like this. And what we're going to do is now that we've given our proxy address box v1 ABI, we can now just call proxy dot upgrade to since box v1 is UUPS upgradable means it has access to this function address new box. Like this we're going to upgrade it. And we're just going to do vm dot stop broadcast. Like this, we could also optionally wrap this in box v2, or we could, you know, do a direct function call, whatever we want to do. Now we'll just return address proxy, and that's it, right? So what is this doing when we actually upgrade? Well, we deploy box two implementation. We are calling this upgrade box function, and what we're doing is all we're doing is we're saying, hey, point the proxy to this new place. That's it. We're saying. Proxy contract now points to this new address. 
That's it. Don't believe me? All right, let's write a test. So, new file. And we're going to write some crappy tests here. We're just going to do the whole suite just to show you the power. Deploy and upgrade test.t.sol. You know the drill. SPDX license identifier MIT contract deploy and upgrade test is test import test from forge std slash test dot soul pragma solidity 0 0.8.18 we got to do a whole bunch more imports we're going to need to import deploy box from dot dot slash script slash deploy box dot s dot soul import upgrade box you know this is what we're actually testing from dot dot slash script dash upgrade box dot s dot soul we're needing to import box v1 from yep thank you github copilot and box v2 we're probably going to need to import more stuff but it's fine function setup what do we want to set up here well let's get a deploy box public deployer upgrade box public upgrader and we'll do an address public owner equals make addr owner and we're going to say deployer equals new deploy box upgrader up greater equals new upgrade box okay cool and we probably should write a whole bunch of tests but for this video i'm just going to write one we'll say box v1 public box v1 and we'll say box v1 equals deployer dot run we're gonna have to wrap box v1 like this cool so we have our box v1 it gets deployed our deployer dot run is a deploy box run returns the address of the proxy not the address of the box v1 right returns the address of the proxy not the box v1 so we can even call this to make it more clear box v1 public proxy since this is actually a proxy address Actually, let's do this even better. Address public proxy. And this is why before we were working with addresses because it can be kind of confusing to know what it is. The proxy, right? The, the proxy and it right now points to box v1. Cool, hopefully that's more clear. So now we'll do a function, test upgrades like this. And we'll just test the whole darn system. So we have the box, we have the proxy address pointing to box v1. Now in our upgrade box, in our run, we went ahead and did all this, but for now, let's just use this upgrade box functionality because so we can, so I can show you a little bit more granularly what's actually happening, right? So test upgrade, let's, let's deploy our own box V2. We do it in run. We could 100% do it in run, but I want to do it myself. So I'm going to say box V2 equals box V2 or box two equals new box V2 VM dot prank box V2 box two. Now I'm going to say address proxy equals upgrader dot upgrade box proxy, which is just an address, address of box two. So our upgrade box, upgrade box here, all it's doing is saying, okay, cool. Get the proxy for box v1 and now point it to v2. So we're calling that in our test here. And now we could do unit 256 expected value equals two. And we could say assert equal. Oh, actually, we don't. We shouldn't even set this. Let's not even set this, right? So this address is going to be the same. We're never resetting this address. We're being very clear about that. Boom. Proxy deployed here. Boom. We're never even. We're never changing the address. So it's always going to be this address. Now what we can do though is we can say assert equal expected value is box v two on the proxy address dot version. If this works, this means that. On the proxy address, which originally pointed to box v1, it's now pointing to box v2. We could also do box v2 proxy dot set value, or what do we call it? Box v2 set number, set number, number, we could say like seven or something, right? And we could say assert equal seven kind of box, comma box v2 proxy dot get number like this. And we could even add another function test proxy starts as box v1, right? Public, we could say vm.expect revert 
with calling this, this function because set number doesn't exist on box v1. So if we try calling set number on the proxy, it should fail. So let's run these one at a time. Forge test dash m. This should indeed revert. Great. And then let's test this, and this should indeed upgrade. Forge test dash m test upgrades. Oh, we failed. Let's get some granular detail here. Dash vv. Left is seven, right is zero. Set number, get number. Oops, we forgot to actually add set number in here. So let's do number equals underscore number. Whoops. Now let's run that test. And boom, it passes. We have successfully upgraded our box. This is very exciting. So. To wrap this up, I know we went through this really quickly. I want you to ask a ton of questions about this process. A ton of questions about this. Ask them in the discussion. Ask them on Twitter. Ask them to your buddies. Whatever you want to do. We just learned about upgrades. Like I said, I highly recommend you do not default to this. And you do not let protocols that have upgradable smart contracts keep this centralization vector. Because it is. If you have an upgradable smart contract, that means that a group could change the logic of that code at some point or be coerced to change the logic, etc. But this is an incredibly powerful primitive to know about, especially delegate call. We're almost done. Push this up to GitHub, add this to your portfolio, take a break. Congratulations. I'm going to go ahead and deploy this to a testnet now just to show you what it will look like on Etherscan. Feel free to just watch, sit back, relax. You've done a ton of amazing work make my life easier. I'm going to borrow a make file and just kind of tweak it. Let's change. Let's just delete all this stuff. Deploy. It's going to be deploy box. Deploy box. Upgrade. Forge script. Upgrade box. Upgrade box. Make deploy args equal dash dash network. Sepolia. All right, so I ran the deploy. We deployed two contracts. Let's grab this one first. It's a Polia Etherscan. Let me show you what this looks like. So it looks like this one didn't quite verify correctly. I could go ahead and manually verify it if I wanted, but let's look at the second one. Uh, looks like neither one of these actually verified correctly, but that's fine. I can go to the, my broadcast, see which one's which. We can go to both these runs. Let's see the first one. Okay, we did create box. And so this is gonna be the address of box v1. So I copy this, paste it in here. I can go ahead and verify this manually later, but I know that this is my box v1. We'll go back to broadcast, click this one, scroll down. Uh, this one doesn't have a contract name, but I know that this one is gonna be my proxy address. So I go to your browser, let's open, keep them both up, paste it in here. This one didn't get verified correctly either, but that's okay. So this one's our box. This one's our proxy, and this is the one that's more important, right? This proxy is pointing to this implementation, okay? Now, we're gonna call our upgrade by just doing make deploy, make upgrade, like this. Oh, and I need a TOML. Since I'm using Foundry DevOps, I need FFI equals true. Remember, only do that if you are confident about what you're running. You can do make upgrade. Hmm. So this actually is a bit of a bug with this script that I just found out. I do need to update my run latest to ERC 1967 proxy. I either need to upgrade my script to look for null or I need to upgrade Foundry to add this for the proxy name. So I'm just gonna manually add this in. We're gonna hit clear, we're gonna rerun it. Looks like that is a bit of a bug, sorry about that. But now that it knows that this is the ERC 1967 proxy, we're actually running this script now to upgrade the box. And the first thing that we're gonna do is we're gonna deploy our box v2, which for some reason is actually verifying. Looks like something was just wrong with the first time I did it, but all, all, all good. If I paste this in, we now have a box v2 being created and it looks like it's trying to verify right now. Oh, and it looks like this one actually did verify. So if we refresh this one, so it looks like our box v2 is here. We place this in. 
it looks like this one did actually verify, which is great. Box V2. Now, if we go back to our proxy, we hit refresh, we can see we called an upgrade two on this contract. Now, whenever we call functions on this, it'll actually point to box V2, right? So we can even grab the contract address. We'll use a little cast send, paste this in here. We'll call get number like this, or actually, excuse me, cast call, cast call, and of course, dash dash RPC URL, Polia RPC URL like this. We can see that it starts off as zero. That number starts off as zero. Then we can call. Well, we can do send instead. Set number, which takes a U into 256. We'll set the number to 77. RPC URL dash dash private key. Private key. Remember, you're gonna need to do source.emb to do this. We'll send a transaction to actually update update this and we're calling the proxy, right? We're not calling this box v2 address, we're calling it right on the proxy. Then if I go up, up, and we do call again, we're now going to get 4d for the binary. And if we do cast dash dash two base paste dec for decimal, we convert this hex to decimal and we see we get 77 back. So we have successfully deployed and worked with a proxy. This is so awesome. Take a break. We got two more. You're so close. You're almost done. We got two more. Scrolling all the way down. Foundry governance, another quick one. And then introduction to security. And then I'm going to send you on your way to make the future of finance, the future of smart contracts, a better place. You're so close. Take a break. Get ice cream. Post on Twitter. I will see you soon. All right. Hi, baby Patrick. All right, here you go. Here is your 12 word seed phrase. Now you're going to need that in order to generate your private key, which you're going to use to sign all your transactions. Uh, now just remember, if you lose your seed phrase or you lose your private key, you won't be able to send any more transactions ever. And if you accidentally expose or leak your key or seed phrase, whoever gets it will be able to spend all of your money. <laughs> What? This is how a lot of people feel when trying to get their friends into crypto. They tell them that they have to follow all these very difficult rules, and if they break one of those rules, they're going to get rug pulled for all their money. So the wallet user experience for getting into crypto isn't great. Private keys can be very difficult to handle. Anything you want to do costs gas. Preserving privacy from your wallet can be difficult. Sending multiple transactions at once rely on you interacting with a middleman smart contract. There are a lot of issues with current private key and wallet management, and account abstraction is here to try to help aid those. Account abstraction can be boiled down to one single thing. In a traditional transaction, you need to use your private key to sign the data to send the transaction. With account abstraction, you can sign the data with anything. To reiterate, normally we validate transactions by signing them with our private key. Imagine being able to sign a transaction with your Google account, with your GitHub account. A transaction can only go through if three of your buddies give you a thumbs up. You can only sign a transaction during the day. You can't surpass some type of spending limit. So one more time, just to drill it in. Historically, private key equals wallet. With account abstraction, whatever the hell you want is a wallet. And with this whatever the hell you want, with this customization, this means that we can additionally have other people pay for our transactions. Right now, if you want to do anything on chain, anything at all, you always need to have at least a tiny bit of gas and sometimes depending on the chain that you're working on getting that tiny bit of gas can be a huge pain in the butt but account abstraction can help solve this so if i really want to give baby patrick his first wallet uh, uh goo goo gaga i can actually code in some parental controls where he can create all the transactions and then i have to approve them and all of his super likes on skibbity toilet i will definitely be approving so this all sounds fine and dandy but how does it actually work now getting into this is where this gets a bit complicated because there are two places where account abstraction exists as of march 1st 2023 the first official account abstraction smart contract was deployed to the ethereum mainnet called the entrypoint.sol and you have to interact with this smart contract in order to 
do this account abstraction thing. And other chains like ZK Sync have this natively baked in. So let's first learn how this works with Ethereum, which doesn't have it natively baked in. And then we'll look at how it works with ZK Sync, which has what's called native account abstraction. In a traditional Ethereum transaction, you take your MetaMask or your Rabi or whatever wall you're using, you sign a bunch of data, you spend some gas, and you send this on chain and the Ethereum node will be the one that will add this transaction to a block in the blockchain. Right? This is pretty well known. Whenever your MetaMask pops up, any of these transactions in here are you sending a bunch of data that you signed with your MetaMask, your MetaMask did the signing, send it to an Ethereum node and it adds to a block. But as we've been saying, private keys are really sucky. So how can we have an account without having to deal with private keys? Well, you still kind of do have to deal with a private key and on Ethereum, First thing you have to do is you have to deploy a smart contract that defines what is the thing that can sign transactions. So you have to deploy some type of smart contract first to the blockchain. Whereas previously only private keys could sign transactions, but you could say all of my friends have to sign the transaction with their private keys or the friends cast has to. You could use something like a Google session key to be the one to sign transactions. If you can code it, you can build it. So this smart contract will be your new wallet and you will have a smart contract wallet. So now you might be asking, okay, cool, but how do I like send a transaction through my smart contract wallet that is deployed? Will it like pop up in MetaMask for me? Well, this is where it gets a little bit more complicated. So now just remember, traditionally, you use your MetaMask, you use your private key to sign some data, and then you send it to an Ethereum node. And now the main difference is you are no longer sending your signed transaction, your signed data to an Ethereum node, you're gonna send this someplace else now. Now with account abstraction, you'll sign your data with whatever you use to sign it. it, could be Google, could be your friends, whatever. And you're gonna send something let's call a user operation to an alt mempool. So according to ERC 4337, which is the EIP slash ERC for this, you'll actually send this thing called a user operation, which has all this additional transaction information. And you're not going to send this to the blockchain. You're instead going to send this to something called an alt mempool. And this is still going to be all off chain. This alt mempool is basically just any group of nodes that are facilitating these user operations. So this is why you actually don't have to spend any gas when you sign and send this transaction because you're actually not sending it to an Ethereum node. So there is a chance that you're not even going to be making transactions in your MetaMask when you send to this alt mempool for at least on Ethereum, working with these alt mempools, these account abstraction accounts, the wallet UX is going to have to become a little bit more clever to deal with this. Now, these alt mempools, they are gonna be the ones to actually pay some gas because what they're gonna do is they're gonna take your user operation, they're going to validate it themselves, they're gonna make sure everything looks good, and then they are gonna be the ones to actually send your signed transaction on chain. So it's the alt mempool nodes that are going to be sending the transaction and doing the traditional Ethereum transaction. So in Ethereum, account abstraction or ERC4337 is just a framework that everyone's agreed upon for sending these user operations. So these alt mempool nodes are going to be the ones to send this transaction and they're going to send it to this thing called EntryPoint.Soul, a group called ETH Infinitism won a grant from the Ethereum Foundation to be the one to create and deploy this contract. It's this team that actually has deployed this entry point v07 on chain to Ethereum, Optimism, Arbitrum, Polygon, blah, blah, blah. And so it's this address, it's this smart contract that handles every single account abstraction user operation sent. All of these alt mempool nodes calling this contract call this function called handle ops, where they pass all the data associated with a user operation which includes pointing to your smart contract account that you deployed. So these alt mempool nodes are going to deploy your contract for you. It's going to always be routed through this entry point.soul, which is going to do some validation. And then it's going to be routed to your contract, your smart contract account, which is where everything will be directed from. So when you, you know, work with an app, when you send a transaction to something like Aave, your account will be the message.sender or the from account here. And it'll go through all the logic that your account set up. So for example, if you set it up so that only Google could sign keys, if Google didn't sign the key, this whole transaction here sent from the alt mempool nodes would revert. And then of course, once everything's included, your transaction will be added to the Blocksys blockchain. Now there's a couple of things here. There's a couple of things called add-ons. One of them is a signature aggregator. This is where it aggregates. This is an optional add-on to account abstraction where this entry point will let you define a group of signatures that need to be aggregated. This is where you can have like your friends be on your multisig. 
And then there's also this thing called a paymaster, which this is where it gets really cool, where you can set up your code base to have somebody else pay for the transactions. So the alt mempool nodes, of course, will pay for the transaction to actually send it. But then you can set up a contract called a paymaster, which will just have the logic of saying, hey, so and so is actually going to pay for my transactions here. And you defined all of this in your account, you set it up as such. Now you might be thinking, oh, okay, cool, Patrick, well, I, I'm always going to do this if the alt mempool nodes are always going to pay for my gas. Well, if you don't have a paymaster, the alt mempool nodes will pay for your transaction, but they will only pay for the transaction if one of these accounts on chain is going to pay for it. So if you don't have a paymaster set up, it'll try to pull funds out of your account. And that's how the whole system works here. So simple in concept, very convoluted in practice here. Now, this process obviously involves a lot of different steps, a lot of different moving parts. You have to send to these alt mempool nodes. They are going to be the ones to send to the on-chain entry point. You have to customize your account and blah, 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 do all this stuff. Some chains have said, you know what? Let's just do this natively. ZK Sync is one of these chains where they combine this process together. Let's look at how ZK Sync does account abstraction. For ZK Sync, the process is going to look really similar. You still have to deploy a smart contract that has all your rules codified. But the main difference is that the alt mempool nodes are also the ZK sync nodes. So we actually get to skip this step of having to send our transactions to this alt mempool because the ZK sync nodes also work as alt mempool nodes. The reason ZK sync can do this is because they have what's called default accounts for every single account. Every single MetaMask account, every single account in ZK sync is technically a smart contract account that has very specific functions and behaviors that can be validated. So anytime you interact with any address, it will always assume it's a smart contract because that's just how they work. So what I'm showing you here is their default account smart contract. Anytime when you load up ZK Sync into your MetaMask and your addresses are automatically created, they are automatically connected to these default accounts. And this is what the code of those addresses look like. I've got a video coming out next where we're actually going to create some account abstraction accounts on both Ethereum and ZK Sync so you can see exactly what they look like and how they flow and how everything fits together. So be sure to watch that as well if you want to learn how to actually code these things. And hopefully we can save baby Patrick from having to deal with his private keys himself. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time. All right, y'all. In this video, we're going to be actually walking through building some minimal account abstraction accounts. Now, we're actually going to be doing it two different ways. We're going to be building one for Ethereum and one for ZK Sync. Why? Because Ethereum and ZK Sync do it slightly different. For Ethereum, whenever you send a transaction via account abstraction, you actually have to send it to this alt mempool. For ZK Sync, there is no alt mempool. You just send it via the normal mempool. You just have to specify your transaction as a type 113. If you want to follow along, obviously the code here is going to be at siphon slash minimal account abstraction right here. You can follow along here. And we're going to be creating two smart contracts. One is going to be minimal account. You can see this account right here. Very, very minimal smart contract. It does almost nothing interesting. All it really does is it allows for either our private key to pay for the transactions or this smart contract itself to pay for transactions. It's incredibly minimal. We didn't add any interesting functionality in here. But as we go along and build this, we'll show where if you wanted to add additional customization, for example, maybe adding a paymaster or a signature aggregator or some type of spending allowance or a Google session key, whatever. As we build this out, it'll become clear where you can expand on this and build them yourself. Then additionally, we also have in ZK Sync here, we're going to have our own custom ZK Sync minimal account as well which is going to be slightly different. And in doing this, we're actually going to learn a ton about ZK Sync as well, because, because the ZK Sync ecosystem is actually very different than the way the Ethereum ecosystem works. Because like I said, you actually don't have to send your transactions to an alternate mempool. You can just send them directly to the exact same mempool you always do. And ZK Sync has it built into the actual layer two to handle all these transactions. So if you go to the readme associated with this, and we scroll down to example deployments. We can see here we have a ZK minimal account on ZK Sync Sapolia. We have one on Arbitrum as well. If you want to go check these out, you can check them out here. 
But what's cool is we have two transactions here where we have the approve function where the from on ZK sync, and this is what's really cool to me, where the from is actually going to be this ZK sync minimal contract here. Now it's not actually verified because the contract verification for some of the parameters that we're going to be using doesn't work quite yet. But what makes this so crazy is that you can't have a from be a smart contract in the Ethereum ecosystem, but in ZK sync you can. So for our Arbitrum example, this is still really cool. So the from is going to be one of these bundlers, one of these alt mempool people. This is going to be similar to what you would do on Ethereum. Our from is not going to be our smart contract wallet. However, we were able to interact with our smart contract wallet as if we were sending the transaction. So all this did was submit an approval to the USDC token. And during this transaction, the message.sender was our smart contract wallet. So very cool. We're going to be building both of these. And this is going to give you the power to create any type of flow that you want for your smart contracts. If you want people to send transactions with a special session key that you create, great. You can create a smart contract that does it with this process. If you want to create a super special multi-sig where you and a bunch of friends and a certain passcode have to be the ones to get together and send a transaction, great. This is how you're going to learn how to do that. And you're going to learn how to do it for both Ethereum and ZK Sync, which is going to be awesome. So let's jump into it. We are going to start building with Ethereum first, and then we're going to build with ZK Sync so that we can really understand the differences. And as we do ZK Sync, we're going to learn a ton. So let's get froggy. All right, so here we are in our brand new blank BS code where we're going to create some account abstraction wallets. You are going to learn a ton in this section, and I'm incredibly excited for you to come along with us here. This is probably going to be one of the more advanced projects that you make in your learning journey, but let us begin. So we want to just first make sure we are on Foundry. So I'm going to do a quick Foundry up, make sure we're on the latest version of Foundry here, get everything downloaded, and then we're going to go ahead and do a little forge init, create our basic project here. And great. So we have this set up. So Let's go into our source. Oh, let's actually go into source, script, and test. Command click or control click. Let's delete all these. And we're going to go ahead and create a brand new file. Actually, no, screw that. We're going to create a new folder called Ethereum. And then we're going to create a new folder called ZK Sync. Right? And right in the readme here, let's delete everything. Say about. What are we going to do? Number one, create an AA or account abstraction account on Ethereum. Let's just say a basic, a basic one, right? And then number two, create a basic AA on ZK Sync. Deploy and send a user op slash transaction through them. So we were going to deploy these, send a user operation or transaction through them and really see the whole process end to end. Note, I'm not going to send an AA to Ethereum, but we will send and AATX to ZK Sync. So we're actually just going to send our transaction directly to Ethereum because kind of showing the account abstraction, I don't think is that interesting, but I do think it's interesting on ZK Sync. But we are going to still send a transaction through our smart contract wallet on Ethereum. It'll make sense in a minute, I promise. So let's go ahead. Let's get started working with Ethereum here. So in our Ethereum folder, we're going to create a minimal account dot sol. And this is where we're going to start. You already know the drill. We're going to set up a little pragma here. MIT 0 0.8 point. Let's do 24 contract minimal account like this. So here's where we are. And we're, the first question is, OK, uh, what what the hell do I need to do? And this is where we can go over to ERC 4337 and figure out, OK, what are these smart contracts even supposed to look like, right? Because we know we're supposed to be sending transactions to this alt mempool nodes, and they probably need to be formatted a special way. And then we need to send it to this entry point smart contract, which will then send it to our contract. So there's probably some very specific functions that need to be called for this process to work correctly. So let's figure out what those functions are so that our process can work correctly. Now, if you go through the EIP itself, you'll find what is needed for like a user operation. 
and this is the data that needs to go to the alt mempools. You'll also find the entry point definition. This is what we need to be worried about because this is when passed to on-chain contracts, the entry point contract, and then to account and paymaster, a packed version of the above structure is used. So when you're sending data to an account abstraction alt mempool, this is the data you need to send it. But when you're sending data to either this entry point contract, right? Because every single one of these user operations flows through this entry point contract, you need to send all this data. And again, if we look at the entry point contract itself, we go to write contract, we know that this is where every single user operation is going through. It takes ops, which is a tuple and a beneficiary address here. So we can even go to etherscan.death.net here, just really see what this is. So etherscan.death.net is a way to kind of see a smart contract right in the in your browser from etherscan. We can look up function handle ops like this, and we can see the handle ops. It takes a packed user operation and a an address payable. So, so whenever we send our data to these alt mempool nodes, we need to send it so that they can send this packed user operation stuff. And where are they getting this packed user operation stuff? Well, there's another smart contract called packed user operations.soul, and there's this struct. So we need to send all the data about our transaction in this packed user operation. We need to pick the sender, the nuns, the initialized code, call data, all this other stuff. And, and the signature is really this customization piece where we can kind of define how we want to define signatures, right? Because again, account abstraction, you can sign anything with anything. If you can code it, you can build it. So we need to figure out what this contract needs to look like. At some point, the entry point contract is going to call this contract, and we need to set this up correctly. Now, right in the EIP, they talk about having this account contract interface. The core interface required for an account to have is going to be this. This function validate user operation, where it takes this user operation, takes the user operation hash and this missing account funds bit, and then returns whether or not the user operation is valid. Back in this image here, whenever these alt mempool nodes call this entry point, this entry point is going to call your account and your account is going to say, hey, uh, this transaction is valid or it's not valid. If it's not valid, it'll revert. The alt mempool nodes won't be able to send the transaction. And if it is valid, then the alt mempool nodes will be able to send the transaction for you. So we need to make sure our validation is spotless and this is the function that will do it. So we could 100% add this in here ourselves, but what I actually want to do is I want to import from this ETH in infantism account abstraction project here. I want to import this whole thing as a package. That way we can use their interfaces and any other cool stuff that they've built, we can use it in our code base. So we're gonna go ahead and copy this and I'm gonna be using version V07 for our code base here. So if you want to make sure to follow along, that's the version that we are going to be using. So back in our code base, we're gonna do a little forge, install, paste that in here, and then do a little at v0.7.0 dash dash no dash commit. And now we're gonna go ahead and install all of that as a library. In our lib, we have that account abstraction chunk in here. And they have an I account, so we can actually just import that ourselves. So we're gonna say import I account. They have that account interface as defined by the EIP here. So we'll say I account from lib slash account abstraction slash contracts slash interfaces slash I account dot so I already know where it is. So, <laughs> so cool. And then we'll say contract minimal account is I account uh, so that we don't miss any stuff. And if we command click or we go to this contract here, we can see down at the bottom, we have this function validate user op, which is exactly what the ERC slash EIP specified. And then we have all the information here on what this function actually does. If you want to pause and go through this, feel free, but we're going to explain it as we go along here. So, so we do know at some point we're going to need to add this. So I'm just going to go ahead and pop it in here right now and then just make it like blank here to do this. Now, we're going to need this packed user operation object as well. So we're going to have to import that as well. So I'm going to say import packed user operation from lib slash account abstraction slash 
contracts slash interfaces slash packed user operation dot soul like this. And if we command click on this or control click on this, you can see we automatically get this struct pulled in here from this contract. Well, I, this technically isn't even a contract. This is just kind of like a floating struct here. But in any case, we get it into our code base here. And really, at the end of the day, this is the most important thing that we need to flesh out. So let's actually just start with this, right? Because this smart contract is going to be an account. And this validate user operation is essentially the validate signature, right? What the entry point contract is going to send to us is this packed user operation. This packed user operation is going to have like, hey, call USDC and set it to approve. And here's the signature, blah, blah, blah. But also, they're going to give us this user OP hash or the user operation hash. It's going to be the hash of the entire user operation. And it can be used as the basis for a signature. So in the user operation, in this user op, in this packed user operation, they're going to have the signature. And we need to figure out from the signature that they give us and the hash that they give us, okay, does it actually match? And then missing account funds is going to be missing funds on the accounts deposit in the entry point. And this is the minimum amount to transfer to the sender, basically to the entry point to be able to make this call. So you can kind of think of this as like the fee basically. And this is how these, these alt mempool nodes are going to get paid after they send these transactions because they don't want to send it for free, right? So let's go ahead and start actually validating a user operation. And let me just dive into this packed user operation for a second. So the sender, this is where it's going to be, you know, our minimal account. They're going to say, hey, I want the sender to be our this minimal account, this account abstraction account. The nuts should be like a number only used once. You can almost think of it as like the sequence of transactions in the transaction. We can ignore this for now. This is uh, if we set this, the account contract will be created by this is like a constructor, the call data. And this is where we put like the good stuff, if you will. This is where we say, hey, our minimal account should approve, should approve USDC for 50 tokens or something should call the approve function or or transfer or like whatever. This is like the actual meat of the transaction account gas limits is obviously gas limits pre verification gas. This is some more uh, gas stuff, gas fees, more gas. These are all to handle the different gas fees, basically payment and data. So in this image here again, so by default, your account is going to have to pay the alt mempools for the funds, right? Your smart contract, there need to be funds in here to pay for it. However, if you've set up a paymaster, if you've customized somebody else, to pay for your transactions. This is the data that needs to be sent as such and obviously the signature and we're going to sign this whole chunk of data up here. And we're going to customize in our smart contract here, what is a valid signature. So cool. Hopefully that makes sense. Let's keep going. Let's actually start there. So the first thing we're really going to care about is we're going to want to validate this signature in here. So I'm actually going to create a custom function called underscore validate signature. And we're going to take this user operation and this user op operation hash. So in our packed user operation, they have this signature and we need to validate this signature against all of this. Let's really quickly figure out how we want signature validation to work. This is again where your creativity can run free. I'm going to be super lame and basic. I'm just going to say a signature is valid, valid if it's the contract owner. That's it. So if it's if it's the minimal account owner. So that's it. So whoever deployed this contract gets to be also gets to be the only one who sends transactions through it. So it's a little bit lame because basically we're like, all right, MetaMask, you need to call this smart contract wallet in order to call anything kind of like just adding an extra step, but it'll show you what we intend here. So we're going to say import ownable ownable from open Zeppelin. And we should probably install some open Zeppelin then shouldn't we? So I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to install open Zeppelin. I'm going to do forge install install open Zeppelin slash open Zeppelin contracts. 
and I'm going to be using at 5.0.2 dash dash no dash commit for this one. So if you want to follow along with me, also install 5.0.2 at, oops, excuse me, it's v502, sorry. And it looks like those are in. And then I want to update my foundry.toml real quick to do some remappings. We're going to say remappings equals at open zeppelin, zeppelin slash contracts equals lib slash open zeppelin hyphen contracts like this. And now we should be able to get at open open zeppelin slash contracts slash access slash own a bowl dot soul like this. Now we can make our minimal account I account and ownable. And since we're making this ownable, we have to add a constructor ownable, ownable, and the initial owner is going to be message.sender like this. Cool. So now, now that we have an owner of this smart contract, we're going to set this up that whoever is the owner of this contract is going to be the one to validate the transactions. And so actually, I guess this is kind of cool because you can transfer ownership of this smart contract wallet to different wallets. And so I, I guess that is actually kind of cool. That is a, a bit of a novel feature. So you can transfer ownership of a wallet without ever having to share your private key. You know what? Actually, I take it back. That's cool as hell. So um, let's actually go ahead. Let's let's create a function called underscore validate signature. And we're going to take the user operation and the user operation hash. And we're going to use these to actually validate the signature. Because remember, the user operation is going to be basically all the stuff, the meat of like, hey, what's the transaction that we're trying to even send. And then the user operation hash is going to be the hash of all this stuff. So we want to make sure that this signature that they're sending us is a valid signature for the hash of all this stuff, right? So this owner, this message.sender, this owner, the owner of this contract should be the one to sign all of this, populate that here, and then we can check via the hash and then via the signature. That stuff looks good. Um, you'll understand what I mean in a second. So, so cool. Let's create the function. So we'll say function underscore validate signature. And this is going to take the packed user operation. I think we could keep it as call data. Bytes 32 user op hash. We'll have this be internal, internal view. And we're going to have this actually return a uint256 validation data. And you'll see why we need that in a little bit. So this is the function that the entry point contract is going to be calling, right? Validate user operation or validate user op. And they're going to populate all this stuff here. And this user op hash is going to be the EIP 191 version of the signed hash. So this is technically in the wrong format. And I'm not going to go on kind of a side tangent on what these EIP 191 hashes look like. My co-instructor Kira is actually going to go over that a little bit in another video. So hopefully by now you actually know what those are, but they're going to send us this hash and we actually need to convert this hash back into just like a normal hash. And Open Zeppelin actually has a tool for us to do that as well. So I'm going to import that import message hash utils from at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash utils slash cryptography slash message hash utils dot soul. And if we look in here, let me comment this out so I can look in here. If we look in here, there's a function called to ETH signed message hash. And this is actually the function that we're going to be using. It's going to return the Kachak 256 digest of an EIP 191 signed data with version 0x45 or the personal signed message. So uh, I know there's a lot there, but we need to basically format this hash into the correct format here so that we can do an ECDSA recover which is going to say, which is going to give us who actually signed a hash. So a little bit of a pre-processing step, if you will. So we're going to say, uh, we're going to get the hash. We're going to say bytes 32 ETH signed message hash equals message hash utils 
dot to eth signed message hash user op hash like this and now that we've converted this user operation hash into kind of this correct format now we can do this thing called an ecdsa recover so we're actually going to grab some tools for that as well import ecdsa from at open zeppelin slash contracts slash utils slash cryptography slash ecdsa that's so i feel like most of the time in smart contract development we never have to deal with signatures or any of this stuff it's just when we're doing accounts that we do so we're going to be calling this function recover recover and what this does it does try recover does try recover gets the rs and v calls try recover again and we eventually call this pre-compile called ec recover which basically says okay this is some signed data here is the hash here is the signature who actually did the signing here and if it's valid the math will all check out and it will return a correct address otherwise it'll return address zero if it's wrong so now that we have this set up correctly and i know there's a whole bunch of math here don't worry kira's going to come out with a video that's going to be phenomenal if this none of this makes sense to you if you're watching this on youtube link in the description if you're watching this on cypher and updraft you should have just watched that so go back and watch it again if it doesn't make sense quite yet so we have this in the right format now now we're going to actually get the owner so we're going to call ecdsa dot recover we're going to say eth sign message hash user op dot signature so we're going to say okay with this signature and with this data in this hash who signed it right so we're going to say address signer equals this so ecdsa.recover is going to return who actually did this signing and then all we have to do is we can say if signer does not equal the owner oops owner then we're going to return return sig validation failed 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 otherwise we're going to return sig validation success so these this sig validation failed and this sig validation success failed is just one and success is zero but we don't like magic numbers so we're going to set it up like this we could 100 say you know failed and success up at the top but i kind of want to follow the same patterns as the account abstraction playbook and so what we can actually do is they have these defined in a group of helper contracts so we're actually going to import those so we're going to import sig validation failed and sig validation success from lib slash account abstraction slash contracts slash core slash helpers dot soul like this if we look up this helpers dot soul contract we can see sig validation failed equals one sig validation success equals zero so we're just gonna follow their standard so if it failed return to failed otherwise return successful here so all we're doing is we're saying given kind of this hash and the signature that they gave us let's verify the signature is the owner of this contract right is the owner because that's the only signature validation here but this is where we would say all right make sure that the google session key is correct or make sure that seven of your friends are signing this or make sure that this or that or the other thing right so this is where we get to do a lot of that cool stuff there's additionally a signatures aggregator which we're not going to get into but we can do more customization with that so anyways so back in our validate user op we can now say you went to 256 validation data equals validate signature and if we go back to our i account let's grab this go back to our i account we have this return validation data this is the packed validation data structure basically the first 20 bytes is going to be zero for a valid signature or one to mark signature failure and that's actually why we're following this process here uh, there's also some really cool additional pieces you can have you can have valid until valid after for a time range uh, and you can do some other cool stuff here but for us we we just need to make sure we return the un256 validation data and for us our validation data oh we've already got it defined right here 
for us, if it failed, it's going to be one. So we should fail. And if it's going to be zero, we pass. Hooray. We're not quite done yet. Ideally, we would also want to validate the nonce. So in this packed user operation data, there should be a nonce. We can keep track of like the nonce in here. So we could do like unit 56 hour nonce equals zero. And we could have some validation on the nonce. We could say, hey, it needs to be sequential. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You need to do in order. You need to do any order. It's going to be in a mapping. It's going to be this, that. You could do whatever we wanted here. But the actual nonce uniqueness is managed by the entry point itself. So we don't really have to do anything ourselves here. So I'm just going to comment this out and not do anything. But ideally, you should do some type of nonce validation. And then finally, we also have to pay back money to the entry point. So this missing account funds bit is basically going to be, hey, here's how much this transaction is going to cost. And here's how much you need to pay back to whoever sent the transaction. If you have a paymaster, you can add on into this to have the paymaster actually do the payments. However, we're not going to deal with any of that. So we need to have a little pay prefund transaction or pay prefund function where we actually pay the entry point contract the amount it's owed. So we'll do a little function pay prefund UN256 missing account funds. We'll have this be internal. And we'll say if missing account funds uh, is greater or I guess not equal to zero or greater than zero, then we'll do a classic, you know, bool success comma equals payable message dot sender call value missing account funds gas is going to be uh, type uint 256 dot max uh, and then no data and then success so we're just going to say hey pay pay back the entry point contract i guess hypothetically we should hard code this to be the entry point contract but it's the entry points job to verify the payment is good not us so we don't really need to care about this at all so we can even just just do this um but we're probably going to get yelled at by our linters so whatever so we just need to pay back the entry point contract. And speaking of which, we should really have this validate user OP only be callable by the entry point, but we'll add that in a second. So at a high level though, this is really all we need. This is kind of all the functionality that we need. This is kind of all the functionality that we need to have a valid account abstraction based account. Now, at the moment, anybody can validate user operations through this, which isn't great. Uh, and anybody can basically pay themselves, which isn't great. So we probably want to lock this down. Uh, let's uh, let's do that, shall we? But this is already awesome. Like you're, you've already essentially created your own minimalist minimalist account for Ethereum or any EVM chain that doesn't have built in account abstraction. Great work. So let's keep going on this though. So we're probably going to want to make sure that this validate user op is only callable by that entry point contract. So right in our constructor, we'll do a little address entry point like this. We'll create a state variable called called address uh, I underscore entry point entry point make this address immutable private, of course. And then we'll just say I entry point equals entry point. Now I am going to go one step further, though, I'm going to go ahead and and import the I entry point interface. And then that will actually tell us more about how the entry point actually works. And it'll allow us to add some nice getter functions to this as well. So I'm going to do a little import I entry point. So the I entry point interface from lib slash account abstraction slash contracts slash interfaces slash I entry point dot sol. And if we look in here, we can see kind of all the different functions, the entry point interface, the entry point contract can work with. The biggest one being obviously handle ops, but they've also got some other nice ones like get nonce, where it can get the actual nonce or increment nonce of a smart contract wallet. So in any case, I'm going to have, instead of this being an address, I'm going to have this be an I entry point. And we're just going to wrap this like this. I'm going to do some little headers, getters. 
like that, so that at the bottom, I'll add this in, I'll do a little function get entry point. Uh, looks like GitHub Copilot got me here. And if you don't have that headers tool, definitely be sure to check out Transmissions 11 headers tool for making beautiful headers like this every single time. So we'll do headers getters like that. And uh, cool. And then we have a little state variable here. Looking good. Okay, cool. Now that we have this, we should probably create a modifier, modifier called require from entry point like this. And then we'll do if message.sender does not equal address i underscore entry point, then we should revert with some new custom error. I'm going to call it error minimal account not from entry point like this. And so we will revert this and boom. Now that we have this modifier, we can make our validate user operation exclusively from the entry point here. Cool. All right, great. So now are we done with this? This is looking really, really good here. Are we done with this? Not quite. We're actually just missing one final thing here. So here's what's going to happen. So remember, this minimal account is going to pretend to be our EOA, right? This is our account abstraction account. This contract needs to be able to do stuff. Right now, if we send a transaction, we can go ahead and validate this, right? But again, if we look at our if we look at our little image again, we need to remember that our account, well, actually this isn't a great image. Let me go use the other image. Our account, our account, our minimal account contract needs to be able to call and interact with all the dApps that we're going to be working with here. And as of right now, this contract can validate user operations but it can't actually send any tractions itself. As of right now, it's not possible for this contract to actually send a transaction, you know, like to Aave, for example. So we actually need to give it the functionality to do that. So the entry point, right, if we go back to this image, the entry point is going to validate a transaction on our account, and then it's going to pass the transaction information to our account, and then our account will be the message.sender and actually send and interact with the dApp or whatever, right? So we need to add probably one of the more important functions here, a function called execute. And we'll add this up here. I'm actually going to go ahead and make a couple of headers, headers, internal functions like this. I'm going to put this like here, headers, external functions like that. We're going to do, oh, I put that in the wrong spot. Whoops. So external functions, internal functions. And then we probably would want to flesh out our NAT spec, but I'm not going to not going to do that right now. Okay, cool. So we're going to need to add a new external function called execute. And this is going to be the function that whenever we send a user operation to the entry point, we're going to say, hey, you're going to need to call that execute function on our contract to call the dap. So a little bit confusing from our end as developers, but this will make the lives of the people who are using these account abstraction accounts much, much easier. So we're going to make this execute function. And we probably want to add the things in here that are needed to execute a function, right? So we're going to need an address dest for the destination, a UN256 value if they want to send any ETH, and then a bytes call data, uh, function data or func data, or just, yeah, function data, where this is going to be the ABI encoded function data, right? And this will be external. And we could have this as exclusively require from entry point where the only the entry point can call this and that would allow this setup to work great where entry point calls our account and then our account calls the dap but this would mean that our metamask has to go through kind of this long account abstraction process every single time and maybe it makes sense for them just to call straight from their metamask directly to the account if they want so we're actually going to make an additional modifier here called modifier require Acquire from entry point or owner, where the owner of this minimal account can also call our smart contract account, or it can be the entry point, right? So either one, we're happy for both ways. And the reason we're happy for both ways is because if the owner is calling, then that's obviously proof that the correct person is actually calling this. However, if the entry point is calling this, right, it's when the entry point, the entry point is going to call validate user operation. And all the signatures are going to have to be validated here. So cool. So require from entry point or owner. 
this will be our modifier. We'll say if the message.sender does not equal address i underscore entry point and message.sender does not equal owner, then we're going to revert minimal minimal account underscore underscore not from entry point or owner like this oh underscore here and then we'll create this new error error paste that in here cool and then and then i just kind of want to be a little bit more explicit here so i'm going to do some more headers headers errors because i love me a good nice clean code base we'll do headers state variables Right, and state variables could be storage or not storage. We'll do headers, modifiers, this, post that in there, modifier, modifier, and then headers, functions. And then just paste that here. Just kick it off with the constructor, external functions, internal functions, getters. Okay, cool. I love me some clean headers. Mwah, the code base is starting to look cleaner and cleaner. Obviously, we'd want to add some NAT spec in here to make this look even cleaner, but Oh, the headers just make it look so nice. Okay, beautiful code is good code, friends. Okay, so now we have this execute function and we would definitely want to add some net spec onto this, but I'm gonna skip it for now. Um, we would definitely wanna add some net spec onto this, but all we're gonna do is just a basic low level call for this execute function. So we're going to, in here, we're gonna say, okay, a little bool success, comma, bytes memory result equals, Dest.call value will be value, and then the function data will be here. We'll say if not success, then we can go ahead and do a little revert here. And then we'll do a little revert, minimal account, just say call failed. We'll even pass the result as part of the failure reason. And that means way back up here, we'll do a little error, minimal count call failed bytes in here. So, so we'll actually revert with whatever the return data was here. And that's looking pretty good. All right. And then the last and final thing here we need to do is we need to add a receive function, external payable, because this contract needs to be able to accept funds in order to pay for transactions, right? Because again, we don't have a paymaster. So whenever we send, whenever the alt mempool sends a transaction, it's going to pull the funds from here, which we pay them in our, where is it? In the pre pay prefund down here. So our smart contract needs to be able to accept funds, first of all. So now people can directly call through this alt mempool to the entry point to our smart contract or they can just call it directly into our account if they're the private key owner of this. Okay, cool. And with just this, we can actually go ahead and write some scripts to test this, deploy this, and have this be our minimal account. Awesome. This is incredibly exciting. Let's keep going. So now, as many of you know, let's go ahead and write some deploy scripts here. We'll call deploy minimal dot s dot soul. We're probably going to need a, a helper config dot s dot soul because the, oops, this should not be a folder. Delete that folder, change it to a new file. We're going to need a helper config because the entry point contract is going to be different on different chains. So we're going to need to interact with that contract here. And then additionally, we're going to create a send packed user op dot s dot soul. And this is going to kind of be the pinnacle of what we're looking to do here, this send packed user op dot s dot soul. So and if everything works here, this should also work marvelously. Yes, yes. Okay, cool. And it's in us writing this where actually the blunt of our work is going to be because we're going to have to understand how all the signing and the creating of the data works. And this is really where the complicated nature of this kind of comes into play. So but let's go ahead and let's learn how to deploy this real quick. The deploying is pretty easy. So we'll do a little pragma here. MIT 0.8, I think we're using 24 here. And to get this going, this is going to be a script. So we're gonna do import script from forge std slash script dot soul contract 
deploy minimal is script like this. We have to import our minimal account from sc slash uh, ethereum slash minimal account. That's all. Oh, is that wrong? Do a little forge build to make sure everything works. And it looks like everything isn't working. Run it autumnal, open Zeppelin, Zeppelin slash contracts equals lib. Open Zeppelin contracts ooh, slash contracts. Let's try that. <clears throat> okay, there we go. There's some other issues here. That's not found. Import minimal account. Oops. Contract minimal account. What's it mad about? Try forge build now. Oh, okay. Min imal account. Okay, cool. And those just don't have a compiler version. Okay, great. So now that we have those, we're going to, of course, need to make a function run. And we're probably going to need to make a function deploy minimal account public that we're going to call in run. So for our, for our minimal account, all we need is an entry point. And we should definitely do that in a helper config. So let's go to our helper config here. Let's get this set up. A little pragma here, MIT 0.8.24 contract helper config is script like this, which means we're going to have to import script from forge std slash script script so like this. We're going to create a little error helper config underscore underscore invalid chain ID. I should probably just turn this into a package, huh? This helper config and then you in the foundry DevOps tool, maybe, but we're gonna do a little struct network config. This is going to have an address entry point like so. Then we'll do where are we going to deploy this? So we'll say UN 256 constant ETH Sepolia or Polia ETH Sepolia chain ID equals one 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 five five one 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 I think ETH Sepolia and then we'll do UN two fifty six constant constant ZK sync Sepolia chain ID equals three hundred like so and I'm just gonna paste this here for now so don't forget it we'll create a little network config public local network config. Yeah, I should definitely turn this into a package. Sorry, I haven't turned this into a package yet. And then we'll do a mapping UN256 chain ID to the network config public network configs. I'll do a little construct constructor network configs of ETH Polia chain ID is going to equal get ETH Sepolia config. And let's go ahead and create that function. Function get ETH Sepolia config public pure returns network config memory like this. And we'll say return network config entry point. It's going to be this address here. A lot of boilerplate stuff we get to do. And I'm just going to copy paste this for ZK sync, get ZK sync, Sepolia config. For ZK sync, since it has native account abstraction, we're gonna do address zero, which again, I haven't taught us about that yet. So you can kind of just ignore that for now. Uh, but we also want to do function, function, get or create anvil eth config public returns net work config memory memory like this we're going to say if local network config dot entry point does not equal address zero then return local network config like this <clears throat> or we'll probably have to come up with something a little bit more clever because this is also going to return zero uh, otherwise we're going to have to deploy a mock entry point contract. And we'll do that a little bit later. So let's just add another function function, get config by chain ID, UN256 chain ID, 
public view returns network config memory if chain uh, block or it's gonna be chain ID or actually excuse me function get config public view returns network config uh, memory get config by chain ID block dot chain ID all right you and 256 constant local chain ID equals three one three three seven this if chain ID equals equals this then we're going to go ahead and return get or create like this else return uh, else if we're gonna do this conditional again if network config of chain ID dot entry point it's not equal address zero then return like this else revert with this error here and this that means this can't be a public view it just has to be public cool this can't be public view either because we have this okay cool and then we'll deploy mocks down here in a little bit but cool so now we can get the config just by calling get config which means back in our oh oh whoops i put this in the wrong one let's put this over in the right one here which means back over here i can import helper config from src or script slash helper config dot s dot soul in our deploy we can say helper config helper config equals new helper config we can say helper config dot network config config equals helper config dot get config like this memory now we can just do a minimal vm dot start broadcast vm dot stop broadcast like this probably want to set up an account in here but i'm not going to bother we can just say minimal account minimal account equals new minimal account and then i'll do minimal account dot transfer ownership ownership to message dot sender so this should pretty much already be the case um, but just to make sure our tests are all working correctly i'm just going to do this oh and this is actually going to be fig dot entry point in here ta-da it's a little forge build make sure everything's working it sure is okay very nice now we're probably going to want to add an account in here as well so i'm actually just going to go back to our helper config up in here create a little address account like this i'm going to create a constant i'm going to say address constant burner wallets because if i interact with this i'm definitely going to want to use a burner wallet I'm going to grab my burner wallet address here. Then in here, we're going to do for Sepolia, we'll do account. This will be the burner wallet, or this should really be the your testnet wallet, but burner wallet works fine too. And then we'll do account burner, burner wallet like this. Cool. And then instead of entry point, does not equal to zero, let's do account because down here we're actually gonna use address zero for like real. So we'll do, instead of entry point, we'll do account does not equal address zero and looks much better. Okay, cool. Now we're gonna deploy the mock entry point in a little bit, but big dot account, but I wanna just get this all set up here and I want to get a basic test going. Okay, cool. So we now have a deploy script, actually, oops, returns uh, helper config memory and min ml account like this and do return helper config and minimal account oops sorry no just straight up helper config okay cool so now we can use this in our test we can go over to tests create a new folder ethereum and then here, minimal account, 
test.t.sol. And let's start building a test for this. And this test is actually going to be kind of bonkers in a good way. We're going to do a lot of signing of stuff. We're going to do a lot of ABI encoding of stuff. And we're going to be learning a lot during this. So buckle in because this is where it gets fun. OK, MIT 0.8.24. Is that what we're using? 0.8.24. Yep. OK, contract minimal account test is test like this. Import test from forge std slash test dot so all right great function set up you know the drill here you've done this a hundred times we're gonna need to import that minimal account from src slash ethereum slash minimal account dot so we're gonna need to import deploy minimal is that the name of it deploy minimal deploy minimal from script slash deploy minimal dot s dot soul like this. And we're going to do in here, deploy minimal, deploy minimal equals new, deploy minimal, deploy minimal dot, what do we call it? Deploy minimal account, deploy minimal account. And we're going to get the helper config back. So we're going to say import helper config from script script slash helper config dot s dot soul like this and we'll say helper config helper config and minimal account minimal account equals deploy minimal account deploy or deploy minimal dot deploy minimal account and what's it mad about deploy minimal account helper config minimal account oops because I spelt it wrong. Okay. And you know what? Let's actually make these state variables. And let me do a little word wrap here. Config, minimal account, get rid of this, and get rid of this. Ta da. All right. We are cooking. So now, what do we want to test? So we basically want to test that somebody can sign the data, go through this alt mempool, go through the entry point, and then have our contract do something. We could have it do really anything, but I kind of want to test working with a contract. So for us, our test is going to be a USDC approval, right? So the so the message dot sender should be our minimal account, minimal account, and it should approve some amount, the USDC contract, but it should come from the, the come from the entry point. Because if we work this in such a way that it actually works if it comes to the entry point, that means all these alt mempool nodes will be able to bundle our transactions. They will be the ones to submit it and all this stuff will be peachy on door, right? So we're going to go ahead and write some tests to kind of simulate bundling these transactions, sending this transaction. We are going to simulate, we are essentially going to simulate being these alt mempool nodes here. So, so this is going to be really exciting for us to do. So let's start writing some tests and we're going to have to update our setup and update a bunch of stuff in here, but uh, let's keep cracking. So let's do a quick little function just to see if our basic functionality works, right? So this execute function that we created, where is it? Execute. The owner should be able to call it and like send a transaction through here. No problem. So we want to make sure that this flow works, right? So before we even get to the account abstraction stuff, we just want to make sure that our off-chain private key, our off-chain owner can call the minimal account, which can call the USDC directly, right? Because this is kind of going to be the simplest flow. And this will give our user, our, our minimal account users, kind of the most customization with this minimal account, right? Because they will be able to then directly interact with this contract or send the transactions to the bundlers with the alt mempool stuff. So let's just test to see if directly calling this works. So we'll do a little function test. Owner can execute commands, be public, and minimal accounts up there. So let's do a little arrange act assert going on here. So for arrange, what should we do? Well, we should probably get a mock ERC20, right? So let's go ahead and get that. Uh, this actually comes directly with Foundry and Open Zeppelin. So we're going to use the Open Zeppelin one. So we'll do a little import mock ERC20. 
from at open zeppelin slash contracts slash I think it's mocks slash ERC or mock ERC or what is it ERC 20 mock dot soul is that what I I just looked up ERC 20 mock ERC 20 mock yes contracts mocks token contracts mocks token there we go and it has mint and burn great open zeppelin contracts mocks token ERC 20 mock okay cool and then we'll do a little ERC 20 mock USDC we'll say USDC equals new ERC 20 mock and the ERC 20 mock takes nothing okay cool so we're going to do a little USDC approval actually we can do a little USDC mint let's do a little USDC mint take it back because in this mock we have this mint function let's just test that that's a little bit easier and more fun to test so we can kind of start by assert equal the USDC dot balance of address minimal account is going to be zero like that then we could say address destination is going to be the address of USDC right because what are we testing in minimal account we're testing execute so we're going to need destination value function data so destination is going to be our USDC contract value is going to be zero and the function data is going to be the mint function so dest is going to be this u256 value is going to be zero and then we can do bytes memory function data equals this is where we do some wonderful abi dot encode with selector erc20 mock dot mint dot selector like this and if you're not familiar with how this works definitely be sure to go way 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 back to the nft section to learn about this the nft section of cypher updraft so this is going to get us the function selector of this uh, we actually could also just do this actually now that i'm thinking about it <laughs> but i'm going to do this for verbosity because if this did have parameters we would you know add the parameters in here but in any case so now we need to prank the owner of this so we can do a little vm.prank minimal account dot owner like this and then we can run minimal account dot execute dest value function data and this should have our minimal account mint some erc20 mock to the minimal account right so and let's yeah so let's do assert equal usdc dot balance of address minimal account should be how much are we minting here let's go back to that erc20 mock mint oh oh excuse me mint does take an account and amount here so let's actually go back over here let's go up to the top and we'll do u256 constant amount equals 1e18 amount so what did we just say it was it was going to be account and amount so we want to do when we encode this we want to do the account so we'll say address minimal account and then the amount like this and now we're actually encoding mint with minimal account and amount so this is actually kind of a, a more fun test because we're testing a function with parameters so i like that a lot better so ustc.balance of minimal account should equal this amount that we just added in here and great that's our whole test let's give this a whirl forge test dash dash mt paste this in let's add a couple of these let's zoom in a little bit setup failed invalid owner uh, oh it's because passing in the zero address so when we do our deploy deploy minimal account here this account.config if we go over to the helper config uh we don't have this set up so it's giving the zero address so that yeah, let's go ahead and, and set this up here so let's do return network config entry point let's just do address zero for now because we're, we're going to need to create the mock in a minute but for now let's just do address zero and then we'll do account um i'm going to cheat a little bit and i'm going to use the foundry default sender for this so if you look in base.sol we've mentioned this a few times before the default sender for foundry is this 
kind of default color. It's this address right here. So I'm going to use this here up at the top. I'm going to say address constant foundry default wallets equals that address here. And we're going to have the account be the foundry default wallet like this. So it can be restricted to view and then we'll deploy mocks in a little bit. But okay, so now we actually have an account here, the foundry default wallet. So now if we rerun this test again, this one should actually work now, now that we have a, a non-zero address sender, not from entry point. Oh, let's go to our minimal account .sol. Require from entry point. Require from entry point or owner. This is why we write tests, my friends. So let's run that again. And boom. Okay, cool. And it's giving us a warning because we haven't finished this function yet, but we have this passing. And this is very exciting because now we know for our minimal account abstraction, we can at least do this setup right here, right? Cool. Now we want to move over to make it do this setup. And there's going to be a couple of steps that we're going to do to get there. All right, cool. Well, we should probably do one more. We should test that. If you're not the owner and you're not the entry point, you should not be able to do commands. So we'll do a little function test non owner cannot execute commands public like this. Arrange will be pretty much the same as what's up here. So I'm actually just going to grab all of this. Yeah, I'm just going to grab the whole thing. And instead of minimal account.owner, we're going to do a little random user address random user equals make a DDR random user like this. And then back down here, we will do a little vm.prank random user forge forge test. And we'll have everything compile here and run. Oh, duh. <laughs> it failed successfully, but uh, I forgot to tell it it's going to fail. So we'll do a little VM that expect revert. And this will be minimal account dot minimal account underscore underscore not from entry point or owner dot selector. Rerun the forge test. And voila. Okay. Things are looking good. Now we get to go into the fun stuff. We just tested the execute, which is cool. We need to test this validate user operation. So in order for us to test this, we're going to have to create a packed user operation. We're going to have to get the hash of it, and we're going to have to figure out how much it costs. I think we can skip a lot of that, though. And we're probably going to have to refactor some of our tests so we can work with keys to actually do some of the signing here. And kind of our ultimate goal is going to be function test validation of user ops, ops like this. This will kind of be our final test. But before we get that, we should probably test a couple of other, other things first. So in this validate user OP, the first thing is going to be this packed user operation, right, which we can get from this contract here. And it's going to be this struct and it's going to be this signature. So we are actually going to have to write a script here that actually can generate all this code, all of this, and then actually sign it. So we could do this 100% right in our tests here. However, when we send a packed user operation, we're going to have to sign it anyways. So we might as well just actually create the code in here and then reuse it in our, in our tests because that's going to be much better because then we'll get to test actually our signatures over here, test our signature creators inside of our tests. So before we can even test validation of user ops, we're actually going to have to test creating this packed user op, right? So we're actually going to have to test creating this packed user operation. So we're going to have to make a script that will add all of this stuff in that will sign this. And then we need to make sure that this packed user operation is good and that the signature that we used is good as well. So and then only then can we actually run this. So we have to take a step back and let's start writing this send pack to user operation. And this is actually what we're going to do to test on an actual test net or an actual mainnet. That's I, I test this on an actual mainnet because I wanted to see the real experience. But you don't have to do that, of course. So we're actually going to build it here so that we can work with everything. Make sense. OK, great. Let's jump in. Okay, so you know the drill, pragma, 
make this MIT 0 0.8.24 contract send packed user op is script. That means we're going to have to import script from forge std slash script dot soul like this. We're going to have a function run public, which we're not going to define yet. Then we're going to have to have a function called generate user operation like this. And this is what we're going to have to build here. This get signed or generate signed user operation. And this should return that exact thing that we're going to pass to our minimal account here, right? We're going to have to pass this, this packed user operation type. So we're going to want to import that. So we're going to say import this packed user operation from, and this is actually in the lib account abstraction, haha, slash contract slash interfaces slash packed user operation dot so like this and this is going to return this packed user operation and this is a struct so packed user operation memory like this and here's where we get to use all the fun signature knowledge that we've recently learned to actually generate this signed user operation so first we're gonna have to generate the unsigned data and then we're gonna have to sign it and return it and return it like this. So let's actually focus on this first generate unsigned data. And I'm actually going to put this in a separate function. So I'm going to have another function here, function called underscore generate unsigned user op operation like this. And this is just going to take some bytes memory call data. We'll have this be internal pure, and it should return also a packed user operation memory, except this one is just not going to have the signature, right? So if we go back to this file, this is the packed user operation. So our, our generate unsigned user operation is just going to populate all these fields, basically leave the signature blank, and then we'll have this generate signed user operation actually do the signatures. So this, this will definitely be the easier one. So let's even just get started here. We'll do a little return packed user operation, and we'll just populate the fields as we see fit. So the first is going to be a sender, and we probably need to pass that in as a parameter as well. So we'll do address sender like this. Sender will be sender. We'll do a little nunce. This is where we probably want to be clever with our nunce here as well. We'll probably want to parameterize that too. So we'll do nunce or uint256, right? It's uint256. Yep, uint256 nunce. We'll say nunce is nunce. Init code. We probably could modularize this as well, but we're going to ignore this, right? Because we're not going to be initializing any contract. So we're just going to do a little blank data bit here. Or do I do hex? Hex like this. Yeah, okay. Then the call data is just going to be the call data. And the call data, of course, is going to have, you know, all of our function data, our function data to call. All right, next is going to be a couple of different gas limits. Now, I'm just going to kind of wing this. We don't really need to get this exactly correct because a lot of these are just limits here. So just roll with me on these. So account gas limits, we're going to do, we're actually going to make a couple of different variables at the top. We're going to do a uint 128 verification gas limit. This code was inspired by some of the ideology that was used to build some of this account abstraction bits here. So this verification gas limit, we're just going to say 16,777,216. And just know that this is probably going to be fine. If you run into issues with gas, you might want to tweak these a little bit, but this is what we're going to run with for now. Uint 128 call gas limit is going to equal this so these are going to actually be the same and then for the account gas limits we're going to do some clever ways to concat uh, these two variables together even though they're they're kind of the same thing so bytes 32 uint 256 verification gas gas limit and if you don't understand exactly how this is working don't worry too much about it uh, a little left shift 128 gas limit like this so this is really just kind of us combining these two into one bytes 32. If you want to 
jump into chisel and play with exactly what this will return you are more than welcome to do so but then we're going to do pre verification gas is just going to be this verification gas limit then we're going to do gas fees like this and we're gonna have to make some more clever stuff here again this is where we could be clever with how we're doing some of the gas fee stuff but i'm gonna say max party fee per gas is gonna be 256 this and for gas fees we're gonna do a little concatenation as well bytes 32 you and 256 max party gas fees shifted 128 or max fee per gas which we're gonna have to create that as well let's say uint 128 max fee per gas equals max party gas fees yeah like i said if, if the gas fees don't quite make sense here don't worry too much about it they're just gas fees and gas limits then what we have we have paymaster and data we did not add a paymaster so paymaster and data we're just gonna say hex blank we're gonna pass nothing and then for signature not sure we're also just gonna pass some nothing here okay cool the reason i put this in its own function is because this can be kind of gross here but we have our generate unsigned user operation which just generates essentially just this struct for us so what we can do now is we can say packed user operation unsigned user op equals generate unsigned user uh generate unsigned user operation this will take the bytes call all data or bytes memory call data call data uh, excuse me this needs to be bytes memory call data address sender and we're not going to pass the nonce in here because we're actually just going to use a foundry cheat code to get the nonce of the sender so there's a get nonce address account get the nonce of the given account or wallet boom we can just do it like this so we'll do a little uint 256 nonce equals vm.get nonce sender like this and then we'll pass the call data in here the sender in here and then the nonce in here as well and this of course needs to be memory like this okay nice great now we have this unsigned user operation now let's just go ahead and sign it and then return it so okay great so we have this packed user operation we just don't have the signature we just gotta sign all this now in order for us to actually sign this we have to get the user operation hash that the entry point contract is looking for so what so we want to actually sign this way the way that the entry point contract is expecting now if we go back into our lib account abstraction i'm actually just going to cheat a little bit and look for the entry point dot soul right here in account abstraction there's actually a function in here called get user op hash and this is how our entry point contract is expecting that hash to be created so what we could do is we could 100 percent copy paste this or we could kind of take this time to actually deploy our mock entry point contract and then use this get user op hash function to actually get the user op hash so and what's important to know is that the chain id is going to be part of the user op hash and this is actually really important so that we don't have cross chain replay attacks it's also hashed with the actual entry point address so there's no issues with using different entry points and we want to use whatever function the entry point contract that we're actually working with is using so back in our helper config we're going to need to add that entry point contract address for sepolia well not for zk sync but at least with our anvil our local we want to deploy a mock entry point contract so that we can actually work with that when working on our local network so let's go ahead let's actually import that entry point contract we'll do a little import entry point from lib slash account abstraction slash contracts where is this contracts core slash core slash entry point dot soul like this and then down in our mocks we can actually deploy this i'm also going to grab a little console here console2 from our script I'll do a little console2.log deploying mocks dot 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 then we'll do uh, entry point entry point 
entry point equals new entry point like this. There's no constructor or anything. And then we can take this entry point address here and boom, do address entry point like so. And then we're also going to want to do vm dot start broad cast of the founder DeFi wall, just in case we're on Anvil and then vm dot stop broadcast, of course, like so. Nice. So now that even our local one is going to have this entry point contract here, we can use it to call that get user op hash function. So we're actually not going to assign it quite yet. We're actually going to get the user op hash. And then we're going to sign it. And then we're going to have to do some clever signature stuff to actually sign it. So to get the user op hash, we're going to say bytes 32 user op hash equals and this is where we're going to have to get past that helper config address. So in another parameter here, we're going to get that config. So helper config dot network config to import that as well. Import or actually we can just do network config from script slash helper config dot s dot so we don't even need helper config dot we can just import that network config like this. And actually, if we do this, we don't even need the sender. Because instead of doing the sender, we can just say config dot account here and we can do that here config dot account like there. And then the user op hash is going to be config dot like this, we're gonna to need to wrap this in an I entry point interface. So import I entry point and you can see why we installed this as a dependency here. Import I entry point from lib slash account abstraction slash contracts slash interfaces slash I entry point dot so so we can do I entry point config dot entry point dot get user op hash and pass in our unsigned user op right there. Cool. Then once we have the hash, we can convert this into an eth signed message hash. So there's actually a function called to eth signed message hash that takes a bytes 32. And this is going to return the Kachak 256 digest of an EIP 191 signed data with version. Oh, so we're basically just going to add all this EIP 191 stuff to our bytes 32 so that it turns into a proper digest for signature stuff. So we'll do a little bytes 32 digest equals this user op hash dot to eth signed message hash e signed message hash. And since we're putting this function onto our bytes 32, we're going to have to import that. Oh, it looks like we're having an issue. We probably are going to have to do the helper config, but let's go ahead. Let's do import message hash utils from at open open zeppelin slash contracts slash utils slash cryptography slash message hash utils dot so and then we're going to say using message hash utils for bytes 32 and it looks like this is actually causing issues so let's just do helper config dot network config like that. Okay, cool. We'll run a, a forge build in a minute. So okay, so now we have the digest. This is the correctly formatted hash. So we're pretty much on the home stretch. Now all we need to do is sign this digest here. So we're going to do a little vm dot sign. We're gonna have to have the private key, comma, digest here. Now here's one of the cool things that you can do in Foundry. Typically, this is where you'd have to like do like a vm dot env uint private key, whatever. You have to stick your private key in here. But as you know, because you're taking Cypher and Updraft, yeah, you don't do that because that's a great way to accidentally expose your private key. So we're not going to do that here. So Foundry is pretty clever where if you have unlocked a key, right? You know how in Cypher and Updraft we teach you to do, you know, forge script dash dash account instead of dash dash private key. Well, if you have a private key unlocked with an account, you can just do config.account. You can basically pass this an address and Foundry will be smart enough to go, ah, okay, so we're using an address here. Let me check if I have that key unlocked. I sure does. 
boom, we're going to use that unlocked private key to actually sign this, which is outstanding. So, so we're actually going to sign this. And if you watched Kira's video, we're going to get that uint 8 V that byte 32 R oops, byte 32 R. Where is that? Byte 32 R and the bytes 32 S like this from the signature. And then we're finally going to create this signature at the bottom by just combining these values together. So we're going to say user signed operation equals, excuse me, we're going to say user signed operation dot signature, signature equals ABI dot encode packed R S and V. And just be sure to note the order. This is VRS and this is RSV. I must have spent like three hours trying to figure out why my signature was wrong. And it's because I had the order wrong. So note the order here. And then we're going to return our signed unsigned user operation. Actually, this is kind of confusing because now that's signed, let's say, let's just rename this to user op, user op, user op, user op, user op. Okay. So we now have a function called generate, not generated generate signed user operation it's probably giving me a warning because this should be a view let's call this a view generate user generate signed user operation we have generate unsigned user operation and we can now use these in our tests and we're passing call data and a config so what we're going to do now is we're going to pop back over to our test now that we have a script to actually do this way up at the top we're going to do send user operation send packed user operation send packed user op is going to be a state variable that we use. We're going to go ahead and import it, send packed user op from script slash send packed user op dot s dot soul like this, send packed user op, send packed user op. And then now what we can finally do is we can finally test that this actually works. So before we actually test the validation of our user op, let's just test that we're actually signing stuff correctly, right? Because if we're not signing stuff correctly, then our validation isn't going to work correctly either. So let's create a little function here, function, a little test function called test recover signed OP. And this will be a little public view function. And this is where we're just going to do an ECR recover on our signed user operation hash. And if we get the correct owner, this should work well. And I'm going to do a little refresher on all this. We're going to kind of summarize what we learned after we write this test, because I know we've gone over a lot of stuff. Don't worry, you're doing phenomenal by getting this far. And we're, we're going to go over this again. So don't worry too much. So test user op test recover signed operation. Let's do a little arrange act assert here for our arrange. We're actually going to cheat a little bit. We're going to copy all this because we're going to do the exact same arrange here. And oh, we also need the function data as well. And now we're actually going to combine all of this into the execution call data. So when we did the test above here, we only need the function data because we were just calling directly this execute, right? And this execute will call the USDC and pass the, you know, the function selector and all the data that needs to go to the USDC. What we need to do, because we're planning on having validate user operation work correctly. So we are actually going to have to code our call data that tells the entry point contract to call our contract and then have our contract call the USDC. So we've encoded this bit here, but we also now need to encode first calling the entry point and then calling the minimal account, right? Because I have to move all this over because we're going to send our data to the alt mempool here, the alt mempool is going to call the entry point. We need to tell the entry point to then call our account and then have in that same data that we signed, have the minimal account call USDC. So hopefully that makes sense here. So we have the function data for calling the USDC. We also need to get the function data to call the execute. So we're going to actually wrap this up in call data. So we wrap this up in call data in function data. Now we need to wrap this up in call data as well. So we're going to do bytes memory execute call data. And this is the data that's going to be used in order to tell entry point to call this function, which will call the USDC bytes memory execute call data equals ABI dot encode with 
with selector minimal account min -i minimal account dot execute dot selector comma destination value and function data. So this execute call data is saying, hey, entry point contract, where is it? Entry point contract, call our contract, and then our contract, call USDC, right? Minimal account, call this execute function, and then inside this execute function, call USDC. Make sense? Great. We have this execute call data. We now need to use this call data to pack, create our packed operation, right? So this packed user operation, because this is what the alt mempool needs to get. So we're gonna have our sender, nuns, blah, 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 all this good stuff here. What's cool is now that we have this send packed user operation. Oh, we need to do equals new send packed user operation. To actually initialize it. So now that we have this contract, we can just pop this stuff into our send packed user operation. And what are we gonna call? Generate signed user operation with the call data and the config. And this is gonna return what? It's gonna return our packed user operation that is nice and signed. So we're gonna to have to actually import that as well. So let me copy this. Do we not import that yet? We have not. Uh, we can actually just import it from the send packed user operation, which is kind of cool that we can do that like that. But we're gonna say packed user operation, packed user op equals send packed user op dot generate signed user operation execute call data comma and our helper config i believe what is it what does this take it takes the network config so not the helper config but we're going to do helper config dot get config so helper config dot get config so our helper config is going to give us the network config we're going to pass that to here and this needs to be memory like so so Oh, and, and this cannot be view because we're calling this and this could potentially deploy mocks. So, okay, cool. So we have our packed user operation. Finally, it should be signed. It should all be peachy hunky dory. It should all be good. Now we can finally do our act here, which is going to be where we recover, where we take this, where is it? Packed user operation, where we take this signature and we'll say, hey, let's use this public private key cryptography thing and figure out who actually signed this. We can always derive the public key that signed this. We can't always derive the private key, obviously, because it's the private key, but we need to ask the question, hey, is the person who signed this the right person? So we can go in here and we can do our little ECDSA recover. And we're gonna have to import that as well from our wonderful friends at Open Zeppelin. So a little import E, ECDSA from at, open zeppelin slash contracts slash utils slash cryptography slash ecdsa dot so like this and we can finally down in the bottom down in our act here where is it down here we can finally do ecdsa dot recover this and if we look in this and we look up that function recover it takes a hash and a signature so this is going to be the user operation hash and this is going to be the signature so if we scroll down, we have this whole packed user operation. We need to convert this into its hash. Don't worry, our friends at the entry point, remember they have this function, get user op hash, right? Which calls user op dot hash, blah, blah, blah. And this is a little bit cheeky, actually. It's a, a problem that I ran into for a while when I was first learning this. I was like, hey, is the hash hashing all of this? Because you can't get the signature of the whole hash if you hash the signature first like what the what the heck how did, what what is it actually hashing and the entry point is kind of tricky if you scroll up in here there's like a library that they're using user operation lib for packed user operation and if we go to this user operation lib there's a function in here called hash where they have this it has this function called hash where it calls encode and this basically encodes everything except the signature. So there's some stuff going on behind the scenes actually to hash the whole thing a very specific way without using the signature, which is why, again, we always want to make sure we're getting our hashes with the get user operation hash 
with whatever entry point that we're using, right? So, because the hash isn't, because we could 100% just hash this ourselves, but maybe we do it slightly differently than the way the entry point does it, and we'll lose our minds because we, we don't hash the right way. So actually, before we do the act, we need to get the hash. So we'll do bytes32 user operation hash equals entry point. Oh, we need to get the entry point. So we'll do I entry point config dot or do we have the config? No, we should have gotten the config, but helper config dot get config dot entry point dot get hash and we'll pass it this packed user OP hash here. So we'll get the hash and now we can finally pass this in to the recover function, although this isn't quite exactly right yet either. We also need to convert this to a dot to ETH signed message hash. There's a lot of getting the format right in here. So uh, we, we'll, we'll always want to kind of keep that in mind, which means if we're doing that, we got to scroll back to the top. I know a lot of stuff here and we're going to have to say using message hash utils for bytes 32. If you don't do this, stuff won't work and you'll be sad. So let's get that as well. Import message hash utils from at open zeppelin slash contracts slash utils slash cryptography slash message hash utils dot soul like this. And then now down here, we convert the user operation hash to the correct format of the hash. And then we can pass the signature. So we'll say user operation hash dot signature that we just created from this function here. Oh my goodness. And this is going to give us an address. So we'll say address actual signer equals this. And we can finally do a little assert equal the actual signer is going to be the owner, right? Because we can only, this should only work if the minimal account owner does the signing. So we'll do minimal account dot owner like this. Woo! I know that was a lot of stuff going on here, but let's run this as a test. Moment of truth here. Oh, and then I did this wrong. Contracts. There we go. So moment of truth here. Oh, I entry point. Oh, we got to import the entry point to. Um, is that in send packed user ops? It sure is. We can import it from there actually. I entry point. So now we can finally do a little test on this. Scroll back. Oh, just kidding. Not quite yet. I also messed something else up here. Message hash. I should get good at spelling, huh? That's usually my weakness. User operation hash dot signature signature. Oops, sorry, this is packed user op dot signature. Cool. Now we can finally run this. Let's grab this test here. Clear everything out. Forge test dash dash mt paste dash vvv. Moment of truth. Aha, interesting. We're getting this error. No wallets are available. Now, the reason for this is when you're working with scripting, like we are, right, in our scripts here, we have this send packed user operation and we do this sign here, right? So Foundry is smart enough to know that, okay, if you're doing a script, right, when we do forge script dash dash account or dash dash private key, if we have that, it'll say, okay, that account is quote unquote unlocked. And, and anytime you do something with a private key in an unlocked account, it'll go through. However, when we're just running forge test, right? like we're doing right here, we're not passing in an unlocked account. So Foundry gets to this line and goes, uh, nothing's unlocked, even though even in our helper config, we're using the default wallet. Also, we're gonna have to refactor this just a little bit because I, I messed something in here up. But in any case, so what we actually have to do is we have to be a little bit clever and use a workaround for this specific line here. So we're gonna have to do a little bit of a workaround here for this signing to actually work when we're working on a local chain or we're working with a test versus when we're actually going to the wild and use this on a test net. And the beauty of this is this actually inspired me to make this issue on the founder repo as a new feature. Hey, maybe it would be cool to just automatically use an Anvil default key so that you don't have to kind of do this workaround that we're about to go through right now. And this is the beauty of open source. And maybe by the time you watch this, this will be fixed. 
Because yeah, as I was recording this, I was like, oh, why do I have to do this workaround? It would be great if Foundry just had this feature. So we made this feature. So any any Rust devs watching this who want to take this on, you'll get a big thumbs up from me if you fix this. So <laughs> and this also just shows the beauty of open source and how all the tools we're working with here are constantly improving and constantly growing, which is why I have to consistently remake all of these videos. All right, cool. So let's refactor this for working with local tests. Anyways, so we're back here. We're going to need to refactor this and we're going to need to do a little bit of helper config stuff that we've done before. So a lot of the times, instead of doing all this stuff here, we'll make a code constants chunk at the top. I'm not going to do that here, but this would be a little bit better if we made like a code constant and we inherited it and blah, blah, blah. But this is just kind of our fun code base. But if you are here at this point in the course, you already know how to do all that. So we're going to go ahead and skip that for now and we'll do kind of the hacky way. So in our script here, we're going to say if block dot chain ID equals equals three, one, three, three, seven. We're actually going to do this a little bit differently. So we're going to take this VRNS. We're going to do V r and s like so we're going to initialize them as blank and then we're going to say if block that chain equals three one three three seven then we're going to do vm dot sign and we'll do v comma r comma s equals vm dot sign and instead of config dot account we're going to do the uint 256 anvil default key like this and we can grab this by just running anvil getting kind of the main key here, killing anvil, pasting it right here. So this will now be the anvil default key. So if we're on a local chain, we're just going to use anvil here. And then we're going to say else we're going to do all this stuff here. Uh, we're going to swap this out with VRNS like so. So now since we're using the anvil default key for our local chain development, we're going to have to go back into our helper config and actually we need to refactor this anyways. And we're going to have to go down to the bottom and update this so that instead of working with the foundry default wallet, we're working with Anvil by default here. So up at the top, we're actually going to comment this out. And now we're going to say address constant Anvil default account equals. And that's actually where we're going to pull Anvil back up and then grab this account here equals this. We're going to grab this Anvil default account and we're going to use the Anvil default account instead of the Foundry default wallet. Now, the other thing that we're going to have to do, because I forgot to do this, is local network config equals this and then return the local network config. If you didn't do this part, this would just always be true and you would just constantly be deploying mocks. So we don't want to do that. So now we're using the Anvil default account, Anvil default account, so that when we use our user operation We're, we will sign stuff with the anvil default key and then all of our tests should work so long as we work with the anvil default account that does mean that back in our deploy minimal though we're going to have to do vm to start broadcast config.account and then also transfer ownership to config.account just to make sure that we're going to transfer right away to the correct person here so so now now that we've done that little bit of a refactor let's rerun our test here what do you know? We do indeed pass. So this means that we've actually successfully written a code base that we will sign our user operation methods correctly. So we've got this kind of huge script in here. Well, it's actually not that huge, which will generate a signed user operation. And it's slightly different for working with local chains, but we're working with a real test net. It's going to use this and it'll work perfectly. Trust me. I'm going to do it in a little bit, don't worry. And we're actually correctly signing these user operations. Very nice. So now we want to get to the most important test. And then actually we're going to do one more test as well. Test validation of user ops. So this is where we're going to do what? Well, we're first going to sign our user ops. Then, then we're going to call validate user ops with our signed user ops. And then three, we're going to assert the turn return is correct. All right, so let's do it. And then we're going to actually do one more. So then we're going to do a final function test entry point can execute commands. 
And that's going to be our final test here. And the reason, of course, we want to test this is because, again, once again, who is actually sending these user operations? Well, it's going to be these alt mempool nodes who are going to submit the transaction to the entry point. So we need to make sure that those are working correctly here. So let's do this test validation of user ops here. And luckily, we can actually reuse a lot of the code that we've used up here. And by a lot of the code, I literally mean like all of this. So we can kind of save ourselves some time by copy pasting that user operation hash. Then we're going to get into the actual act here. So we're going to do exactly what we did before. But instead of just testing that we can recover correctly, we're just going to test that validate user op actually returns correctly. So we'll do a little vm.prank, the address of the entry point. I guess we're going to have to do this. I probably should have just initialized this at the beginning, huh? Well, I don't need this address either. Helper config .get config entry point. We're going to be the entry point because in our minimal account, right? Validate user validate user op can only be called by the entry point here. So we're going to call, we're going to be the entry point. We're going to say UN256 validation data equals. And remember, we are kind of just having some real minimalist validation data, but technically you can add a ton of stuff into your validation data. So we're going to say UN256 validation data equals minimal account dot validate user op user op we're going to need to give it the user operation hash and then we're also going to need to give it this missing account funds now for this we can kind of just pick some random big number because again this is just going to be sending the money to the entry point and for just the validation it doesn't really matter for the actual call, it'll matter, but for just validation, we can do whatever. So I'm just going to pick kind of a random number here. We're going to do uint256 missing account funds. We're going to say 1e18. That's probably plenty. That's probably actually way too much, but again, random number. So we're going to get this validation data. Oh, user, packed user op, excuse me. And now technically we should parse this validation data because our function here is actually pretty simple. It's just kind of returning what? It's returning zero or one, right? Or what is this? Yeah, one or zero. But technically, this validate user op, if we go to the i account.sol, the return validation data is actually like has a ton of data packed into it. So we probably should go ahead and parse the validation data. But since our code base is pretty simple and we just know it's returning a one or a zero, we can assume it as such, right? A one is going to be failed. A zero is going to be a success. And we are assuming that this is actually indeed a success. So what is it? Zero is a success. So we're going to say, okay, assert validation data equals equals zero or excuse me, assert equals validation data and zero. And now we can test this as well. Test dash dash MT, paste that in, and that passes as well. Okay, awesome. So we've tested, we're doing all of our crazy signature stuff correctly. We've tested that our minimal account validation is working correctly. Now let's just finally test what we really care about, which is going to be that the entry point can actually execute commands based off of our kind of crazy nonsense, right? So. Let's do this last one and then I'll show you exactly what this looks like end to end on a real actual network. And then once we do all this stuff here, we can move over to ZK Sync and we'll show you how to do this whole process on ZK Sync, which from a DevOps perspective is actually a lot simpler because they have native account abstraction. Very exciting stuff. And the reason I'm so particularly excited about you learning account abstraction is because a lot of people still aren't really using this to its fullest. There is so many cool things people can build with this. So, so you are unlocking a crazy skill just by learning this. So anyways, let's do test entry point can actually execute these commands here. So let's scroll on up and you already know we're probably going to want to do all of this stuff again, right? So I'm going to actually once again, copy paste, we're getting the destination, the value, creating the function data, the execution call data, creating the packed user operation, and then getting the user operation hash. We're getting all that good stuff here. And that's what makes writing this test actually so much easier because we've already done most of it. But what we do need to do is we actually need to fund our account, right? Because we don't have kind of this optional paymaster thing. So when these alt mempool nodes go to submit this transaction, they originally pay for it. And they're going to be like, hey, uh, we need to be reimbursed for this 
we're pulling it from you so you better have the money so we're going to go ahead and just do a little vm.deal address minimal account like this and we'll just deal 1e18 i know this is kind of a magic number and not best practice but you know you get the picture then we'll do a little act here we'll do a vm.prank and here's what's cool is we can actually be a random user now so we're going to prove that a random user basically any alt mempool node can submit this to the entry point and as long as we sign it you know we're doing it with our metamask not with google here as long as we sign it anybody can send our transaction which is kind of wild so vm.prank and all they're going to do is on this entry point contract is call this function handle ops. That's it, which we're going to pass our ops, our, our packed user operations, which is just going to be a single user operation. And then the beneficiary, who is the person to actually get the fees, which we're going to give to random user, right? Because they're the one actually executing this transaction. So we're going to give them the fees for actually doing this. Thank you, random user, for sending our transaction here. So all we have to do is do helper config .get config entry point. Yeah, I should have saved this earlier, but you know, I entry point helper config .get config entry point dot handle ops. And all we have to do is pass in the array of this packed user ops. So let's actually also do a little packed user operation array memory ops equals new packed user operation array of size one here and then we'll say ops of zero equals packed user ops like this so handle user ops will pass in this ops array we'll give random user random user is it random user random user oh i didn't capitalize the u okay well we'll give random user the fees for this and then we can just do an assert finally packed user operation packed user there we go and then we can do an assert and we're going to do the exact same assert that we did when just our EOA was the one to call this. So we're going to do this assert right here because we're doing this mint assert here. So let's scroll on down. We'll do assert. Boom. Random. Oh, and then we can make this payable as well. So it doesn't error on us. User operation hash. Oh, we don't even need the user operation hash because that's inside of our handle user ops. And let's go ahead and let's test this. Forge test dash dash MT paste it in dash VVV. Zoom in just a little bit and it failed, whoops. So since you're at this point in the course, you now are a little bit better at debugging. You're a little bit better at understanding what's going on. Stuff like this is pretty much going to define your life. Debugging stuff and figuring out where to solve it. So we're gonna do a little bit of a debugging exercise. We're gonna solve this, we're gonna fix this, and then we're gonna move forward in life. And this is gonna be a great time for you to pause the video and try to see if you can debug this yourself. Of course, if you got the same issue, hopefully you did because you've been following along. Because guess what? This is coding. Coding is a lot of the time it's going to be figuring out why you got certain errors, right? And it's gonna be going through all the debugging skills we've been learning, talking to ChatGPT, maybe Googling it, maybe even going on YouTube for the error. So pause the video, go ahead, try to debug this yourself, and we'll come back in a minute. For something like this, ChatGPT will definitely not be very helpful. So let's go ahead and jump into some debugging practice. So Foundry has some really nice tools where we can actually do forge test dash dash debug and it'll drop us into kind of this really low level debugger here where it has all the op codes and everything that's going on here. So one of the tricks that I like to do is hit shift G and this will bring you right to the end of where it actually reverted. And in kind of the, the bottom here, we can see the, the line and the code of solidity where this actually had an issue, right? So we're looking kind of right here. Now what we can do is we can start walking backwards to see, okay, what was the line in this handle ops command that actually failed? Because the output we got from Foundry before wasn't really super helpful. So I'm gonna start pressing the K keyword. If you look at the bottom, there's kind of this JK previous next opcode. This is opcode by opcode. 
we haven't gone over opcodes yet. We go over that in the assembly course. You can go ahead and check that out later if you want. But we'll just go ahead and start hitting J, which will walk us back through kind of the code base. At some points, Foundry will get a little bit confused. It won't exactly be sure what line we're pointing to, but we'll keep going back. And eventually we'll land here. So it's saying try iCount sender dot validate user op. And this is the line that is having issues. Huh, but we we tested validate user op. Validate user op is working great. iCount sender. So this sender should be what? This sender should be the minimal account. Okay, well let's okay, let's quit this by pressing Q. Let's go back and let's see. Okay, get signed, user operation. Okay, generate user. Blah, blah, blah. Let's go see what this is doing. Uh, sender is going to be sender. Okay, who are we assigning to sender? Config.account. Oh, we're sending the wrong account. Ugh. Now we could 100% confirm this too by actually going to the entry point.soul, finding this line here, right? And I've kind of already cheated. I've got these added right here and doing a little like console.log, making sure these are the correct senders, the correct addresses, etc. So this would be another way to do this. Of course, you would have to do kind of a clever import. So if you want, you can go ahead and do like a clever import here in your entry in your mock entry point here and import console to print them out, <clears throat> print out those values, etc. So but in any case, yes, this is wrong. This should be the minimal account. So we're going to need to do a little bit of a refactor here. So call data config. Yeah. OK, so we're actually going to need to have the address minimal account passed in here as well. And it's this minimal account instead of the config.account that we're going to have to work with. So same thing with the nuns. We're going to have to use minimal account here. And since we're updating this, any place that use this is also going to have to get updated. So this is all going to be fine, but all of our tests are going to be kind of messed up. So in here, we're going to have to do a little comma address minimal account. And I'm just going to copy this whole bit right here. So great. That looks good now. We're gonna have to do a comma here. Address minimal account. Okay, that looks good now. We're gonna comma here. Okay, that looks good now. Any place else? I don't know. Let's do a little forge build. See if stuff's actually working. It sure is. Okay, and now let's rerun the test and let's see if that actually works now. Hmm. AA25 invalid account nuns. And if you want to go ahead and debug this one, feel free. Or I can just tell you, but I highly recommend you pause the video and you go ahead and try to figure this out yourself. <laughs> but basically, our vm.getNonce, this returns essentially the wrong nonce. The entry point also has a get nonce function, but we want to do get nonce minus one. Let's run this now for the final time. And we will finally see that that everything passes successfully. Fantastic job getting this far. So I know we just went over a lot. So let's do a quick summary on all the amazing things we just learned and the power that you just unlocked for yourself. So we created a minimal account, which takes advantage of Ethereum's account abstraction or really any EVM compatible chain that supports this. Account abstraction allows us to define anything can validate a transaction, not just a private key. Maybe our friends want to validate it. Maybe our Google session key wants to validate a transaction, whatever you want. All we have to do is code a smart contract that says, here is what can sign my transactions. Once we deploy this, when we actually want to send an account transaction, transaction, we first sign the data and we send it to a group of alt mempool nodes. These nodes are going to be the ones to combine everything into a single user operation they're going to combine everything into a user operation and call the handle ops function on an entry point contract. This contract will then do a lot of validation. And if it looks good, it will call your account and your account will call the DAP it's working with, etc. This is really fantastic because you can sign and send transactions where you don't pay any gas. If you have set up a paymaster where somebody else is going to pay for the gas, you can code any type of validation into your account. You can say my Google session keys is going to be the one to sign my transactions. My friends are going to be the one to sign transactions. I'm going to add a spending limit. I'm going to give my children an allowance on their account abstraction transaction. I'm going to give them a wallet that they can use for now, but I'm going to put parental controls on it where I have to approve all their transactions. You can code literally 
any rules that you want into your account. We built a minimal account that uses this account abstraction. The main function that we needed to get correctly was validate user operation. Instead of sending a regular transaction object to the blockchain, those alt mempool nodes will send a user operation to the entry point.sol contract, which will call your contract and call the custom logic that you built for your validate user operation. If the transaction is valid and, your, and the signatures associated with the transaction are valid, it will then execute the transaction and do whatever you want here. We did some very basic signature validation and we even wrote a quite badass script to generate signed user operation data generate unsigned user operation data, and then actually send the handle ops transaction directly to the blockchain. So at this point, you've learned what I want you to do to learn for Ethereum account abstraction. This is a great time, if you like, to go ahead, take a break, go to the gym, get some ice cream, get some coffee, whatever you want to do. But we're not done with account abstraction. We have understood this wonderful process on Ethereum. However, as we've kind of seen, it's quite convoluted. So we are now going to learn account abstraction on ZK Sync, which has this built in. The only difference is you need to send a type 113 transaction, and that's it. Because they have what's called a combined mempool. They have the alt mempool and the normal mempool are both just the mempool, which is really cool. So game plan moving forward. We're going to done. We've done this. We're just going to deploy a user op onto Arbitrum, and then we're going to do the whole thing again for ZK Sync. Like I've been saying, now's a great time to get take a break, go to the gym, get some ice cream, get some coffee, and we'll see you soon. But let's do it. So before we actually go to ZK Sync, let's go ahead, let's actually send this, let's actually run this for Arbitrum. And if you go on the GitHub repo associated with this course, you can go ahead and actually see kind of the make commands that we're going to run. I'm just going to go ahead and do it right here because it's not super important that you actually run the scripts, but it is cool just to see kind of it all happen. So, so to for us to deploy our code base, we're going to do a little forge script script slash deploy minimal dot s dot sol dash dash rpc URL. We're going to be using an Arbitrum RPC URL. I've already sourced my dot env and already have this in here like i said i'm just kind of quickly speeding you through this just so that you would see what this would look like we're going to do dash dash account is going to be my small money aka my burner account this is a burner account that i deploy stuff with since arbitrum is a real mainnet there will be real funds here so you always want to use a burner account to deploy stuff just in case you mess something up. So we're gonna use a burner account or my small monies account. And then we're gonna do dash dash broadcast, dash dash verify, verify like this. And after this has been deployed, and I've actually already sent it just a tiny, tiny, tiny little bit of ETH as well. After this has been deployed, we can kind of scroll down in here. We can see this is the minimal account that I deployed. I made it. I added some NAT spec and stuff. It's a little bit different than exactly what we coded together here, but here is the code base. And now what we're going to finally do is we're going to send that user operation. And actually we do need to update our script. We actually do need to update this script because I forgot to add the run stuff in here. So let's, let's add the run stuff in here real quick. So we're going to say helper config, helper config equals new helper config address. This is where I probably would want to do like helper config dot get config dot USDC, but I'm actually just going to grab the Arbitrum, Arbitrum mainnet endpoint, Arbitrum mainnet USDC address. So we grab this, we go to Arbitrum scan, paste this in, boom, native USDC token deployed by circle to Arbitrum. Okay, cool. So that's going to be our destination. You went to 256 value is going to be zero here. Let's do bytes memory function data equals. Let's just call the approve keyword. So we'll do ABI dot encode with selector. We'll say IERC 20. Let's import this from at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash token slash ERC 20 slash IERC 20 dot soul dot soul like here dot approve dot selector 
and we'll approve and I'm going to pick myself. This is just another one of my wallets that we're going to go ahead and approve here. And then we'll choose an amount. We'll do one E18. Yes, this isn't the best code because I'm just kind of showing it for this video. If you want to go check out the nicer code, be sure to check out the GitHub repo. Then we're going to do the bytes memory execute execute call data equals ABI dot and code with selector. This is a nearly exactly is what we did in the test minimal account dot execute dot selector dest value function data like this we need to import minimal account import minimal account from src slash ethereum slash minimal account dot soul like this then we're going to say packed uh, user operation memory user op equals underscore get, excuse me, not equals generate signed user operation. We're gonna have the execute call data. What else? We're gonna need the config. So helper config dot get config like this. And then the address of our minimal account, which I'm just gonna kind of hard code for now. Boom, execute call data like that. Then we're gonna say packed user operation array memory ops equals new packed user operation array one, exactly like what we did in the tests. Ops of zero equals user op. And then finally, vm.start broadcast i entry point. Do we have this in here? Yep, we should do i entry point of helper con dot get config dot entry point dot broadcast oops dot handle ops ops and then and this can be this can be anybody that we want I'm just gonna do config dot account here up config dot get config so I'm gonna go ahead and, and kind of speed through this actual deployment process here what I'm gonna need to do in here is I'm gonna need to go ahead and add Arbitrum and Arbitrum config once I add an Arbitrum config, I'm going to need to make sure all my wallets and stuff are set up correctly. Uh, I'm going to kind of speed through doing that, do that behind the scenes. So, all right, let's go ahead. And then of course this needs to be payable. And then a little vm.stop broadcast as well. Okay, so let's go ahead let's run this as well. So what we're going to do forge script, send packed user op.s.sol dash dash RPC URL arbitrum rpc url dash dash account is going to be small money dash dash broadcast dash vvv now i've actually already run these commands and i've already deployed this minimal account much earlier and i don't feel like spending more actual gas one of the things that's kind of rough about testing account abstraction is there's not really a testnet way to test these so i had to ship it on to a real mainnet which is why i did an arbitrum here so but like I said, I did this a while ago, and here's the output. So this code base is working wonderfully, and now you know how to do this. We can see we have an internal transaction in here. Um, so we have an internal transaction in here, where if we look at kind of the logs in here, we can see we called handle ops, we had an ops.sender, we had the call data in here, we had all everything we talked about, and we had the, a beneficiary. And what this ended up doing was, if we go to the logs here, we scroll down in the logs here. The USDC token gave approval, gave this much approval to this address. And we have successfully made an account abstraction user operation call. Let's go. So you could 100% take your newfound power here and go build some amazingly cool things for the Ethereum ecosystem where you're where there's a lot of smart contracts, where there's a lot of layer twos that don't have account abstraction built in natively, and you'll have to do kind of all this funky programming. Or you can follow along with me and we can learn how to do this on ZK Sync. So if you didn't take that break, be sure to take that break, go to the gym, get ice cream, get coffee, get whatever, and then come back. Cause we're gonna do this all over again, but on ZK Sync with native account abstraction. So take a break and I'll see you soon.
All right, so let's start jumping into working with ZK Sync for account abstraction. Now, like we were saying, ZK Sync has what's called native account abstraction. Where we don't have to do this weird middle step of sending to this alt mempool. We just send to the normal ZK Sync mempool. There's also no entry point dot sol. Everything just goes directly to your contract, right? So we get the much simpler setup that kind of looks like this, where you send your transaction to the mempool and you don't even have to spend gas. This is why when we actually did send that transaction, send deploy that smart contract in Remix with ZK Sync, we actually had transaction type 113. We were actually just signing a transaction. We didn't actually spend any gas ourselves. We sent this data to a ZK Sync era node and it deployed our contract and then actually did end up charging us afterwards to spend gas because somebody needs to spend gas. But we but this is why we hit sign instead of send transactions. So we signed all of this data, which they then sent. And since ZK Sync has native account abstraction built in, it was able to automatically charge our wallet. And all of this happens kind of automatically. And don't worry, this is my test net account. I'm not this rich. Now to get working with account abstraction on ZK Sync, we're going to install this package called Foundry Era Contracts. This is a mirror of a lot of the system contracts in the ZK Sync system. We're going to learn about this thing called system contracts that ZK Sync has, which enables a lot of these really cool automatic things happening in the background. For the duration of this curriculum, anytime you see like era contracts or Matter Labs era contracts, we're going to work with this Cypher Foundry era contracts instead. I've made a lot of tweaks to the code base so that's easier to work with and easier to use. So this is what we're going to be working with. At some point, I'll put like a little disclaimer at the top here that says, hey, instead of this, now go use, you know, whatever the ZK Sync team comes up with. But for now, this is what we're going to be working with. So I want you to go ahead to get started and we're going to go ahead and we're going to go and install this. And, you know, let's get let's close all these up. Let's pull up our terminal, we'll do forge, install, paste it in. And for this video, we're going to use 0.0.3. So we're going to say at 0.0.3 dash dash no dash commit, of course. All right, great. Now that we have this installed, we can actually open up our command palette and look for I account dot soul. But instead of in the account abstraction folder, we're going to look for it in the foundry era contracts folder. So if you can't find it like that, you can just open up your lib foundry era contracts, SRC system contracts, contracts interface, I account dot soul. And I would like you to also open up this default account dot soul which at the moment is completely commented out. Although depending on when you watch this, it might not be commented out. So the reason I'm showing you these is because something really interesting that ZK Sync does. On Ethereum, there are two kinds of wallets. You have kind of your classic traditional externally owned accounts. This is going to be your MetaMask. This is going to be your Ravi, et cetera. And then you have your smart contract wallets. These are going to be your multi-sigs, your account abstraction accounts, which we just created. And these are basically the two different kinds of wallets. Now, this causes a lot of issues, though. Whenever you're coding transactions, sometimes you have to know if it's a smart contract wallet or not. Some people have code where they say, hey, you know what? Dealing with smart contract wallets is too complicated. And, and some of them will even have checks saying, if you're a smart contract wallet, deny the transaction, revert the transaction. And there's a lot of reasons for this, but it definitely makes dealing with wallets, dealing with addresses really difficult. So what ZK Sync did was it said, okay, you know what? All EOAs are smart contract wallets. So externally owned accounts and smart contract wallets are basically exactly the same, and we are going to treat them as such. And this default account contract, which again, I've got everything commented out. You can uncomment it to kind of see what this looks like. Every single account, every single smart contract account is set up as a default account. So if we go to our MetaMask here, and we take our wallet address and we go to the ZK Sync era Sepolia Explorer or Mainnet Explorer, it doesn't really matter. We paste that in here. It doesn't look like it's a contract, right? It looks like it's a normal wallet address. There's no contract tab here. Patrick, what are you talking about? Well, the ZK Sync Explorer is smart enough to know, ah, okay, the code for this is a default account. So we're going to show it as if it's not a smart contract wallet. So we're going to show it as if it's a normal externally owned account and not a smart contract wallet. However, they are all smart contract wallets, which I actually think is really cool because 
in this sense, you know that every single address you interact with is going to be a contract and is going to have code. And to me, that actually makes stuff a lot easier. Now, every single wallet, including your EOAs, follows this interface, follows this interface here, which I think is really cool. They have a validate transaction, execute transaction, execute transaction from outside, pay for transaction, and prepare for Paymaster. And this looks really similar to what we saw on Ethereum for our Ethereum account abstraction. But again, because ZK Sync has account abstraction built in, every single wallet has this account abstraction type functions that we can interact with. And this is one of the things that makes ZK Sync so powerful is that it has this account abstraction built directly into the chain. Because of this, it makes doing all this setup much easier, right? We don't have to deploy that entry point contract. We don't have to send our user operations to an alternative mempool and it cuts out the middleman here. So every single account, every single address will have these functions to some extent, okay? So knowing this, we can now take this knowledge and actually apply it to what we're gonna do here. So we're gonna create a, oh, I've already created the ZK Sync folder. We're gonna create a new file called ZK minimal account.sol and we're gonna get cracking. And this is gonna be our minimal ZK sync account abstraction account. So we know we need this I account thing, right? We know this is the most important interface. We need our contract to have these functions in order for us to use this account abstraction thing. So let's go ahead, let's import this and start from there. So I'm gonna do import I account, lib slash foundry era contracts slash SRC slash system contracts slash contracts slash interfaces slash I account dot soul and do a little toggle word wrap here. So cool. And now we're going to do contract ZK minimal account is I account like this. Oh, and then of course let's do, wow. Pragma. Can't believe I forgot that in the beginning. MIT 0.8.24. Boom. Okay. Now it's saying, hey, you should be marked as abstract. Let's just grab these functions in here. Boom, we're gonna copy, paste them in here. We're gonna get rid of these comments here, but you should add comments. Going to add these little semicolon bits here or these little curly brackets. And one of the things we're gonna need is this transaction, call data transaction. We go back into the I account. It's pulling from this memory transaction helper dot soul. So let's actually import that as well. So we're gonna do import transaction from, and I'll explain what that means in a minute, lib foundry era contracts slash SRC slash system contracts uh, slash contracts slash contracts slash libraries slash memory transaction helper dot soul. So now we have this transaction thing, we have these functions, Let's keep going. So probably the first thing that we're gonna to need to do here is understand, okay, what are these functions? Like what are, what are they actually doing? And we can probably tell based off of their names, but let's get a better understanding by going through the interface itself. So the first one is going to be validate transaction. And if we go to the minimal account.sol, this is gonna be analogous. This is gonna be very similar to validate user op. So in Ethereum, they're called user operations, but since account abstraction is built directly into ZK Sync, ZK Sync just says validate the transaction because it doesn't care if you send a, an account abstraction transaction or a regular transaction, it considers all of them transactions. So this validate transaction is going to be the ZK Sync equivalent of this validate user operation. On Ethereum, they're user operations. On ZK Sync, they are just transactions. And what's kind of cool here is there's this transaction struct, transaction call data transaction. I know that's a little bit confusing here. And we're actually gonna change these to memory though. Memory, 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 memory to make our coding a little bit easier because we don't really wanna have to do a lot of like memory to call data conversions here. But ZK Sync has this transaction object and I have created this memory transaction helper .sol that you guys can check out. The reason I created this was to, again, make a lot of the development here a little bit easier. Some of the conversions between call data and memory kind of break a lot of things. So 
I just said, screw it for this tutorial. We're just going to work with memory. We're not going to deal with any of that conversion stuff and make your lives miserable. But in this memory transaction helper, there's this struct transaction. So this is the structure used to represent a transaction in ZK Sync. And what's cool here, let me zoom out just a little bit. I know it's this kind of massive struct, but what's cool here is every single transaction, anytime you send a transaction on ZK Sync, it's this struct that's used to represent it. And it, so if we kind of go through this, we see first, we see transaction type. So Kira went through this a little bit on the different transaction types, type one, type two, type three, and the account transaction types of 113, AKA OX71. We have a classic from, a classic to, a gas limit, more gas stuff, more gas stuff, more gas stuff, a paymaster. Now this is gonna be the exact same as a paymaster in the Ethereum world. They're built natively into ZK Sync. You have a nunce, you have value. There are some reserve keywords for maybe in the future, yeah, for, for this. In the future, we might want to add some new fields to the struct. So just some reserve stuff. Obviously, the data, signatures, and then this factory depths, which we will get to in a little bit. These are actually really important. Paymaster input and then reserve dynamic. Again, this is just kind of like a reserved extra space in the struct here. Every single transaction can be fit into this struct here, essentially. So when we in ZK Sync send an account abstraction transaction, all it's going to do is say, okay, transaction type is going to be 113. From is going to be, you know, our ZK minimal account. Uh, two is going to be blah, 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 et cetera. We could also send kind of a normal transaction type two, and the account could be from whomever, right? So anytime we send a transaction in ZK Sync, it can be every single transaction is at some point put into a struct transaction, into this struct here. So when we do validate transaction, we send a transaction hash, a suggested signed hash, and then the actual transaction itself. And when we call validate transaction, one of the parameters is going to be the transaction struct, which we will populate, of course. Now, what are these two, the transaction hash and the suggested sign hash? Well, let's go back to our I account here. So the suggested sign hash is going to be the hash of the transaction. So the TX hash is the hash of the transaction to be used in the Explorer. And the suggested signed hash is going to be the hash of the transaction is signed by the EOAs. We are going to ignore these right now. We're not going to use them. This is something that something called the bootloader is going to work with, which again, we'll talk about in a little bit. But for now, we're going to pretend these don't exist and we're only going to focus on this transaction. Now, what this returns is going to be the magic value that should equal the signature of this function if the user agrees to proceed with the transaction. So it's a bytes for magic, but you can kind of think of this as, again, like a true false. Because here, if we want to have this return true, all we would do is say like return I account dot validate transaction trans selector. Boom. If we want this to return what essentially is true, this is all we would return. And just like in minimal account, how this returned this validation data, which has like a zero and a one and some other stuff, this is kind of the equivalent of that, where you just return the function selector, and that's the equivalent of saying the transaction is valid. So we're going to delete that for now, though, because we're going to actually learn how to validate this pretty soon. So we're going to validate the transaction. We're only going to focus on this transaction thing. We're going to ignore these for now because we have to learn something in a little bit to understand these. Next, we have execute transaction. What do you think this one can do? Well, let's go back to the minimal count. In our minimal count, we had this execute function and we put this modifier on it, require from entry point or owner, or either the owner of this contract could call this execute or the entry point, which was that account abstraction contract. This execute transaction is the exact same. If we want to directly call this function with an owner without going through the account abstraction proxy that is ZK sync, we would just we would just directly call this execute transaction function. And again, this takes a transaction hash and a suggested signed hash, which again, we're going to ignore for now, but it's given this transaction object. So we're going to keep ignoring these for now. Transaction memory transaction. Boom. This is to execute any transaction. Next, we have execute transaction from outside. Let's go into I account. To take a look at this one. So this one doesn't have any comments here. However, what this one is, is this is going to be the function that gets called for somebody else to execute a transaction. So this is basically where if you sign ATX, send the signed TX to your friend, 
they can send it. They can send it by calling this function. So basically you create a transaction, you sign a transaction, you send it to your friend, and then they call it with this function. So execute transaction and execute transaction from outside essentially do the same thing. It's basically just gonna be a higher admin calling this versus execute transaction from outside is going to be basically anyone being able to call this. You can kind of think of this as the function that the entry point contract would have called in the Ethereum world. And when we create this function, we're gonna to have to validate the transaction and then execute it. Pay for transaction, this is similar in our minimal account to pay prefund, which was an internal function here. In order to do account abstraction, somebody needs to pay for the transaction. So this is where you encode who is going to be paying for the transactions. It could be your account, it could be somebody else. And then pay for paymaster. This is the function that gets called before you actually pay the paymaster if you have a paymaster. And again, a paymaster is somebody who is going to be paying for the transaction. So. so this is essentially what we want to do. So anytime somebody sends an account abstraction transaction, here's basically going to be the process. There's essentially two phases. There's the validation phase, and then there's the execution phase. So the first thing that happens is the user is going to send their transaction to the ZK Sync API client. I have here sort of a light node, but you can basically just think of this as sending it to Ethereum, right? So you send to the ZK Sync node. Then the ZK Sync node checks to see if the nonce is unique by querying the nonce holder system contract. Huh, wait, what? By querying the nonce holder system contract? What is that? And this is one of the biggest differences between Ethereum and ZK Sync. ZK Sync has a large collection of these things called system contracts. They're smart contracts deployed on ZK Sync by default that do a whole bunch of very interesting things. Let me show you a very specific example. This is address 006. So it's all zeros and then 806. And this is what's known as the contract deployer system contract on ZK Sync. If you scroll down, you look at the contract tab, you'll see a whole bunch of constants and you'll see this contract deployer.sol. This is a contract that ZK Sync has on it by default. So just by running a ZK Sync node, you automatically get this contract deployer smart contract. And this contract governs actually deploying smart contracts. Yes, I know, crazy. So on Ethereum, to deploy a smart contract, all you have to do is send an Ethereum transaction containing the compiled code of the smart contract without specifying any recipient. Doing that, the Ethereum nodes go, ah, there's no two here. They're probably trying to create a smart contract. I'm gonna take their code and deliver it as such. On ZK Sync, that's not how you do it. You actually call a function on here, create, create two, create two account, create account. You call one of these functions and it's these functions that will actually create a smart contract. So ZK Sync has a lot of these system contracts at very specific addresses that govern a lot of the functionality that goes on in ZK Sync. The contract deployer being one of the most important ones. This is also why when trying to deploy a smart contract to ZK Sync, we can have a hard time. So Forge Create with Foundry does this Ethereum edition, right? It sends an Ethereum transaction containing compiled code of smart contract without specifying a recipient. This is why we have to do forge create dash dash zk sync dash dash legacy because foundry zk sync sees this leg uh, C, sees this and goes ah okay they're probably meaning to call this create function on the contract deployer system contract so this is why actually a lot of these different commands don't quite work for zk sync as of today with foundry because of these system contracts. Now these system contracts actually make it a lot easier to interact with ZK Sync because if you want to just do anything, you just send a transaction and you say, hey, I want to create an account and you call their create function. And arguably that's actually much simpler, but it's one of the biggest differences between ZK Sync and Ethereum is going to be these system contracts. In the ZK Sync documentation, there's a ton of information on the different types of system contracts, what they do, and then how to interact with them as well. So in any case, Put this a little bit earlier. So this is gonna be the life cycle of a type 113, aka a 0x71 transaction. So this is the life cycle exclusively for an account abstraction transaction, okay? So phase one in the validation, the ZK Sync API checks to see the nonce is unique by querying the nonce holder system contract. 
So another one of these system contracts is this thing called the nunce holder. What this contract has is it has a ton of mappings where it has the nunce of every single smart contract on ZK Sync. Yes. So you can look up the nunce of every single smart contract on ZK Sync by querying this nunce holder contract. So this nunce holder smart contract has a mapping of every single account, every single account address and the nunce that they currently are working with. The second step in a ZK Sync account abstraction transaction is going to be checking the nunce holder system contract, making sure that it's good. Then the ZK Sync node is going to call validate transaction, which must update the nunce. So in our ZK minimal transaction, whenever we send an account abstraction transaction, this validate transaction function is going to be called. And if this bytes magic returns a, a valid magic value, then these ZK Sync nodes will go, cool, this transaction looks good. But if not, it will say, uh-uh, no good here. So then a question should probably come up. Okay, so we're calling this validate transaction thing, but it must update the nuns. So then this is actually not going to be a view function. This is going to be like a legit transaction. So the question is, so who is the message.sender when this is called? So, you, so are you telling me, Patrick, that anyone can call validate transaction and then just update the nuns? That sounds insane. Well, that would be insane, which is why we don't want to allow that. So Patrick, you're saying we must update the nuns. So who's the message.sender when this is called? Well, whenever you send a type 113 transaction, the message.sender, the message.sender is always going to be this thing called the bootloader system contract. Now the bootloader system contract, you can kind of think as like the super admin system contract of all these system contracts. So whenever you send this type 113 transaction, it will be rerouted to this bootloader system contract. This is how ZK Sync has account abstraction built in. It has this bootloader system contract. You can kind of think of this as the entry point smart contract on Ethereum mainnet. So for everything that happens in here, the message.sender is always going to be the bootloader system contract. Make sense? OK, cool. So Sync API client, AKA the ZK Sync node, will call this validate transaction, which is going to update the nuns. And we're cool with that because it's going to be the bootloader system contract that actually is doing that call. So we're probably going to want to restrict the functionality of validate transaction here so that only the bootloader contract can call this once because we don't want anyone updating our nuns willy nilly. Next, the ZK Sync API client, aka the ZK Sync node, will check that the nuns is actually updated. So if this doesn't update the nuns, whole transaction will revert. Then it will call pay for transaction prepare for paymaster and validate and pay for paymaster transaction. So basically it will call and do all the functionality for paying for this transaction before actually sending the transaction to see if there's enough money to be to pay for it. And once this is called, it will verify that the bootloader gets paid. So there needs to be a there needs to be a balance inside of the bootloader, kind of similar to what we did with minimal account, how we sent the well, we have message.sender here, but this is the entry point, how we sent the entry point funds. Kind of same thing with ZK Sync. We just have to send the bootloader funds. And then if it passes all of this, the validation phase is done. And then we move on to the actual execution phase of the transaction. So in the actual execution phase, this ZK Sync API client will pass the validate transaction to the main node slash sequencer. So everything in validation kind of happens in this, like we said, this light node. So you can kind of think of the ZK Sync system as having a whole bunch of light nodes or API client nodes and then the main node, the main sequencer node. So the main node and sequencer as of today are both the same, but maybe in the future they get split up. Kira does a great job talking about why centralized sequencers are bad. And, and as of today, ZK Sync is working on decentralizing the sequencer so that there's not just one. But as of today, there's just one. The reason that they kind of have this split up into two is it would be very bad if the main node was stuck validating transactions all day so they have this kind of client API, this light ZK Sync node, do all the validation. Once the ZK Sync light nodes validate that the transactions are good, only then do they pass it over to this main node so we don't get a denial of service attack. If you're unfamiliar with that, don't worry about it. Then the main node will finally call this execute transaction function. So very similar to how the minimal account, we have execute, 
where we have require from entry point or owner. We're going to do the exact same thing in here. This execute transaction, we're going to say require from bootloader. And then finally, if a paymaster was used, the post transaction is called. So if there's any type of post transaction, we're not going to be worrying about that, but that would then be called. So that is the whole process of running a type 113 account abstraction transaction on ZK Sync. This is going to be the whole process, and we're going to see that flow go through here. Now, you might be asking, hey, Patrick, what about execute transaction from outside? Well, we're going to set this up so that anybody can actually call this, and they just still have to run through the same transaction validation as everybody else does. So this is where the bootloader calls it. This is where anybody can call it. You'll see what I mean when we build it out. But this is the flow that we're looking to do. We're going to work with these system contracts. We're going to do a lot. All right, so even though we've barely even coded anything, we've really just kind of been talking, we've already gone through a lot. So I want to take a quick breather, a quick refresher on kind of all the things we just learned, because I just threw a lot at you, and it's okay if it doesn't quite make sense the first time here, right? So follow along with me, code along with me here, and I promise you it'll make sense. Be sure to use the GitHub discussions, be sure to ask questions in the community, because this is a crazy unlock. This is a crazy power up that not a lot of people are taking advantage of. So let's do a quick recap of all the things we're doing here. So an account abstraction transaction is called a type 113 transaction. And unlike Ethereum, where you actually have to send your transaction to an alt group of nodes, which will then send it to an Ethereum node, on ZK Sync, all you have to do is say, hey, this is an account abstraction transaction, and you can send it directly to the normal ZK Sync nodes. When you do that, a ZK Sync system contract called the bootloader is going to take ownership of that transaction. In ZK Sync, ZK Sync has a group of what's called systems contracts. These are special contracts in the ZK Sync ecosystem with very unique privileges, locations, and update mechanisms. One of the simplest ones is going to be the nonce holder smart contract, which is literally a smart contract that has a mapping of all the nonces of every single account, every single address in the blockchain. When we send an account transaction transaction, a whole bunch of validation happens where the ZK Sync node will call validate transaction to increment the nonce. If the transaction is valid, it will then pass it to the ZK Sync sequencer to finish executing the transaction. We can additionally sign a transaction and let people call execute transaction from outside, where, where the bootloader isn't the message that sender, where whoever sends the transaction is message that sender, but we want to make sure they run through the same validation as the bootloader would run through. And of course, if we call execute transaction from outside, whoever is calling this is going to have to pay for the gas, whereas when we do the execute transaction and validate transaction, the paymaster will pay for the gas. So cool. So I know that's a lot, but stick with me. We're going to build this. It's going to be quite cool. And I am going to challenge you after this to build your own codified rules for account transactions. Some really easy ones could be like a spending threshold and some more difficult and more interesting ones could be like, all right, you're going to sign a transaction with your GitHub keys, with your GitHub session keys. If you do that, that would be very cool. All right, well, let's get cracking building our code base here. And I want to just already clean this up with some headers, external functions, grab that, paste it here, external, 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 and then we'll also do internal functions like this. Boom, because we're going to have some internal functions because we're going to reuse some code across some of these. So the first one that we're going to have to work with, and probably the most important one, it's going to be this validate transaction, right? So we must increase the nonce for this at notice, and we must validate the transaction. Oh, and actually, before we go keep going, we should do a foundry up ZK sync. Make sure we're working on ZK sync here. Do a forge build dash dash ZK sync. And we might have to wait a little bit for this. And great, after a little bit of waiting, we actually get an output here. Now there's gonna be a lot of warnings in here because a lot of the cheat codes we use in Foundry give basically warnings for ZK Sync because again, ZK Sync and Ethereum are slightly different. They don't use the same EVM, they don't use the same opcodes. So we're gonna get all these warnings, but as long as none of these are warnings with our actual code base that we're gonna deploy, these are pretty safe to ignore. And it looks like that is the case, so cool. 
and we'll periodically be compiling as normal just to make sure stuff works. So we're going to do this validate transaction and this must increase the nuns. It must validate the transaction. We're once again going to do check the owner signed the transaction and we'll go into this transaction object again. So we're going to have this be real similar to what we did with the Ethereum minimal account where it's just the owner. There's a single owner. There's no cool rules here. If you want to go do cool rules later on, you absolutely can. We should also, it doesn't say that we have to do this, but since we're not going to be adding a paymaster, right? We're not going to be doing kind of any of these clever, cool payment stuff. We will also check. We'll also check to see if we have enough money in this wallet to pay for the transaction. And that's pretty much it. So let's go ahead and jump into here. So the first thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to increment the nuns. So every single one of these wallets, every single one of these accounts comes with a nuns. And it's this nuns holder system contract that keeps track of the nonces and it's also what we'll have to use to increase the nuns. So you can see there's increase min nuns in here, set value under nuns. There are all of these different methods in here to actually increase the nuns and, and work with nonces. For us to actually increase the nuns, we have to do what's called a systems contracts call. So calling these systems contracts isn't quite as straightforward as just, okay, drop in the address and call it. Now, making sure we call a system contract actually requires a couple of special things we need to do. On the nonce holder, we're going to need to call this function here. Increment min nonce if equals. So basically, we're going to pass it the expected nonce of our account, which will start off as zero. And if it is zero, it'll go ahead and just add one, right? So we have this raw nonces address as key, old raw nonce plus one. So we're just going to increment the nonce by one here. So we need to call nonce holder and then increment the nonce of our ZK minimal account. To do this, we actually have to, in our foundry.toml, we have to add a flag underneath remappings. We have to add this is system equals true. So, and this is a, gonna be a little bit confusing. And if it doesn't make sense the first or second time, this is gonna be one of those times where I just say, hey, don't worry too much about it. So I asked this question on Stack Exchange Ethereum, and luckily the ZK Sync team actually responded, and I asked for some clarifications. But essentially, what happens whenever you pass the is system flag to the contract, it will inline replace all simulations with their is system call counterpart. So calling system contracts in ZK Sync is actually very difficult. So what the compiler will do, what the ZK Sync compiler will do is if you have this is system equals true, it'll say, okay, well, anytime I see a very specific call where the data is X, Y, and Z, I'm going to convert that into a system contract call. These are called ZK sync simulations. So if is system is true, very specific calls are going to turn into a system contract call once it's compiled, right? So if we look in the ZK out from our little compilation here, we can even go into where is it? ZK minimal all the way to the bottom, ZK minimal count adjacent. This bytecode here, this, if you're familiar with EVM bytecode, is not Ethereum bytecode at all. This is ZK sync bytecode which is completely different than Ethereum bytecode. But making a system contract call can be quite complicated. So basically, system is true. It says anytime you see this specific data inside of a call, turn into a system contract call. So, and here's a good example. For example, if there's a simulation like so, call address 25 with data seven string, hello secret thing. If this is a simulation or basically a key phrase or a key word or a key call, that's equal to the system contract dot update nonce holder one. If is system is false is passed to the compiler, the code base will just stay as this, right? It'll do this weird call to random nowhere bill. But if is system is true, it'll automatically transform this into system contract dot update nonce holder. So whenever we compile a smart contract like this, we need to have is system be true or false. And if it's true, anytime it sees one of these very specific calls, it'll transform it into a system contract call. You can almost think of these as like kind of very specific keywords, very specific variables that 
ZK Sync searches for whenever it compiles to swap out for a system contract call. So we want to do this system contract call. So we're going to use some tooling to do this system contract call and make it very obvious to us that it's a system contract call and very obvious to the compiler that it's a system contract call. So we're going to use this library called the system contracts caller to do this. So I'm going to go ahead and import this system contracts caller from lib slash foundry era contracts slash src slash system contracts slash contracts. I probably should have put a remapping in for this, huh? Um, slash libraries slash system contracts caller dot soul like this. Now this library has a lot of stuff in it. It's got a lot of different addresses, but the main thing that we're going to be using it for is the system call with propagated revert. And it's this function that's going to help us make these system calls, make these simulations without us having to really kind of know exactly what's going on here. So we want to call the system contract. All of this is if this systems contract stuff like doesn't really make too much sense to you for now, like I said, don't worry too much about it. Just kind of blindly follow along and just know that this is what we have to do to update the nuns. And there's going to be a couple of times when we call one of these systems contracts. And just in order to call the systems contracts, you need to set this is system to true. Just know this is how we call these system contracts. We need to update the nuns. So we need to use this system contracts caller dot system call system call with propagated revert this is going to help us do that system call and in here we need to pass a gas limit to value and data so gas limit for here we're just going to do a uint 32 whatever gas is left we're just going to pass all the gas that is associated with the transaction two is going to be the nunce holder system contract so we're going to need to get that nuns holder system contract. We can get this from a constants.soul file in the foundry error contracts. So all of the constants are in here. This is set up for Ethereum. This is set up for ZK Sync mainnet. Technically, if you look in the true ZK Sync code base, these system contracts addresses can actually change, but we've hard coded it for now. If in the future these addresses change, I'll go ahead, I'll update the addresses, I'll update the dependencies. Just go ahead and check the minimal account abstractions. Just go into this make file and just use the same versions that I'm using in here so that you always know you're using the correct versions. But in here, there's a nunce holder, nunce holder system contract with an address over here. It's based off of an offset. So we're just going to use the address of this nunce holder system contract. So we're going to need to import that as well. Import the nunce holder system contract from lib slash foundry era contracts slash uh, SRC slash system contracts slash contracts slash libraries slash slash constants dot soul like this. And so we're going to call the address of this nunce holder system contract. And what's kind of cool is if you're in this constants.soul, you can see the nunce holder is at the system contracts offset plus 0x3. So we can look at the systems contract offset is this. If we take this address and we go to ZK Sync Era Explorer, it's basically saying, okay, at 0x8003, this should be the nunce holder. So hold on, let's just do a little pop up open chisel. We'll do address my addy equals this or address like this. We look up my addy, boom, it's the address we get, pop this into the Explorer. We can go and see that this is indeed the nunce holder system contract. So that's actually pretty cool. And yep, same thing. It has all the same functions, both the same read and write functions for working with nunces, which is very cool. So we're going to send the gas, the nunce holder system contract. It's going to be the two. We're not going to send any value. And then we're going to do ABI dot encode call. So encode call is kind of a nice newer way to do encoding. It's kind of similar to encode with signature, but we're going to call that increment min nunce if equals. So I'm actually going to, to actually work with 
that I'm going to import I nunce holder from lib slash foundry era contracts slash SRC slash system contracts slash contracts slash interfaces slash I nunce holder dot soul like this. We're going to say ABI dot cold call I nunce holder dot increment min nunce if equals comma transaction dot nunce or excuse me underscore transaction dot nunce. So this transaction object, as we've seen, it has a nunce value that needs to be sent. So we're going to say increment the nunce, whatever nunce that was given to us, we're going to take that nunce and add one. And this is all we need to do. I know it sounds like there was a ton we needed to do, but this is really all we need to do to increment the nunce. It's just this one systems contracts call to increment the nunce, and then we're good to go. This also has some return data. We're going to ignore the return data, though. Now, I know there was a lot here, so I'll do a quick recap again, because these are this is pretty complicated stuff. So this is what's known as a system call simulation. ZK Sync sees this and it goes, oh, OK, that's kind of a weird call. I'm not going to let you call the systems contract unless you have is system is true in here. Then I'm going to transform this into a systems contracts call. The nunce holder system contract controls all the nunces. It has a function called increment min nunce if equals, and that's how we can increment the nunce of our ZK minimal account. So we've incremented the nunce. Next, what do we need to do? Okay, we're going to need to check for fee to pay. We're going to need to check the signature, of course, which were signature wizards at this point, and then return the magic number. So each transaction is going to require a certain amount to pay, to be paid, right? Same as Ethereum. So we have to calculate how much this transaction is actually going to cost. We don't have to do the math for that. There's actually a tool that ZK Sync has built that will allow us to get that ourselves. So it's called the transaction helper, but we're going to use this thing called the memory transaction helper that I made to make it easier to do pretty much everything that we're going to be doing. So, so we're going to import this. And actually, it's in the same place that the transaction object is in. So we're just going to import it from that memory transaction helper .soul. And in this, there is a total, there's a function total. And in this, there's this function called total required balance, which basically takes this transaction and figures out how much is required to actually send the transaction. So what we're going to do to check the fee to pay is we're just going to do a uint 256 total required balance equals transaction dot total required balance and oops could be underscore transaction dot total required balance and we're going to need to use this library so using memory transaction helper for transaction like this so we're going to get this total required balance and then if this total required balance is greater than address this dot balance we're going to revert and of course we're going to use a custom revert so error zk minimal count not enough balance like this and we'll revert with not enough balance great so that's it checking the fee to pay does this contract have enough balance again this is where we could add some paymaster stuff we could say hey uh so and so somebody else has signed up to do the payment and here's all the logic to do all the payment stuff but we're not going to be adding any of that customization we're just going to have the money in the zk account minimal pay for the transaction so this is how we're going to check that and then finally the important stuff we're going to check the signature in a very similar way to how we did it with ethereum so first we're going to get a bytes 32 Transaction hash is going to be equal to the underscore transaction dot hash or excuse me encode hash. So this memory transaction helper has another function called encode here where it does some very clever encoding. So one of the most important things is it needs to know what type of transaction is it? Is it a legacy transaction type, which is again type what? Type zero. Is it a EIP 712 transaction type, aka a account abstraction transaction type, aka a type 113. Yes, these are all the same thing. 
Okay, that needs to be encoded a little bit differently. Is it a 115, aka a type 2 transaction? Is it a 2930, aka a type 1? Yes, there's so many different transaction types. There's also blob transactions, which, which is a type 3, but it's not supported at ZK Sync at the moment. Anyways, so each one of these transactions has a different function that actually governs how they are encoded. So this memory transaction helper already helps encode it for us. Boom, we have this encode hash EAP712 transaction. We already kind of learned about encoding and stuff right now, so we're not gonna go deep into it. We're just going to trust that it works. We're gonna say transaction hash is transaction.encode hash. This transaction object, like exactly like the user operation, has a signature. And this is what we need to validate on it. So we're going to get that signature. We're going to say underscore transaction dot signature. And we're going to need to combine this with the TX hash. And we're going to have to figure out how do we actually validate this? Well, exactly the same as with the minimal account. We're going to have to take this transaction hash and convert it to an ETH signed message hash. And what have we been doing? Well, we've been using Open Zeppelin. So we're going to do a little import here. Message hash utils from at open zeppelin slash contracts slash utils slash cryptography slash message hash utils dot soul like this open zeppelin capital h there so that it actually works and now that we have this we can scroll back down and we can do this once again message hash utils dot two eth sign let me zoom in signed message hash of the tx hash tx hash so we're going to convert this hash to the correct format here we'll say bytes 32 converted hash equals this and then we're going to do the classic recover so we'll say address signer equals ecdsa.recover and this is where we're going to have to import that as well let me scroll back up do a little import E C D S A from at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash utils slash cryptography slash E C D S A dot sol. So we're getting the E C D S A now. We'll call E C D S A dot recover. And this will be the converted hash and the underscore transaction dot signature like this. We'll get the signer. Now that we have the signer, we can check. We can do a little bool is valid signer equals. And all we got to do is check to see a signer equals equals owner, which we actually don't have an owner function yet. We should definitely add this. So let's import ownable as well. Import ownable from at open. Zeppelin slash contracts slash access slash own a soul. And we'll make our ZK account minimal is I account is I account and is ownable, which means we need to add a constructor. So we'll add a constructor ownable message dot sender. Ta da. Brilliant. Okay. So it's a valid signer if the signer equals the owner. And if it is a valid signer, then we're going to say this magic, then we're gonna say this magic is the account validation success magic. This is kind of the equivalent of saying true. And we can import this as well. And this from the same place that I account is in, account validation success magic. So if it's true, do that else. We can just say magic equals bytes four of zero. And then just, and then finally just return magic. So this is our validate transaction function. Yay. So now, like I said, we are completely ignoring these. So I'm even going to comment them out like this. Since the bootloader is technically going to be the one that calls this, and we'll add some access controls like that in the future, ZK Sync allows you to do some really crazy customizations with your transaction hashes. So you can have some literally like vanity transaction hashes, which is pretty cool. And you can like save some gas if you have some pre-processing steps with the suggested signed hash, and you can do some other really creative stuff 
with these two variables. Our code base is going to be super simple, super minimal. So all we care about is the transaction and we're going to completely ignore these. Make sense? So here's what we do with this validate transaction. First off, we must increase the nonce. Boom, we make a systems contract call to the nonce holder system contract and we increase the nonce. That's one of the other things that's so cool about ZK Sync here is we have power over our nonces. We can control our nonces in our smart contracts. Very cool stuff. Then we check if we have enough money in our smart contract to pay. And there is a nice little function that comes with our transactions called total required balance that we can use to make sure we have enough money. And then we do the classic signature checking. First, we encode our transaction struct exactly the same as we did with Ethereum. We use a little helper function called encode hash to actually encode it. Then we convert it to an ETH signed message because we got to have things in the right format. Then we run the ECDSA recover to get who signed this hash. Then we check to make sure the signer is the owner of this contract. And if it is, we say, hooray, we did it. And if not, we return bytes four of zero which is basically the equivalent of saying false. So this is how the ZK Sync system is going to validate that a transaction sent via account abstraction is valid. Now, the only additional piece we need to add to this is we need to make sure only the bootloader can call this, right? Because we don't want anybody just updating the system contract. We only want the account abstraction system to be able to call this validate transaction and increase the nuns. So. We're going to have to create a modifier here, very similar to the only entry point modifier where we're going to do a little. First off, I want to do a, a headers modifiers like here. Do a little modifier. Zoom in a little bit. Modifier choir from boot loader. And we're going to have, we're going to say if message.sender does not equal the boot loader formal address. And we're going to import this in a second. Then we're going to revert with ZK minimal account underscore underscore not from boot loader like this. We're going to have another error ZK sync not from boot loader. And then we need to import the boot loader formal address. And guess what? We can get this from the same place as the nuns system holder contract. This is in the constants dot solve. We look for this boom address payable constant bootloader formal address. So this is where we get the bootloader formal address from. Okay, nice. So we have require from bootloader. Let's make sure we actually add it here. Require from bootloader. Only the bootloader can update our transaction hashes. Only the bootloader can now update our nonces. And we have a way to validate our account abstraction transactions are valid. I always feel like I'm speaking poetry when I say account abstraction transaction. All right, so check, we've done some validation. Cool. After we get all the validation done, the ZK Sync node that got the transaction is going to send it from itself to the main node, the main sequencer, and that's going to call execute transaction. So let's now focus on execute transaction and make sure we get this one right. Don't worry, the rest of this will come together and it will make sense. But we're going to call execute transaction because this is where we do the thing. So same thing. We're going to ignore these first two. These are for some cool advanced stuff that we quite frankly don't care about and may never care about, to be honest. So we're just going to comment these out and we're only going to care about this transaction object. And this is going to be the exact same transaction object that was recently called through the validate transaction function. So execute transaction here. We're going to do something very similar to what we did in the minimal account on Ethereum. So first thing, we're going to take this transaction object and we're going to get the two from it. So address two. And again, we can go into the struct. We can see, OK, what this has transaction type from to gas, 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 paymaster, nuns, value, reserve, data, signature, blah, 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 all this stuff. We're going to get the two. We're going to say two equals address 160 underscore transaction dot two. Right. And we have to do this because two is a U into 256. So we need to convert it from a U into 256 to an address. Next, we're going to need to get the value, which if we look in here, value is a U into 256. We're actually going to need to safe cast it to a U into 128. 
The reason that we have to do that is we might have to use value as a system contracts call and it takes a u into 128. So u into 128 value equals, uh, and we're gonna use some utils here that we haven't imported yet. I don't think we've imported the, these yet, have we? We haven't imported these yet, but we will. utils.safe cast to u32, or excuse me, to u2, u128, excuse me. This is transaction.value like this. And we have to import this utils. So the Foundry era code base has a utils. And let's actually OZ imports. And these will be era imports. Era standing for like ZK sync, ZK sync era imports. So we're going to import this utils library from lib slash foundry era contracts slash src slash system contracts slash contracts slash libraries slash utils dot soul like this. And now that we have this utils bin here, we can now call this safe cast to u in twenty eight. So we're going to get the value and then we're just going to get the data. So we're going to say bytes bytes data equals transaction dot data. And we're going to be making uh, bytes memory, excuse me, bytes memory data. And we're going to be doing something real similar to what we did in our minimal account, right? Remember in our minimal account, we just did a call. And then if there wasn't a success, we reverted. We are essentially going to do that, but we're going to tweak it a little bit. So for our minimal account, we did it like this. For here, we're actually going to do it a little bit differently. We're going to use assembly. So if we go to the ZK sync docs, call static call and delegate call actually work slightly differently. So ideally, we're just going to follow the ZK sync way and do these calls in an assembly block. If you're not too familiar with assembly, I know we haven't really gone over it yet. We have an assembly in form of verification course that you can definitely check out. For now, just kind of blindly follow along with me here. We're gonna have this assembly section. We're gonna say success dot or colon equals call. We'll say gas to value add data ox20 comma m load data and then zero and zero. And we'll say before this we'll do bool success like this. And this is how we're going to make calls. So this is essentially the same as doing this, just in a little bit lower level language. Don't worry too much about it if it doesn't make sense. And then of course, if this fails, we'll say if not success, then we're going to revert ZK minimal account underscore underscore execution failed, failed like that. Go back up to the top error execution failed like this. Cool. Now, this is what we would normally do. So this looks pretty good. However, I hate to say this, we do have to tweak this. However, if two was to a systems contract, for example, if execute transaction here was deploying a contract, the two would be to the deployer system contract. And if that's the case, we actually have to call the system contracts caller in the same way we did it with the nuns holder up here. So we actually have to tweak this just a bit. So we're going to say if two equals equals address of the deployer employer system contract 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 and we can actually get this from the same place we get the bootloader from that constants folder. So we'll just import that as well. So if two is going to be that deployer system contract, we want to do something different. So we could do like if two equals any of the system contracts and write some custom code for any of the system contracts, but deploying a contract is a pretty common thing. So we at least want to be able to handle that. If it's to a deployer system contracts, we're going to do you into 32 gas gas equals utils dot safe cast to U32 gas left like this. We're gonna do that system contracts 
caller again dot system call with propagated revert gas to value data. Else, we're going to do kind of this normal call here. So we could put a lot of conditionals for a lot of the different system contracts. For us, we're only caring about deploying. If you want to deploy from this middle account, this is kind of how you would do it. And since we learned about system contracts a little bit already, you can, if you want to customize this to do even more crazy things with the system contracts, you are more than welcome to do so. But with that being said, we now have the execute transaction function just about done. We do want to add a modifier here because right now anybody can call this. So we're going to scroll up. We're going to add another modifier and we're going to give this kind of the same powers as our minimal account. We'll say require from bootloader or owner like this. And we'll do if message.sender does not equal bootloader address and message.sender does not equal owner. Then we're going to revert not from bootloader or owner like this. And we'll create a new error right here like so. And then require from bootloader or owner. We'll add this to the actual execute so that only the bootloader or the owner contract can do this. And this is really almost exactly the same as this require from entry point or owner in our minimal account on Ethereum. Nice. Now with this, we pretty much have our ZK Sync native account abstraction code base done, which I know is crazy. However, I said nearly because it's not quite done. <laughs> we still need paying for the transaction in Ethereum happened in this validate user operation. For here, the validate user operation, we just check to see if we can pay. So the actual payment happens down in these transactions here. So let's actually figure out how to do this payment here. So we're not using a paymaster. So we're actually going to make this do nothing. Ta-da, this one's done. Hooray. So prepare for paymaster. We can keep blank. However, we do want to actually pay for transactions here. Otherwise, our transactions will fail. And it's still in that validation phase, actually, before it gets to the execution, that the pay for transaction is called. So this actually happens before that execute that we just wrote happens. So same thing though, we can ignore the transaction hash. We're gonna ignore the suggested signed hash. We're just gonna focus on the transaction itself. And luckily, once again, in our little memory transaction helper, there's a helper function in here called pay to the bootloader, which will get the bootloader address, figure out how much we need to pay, and then actually pay it. So. All we have to do is do underscore transaction dot pay to the bootloader like this. And we'll just say bool success equals pay to the bootloader. If not success, then revert, revert ZK minimal account underscore underscore failed to pay. And then we'll add this new error back at the top error right here. And that's it. So now we can pay for the transaction. We can execute the transaction. We can validate the transaction. We are pretty much done. The only final thing that we want to be able to do is call execute transaction from outside. So right now, if we sign a transaction, we can send it to the ZK Sync node as an account abstraction transaction. However, we could also send it as a normal transaction with everything signed and have somebody else just pay the gas fees to send it. And that's what this execute transaction from outside is. No bootloader stuff, no account abstraction stuff. This is like, hey, you can send my transaction and you will pay the gas, right? No account abstraction stuff, just, hey, send this. And we, and we can set this up so that it goes through pretty much the same process as the execute transaction bit here. All we'd have to do is first validate this transaction kind of the same way we did up here and then execute the transaction. So what we're going to do is we're going to take all of this here and stick it in its own function. So we're going to do a little return underscore validate transaction underscore transaction. And at the bottom, we're going to create a function underscore validate transaction. It's going to take a transaction 
memory underscore. Actually, I hate the underscore transaction. This will be internal. And I'm going to paste all that code in here. And I guess I'll use the underscore because we're using the underscore in here. And so this is going to do exactly what we did before. Call the nuns contract. Check to make sure we have enough balance. Get the magic. And then I guess I'll just say return. Return bytes for magic right here and then boom we return magic at the bottom so for validate transaction in our validate transaction function now all we're doing is returning this internal function validate transaction and we can take this same logic bring it into execute transaction from outside where we first validate the transaction and then guess what next we execute the transaction with underscore transaction like this. So let's create another function where we did the exact same thing. Do a little function, execute transaction, transaction, memory, transaction, although I hate that style guide, <laughs> internal like this. And we're going to take all of this stuff in the execute transaction, copy it, paste it in our function down here. That looks pretty good to me. We're, we're not returning anything. And so now we're going to delete what's inside of execute transaction. Where did that go? Oh, I already did. Okay, nice. And we're just going to call execute transaction underscore transaction like this. And in our execute transaction from outside, we're just going to call execute transaction. So we could 100% say, hey, you're not allowed to do this, but why not? It's going to go through the exact same flow. And if somebody else wants to pay for the gas to send a transaction, great. Good for us. We're still checking the signatures work. We're still executing the same way. It's still going to come from our account. If somebody else wants to pay for it, phenomenal. And then the last thing we need to do is, of course, this needs to be able to receive funds. So we'll add a receive function, external payable, so that payable. This can actually receive funds like that. All right, cool. And this, my friends, is our ZK Sync minimal account abstraction contract. Let's give this a compile and make sure this works. Forge build dash dash ZK Sync. And it does. Now, sometimes with Foundry ZK Sync, I find it has a little bit of a hard time sometimes. So sometimes I will click ZK out, out and cache and delete everything in here and recompile. And this will take a long time to recompile. However, I've still found it can be very helpful just in case you tweak something that was potentially off. And it looks like it has compiled successfully. So I know there's a lot here and I know we've gone over a lot and I know we're learning a lot and I know we're learning at kind of a breathtaking speed here, but this is incredibly powerful work that you're doing. You're enabling yourself to have skills that very few people in the industry have right now, and you should be very proud of yourself. So what we're going to do for the rest of this is we are going to write some tests. Of course, the test setup is actually going to look really similar to what we've already done. There's very little we have to actually learn. We just have to write the tests. However, we're not going to write a script to actually do this like what we did with the send packed user ops. And it's because Foundry scripting doesn't work great on ZK Sync at the moment. So to actually run this and actually work with this, I actually wrote a lot of JavaScript scripts to actually get this to go because the JavaScript scripts was work very well with ZK Sync at the moment. So I'm just going to walk you through my scripts once we get to there. And I will actually send a true account abstraction transaction on the ZK Sync test Sepolia. I highly recommend that you don't do this unless you really, really want to see, because again, you're kind of clogging up the test nets and you have to get the test net ZK sync Sepolia, which can be really hard to get your hands on. If you want to try this on a local network, I highly recommend you give that a try. And because my scripts here are written in hard hat, I didn't go as hard as I normally do, making the code look very good. Those are our next steps. We're going to write some tests. Then I'm going to show you my hard hat scripts for actually deploying this. Then I'm going to deploy this and I will show you exactly what this process looks like when you get a successful transaction to run. If you're a little mentally exhausted, now's a great time to take a break. 
I know I'm throwing a lot at you right now, so it is okay. And maybe if anything in here doesn't make sense to you, it's not clear. It's like, what is he talking about? Paymaster this, system contract that. It's a great time to ask questions. And one of the things I actually really like about the ZK Sync Discord, if you scroll to the bottom of their docs, they have a little Discord icon. They actually have an AI that has read all of their documentation that, you, that does a pretty good job of answering questions related specifically to ZK Sync docs. It's in their Discord. It's a great tool. Definitely be sure to use that as well. So take that mental break and I'll see you in a minute. All right, so now that we have our ZK minimal account, let's go ahead and new folder, ZK sync, create a new file, ZK minimal test.t.sol in here, and we will go ahead and start testing this. So you already know the drill. We're gonna pop open this pragma. We'll do MIT 0 0.8.24 contract ZK minimal account test is test like so we'll import test from forge std slash test dot so we will add a little function set up public public in here and we will get kraken so if you're following along with the github repo associated with this lesson in the tests that i wrote i actually went ahead and I did this kind of setup here where we see where we have, if it's not the ZK sync chain, we're going to deploy with the deployer. But if it is the ZK sync chain, we're going to go ahead and deploy with new ZK minimal account. So we're going to skip this. For those of you watching this in Cypher Updraft, we showed you this is ZK sync chain using the Foundry DevOps tool. For those of you who are watching this on YouTube, you can just kind of ignore this because we're not going to be working with this anyways. At least I don't think. But the reason that we have that is because the ZK sync chain, like we've been saying, some of the cheat codes and the scripting don't quite work the same way they do on other EVM chains. So we're going to skip that. The deployment process, if you want to have a productionized deployment process for ZK sync, you'd have to write some bash scripts, which you can do. You can get really creative with your Forge Create. GitHub Copilot and ChatGPT are actually phenomenal at writing bash scripts. They're actually much better at writing bash scripts than they are at Solidity. So you can use that to help you out. So, but in any case, we're going to import that ZK minimal account from SRC slash ZK sync. Did I do a capital S? No, I didn't. I did lowercase ZK sync, you know, and let's keep that. Let's keep this lowercase down here too, just so that it's all symmetric across the board. ZK sync slash ZK minimal account dot so like this. And then in our setup, we're going to have ZK minimal account. I'm just going to call it minimal account like this we'll just do minimal account equals new zk minimal account cool now we're going to have a whole bunch more setup stuff here but let's just go ahead and kind of try to mimic what we did with the minimal account tests do basically the exact same thing here right because this zk minimal account is literally the exact same thing as the one on ethereum except it has native account abstraction built in so what was the first test we did for the minimal account? Okay, well, we test the owner can execute commands, right? And this is where the MetaMask directly calls the wallet and it executes. To do this with our Ethereum account abstraction account, we use the execute command and we sent the destination value and function data. For our ZK sync minimal account, if we scroll down, what's the function that we have in here? We have execute transaction, which is required from bootloader or owner. And we're going to pass it a transaction object that we're going to go ahead and we're going to build inside of our test here. So let's do a little something similar here. Function test ZK owner can execute commands public like this. One we'll do a little arrange act assert because I love to write that. So for arrange, we're actually going to do a very similar setup to what we did with our Ethereum account. So we are still going to need an address destination and that's going to be some mock ERC 20. So let's go ahead and actually import that as well. We can pop back open our minimal account, min, min, it, minimal account test.t.sol. We can grab this mock 
copy that line, paste it in here. And I'm I'm just like clicking the line and hitting Command C. I think it's Control C for Linux and Windows. And if you just put your cruiser on the line and hit Command C or copy and then Command V or Control V, that'll copy the whole line and then paste the whole line. So we'll do that down here. Uh, we'll do, we'll actually create a new USDC token. So we'll say USDC equals new ERC20 mock like this. A lot of the setup is actually going to look really familiar to what's in here. So our destination is going to be that address of the USDC. We're going to do a unit 256 value equals zero. And we're still going to do a bytes memory memory function data exactly the same as what we did in our test over here. Let me scroll back down exactly what we did over here. This is going to be ABI dot encode with selector ERC 20 mock dot mint dot selector. And then what do we do over here? We give it the address minimal account and then some amount. So let me copy this amount line as well. We'll have an amount at the top and then we'll pass the address of our ZK. And let me do a little toggle word wrap ZK or sorry, min mall account, and then comma amount like this. Now, what do we do next in our Ethereum account abstraction? Well, all we did was call execute with destination value and function data. However, for the ZK sync minimal account, we actually have to create this transaction object, which is kind of similar to the user operation. So we created these user operations in the minimal account using some scripting. We don't have a script for this, so we are going to have to create some helper functions in our tests. So I'm going to do a little headers, helpers like this. We are going to have to make a function which creates that unsigned transaction. So I'm going to create a little internal function down here. Function underscore create unsigned un signed transaction and this will take an address from a uint8 transaction type an address to uint256 value and then a bytes memory data this will be internal view and this is going to return a transaction tran transaction memory like this so we don't have this transaction. We're going to have to go ahead and import this transaction struct. Import transaction from, and this is from that memory transaction helper thing that we have. So it's going to be lib slash foundry era contracts slash src slash system contracts con tracks slash contracts slash library slash memory transaction helper dot soul. Or dot so cool and if we go back in here it's this transaction struct right so we have to populate this in the same way we had to populate that user packed operation or that user operation right so let's go ahead we'll populate this struct so we can send a transaction to zk sync again this is one of these cool things about zk sync is all transactions are these transaction structs so let's go ahead and scroll down create unsigned transaction let's do a let's go ahead and we'll just do return return transaction and let's open it up and let's just kind of go through this and get it done okay first transaction type transaction type is going to be whatever we pass in for transaction type remember for us we're going to be doing a type 113 which is aka a 0x71 transaction but you could 100% have this be, you know, a type two, a type zero, a type one, or even a type three, which is a blob transaction. We have a little video on that as well. But we're going to be doing type one one three for account abstraction transaction. I think I love saying that. Um, what's next? We're going to need a from to gas limit. So we'll say from is going to be whoever we pass in. Two is going to be two. Now about the two though, in this transaction type from and two are actually both uint 256s. So we actually have to convert these from addresses to uint 256. So to do that, we'll do a uint 160 first, 
and then a uint 256. So this is typically how you convert from an address to a uint 256. You first convert it to a uint 160, and then you do it to a uint 256. The reason for this is because addresses are actually smaller and they don't really fill up the full 32 bytes, whereas a uint 256 fills up the full 32 bytes. That's a much longer, com that could be a longer conversation. If you're interested, be sure to check out the assembly and formal verification course in Cypher and Updraft. Then we're gonna do a little gas limit. We're gonna cheat, we're gonna copy a little bit of what we did in our send packed user op because we did a lot of this stuff down here. We're just gonna use this giant number. Boom, gas per pub data byte limit. We're gonna do the same thing. And this is the maximum amount of gas the user is willing to pay for a byte of pub data. Pub data is published data to the L1. We don't have to worry too much about this one. So we can kind of just pick any value there. We need max fee per gas. We're just gonna use this again. We're just basically gonna say, yeah, let it all go through. We don't really care. We need max priority fee per gas. We're gonna do the same thing, don't really care. Paymaster, none, we're not using a paymaster. Nunce is going to be the nunce that we get. So we're gonna do a little uint 256 nunce equals vm.get nunce address minimal account. And this is kind of a cheaty line that doesn't work super well for ZK Sync because again, ZK Sync has a nunce holder smart contract that needs to be queried. And this cheat code, I'm not sure at the moment is supported, but hopefully in the future, this automatically gets rerouted to just asking the nunce holder smart contract for the nunce. So for nunce, we're gonna say nunce. Value, we're gonna say whatever value is passed. Value, which will be zero. Reserved is just going to be this blank array. So this is kind of just reserved for different slots in the future. So for us, we're just gonna say uint 256, zero. We can do that four times like that. Data is gonna be the data that was passed in. Signature, for now, we're just gonna leave as blank because this is just getting the unsigned transaction here. And we'll sign this in a little bit. Factory depths. This is something that we're gonna learn about in a bit. It is actually pretty important. For now, we're gonna leave this as blank. So at the top, we're we'll do bytes 32, array memory factory depths equals new bytes 32, array of size zero. We're gonna leave this as blank. It's not important for most of what we're gonna be working with. And then paymaster input is gonna be blank because we're not using the paymaster. And then finally, reserved dynamic that's also gonna be blank because we're not using the reserve dynamic either. Ta-da. And this is how we're gonna get our unsigned transaction here. So we can now take this, go back up here, and we don't need the signature, right? Take this, come back up here, and we can say transaction, transaction memory, transaction equals create unsigned transaction. From is going to be the minimal account owner. So we're gonna say address minimal account dot owner. Oh, actually we don't even need the address bit. So from is gonna be owner, transaction type is gonna be 0x71 or 113. Two is gonna be the destination, value is gonna be value, and then of course our function data. So really similar to what we did on Ethereum, except for we're working with this transaction object. Now, since we are calling execute transaction, we actually don't care about the signature because we have this require here, require from bootloader or owner. So as long as it's the owner of this contract, that's the message.sender, this will work fine. So then all we have to do is do vm.prank minimal, minimal account dot owner, and then minimal account execute transaction and we're gonna have to put some empty bytes 32s in here. I'm actually gonna create a static at the top. We're gonna say bytes 32 constant or a constant empty bytes 32 equals bytes 32 of zero. And since we're not using 
the TX hash or the suggested hash. We're just going to do empty bytes 32, empty bytes 32, then our actual transaction. Boom. And what are we calling here? We're calling mint. So then our final bit here, we can just do assert equal USDC dot balance of address minimal account should now be the amount. All right, let's give this a whirl. So we'll pull up our terminal, forge, test, dash, dash, MT, paste that in, dash, dash, ZK sync. And we'll have to wait a little bit for this to compile and actually go through. And you will run into this. So as of today, doing a lot of what we're doing, such as kind of making this giant struct down here, working with this transaction memory helper and everything requires dash dash via IR. So this stands for intermediate representation, and it's a flag you can add to the Solidity compiler to basically have it compile to this middle language called Yule or assembly, and then to the EVM or AeroVM. Don't worry too much about that now. Again, we go over this in the assembly and formal verification course. But for now, just in your foundry.toml, just sit via IR equals true. And at the moment, this will make your compiles and your tests run a little bit slower. So just keep that in mind that it will take a little bit longer, but it will allow us to test our code much more effectively here. So we're going to have VIR on true here. It'll take a little bit longer. Don't worry about it. That's normal. But let's go ahead and let's see if our first test works correctly. And after a brief delay, we see our test has passed. Okay, excellent. So our first initial test for our ZK owner commands is successful. Perfect. Let's keep going. So then I would probably test that a non-owner can't execute commands. If you want to go ahead and practice writing that function, you're more than free to do so. But let's actually move on to this more interesting stuff because yeah, it's like, okay, cool. That's not really account abstraction though, Patrick. Um, I would like to see some account abstraction, please. So let's do our validate transaction. So we'll test validate transaction and we'll assert we're getting this magic value, right? So we have this validate transaction here and this magic should return this account validation success magic. We should make sure that we are getting this as a valid signer, right? So if the signer is the owner, we're gonna say it's a valid signer. Otherwise, we're going to get this empty bytes for. So let's do a new function test zk validate transaction make this public scroll down a little bit might get a copilot is already trying to figure it out for me arrange act asserts like this so we're going to copy a lot of what we've already did same is kind of what we were doing before we're going to get the destination the value the function data we're going to be calling mint to the minimal account with this amount we're going to be doing the same thing. We're going to generate the unsigned transaction here. And now we actually need to sign this transaction, right? We didn't need to sign it up here because our validation for execute transaction was just, hey, is it the owner or is it the bootloader? In either case, go for it. But now we need to call validate transaction, right? Because now we're going to be simulating a true account abstraction transaction. Scroll back up. What's the process look like? Well, the first thing it does is it checks the nonce holder, then it will call validate transaction. So anytime on ZK sync, you send an account abstraction transaction. I, I don't know if I love it or I hate saying it. It's going to call validate transaction first. So, so we need to sign this transaction. So we're gonna have to create a new helper function called sign transaction. So let's do that function underscore sign transaction. And this is going to take a transaction memory transaction and then also so this is going to be the unlocked account doing the transaction now with doing this we're going to actually run into the same issue that we had with send packed user op right so when we signed the transaction with send packed user op if we had an unlocked account we could use config.account no problem but when running locally we had to use a default anvil key because why well 
when you run your tests, Foundry doesn't assume that you have anything. So we're gonna have to do a similar setup here. And since we are also just using tests here, what we can do additionally is kind of cheat a little bit more. So I'm, I'm gonna leave this as a count. However, we're gonna kind of super cheat here and you'll see what I mean in a minute. So what we wanna do in here is first, we're gonna want to encode this transaction. And to do that, remember we have that memory transaction helper dot encode hash transaction code hash transaction and we should import this if we haven't already boom and it's this function again that helps actually encode these right we can go back to this we can see that depending on the different transaction types it encodes them all like a little bit differently so we want to encode it correctly so this will give us the bytes 32 unsigned transaction unsigned transaction hash like this then we can get the bytes 32 digest we now have to convert this into an eth signed message so we will say unsigned transaction hash dot two eth signed message hash like this and since we're doing two eth signed message hash we're gonna have to scroll up to the top here and we're gonna have to do a little using message hash utils or bytes 32 and we're gonna have to import that import message hash utils from at open open zeppelin slash contracts slash utils slash cryptography slash message hash utils dot s dot soul and using message message hash with a capital h here Cool, uh, looks good. Then we can scroll back down. Cool, then we get the digest at the bottom here. Now we can do that actual signing, kind of the same thing that we did in the send packed user ops. And I'm actually gonna even copy this a little bit. I'm gonna copy the vm.sign, anvil key digest. I'm also gonna copy the anvil key and the vr and s. The anvil key and the vr and s here. So we could 100% again do like if you know, block dot chain ID equals three one three three seven or equals equals three one three three seven and then use config dot account, yada yada, all that stuff. But since we're never actually going to run this test on an actual network, because again, scripting doesn't work with ZK Sync, we can kind of safely assume that this is always going to be just running locally. So we can actually even just dump this account here. And we will say for this code base we should have our minimal account owned by the anvil default key the anvil default user so in send packed user opt we call with the anvil default key and back in our minimal account test if we scroll up to the top or excuse me if we go to our helper config helper config we're going to use this anvil default account we could import it from our helper config but again this is our test we know it's going to be a little bit different. So I'm just going to kind of copy paste it here. And what we're going to do, oops, sorry, this is the wrong, sorry, the wrong, make sure you're on the right test. Huh? So I'm, I'm just going to kind of cheat, paste this at the top. And what we're going to do is when we deploy our minimal account here, we're going to do minimal account dot transfer ownership to the Anvil default account. That way, since we're the minimal account is owned by the Anvil default account. We can actually sign the transaction with the Anvil default key. So a little bit of a workaround here. Like I said, I have an issue in Foundry. Hopefully somebody takes it on and actually makes this improvement here. If you're watching, like I said, this is a great opportunity for you to contribute to Foundry. But okay, so we're getting our V, R, and S here. That's looking very good. Then we can do transaction memory signed transaction equals so we're just going to set up sign transaction to kind of make it look different and we're going to say signed transaction dot signature equals abi dot and code packed remember this is rsv remember we get vrs but then we have to go rsv to actually do the signature here remember the order is important and then return signed transaction like this so this needs to returns transaction transaction memory like this cool sign transaction like so what's it matter about it can be restricted to view yeah okay we'll make this view and now that we have this sign transaction we can scroll back up 
we can do transaction equals underscore sign transaction transaction like this and so now just with that we have a signed transaction struct and if you want you can even do like a little like console two dot log of the transaction dot signature dot data transaction type whatever you want so you can see kind of this transaction struct populated but now finally we can do the act so we have this signed transaction and remember the process for doing account abstraction on zk sync is first the bootloader or the zk sync light client or the zk sync api client is going to call this validate transaction function so we need to simulate being that zk sync node and the way we do that is we prank the bootloader formal address remember that is another system contract anytime you have a zk sync node interacting with system contracts the caller is going to be the message.sender is going to be this bootloader system contract right because it's this super special admin smart contract so we're going to do vm dot prank bootloader formal address like this and so we need to get the bootloader formal address so we're going to import that from that constants area so i'm going to do import bootloader formal address from lib slash foundry era contracts slash src slash system contracts slash contracts slash constants dot sol like this and so now that we have the bootloader formal address here we can finally say okay bytes for magic equals minimal account dot val date transaction transaction empty bytes 32 empty bytes 32 and transaction because again for our validate transaction we're ignoring the tx hash we're ignoring the suggested signed hash again you're just some fancy smancy things that we do not care about uh we're just focused on the transaction itself and then we can finally do assert equal magic should equal this where is it it should be this account validation success magic and so we can actually grab this from our i account .sol. so we're going to go ahead and we're going to import that in our test back at the top we'll do a little actually oz imports here's your 20 mark era imports like this we'll import 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 account validation success magic from lib slash foundry era contracts slash src slash system contracts slash contracts slash interfaces slash i account dot soul ta-da now if we scroll down we can do assert equals magic account validation success magic Mwah. beautiful if this test passes it means we are doing something very cool it means we are creating an account abstraction transaction and we are able to sign it correctly and allow the zk sync nodes to say yes this is a valid account abstraction transaction and you can go ahead and push it through so let's run this test we do forge test dash dash mt paste this in dash dash zk sync remember running this with our foundry.toml having the via ir is true if you do not have that in the foundry.toml you can also do dash dash via via uh, ir like this but we have it in the foundry.toml now as of recording originally we could just do is system equals true in the foundry.toml as of recording the latest update of foundry zk sync this is no longer the case we now have to pass it directly into the command line i'm sure that at some point this will change and we can add this back into the foundry.toml but for now, we actually have to do forge test dash dash mt, paste the name of the test dash dash zk sync. And then we also have to do dash dash system system mode equals true like this. So this dash dash system mode is the thing that's going to allow us to call a system contract. And if we don't pass the system mode, if our system mode contracts aren't working, then we're going to get some weird EVM revert errors. So if you run into weird EVM revert errors, definitely be sure to make issues on that Foundry ZK sync. 
project because it's an alpha and the feedback will be very helpful and it will enable you to deploy ZK Sync smart contracts even easier in the future. Or you can go ahead and try to contribute to Foundry ZK Sync. That is a great place to start your Rust development career. And again, this will take a little bit of time. Oh, and then actually this makes a lot of sense. We're getting the not enough balance error here. This is an error that we can definitely understand. We have to do a vm.deal, that minimal account, some amount, some amount, we'll do unit 256, constant amount equals one E18. That should be more than plenty. Address, minimal account, clear and rerun. And it has passed here. Okay. Incredibly, incredibly exciting. So we've tested our validate transaction actually works. And we've tested our execute command also works, which means if we go back to the ZK minimal account, if we scroll back up to the top here, it looks like we've actually gone through our whole process. ZK API calls validate client, which must update the nonce checks the nuts has been updated. They call pay for transaction, which I guess technically we actually did not test this. However, for this demo, I'm going to say we can go ahead and skip that. Obviously, if this was a real code base you were working on, you would 100% want to test that. Then API client verifies bootloader gets paid. The API client passes the validated transaction to the main node and the main node calls execute transaction, which we've already tested works correctly. Now we could then go ahead and test execute transaction from our side, but I'm gonna go ahead and skip this for now and just say, guess what? Huge congratulations. You've just written the tests and built a ZK sync minimal account abstraction account. This is incredibly exciting. Now, a couple of points on running the whole test suite here. If I just run forge test at the moment, what do you think is gonna happen? Without the dash dash ZK sync, without the dash dash, system mode equals true. We, of course, we get some reverts, right? Test validate, test ZK validate transaction, of course, fails because we didn't run with the dash dash ZK sync flag. We didn't run with the system mode turned on. So it, of course, fails. I have gone ahead and in the actual GitHub repo associated with this course, I've added some of these checks in here like if not ZK Sync Chain, if it's not ZK Sync Foundry, to make it a little bit easier. But I don't think it's super important for your learning experience to go through adding all these conditionals in here. So if you want to update your code base to reflect what I have, feel free to just come into the minimal account abstraction code base and copy paste the, the changes directly from the script. So, and when you're using this repo as well, just also be sure to, whenever you run commands, be sure to use the commands that I've added in the make files. I've set it up so that a lot of the scripts that you're gonna to need to do are already in here and you can just run like make deploy or make ZK build or whatever that needs to be done here. So, cool. So now, now the final piece that I want to show you all is actually this, is actually deploying and sending an account abstraction transaction. Now, like I said, as of today, Foundry scripting on ZK Sync leaves something to be desired. So the best way to really do deployments is using Hardhat. So we don't cover Hardhat in Cypher and Updraft, so I'm not gonna walk you through actually deploying to ZK Sync with Hardhat. I'm not gonna walk you through actually setting this up and deploying this and running with this, but I am gonna show deploying the account abstraction contract to ZK Sync and then sending an account abstraction transaction to ZK Sync as well which is really cool. And if you are familiar with JavaScript and Hardhat and Node.js and TypeScript and stuff, and you want to run these as well, feel free to do so. But I'm actually gonna skip, I'm actually gonna jump cut over to me copy pasting all these scripts into my local file here so that we can actually deploy this. All right, and actually before we actually send this out, I do need to make two little tweaks that make the JavaScript a little bit easier. I was, we were erroneously doing this message hash utils dot two eth signed message because I didn't realize that because I didn't realize that in this encode hash function that we're doing here down here, it's already putting it into the correct format like so. We actually don't need to do this this bit right here where we do message hash utils dot eth signed message. So my mistake in our test as well, 
message hash utils. We don't have to do this step. This is already a digest right here. I didn't realize that this encode hash actually already returned that. So sorry about that. You can comment or delete those, those lines. And one more tweak as well. When we call validate transaction in execute transaction from outside, we definitely should check the magic that is returned here. Right now, we're just kind of saying, hey, uh, looks good to me. This is actually a pretty common security issue for signature stuff. So we would do like bytes for magic equals this. And then we would say if the magic does not equal that account validation success magic, then we would go ahead and revert uh, with pretty much whatever we want here, like error ZK minimal count invalid signature like this revert invalid signature boom because we want to make sure that magic value that is returned is actually correct okay now that we have now that we've done the final tweaks here let's go ahead let's deploy this and let's do this so first we're going to run this yarn deploy command to actually deploy that zk minimal smart contract and we've done it like so so we're going to grab this We'll go over to the ZK6 Sepolia, we'll paste this in, and we'll see, we do indeed see a contract here. And this is our ZK minimal account. Now, we can't actually verify this contract as of recording, because as of recording, any smart contract that interacts with system contracts can't be verified. So this is just, it is what it is. <laughs> but then what we're gonna do, we're actually gonna send this some funds. So I'm gonna paste this in here. I'm gonna send it zero point Zero zero one. that should be more than plenty. We'll confirm. I wish I had this much money in my wallet. That would be great. This is one of my burner accounts. ZK Sync was kind enough to send me a bunch of testnet ZK Sync so I could make this videos for you all. Great. So now that we have this, we're going to take this ZK Minimal address and we're going to open up the send AATX right here. And we're going to paste this right at the top, this ZK Minimal address. And if this goes through successfully, we will see a transaction on here that is from this wallet address, believe it or not, even though this is a smart contract wallet, which is crazy cool. So let's go ahead and do a little yarn send TX. And hopefully this goes through successfully and we will have done it. And it's looking pretty good. Transaction sent from minimal account with hash, this hash right here, let's go ahead. We do a little refresh on our smart contract now. We now see we have indeed a transaction right here. It's probably going to be the same one that we just created. Yep, it is. And it sure is. We can see the from is this wallet here. And this is the smart contract wallet that we just deployed. That's crazy. So on ZK Sync, you can literally have the smart contract wallet be the from, which is not possible on a lot of these other chains. Really, really cool. And we've done a very simple approval on the fake mock USDC contract that we actually deployed. Wow, this was a lot, but hopefully you can see how powerful this is. On ZK Sync, you can have a smart contract wallet that also acts like an externally owned account with account abstraction built in. So we have learned a ton because not only do we learn how to do this on ZK Sync, we also learned how to do this on Ethereum. So we learned how to do account abstraction on a chain that doesn't have native account abstraction, but has account abstraction via an entry point smart contract and an alt mempool. And then we also learned how to do account abstraction on a chain that has account abstraction built in. This is wild and this is incredibly powerful. So. Before you jump off, let's do a quick rundown of all the crazy things that we just learned because we've just learned some really, really powerful stuff. So first off, we learned what account abstraction even was. We learned that essentially account abstraction is saying, okay, instead of a private key signing everything, you can have whatever you want sign anything. It can be a Google session key. It could be a group of friends. It could be the weather. Account abstraction is the concept of anything being able to validate your transactions as long as you code that anything into a smart contract. Traditionally, only private keys can sign transactions, but with the power of code, we can have anything sign a transaction. 
on Ethereum, the way that you have to do this is you first have to deploy a smart contract with that anything codified somehow. Once you deploy that smart contract, you can send an account abstraction transaction by signing the data off chain, sending it to an alt mempool of nodes, who they will then submit it to the blockchain to an entry point dot soul via a function called handle ops. The entry point will work with some extensions like a paymaster, a signature aggregator, and then it'll send the transaction through your account where you will interact with a blockchain, etc. We built a very minimalist version of this in our minimal account dot soul. The only function that these smart contracts must have is validate user operation, where they take a packed user operation struct, which has all the stuff that's needed for a transaction to happen. We added a couple of really important pieces. We added a function to execute so our smart contract could actually do stuff. We of course have validate user op where we used validate signature down here, where it was very ECDSA recover, just to check if the person who signed the packed user operations is the owner of this contract. We of course added a function to pay the, the bootloader to pay that entry point contract because you need to pay somebody because you need to repay those alt mempool nodes who sent the transaction. And that was it. And we built some really robust tests for this on Ethereum. And then we also built some really cool and robust scripting for this. That was how it worked for Ethereum. For ZK Sync, it works a little bit differently because ZK Sync has account abstraction natively built in. For ZK Sync, you don't have to send to an alt mempool all you have to do is codify your rules, your signing rules, and then send your transactions as a type 113 and ZK Sync will handle everything auto magically behind the scenes. So in order for us to make a ZK Sync minimalist smart contract, there are a few other pieces we needed to add. So we need instead of validate user ops, we have validate transaction because on ZK Sync, all transactions are of this struct transaction type. So ZK Sync will always pass your transaction to this validate transaction function. We also added an execute transaction and execute transaction from outside. These are the functions that will enable our smart contract to actually do stuff. We added a pay for transaction and prepare for paymaster as well to interact and deal with the paymaster. In our ZK minimal account, we had our validate transaction, which was a really basic Function down here, we increased the nonce by interacting with a system contract, which was something that we hadn't learned about before. On ZK Sync, there are a lot of admin smart contracts called system smart contracts, where they have admin level power, they have power over the global state of the chain and can do really cool stuff. We made sure we had enough money, and then we also did a very basic ECDSA recover on the signature and returned the magic as such. We then had a very basic execute transaction function which just had a little bit of a conditional for if you wanted to interact with a deployer system contract. For this, we also wrote some really cool tests and we had to make sure that we used forge dash dash forge build dash ck sync dash dash system mode equals true. And depending on when you watch this, this key might be a little bit different. We might actually be able to have this in the foundry.toml, but as of today, that's how we had to do it. We wrote some very basic tests for this as well. And we didn't write any Solidity scripts because Solidity scripts don't work great with ZK Sync at the moment. So what we instead did, we kind of cheated a little bit. We, we watched me actually deploy this contract with some JavaScript stuff that I wrote previously, and then also send the account abstraction transaction myself. If you're following along with the GitHub repo associated with this course, if you scroll down into here, you can actually go and see the examples. Where are they? Examples. You can see the example deployments and the example transactions that we ran if you want to take a look at some of the coolness. Some of the big differences between having native account abstraction and normal and entry point based account abstraction is that entry point based account abstraction, the from is going to be whatever node or user actually created the transaction. Whereas on ZK Sync with native account abstraction, the from is actually going to be the smart contract wallet itself, which is really cool. So I know there was a ton of code, but you learned an absolute ton. And a lot of people do not have 
this power unlock for their smart contract development journey. I highly recommend you take a minute or several minutes actually, you take a break, you go get a coffee, you go to the gym, and maybe you try to build an even cooler account abstraction code base. Account abstraction is a great way for Web3 to scale adoption because we can actually code smart contracts that are more user-friendly, have easier login, have easier validation, and just have a lot more flexibility and granularity with how transactions are signed and interacted with. To me, there is a $10 billion company in this account abstraction idea somewhere, and it's up to you to go out and figure out how to build it and figure out how to scale it. So with that being said, take a break, go to the gym, go get some coffee, go get some ice cream. You have done phenomenal getting this far. All right, welcome back. We're almost there, everybody. Let's scroll on down to lesson 14. We are now on Foundry DAO slash governance. And of course, all the code that we're gonna be working with is in this GitHub repo. So if you wanna follow along, feel free to go here. Now, there's a ton of conceptual stuff to go over before we get into this. But basically, we're gonna learn everything about what a DAO is, what they're for, and how to use them. And as we're going along and as we're learning about DAOs, I want you to take some time to read these two articles. They're both from Vitalik and they address a lot of the main concerns with DAOs. One of them are that DAOs are not corporations where decentralization in an autonomous organization matters. And this article came out in response to a lot of people having really hard coordinating DAOs because since they're decentralized autonomous organizations and it can be difficult sometimes to coordinate with so many people and so many heads. So this article is really interesting where DAOs work really well and sometimes where they don't. And this one is one of my favorite articles about plutocracy. Plutocracy is government by the wealthy. This is something that obviously sounds bad and something we want to avoid in this new system that we're creating. If we default to typical ERC-20 based governance, we're gonna run into a lot of issues outlined in this post. If that doesn't make sense to you right now, don't worry, it will. And we'll come back to this in a little bit. But first, let's learn about DAOs, what DAOs look like and how they actually work, especially as developers. So I made some videos about this in the past. Let's go ahead and watch those and we'll come back. Now, before we learn how to code a DAO, we should learn what a DAO is. And again, I've already made a video that I put a lot of work into. So we're gonna watch what a DAO is from a high level first. Then we're gonna learn how to code a DAO Now, DAOs or Decentralized Autonomous Organizations is a bit of an overloaded term, but it typically describes any group that is governed by a transparent set of rules found on a blockchain or smart contract. And I say overloaded because some people say Bitcoin is DAO because the miners could choose whether or not to upgrade their software. Other people think that DAOs must use transparent smart contracts, which have the rules ingrained right into them. And then other people think DAO is just a buzzword, so they just slap the name really onto any organization so that they can get some clout. And this makes for Sad Patrick. And this is enough to be confused with the DAO, which was an implementation of a DAO back in 2016, which set the record for the largest hack at that time. So there's a lot of different ways to think about it. And the DAO term is used in a lot of different ways. But in essence, imagine if all of the users of Google were given voting power into what Google should do next. And the rules of the voting was immutable, transparent, and decentralized. This solves an age-old problem of trust, centrality, and transparency and giving the power to the users of different protocols and applications instead of everything happening behind closed doors. And this voting piece is a cornerstone of how these operate, this decentralized governance, if you will. And it can be summarized by company or organization operated exclusively through code. And to really understand all this, we're going to look under the hood of the protocol that's setting the precedent for all other DAOs in Compound. Then once we look at Compound, we'll understand what goes into building one of these and all the trade-offs, all the different architectural choices mean for your group. And then in my next video, I'm gonna have a full code along tutorial for developers looking to build one of these themselves. But be absolutely sure to watch the rest of this video because it's gonna give you all the architectural fundamentals so you can make intelligent decisions when you get to that section. 
And be sure that you and your Dow friends smash the like and subscribe button so that we can keep giving you the best engineer first content on the planet when it comes to smart contracts. Let's get into it. So here we have the Compound Protocol. It's a borrowing and lending application that allows users to borrow and lend their assets. And everything about this application is built in smart contracts. Now, oftentimes they're gonna to wanna to do a lot of new things. Maybe they wanna add a new token to allow borrowing and lending. Maybe they're gonna to wanna to change some of the APY parameters. Maybe they're gonna to wanna to block certain coins. There's a lot of different things that they might wanna do. So that's where we're gonna go ahead to governance. This is where you can find a user interface for a list of all the proposals and all the different ballots that came to be. So here's a list of some of the governance proposals that this protocol has actually been making to improve. And let's look at one of these proposals that's currently actually in process. So if we click on the proposal, we can actually see everything about this proposal, who voted for, who voted against, and the proposal history here. Now, the first thing to one of these proposals is somebody has to actually create the proposal in a proposed transaction. And we can actually see that proposed transaction right here. If we click on this, and we scroll down, we can actually see the exact parameters they used to make this proposal. Let's go ahead and decode the input data and we can see this is exactly what this proposal looks like. The way that they're typically divided is they have a list of addresses and a list of functions to call on those addresses and then obviously the parameters to pass those addresses. So this proposal is saying, hey, I would like to call support market on this address, set reserve factor on this address, here are the parameters we're gonna pass. They're obviously encoded with bytes. And then here's the description string of what this is doing and why we're actually doing this. The reason we have to do this proposal governance process is that these contracts likely have access controls where only the owner of these contracts can actually call these two functions. And the owner of these two contracts is likely gonna be this governance DAO. And values to zero just means that we're not gonna send any ETH along with these transactions. Once a proposal has been created, after a short delay, it becomes active. And this is when people can actually start voting on them. This delay between a proposal and an active vote can be changed or modified depending on your DAO. Then people have some time to start voting on them. And if it passes, which this one overwhelmingly did, it reaches succeeded. If we click on this transaction again, and we go to the compound governance contract, and we scroll down to contract, write as proxy, we can actually see the exact function that the people call to vote, namely cast by vote, cast vote by signature, and cast vote with reason. We'll talk a little bit about the exact differences between these in our next video, but these are the functions that they're actually calling. And if you go to the compound app and we go over to vote, this is a user interface you can actually vote through to make it easier if you're not as tech savvy. So you can vote right through this app.compound.finance, or you can just send the transaction yourself. Once all those votes happen, it reaches this queued stage. Now, what does queued mean? Well, before a proposal actually becomes active, there's a minimum delay between a proposal passing and a proposal being executed. So somebody has to call this queued function and it only can be called if a vote passes and it says, okay, that proposal ID has been queued and we're going to execute it soon. Now, if we go to a different proposal, like this one, for example, we can see it has been executed. We can see somebody called this executed function and they executed proposal 82. So this is gonna be a full example of the life cycle of a proposal going through this process. Now, there are a couple that even failed. Whole bunch of people voted against this. And if you scroll down, you can see it was created it was active and the majority of people voted against. So that's where it stops. Now, oftentimes just putting one of these proposals through isn't enough to really garner some votes for it. You generally want a forum or some type of discussion place to talk about these proposals and why you like them or don't like them. Oftentimes a discourse is one of the main places that people are going to argue for why something is good or why something is bad. So people can vote on these changes. And again, snapshot might be one of these tools that you use to figure out if your community even wants something before it even goes to vote. You could join one of these and with your tokens actually vote on things without them being executed just to get the sentiment. Or like I said before, you could build your protocol in a way that Snapshot actually helps you with the voting process. All right, now you've seen the protocol that has been influencing all the other DAOs on how to vote. Now you know. Now that we know what a DAO looks like, let's talk about the architecture and tools that go into building one of these. And additionally, the trade-offs that they have. And the first thing to talk about here is gonna be the voting mechanism. 
Now, voting in decentralized governance is critical to these DAOs because sometimes they do need to update and change to keep with the times. Not all protocols need to have a DAO, but those that do need to have a DAO need a way for the participants to engage. This is one of the most important questions to ask and to tell your communities. How do I participate? How do I engage in this DAO? How do I help make decisions? And you'll find this is a bit of a tricky problem to solve. Now, an easy approach to this problem is gonna be using an ERC-20 or an NFT token as voting power, similar to what we saw with Compound. Use the Comp token to vote for different proposals. Seems simple enough, right? Boom, problem solved, hooray! Now, this actually might be the right approach for certain DAOs, but it also runs the risk of actually being less fair. Because when you tokenize the voting power, you're essentially auctioning off this voting power to whoever's got the deepest pockets. Whoever has the most money gets to pick the changes. So if it's only the rich people who get to vote, then it's highly likely that all the changes in the protocol are going to benefit the rich, which doesn't really seem like that great of an improvement over our current world. NFTs are interesting because they have this non-fungible component, but yet even they still run into this issue. Additionally, if you buy a whole bunch of votes, you make a bad decision and then sell all your votes, you as an individual don't really get punished. You just punish the group as a whole. But you being malicious, you can get away with pretty scot-free. Now again, this voting mechanism is going to be correct for some groups, but for other groups, maybe not. It really just depends on what your DAO and community setup is going to look like. Now the next one we're going to talk about is skin in the game. Now Vitalik has actually written a lot about this and I highly recommend you read his article, link in the description to see that. The skin in the game method means that whenever you make a decision, your vote is recorded. And if that decision leads to a bad outcome, your tokens <laughs> are axed. So you get punished for making evil or bad decisions for your DAO and your protocol. I like this mentality because even if you buy a ton of tokens and decide to be evil with it, you can be held accountable for your bad decisions. Now, the hardest part about this though is gonna be how do we decide as a community what is a bad outcome? How do we actually punish these people? And that's easy because the answer is, I'm not sure. Now, the third method of this voting mechanism is probably one of the most interesting ones, but also the hardest ones to implement. And this is proof of personhood or participation. Imagine that all users of the compound protocol were given a single vote simply because they used the protocol. And even if they had a thousand wallets that used the protocol, one human being means one vote. This would be amazing and a far more fair implementation where votes couldn't actually just be bought. The issue, however, comes in something known as civil resistance. How can we be sure that it's one vote equals one participant and not one participant pretending to be thousands of different people so they get more votes? This method hasn't really been solved yet, but I'm willing to bet some very clever engineer will do some amazing chain link integration because proof of personhood is basically just off-chain data that can be delivered on chain, and that's exactly where chain link shines. Now, as you can see, all of these methods and even more that you probably think of aren't that far-fetched, and we actually see these exact same methods happening in the real world. Proof of personhood or proof of participation might just be the exact same as kind of the regular government voting that we see every day. In the United States, at least, one person gets to vote for one president. You can't go around making a whole bunch of fake people and voting for president. But in companies, the ERC-20 voting standard kind of applies. The more shares of a company you have, maybe the more voting power you have in that company. So we can draw parallels between the real world and how voting and governance is going to work in our smart contracts. And in fact, you should draw parallels and look for inspiration from the Web2 space. Now, when it comes to implementation of the voting, I put them into two categories, on-chain voting and off-chain voting. On-chain voting is exactly what we saw with Compound. There's a smart contract, on-chain, you're a voter, you call some function called vote with your MetaMask, your Ledger or whatever, send a transaction and boom, you voted, congrats. You can wear your little sticker now. You call that function and you send a transaction. You send a transaction. Hmm, what do transactions use that are kind of annoying and kind of costly? Uh, oh, that's right, gas. Imagine you have 10,000 people in your community and it costs $100 to vote per person. You're now costing your community $1 million anytime you want to change anything. This is obviously insane and not very sustainable for your community. The pro here is that the architecture is really easy. Everything's going to be transparent. Everything's going to be on chain and that's really good. But yes, the con is that you're going to break the bank account for a lot of people, potentially. Now, there are a lot of variations of this to help solve some of these problems, especially the gas problem. One of the ones that I'm incredibly excited for is this one called Governor C 
where they use some random sampling to do some quadratic voting to help reduce costs while increasing civil resistance. If you want to learn more about that one too, be sure to read about it in the description. So on-chain voting is the simplest one here, but let's talk about off-chain voting. How could you possibly vote off-chain in a decentralized context? Relax, relax. You can vote off-chain and still have it be 100% decentralized. You can actually sign a transaction and sign a vote without actually sending to a blockchain and therefore without actually spending any gas. Instead, what you can do is send that signed transaction to a decentralized database like IPFS, count up all the votes in IPFS, and then when time comes, deliver the result of that data through something like an Oracle like Chainlink to the blockchain, all in a single transaction. Alternatively, what you could do is you could replay all these signed transactions in a single transaction to save gas. This can reduce the voting cost by up to 99%. Right now, this is an implementation, and one of the most popular ways to do this is through Snapshot. And I'm just dying for someone to make a Chainlink integration because it's gonna be so much safer, more secure, and better, and blah, blah, blah. Dying for it. This is your call to action. Go build this thing. This off-chain voting mechanism obviously saves a ton of gas to the community and can be a more efficient way to store these transactions anyways. However, it needs to be implemented very carefully. If you run your entire DAO through a centralized Oracle, you are essentially reintroducing a centralized intermediary and ruining the decentrality of your application. So don't do that. And if you made it to this point of the video, give yourself a little pat on the back. You're doing fantastic. Learning is fantastic. Like I said, I have a video coming out after this one that's gonna show you end to end how to build one of these from scratch. Well, let's learn about some of the tools that you can use help get you up to speed quicker. Now, there are a number of no-code solutions that can go into building one of these DAOs. DAO stack, Aragon. Just kidding, this is Aragon. Colony and DAO house are all alternatives that can actually help you with the ops side of running a DAO and building a DAO. However, if you want more granular control and you don't wanna have to pay any of the fees associated with these protocols, you might wanna do it from scratch. Now let's talk about some of the more Cody solutions that you can use. Snapshot is one of the most popular tools out there for both getting the sentiment of a DAO and actually performing that execution. Users can vote through this protocol with their actual tokens. Those transactions get stored in IPFS, but none of it actually gets executed unless the DAO chooses to. So this can be a great way to get a feel for what your DAO wants to do. And optionally, you can send the transactions and execute the votes as well. I highly recommend checking out Zodiac, which is a suite of DAO-based tools for you to implement into your DAOs as well. Tally is another one of these UIs that allow people to see and actually vote and interact with these smart contracts through a user interface. For those of you who don't know about Gnosis Safe, you absolutely should. Gnosis Safe is a multi-sig wallet. And the reason that I put this on the list, even though it adds kind of this centrality component, is that most DAOs in the beginning are probably gonna start with some type of centrality. It's much easier to be fast when you don't have thousands of people to wait for a vote. And in the beginning, any protocol is gonna be centralized to some degree anyways. Using a multi-sig where voting happens through only a few key members can be good in the beginning for your DAOs. And often emergencies as well. But just keep in mind, when you add one of these, you are adding this level of centrality. And then of course, open Zeppelin contracts. We love open Zeppelin contracts. These are the contracts that we're gonna be basing our DAO code along on. All right, so that's all the tools, that's the architecture. One more thing before I let you go, legality. The future of DAOs is interesting for all these reasons we just talked about, but especially on a legal front. Does it make sense for a DAO to live by the same regulation as another company? How could you even force a DAO to do something? You'd have to force them to all vote a certain way if the government tells you to. It's, it's a little gray. It's hard to nail down who to even keep accountable for these DAOs. In the United States, at least, you can actually form your own DAO and have it legally recognized in the state of Wyoming. This is something I want to do, so we'll just have to see what happens there. Woo! At this point, you have been injected with all the DAO knowledge you need to succeed and thrive with this new amazing technology and these new amazing concepts. And it's time to build, baby! Now, we are still gonna build a DAO from scratch, but we do have our special guest, Juliet, from the Aragon team to go over a no-code solution that you can use as an alternative. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Julia Chevalier. I'm the developer advocate for Aragon, and today we'll be building a DAO without using a single line of code. Let's go. So to do that, I'll be using Aragon as my DAO framework, and to give you a bit of a better overview as to how Aragon's architecture is set up, um, DAOs are essentially composed of a smart contract, which is 
the one that contains all of the assets that the organization manages. Um, so it acts as a treasury. And then all of the other functionality for DAOs is really enabled through plugins. And we'll see how this, uh, how this is represented itself throughout the process that we'll build. So we go into app.aragon.org, we go into creating a DAO. Um, first, we'll see the process uh, that we'll be taking in order to do that, and then we can get right into it. So firstly, we need to choose the blockchain which our DAO will be deployed in. Um, I'll choose Gorily for the sake of simplicity and playing with testnet. Um, then we get to describe our DAO, so we can have a developer DAO, um, which can be something like this. We can set up our ENS, we can set up our logo, a description, a DAO for developers, um, and we can add in additional, ooh, we can add in additional links um, as well that represent the organization. Then we'll go into defining the membership. This is the, what will define who is able to participate in the governance of these assets. Um, and currently, our app supports two different types of uh, membership definitions and governance mechanisms. One of them is token holders, which enables holders of specific tokens to vote in the organization. And then we have multi-sig members, which establishes a specific quorum that needs to be met in order for a proposal to go through. Now, to give you some context, both of these on the back are plugins, um, which essentially extend the functionality of what DAOs can do through enable them this specific uh, decision-making process in order to manage the assets of the organization. However, keep in mind this can be anything, and um, plugins can also work to move uh, funds, they can be treasury management mechanisms, they can be different types of coordination styles, um, and so really the possibilities are endless when we speak about uh, customizing these types of on-chain organizations. Then we're going to create a token. Um, this can be something like developer token. We can call it something like DVP. Um, I can set up, say, a thousand tokens for myself or an add any other address that I want to transfer uh, some funds to. Um, then I establish what is the minimum amount of tokens that someone needs in order to create a proposal. I'll say 10, uh, I could also just say like, allow anyone out there to vote um, and create proposals, at which point uh, there is a risk of proposal spam. So keeping that in mind, I'll just say that we need um, say 10 tokens in order to create a proposal. Then we'll go through our governance settings. So what is the minimum support threshold needed, the minimum participation needed for a proposal to be valid, how much time is the minimum duration the uh, proposal needs to be out there in order for it to uh, be counting the votes. And then we can say that we don't want early execution, which means that we wait for the entire time of the duration of the proposal, as well as uh, not enable people to change their vote after they've voted. I can also vote yes to that. And then the last step is simply revising um, those parameters that I've set. So out of everything that we've defined, only the blockchain selection is the one thing that we cannot change later on, since that's the blockchain through which we're deploying our DAO. But really everything else, um, we can change it later on with a proposal vote. Um, and so the idea here is to really enable these types of immutable organizations to mutate and evolve with time. Um, so I'll sign in my proposal, I go back into my deployment, um, and so at this stage, what's happening on the back is that Aragon is deploying this DAO construct instance with uh, the specific plugins defined, installed, as we determined through, through the DAO creation process. So once that's done, we can come into the dashboard of our DAO. We'll be able to see who is a member of our organization, how many tokens are hold. I can create proposals. I can make deposits. Um, and so this is where we'll be managing the organization. Um, keep in mind that this is a, a pretty um, default template that Aragon has set up as our initial drafts. We have a lot of iterations coming in terms of the type of plugins you'll be able to use, the different types of uh, decision-making strategies you'll be able to implement. And so the customizability really is endless. Thank you very much. All right, welcome back. You now know a ton about DAOs and how they work. And we are going to go over one of these plutocracy DAOs, right? One of these ERC-20 based DAOs and how to build one yourself from scratch. However, I want to challenge you to not default to this. A lot of protocols default to, okay, I'm just gonna launch a governance token. We're gonna be good to go. 
And then a couple years down the line, they realize that that was a horrible decision and they have a hard time scaling their model. They run into issues where they can't separate speculation on the token from the utility of the token. And there's a ton of issues with that model. So anybody who's watching this, if I catch you launching a DAO in the future and you do not have a foolproof white paper as to why you need a governance token, I will be very disappointed in you. I know that doesn't really matter to you, but I will be very disappointed in you and you will make me sad. So please don't make me sad. But we are going to learn this methodology and how to do it. So let's jump in because guess what? We only have two lessons left and then you're ready to go on your way. All right. You know where to begin. MKDIR, Foundry, DAO, F23, code, Foundry, DAO, F23, or file open. Let's pull up our VS code. At this time, you should be pros at this part. Forge in it. I don't want these three files. Boom, boom, boom. Goodbye. Boom. So let's do a little readme and let's talk about what we're going to do. So one, we are going to have, we're going to have a contract controlled by a DAO. 100% controlled by a DAO. Every transaction that the DAO wants to send has to be voted on. And we will use ERC-20 tokens for voting, which, like I said, this is kind of the default model that the industry is currently using. But I'm telling you, it's not a great model. Please research better ones and make Web3 better. But all right. And this is the model used by pretty much every DAO at the moment. Compound, Uniswap, Aave, etc. So I'm showing you the most popular model. But yes, I'm telling you, please don't default to this. Please don't always use this. But let's start with this first one. We're going to have a contract controlled by the DAO. So let's create a minimal contract that we can vote on stuff for. And we're gonna do something pretty similar to what we've already done. We're gonna do SRC, new file. We're gonna make a box.sol. Real similar to what we did before, right? SPDX, places identifier, MIT, pragma, solidity, 0 0.8.18, little carrot, contract, box. Let's close this like this. Like we said, we're gonna make this ownable. It's gonna be controlled by the DAO. So we're going to do a little open Zeppelin work. Forge, install, open Zeppelin, slash, open Zeppelin, dash contracts, dash, dash, no, dash, commit. And since we're doing this, we're going to need to open up our foundry.toml, paste this in here. Uh, I copied this from a previous project. Open Zeppelin slash contracts, lib, open Zeppelin, blah, blah, blah. Now, since we have that, we can do import ownable from at open Zeppelin slash contracts, slash access, slash ownable.sol. And our box is going to be ownable, and the DAO is going to own it. Tracks. All right, cool. It's going to be a real minimal contract, UN256, private number. This obviously should be like S underscore number, right? Uh, event, number changed. Looks like that. Function store. You into 56 new value or new number public. This will be our only owner function, which this store function will be only ownable, will be only callable by our DAO. We'll say number equals new number. We'll even emit number changed with the new number. This is S underscore number. And then we'll do a function read number or get number, get number public or external view returns you into 56 return s number and that's it that's the whole contract boom that's it this kind of looks like box kind of looks like simple storage it's kind of an amalgamation of both but this is it cool we'll make sure it actually compiles with forge build make sure it compiles looks like it's compiling okay cool awesome so we have our box what's next well Every transaction that the DAO wants to send has to be voted on. We will use ERC-20 tokens for voting. So let's create our, our voting token here. New file, govtoken.sol, and this is going to be our voting token. Now, we could implement this from scratch, but again, what we can do for this is actually just come to the contracts wizard of Open Zeppelin, go to ERC-20, and select votes, and literally just copy this to clipboard and paste it in or copy this ourselves and paste it in here. And this is going to be our voting token. 
That's it. So let me talk to you about what we just copy pasted. And we're going to update this to be named imports because named imports are awesome. For this draft ERC20 permit, we're just going to import this ERC20 permit and then ERC20 votes. So I'm just going to talk you through what this is actually doing. So it's a regular ERC20 token, exactly as we've seen, but it has these two kind of extensions. Let me toggle the word wrap. And we have the opens up and contracts installed. Okay, cool. So I'm going to control command click into them. Again, you can open up the file viewer and you know type the actual name of the contract if you want. ERC20 permit, what does this actually do? This allows approvals to be made via signatures. Basically, you can sign a transaction without sending it and let somebody else send the transaction. That's it. It's based off of this EIP. We don't really need to understand this too much, but if you're interested, I would definitely recommend looking into it. The more important one is this ERC-20 votes contract. And like I said, it's based off of this compound voting and delegating. It does a lot of important things here. Number one, it keeps a history of each account's voting power. It keeps snapshots of them. Now, this is important because when you start a vote, you want to use a historical snapshot. You don't want to use the current balance of everyone's tokens at the moment. Somebody could do something called a flash loan, which is something we didn't talk about, but they basically can use this DeFi thing to get a ton of tokens for a very, very short period of time and crash the vote. So we use a historical value. And the way to get that historical value is to keep checkpoints of people's values. We can also use a delegate function on our tokens. Sometimes we trust a person more than we trust our understanding of a topic. So we can actually hold on to our token still. Their tokens are still ours, but we can delegate the voting rights of our token to somebody else. And these are some of the two main features that this token has. If we scroll down, we can see we have this checkpoints function, which gets checkpoints. And there's this checkpoints mapping address to checkpoint. We can see the checkpoint object says from block and then votes. And if we scroll down, there's this Afton token transfer function, which anytime you transfer a token, this gets called, it ends up calling this move voting power, which does a whole bunch of stuff in here. But the main things are it calls this write checkpoint function. So anytime you move tokens by delegating tokens or transferring your tokens, you write a new checkpoint, right? So you say, hey, at this block, this was people's voting power. And you don't do it for every single block, right? You don't calculate someone's checkpoint in every single block, you, you only calculate the updates in the checkpoints. So if we scroll up to the top, for example, it says from block, this would be like, you know, let's say you minted, let's say you bought a token at block five, and then you sold it at block 25. This would just have two checkpoints, block five and block 25. That's it. It adds some gas for every single transfer you make, but it allows us to do these sophisticated voting methodologies. So and that's really it. Other than that, it's a basic ERC 20 token just has these checkpoints has these additional delegate functions as well. And that's really it. And cool, like, that's it. Our governance token is done. That's all you need to do. What else? Well, guess what? The Open Zeppelin Wizard can help us with even more. Because what do we need next? Well, we need a DAO, right? We need a system. We need a contract to actually manage these votes, right? And guess what? The wizard has one called Governor. We can go through this and update settings. So we can update the name if we want. I'm going to leave it as my governor. A voting delay, which is anytime somebody proposes something, it says, okay, we're going to wait at least one block for the voting to start. Maybe you do something like 100 blocks. You know, it depends on your chain. The voting period for how long the voting will actually last. A proposal threshold where it's the minimum number of votes an account must have to create a proposal. Most of the time, this is kept to zero. A quorum percentage percentage of tokens that need to vote in order for something to pass. If there's 100 tokens in circulation, at least four tokens need to vote for it to pass. Make these settings updatable or not. This is, this is to make the contracts fully compatible with Bravo, which is the compound implementation. The type of votes, you can have ERC-20 votes. You can have ERC-721 votes, which is an NFT or comp like a time lock controller, anytime a vote passes, give users some amount of time to leave the DAO before it's implemented. 
and then upgradability. We probably want to avoid this as much as we can because like I said before, security. And with that, I'm just gonna leave all the settings to be default. We can literally copy this into our contract and not really have to do anything. So new file, my, my, vernor.sol, paste this in. And let's talk about what is going on in this contract. What are these different functions? So first off, let's update this to named imports. And we also need to import iVotes. This is gonna come from governor votes. We're gonna to need to import this time lock controller, which is gonna come from this governor time lock. And then we're gonna to have to import iGovernor, which is gonna come from governor, and that's it. So just update these to named imports and we're good to go. So let's walk through what this is doing. So my governor is governor, governor settings, governor counting, blah, 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 all this stuff. I'm gonna give you the high level overview of what all of these does. This governor contract, if we command click into it or control click into it, it's the core of the governance system. This governor contract, if we control click into it, it brings us to governor votes, but let's go to the governor contract. This is kind of the main contract here. And how it works is it keeps this mapping basically of proposals, right? Each one of these proposals have a vote start, a vote ended, and then an executed or canceled. And that's really it. Every single time somebody submits a proposal, this mapping gets updated. And if we scroll down, we have this state function. This is the function that tells us if a proposal has passed based off of this mapping of proposals. If it's executed, if it's canceled, what's the deadline, has a quorum been reached, etc. This is what most user interfaces are going to read to see if a vote has passed or not. We keep scrolling down, we can see a proposal snapshot which is basically getting the deadline. When the proposal is due, we can see some stuff like a proposal threshold, and then a whole bunch of unimplemented functions like quorum reached, vote success, get votes, et cetera. And this is because this governor function is this abstract contract meant to be extended on and implemented with. Governor votes is one of these extensions where it says, okay, ERC20 token voting. That's the way we're gonna do votes. And this has a function like get votes, which reads the token voting weight from the tokens built in snapshot mechanism to get how often somebody can vote uh, and that type of thing. Now in our governor, one of the main functions that we has is gonna be propose. And these are gonna be the variables it takes in. Targets is just gonna be like a list of different contracts to make a transaction to. Values is gonna be a list of values to send with each target. Call data, now that we know all about call data is gonna be the bytes data that we're gonna send with each transaction, and then just a description, right? So for example, this might be like zero X, zero, blah, 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 some address here. And if it's just one, it would just be like, you know, one address here, If it's two, you know, it might be like this, et cetera. Values might be like, you know, something like zero, meaning the transaction we send to this address, we're just gonna pass zero value. You know, if there's two transactions with two addresses, like zero X, blah, 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 something or other, you know, we could have two values, right? Call datas are going to be the call data for sending to here. And now that we know about function selectors, function signatures, and etc., we know that with this, this call datas section allows us to make, allows us to call any function and really send any data to this target that we want. So it makes it completely modular and then some description, right? And this is really just for the internal state of the governor. You know, it might be something like proposal to send money to Don, right? And so if this was like one, two, three, this is Don's address, cool. We've just made a proposal to send money to Don, right? If this was, you know, like, like the link token contract, for example, we could have this be zero, we could find the function selector for transfer and we could be like transfer function selector and encode, you know, and then encode all the data for the, for transferring some link, we could then say proposal to send link to Chris or whatever we want to do here, right? So this is how we can propose any transaction for our DAO to do and send proposals. So really, really important function here. And if we go through it, we can see it hashes the proposal, 
It does a whole bunch of checks in here. It adds our proposals to that proposals mapping. It gets a deadline, picks a snapshot for votes and everything, emits a log, and importantly, it returns a proposal ID. The proposal ID is a hash of all the inputs so that this proposal ID will be unique. Then we have an, uh, another important function called execute. And all of the inputs you can see are the same as the inputs up here, right? The only difference is it's saying a bytes32 description hash. This is just gonna be the encrypted description from up here. And it's this function that gets called, oops, excuse me. And it's this function, this execute function that gets called once a proposal has passed to actually send that proposal, right? So here, it first reverse engineers and gets the proposal ID from all those inputs, which should be the same as what was proposed, and then says, okay, let's get the status of that proposal state based off of how the votes go, and if it's good to go, then go ahead and execute it, right? So we do some execute stuff here. The execute internal function actually sends it with some familiar stuff here, right? We're doing targets.call, values, call datas, et cetera. This is this low level functionality here. It's got some before execute stuff, some after execute stuff. We don't really need to worry too much about that. We can vote to cancel transactions. We can get votes. And then finally, another incredibly important function is gonna be cast vote. And there's some derivatives of this, like cast vote with reason, cast vote with reason and params, cast vote by sig, whole bunch of different ways to cast vote. But the main thing this cast vote thing does is it calls this internal cast vote function, which calls this internal cast vote function. And this is the actual function it calls. So it gets the proposal based off the proposal ID. It gets the weight of your vote based off of the snapshot of the tokens that you hold, it calls this internal count vote function, which basically just updates some internal state variables to add your votes to them and then admits an event. That's it, right? And it updates your vote based off of whatever your weight is, which in the system that we're using, the more tokens you have, the more you your vote counts. And those are the main functions here. So hopefully that made sense. I know I kind of went through that a little bit quickly, but that's kind of the basics of the governor. Now, governor is the main contract. Governor settings is just an extension to add stuff like voting delay, voting period, voting threshold, et cetera. Governor counting simple is also an extension, uh, which is just an extension for a very simple counting mechanism. This extension allows our votes to be against, for, and abstain. And so we have this proposal vote for each proposal, they get this struct. And this is where those votes get counted. We have against votes, for votes, abstain votes, and then a mapping of who has actually voted. Governor votes just implements this get votes contract and governor votes quorum fraction. This is just an extension for token weight extraction. And then we have this important time lock controller function. Every single DAO should 100% always have this governor time lock control. Using this model means the proposal will be operated by the time lock controller and not the governor. Thus, the assets and permissions must be attached to the time lock controller. So we're actually going to deploy a contract called time lock that's going to own the governor. Anytime our governor contract votes on something and says, okay, this vote has passed, let's execute it the time lock controller will say, okay, cool, but you have to wait X days or something. You can't execute without some delay. And it's really important to have this because if a DAO votes on something that a lot of people in the DAO hate, it gives them time to get out of the DAO before they get steamrolled, if you will. So really important to have this. And that's pretty much it. So we have some uh, voting delay, voting period, quorum, state propose we have all these uh which are just calling super right that's pretty much it and that's all we really need for our governor contract right we have this constructor which takes the token that we vote on as an input parameter and the time lock controller that's going to block us from block us from executing proposals right away the time lock controller contract is going to own our governor controller contract and that's actually the last contract we need to create a time lock .soul. So this is the only one we have to build ourselves, but we actually barely have to build it ourselves. SPX license identifier, pragma solidity, 0 0.8.18 carats contract time lock. 
And we only, we barely have to implement this because Open Zeppelin already has one of these. So we just say our time lock is time lock controller. And then we can just import it, import at open Zeppelin slash contracts slash governance slash time lock controller dot soul. Let's import it like this from, did I spell that right? Time lock controller. Okay, that's more right. Governance, governance, contracts, contracts, open Zeppelin, open Zeppelin, time lock controller, time lock controller. Okay, cool. That looks good. Now we'll just do a constructor and we'll pass some parameters in here. We'll say unit 256 min delay, which we'll put a little comma here. This is going to be the min delay is how long you have to wait before executing. We're going to have to pass and we can find all of these in the constructor of this. Min delay, proposers, executors, and admin. Right. This is the constructor of the time lock controller. So we're going to need to have this be the constructor of ours as well. Min delay, we're going to need proposers is the list of addresses that can propose. So we need an initial list of proposers. We're going to update this so that it can be anybody. And then executors is the list of addresses that can execute. Execute. We're going to update this as well so that anytime a vote passes, anybody can execute it. So min delay, address array memory, proposers, address array memory, executors. Boom. And since this time lock controller parent class has a constructor, I'm going to toggle the word wrap. We got to put those in here, and it's just exactly. The constructor parameters we created in delay, proposers, executors, computers, and then we also have to give it an admin, which we're just going to say is message.sender for now. And we need to give it an admin at first so that we can eventually move the time lock controller's admin so that only the DAO can do anything with the time lock controller. And you'll see us do that in a minute. But those are all the contracts that we need. That's it. We've written the contracts. We're done. Like I said, I'm going to do this kind of quickly. I do recommend that after this, you go back and you really try to understand what's going on here because I, I know I'm kind of doing this quickly. But now we're going to write a test to show it actually worked. And that's it. I'm not going to write a deploy script here. Uh, if you want to go back and you want to write a deploy script, that's great. But I'm just going to write a test to show you basically end to end exactly the process that happens in one of these DAOs. So let's go ahead. Let's write the test. My gover nor test dot t dot soul. And the other reason that I'm going a little bit quicker here is because at this point you understand a lot of this, right? And you know and should know how to go back and flesh this repo out, right? With scripts, with tests, unit tests, fuzz tests, etc. And you know how to make this project badass. And I'm just I just want to give you the new stuff, right? Teach you the new stuff for here. Teach you about the DAO stuff. So Let's write some tests just so that we can really see this process work end to end. And we're just going to have one giant test just to show the whole process. So, you know, the drill pragma solidity here, contract, my governor test is test. You already know we're going to import test from forge STD slash test dot soul. And we're going to need a function function set up be public, public course, and we're going to need a whole bunch of stuff in here. Function setup. Oops. <clears throat> what are we going to need? Well, we're probably going to need at least these four contracts. So let's go ahead and import them. Import my go nor from dot dot slash as receive slash my go for nor dot soul. Import box from dot slash src slash box dot soul import time lock from here get up copilot taking over a little bit import gov token okay it failed it almost took over here from dot slash src slash gov token dot soul oh is that not what it's called ah sorry let's change this thing to gov token like this looks good okay so now let's actually deploy some of these so our gov token let's say Actually, let's create each one of these. My governor, governor, box, box, time lock, 
time lock gov token gov token cool first thing that we're going to need is our gov token equals new gov token and i know this doesn't take any input parameters but we should give our gov token we should actually mint some of these so this gov token doesn't have a mint function so i'm just going to create a mint function but in your system, maybe you just have the constructor mint to the message.sender. I'm just going to go ahead and add this function mint address to you and 256 amount. We'll make this public. Um, this probably isn't what you want your token to have. You probably don't want anyone to be able to mint any tokens, but this is what I'm going to do mint to amount. That's it. There's an internal function called mint that we're going to call. So I'm just going to say I'm going to mint to some user. I'm going to say address uh, public user equals make address. This is going to be our user here. Do this capitals user like this. We're going to say gov token dot mint user and we'll do un 256 public constants. Uh, yeah, initial supply equals 100 ether. We're going to mint ourselves 100 ether. Boom. Now, something that you'll often forget is that just because you minted tokens doesn't mean you have any voting power. So we want to run gov token dot delegate that delegate function. And we're just going to delegate to ourselves. So we're saying, hey, we now have 100 tokens. We're going to delegate those 100 tokens voting power to ourselves. You could delegate it to somebody else if you wanted to. But for our test, we're going to do it for us. And we need to actually do vm dot start prank user because only the user can delegate tokens to themselves and we might as well stay as the user for these next ones just that we can start off as owners of the contracts we're about to do so now that we have our governance token next what we want to deploy is our time lock because in order to deploy our governor we're going to need both the gov token and the time lock so we have the gov token let's actually create the time lock now so we're going to say time lock equals new Time lock. And what does this take? Min delay, composers, executors. So let's create those. I'm going to scroll up. We're going to make un256 public constant min delay, delay equals 3600, which is going to be one hour. This is the delay after a vote passes, right? So this is the time locks min delay. Nobody can actually execute a past proposal until an hour goes by. Boom, we'll do min delay. What else do we need? We need the proposers for stuff. And we'll just make this at the top. Address array proposers. Address array executors. And we'll just leave it blank because we don't care. Proposers, executors. And this is actually how with the time lock controller, you say anyone can propose and anybody can execute. You just leave these arrays blank. Cool, looks good. Okay, now that we have that, we finally can deploy our governor contract because we have these two. So we'll say my, or what do we call it? Do we just call it governor? Yep, governor equals new my governor gov token time lock like that. Now we have to grant some roles. So the time lock actually starts with some default roles and we need to grant the governor a whole bunch of roles and then we need to remove ourselves as the admin of the time lock, right? We don't want a single centralized entity to have power over it. So first we got to get some of the roles. So we're going to say bytes32 proposer role. And the way that the time lock has roles is that it hashes the names of stuff. So we'll say proposer role equals time lock proposer role. So there's this function on the time lock called proposer role. Uh, and we're going to allow this proposer role to be just the governor. So only the governor can propose stuff to the time lock. We'll say bytes 32 XEQ tor Q tor role is going to be time lock that executor role. We're going to give this to anybody by setting it to the zero address and then bytes 32 admin role right now that's us time lock dot nope it's gonna be time lock admin role and so like i said these are just kind of the um these are hashes in the time lock 
and we just need to update these. We're gonna say time locked or time lock dot. It has a grant role function. We're gonna grant this proposal role to the governor. So only the governor can actually propose stuff to the time lock. We're gonna say time lock dot grant role executor role to address zero, which means anybody can execute a past proposal. And then time lock dot revoke role revoke the admin role from user. So the user will no longer be the admin. And then we'll say vm.stop prank like this. And then we just need a new box, box equals new box. And now we're gonna transfer ownership of the box to the time lock. And the time lock is owned by the DAO. So we're gonna say box.transfer ownership to address time lock. So transfer ownership. A common misconception here is, oh, shouldn't we transfer to the DAO? No, we should transfer to the time lock. So the time lock owns the DAO. So the time lock owns the DAO and the DAO owns the time lock. It's kind of this weird two way relationship, but it's the time lock that gets the ultimate say on where stuff goes. So we transfer it to the DAO. And so we can even do a quick test function test can't update box with out governance public oops public we'll say vm dot expect revert box dot store one like this since our box has a store function that's only owner the owner is now the time lock slash the DAO oops if I try to run this test right forge test dash m paste this in this should pass because you can't update the box unless it's through governance. And this will also be our sanity check to make sure our, uh, all of our code is compiling, which it is. Okay, great. Let's keep going. So now let's make a giant function, function, test, governance, updates, box, public. And this will show you the exact process from a code standpoint of how one of these DAOs actually work. So first, let's get started. Unit 256. Value to store is gonna be 888, boom. So we're gonna update our box, right? This box here, we're gonna update this new number to 888. Okay, let's come up with a proposal, right? Remember, if we show up my governor, we click into governor, you know, uh, and we click into governor function propose right here. First thing we need to do to kick off anything is propose something, hey, we are going to propose that box updates the stored value to 888. So we're gonna to need to have all this stuff in here. Targets, values, call datas, descriptions. So let's start with description because that's simplest, right? String, memory, D, description equals store one in box. That's it, that's our description. Pretty easy, right? What else do we need? Okay, we're gonna need some call datas. Oh, well, we know what call datas are. That's that function selector and all that other stuff that we learned in that NFT one, right? So we can say bytes memory. So if you go back to the Foundry NFT F23, we go to SRC, sub lesson, we can remember, oh, wait, we can, we can call anything that we want, right? And all we gotta do is encode stuff, right? Like abi.encode with signature or encode with selector or whatever we, we wanna do here. So we can actually say, oh, okay. So this allows us to make any function call that we want. So we'll encode it by saying encoded function call equals, we wanna, well, what do we wanna call? Well, we wanna call this store function. Ah, so we know the function signature of store is gonna be store unit 256. So we can say abi.encode with signature. We're gonna call the store function like this. And then what else do we need? Well, we need the value like this, and that's it. Cool. Let me toggle the word wrap here. Cool. So we have the encoded function call. So we have the call data that we need to call it. Okay, great. What do we need next? I know we're going kind of this, in this reverse order. Values. Uh, well, we don't really care to send any value, right? So let's even just go to the top here. We'll make a unit 256 array values, 
it'll start off as blank. We'll just say values.push zero. Cool. We'll just have it be empty. We're not going to send any ETH. And then the final thing we need is targets. So we want to call this on the box contract, right? Oh, and actually, all data is, is also an array. So we're going to do a couple things. We're going to do values, all datas, and targets. Targets, right? So the call data is, is a unit 56. No, call data is a bytes array. And targets is an address array. So we're going to say values.push0, call datas.push, that encoded function call that we just made, and then targets.push the address of the box, right? So now we have all that. Now we can finally call our proposed function. And what does this proposed function return? It returns this UN256 proposal ID, and we need that to keep going. So first thing we're going to do is propose to the DAO. Propose to the DAO. So say UN256 proposal ID equals governor.propose the targets, values, call datas, and description. Boom. And we got our proposal ID, just like that. Now we can even view the state of this proposal now, right? Because we can call that state function. So we can do even like a little console.log proposal state. Uh, we can call a state function like this. Actually, GitHub Copilot has this right, except for we want to turn this into the UN256 version. So we'll say UN256 governor.state proposal ID like this. And if we look up function state, we'll find this. There's like a million of these. In our governor.soul, it returns this proposal state, which if we control or command click on that, we can see all the different states it can have. Pending, active, canceled, defeated, succeeded, queued, expired, executed. So pending obviously is going to be zero. Active is obviously going to be one. Canceled is going to be two, etc. Right. And of course, we're going to need to import console from test. Okay, cool. So this should return what? Should return pending. It should return a zero. And it hasn't started yet. It's not active because there's a delay. Right. So we want to actually update our fake blockchain to move past that. So we'll just do VM dot warp. We'll use these cheat codes. Remember block dot timestamp plus, and then we'll just do voting delay. You went six public constant voting delay equals one. This is how many blocks till a vote is active, right? And from our wizard, we just left this as one. Oh, well, if we go back to governor, we just left our voting delay as one. So this voting delay is one. So uh, plus voting delay. And then actually we'll do voting delay plus one. And then we'll also do roll to increase the time as well. VM dot warp, or excuse me, to increase the number block dot number plus voting delay plus one. Now, if you view the state, it should be active. So now it'll be active. Cool. Two, after a proposal starts, because we've proposed enough time has passed, we now can actually start voting on something. So I'm going to do this cast vote function, but I'm going to do cast vote with reason because I like cast voting with a reason. So we're going to do string memory reason equals because blue frog is cool. That's gonna be my reason. That's why I'm going to vote for something because blue frog is cool. In order to vote, we're gonna need to call this cast vote function. And if we go to governor, we look for the function vote or excuse me, cast. And if we go on our search bar, we can look for a function cast vote. There's a whole bunch of cast votes. We can see in here, we need to pass a proposal ID and support. How do we know support works? Well, let's look at this castvo internal function. This castvo internal function down here, support count vote. We got to look at this count vote function. So let's look for function count vote. Okay, this is the abstract implementation. Let's, we don't want governor compatibility Bravo. We want governor counting simple because that's what we're using. Okay, support, how does support work? Aha, okay. 
So there's this vote type struct that it's checking for. Let's go to the vote type. Okay, against four abstain. So against is gonna be zero, four is gonna be one, and abstain is gonna be two. So what do I wanna do? I wanna write vote four, so we're gonna do one. So we're gonna say we have our reason, you int eight, vote way equals one, which means I'm voting for, voting yes, if you will. And now let's do our vm.prank, our user, or our voter, and we'll do governor.cast vote with reason, proposal, ID, vote way, and reason. Reason. All right, cool. Now that we've voted, let's speed up this voting period because everyone voted because we're the only voter. Let's speed up this voting period. And we set the voting period automatically. If we go back to our my governor, right? Voting period was set to one week. In here, this number represents one week. So we're gonna speed up this voting period. I'm gonna copy this number, scroll up to the top. We'll do u into 256 public constant. Uh, excuse me, voting period equals this. Oh, and this should have a semicolon voting period. We're going to speed through the voting period. I'm going to just copy these, change this to voting period, voting period. Now, now that we voted and the voting period is done, what do we do? Well, we actually need to queue the TX before we can actually for execute. So we have to queue it first. So there's a queuing process. So on our my governor, there's a function, function queue, and a whole bunch of them have this. Let me open this up. Function queue. On this governor time lock controller, there's this queuing bit because a queue means it's passed, but we have to wait. To queue it up, we just pass the same bits that we originally did for propose. So we're gonna go back here. We'll say the only difference is we need to hash the description first. So we'll say bytes 32, description hash equals, hit check, 256, abi.encode, hacked, description. Now we can call governor.q, proposal ID, uh, excuse me, this is not right, governor.q, um, targets, we're gonna pass the same values that we proposed with, so that we guarantee it's the same Proposal, so targets, values, function, uh, call datas, and description hash. Oh, we don't need that zero. We're gonna queue it, and then we're gonna finally wait this min delay, which we said, hey, after a vote passes, we need to wait this min delay before we can execute. So I'm gonna copy this again, paste it here. Instead of voting period, this is gonna be min delay, min delay. And then finally, we can execute. So we'll do governor.execute. It's gonna be the same as what we did to queue it up. I even just copy this whole thing, paste it here. Targets, values, call data is description hash. X, um, uh, let me spell this right. And now finally, we can do assert box dot get number equals the value that we stored. Boom. We can even do like a console.log, box value, box socket number. Okay. Copy this. Open our terminal. Clear. Forge. Test. Dash M. Paste. Dash VV. So we can see the console.logs. Pull it up. Is this what we've been waiting for? No. We ran into an issue. We see these two logs. Proposal state is zero. We're getting vote currently not active. So. Let's add a couple more Vs so we can see where it failed. It looks like it got to the cast vote with reason and it failed. So let's go to our test. So it looks like it proposed okay. It looks like this failed. So it says it's currently not active. So did we mess up our voting delay? Ah, it's because I did warp for both. This should be vm.roll. Let's see, did we do, oh, we messed that up for all of them. Let's fix this roll, roll, roll. It's clear. Let's run it again. Pull this up.
Oh my goodness, it passed. And we can see in the logs, proposal state was zero. We waited and then it became inactive. And then finally, after we got through all the different states, we finally were able to update the box. I know we kind of sped through this section, but like I said, at this point, you're becoming a pretty sophisticated smart contract engineer. And it, I really wanted to show you the process of voting of a typical DAO from today and for you to see it from the coding side as well. Now, if you want to go further with this, I highly recommend you look into some of the different methodologies and some of the newer methodologies that researchers are coming out with for people to actually do votes. Because like I said, plutocracy is not the best. So if you want to go farther, try experimenting with other ways to build DAOs. Maybe flesh out your own DAO. Maybe deploy a DAO. Do whatever you want to do here. But in any case, you should be incredibly proud of yourself because you got through the hardest lesson of this whole course already, which was the stablecoin one. And then you just learned this incredibly powerful advanced course in how DAOs actually work. Students, we're almost at our end. There is one more lesson for us to do, and it's our smart contract and security auditing for developers. Do not leave this course without watching this. I want you to have at least the fundamental knowledge of where you should look for security help, what you should have in mind for security, especially now that you have the ability to go out and deploy some amazing contracts. I'm not going to teach you how to audit step by step here, right? But I am going to teach you, here's what you should be looking for in an auditor. Here's how you, you can begin to start thinking about security. And I am working on some security and auditing education material as well to make those of you who do want to go down that path successful. So give yourself a pat on the back, do a little dance, do a little celebration, get some ice cream, and I'll see you in the next one, and then I will, I will release you to the world. So pause the video and I'll see you soon. And as a special piece of bonus content, we have Harrison here to give us some tips on gas optimizations. So enjoy. Hey guys, I'm Harrison Ledio, and I'm the CTO and co-founder of Pop Punk LLC, where we're building Gaslight GG. Uh, Gaslight GG is a audit firm, but we focus specifically on gas optimization for protocols to ensure that your gas costs are as low as possible. Uh, in addition, we're happy to announce that we're now building uh, hyper-optimized public goods tools for EVM developers to make sure that everyone has access to just the best and the cheapest contracts. So Patrick invited me on here to show an example of some common ways that you might be using too much gas in your smart contracts without really noticing. So I have a quick example here. We're going to look at an airdrop contract. This is a super basic airdrop contract, which I'm calling airdrop bad or bad airdrop. Uh, very simple. We have a token. We're using a counter to iterate um, and count the number of transfers. Uh, so as you see in the constructor, we set the token here uh, and then we have our airdrop function. So we have two parameters um, for this function. The first one is a memory um, array of addresses, which is the recipients. And then we have a memory array of UN 256s for the amounts. The first thing we're doing is we're checking to make sure that the amounts match. Otherwise, we're going to revert. The next thing here, which is really common, um, is making sure that you're batching your your actions. So if we see in this case, we have to traverse through the entire uh, input argument array a full time just so we can transfer the number of tokens from the message.sender to the contract. So let's say there's 50 amounts, we'd have to do 50 separate transfer from. It's definitely not ideal. Uh, and then lastly here, we have a super basic loop where we're just iterating through the array um, and we are transferring the tokens from the contract to the user with the respected amounts here. Uh, lastly, we can see that we're iterating this counter every single time in the array, or every time in the loop, yeah, so keep that in mind. So now if we look at a more ideal example of this, the first thing that you're going to notice is we're using immutable for the token. Immutable is good if you're obviously never going to change something because we set this value in the constructor and it'll be included in the contract deployed bytecode, which is cheaper to read from every time. 
If we look now here, we've changed our arguments for our function to call data and we've added a new one called total amount. This is done so we don't have to do two loops through the array, we can do one. So if you see here, the first thing that we're doing is we're transferring this total amount from the message.sender to this contract. So that's gonna cut a large amount of gas because we're only gonna wind up looping one time. So if we see here, we, we've changed the way that we're going through the loop. Technically, we don't have to cache this array length because we're using call data. But if you do see here, it's the same thing. We're transferring tokens from this contract to the recipient. Uh, we're also using unchecked for our loop iterator because it's not going to overflow because the odds of someone doing an airdrop to more than the max UN 256 of addresses is kind of crazy. Um, and the final thing to look at here, we're using an unchecked block again, but rather than updating this state value of transfers every single time and paying that base gas cost each time, we can just update this amount at the end with the bulk length. So these are small things that you can think about when you're writing your smart contract to ensure that you're saving as much gas as possible. If we look at the results of this, the airdrop bad costs uh, 1,094,690 gas and the airdrop good costs 404,842 gas. So we've essentially saved 600,000 gas just by doing simple things, you know, it doesn't make the code unreadable, um, and you're just making sure that, you know, the end users of this will not have to spend a crazy amount of money. So I want to thank Patrick for having me on here. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at at poppunkonchain, um, or the business account is at poppunkllc. If you're a small protocol or a large protocol, feel free to reach out for gas audits, and. Uh, pretty soon in the near future, you'll be able to go to gaslight.gg and you'll be able to deploy super cheap, super gas optimized smart contracts, you know, through no code and just pressing one button. Thank you. Right. Welcome back to our last lesson of the course. I hope you're excited because I sure am. In this last lesson, we're going to give you just a teasing of smart contract security and auditing. This is especially for developers. We're not going to go over everything security. However, in here, I'm going to leave a ton of places where you can learn and grow and absolutely be sure to sign up for web3education.dev because we're going to put a whole lot more security information in here as well. But we are going to give you the foundational information that you need to even begin to start thinking about where to go and how to work with security in the space. We have this repo Denver security to talk a little bit more about security and how it works. But I want to give you all a couple of stats before we even jump into security impress upon you why this is so important. This is probably the stat that's the most jarring to me. According to Chainalysis, as of last year, 2022, about $3.8 billion was stolen in crypto hacks. And about 3.1 billion of that 3.8 billion was specifically DeFi. And if we go to DeFi Llama, last year, DeFi had a total value locked of around 50 billion. So if we do the math there, 3.1 divided by 50. We're talking around 6% of all DeFi was hacked last year. That's like walking up to a bank and saying, hey, can I put my money in you? And the bank going, yeah, sure. Just a heads up. There's a 6% chance all your money will be gone next year. That is an insanely horrible statistic. And it's why we need to put so much more focus and so much more emphasis on security. There's a popular website called rect.news that has a leaderboard that if you go to, you can see a lot of the top biggest hacks, hugest hacks to ever existed, went off of code that was unaudited, unreviewed by security professionals. Unaudited, unaudited, unaudited. Uh, NA, NA, unaudited, 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 unaudited. Out of scope, unaudited, out of scope. And it is not acceptable. Some of these hacks were absolutely massive, losing over half a billion dollars. So if you're a protocol or if you developers go on to build protocols, here is what you want to think about. You can maybe spend $2 million of your budget on security or get hacked for $200 million. 
the spending money on security is a 99% reduction in costs. So if you approach security from a business perspective, it absolutely 100% makes sense for you to spend resources on security. So to kick start this video, all of you protocol devs will probably want to get a smart contract security audit at some point, a security focused code review before you launch your protocol. So let's start there. I've made a video recently on what a smart contract audit is and how to prepare for a smart contract audit that we're gonna watch first. Because even if you don't wanna become a smart contract auditor yourself, you'll need to know what a smart contract audit is for when your protocol is gonna go launch to mainnet. So let's start there. A smart contract audit is a time boxed security based code review on your smart contract system. An auditor's goal is to find as many vulnerabilities as possible and educate the protocol on best security best practices and coding best practices moving forward. Auditors use a combination of manual review and automated tools to find these vulnerabilities. Now, why are these so important? Why is it critical that you get an audit before deploying your code base to a live blockchain? Well, for starters, there are entire websites dedicated to how many hacks happen. Last year, we saw the most value ever stolen from smart contracts with almost $4 billion stolen. Due to the immutability of the blockchain, once a smart contract is deployed, you can't change it. So you better get it right. The blockchain is a permissionless adversarial environment and your protocol needs to be prepared for malicious users. But even more so than that, an audit can improve your developers teams understanding of code, improving their speed and effectiveness in implementing features moving forward. And it can teach your team the latest and greatest tooling in the space. Often just one smart contract audit isn't even enough. And protocols go on a security journey that includes many audits and many different services like formal verification, competitive audits and bug bounty programs. We'll break these down in a future video. There are a lot of companies that offer smart contract auditing services like Trail of Bits, Consensus Diligence, Open Zeppelin, Sigma Prime, Spirit DAO, Mixbytes, Watchpug, Trust, and of course, Cyphern. Additionally, there's a lot of independent auditors that do great work as well. A typical audit looks like this. Price and timeline. First, a protocol needs to reach out and they can reach out before or after their code is actually finished. Ideally, they reach out sometime before their code is finished so the auditors can have time to slot them in. Once they reach out, the protocol and auditors will discuss how long the audit will take based off of scope and code complexity. The scope of the audit is going to be the exact files and commit hash that's gonna be audited. How long the audit usually depends on how many lines of code slash complexity. You can see a very, very rough approximation of how long an audit takes on your screen now. Of course, this depends firm to firm, audit to audit, and tool to tool. So take these with a very large grain of salt. Additionally, it's this duration that sets the price. And same thing at the time of recording, prices range wildly depending on who's doing the audit, how many people are doing the audit, how complex the code is, and more. And these initial conversations are really just to get a ballpark estimate and slot you in to the auditor's schedule. Commit hash, down payment, start date. Once you have a commit hash, you can finalize the start date, and final price. The commit hash is the unique ID of the code base that you're working with so the auditors can know exactly what code they're gonna be looking at. Some auditors will ask for a down payment in order to schedule you in. Audit begins. The auditors will use every tool in their arsenal to find as many vulnerabilities in your code as possible. We'll give you some tricks in a minute to make this a successful step. Initial report. After the time period ends, the auditors will give you an initial report that looks something like this, with all their findings listed by severity, usually categorized into highs, mediums, lows, informational slash non-critical, and gas efficiencies. High, mediums, and low represent the severity of impact and likelihood of each vulnerability. Informational, gas, and non-critical are findings to improve the efficiency of your code, code structure, readability, and best practice improvements that are not necessarily vulnerabilities, but more ways to improve your code. Mitigation begins. The protocol's team will then have an agreed upon time to fix the vulnerabilities found in the initial audit report. Sometimes, depending on the severity of the findings, this might mean you have to start from scratch, but more times than not, you can just implement the recommendations the auditors give you. This is usually much shorter than the audit itself. Final report. After the protocol makes these changes, the audit team will do a final audit report exclusively on the fixes made to address the issues brought up in the initial report. Then, hopefully, the protocol Call and auditors have a great experience together and will work together in the future to keep Web3 secure. Now, there are a few key things that you can do to make sure your audit is successful as possible. To get the most out of your audit, you should have clear documentation, a robust test suite, ideally including fuzz or invariant tests. Code should be commented and readable. Modern best practices are followed. There should be an established communication channel between developers and auditors during the audit, and an initial video walkthrough of the code should be done before the audit starts. The most important part of the process 
is going to be during the audit. To get the best results, you want to think of you and your auditors working together as a team. One of the best ways to do this is to have a dedicated channel where auditors can ask questions to developers. The developers will always and forever have more context over the code base than the auditors ever will because they have spent so much more time working on the code base. And the more documentation, context and information that you can give to the auditors, the better. This way it can be easy for anybody to walk through the code and understand what it's supposed to do. In fact, 80% of all bugs are actually business logic implementation bugs. This means that these are bugs that have nothing to do with some weird coding error and are just somebody not knowing what the protocol should be doing. So it's vitally important that the auditors understand what the code should be doing. Having a modern test suite and tooling can also make auditors spend less time fidgeting with your tooling and more time finding issues. Post audit. We highly encourage you to take the recommendations your auditors give you seriously. Additionally, after an audit, if you make a change to your code base, that new code is now unaudited code. It doesn't matter how small the changes. We've seen a ton of protocols saying, oh, I'll just slip in one line of code. And sure enough, that's the line of code that gets exploited. And often, depending on the seriousness of your protocol and how many users you want to use it, one audit might not even be enough. Working with multiple auditors and getting more eyes on your code will give you a better chance of finding more vulnerabilities. What an audit isn't. Now, here's the thing. An audit doesn't mean that your code is bug free. An audit is a security journey between the protocol and the auditor to find as many bugs as possible and teach the protocol different methodologies to stay more secure in the future. Security is a continuous process that is always evolving. No matter how much experience someone has, people at all levels have missed vulnerabilities. On the unfortunate day that that happens, be sure that you and your auditor can jump on a call quickly to try to remedy the situation and maybe consider getting insurance for your protocol as well. So now with that being said, now you have a good idea of what a smart contract audit entails and what to expect end to end. A smart contract audit is a security journey end to end, leveling up your protocol so that you can have all the best practices and security know-how to deploy your code to a live blockchain forever. And of course, if you're looking for an audit, be sure to reach out to the Cypher team, link in the description. And as always, stay safe out there and we'll see you next time. All right, great, welcome back. So now that you know a little bit more about what a smart contract audit is, let's talk about the process that smart contract auditors and security professionals take and the tools that they use. Security is both for protocol developers and for auditors. You as a smart contract developer need to know all these tools and probably should use all these tools before you even go to audit. At the end of the day, it is you who is responsible for the code base that you launch. And additionally, you often can't just do security at the end. You have to have security built in from the architecture from day one. For example, if you build a car and the car is a total piece of garbage, and you say, hey, cool, it's time to race, you're probably just gonna have to start over and, and it's not a very good use of time for you to even go to the audit. There are some tools like Solcurity, which, which have opinionated security and code quality standard for Solidity Smart Contracts. And we showed you the simple security toolkit from Nason XYZ for great places to read before you go to audit and make sure you have checked off or you've looked at this doc to make sure you're even ready to go to audit. But anyways, let's talk about the audit process. So there is no silver bullet, but typically the smart contract audit process goes through a process of manual review and then using tools. And there are a ton of tools security professionals use to make sure code is secure. Now, manual review is probably one of the most important, if not the most important tool that we have in our toolbox. Manual review is literally going through the code line by line and going through the docs and making sure the code actually does what it's supposed to do. There's kind of a joke in the developer community where if you just read the documentation for 15 minutes, you'd be way better prepared to actually do code, but a lot of people don't do that. So step one on any audit is really getting some understanding of what the protocol should do. Most bugs are actually business logic issues. And the only way you'll know if business logic is wrong is if you understand what the protocol or the business should do. And repetition is the mother's skill. So the more you read code, the more you read docs, the more you do these audits, the better you'll get. For example, for example, if we had a contract like this, this caught with test, we have this set number function, this code technically isn't wrong, right? It'll compile fine, it'll deploy fine, but maybe if we read the docs and we read that set number was supposed to set number to new number, we would then read this function and go, oh my gosh, you're setting it to new number plus one. That's clearly wrong, right? And the only way we would have caught that bug is by understanding what the function should be doing. 
So that's manual review. Now let's talk about some of the other tools that we have in our toolbox here. The first line of defense is going to be test suites, which is why we spent so long in this course writing test suites. All the most popular frameworks out there have test suites. I don't really need to go over them because you have already done so. Static analysis. This is something we haven't gone over. Static analysis is going to be automatically checking code for issues without executing anything. Hence, the debugging is static. Most of these tools were sort of just dumbly look for keywords in specific orders. And AI is actually going to be an example of static analysis as well. And we'll show you an example of all of these once I get through this. Fuzz testing, we've gone over fuzz testing. It involves providing random data as inputs during testing. Uh, we have stateful fuzz testing, which we've definitely gone over in this course as well. Differential testing, which we aren't really going to go over, but it's a way to actually write the same code multiple times and compare the code against each other. But then finally, there's formal verification. Now, formal verification is a generic term for applying formal methods to verify the correctness of hardware or software. Applying FM means anything based off of mathematical proofs. And software often used as a proof of correctness or proof of bug, or just mathematically prove that something in your code can happen. This can be a little bit confusing, obviously. Um, but to me, the way that I generalize it is you basically take your solidity function, you take your solidity code, and you convert it to math. And math can be solved. Math has right and wrong answers. One plus one equals two, right? So we convert our solidity code to math and then mathematically prove or disprove it. Symbolic execution is one of these formal verification, these formal methods. And ma symbolic execution involves converting our code to a mathematical expression. There's some tools here like Mat, Manticore, Z3, Zertora, even the Solidity compiler actually has a symbolic execution client. There is a fantastic article on HackMD by Paulina who goes over some of these different symbolic execution clients and compares them to each other. I left a link to this, of course, in the GitHub repo associated with this course. Symbolic execution is one of these tools that is the most time intensive. And a lot of protocols and a lot of audit firms don't even go down this route because even symbolic execution isn't a silver bullet. It's not a guarantee that some code has no bugs. It's not a guarantee code is bug free. But especially if you have some incredibly math computationally heavy process, Symbolic execution or form of verification might be a good tool to use. AI tools. AI tools are a work in progress, long story short. Sometimes they're okay, and sometimes they're absolutely terrible. All right, so now that we know some of these tools, let's actually see them in action. And I'm going to go kind of quick here. But what we could do is if we're in the GitHub repo associated with this course, we can actually download this Denver security repo. Now, this does not have the dash F23 at the end of it, because this is a lesson that I've done in the past, but it is associated with this course. And what we'll do, though, is we'll just clone it. We're not going to build a project from scratch here. We're just going to look at some code ourselves. So we'll do git clone, paste it in, do code Denver security. And we'll open that up in a new tab here. And I, want, and I want to just show you how bugs can be found with some of these different tools here. So in our SRC folder, we've got a couple of files here. We have caught with fuzz, caught with manual review, caught with slither, stable fuzz, symbolic, caught with test, etc. Each of these has a bug in them where one of these methods was going to be how you catch it. Our first one, caught with manual, caught with manual review. We'll do a toggle word wrap. The way we can catch this bug is just with manual review, right? So we have this function, do math, and the comments or the docs here say dev adds two to number two add and returns it. We can then easily read the code and say, oh my goodness, we're only adding one. Boom. That's an issue. That's a bug. That's something that we would want to fix. That's how we would catch this one. Next, caught with test.sol. This is the one that we saw in the presentation that we gave. Set number should set the number. A unit test would easily catch that this was wrong. All right, what's next? Static analysis or slither. Now, this is something we haven't really gone over, but one of the most prevalent hacks in this industry is going to be a re something called a reentrancy attack. And you can read more about it in the Solidity by Example reentrancy. I've left a link to this, of course, in the GitHub repo associated with this course. But there are actually tools that will automatically check for stuff like this. If I pull up my terminal, 
and I use this tool Slither. I've already gotten installed. You can go ahead and check out the install instructions yourself. But if I run Slither dot, it'll automatically compile my code base. And then it'll give this massive printout of a ton of the issues that it found. And right at the top, right in red, it can see, hey, there's a withdraw issue. There's a re-entrancy issue with your withdraw function. And then obviously we could go back, update it, rerun Slither, and this would go away. So a lot of these issues have tools that you can just run and it'll automatically detect. So Slither is one of these tools that I think everyone should run on their code base before going to audit. What's next? We have caught with fuzz, which we know what fuzz is. We learned about fuzzing. We have this massive function. We see this here say should never return zero. So there's probably a fuzz test. So if we look in our fuzz tests, we actually smartly wrote a test fuzz here where we say, hey, the return number from that function should never be zero. We can then grab that forge test forge test dash dash MT. What's it called? Test fuzz. And we see we get a failing test here. We see we found that if it passes one, two, six, five, it actually will fail. We come back to our test here. And we can see there's a conditional if my number equals one, two, six, five, one, two, six, five, modular one, two, six, five is going to be zero plus one minus one times one is one, which means it returns zero. And we don't want this to return zero, which means we break our invariant. If we call change value with zero, It'll set my value to zero up here. And then we can call do more math again with zero. We're going to get zero divided by one plus zero, return zero, and boom, this will break as well. And then finally, we have symbolic here, where we can actually just use the Solidity compiler to do symbolic execution. We have these two functions, function one, function one symbolic, where we have this revert in here. This is going to be the bug. In Solidity, we can add asserts to our code base, and we'll go over a video that explains this more in depth to tell our Solidity compiler, hey, this should not hit, and this should hit. This conditional should not be hit, this one should hit. In Foundry, in our foundry.toml, we can add information in here to send to the Solidity compiler. We're going to tell the, our Solidity compiler to use the CHC model checker, time out of 1000, and to look for those assert keywords. And if we just run forge build, or forge build dash dash force to force it to rebuild, it'll compile and it'll give us this output here saying warning, CHC assertion violation happens here, meaning it found an issue, it found an input such that this assert line hit. So if we pull up our terminal, we can scroll down, we can see exactly, we can see exactly what the input is 8088 is the input that will allow that to hit. If we look, 8088 divided by four does indeed meet this criteria. So it would go ahead and revert here. So those are some of the tools we have in our toolbox. We'll go over symbolic execution a little bit more, but let's wrap this lesson up. So to talk to us more about the process of manual reviewing, we have legendary Ethereum smart contract researcher Tincho to walk us through his process in a real process of him going through ENS. He did an audit on ENS just for kicks and ended up getting paid out $100,000 for finding a critical vulnerability. So let's learn from legendary manual reviewer Tincho. This is Tincho, Ethereum security researcher, previous lead auditor at Open Zeppelin, and creator of Damn Vulnerable DeFi. And today we have the pleasure of talking with Tincho, going over his auditing process so that you can learn how to make damn unvulnerable DeFi. To do this, we're going to be doing a live mock audit of the Ethereum name service GitHub, seeing exactly some of the tools and techniques that Tincho would use to audit this. I don't have a super formal auditing process. I really think that everybody will find their own ways. I will just show you briefly some things that I do today. Link to the full interview in the description. Let's get froggy. 
So this is a repository for ENS. The first thing that I would do is obviously go to a repository, you would clone the repository to my local environment. But if you are like very unfamiliar, you should probably go to the documentation, at least I know, read the introduction. Now he says there's no formal audit process, but this sounds like a good step one. Download the code, read the documentation. Read the fucking documentation. Here we have the architecture is telling us like already some keywords that we will need to understand at some point, such as what a registry is, what a resolver is. Already I will get familiar with this. Probably these are contracts that I'm about to see in the code and so on and so forth. One thing that you can do also after reading some documentation is looking at audit reports. If we go to the actual code, we will realize that there are lots of things. Wait a minute. What the heck is that logo? What wonky text editor is Tencho using? That, my friends, would be VS Codium. It's different from VS Code. VS Code is a product owned by Microsoft that actually sends a lot of your usage information over to Microsoft. VS Codium doesn't do this. They have removed, I think, telemetry and some things related to Microsoft. Tencho said he's just been trying it out recently, but maybe it's a security alpha leak. And so multiple contracts in here. Already we see that lots of folders. It's using hard hat from what I can tell. These days I like projects that use Foundry more than those that use hard hat. So in that case, what I would do is I created another folder in which I have a Foundry local setup. Why do you like Foundry better? Why do you make this Foundry local setup? It's faster and I can write quick tests only using Solidity. So I will do whatever thing that I want to do here, but just an easy way to have something quick and dirty to test things quickly. Bring and use the tools that you're most familiar and best with. I think that's super important. And don't be afraid to bring your disgustingly horrible, dirty, dirty tests. But anyway, already we saw that it's quite complex. So what I would do in this case is there is a command line utility that I would use, which is called CLOG. CLOG will help you count lines of code. And so I would use CLOG, it would give me a nice output that you can actually parse to a CSV. And instead of doing this here, what I would usually do is I would move that to a spreadsheet. I have the scope for ENS, right? All these files are now ordered here. And now I can have a better view in terms of how many files do I have, how complex they might be. So apparently I have 59 files and now I know the name wrapper will be one of the most complex contracts perhaps, right? Because it has more than 700 lines of code. Another approach to do this scoping phase, you can actually use this tool by consensus, which is called Solidity Metric. So you can run it on a project and it will actually give you a nice report of the code base and at its level of complexity. And then I will have a column stating where the thing that I'm doing is not started, it's in progress or it's done. So this is his next step. He either uses Solidity Metrics or C-Lock, ranks other contracts that he needs to audit based on complexity and starts going through it, moving contracts from not started to in progress to done. A very organized approach. When you do this alone, it might seem silly, but when you work in teams, it's quite important. As the audit progresses, I will be less and less focused on this file because probably this is super complex and will be related to either. But most of all, it's very useful, at least for me at the beginning of the audit, just to understand what am I looking at. Once I have this table, I usually start with the little Legos and then I go move up in complexity. So in this case, I will probably, I don't know, start with the ERC20 recoverable contract. Here it is. And it's quite short. Say, okay, it's Ownable, inheriting from open Zeppelin as an auditor, probably I can take that for granted, which is out of the scope, and I will assume that's working correctly. And it has a single function to recover funds. If, okay, it has access control, so this is probably fine as long as they are handling access and controls in the right way. This is fine. And it's actually doing this, right? So we start with the small little building blocks or Legos, as Tincho said. And now you're going to see Tincho's brain start switching into, how can I break this? As an auditor, you might start wondering where this is good for any token out there, right? Where it's possible to actually execute a transfer on any address that the owner passes here and where that could be problematic for ill behaved ERC20 tokens. And if you're familiar with USDT, for example, that could be problematic in this. Ah, now we're seeing him drawing on his expertise, knowing that USDT is a weird token. USDT actually doesn't return a Boolean on its transfer firms, whereas a lot of other tokens actually do. What the fuck, USDT? When you see that only owner function, do you think, okay, is this a DAO? Is there a single person who controls? What are your thoughts? At least at the beginning, I wouldn't worry about it too much. At some point, I will read documentation about the roles of this. But yeah, at some point, I should probably understand at some point who's the actual owner. Okay, let's say that you think that this is okay. So what I would do usually is I would take notes in the code, right? So in this case, I would say like access control, okay. For example, just to have a 
no saying that I was here. But you can have a question, like Patrick said, is this governance, right? And let's say this was an issue, so I would do this. I shouldn't be, I don't know, let's say shouldn't be owner. Another thing that I do to take notes is actually have notes files in the same place. Very raw notes, very having a file where I can quickly dump ideas that I have. At some point, things will go well. I would have an issues list here. And I will start listing, I don't know, in line, blah, 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 or file, blah, 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 list issues. Take notes in the code in a notes file somewhere. Just have a place where you can dump thoughts. Maybe you can even use a note-taking plugin. I don't use any plugins. That's because I don't like having the UI clutter too much with stuff. Yeah, I, a note-taking extension was a dumb idea. And one thing that you have to be careful when you start with the very little things, so it's very easy to go deep into the rabbit hole of the single thing that you are trying to audit. Is that, for example, I have very little knowledge of DNS. I'm not like super familiar with it. And I got like very like down into DNS because I was just paying attention to this single resolver. And that led me to realize that after, I know, two days, I was growing familiar with DNS, but I was losing the big picture of actually Hey, I'm actually putting ENS. So it's very easy to go deep into the rabbit hole of the single thing that you are trying to audit. Remember to jump out of the rabbit holes. Perfect. So at some points in during the audit, you will realize that you might need to test things. So in this case, I saw these two functions. One is going from my bytes thing, returning an address, and the other is doing the other way around. You might say it's okay, but if you're lazy, you can actually use Foundry to help you in that. So what I did in this case, I used my very handy hacky boundary repo that I have in here. And I actually copied these two functions to a contract. Like I just took them, not even trying to do fancy imports or whatever, just raw copying and pasting them here. And I did a quick test, a fasting test in which I provide an address. I pass that address to this first function and the result of that, I pass it to the other function. And I want to make sure that I always get the same address as a result. A lot of times, yes, you're going to write code and not just do manual reviews. Tensho here wrote what's called a fuzz test, which you should absolutely smash that like button because we're going to have a video on that sometime in the future. Use your tools to validate findings that you have an inkling are wrong. In the cases where I have to set up more complex stuff, perhaps having a separate folder with a single project is not that convenient because I would need to set up the whole in a system and that wouldn't be that convenient. So in those cases, I would go to the actual testing environment of the project. If you're doing a private audit, how important is the process of, it, of talking and interacting and, and keeping communications with the client open? I would say it's almost fundamental. Usually developers will have much more context than you as an auditor on what the system is intending to do. So you can spend a whole week trying to figure out on your own where this modifier should be in this function or not. But if you actually send a question to the client and tell them, hey, should this be here or not? And they will tell you, yes, it should be here. You can see it in test, blah, blah, blah. You can see them as companions during the audit and you should rely on them. You can rely on the client. AO protocol, is your code good? You think so? <laughs> Hell yeah, my work is done. Having said that, it's also important not to trust too much. At the end of the day, they are trusting you as the expert. So in this, in that sense, I would advise, okay, keep the clients at hand, ask questions, but also be detached enough. Since they built the code, they have spent more time thinking about the code and looking at the code than you ever will. Ask them questions and don't be afraid to ask questions. I guess at this point, what's the next step? Are we wrapping up now? Are we writing the report up? What do we do next? The thing is, I always get the feeling that you can be looking at a system forever. It, there's always one additional line that you can check. There's always one additional attack that you can think of, one additional potential cause, my vulnerability and everything. So what I do is I time bound myself to have a certain level of confidence when you're shipping the report that you did your best and you thought of every single possible attack or vulnerability that you could think of in that limited amount of time. Time bound yourself. When you're going through this code, how are you thinking of different attacks? Like when you're looking at a piece of code, how do you get that context of what different types of attacks to think of? Yeah, I don't have a checklist. Very difficult to translate experience in doing it. Have this adversarial mindset or try to at least. There's lots of knowledge that can come from oh, every single day reading vulnerability reports, every single day doing or reading responsible disclosures that are published. 
doing all these reports. I read newsletters. Like, I don't know, I have this constant influx of in security related information to Solidity that little by little, I think you start growing the intuitions, the experience that actually help you identify quickly things that can happen in smart contracts. And always remember that you can miss things. There's no perfect auditor. I think that everybody has audited sufficient enough and complex enough systems. They have all missed issues and it's okay. Security is a, it's a thing that we have to approach from many different angles and auditing is just one thing that must be done, but it's not the only one. Knowing that you're doing your best in that knowing that you're putting your best effort every day, growing your skills, learning grows an intuition and experience in you. Something that I always say is to audit, to me is 50% funding vulnerabilities and 50% delivering readable report. Once the client starts fixing the issues, they will send you the fixes for the issues. And what you have to do at that point is actually review the fixes and make sure that not only the vulnerability that you highlighted in the report is fixed, but actually this has been introduced by the fix. And then you wrap up your whole auditing process with writing a very good report and take the time to do so. Once you give them the report, they will go ahead and fix the issues, come back, say, hey, we fixed them. And then it's your job to make sure that they fix the issues and they didn't reintroduce new bugs. Let's say you give your audit report, you've done your time box, you've done as much as you can, you think you did a good job, Four months goes by, oh my God, $100 million hack. They've ended up on wrecked. What do you do? What happens? Let me approach it slowly, okay? So sure. I will first say, I have always been of the idea a security code review should be valuable enough beyond the fact that I find or not find a critical issue. So I should be able to provide value to whoever is working with me, to whoever is trusting me, beyond the fact that I did or did not find a critical issue. Obviously, the less critical issues that you miss, the better, the safer, and perhaps they miss something. And that can happen and has happened and will continue to happen. But it's naive to think, in my opinion, that just because an auditor missed something, the whole blame of thing is on the audit. This, I think, is a really important final thought. You as an auditor, it is not solely your job to make sure their code is bug free. You share that responsibility with the client. However, this doesn't give you free range to suck at your job. People will notice. So to understand symbolic execution a little bit more, we've got some members from the Trail of Bits team to teach us about symbolic execution and formal verification. Formal verification is the act of proving or disproving a given property of a system using a mathematical model. Symbolic execution is one technique used for formal verification. Symbolic execution explores different paths in a program, creating a mathematical representation for each path, or more plainly, converting your code to a set of mathematical expressions. Is this the silver bullet for your auditing journey? Let's get froggy. I had the absolute pleasure of interviewing Trail of Bits head of engineering Jocelyn and security engineer from Trail of Bits as well, Troy, about fuzzing, testing methodologies, and importantly, formal verification. I have links to the full interviews with both of them in the description. And in this video, we're going to summarize a lot of that and focus on what formal verification and symbolic execution actually are. But to do that, we need a quick refresher on some of the testing methodologies that we use in Web3. If you haven't seen my invariant testing video, be sure to watch that first before coming here. And to really understand this, you do need at least a high level understanding of Solidity as well. What tools do we have in our toolbox to have high assurance about our program? Layer one, the unit test. Obviously you have unit tests, which you do a very specific thing like this function does this. And you start looking at things like test code coverage, like statement and branch coverage. And I think th that's kind of the bare minimum. The absolute bare minimum in security is a unit test. For example, if this is our solidity and we have a set number function, which should set our number variable to whatever new number is, a unit test would be able to catch this. And if we're using Foundry, we could get an output that looks like this. Some assertion failed and we can go see our test and see that when we call set number to my number, we assert that we get what we want. And if that breaks, Cool, our unit tests have saved us. Foundry, Hardhat, Apex, Truffle Brownie, and all the most popular frameworks have unit tests built in. Layer two, the fuzz test. Fuzzing is where you take random inputs and run them through your program. So you have to define things in your code that you always want to hold true. And fuzz testing is the new bare minimum for Web3 security, because I decree. And as Troy said, you need to understand the pretty or invariant of your system to do fuzzing. 
Once you have your property defined, you throw random data at your system in order to break that property. If you find something that breaks it, you know you have an edge case that you need to refactor your code to handle. For example, if I have a function like do more math, and I know that this function should never return zero, I can throw a whole bunch of random numbers in here to try to get it to return zero. I can have a fuzz test that looks like this, which passes in a whole bunch of random numbers and tries to assert that we never get zero. And we can see from our fuzz test, it was able to pick a random number in order to break our invariant or property. Now, like I said, we recently did a video on fuzz testing or invariant testing, and I highly recommend everybody watch that video because I decree. Foundry, Echidna, and Consensus Diligence Fuzzer are some popular fuzz testing tools. Okay, what's next? Layer three, static analysis. So the things that we've been discussing, unit testing and fuzz testing are dynamic testing, which dynamic just means like you're, you're actually doing something. Dynamic analysis is when we run or we execute our code. In unit and fuzz tests, we do exactly this. We are running our code to try to break it. In static analysis, we just look at our code or have some tool look at our code. For example, this code here has a classic reentrancy vulnerability in our withdrawal function. If we run a static analysis tool like Slither, it'll automatically detect, hey, you have a reentrancy vulnerability. And this is great for very quickly picking out very specific parts of your code that are known to be bad practice. Some popular tools for static analysis are going to be Slither, created by the Trail of Bits team, and even the Solidity compiler could be considered a static analysis tool. So now that we have a little bit of a backstory on some of the popular layers of testing and keeping ourselves secure, let's jump into formal verification and symbolic execution now. Layer four, formal verification. So on a high level, formal verification is going to be the act of proving or disproving a given property of the system. This is usually done through a mathematical model of the system and the property. There's that word again, property. You're seeing that almost no matter what you're doing in your testing, you need to understand the properties of your system. And right there, Jocelyn gave us some of the keys between fuzz testing and formal verification. Fuzz testing tries to break properties by throwing random data at your system, whereas formal verification tries to break properties using mathematical proofs. And there are many different ways to do formal verification, such as symbolic execution and abstract interpretation. For this video, we're going to focus on symbolic execution as that's one of the most popular ways currently done in Web3. Symbolic execution is then one of the techniques that you can use to do formal verification. Symbolic execution on a high level is going to be a technique where you are going to have your program and you are going to try to explore the different paths of the program. For every execution path, you are going to create a mathematical representation. Additionally, if you want to learn more about symbolic execution outside of Web3, I left a link in the description to an MIT open courseware video, which does a great rundown of symbolic execution. Now let's look at Jocelyn's example of using formal verification and symbolic execution. Let's say this is our function that we want to do formal verification on, and we're going to do symbolic execution to do formal verification. Well, let's go back to what formal verification actually is. Formal verification is the act of proving or disproving a given property of a system using a mathematical model. So the first thing we need to do is figure out what we want to prove or disprove. For our demo, we should say our invariant, this should never revert. And that's what we're going to try to prove or disprove. Now, this might seem like a silly example, but you can imagine that this was a function called withdraw money, and you want users to always be able to get their money out, which would seem like a much less silly example. Symbolic execution is going to be creating a mathematical formula for this function f from our code. We're going to convert this function to a mathematical slash logical representation of every execution path from our code. Once we have a set of math functions, we can push those into a solver, which will tell us if a property is true or false, or if our invariant is true or false. When we talk about the different paths of our function, we can imagine, okay, one path that our function can take is going to be a plus one being returned. That's going to be one of our paths. But we can also imagine that a plus one is actually going to overflow and therefore revert. If we pass in the maximum u into 56, a plus one would revert. So that would be a second path that our function could take. And a symbolic execution tool would find this second path for us programmatically. And then of course, convert these to a set of mathematical expressions. This set of mathematical expressions might look something like this, a and also not a. Imagine if you ask somebody, can this set of mathematical expressions be true at the same time? The answer would obviously be no. It is impossible for both A to be true and A to be false. This is what our solver is going to figure out for us, but with much more complicated expressions than this. In our example, the solver is known as a SAT solver or an SMT solver. 
And there are many different types of solvers, but I'm not gonna go too deep into that right now. So running our symbolic execution tool, we would see two paths. Our first path gonna be if we give it the maximum size of a UN256, we try add one to it, the function will revert. Solidity doesn't allow you to add one to the maximum size of a UN256. The other path is anything lower than the max size of a UN256, we'll just add plus one and then return. So those are gonna be our two paths. Path one, A is not two raised to the 256 minus one, and then A returns normally, and A is two raised to the 256, and it reverts. However, instead of A, B, C, not A, et cetera, our symbolic execution tool will give us an output that might look something like this. Now, what you're seeing on screen is an SMT lib language, and it's a language specifically made for working with these solvers to solve our mathematical representations of our code. I'm not gonna go over too deeply what this is doing, but you can consider this just a list of Boolean expressions, kind of like A and not A, and if A, therefore B, and A, B, and C, et cetera. Now, if you take this code and paste it into a tool like Z3 or run it locally on your machine, it'll give you an output that looks something like this, sat and sat. This first sat is saying they were able to find an input for path one, and they were able to find an input for path two. They were able to satisfy the Booleans in those different paths. Since it was able to satisfy an input for path two, and we know that path two reverts, we know that this invariant is now broken because our invariant is it must never revert. And our mathematical representation said, hey, I've mathematically proven that there is a scenario where path two is executed and your function reverts. So sat here means we mathematically proved that this invariant breaks. Now, I manually created this SMT lib list with the help of ChatGPT. However, symbolic execution tools like Manticore, HEVM, and even the Solidity SMT checker can give you this SMT output. But all those tools come with a Z3 built in, so they'll even just skip this step and just give you, hey, is my invariant broken or not? Even the Solidity compiler itself can do this entire process behind the scenes. Explore the paths, convert the paths to a set of Boolean and check to see if those paths are reachable or not. Using the SOAP compiler, we can run with model checker engine and we can look for an overflow in small soul .soul. And if we run this, you'll see the Solidity compiler was able to do symbolic execution to find out, hey, if I add the maximum unit 256 as an input to here, you're going to get an overflow and that function is going to revert. Now, obviously reverts are pretty easy to find, but we could even add a cert a does not equal one, rerun this, but instead of overflow, look for asserts, and we would see that, again, it was able to mathematically find an input to break our assert or our invariant. It said, if you add zero, you're gonna get one. Asserts are what you're gonna use if you wanna use more complicated and more specific symbolic execution, rather than just overflow or underflows. A tool like Manticore will also give you an output with the revert, as well as a much more hyper-specific list of SNT lib that it's inputting into its Z3 solver. So a lot of stuff just happened here. Let's recap. We built some solidity, we understood our invariant, and the next two steps happened at the same time with Sulk or Manticore. We used a symbolic execution tool like the built-in one to Solidity to create a set of Boolean expressions that represent every execution path of our code, and then we dumped them into a solver like Z3 to see if our property could be broken. Just by running this one function, Solidity was able to do all those steps behind the scenes for us. We go through a full walkthrough of this example with the interview with Jocelyn, so be sure to check that out as well if you wanna learn more. And don't be afraid if this seems a little bit complicated. Be sure to ask questions, leave comments in the descriptions, and leave a like as well, and hopefully I'm gonna clear this up for you. Yeah, oh, sometimes the solver might not be able to solve the equation too. Like if the equation is too complex, you usually provide a timeout to the solver just because if you, know, if you have to invert hash function, you know, good luck to do that with a solver. Well, so you're saying this isn't a silver bullet for auditing? Like any technology, even formal verification and symbolic execution, abstract interpretation, these are not a one-size-fits-all approach. Using symbolic execution can run into something called the path explosion problem, where there's too many paths for a computer to explore in a reasonable amount of time, and a solver would never be able to finish. How practical is it to, to take all these steps? How hard is this to really do? Well, there are a couple of things to consider. The first one is that this specific technique, symbolic execution, has a couple of limitations. As you're going to explore the different paths of the program, there is a problem which is called the path explosion problem, which is basically if you have so many paths to explore in the program, it's going to take forever. If you have an infinite loop, this technique requires significant effort to be used. You need to understand how they work and you need to understand their limitation and how to help them. And also significant effort to be maintained. At the end of the day, 
I think what really matters are the properties. If you want to know if a bug can occur and if the property can be broken, you don't necessarily need formal method for that. And you can use a further, which is way easier to use and provide like kind of the same type of value. Something that is sometimes difficult for people is really to understand how to create this property and how to create invariant for themselves. If someone wants to you know, learn a bit more, we have this website, it's called secureattract.com, where we go over a lot of guidance and best practices. And among other, we have tutorial on how to use Echidna, how to define invariant, how to think about properties. There's a high skill requirement to using these tools effectively at the moment. People are working on making them easier and easier like the built-in Solidity SMT checker. However, as Jocelyn's been saying, sometimes a sufficiently powerful fuzzer is all you need. And if you combine a fuzzer with a symbolic execution backend, the fuzzer can pick better random numbers based off of the symbolic execution. And maybe you can find all the answers you need without having to do a formal verification test suite. And the most important piece here is that even this isn't a guarantee your code is bug free. All it does is mathematically prove your code does that one specific thing correctly. I'm hoping as AI takes off, doing a lot of this will become much easier. And I guess we'll have to see. But for now, hopefully you learned at least the basics of symbolic execution. If you'd like to learn more, leave a comment in the description. If you want to see more videos about form of verification, let me know. But the takeaway from this is that you should become a stateful fuzzing wizard. Thanks all for watching. Be absolutely sure to go watch the interview with Troy and Jocelyn. Links in the description. And we'll see you next time. Now, for those of you who are looking to become security professionals, smart contract security wizards, there are a ton of resources you should actually check out. I've left a link, of course, in the GitHub repo associated with this course to this comprehensive list of known attack vectors and common anti-patterns. It's got a ton of different solidity attack vectors that you should 100% know about. Additionally, if you want to learn more on doing security, there's a phenomenal game by a developer named Tincho called Damn Vulnerable DeFi, which is a way to learn offensive security of DeFi smart contracts in Ethereum. And they've got these amazing games that you can check out and play to learn security. Ethernaut is another game that is absolutely phenomenal that will help you to learn and understand solidity and smart contract vulnerabilities. For those of you who are looking to become auditors, definitely be sure to check out Solidit, which is this amazing tool for you to check out audit reports from the top smart contract security professionals in the entire industry. Of course, be sure to check us out at Cypheron. We do smart contract security and auditing as well. If you are building a protocol yourself, definitely be sure to check us out for your next project, for your next protocol. For any and all of you, absolutely subscribe to web3education.dev. We have some amazing surprises coming for you in the next couple of months, and I don't want you to miss it. There's going to be some awesome opportunities for you to participate, learn, and grow in top security. So be sure to put your email in here. And this is really just the tip of the iceberg. There's so much more to go when it comes to security. We are working on more security based education as well. So stay tuned for that. But the prerequisite for the security course is this monster foundry course anyway. So you have already taken the first step to becoming a smart contract security badass as well. But all right. Guess what? That's it for the security lesson. Congratulations. I and the Web3 community as a whole want to congratulate you for completing this absolutely monstrosity of a tutorial. You have done an amazing job to get this far and to watch me talking to you right now. And if you haven't finished the course, go back and finish it before coming here. We have learned so much on this journey. And I can say from the bottom 
of my soul that I am so glad to have you in the Web3 space, the smart contract space, the blockchain space, the cryptocurrency space. We are so excited that you're here. I'm really looking forward to seeing you in the Web3, in the blockchain community. Now, a lot of people ask, well, where do I go now? I have all this newfound knowledge. I'm armed with the intelligence of the Web3 developer space. Well, I've left some links in the GitHub repository to lend you to those next steps. But the biggest thing that you can do for yourself right now is go take what you've learned and apply it somewhere. This is going to be probably the most thorough course you will ever go through in this space. And you can go tutorial to tutorial and bootcamp to bootcamp all you want. But at some point, you have to make that leap and you have to dive in. And that's where the majority of the growth is going to be anyways. So if you're here wondering where to go next, go join a hackathon. Go start jumping onto issues on GitHub repos. Go start applying for grants. Go start applying for jobs and say, I took Patrick's massive course. Here's my GitHub repo. Work on a personal project. Work on somebody else's project. Take this knowledge and apply it. The challenges that you'll run into and the challenges that you'll face really trying to do something without me handholding you is where you're going to learn 10 times as much as what you've learned here. I've walked you as deep down this rabbit hole as I can take you. Now it's up to you to go out and do something with it. So thank you everybody who helped me create this course. Thank you for taking this course. And I'm so excited to see you in the community and see what you build and see what we can create with this technology.